This is Audible. No More Heroes, an Adrian's Undead Diary novel. Loki vs. the Apocalypse, Book One. Written by Carl Meadows. Narrated by Danielle Cohen. Dedication. When the night is at its darkest, look for the light of the stars. No More Heroes is dedicated to the two North Stars who helped steer me through the darkness when I felt lost. They will never know just how dark that night was, or just how bright they shined. For Eve and Archie, with all my love, Dad. Forward. If you followed my writing career at all, then you probably know that I'm an old-school gamer. Pen and paper role-playing games, miniature battles, geeky card games, all that. My passion of them all, however, is role-playing games. As dungeon master or game master, I would get to tell a vivid collaborative story with friends and sometimes strangers. We'd eat Doritos and Mountain Dew until late in the night, experiencing entire worlds of imagination over and over, Writing is kind of like that, but one-sided. I create the setting, devise the plot, and give life to the characters. One-sided. But when I do the anthologies set in the world of AUD, I get that reciprocity. I see people take my setting, sometimes my plot, and sometimes my characters, and they run with them, creating stories inspired by me. It's like imagination tennis, and boy, is it some hell of fun. When Carl wrote his submission for Dead Lucky, it was instantly included. That turned out to be just an excerpt from this novel. That turned out to be the first part of a series, all set in the world of AUD, all nearly perfect to what I could have imagined. Talk about satisfying. And, while we're speaking of satisfaction, I am certain that you'll all enjoy the story of Nate, Particles, and, of course, Lucky. May the Ring family always invite in characters like them. Thank you, Carl. Let's let the world get a peek inside that imagination of yours now. Chris. Part 1 Can you describe the ruckus, sir? First entry, not Sun Tzu. Hey, it's 2010, it's June. I think it's like the 24th, 25th. Honestly, I'm not sure. My phone is dead and there's no power to charge it. And who wears a watch these days? Anyway, two days ago, the world shit the bed. I'm not talking about an accidental shit the bed, dear reader. Like a fart gone wrong that leaves a little chocolate streak on the sheets. Oh no, I'm talking about waking up from a major girly night and realising you're riding the wave of a faecal tsunami that's drowned every part of the bed you're in. I'm talking a half hour of screaming and anal incendiaries as you purge your system. And the situation is made worse because that guy you liked, the one you finally hooked up with and came back to your house, your hunky chunk of man beef. Yeah, he's been sandblasted by your rectal volcano. That's how bad the world is shit in its bed. I've no idea what happened or why it's still happening, but the world has become a horror movie. I'm talking a legitimate zombocalypse. The dead are up, shuffling about, lunging. Yes, lunging and fucking eating people. No, wait, that's not right. They start eating people, yet as soon as the victim is dead, the meal comes to an end. Then it's like they just wait for their newest recruit to sit back up, after a bit of twitching, and join the silent, shambling mass, looking for the next victim. Movie zombies all shuffle around, moaning, arms outstretched, or hissing like I do when someone's stolen my last tampon. Not these ones. These are ninja zombies, hungry stalkers that sneak up on you if you don't constantly pay attention. 
I nearly walked right into one downstairs last night and just managed to get my hand on its chest, pushing it away while it snapped its jaws at the empty air in front of my face. Pant-shitting stuff. Most of the guy's face had been chewed off, leaving a bloody half-skull snapping its teeth together in the air. There's something inherently chilling about teeth smashing together over and over like that. Plus Skeletor looked at me with such fury. Weirds me out how they always seem so rage-filled when you get up close. They're dead and should be empty, but it's like there's something there, something wrong. Eesh, my butt is puckering just at the thought. I'm just spilling all this out as it comes to me, trying to make sense of all this bullshit. The world is ending. Everywhere is fucked. Everywhere. The world is a porn star being aggressively boned in all available orifices, and there's still a queue impatiently waiting for summary insertion. Hey there, unknown reader, who may have found this scribbled notebook. I hope you can read my handwriting. The name's Lockie. Well, my actual name is Erin. Erin Lock. But my friends, well, basically everyone, calls me Lockie. I'm 26 years old. I have a mouth, and apparently a hand when a penny's in it by the looks of it, that runs off before my brain gets in the driver's seat. I make frequent and often obscure pop culture references, and I have a particular set of skills. Skills that make me a nightmare for zombies like you. If you give the world back now, I will not look for you. See? I love movies, comics, and general nerd stuff, and can't help but quote them. What are my particular set of skills? Well, I've been doing parkour and mixed martial arts from 13. Zombies can't chase you up a drain pipe when you spider monkey the fuck away from them, and using the aerial highway when possible makes life a little easier. Thankfully, I haven't come across any climbing zombies as yet. I'll probably just give up on life if that happens. MMA is great for up close and personal if I end up tangling with another survivor for a can of soup. Ground and pound on a zombie is pretty useless, as no chokehold or arm lock is going to stop Chompy McTwat face from chewing through your arm. Sleeper holds are ineffective against the raged filled dead. Plus, I came up in the care system. When you're a teenage girl and you start shaping like a woman, a lot of unwanted attention comes your way. I found the best way to deal with such attention was a kick in the balls followed by a knee to the teeth. So I applied myself to perfecting aggressively violent self-defense. It also helped when Skeletor popped up like Aladdin's genie and tried to bite a chunk out of my beautiful face. When I put my foot through the front of his knee, then curb stomped his head like an 80s football hooligan, it felt pretty useful then. What's my other skill? I drive like a Hollywood stunt woman. Okay, I might be overdoing that a bit, but I've been stealing cars and joyriding them since I was 14. Admittedly, there were some incidents where things didn't go as planned, and I may have crashed a few times, but nobody's perfect, right? Look, I never said I was a shining example of goodness and light, but a girl has to do what she can to survive, right? I came through the care system and learned to take care of myself. So, I'd describe myself as a mix of Ripley from Aliens, because she's badass and you don't know me so I can say whatever I like. Tigger and Jackie Chan all rolled into one sweet-cheeked package of awesome. Go Team Lucky, and the crowd goes wild! But all my awesomeness aside, I'm still shitting myself. Do you know what is not one of my skills? Strategy. I'm more of a reactive rather than a proactive girl. I wing it. I ride the wave of fortune, and sometimes I'm up high, or sometimes I'm teeth deep in liquid shit. This was the latter. What was I thinking? Who thinks a fucking high school is a good place to ride out the apocalypse? Well, my dearest reader, let me tell you about this rare and uncompromising genius. Sticks two thumbs up and rams them backwards. 
have obviously watched too many movies where the great strategists say, if you own the high ground, then victory is assured. Well, Boudicca here took that to heart, didn't she? And the tallest building around was the top floor of the high school in this shitty small English town. So off I went. Everyone was coming out, a flood of panicked teenagers desperate to escape. So Sun Tzu here decided to go for the high ground. Well done, Lockie. You are now the proud resident of a classroom with huge windows looking out over a town filled with fucking zombies. They're everywhere, because this high school is right in the middle of a residential area. Sigh, I am so wise. Pass me that great tome of knowledge so I can chew on it like a retarded donkey. It's not a big town by standards, but it's still a town. In the full bloom of life, there had to be a good 10,000 living here. Not exactly a rural hamlet, so there are people everywhere. Well, there were. Most of the town fled when Hurricane Shitstorm landed, but they're the live ones. The rest are dead and just milling about, all lost and forlorn. Such a weird thing to say. The dead are just milling about. So what's my problem? Well, let me tell you, my inquisitive unknown reader friend. About ten minutes after I shimmied my way up a drainpipe and through an open window, some panicked helicopter parent in their giant SUV, pointless for a town this size, came thundering through the school gates to pick up their precious little angel. Of course, Mrs. Thompson Smythe isn't exactly trained for high-speed driving, and as she came through the gates into the car park and rounded the corner at pace, all panicked for her little cherub's safety, she managed to plough through a field of teenagers. Dear fucking God. It was awful. It was like a bowling ball through pins, scattering the poor little bastards everywhere, though the ones at Ground Zero just made a god-awful thunk sound as they were hit square and smashed flat, then ridden over. The asphalt of the car park near the school gate was splashed with crimson and mangled uniformed kids, which then unleashed all kinds of crazy. Kids started screaming. The mother in the giant SUV was screaming. I was standing two floors up, screaming. Did I mention the screaming? There was screaming. Turns out, it got even worse, because one of those little angels that got splashed was her own little angel. So Mrs. Thompson Smythe gets out of the SUV, screaming in shamanic tongues as she goes to attend her very dead child who, yep, you guessed it, summarily reanimates and bites a mouthful from the fleshy front of her throat. Shit, sometimes these Zeds reanimate really fucking fast. There was probably a total of 20 seconds max, from dead teenager to flesh-rending undead. I saw the arterial eruption, even from my elevated and distant position. Gross. Some more rapid twitching followed from other mangled kids, which was then followed by more dawn of the dead, and well, you can guess what happened from there. Multiply zombies to the power of, oh shit. Those kids who had gone to help friends, or were holding their phones up and recording the horror on their grainy little cameras like assholes, suddenly fled the scene like they were escaping from a fart-clouded elevator, but not before a metric fuckton had pieces chewed from them. Some of the bites were insta-kills, like poor Mrs. Thompson Smythe. Some were slow bleeders that would kill them in minutes, and others ran off home nursing apparently superficial bites to arms and legs. I've seen enough zombie movies to know what that means, though. They'll just die at home later and eat their parents and siblings. It's in the movies, and it seems to be the case in this messed up reality. Getting bitten equals doomed. It might not be right away, but once those zombie teeth leave their mark, the doomsday clock starts ticking on you ending up a brain-chomping cockrot. So, that means now I have a car park full of mangled, blood-covered high school kids and parents, a big SUV blocking the vehicular exit of the school, so even if I get in one of the vehicles in the car park to make my daring escape, I can't get the bastard out of the gates, and a whole heap of what-the-fuck to sort through.
Having raided the stores for this shitty little notebook and a box of pens, I'm writing all this bullshit out to try and order my thoughts. I'm a social person who doesn't know when to shut up, and with nobody else to talk to, it helps that I'm talking to you, unknown future reader who will find this after my death. Shit, I need to give you a better name. I'll think on that. Honestly, I have no fucking clue what to do next. I'm trapped in a high school, surrounded by a legion of little bastards that want to buy chunks out of me, with no clear method of escape or plan for what comes after. I mean, I could just run over the back field behind the school and leave all this shit behind me, but the field backs onto houses. It's a residential area, and I don't really fancy the idea of jumping over a fence and coming face to face with a zombie Doberman. Fuck, is that even a thing? Does the zombie virus, or plague, or possession, or whatever it is, pass to animals? Being chased by a pack of Zobermans is not on my things Lockie would like to experience list. See, just the thought of it is making me talk myself out of that plan. I love dogs. I really do. They're awesome. But I've never been a huge fan of massive, dangerous-looking dogs that could tear all my lady parts out in a single snap. I like terriers, collies, mongrels, and pugs. But if I see an undead Doberman or Rottweiler coming to chew through my most precious of orifices, I'll probably just die on the spot out of sheer fucking terror. I love dogs. I really love dogs. But killer zombie dogs? Nope. So, if heading into the heart of a zombie council estate to be eaten by zombie smackheads or undead canines is off my list of things to do, and it is, I've got to figure out a way to get my ass from this school. I've got to get out of this building, through the car park, out the gates, and prance off into the sunset. Though, I've got no idea where to go. This planning shit is hard. Second entry. Woman with a sort of plan. Well, not only is sleeping in a school classroom overnight uncomfortable, it is fucking pantshittingly terrifying. Honestly, I thought I'd been dropped into Silent Hill last night. When it gets dark and there's no power, Holy shit, it gets fucking dark. And let me tell you, my dear stranger, the night carries with it a capacity for pants-smearing terror that the day cannot hope to match. There's a pile of desks and chairs I've pushed against the classroom door I am now lovingly referring to as the Great Wall of Lucky. It'll take me ten minutes to pull all that shit clear to leave, and I'm planning to do that shortly, because... Remember how good I said my planning skills were? Well, what does a human being have to do to survive? Yup, eat and drink. Sigh, I've got no food and no water. I've seen a hundred zombie movies and clearly learned nothing. You know how you laugh with your geek mates about what you'd do if the zombocalypse descended like a great celestial turd to curl upon the world? How you think you'll be a fucking champ and know exactly what to do? Bullshit. Unless you're a proper survivalist who truly is preparing, even hoping for the end of civilization, and anybody who says they want an apocalypse is a total turd of a person. When it all comes, all us normal folk do is squeal, ah, shit, zombie, run, and we all run like the little bitches we really are with no plan, no good sense, and not one fucking clue. How the fuck is the world supposed to survive a zombie apocalypse when most people run away from spiders and can be defeated by peanut allergies? We're just not that strong these days. So, here I am, hungry, thirsty, and of all things, I'm absolutely bursting for a shit. Yeah, that's never in the movies, is it? Everyone just thunders round, popping their rounds into zombie schools, but the heroine never says, Dude, hey, dude, I gotta drop the kids off at the pool. That'd be badass, having Charlize Theron drop her panties and gruffly wave everyone ahead, nine mil clasped in teeth and squatting because she's got to saw a log in half, and all the while the zombies are getting closer. Whoosh, that'd be some tense cinema right there. Nope, the need to go potty is never in the movies. I need to go and purge myself, 
and I'm building up the courage by scribbling in this stupid notebook. Last night was so damn quiet. When you go to sleep at night, there's usually some ambient noise outside your little bubble. Cars in the distance, wind in the trees, teenagers laughing overly loud because they're pissed up on some cheap booze bought with a false ID, that kind of stuff. Well, somebody pressed the world's mute button last night. I couldn't sleep because it was too quiet. I could hear my own heart beating in my ears. Freaky. You know what's freakier, though? Hearing the squeak of shoes somewhere below you. There are Zeds still in the school, maybe random staff members or students. How they died, I don't know. But hearing that squeak, 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 like some horrific metronome echoing up the stairs as something shuffled somewhere below. Eesh. Squeak, squeak, squeak. Like he was shuffling around in a circle. I've been waiting for whoever that zombie is to shamble off before I go out hunting. In the movies, our intrepid heroes wield their handguns like a boss. Headshot here, headshot there, headshots everywhere. But this is England. I can't very well throw three darts for 180 and distract the zombies with a nice cup of tea now, can I? Oh, I'd fucking love a proper brew right now. Mental note, get a brew. I'm from Liverpool originally, a solid, boiled-in-the-bag English northern girl. How am I supposed to take on the apocalypse without a brew and two sugars? Mind you, there's no power, so how the fuck will I even boil a kettle? Ray Mears, I am not. So, I've got something that resembles a plan. I think. Ha, because we all know how well Alexandra the Great has done so far, eh? But anyway. I've got a plan. I need food, I need water, I need a weapon, and first and foremost, I need a great big shit. And the stretch goal? One cup of tea. Just one. So, first off, there are toilets on the bottom floor of this building, right at the base of the stairs. How do I know this? Well, because this shithole was my high school when I was a teenager a decade ago, and not much has changed. I know this place, so at least I've got that going for me. Once I've dropped the kids off at the pool, it's a quick run through some double doors into the canteen. In there, there's got to be water, dried food and canned stuff. From there, back up to base HQ and stash any fat loot I acquire. Then I go back to the middle floor to the end of the corridor that leads to the walkway, crossing the inner courtyard, over to the sports hall, then down the stairs where all the art rooms are, and... Drum roll, please. The fucking woodwork department. Tools, aka weapons. Big ass hammers, screwdrivers, stuff. Before the morning is out, I'll be hammers in hand and feeling better about my chances of escape. So, here's the plan. Downstairs, take a shit, wipe, front to back, I'm no savage. Canteen to get food and water, back upstairs, dump my loot, back to middle floor, across to sports and arts building, downstairs, load up on weapons, back up to my classroom HQ, take the car, go to mum's, kill Phil, grab Liz, go to the Winchester, have a nice cold pint and wait for all this to blow over. How's that for a slice of fried gold? Like my old stoner mate Rodney, the plan I have is simple. But... Unlike Rodney ever did, this plan might just work. Gotta take a dump first, though. I'm fit to shit. Third entry. Battle of the Bog. Well, it could have been worse. Hey, I'm not dead. I have a backpack full of bottled water, cans of food and soda, chocolate bars, breakfast bars, and Rosalind Franklin here even remembered a little dash of cutlery and a can opener. I ate a cold can of beans and sausages, followed by some cheap-ass cereal bar that was like chewing saliva-glazed cardboard sprinkled with shriveled, sun-baked testicles. But still, that shit was delish when you're hungry enough to eat a scabby dog. The food and water gathering, great. The drop-off back here at Lucky Tower? No problem. 
My major problems came in the opening gambit of my totes good plan, TM, and then right at the end, when I was planning to load for zombie bear. Oh, my life, can you imagine that? Thankfully, England has a distinct lack of bears, so that's one less potential horror to worry about. With an empty backpack, I disassembled the great wall of Lockie from the doorway and slipped out. Things were getting desperate in the sphincter department. I was five millimetres away from touching cloth in my pants, so some caution had to go to the wind. I'm not facing the apocalypse smelling of my own shit. No, ma'am. Some things are non-negotiable. Squeaky must have shuffled off somewhere in the night or morning because I heard nothing, which was great. A quick peep down the central stairwell to the bottom, and all looked clear. In fact, from where I was standing, I could see the door to the little girl's room. It shined with a celestial glow to my eyes, and I swear I heard a chorus of angels raising their voices to heaven in joy. Two floors down was anal salvation, and I started bounding down those stairs with all my mad parkour skills to make the trip as swift as possible. Side note. I would buy the music of any band that called itself Anal Salvation. I went through the door as quietly as possible, but as I laid my eyes upon the stalls, the burning press intensified. Things were starting to get warm in the basement, so all pretense at stealth went. I went into the stall, closed the door and locked it. Why, I don't know, but it's just what you do, right? Dropped the seat, dropped my pants faster than if Brad Pitt had said, Allow me to pleasure you placed my cheeks upon my ceramic throne and released the kraken. I know I shouldn't really dwell on it, because there's more interesting stuff to write about, but Jesus, Mary and fucking Joseph, it was like a religious moment. Anal salvation was achieved as I felt myself deflate. It was like I was purging myself of all my tension, all my fear and, well, all the shit that was threatening to explode in my pants. But still, after the event, I had exorcised my demons and my ass was clear. It was epic. So much relief. Now that we've got that down for posterity, let's move on with Lockie's tale of woe, shall we? So, as I'm grunting and groaning with relief, eye twitching as the splashback occurred, at that moment, I probably was the happiest I'd been in days. I let out a big randy macho man savage, oh yeah, and gave myself a mental high five, leaned back, sighed in contentment, savouring this most treasured of moments. Squeak. Splashback part two, the return. I swear to whatever god from whatever pantheon was having a good laugh at my situation when I heard that squeak. I was so glad I was still sat on the shitter because I full-on shit myself for a second time. Literally. My ass squeaked and pumped out a second round from the barrel with a bloop into the lake below before it snapped shut tighter than the ivy needle. Squeaky was in the fucking bathroom. Seriously, what the hell? How did Squeaky get into the bathroom in the middle of the night? Well, it turns out it did, and little did I know, when I burst into the bathroom in a wild-ass panic, that Squeaky was in the far stall as I had headed for the nearest point of salvation. Maybe it had been drawn by the noise in the pipes or something. A mouse? No idea. My wild and savage cries of anal salvation had obviously drawn Squeaky's attention. The squeak of those shoes on that shiny floor sent my blood cold and clamped my ass tighter than a shark's ass at 10,000 fathoms after Splashback Part 2 escaped. Sat there, vulnerable and weak, I heard him shuffle Squeaky's way out of the end stall to mine, not making a sound except for those damn shoes and then bump into the door. And again, and again. Toilet etiquette for the win had locked the stall. However, it was a tiny piece of shit lock that wouldn't stand up to consistent pressure, and the door opened inwards, so I was on the clock in the most surreal moment of my life to date.
Imagine, dear reader, calmly wiping your ass while a zombie head bumps over and over outside your door. It's shoes, totally a teacher with those bad boys, squeaking and squawking like nails on a chalkboard, while you are trapped in a little cubicle that smells like its own special slice of the apocalypse. You check, wipe again, make sure you banished all those little nuggets from your life, and still, bump, 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 squeak, squeak, squeak. Not a single sound from the dead, though. Silent as the crypt itself. I'll never get used to that. And then, like a shining light, I remember. Zombie land, survival rule number three. Beware of bathrooms. And that image of the movie from a year earlier comes to mind, of the zombie crawling under the stall to eat the guy taking a shit and inwardly I face palm. I forgot your rule, Columbus. Cardio, I'm good. I always wear my seatbelt, and I'll check all the back seats in my next vehicular adventure. There are some others, but I can't remember them all now. Anyway, suddenly faced with the potential prospect of Squeaky dropping to his knees and climbing under the stall, didn't know if they could at this point, my wiping became more frantic. A sense of urgency was returned to me. After all, I'm sat on the shitter and there's a zombie three feet away trying to break into the stall with his face, so a sense of perspective was required, I think. A realignment of one's priorities. Also, getting murdered by a zombie while sitting on the toilet? That's a pretty ignoble way to go. Here lies Erin Locke. She died upon the shitter. That would not be my fate. So pants up and head in the game. Thankfully. I'm little at 5'6". I'm in good shape, as you have to be when your free time is spent scampering on rooftops and making retarded jumps between stone walls. I'm agile and wiry, which is really handy when you have to escape the siege of stall one. While Squeaky kept up his retarded assault, using his face as a battering ram, I went up and over into the next stall. As I was slinking over, thinking how the fuck I was going to get out of this pile of stupid... My eyes alighted on my new weapon of choice. After all, I had to get past the Z because I was now further away from the exit. But I spied the lid of the toilet's tank and a little light bulb went bing over my head. You know the ones I mean, the big ass heavy ceramic lid that covers the tank with the floaty ball thing in it. I'm not a plumber, work with me here. Well, those things are heavy. And as I dropped into the stall and lifted it, I nodded appreciatively as I hefted that bitch. Oh yes, this would do nicely. Armed with the mighty club of doom, I stepped out of the stall and instinctively took a step back to give myself swing room. As I did, I got a good look at Squeaky for the first time. The guy was in his mid-forties. He was the kind of guy that boredom would look like if it was moulded into a person. You know the ones I mean, the type of person who is so boring you feel they've poisoned you. He was all beige and tan, with a woolly sweater vest over a pastel-coloured shirt, two for a tenor men's grey trousers, and a I-still-let-my-mum-cut-my-hair style atop his head that was carefully side-parted with enough product that an open flame might make him do a pretty fair impression of Ghost Rider and those shiny, squeaky shoes that no man who ever wanted to get laid would ever consider wearing. I don't know what you call them, as I'm not down with virgin chic, but you can probably work out how uncool and shite they were from my artfully descriptive depiction of his general appearance. They were shit. Let's leave it there. If you were to have a conversation with this guy when he was alive, I imagine you'd have been as bored as a midget in a theme park. He'd obviously died from three vicious bite marks on his arms, and by the size of those bites, they looked student-sized. He probably bored them to death, and they unleashed their undead vengeance on him the only way they could. I'd given myself the room I needed, and gave the toilet lid a couple of practice swings to get the arc right. Overbalancing and falling on my face would be a bad move, so I made sure I got myself planted and ready for his lightning assault. Squeak. Shuffle. Squeak. Shuffle. Zombies are slow, 
And they aren't intellectuals filled with witty conversation or the ribald tales of a horny sailor. But fuck me, I was getting bored waiting for him. But then, at the last moment, something changed. Lips drew back, fingers curled to claws, and his expression changed into pure, unadulterated hate. It was a stark and sudden shift, and I swear my heart nearly seized. He went from a vaguely comical undead to terrifying supernatural force in the time it took to fart out my fear. I swung that thing right to left in a sudden panic, catching him clean on the side of the head and knocking him the fuck down. It obviously didn't kill him with one blow, but once he was down, then I started to pound, letting out a feral yell. Stealth could blow itself. I was shitting it and just wanted this done. I brought the heavy edge of the lid down onto the side of his head while he was flat on the floor and was rewarded with an audible crack. Still wasn't dead, so I did it again and again and again. I wailed on his head like that scene in Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels, where Vinnie Jones's character is slamming that guy's head in the car door for threatening his kid. Full on scream, roar, fuck you, die motherfucker. For a moment, I completely lost myself in an equal blend of fury and terror. By the time I got my senses back and looked down at my handiwork, Squeaky would squeak no more. There was nothing left of his head but a mangled pulp of red, white and grey. Awful. I dropped the lid and stepped back into the empty stall I had emerged from and threw my guts up for a good thirty seconds until I had nothing left in me. I flushed, sat on the seat and took a minute to get my shit together. My hand hurts. Dear reader, let me tell you, writing for so long with a pen is hard. I'm going to take a break and carry on the tale shortly. Thinking about splashing that head has made me feel sick again. Fourth entry. Vice, vice, baby. When I'd finally got my shit together, I stepped over the human wreckage and bobbed my head out into the corridor. I mean, shit. I'd been screaming in terror like a child molester thrown into prison gen pop while I was pancaking Squeaky's head, and I was half expecting a scene from Thriller in the hallway as the army of darkness came shuffling towards me. All was well, however, no sign of any further threats, so I slipped out and headed straight for the school canteen. I expected to find it full of Zeds, but amazingly, there was not a damned soul anywhere. After the Battle of the Bog, I was all slaughtered out and just wanted to fill my backpack with snacks and get back upstairs, so that's exactly what I started doing. I threw all kinds of snacky goodness in the bag, took plenty of bottled water, and generally started feeling better about myself. And then, fate smiled upon me. As I was filling up my backpack with fat loot, my eyes were drawn to a socket on the wall, and there, winking at me, was a little red light. Power. Frowning, I flicked the light switch, and lo and behold, the lights came on. I stepped out into the hall and flicked the lights out there, but there was nothing. Okay, so I'm no electrician, but it said to me that the kitchen and canteen were on a different circuit, maybe their own circuit with a backup generator for the fridges and freezers. But who knows? In fact, who fucking cares? I fortified all the doors so I had an early warning system, switched all the electric hops on, got some pans, raided the fridges, and lo and behold, Lockie had herself a fry-up. Eggs, bacon, sausage, hash browns, beans, toast, butter. Oh my God. And then, the coup de fucking grass. I switched on the kettle and made myself a fucking brew. I sat at a table with my awesome full English breakfast, a goddamn cup of tea, and felt like the queen of the apocalypse. Pity there was no TV in the canteen. My morning would have been complete watching Jeremy Kyle torture people on TV in spectacularly titled episodes such as My boyfriend thinks I cheated with another man through a letterbox. Where was my boyfriend when he said he was behind the chicken shop? And my personal favourite, Leave your fiancé, he had sex with me in a graveyard.
Good times. Shit, if all this bullshit exploded while Jeremy was filming, I've got visions of a new episode. My wife made my brother a zombie, but not me. Is she cheating on me? When I think of Jeremy Kyle, it comes to mind that the apocalypse might have done us one favor at least. What a twat. After finishing my breakfast, my God, it was sweet, sweet heaven. I felt better than I had since the world shut out a razor blade. Lucky versus the apocalypse was on. Bitch is back in the game. I shot back upstairs, emptied my bag of all loot into my temporary home, ready to receive tools and weapons aplenty, and off I popped to the middle floor. The walkway that crossed the inner courtyard of the school campus was an experience. You go through a set of double doors into a little covered glass bridge, about 20 feet long, that transfers you from a classroom building over to the sports hall, one floor above ground level. I have to say, I was a little surprised to see that the inner courtyard had about 30 Zeds staggering around aimlessly. Some teachers, some parents, some uniformed kids in their dark blazers. All were bloody as fuck. I don't know what happened, but I was surprised to find so many in the courtyard between buildings. I thought everyone had done their level best to get the fuck out when all this shit started. Kids waiting for parents that never came, maybe? Shrug. Freaked me out, though, when I was pattering along the bridge. They clearly heard or sensed me. Thirty sets of dirty, glassy eyes snapped up and looked right at me. Then they all started shuffling my way, lips peeling back with hate, as though I was responsible for their current undead stasis. Ass squeak moment. I wasn't hanging around for them to gather beneath me, so I picked up my pace and popped through the second set of doors at the end and then switched to ninja mode. There is something about an empty school that really freaks me out. I remember playing a cracked version of Silent Hill on the original PlayStation, and because it was a copy, for some reason there was no colour. The whole game was black and white, and man, it made for creepy level. Expert. Silent Hill 1 and 2 were just pant shitters of games. I think my fear of empty schools comes from those games. I expected a nightmare to appear around the corner at any moment. Just the bang of a settling radiator, the rattle of a pipe, creak of a floorboard popping back into shape. They're all amplified and threaten to pop a nugget straight out your back door in fright every time you hear one. Honestly, if my life continues in this manner, my sphincter will have a fucking six-pack in a week's time. My entire existence is one of paranoid hypervigilance because, let me tell you, sloppiness gets you surprised dry-fucked in the ass by a rusty metal dildo. Things would not end well. Remember how quiet these things are. Constant head on a swivel. Getting a handle on my breathing took some effort, with all those freaky stares of hunger from a moment ago still on my mind. I sucked in some, allegedly, calming breaths and started to mission impossible through the first floor entry hall, making my way to the steps that led down. I saw nothing. I heard nothing. It was great. Confidence began to return as I ghosted down the awful terracotta colour steps where the woodwork room was. I put my hand on the door, creaking it open, and just as it literally started to creak open, I heard a sound, a footstep of metal on tile. A memory bubbled up from deep, like a wet fart in the bath breaking the surface, deep and ominous when you're not sure if you've followed through and you might be now sitting in a bath you've sharted in. When I was in high school, the woodwork teacher, they called it CDT then, craft, design, and technology, was Mr. Emerson. He was in his late forties, a small, rotund little man with a grey widow's peak and a surly facial expression that was as sour as a bulldog sucking piss from a nettle. I never understood why he went into teaching, as he fucking hated teenagers. I mean, with a passion. And oh, mama, he was not afraid to let us know. He was like a drill sergeant with his obvious disdain for his students. Allow me to divulge some of his most memorable sayings. 
I don't have the energy to even pretend to like you today. Life is full of disappointments. I've just added you to mine. Sometimes I listen to what you're saying and I can't help but wonder who tied your shoelaces for you this morning. Oh, you don't like being called stupid. I'm sorry, I thought you were already aware. He was a right little splash of sunshine, was Emmy. Everywhere he walked, he left a trail of rainbows sprinkled with the glitter he farted. Wanker. So, why do I bring up my memories of my old woodwork teacher? Well, Emmy's most bizarre trait was his choice of footwear. He was proper old school, and the safety shoes he used to wear were something of a joke to everyone he taught. No modern safety footwear for Emmy, oh no. I shit you not, my fearless reader. This guy used to wear these things that looked like solid wooden clogs with hammered metal on the bottom, so they made this really distinct sound on the hard tile floor of the wood shop. Metal on ceramic tiles. Clickety-click, clickety-clack. Pretty sure he made them himself. As I creaked open the door, clickety-clack. I knew without a shadow of a doubt that Zombie Emerson was shuffling round the wood shop. That certainty was confirmed by the death stench that wafted through the door crack as I heard the undead river dance. Zombies fucking stink, man. Once the human dies, they piss and shit themselves as everything relaxes. It's gross as all hell, but they have this, this aura. Their smell isn't just natural odour. It's like some brimstone kind of shit. I don't know what brimstone smells like, but it's always associated with evil. That's what they smell like. Pure, absolute corruption. Hard to articulate. When the apocalypse wasn't a reality, every kid would dream of getting the chance to brain an asshole teacher without fear of reprisal. But when the end of the world is real, and that asshole teacher can equally just kill and eat you, well, that's a whole different set of rules. Plus, as I had discovered earlier, smashing the brains out of someone, dead or alive, is no fucking joke. It's brutal. It's messy. It's sickening. This isn't Shaun of the Dead where hilarity ensues. Putting someone down up close and personal is gross as all hell. I imagine our friends across the pond have things a bit easier, as there's probably a certain amount of detachment popping the melon of a Z with a nine mil from 30 feet away. We don't have a gun culture, though, so the report of a gunshot is super rare. Having to do the job nose to nose with something that smells like a rotting colon with full on head splash in your face. Nope. Fucking awful. Everything about it is shit. So, here I was, about to have a gladiatorial battle to the death with a short, fat wanker that would no doubt be even surlier in undeath than he was in life. Marvelous. Well, me creaking that door meant that little flash of sound was like an air horn to Emmy. He scuttled and bobbed over like a fat, shriveled Skeksis towards the door, and I could hear him coming in his clickety-clackety way. The door opened inwards, so I waited and waited for him to weave and stumble his way around the workbenches until he was heading towards the door, and, as he got up close... I full-on kicked that door like Bruce Lee, right into his kisser. There was a satisfying crunch and crack, and he went arse over tit, bounced off a workbench, and collapsed flat on his face. Well, I say flat. As I said, he was a rotund fellow, so he bobbed, rolled, and flailed on his big belly as he tried to climb to his feet again. It would probably have been hilarious had I not been so desperate to get past him and find a weapon. After curb-stomping Skeletor the other night and remembering how rank it felt to do that, feeling a skull splinter under your boot as you stamp repeatedly on it, I had no desire to do it again. All I wanted for Christmas right then was something big, blunt, and traumatic, so I could end this shit show with a single blow. 
Of course, with my luck, I couldn't see a single tool to hand, and Zombie Riverdance didn't take long to wobble to his clacky feet, all while my head was on a swivel looking for something I could brain him with. So, it was time to get creative. There are some big-ass vices in that room, and one of them had wide, gaping jaws, fully opened, a real industrial width. A quick estimation of Emmy's melon and the gap between the jaws. Remember my parkour nimbleness? Mr. Emerson couldn't get near me as he shuffled and bumped his way around, while I jumped up and over the benches. Every time he got near, though, that same silent snarl appeared I keep seeing on every one of these when they're just a pounce away. No growl, hiss, or even gurgle. Just a twisted expression of hate as it screamed in silence at me and accelerated like it had just been given a shot of zombie adrenaline. Gives me shivers every time. Once in position, I slid across a bench to strike from the rear, planted my foot full in his back and pushed him face first towards the vice. He didn't go flush in. Nope. First, I had to gag back, vomit as I heard him go teeth first into one of the vice's jaws. Blur, that sound. I remember a kid I used to know when I was ten named Timmy. We used to crack golf balls off the top of a hill, across a big stretch of earthy wasteland, seeing how far we could hit them, and obviously the boys couldn't get beat by a girl, so they were super competitive. We only had one club passing this iron between us as we took turns. Timmy had taken his turn, but hadn't moved far back away from this other kid we used to hang with, Nick. Nick brought the club back, swung, smacked the ball clean, and the club continued to sweep up. Timmy was too close. There was a weird sound, like a mix of metallic chink and dull thunk, with a shuddering ceramic splinter as that club Zion's head met Timmy's front teeth. I'll never forget that sound. Never. It was brought to stark life once again as Emerson took an involuntary bite of the metal vice at speed. The crack and shatter of teeth against solid metal, dear reader, is hard to describe. I'm no prize-winning writer to capture the sound in words, but I felt that shit shudder through my fucking soul. My eye is twitching just writing about the memory. Swallowing the bile, I followed up while I still had the advantage. Shifting Emmy to the side while he was still face down, I pushed his bulbous face between the jaws, then held him there, helpless, while I whirled that industrial-sized bar for all my worth. Righty-tighty, motherfucker. Finally, the jaws had fully clamped his temples, and he couldn't move. Panting by now, I clambered off him and set to work with all my tiny strength on that bar. Jesus, what a way to go. I mean, I know I was being creative and I write about how awesome I am, but slowly crushing a human skull in a big-ass vice is fucking nasty. Creaking, cracking, tension, straining, and then suddenly... Pop, crunch, fracture. The tension is gone as the skull's structure collapses, then it's a free roll into Squish Town. I stood back after crushing Mr. Emerson's skull and brain in the bloody mess of the vice, surveyed my handiwork with a nod, put my hands on my hips in satisfaction like a champ, then promptly puked my guts up again, right next to his dangling corpse. Lovely. Tallahassee had to be proud, right? That had to be a contender for Zombie Kill of the Week. Vice, vice, baby. I'm pretty sure I could hear the sound of my heart breaking as my full English breakfast splashed around my feet, though. Bye-bye, baby. It was nice to have known you for even a little while. Sob. After I'd purged, I had more time to find the tools I had been denied. Finding a locked cupboard and my Sherlock-esque skills, deducing the tools were in there, I returned to the fat controller, wondering how he'd died, as he didn't have any bites or injuries I could see. Maybe his heart just gave out. I mean, shit, he wasn't exactly training for a triathlon, was he? Anyway, Emmy had keys in his pocket, and I returned to the locked cupboard, trying key after key that looked like it might fit. 
By the way, who does that in an apocalypse? Locking away potential defensive weapons. Pretty sure that wanker wanted all the teenagers to get eaten and prevented them from acquiring any defensive capabilities. Wouldn't surprise me. Seriously, that guy hated everyone. Now, however, I have returned to Lucky Tower. I have hammers, screwdrivers, and a goddamn crowbar, which is my new favourite toy. It's heavy and curly and pointy and all kinds of comforting to have in hand now. Bottom line, I have food, water, tools slash weapons, have secured the stairs so possess a relatively safe classroom to reside in while I figure shit out, and I'm not dead. Now I just need to figure out a solid escape plan and get on the road and out of this shithole town and into the country before I get swarmed and eaten. Yay! Best bit of the day, though? I got me a fucking brew. Fuck yeah. Fifth entry. Now what? So, what to do now? I can't survive on Snickers and beans for the rest of my days, and I sure as shit can't live in this classroom. Hell, I can't stay in this crappy-ass town either. The sensible thing would be for me to head out to one of the little country areas that surround it. That's the advantage of being in this little slice of northern English gold. There's a whole lot of greenery and pretty villages and farms nearby. So I guess the smart thing to do is get away from the press of undead and hole up somewhere the zombies won't be gathering in numbers. Trouble is, I'm an urban lass. I don't know shit about farming or surviving on my own without modern convenience. If I want to eat, I go to the store and buy shit, and long term that won't cut the mustard. To be honest, the thought of heading down to Tesco doesn't exactly fill me with excitement. I bet the supermarkets have been scavenged by now. That would have likely happened on day one, as people loaded their cars and got the fuck out of town. As people are generally shitty to each other, I'm pretty sure all kinds of awful shit went down there, as frightened people went to war with each other over cans of soup in supermarket aisles. People are generally wankers in car parks, and I bet the hole in my ass they got jammed up and fights broke out, complete deadlock with people unable to get in and out, fists flying and so on. In such a massive press, it would take only one person to get killed in a fight, and it would have been zombie ground zero, spreading like wildfire, and as I've stated, no firearms to stem the tide of growing undead. Panic makes people do stupid shit, like not checking the bathroom for zombies when they're busting for a dump, and people are generally stupid as a rule anyway in my experience. I mean, for fuck's sake. Get an inch of snow on the roads in England, and people lose their minds, grinding the country to a halt. A zombie apocalypse? Ha! Huh. There'll be mental and emotional breakdowns on an epic scale. We, as a nation, are not equipped to manage the social collapse, because most are selfish assholes. I wonder how the spiritual people are doing with their positive thinking and crystal energies. But that's me, just musing. It doesn't change my current situation. Problem number one. I need to find a lucky HQ that's away from the centre of all this bullshit. Thankfully, the nearest city is around 20 miles away, and man, I bet the likes of Manchester, Chester and Liverpool are fucked. Complete traffic gridlock, people fucking everywhere losing their minds, no direction, no clue, panic, mayhem, murder. So, to be able to get out of town, I need a vehicle, and my eyes keep getting drawn to the too-big-for-this-town SUV blocking the exit. The keys must still be in the ignition, as I doubt Mrs. Thompson Smythe had the presence of mind to pull them out when she jumped out of the car after running over her own kid. She switched the engine off, and I can see from here that the driver door is still open. So that's the best option. There are other cars in the school car park, but they're likely cars of people shuffling around as undead with their keys still in their pockets, so I could be fucking about all day trying to find them. No, the murder wagon it is. It's big. It made short work of an entire crew of teenagers as the silly bitch came tear-arsing into the school. 
It's high off the ground, and it's got keys in, as well as being a barrier to getting any other car out of here. So yeah, it will have to be the SUV. There is one slight hindrance to my plan, though. The battalion of acne-faced undead meandering around it. I need to draw the army of darkness away from the vehicle, and to do that, I need noise. Lots of noise. All the fucking noise. But how? Aha! Of course. Those other cars will come in useful after all. I'll set their alarms off. They'll be shuffling over to the source of that noise in as much time as it takes a nerd to start crying when the internet goes down. Man, I bet so many nerds just topped themselves the moment they realized the internet was gone for good. They'd have been like lemmings throwing themselves from the nearest high point. I'm not really sure about a destination, though. I mean, yeah, I've got a plan to draw the dead away from my intended escape vehicle so I can leap in, reverse out, and get out of town. But where the hell am I going? There's no use me breaking for it unless I have a clear idea of where I'm going. I've no idea how much fuel is in the vehicle, and a big bastard like that will drink it fast. Faster than a bunch of 19-year-old girls on a Saturday night in Cardiff can consume vodka Red Bulls in happy hour. And that is fast, dear reader. I have experience. There are photos. Now, I have one slight problem in going for a quiet farmhouse that is making me nervous. So, no, there isn't a plethora, I love that word, of guns in Britannia. People aren't carrying handguns, and every home doesn't have one. However, Farmers are likely to have a licensed shotgun for use on their lands, for shooting game and so forth. And I really don't fancy rocking up to a nice quiet farm looking for succor from the apocalypse, only to roll up and get shredded by a shotgun. That would really piss on my chips. Shit, this is like a rock and a hard place. I need somewhere away from it all, but those places are likely already getting locked down by their owners, who now have free license to shoot anyone they deem a trespasser without fear of any legal reprisal. Still, the alternate is dying a slow death in a classroom and shitting in a pencil case. Honestly, I'd rather get shot in the face. Okay, I have a plan. It's shit, but it's better than nothing. If I get the murder wagon and head out the back roads at the top of town, then head out even more along the quiet Cheshire back roads and find a nice empty house all on its own that doesn't seem to have anyone at home, I'm golden. I'll make the new plan from there. First thing first. School's out for summer. Sixth entry. School's out, bitches. Hey there, friend. Look, it's me. I'm not dead. My plan worked like a charm. I know, I know. You expected everything to go to shit, as did I. But nope. Nailed it. Everything went swimmingly on the escape, so obviously something was bound to go to shit later on. And it did. Big time. But first, let me catch you up. It's about 9pm now, and it's been a shitstorm of a day. But I made my escape from the school about 7am this morning. Here's my account of my crazy day. I'm writing this from a nice, quiet farmhouse, about four miles outside of town, with a new friend downstairs. I'll get to him shortly. But first, let's cover the great escape. So, morning came. And with a loaded backpack, I decided to go up to the roof and get a better panorama of the shitstorm below me so I could plan my route to the SUV. It took me no time at all to get out the window and spied a monkey up to the roof. However, I nearly fell off and died on the fucking spot as I was hauling myself up to the flat roof of the classroom building. Halfway up, as I was just about to swing my legs up, a shadow loomed over me, and I looked up to see an undead six feet away, shambling towards me, lips already starting to peel back in that flash of lunging rage I knew was coming. Jesus fucking Christ, my heart nearly stopped. 
The kid was about fifteen, shambling about on the roof above me these past few days, just feet away while I slept. The fact that I had no damn clue creeps me out like you wouldn't believe. These things are so fucking quiet. Now, at this point, I was in something of an awkward position. I couldn't go backwards because, well, backwards was a 30-foot drop to concrete and I didn't have time to get myself back into a climb-down position. I had horrible visions of the little shit dropping to its dead knees and taking a bite out of my fingers, so my only option was to power forward. Flicking myself up, I sprung past the teenage dirtbag, feeling its filthy claws sweep at me and miss by the width of a gnat's pubic hair. But then I was up on my feet, turned and ran back, leaping at it with both feet. Boom! Both feet, centre mass, and that fucker shot away like he'd just been snapped back by a bungee cord, right over the edge. I popped my head over the roof, just as the undead teen died from a severe case of concrete poisoning, which caused the rotten bastard to burst like a bag of vegetable soup. Wow. Check me out, Hemingway. Check out my awesome simile. I'm a literary genius. Like a bag of vegetable soup. Face palm. Sometimes I think I should just stop saying words. Anyway, retarded descriptions aside, I put that quick fright behind me and surveyed the realm. The burst zombie splashing onto the concrete drew the attention of some nearby Zeds and they came shuffling in my direction. But as they weren't exactly gymnasts, I was okay up on my perch. There were three cars close together on the right side of the car park, and if I could get their alarms going, they'd draw everything away from my escape vehicle, while I made a circuitous route back across the roof of the school buildings, preventing me having to work my way through the shambling mass. Then it would be dropped down, scamper to the murder wagon, get in the car, grab mum, kill Phil. Yeah, you get the picture. So that's exactly what I did. I worked my way round the back of the building, set those bitches off. I'm not going to write all the technical ins and outs, because it's boring, so let's just accept my awesome. And off they went. Wee-oo, wee-oo, wee-oo. And like a siren song to horny sailors, the mass began to move. Up to the roof again, began my scamper, with far more vigilance this time, and I watched with a fat grin as the mass pulled away from my target vehicle like iron filings to a magnet. It was glorious. Now I really was feeling like a strategos, after all my initial fuck-ups. This was going brilliant. As I watched the SUV clear of all zombie presence, I'm not gonna lie, I felt like a champ. I could do this planning shit. It wasn't that hard. Now all I had to do was get in the car, grab mum, kill Phil. I need to leave that joke alone. I'm tugging a dead horse there. Wait, that's not it. Flogging a dead horse, that's right. Shit, that changes the saying in all kinds of weird ways. Flush with my newfound confidence at my awesome skills of strategy, I shimmied down to ground level and prepared to head to the car. Not gonna lie, I had a bit of a swagger. Of course, that overconfidence results in anal penetration by a corroded metal sex toy, doesn't it? That sloppiness I was talking about earlier. That one that gets you painfully butt-pumped by spiky things with no lubrication for maximum friction? Yep, didn't follow my own advice. I dropped down and landed about eight feet away from three zombies. They weren't in school uniforms. All three of them were dressed in track suits with baseball caps on and hoods pulled up over. Teenager zombie chavs. Sigh. Brilliant. Just... Fucking brilliant. Honestly, at first glance I couldn't tell if they were alive or not. I mean, teenage chavs are complete dicks anyway, with uh as their common response to any question posed at them. Even giving them a sniff didn't help determine their life status, as the little bastards usually have a weird cocktail smell anyway, like Lynx Africa, weed, red stripe, and a week's worth of groin sweat all mixed together in one malodorous eau de twat. Honestly, that's not much different from The Walking Dead. The only reason I could tell instantly that they were actually dead was their silence. They weren't shouting, Yeah, bro, fucking tell your lad, 
and do you fucking know who I am, brah? Though I swear the grotty little fucks were still trying to roll their faux gangster pimp limps, even in death. Even so, they were damn close, and their ass-scratching hands began reaching for me as I touched down, lips drawing back to reveal teeth that had never seen the inside of a dental surgery. I had to go through them to get to my goal, so I took five quick steps back, and I'm not ashamed to say I squeaked like a little bitch when I first saw them, such was my surprise and their proximity. Pulled out the crowbar, dropped my backpack to the ground so my balance wasn't affected, and I did this United Kingdom a great service. Chavs are a curse on our once great and noble land. They're like the human version of wasps. They all look the same, they're all really aggressive, and won't just fuck off and leave you alone, and, two or one, they are all little fucking cunts, and I don't often drop the sea bomb. Braining those three little shits, who probably spent their days in life doing nothing but seeing how much of a twat they could be, was no great labour. The other Zeds I killed were for survival, and generally scared the shit out of me, but this unholy trio of smelly little shits were like a bit of catharsis. I felt absolutely nothing other than grim satisfaction smashing the hooked pointy end of my crowbar into their brain pans. You don't need a full description. Suffice to say, lucky three, chavs zero. Float like a butterfly, sting like a badass bitch with a crowbar. After wiping the crowbar clean, I did an ninja run over to the SUV. Checked the back seat first, always check the back seat like Columbus advised, and laughed aloud as the keys were indeed still in the car. I laughed louder still when I turned that key and it thrummed into life first time. So I closed the door, saw it had a three-quarter full tank, hell yeah, then popped it in reverse, connected the seatbelt, zombie survival rule number four, buckle up, and I was out and gone. I expected chaos and mayhem everywhere, but the truth was the roads were mostly clear. There were a number of accidents here and there, and scattered packs or lone zombies, but I think when the world shat itself a few days back, everyone just simply upped and fucked off before things got too bad. I avoided main roads anyway, and trundled away into rural Cheshire in search of a new home. Took me about an hour of crawling around back roads to find a likely place. Big farmhouse with fields all around, so good lines of sight, and it looked empty. There didn't seem to be any signs of life, but I thought it best to sneak in on foot and check it out, rather than drive right up in my thunder truck and give my position away. So, leaving the backpack in the car and locking it, and taking my trusty chaff slayer and a small claw hammer for weapon comfort, I decided to ghost in on foot. And that, my dear reader, is when it all went to fucking shit. Seventh Entry Old MacDonald had a hard-on. I think I'm pretty stealthy. I'm quick, light-footed, and a bit paranoid because everything in the world is trying to kill me. Generally, I'm quite perceptive when I actually bother to concentrate, but concentration is a bit of an issue for me as you have no doubt discovered from my collection of spectacular near misses along my little journey thus far, and my inane spilling of random thoughts. Well, this time I royally fucked it and almost got fucked. Literally. I sneaked up slowly to the farmhouse, keeping low, but as I said, the reason I chose the place was because I'd be able to see zombies coming from a way off, because there was clearance around the house. Well, that same pro turned out to be an equally large con when I was the one doing the sneaking. I was sure the place was empty because no crazed old farmer came out waving a shotgun at me or trying to blast me from existence, so it seemed like a win. Unfortunately, it just meant that the rampant thunder cunt who lived there was watching me like a predator as I approached and, knowing his own property far better than little old me, he waited like a trapdoor spider for me to wander into his kill zone. Honestly, it would have been a mercy if he'd just shot me. PTSD is going to get me soon enough, so let me explain why. There was a big barn-like structure attached to the side of the farmhouse, so I thought I'd have a peep in there first. 
but as soon as I pushed open the door and leaned my head in to check for undead, blam, everything went dark. No warning, no shout, nothing. Just a smack to the side of the head that knocked me the fuck out. And then this is when shit got really dark. I woke up feeling sick as fuck and tried to move. That was when I realized I couldn't. I was still in the barn I'd been in the process of sneaking into, judging by the open space I could sense around me, aged wooden wall four feet from my face and the straw-scattered earth beneath me. I was locked into this weird contraption that was a bit like, I shit you not, medieval stocks. My head and wrists were firmly clamped, but weirdly there was a right-angled frame built onto it, so my body was supported. However, when I came fully to my senses, I realized I was bent over at a right angle, my ankles also clamped with my feet flat on the ground and legs pulled slightly apart. And then I felt the air on my skin. I was clamped into stocks, ass sticking out, and my trousers had been removed. With this realization, my senses instantly sharpened from fuzzy headache to hyper-awareness. I started thrashing, desperate to get out. Here now, said a raspy voice to my left. That'll do you no good. I stopped cold and twisted my head to see the voice's owner. I nearly popped out a log of shit at the sight. Sitting in an old chair, but fucking naked, was some old guy. He was late fifties, I reckon, with a dirty white beard that was yellowed by nicotine round his lips, pasty white fish skin, a middle-aged paunch flowing around his waist like ooze, and an explosion of wild grey pubic hair not three feet from my face. Jesus fucking Christ, what a sight to wake up to. It was horrifying. Worse, he was sat there in his birthday suit, stroking himself. Leisurely working his shriveled dick into a wrinkly spear with a look of contentment on his red face, like he'd just had a steak and a blowjob, in that order. What the fuck, man, was all I could hiss, tearing my eyes away from the horror of him slowly wanking himself. Death seemed like a pleasant choice at that moment. He tusked, like I was some naughty kid who just said a bad word. You have a filthy mouth he observed. No fucking shit, I snapped back. See how fucking calm you stay when you're strapped to a rape rack with old MacDonald about to go E-I-E-I-R on your ass. Let me out of here, you freak. Out, he breathed. Sweet Jesus, he had a voice that was so calm and detached it was chilling. Out. Oh no, not yet. First, you have to be a good girl. I cannot articulate how fucking scared I was at this point. This creepy old naked guy was going to raid my ass like an anal pirate at his leisure, and there was sweet fuck all I could do about it. I was helpless. Utterly, absolutely, completely, totally helpless. And alone. After the past few days, after nearly dying in a toilet, having an old teacher try and eat me, and assaulted by three undead chavs, this was a real cosmic, fuck you, Lucky. I really didn't want my end to be as a chained-up rape doll for old MacDonald. A shotgun blast to the face would have been a mercy. I had no way out. I couldn't move a fucking inch in his custom Rapertron 3000, and he knew it. He was enjoying himself savoring the moment like a cat playing with its prey, trapped and injured, maximizing enjoyment from the kill. Well, he breathed finally, his withered cock now worked to attention. Jesus, that sight alone will give me nightmares, with his low-hanging old man balls swinging below him. When he sat on the toilet, he'd have to hoist those fuckers up so they didn't get wet in the bowl. God, I need to stop describing his cock and balls. It sounds like I'm obsessed. But when they're used as tools of fear and menace against you, they're the kind of things that stick in your memory. Rapey Santa got out of his dirty chair, and then, in full fucking view of me, 
he scooped something out of a pot and started smearing it all over his dick, making sure I could see. Goose fat, he rasped, his voice like a rusty blade. It'll make things more comfortable for us both. Then he gave a deep throaty laugh, like the sound a dog makes just before it throws up. I am not ashamed to admit I started to fucking cry and plead. I removed all pretense at being a badass then and straight up begged for him to desist, but those pleas fell on deaf ears. He disappeared from my sight and moved round behind me, and let me tell you, that terror is worse than seeing him work his dick into a frenzy in front of you. Now I couldn't see shit. I had no method of escape. I was utterly fucked and about to be violated by a creepy Cheshire farmer. It didn't matter that I wanted no part of it, and to be honest, I think that was part of the thrill for him. No matter how I thrashed, I couldn't move. I was at his mercy, and I almost threw up in terror as I felt his calloused hands slip over my hips like coarse sandpaper, hearing his breathing shallow as his excitement intensified. Fucking hell, I feel sick just writing this shit. Thank fuck for what, or more precisely who, came next. I've never been one for prayer. I don't believe in magic space fairies in the sky, but at that moment, I swore I would become a nun if something, someone, somewhere just did something to stop old MacDonald with his grunt grunt here and his grunt grunt there. I gritted my teeth, waiting for the inevitable, tears streaming down my face. What the fuck? came a graveled voice. It was a different voice to old McGrapey. It was harder, meaner, stronger. No cock smeared in goose fat invaded me, and for that I was eternally grateful. This is private property, said my captor. I heard him moving away, then the other voice spoke again. If Farmer Rapey had been in my ass at that point, I'd have probably broke his cock in two. When the new guy spoke again, I swear on my ass virginity, which had remained intact, it was the most chilling fucking sound I ever heard, with just the barest hint of a Yorkshire accent. My whole body tightened as fear locked every muscle. One step closer to that shotgun, friend, and you're a dead man. Nothing fancy. No flowery language, no flair. Just a simple, cold promise of what came next. There was a finality to it, hard, and yet somehow regretful he was being forced down this path. I believed him with every fibre of my being. That was a voice that knew the future and was saddened by what was to come. It was regret, but willing to see it through to the bitter end, no matter the pain. It went quiet, like there was a standoff, the two men staring at each other at an impasse. Then old McRapey must have gone for his gun, but the gunshot that sounded wasn't the tearing thunder of a shotgun. It was the crack of a semi-automatic handgun, and you don't find many of them in England. My ears were ringing, but I suddenly felt all the pressure at my ankles release, then a bit of fiddling and the stocks popped open and I sprang up and turned. The newcomer also looked in his fifties, but unlike my intended rapist who was all flab and filth, this guy looked like he was cut from aged granite. He was physically fit with narrowed eyes, close-cut hair, and jaw like a brick. He gave a flick with his head, indicating where my pants had been discarded, and I nodded, feeling much better once I was fully clothed again. New guy kept the gun in his hand, though, even though it was held loose. Loose, but ready. Fair enough, he had no reason to trust me. At least he had the decency to turn his back while I clothed myself. I like the guy. Old school values even though the world has gone to shit. I bet that's fucking rare in these weird times. Not my best of days, I said, trying to crack the tension. Cheers, mate, you literally saved my ass. I swear to fucking God, I was certain there was a flash of a smirk at one corner of his mouth, but his face remained pretty even. He did, however, seem to relax and slid the handgun into a holster at his hip. Lucky, I said, thrusting out my hand. 
Name's Erin Locke, but my friends call me Locky. And as you just stopped an unwanted invasion, you definitely fall into the friend category. He gave me this quizzical look, and it's one I've gotten used to over the years. I can almost see the words in a thought bubble above their head like a comic strip. Does this girl really talk like this all the time? Yes, yes I do. I broke the mold. I made my own mold. It's a bit wonky and has a stupid grin scratched into it, but this is me. Nate, he said, gripping my hand eventually. I smiled, trying not to weep as his mighty gorilla grip nearly shattered the dainty little bones of my hand. What are you doing here? I asked, hiding the flex of my crushed hand as I spoke. Saw the car at the gate, parked like it was in a rush. Fuck you, buddy, I'm great at parking. Put my hand on it and felt it was still warm. Saw the backpack inside and figured someone must be here. He shrugged. Thought I'd check it out. He curled his lip. Wasn't expecting to find this. He swept his arm round old MacDonald's rape barn. I glanced down at the dead man. Shit, Nate was a good shot. Clean between the eyes, no reanimation for you. I tipped my imaginary forelock to my grizzled saviour. And that, dear reader, is how I met Nathaniel Carter, ex-SAS, I think, all-round badass, and the man without a smile. I'll make this straight-faced fucker laugh if it kills me, though he might kill me first. But hey, life is for living, eh? I don't know when I'll write again, as I'm at the end of this notebook. I can't really just pop down to office outlet and get myself a new one. So for now, I must bid you farewell. It's been emotional. Stay safe. And watch your ass. Literally. And I will leave you with this inspiring, motivational thought. When life closes one door, another door opens. So shut the fucking door. There are zombies, you dick. Hide, run, stay away from doors. I hope we meet again, dear reader. Toodles, Lucky. Part two, the pug life. Eighth entry, particles. Today I found a new notebook to start scribbling my thoughts in. I think this is my eighth entry now, after all the weird school and farm shit went down. So, Hello again, my fine imaginary reader that has not read my journal because I'm still writing it. It's weird that writing helps me figure out all this jumble of crazy bouncing round in my head all the time. The world shat itself a couple of weeks ago now, and after I escaped the school I got trapped in, only to get trussed up and almost anally invaded by a freaky Cheshire farmer, then saved by Clint Eastwood's long-lost English cousin, a.k.a. Nate Carter, it's good to be writing again. I'm especially pleased, though, because I have big news. I found a dog. His name is Particles, and he's my lucky charm. Yeah, Particles. How freaking cool is that name? What makes it better is that he's a pug, so he's this tiny little grey ball of awesome that looks perpetually outraged by the apocalypse. I carry him in a little backpack I wear frontwards, with a hole cut in it for his head to stick out. Honestly, I look like fucking Quarto out of Total Recall, only my belly face is a permanently outraged pug staring balefully at the world, judging it. I love him. Nate hates my Quarto bag, as I've dubbed it. I'm pretty sure he still doesn't like particles, despite all the good he's done. Probably because he keeps saying... That's not even a dog. It's an accessory. Bah, the man has no soul. He'll see. Particles is lucky, and I'm going to tell you why he's lucky, and how we found him. Going back to Nate for a minute, I can forgive the big grumpy bear. He's a 50-something ex-SAS badass, I think, with a jaw that can chew bricks, and that rarest of all rare animals in this not-so-great Britain, he has guns and knows how to use them. He's seen some shit in his time, no doubt, and I'll forever love old Gunny Highway for saving my ass, 
literally, from Alder McRapey on his farm. But how he can hate little old particles with his particular brand of cute outrage, I'll never know. War has taken a piece of his soul he needs returning, so my mission in life is to make him love particles. Love him and squeeze him and call him his own. You watch me. I can be really annoying when I put my mind to it. I'm going to irritate Nate into loving particles. Not a sentence I expected to write today. So, how did we come by particles? Funny story. Well, actually not funny for particles' his previous owner. So, after Nate popped old McRapey between the eyes with his pistol and saved me from hell, we raided that farmhouse for supplies and hung round there for a few days. Eventually, Nate turned to me. We can't stay here, Erin, he said, in that throaty growl that makes him super manly. Lucky, I replied for the 57th time, flicking my long dark hair dramatically like I was in a shampoo commercial. My friends call me Lucky. Everyone calls me Lucky. Nate has this way. He lifts his left eyebrow about half an inch, managing to convey, in that tiniest of gestures, the displeasure and contempt of someone who has just watched a leper take a shit in one of their favourite shoes. He still doesn't do outrage as well as particles, though. Pugs have that shit nailed. Indignation is another forte of the pug. If I'd had particles at this point, I'd have held him up to Nate's face so they could have a stare down. Nate can't lick his own nose, though, so I reckon particles would win every time. We're no farmers, and there's little enough food here. Plus, it's miles from anywhere. We need to stay on the move. We, huh? I said. So, we're like Starsky and Hutch now, like Cagney and Lacey, Butch and Sundance. I smiled sweetly at him. Are we a power couple, Nate? He shook his head pug-like in his expression. Are you taking this shit seriously? Absolutely not, I replied. Ha, that stumped him. Erin, the world is over, he said, all grave and serious and baritone, purposefully ignoring my preferred handle for the umpteenth time. The dead are rising to eat the living. Society has crumbled. There's no government. There's no support. No one is coming. The world is dead. And you're not taking it seriously. Fuck no, I snorted. The world is shit and miserable, Nate. It's taken everything away from us, so the one thing I'm giving the apocalypse back is my ability to drop my pants and wink my brown eye at it in a grand cosmic fuck you. No point living if you're just gonna mope about. Be more Tigger and tell Eeyore to cheer the fuck up, that's what I say. Nate looked at me like I'd just boned his dad in front of him. We've not known each other long, but he looks at me like that a lot. Most people do. Usually when I say words. Anyway, we decided, and by we I mean Nate, to load up the SUV I'd swiped on my escape from the school with what supplies we could, then head out and keep on the move. Maybe he looked for a survivor community if any had started to form. I mean, it's early days yet, and people in this country are notoriously selfish assholes at times, and the world only died and shat its pants a couple of weeks ago, so there's some way to go yet before anything coherent starts to form, I reckon. But, then again, this is my first apocalypse, so what do I really know? I'm an apocavirgin, so to speak, so I don't know how much this is really gonna hurt. Damn, sometimes I should really stop writing. But I'm using a pen. I can't delete. So you're getting the unfiltered lucky brainwaves, I'm afraid, my imaginary reader. You're welcome. Only a day passed before my life changed for the better. We started hitting up some of the country houses for supplies in the local area, mainly diesel for the SUV. Nate has a real hard-on about fuel supplies and being mobile, and always insists on driving. And he drives so slow. It's like driving Miss Daisy with that old fart behind the wheel. 
not a soul on the roads, and he's driving like a pensioner on his way to Sunday church after three hits on a super skunk bong. I asked to drive once. He let me. Then after a half hour of Hurricane Nate blowing in my face as he raged at me for my speed and late braking, a load of old man stereotypical whine about women drivers, threats of shooting out my knees, and general, I fucking hate you, Erin, in various forms, I relented and swapped with him. Usually he's all calm and stoic, showing his contempt with an eyebrow or a tightening of the jaw, enough to let you know you're edging close to the line. My driving, it would seem, was his rage trigger. And oh, mama, that rage is scary. For the record, I only swapped because he's got a gun and that he could probably snap me in two like a twig without one. I'm a fast little ninja with skills of my own, but Nate has that look. I read a really great description in a fantasy book by David Gemmell that really sums it up. The look of eagles. That's a badass statement that just tells you anyone with this look is a stone-cold killer backed by experience and will not be fucked with. I can hold my own with anyone in fisticuffs, I reckon. I've never really thought, I can't take you, when I've been involved in a fight, and I had a few growing up in the care system. I learned to fight fast and dirty, because if you didn't fight back twice as hard, you'd always be prey. When you're a girl, you have to be twice as hard so you can rip the dicks off guys who think you're easy meat to satisfy their boner. So I learned to fight and never show fear, to blast in headlong and whirl my arms, keys in fists, windmilling in classic British kung fu style. I've never been afraid to take anyone on in a scrap. Except Nate. I'm just glad this guy is on my team, because I swear to God, He's the first guy I've ever met that genuinely scares me. If he lost his shit, like, really lost his shit, I bet he's fucking terrifying. You don't get in the SAS unless you're a quadruple hard motherfucker. Pretty sure the bastard drove extra slow after we swapped back, though, just to mess with me. I do go off on tangents. Okay, lucky focus. Particles, yes. So. We rolled up to this secluded farmhouse, but this one didn't seem like a working farm. It had a pretty garden, more like a cottage, to be honest. It had this weird little Nissan Micra parked on a gravel driveway as well. Bright yellow. God-awful thing. But it suggested the owner was still home. Not that anyone being home bothered Nate, as he stopped the vehicle at the end of the path, slid out the door, and drew the shotgun he'd taken from old McRapey's farm. Can you shoot? he asked, his voice low. Like a boss, I replied with supreme confidence. Probably too confident, as he cocked that fucking eyebrow at me again. I'm a stone-cold killer on call of duty, I added, making the finger guns and firing them off with a whispered, pew pew. Nate didn't let me have a gun. I followed in Nate's wake, at least able to match his light feet with my parkour skills. Balance and grace, I'm not afraid to admit, are two things I can actually boast about. I think I surprised Nate, because he looked back to find me in his wake, not blundering around like a drunk bitch fighting with a bra before bed. There was no eyebrow raise judging me. I call that a win. Nate has this freaky way of moving, his combat walk. His knees are bent, hips solid, gun up, always in balance. The barrel of that shotgun didn't quiver once as he stalked up the path. Scary shit. I was shitting sideways bricks in his wake, but he was calm as hell, breathing slow and even, not a twitch in any muscle. Stone cold. Ice instead of marrow in them bones. Though, in fairness, what did we have to fear from the inhabitant of a cottage surrounded by flowers who drove a bright yellow Nissan Micra? I was pretty confident a Taliban warlord wasn't hiding out in the Cheshire countryside, driving a car the colour of a daffodil. Everything was quiet. Deathly quiet. Nate signalled for me to open the little red gate that led up the path to the front door, and I did so. Now wasn't the time for me and my smart mouth. Do what the big scary soldier tells you, Lockie. As we ghosted up the path and reached the door, 
That's when we both heard the bumping and scraping from inside the cottage. The curtains were drawn on the front window, so we couldn't see into the little house. Then I heard the high-pitched yelp. People can go fuck themselves most of the time. In my experience, most people are assholes given half the chance. I don't trust easily. But dogs? Man, I love dogs. They are pure, unconditional, excitable love. They're like an animal version of me, but without the bad bits. They're role models for how society should be. Dogs are the only things on this shit-sucking earth that will love you more than it loves itself. You know what I really love about them? You can start celebrating and they'll join right in, wagging their tails and lolling their tongues when they have no fucking clue what the context is. Dogs are great because they're just always ready to party. So when I heard that little scared bark yelp, I started moving. Now, I know a weakness of mine is impulse control. And no, I'm not doing anything to mitigate that, dear reader, because I am who I am. However, on this occasion, I accept that I made the very grave error of plowing past Mr. Spec Ops and opening the cottage door, barreling in and realizing all too late that the place smelled like death had taken a shit in there. I stopped, eyes streaming from the choking cloud of horror assaulting my senses. Then I heard that little muted yelp bark again and turned to my left and promptly squealed at the pitch of a six-year-old girl. Just three feet away was a disheveled old zombie woman. I say old, but she was probably about Nate's age in life, 50 or so. Still, I'm only 26, so that's two of my lifetimes. Old as time. She had a little blue cardigan, spectacles on a chain hanging round her neck, and hair like Albert Einstein after he'd been electrocuted. Seriously, in that brief snapshot moment, all I could see was this explosion of mangled grey hair, like she'd been banged doggy style while her head was rammed in a bramble bush just all over the place and wild as hell. She wasn't moving too fast, slower than a normal shambler, and it was easy to see why. Her right ankle was clearly broken as hell, and moving about on it had only made things worse. The foot had all but torn off and sat at a horrible right angle, and she was off balance as she hobble-dragged herself around. A spur of bone from the shattered ankle was used to rest her weight on, like some messed-up pirate peg leg, and, Lord above, it was gross. There were bloody smears all over the once shiny oak parquet flooring, and grooves cut by the bone shard, where she'd dragged herself about and slowly torn that foot almost clean off. It made a jarring scrape on the wood as she moved, sending shivers through me like a rusty nail being dragged down my spine. Ah, just horrible. Despite her off-center gait, though, as she neared, the milky-eyed old deer's lips peeled back, her arms coming up like claws, ready to pounce like some undead predator. That's the weird thing, right? Our zombies don't shuffle about, arms up, moaning and groaning for brains like they do in all the movies. They are silent as a ninja fart, and way more deadly, and they smell worse to boot. They're blank as a mannequin until they're three feet from you. Then, their lips peel back, dead expression twisting to this rictus of soul-deep hate for you, and they fucking lunge that last gap, ready to make your entrails your extrails. I'm quick on my feet, but something had me frozen, and in that moment, I saw my death. Death that looked like some sweet old lady living in a cottage who drove a yellow Nissan Micra. The yelp had given me just enough time for a single step back as I squealed, arms up to futilely defend against the grim reaper's grandma as she lunged for me. But that one step back meant she had to step into the hallway and into Nate's cone of fire. Can I just give special mention to, as my first real experience of it, a shotgun going off in a little confined space like that cottage. Oh. My. Fucking. God. It was like a goddamn army of thunders tearing the air round me. Holy shit. The world got really loud, 
then really wet as I was hit by some of the spray from Nate unleashing both barrels of the shotgun simultaneously. The little old lady's upper quarter just vaporized in front of me, head and chest just gone, shredded beyond recognition. I think I got some old lady juice in my mouth. Nasty. I think I was screaming. My throat's vibrations told me I was, but I couldn't hear for shit. There was just a dull whistle from the detonated bomb of the shotgun's blast in the hallway. I was pretty certain I was going to need to find a new pair of underpants from somewhere, though old lady knickers were off the list. I don't have much self-respect, but I have to draw the line somewhere. Dropping the shotgun, Nate smoothly drew the handgun at his hip and stalked the hallway, completely ignoring me until he'd swept the rest of the building for any other undead. Then, his hand gripped my shoulder and gave me a shake, bringing me back to my senses. Are you hurt? He said, his voice sounding both distant and underwater. Jesus, guns are loud. Are you okay? Well, I shouted, like an Englishman pointing at fish and chips on the menu in a Spanish hotel. I'm so damn happy, I might need to sit on my hands to keep myself from clapping. You? Again, that, you've just boned my dad look. Hey, at least I'm consistent. Well, it turned out that Long John Grandma was named Patricia Fox, and, I shit you not, she was a goddamn quantum physicist. Now, I don't know what a quantum physicist actually is or what they do, but I do know that it's all science and shit, and she had books in her house that I struggled to even read the title of, never mind the content. Her picture was on the back of some of them, so she even wrote about quantum silly string theory, or whatever it is. Anyway, she was a scientist. She lived on her own, and from what Nate deducted from Sherlocking the place, it looked like she'd taken a fall, broken her ankle, and either died from infection or overdone the pain medication just to end it all. I can't tell you how sad that is. She was a quiet woman, smart as all hell, and she died in terrible pain, knowing there was nobody coming to her aid. The apocalypse sucks, man. She didn't die alone, though. That little yelp bark came from under an ornamental bookshelf or dresser or... I don't know. I don't know what furniture things are called. Anyway, whenever poor old Patricia spun off the mortal coil, she must have gone chasing after her little doggy, knocked this furniture thing over and trapped said dog in it. Because the dog was so small... The way the shelving had fallen trapped the animal inside a shelf space. Unbelievable look. That dog had a tolerance of about eight inches either side, or this big heavy bookshelf thing would have pancaked it, and that would have probably upset me more than Patricia's lonely death. How weird and messed up is that? Thankfully, Patricia's spectacular living intelligence didn't translate to her undead state, so she didn't have the presence of mind to lift said furniture up to get at the animal trapped beneath. That was one lucky little dog. Nate and I lifted the toppled furniture up and found a shivering little pug beneath. Is that a dog or a rodent? muttered Nate. That, my dear Nathaniel, is a pug. He couldn't have been under there more than a day, Nate reckons. Dr. Patricia hadn't been dead all that long. Again, that makes me sad. If only we'd arrived just a little earlier. Despite no doubt being terrified, trapped under there for up to a day, the pug looked up at me and though pitiful, shivering and scared, somehow he managed to look outraged. I fucking love that about pugs. There's something so very British about their quiet, unspoken indignation. They don't possess the small man syndrome of a terrier or Jack Russell. Those little hilarious bastards act like they're 20 times their size to compensate for their small stature, barking and screaming a challenge at everything. Pugs accept their diminutive size and accept they will spend most of their lives being carried around like babies, Yet, they have this look on their face that mirrors an angry middle-aged man that listens to Radio 4. It's a really sarcastic outrage, like the face of someone who holds a door for another, only to see them pass through without acknowledgement of the act. The quiet whisper of, you're welcome, lathered in a thick coating of sarcastic outrage, is embodied by a pug's face at all times.
It's like the world just annoys them and they have to accept being surrounded by absolute morons. I love it. Anyway, I picked the dog up, feeling him shiver, and found a blanket to wrap around him. Once I was sure he was okay, I fumbled on the collar and saw the name. Particles. I think I'd have liked Patricia. She was an old science loony who had an outraged pet called Particles. My kind of girl. We're not keeping it, Nate said. No way are we just abandoning him, I said. Particles saved my life. Again, that look. What? Had he not yelped when he did, I wouldn't have had the step back that brought Patricia into your line of fire. She'd have totally blindsided me and ripped me open. If you hadn't charged in there like a dickhead, you wouldn't have been in that situation. Ah, but I did act like a dickhead, I argued. Admittedly not my best retort. And I'll probably act like one again before too long. I felt like the hole was getting deeper at this point, but I was committed. But with particles here as my lucky charm, I might just make it to the end of this... end of days. Nate looked at me for a long moment, silent and thoughtful. You know none of that makes sense, right? I held particles up to his face so the little dog could convey my disgust at the notion of leaving him behind. Pugs have mastered that, too. I didn't choose the pug life, Nate, I said solemnly, with a completely straight face. The pug life chose me. Here's where shit gets hilarious. Nate was having none of it. We took anything we could of use from Patricia's little cottage, canned goods and the like, but I found a little backpack. I also found a big pair of those seamstress scissors, absolute monsters, and I set to the backpack as inspiration struck me. I got the measurements about right, packed the bottom of the rucksack with a blanket from the dog's bed I found, then lowered particles into the bag, zipped it up, and out popped the pug's head from the hole, quarto style. I thought it was genius. You've got to be fucking kidding me, was Nate's opening statement when I walked out with the backpack as a front pack and particles staring moodily at Nate, flicking his tongue out to moisten his nose. What? He's only got little legs. Poor little guy will never keep up. Nate looked at me for far too long, as still as granite. For a moment, I swear he was considering popping a cap in both our asses and going on with his own existence, free of loud-mouthed idiots with too much energy and overly judgmental canines. For fuck's sake. The words hissed out in a low breath. Get in the car. We'd been driving for about half an hour when Particles started to bark. He'd been silent and still for the entire journey, but something really jabbed him in the ass and stirred him, his little head turning to peer at Nate. It was like the dog was shouting at him. Hilarious. What's up with him? He's house trained, I mused, probably telling us he needs to go potty. Needs to go potty? Yeah, you know, take a piss, dump, maybe both. No, I know what you mean, Nate huffed. It's just, need to go potty. Did you really need to say it like that? It's a dog, not a toddler. Well, however I say it, Nate, you can stop the car and let particles here split the atom, or we can have our own fecal big bang in the car. I am so persuasive at times. Nate muttered a quiet curse under his breath and pulled over. I slipped out of the SUV and let particles out so we could go spray some particles on nearby vegetation. Nate got out as well, ever the vigilant super soldier, eyes scanning the surroundings. There was a pickup parked just out of sight of the road in an overgrown layby. While I watched particles with his weird tiny legs do that hilarious little run hop thing pugs do, Nate palmed his handgun to his grip and combat walked to the truck to check it out. When Particles had finished, Nate walked back over, and I swear to shit, he was almost smiling. That pickup still has the keys in, almost a full tank, and no dead anywhere to be seen. He sounded positively joyous. Let's unload everything out of this into the pickup. It's more spacious, bigger engine, 
better ground clearance, a spare tire, and you'll never believe what else. I stroked particles knowingly, like a Bond villain with his white cat. Go on. There was actually a hunting shotgun in the back, with two full boxes of shells. I gave him a raised eyebrow, a knowing look. Any gun at all in England was as rare as rocking horse shit. What? he demanded, his leathery face creased into a frown. Say it. I got a genuinely confused look. Say what? Say thank you to particles. His expression quickly shifted into the leper shitting in your shoes look. What? I told you he was lucky, I said imperiously. He saved my ass with a well-timed yelp, and now he's got us not only a new vehicle with a full tank, but one with a gun and ammo. This is Cheshire, Nate, not Texas. Of all places Particle needs to curl a turd out, it's right here, where there's a shiny new vehicle with fuel and weapons. Come on, admit it. He's a lucky mascot. This time his expression reflected a man who had just witnessed a mutant penis grow out of my head while he watched. It's just coincidence, he huffed eventually. Denial, Nate, really? I sniffed in a mock haughty fashion. Just accept that Particles is lucky. Help me transfer all this shit to the pickup, he growled. Particles just looked at him, outraged. He still wouldn't admit my pug was lucky, even though we were pootling in a giant dick compensator and going about 12 miles an hour because of Dame Carter at the wheel, and the proud owners of a new shotgun, Nate refused any further conversation on the subject of Particles being a lucky mascot. It's just coincidence, he said. Well, isn't it too coincidental to be coincidence, I argued. I mean, come on, Nate, a fucking gun with ammo in the Cheshire countryside, unattended, with a truck that has keys in and nearly a full tank. Exactly where we stopped. Come on, admit it. That's not just coincidence. That's providence. What, so now we're being looked after by a higher power? I shrugged. Dog is God spelled backwards. Just saying. Nate swore. I was starting to piss him off. I should have stopped. Really, I should have but I did make it rather clear earlier that I have a real issue with impulse control. All I'm saying is that there are no coincidences, only the illusion of coincidence. No way you just made that up, he accused. You're not that insightful. Cheeky bastard. Maybe I'm just too lazy to show you how clever I am. He went to reply, stopped, then chuckled. Actually fucking laughed. Now that's probably the smartest thing I've heard you say. He glanced over. So, who said the other thing? I thought about lying, but Nate actually cracking a smile was too good a chance to pass up, so I grinned back. V for Vendetta, Alan Moore, I admitted. We drove on for a little while longer. While we did, Nate talked me through loading the new shotgun. Despite my earlier dickhead reply about Call of Duty, I had to learn how to shoot. Firearms were too big of an advantage over the undead. That was one thing the Americans have over us in fighting this global shit show. They have more experience and more bullets to use against the shambling legions of undeath. I had a great resource in Nate, so I'd be a dumb little prick not to use it. While he drove, he talked me through popping it open. That's called a break action, apparently, and sliding the two cartridges into the barrels. This one was a single selective trigger, Nate said, meaning, unlike the older model he shredded Patricia with that had two triggers, allowing both barrels to be blasted at the same time, this one alternately fired each barrel. Hey, look at me, learning yo. So, I loaded up the new shotgun with two shells, and it was all ready to fire. Then Particles started to lose his shit. The fuck is up with your dog, demanded Nate. I'd let Particles out of his quarto bag to sit on the seat with us. Obviously, he seemed outraged by this at the time, but he got on with it. Now, though, 
It was like he was injected with crack, barking and yelping, scampering all over me with his tiny legs. No idea, I answered truthfully. I've been his owner for about two hours, not exactly his homegirl for life just yet. Nate put the brakes on, stopping the pickup just before crossing a junction. Honestly, for a horrible second, I thought he was going to draw his pistol and put particles down. I can't drive like this. You need to... The words died as a box truck whistled past the front of our pickup at about fifty, just inches away. Had Nate not stopped when he did, that big-ass seven-and-a-half-ton beast would have side-swiped us. At that speed, Nate on the right in the driver's seat would likely have been turned into a splash. What the... The box truck careened on and smashed with a bone-crunching thunder into an abandoned car parked on one side of the road. It was an unholy mess of twisted metal, the box truck flipping to its side, the back doors cracking open as it slid to a sparking halt on the asphalt. Stay here, ordered Nate, slipping out the driver's door and palming the handgun, legs bent as he moved forward with liquid grace, perfectly primed and balanced for battle. Damn. That always looked so badass. Obviously, I disobeyed a little. I got out my door, laying the shotgun I'd been messing with on the seat. I watched Nate stalk towards the truck that had appeared out of nowhere at speed. I glanced down at Particles, who looked up from the seat expectantly. You are one lucky dog, I said, turning my attention back to Nate, then whispered, Holy shit. Nate had gone still. Out of the back of the box truck, bloody, shambling figures were beginning to emerge. Seriously, what the hell? Who the hell was carting zombies round in a truck? About twenty-five Zeds crawled, shambled, and fell out of the toppled truck, all their white eyes fixed on Nate. Like he was shooting at a fairground range, Nate just planted his feet and went to work. Two hands on the pistol, he was steady, sure, and somehow made the whole thing look easy. He didn't rush, or maybe he made it seem like he was taking his time, I don't know. What I do know is that the air filled with the crack of his glock as he started to put the mini hoard down, one by one. Every shot was lethal, popping an undead melon with unerring accuracy, the bodies dropping like marionettes that had just had their strings cut. It was an honour and a privilege to see him go to work. He popped a magazine out the pistol and switched in a new one from his tactical vest in one fluid motion before resuming firing. Just as his gun barked into life once more, Particles let out an agitated bark of his own. As I turned to see why he was so tetchy, my eyes glanced over the rearview mirror on the door I leaned on. My heart almost stopped. There was a zombie only inches away from me. Fuck, these things are so damn quiet. Distracted by Nate's badassery as he single-handed took down a mini horde of undead, one single zombie had slowly shuffled up behind me, not making a single sound as it approached. As I caught sight of it in the mirror, it peeled back its lips, revealing nicotine-stained teeth and bright red gums, an expression of hate twisting its chubby features like my very existence was an offence to it. The guy was fat, a sliver from morbid obesity. There was a lot of weight in it, and to top it off, it was wearing a really loud green and orange Hawaiian shirt. It was bad enough a fat guy had crept up on me, but a fat guy in a Hawaiian shirt? Shame. I barely had time to react as the thing lunged at me. God, that lunge is pants shitting. It really comes at you with predatory speed. I got my arms up in time to deflect its grasp, sliding my forearm underneath the zombie's nine chins, across its throat, and forming a makeshift brace as it snapped its rotting teeth inches from my face. It couldn't bite me yet, but I'm only a wee slip of a girl. I'm five six and built to be a spider monkey up drain pipes and jumping rooftops and ledges. I'm a tracer not a wrestler, and even if I was, I'd be a lightweight. This gigantic blob was a super heavyweight, and the combination of his gargantuan girth and forward momentum with his lunge drove me back. Ultimately, it drove me down. I could still hear the crack of Nate's pistol as he cut down the horde, so no help was coming there. 
He had no damn clue I was being swallowed up by this giant blob of undead flesh. What a way to go. If the blob didn't tear off my face with his smoker's teeth, I'd either suffocate on his oozing flesh or just be crushed under his extreme weight. I had nowhere to go, as the pickup door was behind me, and it was all I could do to stop the thing biting me as my mind fought for some solution to this absolute horror. The weight was too much, though. The pressure caused by his obesity and my balance utterly fucked from its initial lunge. Eventually I buckled and went down, the giant undead atop me, and only my forearm ran under its chin, preventing those teeth from tearing chunks out of my beautiful face. My dear reader, I was going to die. I was sure of it. An ignoble death, born to the ground by a fat guy in a Hawaiian shirt, while Nate was gunning down a horde like a boss on his own. I always thought my death would be a blaze of glory, like missing an impossible leap to a ledge and plummeting to my death to die from concrete poisoning. Suffocated and chewed to death by a fat guy wasn't on my list. My strength was giving out. Like I said, I'm only a little gal, and even if this thing was still human, I'd have struggled. It wasn't human anymore, though. It was a feral thing, powered by some dark force, I'm sure of it. This wasn't any virus outbreak like in the movies. This was fueled by hate, a hate so total and absolute that only the utter destruction of my flesh would sate it. That hate gave it strength beyond the human. It was almost demonic. I was going to die. Then there was a sound by my head like a storm cloud tearing itself apart, and the zombie's head exploded. All the pressure vanished as the detonation rattled my skull and royally fucked me in the eardrum. I couldn't hear for shit, and I was absolutely drenched in zombie goop. Blair, just awful. My head felt like it would crack open, such was the aftershock of the gunshot. Had Nate finally finished and come to my aid, seeing my struggle on the asphalt? Heaving the headless corpse aside, I looked down at my torso. Fuck me, I was covered in zombie shards. Nasty. Spitting a piece of fat man's scalp out of my mouth, I put one filthy hand to my left ear, which was still deaf, the right ear muted by a dull whine, and turned to check on particles. The shotgun I'd loaded was lying on the seat where I'd left it, the barrels pointing out of the vehicle. A wisp of smoke ghosted from the end of one barrel, evidence of its recent firing. The dog had gone arse over tit into the footwell of the pickup. The fucking dog must have stepped on the trigger and somehow fired the weapon, and the recoil thrown the poor little bastard as it cannoned backwards from the blast. However, that freak firing had blown the fat zombie's head clean away. It must have been in the perfect place to shred fat boy, but leave me untouched by the spread of buckshot. A completely freak occurrence. You are one lucky fucking dog, I said, spitting another chunk of fat guy from my mouth. I gave Particles a baleful look as he sat in the footwell. One might even say I looked outraged. He just licked his nose and gave me the same look back. Particles did it better. Nate finished his execution of the horde and appeared above me. Holy shit, he said, seeing me drenched in undead goop. Now will you believe me? Eh? I pushed myself to my feet, leaning into the truck and pulling Particles out, holding him up to Nate's face. Naturally, Particles looked outraged by this turn of events. He saved my life against Pegleg Patricia, I said. He got us a new truck and gun, he saved us getting sideswiped by a box truck full of zombies, and now he's just shot a fucking zombie with a shotgun. Come on, Nate, now you've got to accept the truth. Particles is a lucky dog. Without him, we'd be fucked. I stopped then. What was the deal with the truck, by the way? Nate shrugged. No idea. Driver must have been bitten a while back and died at the wheel. He'd reanimated and I had to put him down after dropping his passengers. Makes no sense. Nothing in this world makes sense anymore, Erin. Aha, I said, seizing the day. That's where you're wrong. Keeping particles makes sense, you have to admit. He's now a member of the team, right? 
Nate looked at me for a long time before the ghost of a smile haunted his lips. Okay, the dog can stay. Yes! I made Particles do an involuntary victory dance in the air, which he naturally looked outraged by. Just to be clear, added Nate, he's not part of the team because he's lucky. I frowned. Then why? Nate quirked a smile at one side of his mouth. Because he's killed more zombies than you. For the first time in my life, I was speechless. I turned particles to face me and stared at him. Outraged. Part 3 Negative Energy Ninth Entry I think it's July. Hola, amigo. I haven't written anything in a while, but I found this shiny new notebook. It's pink with hearts, stars and rainbows all over the cover. It's absolutely fucking awful and looks like a unicorn threw up on it, but it'll serve my purpose. And that purpose is recording the new adventures of Erin Locke. Loud applause, Nate Carter, muted polite applause, and Particles, my lucky pug. And the crowd goes wild! It's been a couple of weeks since I last wrote anything. The apocalypse has been in full flow for roughly a month now, and Nate, Particles and I have been touring the countryside like some shit BBC show following B-roads and seeing the back country sites of the green and pleasant land. Nate had a hard-on for always being mobile, never stopping in one place too long. But it's really starting to grate on me now. Like, really? I really want a bath or shower, or I'm going to be able to pass myself off as a zombie soon enough, with the death stench rising from my pits and crotch. I'm no girly girl that needs pampering, but I am a normal human being that likes to at least be clean. So, what have we been up to? Well, Nate taught me to shoot. Not with his pistol, as he says that his ammo stash is limited for that, and it's too important a weapon. But after Particles' magic powers helped us discover a new shotgun with two boxes of shells, he showed me how to use that. Put a controller in my hand on Call of Duty, I'm the baddest stone-cold bitch that ever pulled a trigger. The first time I fired a real shotgun, I fell over and squealed, as it felt like someone had smacked me in the tit with a hammer. Fucking hell. Shotguns kick like a mule on PCP. This is not like the movies. Shooting is fucking hard, and it's doubly annoying that Nate makes it look so damn easy. Anyway, I've got the basics, and Nate showed me how to take shit apart and clean it, as apparently that's super important for reliability. We need some more supplies in that regard, which is partly why we've been hitting up every remote farmhouse we can find, as that's likely the only places we'll find shotgun ammo and cleaning stuff. As it turns out, the fucker was right. We're pretty fat on shotgun goodies now, but Nate's starting to get all twitchy about his Glock ammo. Nine mil is a bit harder to find in rural Cheshire, like zero chance except for police stations with AFO capability, and he says he's okay for now, but still. It's starting to get a bit old now, though. With driving Miss Daisy here rolling around at 15 miles an hour, it's boring beyond belief. Also, being stuck in a car with a sweaty man and a dog is pretty rank. If either one of those two drops a fart in the car, I swear you'll still be chewing on it an hour later. Just gross. Also, I'm getting sick of squatting in bushes when I need to go potty. Generally, I'm just sick of it. I need some interaction with people. I'm a social person, I need conversation, banter and bullshitting. Nate has the conversational desire of a brick and he's all business, all the time. Plus, the only sign of people I see are undead ones. Nate is only a marginally better conversationalist than the zombies, and he doesn't try to bite my pretty face off. But surely the whole point of an apocalypse is we have to come together and rebuild? Surely. Not for Gunny Highway here, though. Anyway, 
Our hand was starting to get forced, as I caught Nate glancing down at the dash repeatedly yesterday. What's up? I asked. Low fuel, he rumbled back. He's so economical with words, shortening his sentences to the minimal amount. You can see why he's a pain in the ass. What's our stash like? Almost gone, he said. Great, I muttered. And here we are, crawling around the arse end of nowhere. Don't think we're going to find a petrol station in. I looked out the window. Where even the fuck are we? As far as I can tell, we're in fucking Narnia. You swear a lot, he observed. Well, fuck a doodle do, Sherlock. Nothing gets past you. That was pretty unfair. But you have to understand, the old bastard was really getting under my skin by this time. The last thing I needed was some old soldier telling me I cursed a lot for a girl. Thankfully, those three words hadn't been tacked on as yet. But I swear the minute he does, badass soldier or not, I'm dick-punching him. Nate said nothing to my childish response, which is just as infuriating. You know when you really feel like having it out, like a really cathartic screaming match to blow out the dust? I was ready for one of them, but Nate never bites. He just cocks that infuriating eyebrow at you and says nothing more, making you feel like a whiny little twat. Bastard. We trundled on in silence for a little while more, and it was starting to get dark. We'll sleep in the car tonight, Nate announced. Can't afford to trundle around in the night looking for a new place to stay. We'll be all right out here. He declared this as he pulled into a rough imitation of a lay-by and put the pickup in park. Seriously? In the car? With you and a pug? I swore again just to piss Nate off. I'm making you a solemn promise that if you start to snore like an asthmatic ogre, I will throat punch you. Nate's mouth just quirked in the twitch of a smile, just for a moment. We ate cold food from a can, which was about as pleasant as it sounds, and settled down for a shitty night in a pickup. I was awoken sometime after dark. It wasn't super late, maybe around ten, but there was an obvious change to the world outside. I shit you not, my dearest reader, I could hear fucking drums in the distance. Not war drums, like a Zulu horde was suddenly going to appear on the horizon, but really shit, random drumming, like the contents of a percussion studio had been handed to a bunch of three-year-olds, smacked up on sugar and left unsupervised. And there was something like singing or chanting, or some of the shittiest karaoke I've ever heard in my life. It carried on the quiet night air, and all I could think was, you know there's a fucking apocalypse, right? Nate and I had our chairs clocked all the way back for sleep, and I was about to sit up when his hand rested lightly on my arm. I glanced over at him, and he just shook his head, the movement barely perceptible in the gloom, as he lifted one finger to his mouth to shut me up before I said anything dumb. Then he pointed at my window. My arse nearly dropped clean out as I spied the silhouette of a shambling figure, not two feet from my door, shuffle blindly past. I was too afraid to even shudder in horror in case I made any kind of sound at all. Then another went past, and another. Every one of them was silent as a crypt, only the odd scrape of a shoe on asphalt disturbing the night air. Super creepy. I swear, I was twitching and sweating like Anne Frank in a pair of tap shoes as the undead wandered blindly past us and looked down to particles, feeling the little guy shiver under my hand. He was scared witless, which was much better than him barking some challenge at the undead and drawing them to us. He's a good pooch and knows when to keep his mouth shut. I watched in cold silence, hugging particles to me, as about eight or nine undead shambled past us up the country road, drawn to the constant wall of noise by the morons in the distance. All three of us remained perfectly still, not even the twitch of a muscle, until the group had passed us by. We waited in silence for another hour, the same stupid drumming and chanting banging away for at least another thirty minutes. No more undead shuffled past, and finally, we started to relax. 
Didn't get much sleep that night, though. Shit. I'd never been so damn happy for the sun to come up and the world have the lights flicked back on again. What was that drumming last night, do you think? I asked Nate. He shrugged. No idea. But whoever they are, they're thick as shit. We should go warn them, I said, excited at the prospect of new people. Nate shook his head in the negative. They made their choice. Can't risk it. What if they don't know, Nate? I said. What if they've no idea the world's shat itself? How can anyone not know? I shrugged. I didn't say I had the answers, but come on, we know there are other people nearby now. Let's find them. Strengthening numbers, blah, blah, blah. Nate snorted, spooning more beans from a can into his cavernous maw. Those numbers sound more like a hindrance than help. He was starting to get on my nerves now. Look, you big, miserable bastard. There are people nearby who might not know if the world is even ass-fucked by razor blades. But more than that, there are simply people. I threw my hands up, exasperated by his spectacular lack of give a shit. What's the fucking point carrying on living like this, Nate, huh? Crawling around, picking over graves and empty farmhouses for little bits of food, a splash of diesel here and there, maybe some nice shotgun cleaning supplies or ammo. That's all very well as a start, but that isn't any life, Nate. This is just a fucking existence. I want people. I want a bath. I want to stop moving just for a little fucking while as we figure all this shit out. I was almost panting by this stage, shoulders heaving and spitting my words through clenched teeth. Fuck, I want some clean clothes, I moaned. I swear my sports bra is fucking mold growing on it right now. Hell, I just want to take my damn bra off for an evening. Clearly my brazier talk made Nate a little uncomfortable, what with him being so old school and what not. So obviously, being the little shit that I am, I jumped on that like a predator. I think new life is starting to grow in my underboob, Nate, I said, my mood improving with each new squirm. A whole species of tit fungus is growing in those dark and dank places. I need to give them a good scrub and let them air for a bit. Same with my crotch. He visibly blanched as I moved the conversation below. I swear upon all that is holy and sacred, my lady garden has turned into the Amazon in rainy season with all the sweat down there. Okay, okay, he said, holding his hand up in defeat to stop me talking. Shit, we'll go take a look. No promises if we'll stay, but fucking hell, Erin, please stop jabbering about your bits. Victorious, I gave him a haughty nod, like I was royalty granting my approval to a peasant soldier. Well, good, I said imperiously. People, sweet, I couldn't wait. I was so looking forward to it, potentially a community, and if I was really lucky, they'd have some kind of running water for a bath or shower. I don't even care if it's cold. I just want to stop smelling like a zombie shut me out yesterday and left me to bake in the sun. Well, we met those new people. I'm going to give my hand a rest before I introduce you to our new friends. Oh, my fucking God. Buckle up. Tenth entry. Seriously? We set off at a slow roll, mainly because Nate's two speeds are crawl or dead when he's behind the wheel. We followed the road for about a mile before Nate brought the pickup to a dead stop. Shit, he breathed. There was a big ass wooden gate just set off from this tiny country road, a good eight feet tall, mounted on columns of brick. Either side were just long lengths of dense brush, utterly impassable for anything larger than a fox that acted as a border wall. However, milling about outside the gate were zombies. Lots of zombies. There must have been maybe forty or fifty, just banging their faces against the gate, pressing against it. I could see it was bent inward slightly from the inexorable push that the undead provided, tireless and constant. How are there so many? I whispered. 
Nate shrugged, his deep voice almost inaudible. Don't know. Maybe those morons have been doing that drumming night after night, and they've been drawn in over time in tiny groups, like that one last night. He sniffed. That seals it, though. What seals what? We can't get in, and I'm not blazing through ammunition to take all those fuckers down. He glanced at me askew. And you're not combat effective enough for this tight space. Open space, maybe, but not crowded on this little narrow road. There must be another way in for people with actual brains, I offered. Those dumb shits will continue to try and use their faces as a master key. But we've got actual thoughts. Let's park up and find somewhere else we can climb over. Erin, we... Lucky, I corrected again. Erin, he repeated, just to be an ass. What's the point? People are the point, Nate. They clearly don't know what's knocking at their gate. Come on, back the fuck up, park the truck, and come the fuck on. I slid out of the truck to make my point, particles under one arm and his Coato bag in the other hand. Seriously? He hissed, one eye glancing back to the mass of undead at the gate in case any had noticed us. They were a good distance away. You're taking the dog. If you think I'm leaving particles behind in a truck with the sun coming up, you're very wrong. It's already warming up. I'm not leaving the little guy to die a melty death in a truck. Particles emphasized my point by staring balefully at Nate, outraged at the notion of being left behind. Nate said nothing, though I could almost hear the string of profanity echoing in his head, and I closed the door quietly. Nate backed the truck up round the corner, out of sight of the mass of shamblers, before climbing out. He kept his voice low as I settled particles into his carry bag. As his head popped out of the hole, all indignant at the inconvenience, Nate just stared at us both for a moment and shook his head in obvious irritation. Cheered me right up. We managed to find a way into the property by climbing a tree further back on the road, then moving along the boughs and dropping down the other side. Nate did an admirable job for an old guy, but he carries considerably more weight. I, of course, with my mad parkour skills, scampered up the tree, scooted along, and dropped lightly down on the other side. Nate's attempts were comical, with him blowing out his arse as he dragged himself up, shakily moved across the branches, then flopped like a 200-pound bag of shit on the other side. Wasn't so bad, eh? I gave him a shit-eating grin. Maybe not for a demented squirrel like you, he growled. Particles stared back at Nate, silently judging him. We pushed on, and as we entered a lush green field, there was a beautiful-looking building at the top of a hill, all wood and glass. Pretty big, too. Not some little cabin. It looked like some classy chic hotel for the elite that had limited spaces. We could see a handful of cars parked outside, a long and slender road running from the building down to the front gate we'd seen from the other side. Couldn't see a single zombie from this side through the solid gates. You might see their feet if you went up close through the small gap between the earth and the gate's bottom, but other than that, looking down from the building would reveal nothing about the undead party taking place at the gate. Ever vigilant, Nate had come looking like he was ready for some mass execution, all dolled up in his badass tactical vest, spare clips for his handgun, shotgun shells aplenty, and the double barrel with the selective trigger loaded and ready for action. We could hear voices, even though it was probably only seven in the morning. Just a single, soothing voice, all hypnotic, though no words could be made out. We crested the rise, following the sound of the voice, and as we reached the top, both of us stopped dead. There, on the grass in front of this stunning country retreat, were ten people. Doing yoga. Yoga. Fucking yoga in the apocalypse. You only had to take one look at these people to know that Nate wasn't going to get on with them. These people were gentle-looking, flighty and farty, breathing in the country air and finding their centre and learning to love themselves or some shit, while I was accompanied by the Terminator's granddad. 
The instructor was the only one facing us when we appeared, a quite beautiful woman in her mid-forties who clearly took really good care of herself. One thing I immediately noticed was that everyone looked clean, and that gave me real hope for my future. The instructor's eyes were closed as she talked, holding some position that was sure to win any game of Twister without fail. But as she relaxed and began issuing her next instruction, she opened her eyes, and Nate and I were both in her cone of vision. She stopped for a moment, too stunned at seeing our incongruous little trio standing outside their shiny lodge. There was Nate, all in black, tactical vest, handgun, shotgun, and a facial expression that silently said, What the actual fuck? He shit at hiding what he thinks, especially when he thinks, What the fuck? Then there was me, dirty and disheveled, with an off-center ponytail in hair that hadn't been washed in a month or more, my loose athletic pants, battered Nikes, vest top and hoodie, with a backpack hanging over my torso, and a pug's head staring back at them all, judging them. I waved and smiled, knowing full well Nate probably looked like he was about to execute every last motherfucking one of them. The instructor let out a little squeal, squeaking out a name. Theo! A man at the front, about the same age as the yoga teacher, probably a little older, actually, paused in his stretch and turned, blanching at the sight of us. To be honest, I nearly blanched at the sight of him. He had this really weird round face, with crumpled skin in folds, and a shock of wiry black hair on his head and sticking out of his chin, like he'd just been electrocuted. When I saw him, all I could think of was how he looked like a testicle. With teeth, the whole group by now had turned to see the commotion, and most of them squealed, clustering together fearfully, begging for their lives like Nate was about to start blasting. Whoa, whoa, I shouted, trying to get them to calm the fuck down. Hey, we're not here to hurt anyone. This is private property, declared Testicle. Um, Theo. He tried to muster as much gumption as he could, but honestly, he sounded on the verge of tears. I'll call the police. Both Nate and I stared at him for a moment, stared at each other for another moment, then turned our gaze back to him. As one, we both laughed. Okay, Theo, is it? He nodded dumbly. Okay, Theo, first question. Where's your phone? As I thought, nobody who looks like this guy takes his phone to yoga. He looked like a kid just caught in a lie, and his bottom lip quivered the same way. Secondly, we're not here to hurt anyone. We heard your drumming and chanting last night, and, as you can see, we're a little worse for wear. I gestured to my appearance, which was clearly lacking my usual hotness. And thirdly, call the police. Really? How long have you been here? Do you even fucking know what's going on out there? I gestured in a general sweep behind me. This is a sp spiritual retreat, stammered Theo. We've been here since the 20th of June. No electronics permitted. Fork testy. Theo, I corrected quickly. Shit, he really did look like a toothy bollock. How fucking long is this retreat? 30 days. A month? I choked. A fucking month? Who the hell can afford to fuck off for a month? I mean, come on, a month of doing yoga, chanting, meditating, inhaling incense and twatting drums round a campfire? Who the shitting hell can afford that? Are you telling us, growled Nate, are you seriously telling us that you haven't been in contact with anyone outside this lodge for the past month? No one, affirmed Theo. The retreat finishes the day after tomorrow. Nate and I shared another amazed look, one of utter disbelief. While the world has been holding the side of the toilet bowl with two white-knuckled hands, screaming in horror as it shits out bloody spikes, this bunch of twats has been singing Kumbaya blissfully unaware of the world's end. Un-fucking-believable. Nate, I said, put the gun down, you're scaring the hippies. Nate snorted and lowered the shotgun. 
Now look, I said. We're really not here to hurt anyone, so can we start again? My name's Erin Locke, but everyone calls me Lucky. This here is Nate Carter, and this is Particles. I think you better put the kettle on. Tell me you have coffee. Theo shook his head. Green teas, chamomile, fruit teas. This is a place of healing and cleansing. Here we detox and reconnect with our inner self. Here we go, I thought. Here comes the twat speak. I could feel Nate's disgust rolling off him in near physical waves. These were not his people. Typical, you're all on a detox when I really need to tox the shit out of myself, I moaned out loud. Well, put some fucking asparagus and broccoli tea on, or whatever it is you drink here, and let's talk. There's some shit you need to know. 11th Entry Our Intrepid Adventurers I think it's fair to say that when we first explained how the world had come to an end, they thought we were the ones taking magic mushrooms and not them while they drum round a campfire. Before we get into it, allow me, fair reader, to introduce you to our spectacular bunch of idiots. First of all, we have the owners of the lodge. The Gaia Lodge, it's called. Of course it is. Anyway. The owners are the pretty yoga instructor in her forties, Grace, and her husband, Theodore, a.k.a. the toothy testicle. This pair are fucking off their sweet spiritual tits, fully invested in chakra and detox and inner self and spirit totems and crystal therapy and any other holistic bullshit that has no founding in any form of science. Turns out, they're also savvy as fuck in many ways. Every one of these eight raging dickheads paid eight fucking grand each to attend this retreat for a month. Eight thousand English pounds. Each. As there are eight of them here on the retreat, do the maths. Sixty-four thousand quid for a month of sitting round, doing largely nothing. Pair of fucking geniuses. That being said, that just makes the other eight more fucking stupid than I originally thought. Anyway, this is where shit gets really weird. So, when people come to the retreat, they cast off the cloak the world forces them to wear in society, and at the Gaia Lodge, emerge as their true self, allowing it to bloom in the sunlight of introspection and self-care. Bullshit aside, what this means is that while they're at the retreat, they choose their true name, and that's how they're known for their stay. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, when these fuckers all start introducing themselves, they use their true names, or as I like to think of them, the LARP characters they're playing, who are all universally twats. Only Grace and Theo use their real names. Let us begin. First. We have Hope and Jericho. God, this hurts me even writing these names. Be brave, Lucky. Soldier on. You can do this shit. Deep breath. So, Hope and Jericho are mid-thirties. No kids. I hope, seeing as how they flounced off to the country for a month. Both have high-powered careers from what I can gather. That will mean sweet fuck all in the zombie-conquered world. They're both in finance or something. Absolutely cock all use anymore, basically. These two actually make me pretty sad. I'm a self-confessed people watcher. I find people fascinating about what drives them, why they do shit, all that jazz. I've gotten pretty good at reading people, I think, and these two are desperately clinging on to something that isn't there anymore. They're both pretending they've come here to reconnect. I mean, come on. She chose the name Hope, for fuck's sake. Jericho, the crumbling of a wall somehow? Who knows? Maybe I'm reading too much into the names. Either way, these two don't have the love for each other anymore. They're hanging on till the end of this retreat, and then divorce was on the cards for sure. I mean, they were clinging to each other right through mine and Nate's 
the way the world has changed, PowerPoint presentation, but that's just from familiarity, I reckon. Sad. On the flip side to the deeply tragic Hope and Jericho, we have Ariel and Pax. Oh, sweet Jesus, I don't know if I can keep introducing people with these names. It just gets worse. Ariel and Pax are younger versions of Grace and Theo. Mid-twenties, clearly both from wealthy families as they have no fucking clue how the real world actually works and they are wholly invested in the awakened and spiritual existence they've chosen. These motherfuckers will devour any piece of spiritual bullshit on Facebook or YouTube, no doubt. Lick it all up like particles hits my biscuit crumbs. Let's put it this way. When they introduce themselves, Ariel, and don't get me wrong, this woman is full-on radiantly beautiful with no makeup, absolutely glowing so much I'm insanely jealous of her skin. The first thing this soft-headed dipshit said to me was this. He's my buffalo, and I'm his little wolf. And then she put her head on his muscular shoulder, blatantly on show through his yoga vest top, and gave a little, aren't I so lucky, smile. I nearly did a full-blown exorcist on her, right there, projecting a stream of hot bile right into their faces. Mother of all fucking gods, I wanted to punch her in the tit for being such a fairy brain. Pax was a damn good-looking guy, took real good care of himself. But when you've got all the time in the world to pump iron in the gym and spend a month at a spiritual retreat, any bozo could get that shredded. He's just as head over heels for his spaced-out honey bunny as she was for him, too. It was sweet and vomit-inducing at the same time. Still, while I liked to look at him, because he did look good, he had this vacuous look in his eyes. I swear, if I shouted in his ear, I'd hear a fucking echo. These two won't last one minute alone in the apocalypse. The best this poor pair of dipshits can hope for is a quick death, and that zombies chowing down on their pretty corpses will give someone else the chance at life. The third couple are a pair of women, Faith and Sky. Now, these two names are less painful to write, because they sound like normal names, and these two hot mamas are invested in the spiritual life, because it's also their business. Apparently, they do yoga classes and Reiki and crystal butt plugs or whatever else these people do. They run a pretty successful business, all told. Or did, at least, before Hurricane Shitstorm hit the world. And they seem to have their heads screwed on tighter than the Little Mermaid and her buffalo, at least. They're very much in love, but it's more of an adult love than the childish teenage infatuation of Ariel and Pax. Apparently, Pax is Latin for peaceful. Sheesh. So now we arrive at the two singles remaining. Freya, oh, let me sit down at the shock that someone chose the Norse goddess of fertility as their spiritual handle, is straight up drop-dead gorgeous. I mean, everyone here is pretty, except for the fanged testicle, but Freya is the type of woman that even straight women stop and gawk at. She's absolutely stunning. From what I can gather, she's recently gone through a divorce with some football star, so she's obviously got money from a settlement because he played for a Premier League team of some form. Hence, why she can fuck off to a retreat for eight grand for a whole month. She doesn't live in the real world, though. She's enjoyed a life of privilege for so long that the world being flipped arse up is going to royally fuck up her shit. This poor woman just can't survive, and she's as fragile as a cracked china plate. One more knock, and she's going to shatter into little pieces. I'm actually pretty concerned about her mental state. The last of the gang is Zion. Sigh. Now, to look at, this boy is darn pretty, skin to die for, sculpted like a young Adonis, has these green eyes like polished emeralds, mouth-wateringly good-looking. Con? He has a top knot. Of course he does. Blonde hair that shines like sunlight reflecting on gold, but it's piled atop his head like some furry yellow potato, signifying his dishonourable entry to the twatty hall of fame. 
Honestly, this guy will think just having a mother makes him a feminist, and he bangs on about respecting and empowering women all the time, like it makes him some kind of hero, when in truth equality comes from, well, treating all people equally. It's like this piece of shit wants a medal because of how he respects women. Every night, this dickwad pulls out his guitar, of course he does, to try and impress everyone with his soulful, original songs about his feelings. I think he's just learned shit from YouTube of obscure folk artists that none of these idiots will ever have heard of. Well, Top Knot is clearly here for one reason. He's trying to get laid. Seriously, the guy hangs around Freya like a bad stench, quoting how much he respects women while simultaneously mansplaining everything to her and treating her like a child that needs everything doing for her. I'm seriously considering feeding him to the zombies outside the gate, just to show everyone the end of the world is real. At least he could be of use as a bad example. So, there's our intrepid party of heroes. Ten absolute fucking wackadoodles that are unlikely to survive a single day on their own once the real world pops their little bubble of kale smoothies and rose quartz. Namaste, bitches. Twelfth entry. Welcome to the dark side. We have zombies. So. Imagine, if you will, dear reader, telling ten spiritual people that the world beyond their little bubble of self-love is a wasteland where the dead have risen to tear apart the living with extreme prejudice. Yeah. They looked at us like we were the nutjobs. Then, no fucking word of a lie, Graceful Grace glides across this open-sided dining area to light a little clustered bush and starts wafting it around the room, walking around the place like she's ringing a bell, but instead just swirling the smoke round from the end of this fiery plant. Um, Grace, I ventured, what are you doing? It's Sage, offered the little mermaid. It's to cleanse the area of negative energy. It took me a minute to realise they were being serious, as Grace nodded her agreement with Ariel's statement. Even particles looked incredulous, sat on the tabletop in front of me. That badass pug looked at Ariel, then turned to look at me. His expression simply said, What the fuck have you got me into here? Is this some kind of reality show prank? asked Topknot. He was puffing up like a blowfish, three inches from Freya's side and getting his flex on. Zombies? Seriously? Zion, it's... I stopped. Seriously, though. Zion? What's your actual name? I bet it's something like fucking Nigel, isn't it? That popped his inflating scrotum. The fluffy potato on his head quivered in indignation. Look, whatever you're calling yourself, the only way to fucking prove this is if you come down to the gate and see for yourself. The gate? asked Theo. Right now, my herb-scented lovelies, there are about fifty undead pushing at your front gate, which you all managed to pull in while you were chanting Kumbaya as you slapped those drums like demented monkeys. I think my derogatory depiction of their cleansing mantras was as popular as a whore doing a happy hour deal during Sunday church service. They're going to have to be cleared, offered Nate. Sooner or later, that gate is going to give, unless it's suitably reinforced. As much as I hate to say it, this place is a pretty good base to work out of. I noticed the roof was covered in solar panels. Is this place self-sustaining? Of course, replied Testicle. Ah, damn it, Theo. What about water? Artesian wells. Fresh water is drawn through electric pumps charged via the solar panels. It's all renewable energy here. Do you have hot water? There was a little tremor of terrified excitement in my voice. Theo nodded. While the tank is full, yes. Sweet Mary, Mother of God. Testicle-faced or not, I could have banged the back out of that round-faced freak right there and then on the kitchen top. 
hot shower, oh mama. Well, pretty much sells itself then, murmured Nate grudgingly. I gave him my, and you didn't want to come here, look. He knew what I meant and had the grace to shrug his acknowledged defeat. Um, this is our home, ventured Theo nervously. You can't just move in. Erin, I'm going to need your help, said Nate, ignoring Theo's wail. I need you to take this seriously and not piss your pants like an excited four-year-old. Nate gave me a severe look, and I knew what he was thinking. I nearly pissed my pants like an excited four-year-old. I'll go and get it. Ten minutes later, I swaggered back into a room filled with enough tension that even a single fart from particles would have made everyone jump. Nate doesn't see the need for pointless conversation, and as these people were all pretty pointless in his eyes, he'd obviously just stood there like a gargoyle for ten minutes, brooding. Freya had moved. She was stroking particles, who seemed to be enjoying the attention. Little dog whore giving it up for the pretty lady. Still, I didn't mind. As she sat there stroking the little fellow, she seemed a little calmer. Dogs are the best therapist you can have. What was hilarious was Topknot's look of insane jealousy, made even more perfect by particles just staring at him while Freya stroked him. I could almost hear the pug's thoughts. Yeah, Freya, stroke me like that, right there, baby. Mm-hmm. All the while just staring at Zion, getting a kick out of his jealousy. Particles didn't choose the smug life. The smug life chose him. Anyway, I sauntered back in with the double-triggered shotgun we lifted from old McRapey's dead hand and all the shells. We had nearly 300 now, with all the ammo we'd acquired over the past couple of weeks. Let's do this, I declared. If I had a cock, I'd have had a boner at that moment. I was way more excited than I should have been. I mean, Nate and I were about to go all Bonnie and Clyde on the undead posse coming for our ass, but every one of these fuckers put down was a victory. Plus, I was about to finally get some live time with the shotgun. Kinesthetic learning, bitches. Learn by doing. Pick your shots. Don't rush. Don't fuck about and aim for the one closest to you every time, warned Nate. Wait until they're close enough that the spread will take them, even if your aim is a little off. Reload on the move as you displace. The benefit of the shotgun is that from close range, you pretty much can't miss. So aim high and make sure each shell shreds a brain pan. I nodded, serious as chlamydia. Game face on. Wait, said Theo. What on earth are you doing? He looked at the two shotguns in our hands, Nate checking over his like a pro, me trying not to giggle like a schoolgirl as I cracked the brake action and popped two shells into the barrels. There are nigh on fifty undead outside the gate, repeated Nate. We're going to clear them and you hippies are coming to watch. We are not, declared Theo indignantly. The others began to voice their support of Theo. Nate's an easygoing guy most of the time. He huffs and puffs a lot, and rolls his eyes out loud, or shakes his head when I open my mouth. But generally, he remains quite neutral. I still remember the day I heard him for the first time, when I was strapped to that awful rack in McRake's bondage barn, and he warned the dirty old bastard not to go for his gun. His voice went glacial cold and scared the shit out of me because of its simple promise. He went there again. Listen to me, you tree fucking gimps, he started. No hint of rage, no raised voice, just cold. So fucking cold. The room froze, nobody daring to even breathe in case they drew his wrath. Everything and everyone you've ever known or loved is gone. Gone. Dead. And if they're not permanently dead, they're shambling around, filled with rage for the living, with no concern other than tearing out your innards and adding you to their legion of death. You need to wake the fuck up and see how the world works now and understand what it is you're up against. 
So, every single one of you is coming with me and Erin, and we're going to open your gate and let the undead in. And then, this slip of a girl and I are going to give them some buckshot to gargle with. Then, I'm going to drive our truck in here, and we're going to sit down, have a meal, and get to know each other a little better. We're going to be in each other's pockets for a while. He stared at each one of them in turn. Questions? Incredibly, there was one. Freya nervously put her hand up, and Nate nodded for her to speak. Why let them in? She asked timidly. Why not just do it outside the gate? Nate had been prepared for a thoroughly moronic question, as was I in truth. But he softened a little at the surprisingly pertinent query. There is a mass of open space once the gate is opened, he replied, his voice a little gentler. I guess even that block of granite could see Freya was the most fragile of them all. She clearly had anxiety issues, but by gods, she'd already shown more courage than the rest of them combined. Plus, Particles liked her, and he's a good judge of character. If we go outside the gate, the space is cramped. Erin and I won't have room to move a lot, and these shotguns need reloading every two shots. So, we need time and space to move. If things get out of control... I'll go to the Glock at my hip, which has a faster rate of fire, but it's too valuable a weapon and I don't know when I'll get a resupply, making it my last resort. Outside, it's just a narrow road with heavy foliage on either side. Erin and I can't move safely in that space. Plus, it's all uphill from the gate to here, I added. That'll slow their shamble a bit more and give us much-needed time. Nate cocked an eyebrow in my direction, this time in approval. I grinned. High ground, it's in all the movies. Again, just another little twitch of a smile. Every one of those feels like a fucking victory. Nate nodded. Okay then, load whatever pockets you can with shells. Bring a box out as a fallback. Erin, I'll need you to open the gate and scamper back up. You'll be faster than anyone here. Her? Oh, Topknot, you had to do it, didn't you? I'm right here, Potato Head, I said. But, by all means, if you think you're faster, be my guest and open the gate for the undead horde. Just make sure you don't shit your pants and fall over, eh? I gave him my sweetest, sickliest, most condescending smile. Why don't you put a little crystal up your butt to disperse all that negative energy, or wave some sage at them? I'm sure that will keep the demons at bay. If you weren't a girl, he muttered. I went from a sassy-mouthed piss-taker to a raging ball of fury in a nanosecond. Don't let me being a girl stop you, potato head, I roared at him. Freya's hand went to her mouth to hide her amusement. Clearly, the top knot was a distinct turn-off for her. I like that girl more the longer this goes on. Come on, you pindic little gym bunny. I handed the shotgun to Nate, who took it without comment as I got all British kung fu on spunk trumpet. Come on, you fucker, let's have you. I beckoned him on, affecting a Liam Gallagher cockswagger as I sauntered towards him. I will rip your fucking ears off and stick them in your fucking colon so you can hear me kicking your ass round the field. You'll be trying to pick your pretty white teeth off the kitchen floor with broken fingers. Get me drunk or get me mad, and I'm the biggest scally in town. I was like Brookside on PCP. I was going full scouse. The tiny slivers of my Liverpool accent that existed now bloomed to full life in near berserk rage as I dropped my final challenge. You're about ten seconds away from the most embarrassing moment of your life, so make your choice, top not Sit the fuck down or come the fuck on. Senses overwhelmed by my spit-flying onslaught, he sat down, stunned. That piece of shit has never had a real fight in his privileged existence, and my entire life has been one giant slugfest. Thinks he can intimidate me because I'm a five-six girl. Fuck you, buddy. 
There's more man in every one of my turds than in your whole fucking body. Nate didn't even bother hiding his pleasure as he handed the shotgun back to me. That'll do, kid, he grinned. That'll do. 13th entry. Not a Ted talk, a Nate talk. I could feel the hunger on the other side of the gate, chilling stuff as they pressed inexorably against the wood. The gate itself only had a small latch to open it, but it had two deadbolt-style metal bars that dropped into holes straight down. Thankfully, both of those were in place, and the primary reason the gate hadn't folded inwards. I sucked in a few deep breaths, every bit of good sense and logic screaming inside my head. I mean, here I was, a mob of slavering undead inches away and separated from me by a perfectly good gate, and I was going to open said portal and let them in. On purpose. I should have been shitting myself and raging against such a dumb move, but I was all in now. My chips were in the middle, and I was standing waiting for the river card to turn. All or nothing. I unhooked one of the bars. At the same time, I also flicked up the little central latch, immediately springing back into a roll and coming up to my feet. One half of the gate swung inwards, and the undead began to spill into the enclave. Hitting the afterburners, I sprinted up to where Nate waited. He tossed the shotgun to me as I neared, and I snatched it out of the air, spinning and getting the stock against my shoulder in readiness. At the sight of the blood-soaked dead swarming through the gate, the hippies started losing their mind as their new reality revealed itself in all its glorious gore. The horde carried the full assortment of wounds, from torn throats, missing chunks of flesh from arms and shoulders, bloody blue loops of intestine dragging in the dirt below them. Whatever horror your mind can conjure, it was there. There was no mistaking this bedraggled, shambling horde of death for a reality show prank. There was no chance physical makeup could imitate the obvious ragged state this group was in, and the yoga bunch knew it. I heard someone throwing up amid all the witless jabbering and squealing. A little quiet, ordered Nate, his voice as soft as stone. He didn't even look away from the horde. That tone is like a whip of ice when he uses it, and he doesn't even really try. It's just there. It smacks you in the face and turns your bowels to water, and that, dear reader, is what real authority sounds like. The hippies went from jabbering lunatics to muted squeals in a snap. There was only one alpha in this pack. I chanced a quick glance in their direction, finding particles cradled in Freya's arms, and nodded. Okay, murmured Nate. This is real, Erin. No fucking about. No getting cocky. This is real life and death now, hear me? I almost gave some smart-mouthed quip, but bit down on it. The hippies needed this lesson, needed to see shit was very real and very dangerous. So I just gave Nate a nod, and he grunted his approval. And so it began. Jesus. Now that it's all over, I feel like I've been punched in the shoulder and chest repeatedly by Mike Tyson. Every kick of the shotgun was like a hammer to the same spot, but Nate's lessons paid off. When I put my mind to it, I'm actually a decent shooter, I think. I followed all his advice, aimed a little high to make sure I blasted the head, and I started dropping them. Nate and I moved wide of each other across the crest of the hill that the lodge sat on, splitting the swarm to thin them out so they didn't come as one rolling mass of hate and hunger. There were a few rectal clenches when I didn't reload smoothly and a Zed got too close for comfort, but none of them got close enough to do that lip-peeling snarl when they suddenly get an extra burst of speed. That shit frightens the fucking life out of me when they do that, because you get a glimpse of whatever is driving them, and whatever that thing is, it's fucking dark. Hatred incarnate. Eesh. It was a long morning and starting to get warm as the sun rose. But with a solid plan and solid execution, Nate and I pulled it off. In truth, I was fucking proud of myself. 
I know I can be a bit of a dick at times and add a little colour and swag into my reciting of history. After all, who wants to read a boring textbook when they can have some comedy drama instead? But still, it felt good to really do something. It was a tiny drop in the zombie ocean, but for that one morning, it felt like Nate and I took back a little of our world, even if it was only a yoga lodge. Lockie and Nate, 43, zombies, zero. When we got down to the last one, Nate called a halt. The hill leading up to the lodge resembled the bloody remains of a battlefield, with ruined corpses and pools of blood and brains scattered everywhere. My chest and shoulder were numb and just a patch of pain, and my ears had a constant whine from the repeated thunder of the boomstick so close to them. Jesus, I've said it before, but movies don't prepare you for how damn loud gunfire really is. No wonder they wear ear protection on ranges. My entire head felt like a bell that had been rung by a bunch of monks on amphetamines. Why are you stopping? came the cracked shriek of one of the women. There's still one left. I couldn't tell who it was, simply because it was so distorted through the ringing. I think it might have been the Little Mermaid, or Unamazing Grace, don't know. Nate put down the shotgun and drew the biggest fucking knife I've ever seen in my life. It's always strapped to his leg, but this was the first time I'd actually seen him draw it. This bitch was full crocodile Dundee. This is a knife, size. Shiny, sharp, with razor-like serrations and a curve on one side of the blade leading to a wicked point. None of you have firearms, so if you're in the shit, you need to learn how to deal with a walker. Nate moved into the eyeline of the final undead, drawing it to him like bait on a hook, knife held loose but steady. He talked as he gave his lesson. Just as they get near, they increase in pace, he said. You'll see the moment. They'll look at you like the source of all their misery. With such hatred, it'll make your guts twist. Accurate. As the zombie neared, everyone saw that baring of teeth, that clawing of hands and slight burst of acceleration as it switched to predator mode from its relatively docile shamble. Nate smoothly stepped aside and let it soar past him. They're only good in a straight line. So, if you can, don't back away as they'll just follow you. Sidestep, change the angle. 90 degrees to whatever way the monster is facing, and it will save your life. He drew it again, displaying the 90-degree method once more, though this time he kicked its legs from under it. The zombie slammed face first into the earth, and Nate shocked everyone by placing a knee between its shoulder blades, trapping it beneath his muscular frame. Grabbing a fistful of the creature's hair, he pulled the head back so everyone could see the glassy, milky eyes and the silent snarl of hatred. Every one of the yoga bunch looked at him with abject horror. These things only die if you ravage the brain, he said, all calm, as if this was some university lecture in the pretty gardens of Oxford. The skull is immense protection, so... If you find yourself unable to smash their heads in with something heavy, like an axe or a hammer, and you can only get a smaller weapon, then these are your three options. He pointed with the tip of his mutant knife to the base of the skull. Go under and up if you have something suitably sharp with the length. If not, then your best bet is through the ear or the eye. You could get to the brain with something as simple as a screwdriver or a sharp kitchen knife. The eye is your best option, though, as it's an easier target than the ear. He chatted away like there wasn't a silent, slavering zombie beneath him, desperately trying to reach back and claw at him. But he was no amateur. The zombie was entirely in his power. Straight in, no messing, no hesitation. He made sure they were all looking, no matter the expressions of trauma etched into their pretty faces, then rammed the blade into the monster's right eye. It punched through the soft tissue and cracked the orbital bone. Such was the force he struck with and the width of his mini-sword. The zombie went limp, all darkness banished from its form, and all ten of our wackadoodles emptied their guts on the grass. 
Every one of them is now traumatized for the rest of their lives. Nate is a scary motherfucker. But he's my scary motherfucker. Fourteenth entry. Special friends. If the opening lessons were traumatic, then the cleanup has probably broken a few of them. There were now 43, mostly headless and all gory, corpses scattered across the field, with random chunks and bits of zombies all over the place. My God, cleaning up is worse than the putting down. Absolutely vile job. Faith and Sky were the most impressive in that task. After they shook off the horror of Nate's up-close and personal lesson, they got their shit together pretty well, and before long had arms and legs of corpses between them, carrying them over to one side of the field, far from the lodge. The bodies had to be disposed of, and Nate wasn't happy with trying to burn so many, so we moved them to one side of the field into a tangled pile of death. Tomorrow, Nate's going to do a run and get some supplies from a nearby farm he remembers that had appropriate tools, shovels and the like. We're going to dig a mass grave at the bottom of the field and bury them, as the last thing we want is a big pile of disease growing at the bottom of the garden. Obviously, Grace and Theo don't have said tools, as all the landscaping was dealt with by a contractor to keep the place pretty, but I don't think they'll be coming round any time soon. It was a long and thoroughly shitty afternoon, and I was bone-weary by the end of it. Covered in shit, blood, brain, and general grime, I was going to punch anyone in their most sensitive parts if they dared take a shower before me. A hot shower. Orgasmic. Can you imagine how amazing a long hot shower is when it's your first in a month? Mama, I was in hot liquid heaven. I scrubbed myself clean, washed my hair, which was like sex after so long, and when I finally emerged, I was me again. I felt like a million dollars. I did the neighborly thing and scrubbed the shower clean, because it looked like a scene from Psycho in there by the time I'd finished, then sat at the kitchen island with a hot cup of strawberry tea that Freya kindly made for me, and sighed in contentment. I like Freya. I misjudged her. She's actually pretty tough and reacting well, some of which is down to particles helping keep her calm, I think. Good doggy. Also, she's my size and gave me a set of her clothes to keep me going so I could bury or burn the others, as they are officially dead to me. Having clean underwear, a clean sports bra to keep things stationary on the move, turns out Freya and I are boob buddies and virtually the same size, and a nice loose-fitting tracksuit and hoodie, is amazing. She's my new girly BFF. Also, I was very pleased to discover that Freya is her actual name, and she didn't change it to a twatty spiritual handle for the retreat. She just used her name. I like her even more now. She didn't buy totally into the bullshit. From what I can gather, she was just a bit lost in life had no identity of her own because she was arm candy of a famous sportsman, and that's all she was seen as, a pretty trophy wife. In truth, for all her anxiety, I think she's actually pretty tough. She's certainly got more fire in her belly than Top Knot, who's probably wondering how he can possibly get his next dose of moisturizing skincare products in a dead world. Now I felt like a million dollars, but I had the blasted stares of the traumatized all around me. People who burn sage for positivity think shiny rocks can sort out their problems and spend a month doing yoga and not prepared for the apocalypse and all its grim realities. Top Knot's bravado was well and truly in the wind. For all his rippling muscle from countless hours in the gym, the only real muscle that was getting a workout now was his sphincter. He looked like he was flitting between the choice of crying in a corner or just plain shitting his pants. The two lesbian businesswomen seemed to be holding up the best, like I said, leaning on each other for comfort and strength, but they seemed to be more practical in switching their attitude. They had a, I don't like this, but this is the world now, look on their face. Tough chicks, I like them. Ariel, Pax, Grace and Theo, and not doing well.
The foremost spiritual people here, the ones who really swallow this holistic mess instead of spitting, are the most off-center. Their life is clearly great when they can just forget about negativity because they don't really have any. But when the shit hits the fan, they just stand there dumbly as that fan flings said shit all over them. Ariel's a mess. Her pretty boyfriend is doing the best to comfort her, but her eyes are constantly wet with tears. Grace is a nervous wreck trying to keep herself busy around the place so she doesn't have to think, while Theo just looks... haunted. Like, seriously? Testicle face looks like he's just returned from the Vietnam War and seen some traumatic shit. Nate says he's seen that look in the service, and we need to keep an eye on the toothy bollock. Hope looks lost. She's not even seeking comfort from her husband, but distancing herself from him. I feel for her. She was clearly already in the middle of dark days, being forced to accept her marriage was over and going through the motions. She was probably planning on how to start her new life as a single woman in her mid to late thirties, which was upsetting enough. Now, that chance of a new life is gone. She's stuck here, with him and a bunch of strangers, in a world ruled by the dead. For his part, Jericho is a bit like Theo, a man who spent his days doing hedge funds and stocks or whatever. Well, his skill set is utterly redundant. He's having trouble accepting it. Lots of, this can't be happening, under his breath. Denial. Classic first stage of grief. Now I just have to keep a beady eye out for anger, because any conflict in here is quickly going to escalate with such raw emotions. Nate looked the happiest I've ever seen him when he got out the shower. Of course, being ex-military, he had spare clothing, not that you could tell. Nate is the man in black. Black t-shirt, black combat trousers, black boots, black hair, eyes so brown they can seem black. He's like the Grim Reaper's unfriendly kind of threatening dad. Still, his mood was greatly improved after we'd done all the work, piled up the bodies ready for burial, brought the pickup in with all our scavenged goodies, and reclosed the gate. As extra reinforcement, one of the cars was edged behind the gate and parked there, just in case we had another horde incursion. The gates couldn't swing in now without the vehicle being moved. What now? I asked. Rest for today, said Nate. Eat, drink, sleep. First thing tomorrow, I'll go back to that farmhouse a couple of miles back and pick up the tools I saw there, and we'll get those bodies buried. I'll head out at first light. Need me to come along? Nate shook his head. No, he answered in a low voice. Keep an eye on this lot. Some of them are on the verge of breaking. They might need a harsh word or two to snap them out of a spiral. Or a slap? Nate nodded. Or a slap. Isn't it nice when we hate the same things? Nate chuckled. Clearly the shower had improved his mood. This was almost a natural human response. As night fell, we ate. Grace had been keeping herself busy to try and not think, and it turns out she put a pretty good spread on. Okay, there was no meat, because, of course, there'd be no fucking meat in Yogaville. But still, it was pretty damn cool to eat a load of freshly made food, instead of warm or cold canned goods. Grace and Theo had herb and vegetable gardens of considerable size out the back of the lodge, so there was literal fresh food to eat, and it was bloody lovely. The only way it could have been better was with a fat steak dripping in grease on the side, but hey, beggars can't be choosers. Suffice to say, eating a freshly made meal with actual fresh food was yummy. The lodge is pretty big. The main house is largely communal, with bedrooms and bathrooms on the first floor and a wide open space on the ground floor that is largely a sitting area, and a combined kitchen and dining area with big glass sliding doors on one side that can be fully opened to the outside when the weather's nice. It's pretty lovely, actually. Grace and Theo have their own separate abode attached to the lodge, like an extra bungalow that comes out of the lodge, making it an L-shape. It's probably a good two or three bedroom size, and just for those two when there are no guests staying at the lodge. 
Hope and Jericho were in a double room, though I can see that changing in the near future. Faith and Sky had a double as well, as did Ariel and Pax. There were still some spare rooms left. It has about six doubles and six singles, I think, in total. So Nate took one, and I was going to take another single, but Freya asked if I'd sleep in a twin with her, at least for the first night. Seeing as how Topknot's eyes kept flicking at her, all wild and darting, I readily agreed and loudly announced, so Potato Head could hear, that I'd bring my shotgun for a threesome. So, girly night for me and Freya. There was a wee bit of tension as we were eating our communal meal. Most people were nibbling at their food, their stomachs still a bit tender from their mass vomiting, but Nate and I savaged it. We'd been eating purely for sustenance for the better part of a month, so naturally, when there was real food on the table, we smashed the shit out of it. I was like Cookie Monster with a rabid case of the munchies. Spectacularly unladylike as I battered everything, making cooing noises of pleasure as I tried each new tasty morsel. Ariel and I are not destined to be friends, that much is obvious. She burns sage, rubs crystals on herself and does yoga while dressed like something from Woodstock. And I do parkour and slay zombies in a tracksuit and trainers. She eats like a bird, all dainty-like, while I attack the table like a Viking feast, all fingers and slobber. If I had a flagon of mead, I'd be banging that shit against other flagons and spilling it everywhere in a raucous manner. I'd much rather be me. Anyway, there I am, having a great time, when out of nowhere, the little mermaid pipes up. Do you have to be so uncouth? Bear in mind, Ariel and Pax are from la da families, born with a silver spoon rammed up their arse, so you can imagine how shudderingly posh her accent is. Superior, haughty, up her own arse so far she's bent into a loop. Now, I get this a lot. My accent is a little common. I wear tracksuits for comfort and my sport. I never wore makeup even before the apocalypse. Basically, People will like me, or they won't, and I honestly don't give a shit either way. I'm not going to bend to anyone's expectations, and I'll live my life however the hell I want. So, when I get this, I don't go aggressive. I go sarcastic, because it's a little like punching people with words and the body's natural defense against stupidity. I'm busy eating right now, I said amiably, purposefully talking with my mouth full to piss her off. Could I ignore you some other time? The whole room went tense. Well, except for me and Nate, who carried on eating without a care in the world. Particles had a quick glance at Ariel, then to me, then to Ariel. He gave the woman a distinctly withering look. Love that dog. The little mermaid was a bit aghast. She's obviously not used to her opinion being of zero worth in her little special circle of trust fund babies, and it took her a moment to gather herself. How rude, she declared. Seriously? Is this girl for real? There I am, minding my own business as I feast for the first time in a month, when this snotty bitch pipes in that I'm uncouth and rude. This is usually the way with assholes like the Little Mermaid. They just expect the world to dance to their shitty tune and get all offended when the world flips them a middle finger in response. She wasn't done with her indignation as she turned to her beloved buffalo. Barkley, are you going to let her? I nearly snorted tomato out my nose. Barkley, is that your real name? Seriously? I laughed again. No wonder you disguised it as Pax. What's your name then, Little Mermaid? Cecilia? Camilla? Eugenia? I bet it's Ophelia or some shit, isn't it? I hardened my tone just a little while she was reeling. Now listen, you uppity little fuck. You started this, so don't turn to your moisturizes his scrotum three times a day boyfriend when I bite back. You're the one judging and making comments, so if you're not going to fight your own battle, I suggest you bite down on that silver spoon in your flappy trap and shut the fuck up. Nate carried on eating like nothing was happening. I love that about him. 
He doesn't feel the need to butt in and defend me. He knows I can fight my own battles and lets me get on with them. I don't think I like you very much, declared Ariel, just a hint of quiver in her lip. Bravado. Oh, no, I said dramatically. You don't like me. Let me just sit here for a few minutes while I recover from this tragedy. Grace piped in then. You obviously think it's very clever to be sarcastic, don't you? No, I said, sarcastically. You know it's the lowest form of wit. Think of that one yourself, did you? I snapped back, popping a cherry tomato in my mouth and presenting her with a cheesy grin as I chewed. I'm such a people person. It soon died down. Stupid people can't deal with good sarcasm. It just highlights how stupid they are. It's not the lowest form of wit at all. Done right, it's a fucking art form. Anyway, after that little clash of heads, Nate announced he'll be up and gone in the morning before anyone else rises, most likely, so we've plenty of the day left to get the grim work of a mass grave done. Once we've got that boxed off, then we can start some real planning about the future. Well, I'm absolutely beat, and I think it's time I face planted into the blessed embrace of sleep. I'll say good night, my dear reader. Huh. I really need to give you a name. I can't keep calling you my dear reader, as, well, it's pretty impersonal. I think we've gotten to know each other a little better. The more I write this shit down, the more I need to address it to someone. Dear Diary is, well, it's a bit shit. Diary McDiary face makes me titter, but it's just too damn long. Bah, I can't think of this right now. So, instead, dear reader, I'm going to sleep in a bed. Fuck yeah. Catch you on the flip side. 15th entry. Hell's Kitchen. Holy fucking hell. Absolute carnage. Nate disappeared first thing. Must have been about 5am as I heard the truck fire up and him piss about at the gates with the car. Then he was gone. Once I was awake, I couldn't drift off again, but I'd crashed out about 9pm anyway, so I'd had a damn good sleep, best I'd had in an age. Freya was still asleep, particles snuggled into her like a little teddy bear, her arm protectively around him. That little dog whore has done wonders for her mental state. Really helped to calm down and adapt. I'd probably be jealous if it wasn't for the fact that Freya was just so fucking nice. I don't think the woman has a malicious bone in her body, and she looked like a fucking supermodel, with no makeup on, hair everywhere, fast asleep. Bitch. LOL. I decided to head downstairs and make myself a brew. It was a bright morning, and the simple act of sitting at a kitchen table with the sun just coming up, sipping at a steaming cup and enjoying the peace. Well, that seemed like a little slice of serene normal after what had been a whole month of adapting to a new and broken world. Of course, I'm not that lucky, seeing as how Particles is currently using all his mystical ability to heal Freya's anxiety. Sat at the island was Ariel. I think she heard my eyes roll as I reached the foot of the stairs. You're up early, she said by way of greeting. Nothing gets past you, eh? I said, thoroughly annoyed my plan for peace had been shat on by one of the two people I disliked the most. I was surprised to see her reaction. She blanched a little, like the words had really stung. She didn't respond with any comeback or shitty condescension. Instead, she waited while I made my own brew and sat at the island, staring out the glass doors to the beautiful country morning. We said nothing for a little while. Then her voice made me start a little. This is really happening, isn't it? I was going to hit her with another rock of sarcasm to the face, but I stopped myself as I caught her expression. Reality was sinking in. Her home, her family, her entire life. It was all gone. Now the shock of day one was over, and she was sitting alone with her thoughts. All the cracks were starting to appear. 
The girl was still a bitch, no doubt, but she was still human. She still had people she loved, family that she'll never see again, no skills applicable to surviving in a world of the damned. That crushing realization that you have no place in this new and shattered existence, that you will have to rely on the goodwill and the skills of others to survive, had hit her hard, it seemed. Instead of a barbed comment, I stopped my sassy mouth and just nodded. Sometimes, I guess, the first step on the road to forgiveness is realizing the other person was born an idiot. I'm sorry, she said then, completely taking me off guard. For the things I said last night, I was just... Forget it, I said, waving it away. It was a stressful day. I'm not exactly known for my diplomacy. That got a rueful chuckle from her, and I thought, maybe she's not so bad. It's no small thing to cough up that apology and take a hit to your pride. Probably doubly hard for someone used to getting what they want whenever they want it. Maybe, just maybe, there was a little spark of hope for her yet. Then, everything went to absolute shit. When the scream sounded, my heart almost stopped. It was a woman's scream, and all I thought was that I hoped it wasn't Freya. Ariel and I shared a brief look, then headed for the stairs, which rise to the upper floor in a spiral with no visibility. I couldn't see what was happening on the top floor, but as I reached the top of the stairs, my breath caught. Sky was down, blood everywhere, as her throat was a ragged mess. Faith was the one screaming, her lover on the verge of death, no possibility of saving her. Hope was a topper, bloody chunks of meat grinding in her teeth, while Faith screamed in blind grief and panic, frozen and unable to move. I guess the two women went to check on Hope and Jericho for some reason, maybe concerned about them because of noise as they were in the same bedroom. When Nate and I examined the scene later, we pretty much worked out what had happened. Hope had, ironically, lost all hope. There was a bottle of pills virtually empty beside her bed, and without doubt, that broken look that concerned me had evolved into full suicidal thoughts. She couldn't face the world and her unhappiness any longer, no chance of a normal future ahead of her, and she just ended it. She clearly died in the night and then murdered her sleeping husband. Faith and Skye were in the next room and must have heard the couple bumping about in the morning, gone to check on them as a pair, got no response from knocking on the door, and decided to open it to see if everyone was okay. That must have been when Hope lunged through the open portal, fixed her teeth to Skye's throat, and ripped out her jugular. Even as Ariel and I watched in horror, Jericho, his belly chewed wide open to reveal a spill of intestinal loops, lunged after his undead spouse, clattering into Faith and bearing her down, his teeth savaging her face. Fuck. This was four undead now in the house, and the door to mine and Freya's room, with my little dude particles in, was the one directly opposite. If she opened the door, there were four Zeds in immediate lunging distance. Freya, I roared above the din. It's Erin. Don't answer. Don't make a sound. Keep the door closed until I tell you it's clear. The door stayed closed, and the smart woman kept her mouth shut. Particles, as ever because he's super smart when it comes to zombies, kept his little doggy trap firmly shut. However, my bellowing from the top of the stairs drew every glassy eye my way. Ah, oh, shit, I muttered. Guess where my loaded shotgun was? still beneath my bed, in a closed room, with four zombies now between me and it. There was no way past them, so I had to draw them downstairs where there was space. Then I could get up the stairs, get the shotgun, and clean this unholy mess up. It twitches my ass how fast some of these things reanimate. Hope and Jericho were the first to react to my voice, but it was no more than ten seconds before Sky twitched to life, and judging by the god-awful ruin of Faith's neck and face, she wasn't going to be far behind. All I wanted at the moment, though, was the fuckers to get away from my friend and my dog. A door opened further up the hallway, and Zion stepped out at exactly the wrong moment. What the hell is... 
His sentence ended as Hope's teeth drove deep into his arm. The timing was exquisitely bad as Zion stepped into the hall just as Hope reached his door. He had no time at all to react and he unleashed a scream of pain, higher pitched than most girls, surprisingly, before Hope ripped the chunk out of him. He fell backwards into his room, somehow kicking the door shut behind him. Well, at least that was one less undead to deal with. Locking himself in his room as he died from his bite meant there was only four to deal with immediately. But fucking hell. We'd gone from ten spiritual lodges to five in a minute. Freya was locked up safe, Ariel was behind me, Grace and Theo were in their bungalow away from the madness, which meant there was just... Pax. Barkley opened his door, just as a reanimated Jericho was passing by. I didn't see what happened, because Pax didn't get a chance to appear. All I saw was Jericho turn, his lips peel back, then he lunged through the open doorway. Gurgled screams followed, and I nearly shit myself as Ariel hit a frequency of scream that could powder stone. Buffalo! She screamed, at a decibel level never achieved by the human voice until this moment. Well, her buffalo just got served at an undead cookout, and she lost her shit. I don't mean just screaming with horror and grief. I mean a total psychotic break. She just screamed and screamed, her arms flailing like some demented puppeteer had got hold of her strings and was having a seizure. All the while, she just screamed at that bone-jarring frequency, the sound like a rusty blade soaring down my spine. I turned, wanting to get down the stairs, but she wouldn't move. Ariel, I roared, for fuck's sake, move. I was trapped between what was going to be a small battalion of five undead, once her buffalo was up and about again, and a screaming marionette. I wanted to make her come with me, but she was broken. I knew she was. She was just screaming in tongues, her eyes somewhere else, her throat tearing with grief. It broke my fucking heart, but I had to leave her. I pushed past her, trying to make her follow me down the stairs, but she pulled away, screaming, Buffalo! in the midst of all her madness. She wouldn't move, and the undead yogis were almost upon us. The lips had started to peel back, the clawed grasp reaching out. Fucking hell, Ariel! I almost sobbed, and left her. The guilt of that will probably catch up to me at some point. I keep telling myself she was gone, she couldn't be helped, and logically, her grief was so spectacular, she'd have probably taken her own life anyway. Yeah, keep telling yourself that, Lockie. That might make the guilt go a little quicker. Fuck the apocalypse, man. I hit the bottom of the stairs back into the open kitchen, just as I heard Ariel's screams gurgle and fade as she was assaulted by the zombies. I looked around frantically for a weapon, then stopped myself. Seriously, I couldn't take that many undead in fucking melee combat, and there was nothing heavy enough to swing. I wasn't taking on five undead in a kitchen with a knife. While my mind frantically tried to figure out what to do, I was drawn by a thumping behind me. I'd have laughed if my situation wasn't so fucking dire. Zombies aren't too smart at coming downstairs. They just don't have the coordination. So when Hope and her growing legion of undeath shredded Ariel, they all poured forward, and a zombie avalanche came down the stairs, arse over tit, one after the other, piling up at the bottom. There was no way I could get past them to get back up the stairs. But I had a brainwave. Now they were all down here, I could use my mad parkour skills to get back upstairs, via the outside, and get my shotgun. Brilliant! Go, Team Lucky! The shitstorm wasn't finished, though. Ariel's ungodly screams were probably heard by Nate at the farm two miles away, so Grace and Theo had easily heard them. Just as I was opening the sliding doors to get outside, I heard running footsteps. Grace and Theo's bungalow joins to the main building, and the door is, yep, you guessed it, right next to the stairs. Theo came thundering through the door at speed, all wild-eyed, and ran straight into the writhing undead mass at the foot of the stairs. He tripped, fell face-first into them, and was summarily chewed in multiple places all at once. Oh, come the fuck on, 
I roared in frustration. Grace was just behind Theo and managed to stop falling into the mass. But like Ariel, her mind just fucking broke as she watched her testicle-faced husband ravaged like an antelope by undead hyenas, tearing bloody chunks out of him as the writhing blob of undead added him to their platoon. She screamed, staring at the gore-fest splashing at her feet. Then a hand from somewhere in the writhing horror snapped out to grab her ankle. Jericho's face slithered from the demonic blob of heads and limbs, tearing a mouthful of meat straight from her calf. Just like that. In two gore-drenched minutes, the whole fucking lodge bar me and Freya were dead. It's easy to see how the world got so boned so damn quick. Can you imagine this shit in a hospital? Man, that shit would have got exponential in no time. With Grace doomed, I slid out the glass doors and ran to the side of the lodge, trying to figure out which window was mine. Freya, I called out. I needed a little help. Freya! I didn't know whether she'd be able to hear me, because holy shit, Grace was making as much noise as Ariel was. Absolute psychosis. Then Particles leaped up onto a sill in full view of me and started barking. My man. Freya appeared at the window and opened it. I'm coming up. My eyes were already working out the route, and I was up in no time, scampering up a drain pipe, then transferring across, holding to the open window. I slipped in through the window dukes of hazard style, right into Freya's embrace. What's going on? She asked when she finally released me. I fussed over particles who danced around in little circles at my feet, desperate for attention. Everyone's dead, I said bluntly. Don't know how it started, but it seems to have started with Hope and Jericho, and it's gone nuts since then. Everyone is bitten and dying, or already undead. Freya's hand clamped to her mouth, and she sat down on her bed. Particles, ever alert, bounced around at her feet until she picked him up. Then both started to calm a little. Reaching under the bed, I pulled out the shotgun and a box of shells, popped one in each barrel, then stuffed a handful in the pockets of the hoodie and pants, enough to do the job that needed doing, with a few spares. I couldn't climb back down the way I'd come with a shotgun, and couldn't afford for it to be dropped out the window to me, in case I missed the catch and it broke. Nate had all the other weapons, and the only way I was taking out a small battalion of these bastards safely was with my gun. So. I had to go down the stairs and do these fuckers in the kitchen. I was already dreading the cleaning. Stay here, I ordered. I'll let you know when it's clear. Freya just nodded and put a hand on my arm. Be careful. I gave Particles one final scratch around his ears, sucked in a deep breath, and slipped out into the hallway. I checked on Top Knot's room as I passed, making sure the door was still firmly closed. That would be one less problem to worry about that I could deal with at leisure later. Then I pressed on to the staircase. Jesus, the landing and top of the stairs was a crime scene. Blood and gore just everywhere. I lightly moved step by step to the top of the stairs, then stalked down one by one, shotgun up and ready. As I came around the bend where the foot of the staircase would become visible, I silently swore to myself. The writhing mass had separated and must have got to their feet in the time I'd been messing about outside and climbing up to Freya and Particles. My sphincter clamped so tight it would have its own six-pack by the evening as I edged down the stairs, looking for the first sign of the undead. I hate how quiet these things are. Hate it. They give you no audio clues at all, unless they walk into something. Then Ariel moved into sight at the foot of the stairs, a ruined mess of torn flesh and blooded rags. In that tiny staircase, the boom of the shotgun was like the rage of a god. Holy shit. Ariel's head vanished, her body crumpling, and now all bets were off. My stealth mode was gone, and I took a gamble, moving down another couple of stairs to try and get a clearer view of the kitchen. Theo's scrotum face appeared in my vision, and I flinched, reflexively unleashing the second barrel, which didn't hit him in the head. 
Instead, it knocked him from his feet, his torso a pulverized ruin from the buckshot. Swiftly, I popped open the action, fumbled two more shells into the barrels, and clicked it shut, just as Jericho shuffled into view. This time I kept my calm, aimed, then squeezed the first trigger and transformed his skull into bloody fragments. The mess at the bottom of the stairs was horrific, with two headless corpses spilling out their innards and all kinds of trauma from the earlier zombie avalanche and the ruination of Grace and Theo. I inched down another couple of steps and found I had enough space to get into the kitchen proper before the next undead closed the gap. So I did just that. Springing over the pool of gore at the base of the stairs, I moved with my back to one wall to find five undead whirling towards me. Remembering Nate's lesson, always take the closest one to you, I took a bead. That was Faith, her face and neck just a canvas of torn flesh and spilled crimson, like she was some psychotic project of a demented artist. I pulled the trigger with the barrel high in her chest, but the spread was enough to blast through the brain, and she toppled. I was already popping the action open, fumbling two more shells into the barrels as the others closed. Sky and Pax were next to go before I needed a reload, which I did by moving around obstacles like the big dining table and kitchen island, keeping a barrier between me and the undead while I fumbled two more shells into the shotgun. I clicked it shut, took aim, then evaporated Grace's head, and then finally, with the second shell, I moved it round to Hope, the selfish bitch that had started all this fucking bedlam, not hesitating for a second as I permanently put her to rest. Holy shit, I breathed out, all relieved, as I leaned on the island, head down and panting as my heart raced. Just Mr. Potato Head upstairs to take care of at leisure, as well as... I cursed, turning just as Theo, his torso in ribbons, rose back to his feet and lunged at me. There were no shells in the gun. I'd gotten sloppy, not double-tapping that son of a bitch after blasting him in the chest, and in all the mayhem of Hell's Kitchen, I'd forgotten about him. The shotgun was still in my hands, and I managed to raise it between us as Theo's snapping teeth bit down on the barrel of the weapon. His forward momentum caught me off guard, though, carrying me backwards, knocking the air out of my lungs as I slammed into the hard kitchen floor. I could feel the blood from his ruined body soaking my nice, clean tracksuit as he oozed all over me while I desperately tried to keep his teeth from my face. He was heavy, though, and I was struggling with his weight as my chest and shoulder were bruised as all hell from the previous day's shooting topped off with today's unexpected shooting repeatedly punching those bruises. One side of me was weak, and I desperately tried to keep the barrel of the shotgun between his teeth so he had no chance of biting me, all the while trying to figure out some escape for my desperate situation. It was the fat guy in the Hawaiian shirt all over again, only this time I didn't have particles and a loaded shotgun by my ear. The pressure suddenly relieved as Freya appeared above me. Grabbing a fistful of Theo's wiry hair, she yanked back his head like Nate had shown the day before, and with absolutely no hesitation, she rammed a long-bladed kitchen knife right into Testicle Face's left eye. In the blink of an eye, pun intended, Theo went limp. Freya helped me to my feet, and I looked down at myself, dripping in gore. I think I might need to wash your clothes, I said, eliciting a laugh from her. Killing that zombie seemed to have added something to her, like she'd banished some demon from within. She seemed... calmer. Particles ran round in circles on the kitchen top, where Freya had deposited him while retrieving the knife to save my ass. I scratched at his ear and he settled down. I popped two more shells from my pocket into the shotgun and blew out a breath. Why don't you put the kettle on, I said, while I go and take care of Zion. Freya nodded, calmly filling up the kettle from the tap, surrounded by the ninth level of hell. Zion was already reanimated. There was no ceremony, no great moment of savoring it. I was too damn tired, so I just opened the door to find the glassy-eyed shithead near the far wall. Fuck you, Nigel, I muttered. I took aim directly at his stupid, fluffy head potato, blasting it from existence so there was one less in the world before quietly closing the door behind me. 
Freya and I were enjoying a nice cup of chamomile tea when Nate rolled back through the gates. I watched him put the car back in position in front of them, then drive up to the lodge in the pickup. When he arrived at the glass doors, he stopped dead. I was sat on the kitchen island, my legs dangling happily, covered in drying gore, the shotgun on the counter beside me as I sipped from a teacup held in two hands. Particles was sat in Freya's lap, her hands still red from popping Theo's eye and brain, as she also sipped at her chamomile. Ruined corpses lay scattered all round the kitchen, oceans of blood ran free, with meaty boulders of flesh and brain covering almost every part of the tiled floor. We must have looked like a right pair of psychos, lounging about and having a tea party in Hell's Kitchen. There was a series of... incidents, I said in greeting. Nate looked at us, eyes and jaw wide. Incidents? In our defense, you left us unsupervised. He shook his head in disbelief. What the actual fuck, Erin? He puffed. I was only gone for two hours. Particles gave Nate a disparaging look, and I sniffed, turning to Freya. Is there any sage left? I said. I'm sensing some negative energy in the room. Part 4 King's Shit of Turd Mountain 16th Entry Reflection I really wish I'd had the presence of mind to lure those fucking zombies out of the big glass doors and onto the grass. Life would have been far less arduous. After we'd removed the headless bodies of our spiritual zombies, the kitchen was like some modern art piece from the mind of a depraved serial killer. There was fucking blood everywhere. And I mean, everywhere. Dotted throughout the congealing horror was a veritable archipelago of bone and brain, even an eyeball or two, the latter of which I made Nate clean up. Jesus, I'm almost sick of the thought. I couldn't bear to even look at the dreadful things, all the wiry nerves still attached, the squishy orb just staring at me in eerie accusation. Shudder. I like to think of myself as pretty hard-ass, Hell, I'd just wiped out a lodge full of yoga zombies single-handed, save that last one when Freya got all buffy with the knife and saved my butt. In fact, yeah, I am a hard ass. I don't dwell or freeze when shit hits the fan. I act without hesitation. I might act like a massive retard and do something that will make Nate bite chunks from the pickup ties in pure fury, or potentially inflict me with a life-changing injury, but I still act. Blood, bone, brain, gore. I can handle it all. But the one thing that really makes my innards twist is any form of eye injury. The cosmic apocalypse joke is on me, right? The eye is the simplest way to the brain in a pinch, and I'm dreading the moment I have to plunge a blade or a screwdriver into an eyeball. I'll be screaming at a frequency only dogs can hear when I have to do that shit. Eye injuries are the worst. Just horrifying. Ometophobia aside, it took us the whole day to clean the kitchen of all the horror. Once the corpses were hauled out, and the eyes, and large chunks of shredded yogi, terrible idea for a breakfast cereal, were bagged and removed, that just left all the vile little blobs of tenderized slaughter dotting an ocean of blood. Cleaning that up was no fun. At all. Nate had to go to some of the nearby farms to collect any bleach he could find. Freya and I couldn't locate a fucking drop of it. What the fuck did these hippies clean with? Piss and vinegar? Dirty bastards. When he returned with the cleaning supplies, Nate set to the back-breaking task of digging a grave for over 50 bodies. You know, for a pensioner, that guy has some serious endurance. He dug a hole a good six feet deep, and only God knows how long and wide, then dragged every single one of those ruined corpses into the hole and piled all the spoil back on top. It was dark by the time he finished patting the last of the soil on all those ragged cadavers, and he looked shot to shit when he came into the newly sterilized kitchen. I hate the smell of bleach. It clings to the nose and throat. 
so we had to leave the big glass doors open all day to air it. By the time our labor was done, right about the same time as Nate finished up, both Freya and I were equally shattered. I thought she was weak when I first met her, but hell, I misjudged her. She threw up a few times, like I did, when cleaning up the kitchen. But every time she spat it out, swilled her mouth with water, then got straight back on her knees to scrub at patches of gore. Even after that back-breaking labor and multiple vomit stops, still the bitch managed to look like she'd just stepped off the cover of Vogue. Honestly, the only thing that could mar that woman's beauty is being hit in the face with a truck. It's maddening. I'm writing this now the following morning, sipping at a green tea in the quiet. Freya and Nate are both still out for the count, and I've got a rare bit of time for myself. Now that we've got a place we can sort of call home, and a moment of peace for reflection, I feel like I should tell you a bit about myself. Well, where to start? I remember stating in my early entries how I grew up in the care system, so maybe that's where I should begin. My parents were fucking assholes. Let's get that out there straight off the bat. I was taken from them when I was six and barely remember them, but I remember the drugs and the drinking from both those pieces of shit. I remember my dad beating seven shades of shit out of my mum and then crying apologies with the stupid bitch soothing him, telling that son of a bitch it would be okay, even as her blood dried on his knuckles. I don't know who put the social services onto them, but it was bittersweet. On one hand, I was torn away from all that I knew at a young age, but on the other, I lived in fear of my father's rage, so it was undoubtedly the right thing to do. I took a slap now and again when I got under his feet, and despite me being a tiny dot, that shitball didn't pull his blow. Open-handed or not, it knocks a six-year-old senseless. I don't recall that motherfucker ever crying an apology to me, though. I never saw them again, and I'm utterly blasé about their fate. I honestly don't give two shits if they're dead and gone. My father was a savage, and my mother put him above me every single time. My early childhood was just screaming and fear. Naturally, this led to me being something of a handful. I mean, shit, I had issues coming out my arse. Trust, abandonment, loneliness, you name it, I had it. I dealt with it by building walls around me and painting those walls with the snarky bitch I am today, with a mouth as fast as my feet. I don't want to sound arrogant, but I'm no dipshit. I'm actually way smarter than I let on. Now, I'm no particle physicist, and when I say smart, I don't mean academic smart. If you ask me to do long division in my head, my expression will go blank, and I'll likely go catatonic, drool still hanging out my mouth an hour later, as my brain has ceased to function. But reading was an escape for me, bouncing around between foster homes and group homes. I'd read anything as it was all an escape, whether it was reading some trashy romance novel, literary classics, pulp noir detective novels, comic books, sci-fi, fantasy, horror, thrillers, anything and everything. The evidence of my extensive reading is clearly evident to you, my dear reader, by my spectacular understanding and mangling of the English language for my own twisted purpose. I'm also people smart. I don't trust easily, but I'm generally good at reading people. Obviously, I'm not flawless, given my recent underestimation of Freya, but in my defense, my first impression was of the group as a whole, and anyone who paid eight grand to sing Come By Ya for a month had to be a bit of a fruit loop at first glance. Sweeping generalization duly thrown out the window. As of now, I love that girl. Whoever that footballer was who divorced her had no fucking clue what a superstar he had. She's just bloody lovely in every way, inside and out. And I'm doubly impressed by the way she's handled this whole clusterfuck. I'd like to see a footballer rip back a zombie's head and plunge a kitchen knife into its eye without a shred of hesitation. If they're so much as nudged by another player, that bunch of tarts roll 15 times on the ground, waving their arms in the air and screaming to high heaven like a sniper's just put a high-velocity round through their kneecap. I'm pretty confident every professional footballer is dead. Fuckers have 
everything done for them and just aren't equipped to survive the end of the world. Tangent. Anyway, my smart mouth is both my sword and my shield, and I don't know many adults who enjoy being outsmarted by a ten-year-old with a grasp of sarcasm way ahead of their time. Abstract concepts usually start getting grasped at around eleven or twelve, I read somewhere, but I was snapping back at nine. That was a problem. Let's leave it like that. On top of reading, I discovered parkour from my endless fascination with YouTube and became obsessed with it. It was just so mesmerizing, watching these men and women do breathtaking things, so elegant and strong, their movements so aesthetically graceful and fluid. My life was so unbearably mundane, constantly moving about, always moving schools, never putting down roots. Reading let me escape in a quiet corner, but I wanted something that would set my heart racing and fell in love with extreme sports. BMX, skateboarding, base jumping, free diving, parkour. My heart would race just watching that shit on a screen, and I wanted some of it. The closest I'd ever come to an extreme sport was trying to furiously finish my homework as the teacher was walking around the class collecting it from everyone. Whew, what a rush. My apparent absence of fear was both a blessing and curse during my early years. I'd try something way too advanced and bang the shit out of myself, ending up in A&E so many times I got to know some of the staff by name. Naturally, being a free spirit as I was, I ended up in the wrong crowd. Fast forward to 15, I was pretty nimble and accomplished by this time, and I'd also started training in MMA, because boobs are way too interesting for teenage boys, and in the circles I lived in, boundary issues were the norm. A broken instep, a kick in the balls so hard they'd have three Adam's apples, and a fearless headbutt to the nose soon dissuaded anyone getting too touchy-feely without my consent. I became one of the lads. I stopped getting treated like someone they just wanted to bang when I proved myself to have more balls than the rest of them combined. Then I learned to steal cars. Look, I'm not proud of how that shit went down these days. This was ten years ago, and I was fucked up. A kid just looking to find a place for herself in a world that had chewed me up, spat me out, and shat on me repeatedly. Don't feel sorry for me, dear reader. That's not why I'm telling you this. I don't want your sympathy. I just want you to understand who I was before I became who I am. Stealing cars got me in the worst trouble of my life. It was a turning point for me. Even if I do say so myself, I'm a pretty fucking good driver at high speed. My abhorrent lack of fear made me try things no sane child of that age would ever consider. Yes, I crashed a few times, of course I did. Looking back, I'm just thankful that nobody got hurt, as that guilt would royally mess me up now. I did get in a bit of cat and mouse with one copper, who almost caught me a few times. He knew me by sight after some escapes from wrecked vehicles he'd chased me from, but have you ever seen a police officer able to follow a 15-year-old girl with some serious gymnastic parkour skills when she's on the run? Nope. The meathead had no chance of catching me once I scampered up the side of a building Spider-Man style and vanished into the night. All good things had to come to an end, though. One night, I fucked up, racing around town in the dark, and I lost control, smacking into a parked van. Lo and behold, just as I wrecked my current joyride and was trying to get my wits about me, that same copper's patrol car turned the corner in front of me, and I was banged to rights. He opened the door, checked I was okay. I was just a bit frazzled, and then he gave me the biggest shit-eating grin I've ever seen anyone express. He was like the Cheshire Cat post-blowjob. I've been waiting for you for a long time, he said. Well, I got here as fast as I could, I retorted, puffing out my cheeks. He was still chuckling as he put the cuffs on me. Officer Dean Williams saved me that day. I don't know what he saw in me, what possessed him to take a special interest in me, but he did. He kept me out of juvenile detention when it went to court, once he learned my background. He took me home himself, cast his eyes around the group home I was in, and I think he unraveled my story in that singular moment. 
Right until I was 18 and a legal adult, when the foster homes spit you out to fend for yourself, Officer Williams was my guardian angel. I finished school with decent exam results because he was always on my back, driving me to be better. And he was responsible for sticking the first David Gemmell novel I ever read into my hand. If you've never read him, do so. Waylander, it was called. A good man once, torn by tragedy with the murder of his family, embraces the darkness and becomes a killer for hire after avenging his family's murder. He falls so far and becomes so good at it, he ends up killing the king of his nation for coin, plunging the land into war. A chance meeting with a priest, a woman and three children sets him on a path to redemption. He seeks to atone, falls in love, becomes the nation's greatest hero when it needs him the most. He rose above the darkness of his life to become something else. Something better. Officer Williams knew what he was doing with that book, and it lit a fire under my ass. I devoured every one of those books I could get my hands on, and those themes sang to me. Honor, redemption, friendship, love. Good themes. I wanted to be better, like one of those characters in his books. Yes, I was flawed as all hell, and I'd done some pretty shitty things. Never killed a king, though, so there's that. But those books taught me that redemption and a chance to be better was always within my grasp. All I had to do was reach for it. Dino, as I lovingly called him as we were now BFFs, and his wife Maria, became like an aunt and uncle to me. Maria would forever feed me, send me off to the shower with clean towels and clothes, let me sleep in their spare room for a night or two if I needed it. They treated me like family, the first people to ever make me feel like someone really had my back, and they set my path on the straight and narrow. They made me want to be better, to step out of the shadow my asshole parents loomed over me with their fucked up choices and neglect. They set me on the road to being cuffed by Dino, but it was that copper in his wife that showed me there was a better way if I had the courage to take a road less travelled. I fucking love that couple. They're the very definition of honest, decent, hard-working people. He's a police officer, and she a nurse. Their entire lives are dedicated to helping others, and they do those jobs above and beyond any call of duty, simply because they care. I always felt bad for them because they couldn't have kids of their own and had finally come to accept it as they both knocked mid-thirties. They'll both be mid-forties now, no doubt holding senior roles in their chosen professions. I really hope they're okay. After witnessing how fast shit goes west yesterday, when we went from ten living people to nine murderous undead in less than two minutes, I worry for them both. Maria especially. I mean, fucking hell. Just consider how chaotic a hospital would become in two minutes. I'm feeling a bit raw now after spilling that out. I don't like going over the past. I'm more of a live-for-the-moment type of girl, and trudging through all that old dirt just ruins my mood. I might come back to it eventually and fill in what I did from becoming an adult at some other point. Particles is also looking at me like I'm the worst person since Hitler because I haven't fed him yet. So, I should go do that. 17th Entry Taking Stock So, we've spent the day just recovering. Nate and I have been jumping about for a month, and after yesterday's unholy mess and subsequent physical labour, we needed to take stock and properly check out the lodge, while also running through the inventory. The room I blasted top knot in has been written off as a bedroom. No fucker will want to sleep in there. So Nate's pretty handy with tools and the like, and has said he'll build some shelving in there, and we'll make it a storeroom. I had a mooch in Grace and Theo's bungalow, and that place is pretty darn nice. Comfortable and cosy, yet pretty big. It's got three decent-sized bedrooms, so the three of us are going to move in there and make that our primary living space, leaving the lodge open for any new survivors we might collect along the way. Yeah, that was a fun conversation with Nate. 
What do you mean, other people? He demanded after I said it in passing. We've got space here, I pointed out. We can comfortably add a few extra people here. Complement the skills we have. Nate shook his head firmly. Absolutely not. It's too much of a risk. Have you forgotten what happened here yesterday already? No, Nate, I haven't forgotten, I said, my tone bleak. I don't think I'll ever forget hearing Ariel's mind break when her buffalo got chomped on. I let that one settle with him for a minute, and the guy at least had the grace to look contrite. But just because we had one bad experience doesn't mean we should isolate ourselves in our nice little safe space. There might be other people out there, scared and alone, in need of help. Are you really going to tell a single mum with a five-year-old to get bent and walk on while they scream and beg for your help as you pass? Erin's right, offered Freya, scratching behind Particle's ears as he sat on her lap. I don't think I could sleep at night if we just left someone to die. It's not practical, he pushed back, though this time with far less conviction. Nate's a hard man, who's clearly been through some shit that I'll never be able to imagine. But he's not an asshole, and he's got ticks in the box for noble acts. He saved me from a fate worse than death, and let me stick with him after all. Let's face it, I'm probably more annoying than anyone we might collect on our travels by at least a factor of three. Honestly, I think he's just trying to protect us, which is sweet, but ultimately pointless. Well. If we're talking practical, do you know how to tend those herb and vegetable gardens out there? That's a great source of fresh food and good nutrients, but unless we learn shit real quick, it's finite. Nate's not a man prone to snappy judgments. He sat there for a moment, still as a sculpture, then sighed. Fair enough, he conceded, but we're going to have to use some instinct and good sense. The fact is, we can't take every stray in because there'll always be the chance they're rotten inside. Space is limited. Food is limited. We should probably do something about that, I mused. We need food, we need medical stuff, and we need hygiene stuff because I'm never spending a month covered in zombie goo again. Town is only about five miles away, and if we keep to little corner shops and pharmacies, we could boost our stores considerably in no time. And there it is, the beginning of a survival plan. I'm actually pretty stoked by it. Tomorrow, Nate and I are going out to a little row of shops I know in town that's away from the bulk of residential estates. There's a pharmacy, convenience store, and a little further up the road is a petrol station. We need to fill up the pickup as it's our best vehicle for loot loading. Frey is not ready for the field yet, so she's going to go right through the lodge and inventory absolutely fucking everything. Food, medicine, cleaning, hygiene, bedsheets, towels, everything. I'm so glad she volunteered for that job, because a quartermaster I am not. I can't think of anything more soul-destroying than inventory. What we need is a nerd. Right, I'm going to get some sleep. Tomorrow, Nate and I go out to play. Um, I mean, seriously recon the area and acquire much-needed provisions. Priority one, coffee. I am a caffeine-dependent life form, and I don't care if it's shite instant coffee. If I have to drink another hot, fruity beverage, I'm going to lose my shit. I'd really like a proper cup of tea, but without milk and sugar, tea just doesn't hit the spot for me. I can drink black coffee, however, with no problem at all. What I most certainly can't do is drink another lavender and elderflower tea. It's like drinking perfume. Nighty night. July 28th, 2010. Gorilla with a gun. Well, fuck. The situation has changed. A lot. First of all, you'll note that I've got an actual date for this entry. Freya found a laptop in the bungalow, so I can now keep actual history instead of just writing incremental entry numbers. The laptop calendar has given me a sense of time again, which weirdly makes me happy. 
Everything was just blurring into one great smear of time, so knowing the actual date has put some order back into my existence. It's the little things. It's also a lot easier being able to type my memoirs of the apocalypse than handwrite them in notebooks. I'll have to scoop up my diaries and add them at the start of this digital record, so it's all in one place. But I'll do that when I've got time. So, what's changed? There's a group of survivors in town that have banded together and, dear reader, these motherfuckers are bad news. I'll get to them, but let's get this shit shoveled. Nate and I rolled out early this morning about eight, taking the pickup. The truck's bed was empty, ready for our loot haul, and all we took were weapons. Nate has attached a leather strip to my shotgun so I can sling it over my shoulder if I need to climb. And he also made me this cool bandolier type thing that goes from shoulder to hip with tight loops to load up with shotgun cartridges. I now have two in the barrels and a further ten, ready to just slide out and pop in as needed. Nobody's ever made me anything before. I don't mind saying that I was a little touched by it. Also, it gave me great opportunity to rag on Nate about his mad sewing skills. I asked if he could crochet a live, laugh, love sign for the bungalow, but I can't repeat what he said. That block of granite could make Bernard Manning blush with the colour of his language when he puts his mind to it. I was impressed. Melee weapons for close work were important too. Nate has his crocodile Dundee knife, and he gave me something called a roofer's pick hammer. It has a usual flathead hammer one side, but on the other is a vicious-looking spike, which is used for putting holes in slate tiles, Nate tells me, before the other end is used to bang the nail through that hole. If I've got to smush a brain in quick order, that spike will do the job, no doubt. I felt like a bandido as we rolled out, leaving particles in the loving care of Freya. She came to the gates with us and rolled the little car to block them off after we'd gone, and we gave her a signal pattern for the horn when we returned, so she knew it was safe to let us in. And off we went. We rolled into the edge of town about twenty minutes later, the countryside giving way to rows of houses along a road that stretched right across the top of town. About half a mile down, I pointed out to Nate where the shop and pharmacy were. He nodded and pulled the truck up a little short. It's right there, I said. Why stop here? Recon, he replied, reflexively drawing his Glock, checking the slide and chamber. He does that. Everything needs to be locked, loaded, and ready for action before he does anything. It's like weapon OCD. Also, apparently, Glocks don't have a safety. Those fuckers are live and kicking all the time and ready to party. Handy, huh? Only go loud if you can't take a walker down in melee, he said, moving his checks to the shotgun. Any shot will draw any nearby dead, or living, for that matter, and things could go to shit at speed. We need to clear the buildings before we start collecting. No surprises, no injuries. If we're going to work together, then I need to effectively teach you how to clear rooms and a building in partnership so we're efficient. But above all, so you don't shoot me. What about you shooting me? I protested. If I ever shoot you, kid, he murmured, it'll be entirely on purpose. I laughed. Funny old bastard. The shop front was locked, which gave me real hope that the place was largely untouched. Nate had me keep an eye out as he slid a small fabric roll out of one of the large pockets on his combat trousers and revealed bloody lock picks. I need to learn how to do that, and Nate is clearly a pro, as he had that door clicking open in seconds. Must be some special forces infiltration skill or something. You know, I keep banging on about Nate being SAS or some kind of special forces, but that's just a massive assumption, because he's so fucking competent in these situations and keeps surprising me with elegant new skills. I should probably ask him but I figure he'll tell me when he's ready, eventually. Nah, fuck it, I'm going to ask him. Since when have I respected privacy? I'm a curious little shit and people's stories interest me. Nate opened the door, 
but held up a hand, shaking his head as I moved forward a step. He leaned inside and blew a quick whistle through his teeth into the dark confines of the store, then backed up. Sure as shit, some banging and bumping came from inside the shop, and Nate turned to me. No mistake in that smell, he said by way of explanation. I nodded my understanding. You can always tell if something undead is in there. I've said before, it's not just the rot of a corpse. It's a real stench of hell kind of odour, pure taint and corruption. Knocks you sick. We backed up, knife and hammer ready respectively, as a heavy-set Asian man came stumbling into the light. He'd come home and locked himself in after being bitten, it seemed, as there was a massive chunk of flesh missing from his left forearm. The bite had sealed his doom, and he'd locked himself in the store, an undead booby trap waiting to be sprung. Booby? Snigger. The good sign was that there was no blood on his lips, which meant he hadn't bitten anyone else since dying, so he was likely the only zombie in the shop. It wasn't a big place, just a quick stop to pick up some bits, but for us it was a gold mine if still full to the brim. Nate nodded to me, indicating he wanted the pick hammer tested. I slung the shotgun diagonally across my shoulder, pulling the tool from my belt and spinning it so the point was angled forward. I moved in its eyeline, letting it focus all that hunger and fury in my direction. As it neared, its speed increased, readying for lunge mode. One quick sidestep, one fast arc, and the thing collapsed as the hammer's pick punched unerringly through the top of the balding man's pate and into the brain. Seems to work just fine, Nate nodded, his tone suggesting I'd just started a car and revved the engine a couple of times. Meanwhile, I was trying not to shudder as I stuck my foot on the guy's face to lever the hammer out of his head like King Arthur withdrawing some gory Excalibur. Peachy, I muttered, trying to avoid flicking brain juice on myself. I'm not going to lay down all the lessons Nate gave me then, but he taught me the correct way to work as a pair when clearing rooms and buildings, making sure the barrel of your gun never points at your teammate, breaking a building down into sectors, how to do that balanced combat walk Nate does so smoothly. I have to say, it was interesting stuff. Now, he didn't do a live test. That would just be dumb. Nate swept through that building single-handed first with his Glock, fast and efficient, while I kept watch outside. Only when he announced it was clear did he walk me through the building, telling me what to do at every stage, all the things I should and shouldn't do, the latter of which were often emphasised with the motivational phrase of Stop fucking doing that, Erin, or you'll get us both killed. I learned a lot. But, with the building clear, we had the joy of then assessing our loot. And oh, mama, it was a payday. The place was pretty much untouched, so we rolled the truck up right outside the door and started loading it up. Canned food, bottled water, all the coffee. Sanitary products, there are two women after all. Bottled water, toilet paper, soap, cleaning products, shampoo, toothpaste, alcohol, mainly wine and spirits, because everybody has to kick back now and again. Trays of canned fizzy drinks, because yum. And Nate even loaded up on cigarettes as well. I gave him a weird look, and he pointed out that if we did meet others, they might make good trade items. Clever bastard thinking ahead. Some people will still want to poison their lungs, even in an apocalypse. The owner's keys were in his pocket, and out back we also found his big white transit van, which he obviously went to the wholesalers in. That was a win, as his keys included the one for that too. So we decided to take both vehicles back to the lodge. The van started first time and had a good half tank of fuel left, so doing as much as we could in this single run was just sensible. We could head back with a pickup and a van full to bursting of stuff, so we decided to spend a few hours loading up. After a while, when we'd been left to our own devices, with no further incursion from living or dead, Nate checked I was okay on my own, and I gave him the nod. He wanted to break into the back of the pharmacy next door, 
as that had a full metal shutter covering the shop front, and fill up on important stuff like dressings, antibiotics, painkillers, general cold and flu treatments, that kind of stuff. What a fucking surprise. The guy was also versed in combat medicine and had a decent understanding of emergency stuff needed. So I left him to it. I was out back, off in my own little world, while sliding another tray of canned food into the back of the transit, when a voice stopped me dead. Hello, sweetheart. I froze, the shotgun still slung around my shoulder and hammer in my belt. A ripple of laughter told me the speaker was not alone. Slowly, I turned around, finding seven leering faces gawking at me. All of them were armed, wielding a collection of tools and blades. A couple of them had what looked like fire axes, but they had a weird crowbar tool on the other end. One crazy-looking bastard had, I shit you not, a fucking machete in his hand. The other three had a selection of heavy hammers. What really drew my eye, though, was the guy in the middle, as he was holding a semi-automatic handgun that looked almost identical to Nate's. Well, fuck a duck, chuckled the gunman, who resembled a gorilla more than a man. If it isn't little Lady Locke. Hearing my name snapped my gaze from the gun in his hand. I examined his face, frowning. You've got to be shitting me, I muttered as I recognised his leering grin. I hadn't seen the bastard for ten years, and he was shockingly large then, as big as any grown man. Now he was in his late twenties, the motherfucker was huge of chest and shoulder. He wasn't someone who'd worked out and got big. He was one of those guys that are just born with gargantuan natural brawn. Freakishly strong, a good five inches over six feet, hair on his arms that was closer to fur, and, as I looked squarely at him, he appeared almost as wide as he was tall. He was like the link between man and ape, stuck in the middle of his transformation, a thing hammered out on evolution's forge before being cast aside for something more aesthetically pleasing and elegant. Johnny fucking Bancroft. This was bad. Very bad. Bancroft was a bona fide psycho from a long line of bona fide psychos. He was the second of four brothers, his eldest brother being the most dangerous criminal in this little town. The patriarch of the family, Harry, was banged up in some prison somewhere, but the Bancrofts were a name everyone knew, and everyone avoided if they could. No good came from being on their radar. While Johnny's intelligence was reflected in his appearance, one evolutionary link beyond animal and just scraping the bottom of humanity's barrel, his brother Jamie was the real deal. Drugs, guns, extortion rackets, grand theft auto, coppers on the payroll, full-on criminal kingpin and really bad news. My past was coming back to haunt me a month into the end of the world, Another cosmic laugh-and-point moment from the universe's black sense of humour. Long time no see, I said, affecting a more relaxed pose, leaning against the van's tail, mind working furiously. That's a lot of stuff for one little girl, he grinned, eliciting another ripple of sycophantic laughter from his minions. Well, Tesco's running a bit behind with their deliveries, so I thought I should stock up. This was good. It meant they didn't know about Nate, which suggested they'd only just got here. I had to keep my smart mouth running for as long as I could to give Nate time, though my eyes kept flicking to the loosely held pistol in Bancroft's hand. If he didn't have that, I could have escaped from this bunch of muppets in a blink. One false move, though, and Bancroft might give me a severe case of lead poisoning I wouldn't survive. That pretty mouth of yours is still too quick for its own good, I see. The way he said pretty mouth, combined with his intense leer, made my teeth itch. Bancroft had always had a thing for me, but it was a possessive desire. He wanted to dominate me, have me under his power. He didn't like the fact I was so much smarter than him, and every time I slapped him or his cronies with a witty retort back in the day, they pulled that mental long division face I referred to earlier. 
Bancroft wanted to shut my pretty mouth up, and I had no doubt what he wanted to fill it with. Gag. I feel sick at even the notion. He'd get a shock if he ever did, though. I'd grind that sweaty little chipolata of his to bloody paste between my teeth. How's the family? I asked, playing for time and not wanting to light the fire of his infamous anger too early. We own this town now, he smirked. We did before, but now we make the laws. Anyone left here is ours now. Johnny Bancroft is not a genius, as his spilling of intel without any subterfuge proves. So I decided to dig a bit deeper. How many is that? About 40 or so. He looked me up and down. We could do with another woman or two, though. The ones we've got are getting a bit worn out. Another smattering of laughter from his cronies. I swear to God, if I could have swung my shotgun round without taking a bullet, I'd have blasted him into oblivion right then and there. Tell you what, Lockie, he said, in a tone that suggested he was about to offer me a sweet deal. Why don't you put that gun down before you hurt yourself? Then, come along with us. Jamie would love to have a word. Well, I'd love to, Johnny, I sighed. But as you can see, I'm a little busy right now. Rain check? And there it was. In the click of a finger, his expression clouded over, a little flicker of madness flashing in his eyes. His jaw became an underbite as it jutted in irritation, and I knew shit was teetering on the edge of violence. I wasn't asking, he snarled. Don't move an inch, said Nate, appearing behind me as he slid out from the front of the van. Jesus, that gravel tone was like the sweetest symphony to my ears. Back up. Johnny and his minions were slow on the uptake. Nate stalked to my side, glock up in two hands and steady as a rock, the barrel clearly pointed at Johnny's ape-like frame. The gorilla still had his gun down by his side. Oh, how the tables had turned. Ape Boy was the only one with a firearm, the rest of his thugs all armed with melee weapons, and Nate had taken control in an instant. Who the fuck are you? demanded Johnny, adding a splash of bravado to his demeanor so he didn't lose face. You got yourself a sugar daddy, Lockie. Quit yapping, puppy, said Nate, or I'll put you down. Nate just doesn't need to raise his voice, at all. He just tells you how things are going to be, and you shut the fuck up and listen. Bancroft, however, had all his brain cells lined up in single file. The guy is so fucking dense, I swear light just bends around him. Do you know who I am? He postured. Ah, that old chestnut. I don't know, and I don't care, retorted Nate, equally bored by the chest puffing. Let me tell you what I do know, puppy. What I know is, if you and your little puppy friends don't put your weapons on the ground real slow, turn your asses round and walk quietly away, this old wolf is going to end you. The whole scene went still, all of Bancroft's minions starting to get twitchy. The fuckers were sheep holding sticks, and Nate was a lion with a gun. They were out of their depth against a real warrior. Intimidation and numbers were usually enough for them, but their true cowardice was starting to resonate under Nate's steady and withering glare. Their eyes kept looking to Bancroft, and he could sense their questioning gaze, but the dumb fuck was too obstinate to take the hint. Pride is the most foolish of the seven sins. It builds a tiny fortress inside your mind and heart, swaggering round it like a mad dictator, while remaining completely oblivious to the enemy at the gates. There's seven of us, old timer, warned Bancroft, but his voice had lost its edge. He was losing and he knew it, but he was too damn stupid to know when to fold his hand. You can't take us all down. I don't need to, puppy, said Nate. All you need to know is that the moment even one of you twitches in a way I don't like, your switch will get flicked. 
and you won't have to worry about what comes next. Taking the opportunity, I swung the shotgun round from my shoulder, pointing it at some of the minions. From this range, I reckon I could get two of them with a single barrel, I said jovially. What do you reckon, Nate? He nodded on cue. Easy. Maybe even three at once if you pop both barrels. That tipped them. The guy to Bancroft's right leaned towards him. Come on, boss, murmured Machete. This ain't the time. Fuck him, spat Bancroft, and he moved. Nate's first bullet was true, punching through the massive target of his chest center mass. The second bullet, a millisecond later, cracked through Bancroft's skull before the gorilla's gun moved barely an inch. The moment he spoke, Nate knew what was coming, and as soon as Bancroft's arm twitched, the old soldier didn't hesitate. Bang, bang, classic double tap, and the gun-toting primate was dead before he'd even figured out he'd been shot the first time. The rest of his crew clattered their weapons to the asphalt, arms up, horrified at the shift in dynamic. Machete looked down at Bancroft's corpse, then back up at Nate. You've no idea what you've done, old man, he blurted. Fuck, that's Johnny Bancroft. Jamie's not gonna stop until he strings you up. Take your friend back to his family, said Nate, ignoring Machete's disbelief. If I see any of you dickheads again, we won't be having this conversation. As of now, you shoot on sight to me. They stared at him, horrified and frozen. You've got till I hit ten. There are enough bullets in this magazine for all of you twice over. One? Nate didn't even get to two. The six thugs picked up Johnny's corpse and scarpered, struggling under the big bastard's dead weight. But there was no way they were heading back to Jamie Bancroft without his little brother's body. We better finish up, said Nate quietly. No telling if and when they'll be back with reinforcements, and I don't want anyone tailing us back to the lodge. I nodded, wandering over to the weapons scattered on the asphalt. I picked up one of the weird axe tools, nodding at its hefty weight. I like this. Weirdest axe I ever did see. That's not an axe, said Nate. That's a fireman's halligan. Halligan, her? Huh? I nodded. I think I'll keep it. We finished up in quick order, spending no more than twenty minutes with the two of us rushing for all we were worth, trying to get as much in the pickup and van as we could. Pretty soon, though, Nate called time. We had plenty, and even though the transit van was only half full, we were running down an hourglass of unknown size, so we closed up and set our little convoy for home. We had to forego the fuel run after our encounter, so that's something we'll have to come back to. We had a conversation about Jamie Bancroft when we were back, but I'll write about that tomorrow, when I'm sipping on my morning coffee. I have to say, though, I think we just kicked the hornet's nest. Pride runs deep in the Bancroft family. Reputation and image is everything to those bastards. Jamie's not like Johnny. He's smarter but a real sadist. Johnny was just a meathead, not even trusted to lead the real thugs of the Bancroft operation. The Bancrofts have access to firearms, but Johnny's little crew weren't high enough on the food chain to be trusted with them, apparently, and he only got one because he's Jamie's brother. As if the dead aren't enough to deal with, now we've got a local psycho and his mini-army thirsty for revenge. Fuck this shit. I'm going to bed. July 29th, 2010. Happy with a twist. The sun is shining. I've got steaming hot coffee. I've had a hot shower. Particles is chowing down on some proper dog food. And the other two are fast asleep. All in all, I'm in a decent frame of mind this morning. So while I'm feeling chipper, I'll fill you in on our conversation last night. I gave Nate the lowdown on the Bancrofts and the implications of him just shooting one of them dead. I gave them fair warning, he shrugged, sipping at a coffee. The ape chose to ignore it. It's not like they can find us. You don't know Jamie, Nate, I warned, 
He's a cunning shitball and single-minded. Anyone who crosses the Bancrofts ends up dead, and the son of a bitch is a full-on sadist. He likes to take pieces from people while they're still alive, getting a hard-on over their screams. This is bad news. They'll be on the lookout for us, so going into town is going to be nigh on impossible for supplies. We'll just go to the next town over, in the other direction. We can't, I said. That coordinates the tension. Can't? I shook my head vigorously. Can't? He's got captives, women being used as sex slaves from what Johnny let slip. I can't let that go. Nate put his cup down slowly and deliberately. I don't want to sound heartless, but that's not our problem. I gaped at him. Not our problem, I repeated, aghast. Not our fucking problem. Nate, that baboon gorilla love child was going to haul me off to be one of those unwilling sex dolls. And even put that aside, can we fucking sleep if we did nothing? Really? Isn't there a quote about a bystander refusing to act when witnessing evil is, in fact, committing an evil act? Hold up there, kid, he said, raising a hand. A minute ago, you were bemoaning the fact that I'd ended the brother of a complete psycho who will be gunning for us. But now, you want to take the fight to them? What can I say? I shrugged, all nonchalant. I'm whimsical. This isn't a storybook tale about good versus evil, light versus dark and all that bullshit. This is real fucking life. And they're real people, suffering under a fucking sadistic tyrant, I snapped back. For all we know, we're the only people anywhere near here that can do anything about it. Forty, you said, replied Nate, remaining infuriatingly calm in the hurricane blast of my outrage. Forty, Erin. A 52-year-old veteran who finds new ways to grunt and groan as he moves every morning, and a 20-something kid who only just learned to shoot. You think those are good odds against 40? 40 was the number Johnny gave as a total. I wasn't going to be deterred by something as obvious and logical as facts or common sense. They won't all be hostiles. We might even have allies if we kick shit off. Kick shit. Nate's sentence trailed off, staring at me to figure out if I was being serious. Then a deep frown cutting the lines of his forehead as he realized that yes, I was. What you're talking about is insanity. They have us outnumbered a minimum of 10, maybe 15 to 1, if that 40 is a total headcount. But far more importantly, they have us outgunned. You said this Bancroft guy was into small times arms deals, local criminals, gangs and the like. I nodded. Which means every one of those hostiles could be armed. They're thugs, Nate, I argued. They're not trained shooters, just thugs. Thugs with guns and ten to one odds, he said slowly. This isn't a Jason Bourne movie, Erin. I bet those fuckers are only used to sticking those guns in people's faces or executing close up. I bet if you put them to the test, turn them around every which way, they'd be about as effective with those weapons as Imperial stormtroopers. He gave me his, you're doing it again, look, when I made a pop culture reference. Star Wars, you fucking Luddite. Jesus, everyone knows Star Wars. It's been around since 1977, for fuck's sake. In 77, I was in basic training to be a Royal Marine, he said. Didn't have time to catch the latest movies. I put that one in my pocket. First little slip is made about his past. Mind you, all I really took from that statement was, Oh my God, you were a grown man when Star Wars came out, you creaky old pensioner. I tried a different tactic. Nate, you were a soldier. I said, forcing myself to calm. Marine, he corrected me. Eh? I wasn't a soldier. I was a Marine. I pulled a face. Pedantic old sod. Whatever, a Marine. Either way, you signed up to be a protector, right? 
not because you wanted to shoot people. Getting your hands dirty so others didn't have to, protecting the freedom and liberties our ancestors fought so hard to protect. I bet your old man fought against the Nazis, right? Nate nodded, his gaze intense. He did? And I bet it was those stories, that camaraderie, that fighting the good fight and so forth. That was what put you in the service, wasn't it? Your granddad probably fought in the Great War. Your dad fought the second time around, and you felt you had to honour them by following in their footsteps, right? Nate's face betrayed genuine surprise. Lucky shoots, she scores. Told you I could read people. So, let me ask you this, Nate. I looked him dead in the eye. What would your grandpappy and your pops think of you, leaving innocent women to be tormented by a despot tyrant? What would they think if they knew you had the power to act, but still did nothing, because it wasn't your problem? That one stung, his own words returning to haunt him. How to Shame a Soldier's Honour by Erin Locke, in all good bookshops from Thursday. Also, probably the title of a porno somewhere. I decided to press my advantage. Nate, this world is dying or dead, and the people that are left should be working together to build something new, to fight against the dead. These people need a hero, but there aren't any heroes left. I punched him playfully on his thick arm. So, I guess it's up to us. Say for a moment I entertained this, he said eventually. It was hard not to do a victory twerk in his face. I knew he was in, but I thought the twerking might undo all my intelligent argument and salient points, so I just did an imperceptible shimmy in my chair. If we do this, we have to do it smart, and we have to do it right. He gave me a stern look that said his next statement was entirely for my benefit alone. Which means not going half-cocked like some dumb comic book hero. Comics aren't dumb, I said. The characters and themes contained throughout history since their inception have often been symbols of the radical and divisive social change of the time. The X-Men as mutants endured bigotry, their creation inspired by the civil rights movement. Black Panther and the She-Hulk reflected the difficulties endured by ethnic minorities and women. Comics are just as important to history as any other literature. Nate stopped, staring at me like I'd been possessed by some kind of demon, and it was another voice emanating from my body. Though, in your defence, some were hit and miss, I mused aloud. Hell Cow, for example, was a vampire cow. Bessie was bitten by Dracula himself, and once teamed up with Deadpool. A vampire cow? That's pretty dumb, to be fair. I think Nate relaxed then as he realised I hadn't gone anywhere. You're proving my point, Erin, he said, knowing that every time he used my first name it scratched at my nerves. He had a way of saying it that made him sound like a dad. A proper dad, though, not the asshole wife and daughter beating druggy I had. You need to focus and do this my way, or we'll both end up dead, and then your precious hero complex will be no good to anyone. Son of a bitch. Seems Nate is pretty good at reading people as well. I nodded. Okay then, what's the plan? Nate snorted. Erin, we've only just got back from this whole mess getting started. Let me eat, sleep, shit, shower and think. Rushing anything is the best way to get everyone killed. Stupid logic and sensible approach. Well, as long as we're going to do something, I'm okay. You know, Erin, you really are insane, sighed Nate. I prefer happy with a twist, to be honest, I replied with a straight face. Freya remained quiet as Nate and I discussed this, admitting to me later that she felt a bit useless as she couldn't contribute. I reassured her that her work here was just as important and all the inventory she was doing on the mass of spreadsheets on this laptop was vital. We have to know exactly what we have and how much of it. Just because she's no fighter doesn't lessen her value in any way. When Nate and I returned, 
She took some of the stuff we brought back and made tasty as hell pasta bake with canned tuna, canned vegetables, and covered in cheese that was still in date. I'm going to miss cheese so much when it's gone. My heart breaks at the thought of no dairy in my life. Keeping those home fires burning is every bit as important as me and Papa Reaper shooting and kicking the bad things. She just wants to feel like she's contributing, and I assured her she does. Not least because I have a friend to return to that isn't a 50-something Terminator. At the moment, Freya is mega important to my mental health. Her and Particles are my tribe. Well, and Nate too, obviously, but he's like our grumpy dad. Freya's my sister from another mister. Plus, I reminded her that I probably wouldn't be here if she hadn't done her commando strike on Theo as he tried to eat my face. She does not lack contribution. Well, I doubt we'll be doing anything today, so I'm going to help Freya with the inventory while Nate works out the stages of his master plan. I fucking hate inventory, like I've said, but it's a good opportunity to do some girly bonding with my homegirl. July 31st, 2010 Bored I'm so fucking bored. Actually, the correct description would be, I'm bored of waiting. I know Nate said we had to plan and do things right, but Jesus, this fucker is slower than a turtle swimming in peanut butter. Stupid similes aside, I'm getting impatient. I just want to be doing something. Freya and I have counted everything, and no, I'm not recording it here for posterity, because that shit is boring. Suffice to say, we've got a fat haul of good loot, and it's all checked off. Now, I need to do something productive with my time, even if that's to just go and find a console and some games, so I can Mario Kart my days away while I'm waiting. Fucking love that game. Oh, hang on. Papa Reaper wants a word. Be right back. Finally, something to do. Recon and acquisition. Nate's two biggest requirements before we even consider liberation are communications and hardware. Comms so we can keep in touch when doing recon, and he's adamant that he's not doing anything with shotguns and limited pistol ammo. He wants real hardware, preferably a scoped rifle. New bombshell. Nate is a trained sniper. Of course he fucking is. Next he'll be a demolitions expert, or possibly even trained in the construction of a thermonuclear warhead if we can rustle up some weapons-grade uranium and plutonium. Pretty sure he's probably close to finding a cure for cancer. I challenged him on it, and all he said was that men in my unit needed to cover a number of disciplines for operations behind enemy lines which is what this will be. If that isn't black ops speak, I don't know what is. I fucking knew it. Anyway, what we need are walkies, with a secure channel if possible, and some more hardware. Nate wants to hit a cop shop to see if there's anything left there. That means going into town, which is itself a risk, seeing as how Bancroft will have a major boner for our messy deaths. Further through town, there's a big electronics store on a small retail park, so as a backup, we might be able to get something basic there as a fallback. Today, I also watched Nate make some homemade smoke bombs, and I was fascinated. Asking why, Nate again shows his super forward thinking. We're massively outnumbered, and if we're ever pinned down under fire, we can use these to cover a potential escape. I shrugged but watched him do it anyway. Fascinated. I like learning what he has to teach. Powdered sugar, baking soda, potassium nitrate, which is apparently used for fertilizers, and there was a tub of it on one of the nearby farms, and newspaper. He made his mix of three parts pot nitrate, two parts sugar, added hot water, added baking soda, and mixed it all up until it was dissolved and made a dirty-looking liquid. Pouring it all into a big plastic box from the kitchen, he then separated the sheets of a newspaper and started laying them in, one at a time, soaking everything up. When the liquid was all soaked up, he hung them out to dry outside. 
Once dry, he rolled the newspaper sheets into a single tight roll, tying it all up with quick rings of duct tape. Then the clever bastard made a couple of fuses, getting some boxes of matches and grinding all the sulfuric heads off with a small pair of pliers into the tray, taking a couple of small plastic straws, the thinnest he could find, off some juice boxes we'd brought back on one of our supply runs, and scooping up that mixed, flammable dust into them and packing it tight sealing off the bottom and the top of his new makeshift fuses by wrapping it in a tiny bit of shrink wrap. Voila! Fuse just jammed into the centre of the tightly packed new, dried smoke bomb, and they were ready to go. Honestly, I was pretty amazed. Haven't seen one on the go yet, so I've no idea if it will actually work. But hey, when has the old dog ever been wrong? I hate writing details, this is getting like a fucking textbook. I'm not writing bloody history. I'm writing a tale for the ages. So I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to fuck this off about what we're going to do, then tell you what happened in a colourful and sense-overwhelming display of bardic magnificence. That's more my style. Details are so... Nate. If you're reading this, Nate, then yes, that was an insult. You big, wrinkly scrotum face. Love you, LOL. Who am I kidding? One thing I know for sure, Nate would type on a keyboard with one rigid finger and his tongue sticking out one side of his mouth as he makes his thinking face. There's as much chance of Nate using a computer as Anne Frank having a hankering for the drums. We're rolling out. Hope I don't die. You'll miss me. August 1st, 2010. Shooty McFuckface. I'm not dead, nor is Nate. Winning. It was a close run thing, though. Bancroft really does want us dead, and yesterday he nearly got his wish. Yes, yesterday. I've come to discover that morning is my writing time at the moment. Particles making nom-nom noises as he munches his breakfast. Me with a hot cup of coffee and this little white digital page for me to tap away on is my way of processing what happened before. Anyway, I'm doing pointless details again. You want to know, dear reader, why we nearly died, don't you? You don't give a crap about me having a brew and my dog's breakfast, do you? No. You want a bard's tale. So here it comes. Nate and I weren't planning on hauling boatloads of loot, and the pickup was now known by Machete and the other cronies, so we decided to take one of the cars here at the lodge. Being super conscious of the environment as they were, there was a bunch of hybrids left behind by the lodge's guests, so we took one of those. This time I insisted on driving, because if the shit hit the fan and we had to floor it, I had way more experience than Nate at high-speed driving. There was some arguing, a lot of threats and finger-pointing, and other such tomfoolery, but eventually Nate gave in. I think my, you're the better shot if we get in some shit, argument swung it. He couldn't argue against him being a better shot, could he? The Prius was a nice car. Yes, you'll notice the correct tense I used there was the past tense. We'll get to that. Anyway. It was a nice car, and really quiet. If you eased off enough and went to a crawl, it was purely electric and stalked like a four-wheeled ninja. The cop shop was in the middle of town, so the risk was high, meaning both of us were sat with clenched arseholes as we cruised the roads. Luckily, I know the place like the back of my hand and knew most of the roads through the estates. It was an eerie journey, and the first time I'd coasted through town since the world shut out a razor blade. The town was always bustling, always active. Cars on the roads, people on the streets, kids on their bikes, chavs hanging round shops like bacteria. The usual everyday humdrum of human existence. Instead, there were lone undead shuffling, or small milling packs, sometimes even the dead pressed against the windows inside their own houses, jaws snapping at the outside world behind their prison of glass. 
There must be so many individual horror stories inside those houses, I can't even begin to imagine some of them. Men and women, young and old, and children. My heart collapses every time I think of kids trapped in bedrooms, a screaming end to their lives as their hungry undead parents try to claw their way in. The people they trusted most in the world, their protectors, now just glassy-eyed monsters wanting to rend and tear. If I think too long on these imagined stories, my chest feels tight and my eyes start to burn. Just awful. So, I'll move on with the tale. There didn't seem to be any major packs gathered anywhere, so I think we got lucky. But getting to the police station meant exposing ourselves a little, as it was on a main road through town, near to the shopping centre. All around are taller buildings, which made Nate twitchy, and with good reason. As we approached the little turn that would take us to the station car park, a rattle of three bullets raked the arse end of the Prius on my side, and I felt the tyre go. One minute everything was fine, the next there was a bang, a metallic thunk, and the shatter of a rear door window as three bullets raked in a line from tyre to window in a snap. Out my side, ordered Nate, flinging his door open and rolling out to the road. Behind a wheel. He rolled to the front wheel as I instinctively rammed the car into park, dived across the car to the passenger door, and as I slid out and moved to crouch behind the rear wheel, he closed the door behind me. I opened up the rear door and pulled out my backpack, a proper one, not particles carry bag, sliding my double barrel shotgun from the rear seat. Nate popped his head up and another three bullets raked across the front of the Toyota, punching through the engine. I was shitting myself. I'd never been under fire from living people before, and let me tell you, it's no joke. I didn't know where the bastard was, but he clearly had the advantage on us. I just folded myself as small as I could be behind the wheel, looking to Nate for answers. He was cool as ice, a thoughtful frown on his face. He reversed his own shotgun and smacked the mirror off the passenger door with the stock, then moved to the very front of the car, lying on his belly, and edged the mirror out, angling it across the street. I waited for what seemed like an eternity. After having six bullets come down range at us, the silence was somehow worse. I knew the fucker was somewhere, probably staring down a scope at the car, waiting for either of us to stick our head up. There was nowhere to go that wasn't open ground. Eventually, Nate slid back, leaving the mirror in place on the road. On the roof of the court building, off to our right. He's more at your end. Marvellous, I said happily. Nate snorted. You were right about them not being trained. If this is one of Bancroft's lookouts, he's probably just a better shot than most, but he doesn't know what he's doing. In what way? He's using a three-round burst, he said. The barrel rides up, which is why we're getting these rising strings of triple shots. He should be on semi, taking precise single shots. No marksman fires anything other than a single bullet. He's probably figured that out now. And that's a bad thing, I assume. If he's a good shot, but he's not a trained shooter. Nate rubbed at his jaw. Judging by where his two bursts started, he's either just using the base iron sight of the rifle and his shit, or he's got a scope but hasn't calibrated it properly or doesn't know how. An untrained shooter probably thinks like a video game, that you stick a scope on and that's your lot. If you don't spend the time sighting it improperly, the shots will be off. And that's a good thing, I assume? I clicked my tongue. Nate, I'm doing a lot of assuming here. What's the play? Are we safe to make a break for it or not? Nate shook his head. Even a bad shooter can get lucky. He's not off by much, and us becoming running targets will make it harder. But he's still got an elevated position. There's a reason he was put there as a lookout and sniper. It takes patience, and the fact that he's not just peppering us means he's at least conscious of conserving ammo. The good thing is, he's not firing and displacing, so we know where he is. Do you think you could get up there? There's no building I can't climb in this town, I said confidently. I'm being serious, 
he replied, face solid and stern. So am I, Nate. I've climbed every view in this shithole, and what better fuck you to authority than climbing a court building? Plus, it's an older building with bits and ledges jutting out everywhere. For someone like me, it's not even a challenge. But getting up there without being heard or seen is, he said. And once you're up there, there's a man with an assault rifle. You can't climb with the shotgun in case it bangs against anything, which means you'll have to get close and overpower him. He tapped the knife strapped to his leg. Or you'll have to execute him. That word stopped my bravado for a moment. I had no issue putting the undead to rest. Blowing their heads off with a shotgun hardly gave me pause. But cutting a throat or smashing in a skull with a hammer on a living person, well, that was something entirely different. The walkers are empty vessels, all humanity gone from them, as something dark replaces the human soul to animate the hollow husk of the person. There's a detachment in killing them, because they aren't people, they're things. Things that shouldn't be here, that hunt and kill with savage instinct. It feels more like a mercy, like you're letting the soul of that person finally go to its rest, if there is such a thing as the soul. A person, though. Even if they're a complete fucknut and deserve it, could I just sneak up behind the gunman, then with that same cold-blooded detachment, smash a hammer through his skull? I didn't know. I've never killed a living person before, and there is something intensely personal about doing it in close quarters. It's not pulling a trigger from distance. It's being close enough to touch them. But if I didn't, that bastard might kill us. I can do it, I said, with far more conviction than I really felt. But how are we even going to move? He'll see. Nate was rummaging in his own backpack. I just assumed all he kept in there were more bullets. Turns out he carries a bag of many things, TM. I watched Nate take out a small squirty tin of lighter fluid and a box of matches, followed by a thick roll of bandages. I frowned as he unrolled it, crushing it all into a big white clump. And then, like he had received prophetic visions yesterday, out came one of those homemade smoke bombs. Experienced spec ops planning for the win. Opening the passenger door, he leaned in and pressed down on all the electric windows, exposing the car to the open air. What the fuck are you doing? I whispered. He didn't answer. Instead, he lit the fuse on his newspaper and duct tape smoke bomb, then tossed it onto the driver's seat, then started spraying lighter fluid on the unrolled bandages. Nothing happened for a moment, and I wondered if his MacGyver bomb was a dud. Oh ye of little faith, Lucky. It took about 30 seconds for it all to really get going. Just a few wisps to begin with. But once it got its groove on, a thick cloud of white smoke started rolling out of the open windows, filling the space around us. Clever old bastard. Swap with me, he ordered. We shuffled past each other, then Nate opened the fuel cap and began stuffing the flammable bandage into the refilling tube, jamming it up, but leaving a long white tail hanging to the road. Got everything? I nodded. When I like this, run to there. He pointed to the low wall of a nearby car park, about four feet in height and thirty feet away. Both of us began edging away as safe as we dared, the rising smoke now relatively thick and choking. But shit, it worked like a charm. The bell end on the court roof would have a shitty job trying to pick us out cleanly through the thick haze. Once Nate was satisfied there was enough of a screen, he nodded, lit a match, stuffed it into the matchbox, and as the whole thing became a tiny fireball in his hand, he flicked it at the fuel-soaked tail of the bandage. It lit up, and we made a sprint for it. I heard the ricochet of a bullet from the road near to me, which gave me an extra burst of speed, vaulting the low wall way ahead of Nate. Only three or four seconds passed, and then, boom, the car went up like a fireball. Clumping all that bandage up gave a few seconds, as the fire shrank it enough for burning embers to fall into the tank, which then ignited all the fuel, and the Toyota went bang. Thick smoke now screened the whole area, and Nate appeared beside me. 
Leave the shotgun, only take what you need, and make a wide circle. Wait till I start shooting. He doesn't know what I've got, and when he hears me firing back with the shotgun, he'll naturally put his head down before getting pissed and returning fire at me. As soon as I pull the trigger, you go. I nodded, divesting myself of all items except my pick hammer. Be careful, he said. He looked at me for a long moment, as though he might add something else, but then his soldier mask returned, and he gave me a nod. Sucking in three quick breaths, Nate peeped over the wall and pulled the trigger on his shotgun in the court building's general direction. And I moved. I cut into the open-air shopping center, nearly shitting myself at how many zombies were milling about. No word of a lie. There were hundreds, and the boom of the explosion had all their milky eyes turning towards the source. Even though they were dotted down the wide thoroughfare that ran between the shops, I could see all were now starting to move in the same direction. Some were more advanced than others, drawn by the shooter's initial shots, no doubt. Fuck. I had to move fast, because Nate was going to get swarmed by a stream of undead, and he couldn't move until I'd dealt with the sniper. Hitting full sprint, I found myself yelping as I tore past undead in lunge mode, bobbing and weaving through ever-narrowing gaps between them. My goal was an alley between two rows of stores that would let me angle a run to the court building outside the sniper's cone of vision. I just had to trust Nate's instincts that the shooter didn't know I was coming for him. So many times, a finger nearly hooked me, or a bloodied hand swept the air an inch from my limbs. I was flooded with adrenaline, every sense heightened, every bang of my heart like a war drum. When I get super nervous, I end up giggling. I'm probably the worst fucker to have at a funeral, as I'll probably start laughing for no reason. Not that I've ever been to a funeral. Anyone living who saw my lone game of British Bulldog against the undead horde would have thought I'd lost my shit completely. Undead lunged at me, and I skipped aside, or dived under a lunge into a roll, coming up to my feet, laughing and shouting at the undead, taunting them like they gave a shit. Weird experience. Needless to say, I didn't die, and finally reached the alley, tearing round the corner and heading in a straight line. No need to look for traffic, so I belted across the four-lane carriageway, bounding the central reservation with just a single hand atop it, and then I was heading to the court building, 90 degrees to what would be the shooter's left. Shots had been traded as I ran, Nate keeping up the illusion of trying to hit the shooter, and the cocksucker fired back in bursts again, clearly getting irked by Nate's return fire. While Nate kept shooting, he was still alive, and I damn well wanted to keep him that way. Like I said to Nate, the court building is old and has that aged brick look to it, like it was built in the early part of the 20th century. They liked stylish buildings back then, instead of the soulless blocks of metal and glass that are all the rage these days. The joy of these old buildings is that there are multiple roofs at differing levels, ledges, handholds, and fancy aesthetic designs sticking out everywhere that makes it very easy to ascend with someone versed in my particular art. The crack of the rifle increased in volume and frequency as I transferred from hold to hold, and I moved around the building so I'd climb up at the shooter's rear. I waited for the next shot, my hands holding to the lip of the flat roof he was nestled on, and the moment I heard the crack, I hauled myself up. Shitty piece of luck, my dear reader. As I pulled up, Shooty McFuckface must have used the last round in his magazine, and he was turned around, reaching to a bag at his side, the clip already detached from the rifle. The gun was a mean-looking bitch, two-tone black and tan, and nothing like I'd ever seen up close and personal before. I did notice that it had a proper scope attached to it as well. There was a horrible moment as we locked eyes, and the distance was too short for him to get a new magazine in. As I swore and started to run at him, he dropped the rifle and rolled to his back, reaching for a handgun holstered on his right hip. If that thing got drawn and he pulled the trigger with me running at him just fifteen feet away, I was a dead woman. Out of pure instinct, I swept the pick hammer back and launched it at him. I've always hated the phrase, you throw like a girl, like we're inherently worse at it at a genetic level. Well, I fucked that old idiom up with my throw, 
as I sent it cartwheeling through the air like a thrown Viking axe to smack the ugly bastard right in the chest. The shock of it gave me the moment I needed to close the gap, and I swung my right foot like Stephen fucking Gerard, landing an absolute thunderbolt square under Shooty's jaw. There was no fight left in him after that, as one eye went north, the other south, blood welling in his mouth from some broken teeth, and his head lolling about like he'd just done a syringe full of heroin. I took the pistol from his hip, slid the rifle and bag away from his hands with my foot. They always do that in the movies. Flicked the safety off and pointed the pistol right at him. Never shot a pistol in my life, but from this range, it was point the nasty end at the nasty man and pull the trigger. Don't move, fuck nugget, I said. Giving him the once over, he was quite a heavy set dude. There was no way this fucker had climbed to this roof like I had, so I glanced round and found a skylight hatch. I waved Nate over, shouting at him and pointing at the slowly emerging army of undead pouring between buildings. I needed Nate to come to us, because I couldn't climb first or second and keep control of the shooter. After he finally found his way up to us through the building, Shooty had come to his senses a bit more. He was sat up, still a bit dazed, and not a little pissed that he'd been bested by little old me. When Nate hauled himself up through the hatch, however, his demeanour changed immediately. Nate has that effect on people. Nate chatted to him quietly while rifling through the contents of his bag. There were some basics in there like food and bottled water, but Nate looked like a kid at Christmas when he saw how much rifle ammo was in there. There were five magazines, the first of which was now empty after I'd caught Shooty mid-switch, which apparently are 30 rounds each. There were also two more boxes of 556, each containing 50 rounds. This guy was loaded for war, and this intrigued Nate. This is an SA-80, an A-2. He looked at the captive. This is military grade, used on the ground by British troops. Where the fuck did you get it? It turns out, now and again, Jamie Bancroft has a contact that makes a handful of these disappear. Now, this is good, because it means he doesn't have a compound full of guys carrying assault rifles, as they're a limited number. But it's also bad, because he does have some assault rifles, and considering how much shoot he was carrying, they're not short of ammo either. Shooty was very talkative, giving Nate a whole bucket full of juicy information. The Bancrofts are holed up in the family home, which is actually a big mansion outside the other edge of town. It's gated, with its water supply like ours, though they have petrol generators running power, not solar. A big ass wall, a total of 28 men under his command, and about 16 captives, 12 of which are women. There are cameras operating around the grounds as well, as apparently one of the indentured servants is a mega nerd with computers and electronics. All in all, Nate looked extremely satisfied with everything the goon spilled, eventually holding the radio up he found in the bag. How often do they check in with you? Twice a day, mumbled the thug through his broken teeth. But you called and let them know you had us pinned, so backup is en route. It was a statement, not a question, and Shooty's glum expression confirmed the truth of it. Vehicle? asked Nate, dangling a set of keys in front of him. Out back, Black Astra. Nate nodded. Time to go, Erin. I nodded and started gathering up my backpack and gun that Nate had brought over. I stopped as Nate drew his Glock. Wait, Nate, what are you? My sentence never finished. No hesitation at all, Nate lifted the handgun and cracked around through the sniper's head. What the fuck, Nate? I squealed at him. He shrugged. You want to save those captives? Well, I'm not sending even one man back to bolster their numbers or give them even a shred of intel on us. That was cold-blooded murder. That, Erin, was a tactical decision, he said calmly. I don't like it but sometimes the right choice is the hardest one to live with. You started this, remember? You want to fly in and save all these captives, and I applaud you for it. But this is the reality, Erin. We kill them, or they kill us. 
Or are you suddenly forgetting this man was placed here to watch the main road? We were in a vehicle unconnected to us, and this fucker just started shooting at it. We could have been anyone, even that single mum and a five-year-old you used as an example. That shut me up. I fucking hate it when he's right. I'll fight and kill to defend myself and those I care about, but I'm not sure I'm happy with executions. I don't think I ever should be, and that's the key, I guess. Nate took no pleasure in it, but it scares the shit out of me how he did it without even blinking. Blam. Lights out. End of story. He was right. But man, I was fucking pissed at him for springing it on me like that. The undead were milling about, so we cut our losses. The police station was a hot zone now with so many undead streaming down from the shopping centre, so that building was a write-off. Nate had his rifle in an unexpected bonus, and there was one less fucker terrorising any survivors. We had a radio that might give us an inkling into their communications, so the mission was a win, just not in the manner we expected. Slipping down through the building, we found the car parked out back, loaded up our shit and headed back here, taking a wider, circuitous route. Luckily, backup didn't arrive before we made our escape. I'm going to have to stop writing there. Just thinking about Nate's hollow expression. No flicker of emotion or hesitation as he flicked shoot his switch has left me feeling a bit low. I'm not mad at Nate, not anymore. I was on the drive home, fuming in silence. But he's right. There's no negotiation with Jamie Bancroft and his people. Every goon we take out is one less guarding the innocence they hold under their boot. I guess I'm going to have to swallow the bitter pill of our new reality. We're now officially at war, and if our two-person insurgency is going to win, then we're going to have to fight dirty. Doesn't mean I have to like it, though. August 4th, 2010. Intel. A.K.A. Boring. Nate's been listening to that radio for three days. It had a charging dock with it in the bag, and he's become obsessed with it, all part of the intel gathering. He's identified some of the major players, and officially despises Jamie Bancroft with a passion. That bad dude has got a serious hard-on for us after Johnny's death, and according to Nate, this is a good thing. It means Bancroft is erratic. He constantly demands to know if anything has been seen of that murdering geriatric or his little fucking whore. The former made Nate laugh, while the latter didn't crack a smile from either of us. I think Nate was offended more than me. I've been called worse, but his old school sensibilities didn't like it at all. They're not organised in a sensible fashion, they haven't changed channels, even though their sniper is dead with all his gear gone. Nate's of the opinion that they've become arrogant, being masters of their own post-apocalypse fief. They've grossly underestimated this particular geriatric, too, not clicking that he's the real deal. They have no clue that we're actually coming after them, thinking Johnny and Shooty were just chance encounters that went good for us and bad for them. It's boring sitting around, though Nate has begun schooling both Freya and I in good handgun safety and handling. With the gun collected from Johnny's cold, dead hand, and the second swept up from Shooty McBrain dead, we've got a 9 millimeter handgun for each of us now, and with everything that's going on, Nate is running us through safe handling, grip, drawing, aiming, stance, and cleaning. I've winched back my usual tomfoolery, because this is real shit, and I'd rather shoot a gun than have to get up close with a hammer again. We've got a little spare ammo to start firing live rounds for target practice, as Shooty had a box of a hundred in that bag of tricks, but Nate wants us drilled in all the basics of safety and good handling before we even squeeze off a round at a target. It gives Freya and I something to do at least that's productive. Two against 28 is stupid odds, so we can't just go and assault the compound, as I've taken to calling it. 
I'm no special forces operator, and Nate can't do it alone. But oh, mama, is this dude a cunning old fox? Youth, skill, numbers, and firepower are no match for one sneaky old marine trained in treachery, it would appear. If you're sneaking a peek at this, Nate, I would like to point out that I remembered to call you a marine. I'll forget again, but this one is a win. Before we even think of going near that compound, Nate wants Bancroft chewing the arm of his favourite chair in impotent fury. He wants him reckless, and he wants him weakened. So, to that end, Nate has devised a plan that we're rolling out on tomorrow. I'm not going to write it here, because, like I said, this isn't a fucking textbook. It's no fun telling my stories if you already know what we're going to do, eh? We need excitement, we need drama, we need comedy, and we need high-octane action. I also need Nate to change his name. Carter is boring and shit. He should be called Nathaniel Flint. Then it could be Flint and Locke, action heroes. That's fucking brilliant. Damn, that old bastard and his mundane surname. That's absolute gold. He always ruins my fun. August 6th, 2010. Declaration of War. So, yesterday officially underlined my mental sticky note of don't fuck with Nate a few times. I know his cold and practical side is necessary, but when he goes into soldier mode, there's no flicker of human warmth with complete laser focus. He has a mission, at the end of which is a target. While on that mission, nothing else matters but that goal, and if you're in the way, you're nothing but an obstacle to be cleared. Nate had hit upon, as he referred to it, solid gold intel from listening to their chatter over the past few days. Today, seven guys were rolling out to a local petrol station in three vehicles. One would be driving a little solid tanker. In other words, it had no separate cab and trailer like an 18-wheeler would, but was instead like the box truck version of a tanker that home heating oil deliveries are usually done in. It was shorter and entirely a singular vehicle. The other two vehicles would be SUVs, each with three armed gunmen. With a full quarter of their hostiles, I'm using the term Nate always uses, makes me feel all military and clever, Outside the compound, this was an opportunity to deal them a severe blow, not just to their numbers, but also their resources. Clearly, fuel was all important to running their generators, and by hitting that essential supply run, Bancroft would go mental. Active denial of resources, Nate calls it. He's so wordy. Nate also warned that as soon as we did this, Bancroft would know he was in a two-way battle, not just a hunt for the beautiful princess and her loyal sidekick. I am not the sidekick, so shut it. This is my story. This had to go down smooth, and for once, he was going to let me drive my way. The key to this whole plan was being able to draw at least one of those vehicles away, and as they had the hots for us, if I was dangled as bait, they wouldn't be able to resist. I took the black Astra we used to get home from our last outing, realising it was a GTI with a bit of grunt to it. I dropped Nate off about a mile from the petrol station in the opposite direction they would approach and let him get set in his ambush spot. He was tooled up in his tactical vest, loaded with full magazines for his shiny new toy, which he had spent an hour sighting in properly. It wasn't a plaything anymore. It was locked loaded and fully calibrated in the hands of someone who knew how to use it. Properly. He knelt down at the corner of a building and gave me the nod. I headed off towards the petrol station, and as I approached, I could see the two SUVs parked across the entrance and exit, the small tanker parked within. They'd have to manually crank the fuel in and had already been there a half hour. We let them get settled in like it was a normal, boring fuel run that they had to pull sentry on. Then, enter Lockie. I approached at a steady pace, waiting until they caught sight of me. 
One man leaned out and clearly recognised the car, saw it was Princess Peach sitting behind the wheel of this particular Mario Kart, and up went the alarm. I stopped, cementing the illusion that I'd just noticed them as they flooded to the two SUVs en masse, then whacked it in reverse to pull a swift three-point turn. I could have easily done a handbrake 180, but I had to give them the impression I was just a helpless little girl who couldn't drive for shit. Both SUVs followed, so I assumed they'd have left at least one or two centuries with the tanker. I let them gain a little ground as I headed towards Nate's hidey hole, then dropped it down a gear and went full bandit as my own personal smokies put their pedals to the metal. As I approached Nate at high speed, I gave him two honks to signify how many vehicles were on my ass, and as I passed Nate, I slammed on the brakes, yanked up the manual handbrake, and did that full 180 to take in the show. As the lead vehicle approached Nate's position, the air shattered with the staccato rattle of the SA-80. The windscreen was obliterated as a burst of high-velocity rounds raked across it, shredding the two men riding within. With the driver suffering from a severe case of lead poisoning, the SUV spun out of control, careening away to crunch into the front of a small terraced house with an almighty grind of twisting metal. The second driver instinctively slammed the brakes as he watched the first vehicle swerve off the road, and as it screeched to a halt, Nate rose to his feet in that smooth combat walk and stalked in their direction. In perfect balance, the rifle unmoving, he switched to semi, and with four quick trigger pulls, double-tapped both driver and passenger through their windscreen. Just like that, it was done. Nate moved in, rifle fixed firmly on the second vehicle, confirming the kills. Both men were dead, and then he switched to the wreck of the first vehicle, one more shot sounding as he put a dying man down. Four men dead in seconds. Swiftly, Nate took the weapons and any spare ammo from both vehicles, using his knife to stop any of the dead men suddenly reanimating and chewing bits off him, and took two more of their radios. He moved the second vehicle to the side of the road, threw all the new and exciting loot on the back seat of the Astra, then jumped in the passenger seat and nodded. Phase two. I gunned it back towards the petrol station, stopping as we got closer to let Nate slide out while there was still cover, and then waited, watching the digital clock on the dash. Five minutes, he said. Wait five minutes, then engage phase two. I'm not going to lie. This shit was exciting. I tried not to think too hard about the cold method of execution Nate employed, but we were on the side of right. These fuckers were keeping slaves for their own twisted ends, so I kept telling myself the end justified the means. Amazing what stories we tell ourselves, isn't it? We're always the hero of our own story. Philosophy aside, I waited the five minutes, then began rolling down the road at a less than leisurely pace. I rounded the bend about a hundred metres from the station to find the other two sentries out in the road, waiting for their non-responsive buddies. The radio sat on the dash was going mental, asking what the hell was going on, the reinforcements were on the way, and to hold tight. Ten minutes, they said. That was five minutes ago. As I rolled into view, I slowed. The two remaining sentries had rifles, both pointing my way. They didn't have scopes, so I reckoned I was good, but the two mooks never triggered a single shot. Two rapid cracks came from somewhere else, and the two men aiming down the long road towards me crumpled. Nate stalked from a side alley, having made his way down the back of the buildings, only to emerge in a concealed position. They weren't expecting it, and man, he made them pay. His arm went up, and I accelerated to his position, hammering to a stop. I scooped up their weapons and ammo, throwing them to the back seat before joining Nate. He had his rifle trained on the tanker driver, who had dropped to his knees and was begging for his life. Nate, I said, letting him know I was approaching from behind. He was so in the zone, I didn't want to startle him in any way. Nate, put it down. He's unarmed and he doesn't look like one of them. I'm not, agreed the driver fiercely. I'm just an engineer. Please, they've got my son. The guy was late thirties, maybe a little older. I couldn't really tell, 
and I think he looked a little older because of the thinning hair on his head. What I could tell was that he seemed to be as equally relieved as he was terrified. I put a hand on Nate's arm, gently pushing it down until the barrel pointed at the ground. What's your name? I asked. M Mark, he stammered. Mark Reynolds. Hi, Mark. I'm Erin, but my friends call me Lucky. This is Nate. His eyes flicked to the iron golem next to me. You say Bancroft has your son? He nodded. If I don't keep the maintenance up around his estate, he says he'll hurt him. Pretty sure I heard Nate growl at that. Electrics, plumbing, the heating, all that. He says it's my job to keep the lights on, and if they ever go off, Charlie will be the one that pays. We can't destroy the fuel, Nate, I said. This is a vital resource, he argued. Nate, Mark and his son will be hurt if this tanker doesn't go back. Mark nodded vigorously, eyes pleading. Nate huffed, thought for a second, then stalked to Mark and thwacked him across the cheek with the butt of his rifle. What the fuck? I exclaimed as poor Mark hit the deck, hand to his face and dazed. If he's unmarked, he'll be seen as a conspirator. He turned to the flawed engineer. Sorry about that, mate, he said. We've got to run. So you make sure you tell them that we'd just started to question you when we heard their reinforcements arriving, and you're only alive because Bancroft's men arrived in time. He'll be pissed that his men are dead, but you'll still come back with the tanker of fuel and the lights will stay on. Mark nodded, hands still held against his split cheek, blood seeping through his fingers. Tell them our names, I said, kneeling down. Tell them you heard him call me Lockie, and I call him Nate. Describe us exactly how we look, and it'll keep you alive. When we started questioning you, we were asking how many they were, where they were, but you never got a chance to answer because backup arrived and we fled. Can you do that? Poor Mark still looked dazed and confused, reeling from Nate's strike, so I shook him. Mark, get it together. Did you get all that? Yes. He pulled himself together a little. Yes, I did, he repeated with more conviction. One last question. How often do you do these fuel runs? Roughly every two weeks. I nodded and gave him a reassuring smile. Thanks, Mark. Don't tell them we know that and you stay safe. Erin, we've got to go. I can hear vehicles coming. I lifted an arm to acknowledge his statement, then flinched as Nate cracked off two quick shots. Spinning, I saw two crumpled undead that had wandered into our area, drawn by the noise. He glanced over his shoulder. Can't very well let our new friend get eaten now, can we? So, six of their remaining 28 hostiles down, and a plethora, that is such a good word, of new weapons and ammo. We're actually getting pretty fat on 556 for these rifles, as we acquired two more weapons from the last two centuries, and 9mm for the handguns, as each of the six carried. We're in a much better position for a firefight if it comes to it. Now Freya and I just need proper training and firing time with them. Well, Freya is happy to learn handgun for defence, but she's shied away from the rifle for the moment. Not me, though. Nuh uh. I've seen what those bad boys can do, and they are a great fucking equaliser. If they're only sending two of their six fuel sentries with SA-80s, that means their stocks are very limited on them. So us nabbing three from them will send Bancroft into a spin. After all, supply chains are a bit behind given the slight problem of an apocalypse. So, if I can get operational with an assault rifle, that makes me far more useful. All in all, yesterday was a good day for us. We declared war and won the first battle. I just hope Mark and Charlie are okay. August 13th, 2010. Three aces. I haven't written for a while. About a week, judging by the last date. You know why? because I don't write unless there's something interesting to tell you. We're not playing zombie sims here. You don't want to know about every meal, piss, or conversation we have. 
day to day is boring shit. So here's a brief summary before I get to the thing I actually want to relay. We've had live firing time with the handgun, and Nate has been showing me how to handle the SA-80. I feel like such a badass. Then remember I'm handling a weapon that can kill living people and sort my shit out. I can now safely use the holy trinity of handgun, shotgun, and assault rifle. Yeah, I'm no dirty Harriet, but Nate says I've got a good eye and steady aim, and if I concentrate, I can become a decent shooter. Smug mode engaged. Freya, not so much. She flinches as she's pulling the trigger. She can use a handgun in a pinch and knows how to safely handle one, but this girl will never work out in the field. That's okay. To be honest, she'd probably be a distraction for me, as I'd worry about her constantly. She's not cut out for this life, and as resilient as she's shown herself to be, she can take down zombies, but put her in the stress of being under fire, and I think she'd crumble. Probably because she's normal. Normal people don't take to this stuff. They've got too much good sense. Bancroft finally figured out to change the channel, but these things aren't top dollar communications, and with a bit of patient searching, you can find the band again. However, they're obviously now keeping radio traffic to a minimum. That changed last night. We were sitting in the kitchen enjoying a post-meal coffee together when the radio sat next to Nate blazed into life. Are you out there? crackled a voice. It had to be Bancroft. Even his fucking voice sounded mean. I'll hang on for one minute more, then I'll move up a channel. Nate reached for the radio, but as he operates in a different temporal phase to the rest of humanity and takes his sweet time, I snatched it up. I can hear you, I said, overly jolly. Nate looked at me murderously. I grinned at him as I clicked the mic again and said in my best faux Texan accent, Breaker one nine, rubber duck, this is sassy cat, come back now. Honestly, I nearly pissed my pants laughing at Nate's look of pure horror. Who the fuck is this? Clearly Mr. Bancroft was not amused. This is sassy cat with her toes on the bumper, rubber duck. What's your twenty? Oh my God, I was already having too much fun. Are you the little bitch Locky? I told you, Rubber Duck, this is Sassy Cat. You sound like a barely big rigger with some bubble trouble. You okay there, Rubber Duck? Your rig greasy side up? What the fuck are you talking about? He roared down the radio. Shut the fuck up, I'm talking to you. Do you know who I am? That's a big negative, Rubber Duck. Say, you okay, Ducky? You forgotten? The signal went all weird for a minute, with a bunch of static, then went dead. I'm pretty sure in amongst that I heard an apoplectic rage as the mic was pressed for a second. I think I might have made him smash a radio in anger. This was going well. What the fuck are you doing? said Nate. You said he needs to get wild and erratic, and it seems like that legendary Bancroft temper runs true in the eldest as well. This guy isn't used to people fucking with him. And you should know by now, Nate, there is nobody on this earth that can be more annoying than me. Especially when I try. Nate stayed silent for a few seconds as he considered that. Valid point, he conceded. I pulled the laptop in front of me. When we first went through it, we found all kinds of weird music downloaded on it. I found the track I wanted, prepped it, then waited. The radio blared into life again, as we knew it would. Clearly Bancroft had found another handset. Listen to me, you little bitch. Are you still there? I promptly pressed play, stuck the handset next to the laptop speaker, and pressed down the talk button. Jamie Bancroft, local criminal kingpin and hardman, was forced to listen to a good two minutes of soothing whale song over the airwaves as I refused to release the mic. I heard nothing of his raging at the other end, but I knew it was happening. It's my gift. Freya was in hysterics, while Particles sat on the counter in front of her, staring at the laptop speaking whale with confused outrage.
Even Nate's granite face cracked into a smile. When I thought the time was right, I paused the whale song and put on my best children's television presenter voice as I spoke into the handset. There, boys and girls, I cooed. Don't we feel all relaxed and calmer now? Silence. He was catching on. The angrier he got, the more I fucked with him. The airwaves stayed silent for a couple of minutes. You killed my brother and six more of my men, he said finally. Flat, calm, detached. That needs to be addressed. Your brother implied I was going to be brought back to wherever it is you are, and then used as a whore, mate. We had a bit of a Han and Greedo situation, but your boy definitely moved to shoot. He was given fair warning and had his chance to walk away. He was my brother. He was a fucking caveman and you know it, I retorted. Otherwise you wouldn't be sending him out foraging with the suicide chavs. All those guns, Jamie, and you send your brother out with chavs armed with hammers and machetes. You know there's an apocalypse, right? He was my brother. His voice was tight, straining at the chains of explosive fury. We've established that, and like I said, he could have walked away, but didn't. If your brother was bacon, it'd be too fucking dumb to sizzle. Be that as it may, things have got tangled. We should meet to discuss a way forward out of this. I kept the mic open as I barked a derogatory laugh over the airwaves. Nate, Nate, did you hear that? He wants us to meet him. I laughed again. Fucking hell, grab your umbrella. It's raining fucking stupid out there today. When I get my hands on you, I won't kill you, little whore, he hissed. Man, this fucker was pure evil when the mask was stripped back. It wasn't an act. If anything, the act was his everyday psychosis. When he got really mad, he got cold. I'll make sure every one of my guys takes a turn at you. Twice. Cool story, bro, I laughed. Can we jump to the chapter where you shut the fuck up now? My dog needs a piss. Particles cocked his head, gracing me with an expression that said, Don't fucking bring me into this, human. Silence. I knew he was breaking shit, losing his mind to rage, though this time he managed to keep the mic closed. Bancroft was used to being in control, and you just can't reason with me if my sole purpose, at that moment, is to annoy the living shit out of you. Arguing with me in that state of mind is like playing chess with a pigeon. Doesn't matter what you do or how good you are, I will shit all over the board and strut round like the champion of the world. He didn't say another word after that, finally walking away from a losing battle. We didn't need to talk to this guy, and it was vital we didn't give anything away regarding the captives, in case he used them against us. The illusion had to remain that this whole situation had devolved entirely from that single chance conflict with his brother. Bancroft couldn't know of our knowledge regarding his location, his effective manpower, or that there were captives we wanted to help. They were the three aces in our hand, and when we showed them, we'd make damn sure he was all in. August 15th, 2010 To zombie or not to zombie, that is the question. Nate thinks we should start stepping it up now, take advantage of Bancroft's twitchiness and erratic temper, so yesterday we finally went to recon the compound. I've given it this grandiose name, but in truth, it's just a massive house with an eight-foot-high perimeter wall standing on its own at the end of a country lane. I'm sure it's bloody marvellous for avoiding wandering hordes of undead. The nearest neighbouring house has to be at least half a mile away. As a tactical position against living, thinking people, however, it's useless. Good for us. Not so much for Bancroft. There's a bit of space around the walls, but the land is quite up and down and absolutely chock full of trees. 
So Nate and I managed to not only get close to the house, but we actually had elevation so we could just stare down into the compound with shooty McFuck faces binoculars. The house is huge, has to be a million quid minimum, which Nate says is a bit of an ass if we have to breach with just two of us, because it's likely a maze in there. There are a number of outbuildings as well, like an extra guest house, as well as what was probably an old barn that's being converted into some kind of living space, plus a massive triple garage and what looks like some kind of workshop. After a full day's observation, we've pretty much got the layout. The big barn thing. I'm going to use this term and I don't like it, but it's accurate. That's the slave quarters. As it got closer to evening, a string of six women were led out under guard from that barn and into the main house. My stomach twists at the thought, so I'm not going to write what my gut says is going on, but the posture of those poor women told me everything I needed to know, and none of which I liked. We think the guest house off to the right is where Bancroft's top men get to live. Their own space, and from his early days on the radio before they got smart to us earwigging, Nate identified three main captains that most of the grunts deferred to. That's a viable target, as is the big white oil tank at the back of the house. We could also see the little tanker Mark was driving parked to one side. The rest of the grunts appear to live in the main house, so I guess one of the wings has been set up as a kind of barracks where they live communally. That's just educated guesswork, though. And not from me, from Nate. Shit, I don't think like that. I'm letting the spec-op guy do the thinking. That house is a problem, Nate said. It's too big and completely unknown. There could be nooks and crannies we know nothing about. Multiple exits from rooms that could have us flanked. We could run down a blind alley and get stuck. He clicked his tongue. Without a layout, we can't even think of going in there, especially with only a team of two, one of which is demented. I resemble that remark, I replied. So, what do we do? What's the first plan of action? We can't hit this place yet, he said. They'll lock it down and their numbers are still too high. The only way we could even the balance is to use the undead. I turned my head slowly to Nate, not quite sure what he meant. What do you mean, use the undead? Fancy clearing that one up? Remember that box truck after we first found your rodent? He's a dog, Nate. And yes, I do. Nate nodded. Full of undead. What if we did the same? Caught a bunch of stragglers, loaded up a box truck, reversed that thing through their gates and spilled the dead into their compound. That would even the field. I was horrified. Absolutely fucking not, I choked. Nate raised an eyebrow. It's a good tactic. It would be absolute bedlam in there. There are innocents in there as well, Nate, I protested. They could get killed. That's always a risk, but there's risk in bullets flying as well. Yes, in a firefight or a breach, they could get hurt, but they would be accidental, Nate. Shitty, guilt-inducing, impossible to live with, but accidental. The undead are a complete wildfire we'd have no control over. If a stray bullet catches a captive, that's shitty and heartbreaking but we have an element of control over what we do to try and minimize that. Once the undead are let go, there's no calling them back. There's no directing their attack. It's just chaos. We're outnumbered more than ten to one. They're the defenders and they know the grounds and the house. We're at a major disadvantage. Then we find another way, I said, refusing to move on this issue. A smarter way. Shit, there were 29 not so long ago, but there's 22 now after we took down Shooty McFuckface and the six at the petrol station. Let's take them piecemeal. Shooty Mc... Nate gave me a bewildered look. What? Never mind, I said, waving it away. Look, if we unleash the dead into that compound and an innocent gets bitten or killed by one, that's no accident, Nate. We would have done that, and those deaths would be entirely our fault. 
I shook my head vigorously. This is our world, Nate, and they're the invaders. I'm not willingly giving the undead another legion of followers by our hand. We're meant to be taking the world back from them, not adding to their army. That's not a fight we can win, murmured Nate. Fuck you, negative Nancy, I said, jaw set. Just because we might not win doesn't mean we don't try to. Just because we might not be able to achieve perfection isn't a viable excuse for not trying. No, I'm not giving up my humanity by surrendering others to the undead, no matter how much of a shitbag they are. I'm not letting the part of me die that makes being alive worthwhile. Nate was quiet for a time, saying nothing, resuming his observation while I silently seethed beside him. If we assaulted them, yes, killing shots that weren't to the head raised a zombie that would need dealing with. And yes, those singular undead could draw fire for a time. I accept that. Someone dying from anything other than a brain-destroying wound will stand back up. That's our new reality. That's the world we live in now. But driving a truck full of undead, already in that monstrous state, through those gates, just to let them run amok? Hell no. That equates to pushing people off a boat circled by blood-hungry sharks, just because you don't like them. We have to be better than that. I know undead will rise with every man we take down, I said finally, the silence becoming unbearable. But I can't do what you're suggesting, Nate. I just can't. He exhaled in a long breath, like an extended sigh. I know, kid, he said softly. We'll find another way. And just like that, he accepted it and we moved on, saying no more about it. You know, Nate confuses me like no person I've ever met. He's so fucking complicated, like there's two very different versions of him existing at the same time. On one hand, he's cold and practical, unflinching as undead lunge and bullets fly, never getting stressed, always ice cool. Sometimes, like with his zombie truck plan, he can seem downright heartless. Then there's the other side of him, the one desperately trying to get out. Under that stone exterior beats the heart of a good and honest man, one who has been forced to make hard choices and will continue to make hard choices, even though it might cause him pain. I've seen those flashes of warmth, of compassion, in just the little things. He might rage and flail his arms in frustration at me, but he knows I can take it. And let's face facts, I usually deserve it. Freya needs handling differently, and at times he's painfully gentle with her, even in the tone of voice he uses in her presence. When Freya's around, Nate radiates this presence that just makes you feel... safe. God, he's a pain in my ass, but I'm damned if I don't love that grumpy old shit. Piecemeal, you said, huh? Said Nate after a while, dragging me from my wild and random thoughts. Have you ever noticed how the word bed actually looks like a bed? Mind blown. Yeah, I agreed. They have to come out. Let's make every journey out seem like a really hard decision to make. Remember, Mark said they did the fuel run every two weeks. We're coming up on that. Nate nodded. I'm thinking the same. We can't let them know we have their home location, though, so no doing it in the vicinity. It'll be harder now as they'll plan everything offline and their radio chatter will just be updates, using words like target and referring to timelines. They'll want to keep details dark so we can't set up ahead of them. They also won't want to go far, I offered. They'll want reinforcements able to get there quickly. Next time they won't take any bait. They'll hold position and wait for backup. Nate's mouth quirked a brief smile. You're thinking like a soldier, kid. It was almost something like pride. I got a bit of a kick out of it. QRF, we call it. Quick reaction force. QRF, got it. I nodded. Here's where we have an advantage, then. I know this little town like the back of my hand, so I can narrow the list of potential targets they'll likely consider. There's no way they'll go back to the same one. I think they will. 
I frowned at that. They know that we know that's where they'll fill up. Why would they go back there? Geographically, it's still the closest to them, said Nate. Their QRF can be there in ten minutes max, judging by the last response. However, last time they were comfortable and would likely have had to quickly assemble a QRF. Shave two or three minutes off for headless chicken mode, and they could have a QRF here in, say, seven minutes. Anywhere else is going to be longer, right? I nodded. It'd be an extra five minutes minimum to the next nearest station. There you go, then, nodded Nate. Every minute counts, and right now, they're on the back foot. This time, they'll roll out with a slightly larger force, because they're paranoid, and their QRF will be ready to go at a moment's notice. So, we need to watch both locations. I'm going to spend tomorrow scouting the area for perches, and set some up that I can fire from and displace to. When we go live... You'll be in this spot, watching what goes on here, letting me know when the QRF leave and in what strength. So, what's your plan? Nate placed the binoculars back to his face and stared back at the compound. Kill as many as I can, he breathed. I love the guy, but man, am I fucking glad I'm on his team. August 19th. 2010. Door number nine. Nate is a fucking one-man army. I keep saying it, but I'm glad I play for Team Carter. I would not want this wily, deadly old bastard on the opposite side of the field to me. I'm so lucky he found me. Not just because he rescued me from that creepy old farmer's rape dungeon, but because I doubt I'd have gotten this far without him. I'm forever learning new skills and modes of thinking required to survive in these rotten times, and that training really came in handy. Special operator lock at your service. Oh, what a tale to tell. I have officially entered the badass hall of fame. If Bancroft was hot with rage before, he'll be an inferno now. Yesterday did not play out well for him. At all. Mark's intel of every two weeks was absolutely spot on. Yesterday, they rolled out in force, and just like Nate guessed, they went back to the same familiar spot. In the two days leading up to that, though, Nate and I had been hard at work. I know the area, and I walked Nate around it, listening for what he wanted and needed, and showing him a few different places, as well as routes he could take between those sites. We did some serious work too, clearing a few buildings of undead, which gave me valuable room clearance time, as well as live firing of the SA-80 and the Glock I now carried. All the while, Nate teaches, patient as hell, giving me a verbal swat when my focus wobbles and getting me back on track. He's a brilliant teacher, phrasing things in a manner that makes it easy to understand, rather than barraging me with military lingo all the time. He teaches me that as well, so I can understand him in a pinch, should he instinctively switch to that language in a hot situation. So, why clear buildings? Well, some of them are long lines of terrace houses, small independent shops, that kind of stuff. They all have joining walls, and we took a sledgehammer to some of them, making holes between the buildings so Nate could displace to another location without stepping outside. We removed some fence panels so we could then escape out back without having to struggle over obstacles, ending up out the back of a block of flats. Not massive, only three floors with four flats on each, so twelve in total, but it was the tallest building in sight of the petrol station, and Nate wanted to use it. Of course, that meant having to go into that apartment block and clear it of undead. Nate couldn't very well settle himself into a sniper perch, only to be blindsided by the dead. Every single one of those flats had undead in them, and every single one of them was a horror story that's going to haunt me till the end of my days. Remember how I wondered at the awful stories behind all those closed doors as we passed them by? They're worse than I could ever have imagined. The ground floor residents were similar stories. The lower apartments were all populated by the elderly, and they just broke my heart. Not because they were now the walking dead, but because of the terrible circumstances that led to their end. 
I always saw commercials on TV about how loneliness for the elderly, going for weeks at a time with no social contact, was a rising problem. The evidence of that isolation was heart-wrenching. One old lady we found was naked and sliding around on her belly in the bathroom. The door closed when we got to it. One leg wouldn't work, and after Nate put her to permanent rest, even his hard exterior took a wobble. The poor woman must have slipped coming out of the shower and busted her hip, hence why the undead version of her couldn't rise from its belly. Nobody came to check on her, nobody wondered why they hadn't heard from her in a while, and this poor old lady had died a long, suffering death in terrible pain, cold and alone. The fact she was taking a shower suggested the water was still running, which means she might have even died in the days before the world was cursed with the plague of undeath. Nobody came for her. Nobody. Fucking hell. That's so damn sad. It hurts. The whole bottom floor was a collection of old, lonely, isolated individuals, all of them widows or widowers, as there were black and white pictures of weddings and later colour ones. Some of them had kids, judging from the pictures, grandkids as well. So where were they? I have to hope, in some twisted way. It was because they couldn't come, because they were already dead, victims of the undead pestilence choking the world. Because, if I think, for one minute, that they chose not to come, to leave their elderly parent to their fate and write them off as a loss, I think any faith in humanity I still have will die. Shit. Just writing this stuff depresses me. I'm just a happy-go-lucky person, and sadness, real sadness, not just a bit mopey sadness, I'm talking real tragedy, cuts me deeper than I ever knew. Nate could sense it, could see the desolation in my heart change my whole demeanour, and that big old teddy bear side of him reared itself again. I can do the rest, kid, he said his graveled voice impossibly tender. Don't put yourself through it. But I shook my head. This is our world that they took from us. Every person was a story, so many of them forgotten or never heard, but I somehow felt it was my duty to see it all, to feel it all. I was still human, in an inhuman world, and just like I said to Nate, I couldn't let any of this kill the part of me that made being alive worthwhile. Life isn't one great bouncy castle to jump around on. Life is also hard. It's bitter, it's maddening, and it's tragic. We don't just get to enjoy the good times. That's the grand cosmic irony of life, I think. For you to ever truly know the value of happiness, first you have to know sadness. To appreciate the quiet, First, you have to endure the noise. To value the presence of those you love, first you have to feel the emptiness their absence leaves in its wake. Everything in life has a cost, just as death is the final price for your time on this earth. So, I shook my head at Nate. No, Nate, I said, struggling with the knot of emotion twisting my insides. I have to do this. I have to. The words weren't for him, even though I spoke them aloud. They were for me, telling my traitorous heart it had to hold the line. He just nodded as if he understood. He doesn't push, not when he knows it's something I simply have to do. I'm rarely serious, so when my mood takes a turn as dark as this one did, Nate lets me deal with it my way. Amazing how much someone can do for you, how much they can understand what you need by actually doing nothing except be there. Knowing he was by my side, that he had my back no matter what, was enough. And shit did I need it with what came next. Every flat was a horror story, and I can't recount them all, but this one was, without doubt, the worst of them. It will haunt me to the end of my days. On the top floor, number nine, lived a young couple in their late twenties, I'd estimate. It would have been a homely place once, looking at the previously soft pastel colours, the big comfy sofa with cushions big enough for a toddler to use as their own personal bounce house, 
and a wall covered in photos as an homage to the travels of their youth. They were pictures of sunshine and laughter, of good times with friends in the far-flung corners of the globe, as they lived a life of youthful adventure before the realities of life started to take hold. Careers, house, kids, all that stuff. Nate breached the door, and I lifted the barrel of the SA-80 so it didn't point at him, and he moved into the little hallway. We knew there was undead in there, because the place was drowned by that hell stench, thick and bitter, violating every sense and turning the saliva on your tongue to bile. The flats were very open plan, so they were pretty easy to clear quickly, with the kitchen and living room all in one large space, with doors off to a master bedroom, a bathroom, and a second smaller bedroom, which was a little more use than a walk-in wardrobe, storage space, or office. I knew it was bad when I heard Nate swear. I've never seen anything really faze him. I imagine he's seen some terrible things in the service, things he'll never be able to unsee. But I always thought that made him harder somehow. Seeing the things he's seen, that he refuses to talk about, I thought made him that little bit more resilient each time, so he could deal with the next dreadful scene he had to witness. Nothing, absolutely nothing, prepares anyone for this, though. It affected Nate so much, his gun stayed silent, and that fact led to a dark fascination taking hold of me. You know the one I mean. Someone says, don't look, it'll make you sick. So you just have to look, because that little part of you simply has to know why it's so bad. I shuffled up behind him, peering round the width of his shoulder, and my world was forever changed. The couple had turned towards us after the breach, and they were on the far side of the room, so our horrified pause wasn't imminently lethal, but my mind struggled with what my eyes could clearly see. The woman had been pregnant, heavily pregnant, like almost a term pregnant. The flat was awash with blood, a canvas splashed crimson by the insane, but my eyes were only for the woman. Her belly was torn open, and within the ragged, bloody slit of the wound, I saw a tiny arm. Moving, grasping at the air, reaching out of the wound towards us. All I can think is that this woman, so close to giving birth, suffered the horror of her baby dying in her womb. And it turned, tearing her apart with dark, unnatural strength. From within. There were no other wounds on her, and the blood had pooled thick and dark around the couch. She must have lain there, bleeding, both panicking as they realized something was going horribly wrong with the pregnancy. And then the screaming would have started, her husband losing his fucking mind as he watched his wife being ripped apart by their unborn, undead child. Jesus fucking Christ. The lower half of her face was matted with old, dark blood, the front of the guy's throat missing a mouthful of flesh. They both stumbled towards us, the woman's gait awkward as she carried the weight of her monstrous spawn. I was crying by this time, almost babbling on the edge of madness, my eyes fixed to that tiny, malevolent limb as it hungrily reached for us. The bark of Nate's rifle shocked me back to life, the old dog recovering his wits and getting back to business. He dropped the husband, turned the rifle to the woman, and squeezed off a second round that cut her strings. I couldn't take my eyes off it, even though I was praying to whatever force would listen to not have that child's head emerge from the wound. I could still see the rippling of the undead flesh on the woman's belly. Putting her down hadn't affected the horror within, and if that tiny head emerged from the bloody wound in her stomach, I think my mind would have broken. With one arm, Nate gently pushed me back. Back in the hall, kid, he said softly. He lowered the rifle, his right hand slowly drawing the Glock from his hip. I'll take care of this. I obeyed, but my eyes were still on him as he moved further into the room, I couldn't see the woman's motionless body anymore, but I watched Nate intently. 
The pistol was in his hand, pointed down towards her corpse, and I knew where he was aiming. I could just see part of him, and once his aim was true, he turned his head away. He rubbed a weary hand over his face, closed his eyes, and pulled the trigger. No gunshot has ever jarred me like that one did. The very marrow of my bones felt like it had been washed out by ice water. Every part of me went cold, every tiny muscle spasmed in a shiver of revulsion. It wasn't just a shot I heard. It was one I felt reverberate in every part of me. Nate stepped out of the apartment and gently closed the door behind him. I looked at him, and for the first time in my life, I saw the glisten of barely held tears in his eyes. This thundering block of granite, a man that made Rambo look like a whiny little bitch, had been cut to the core by what he'd seen, and the sight of his distress cracked me. He sensed it the moment our eyes met. His rifle was slung down to his side and the Glock was returned to his hip, and he just opened his arms. I smashed into him, wrapping my arms round his waist as I cried out all the grief for what we had seen and what had been lost behind door number nine. I've got to take a break. Bringing all that up again, reliving it all, writing it down. It's left me hollow. It needed to be recorded, because if we ever win this war and we look back, anyone who ever reads this has to know what we lost. Has to know why we had to fight. This isn't just a world overrun by the dead. It's a world of a billion stories, with so many of them ending in tragedy or loneliness or mind-bending horror. When you live in the graveyard, you can't weep for everyone. But that young couple, with their pictures of happiness and a future before them, deserved somebody's tears. I gave them mine. August 20th, 2010. The Dog's Bollocks. I took the rest of the day to sort my head out, and while I don't really feel better, as I don't think I ever will again after seeing that, I'm together enough to get back to recounting our black op against Bancroft. This is largely thanks to Freya's boundless compassion and fussing over us both yesterday. I had a hot beverage in my hand every time I thought about making one, and Freya walked round the perimeter of the lodge's ground with me, her arms linked, just being there. It was too nice a day, sunny and warm, and I needed light and air to banish the choking darkness of my thoughts. Love that girl. Particles is also a fucking champ. Little dude fussed over me like a complete mentalist. He knew I was off and was determined to make me laugh with his short-legged antics and intense desire to lick my face until he'd banished my misery. Love that little guy. So, yes, back to the op. We spent a couple of days sorting out Nate's numerous perches and escape routes for when he had to displace, then decided to get on with the op. We got lucky, largely because of Mark's good intel of two-week fuel runs, and I was lying in our observation post when I saw a small convoy start to assemble. Four cars, each with three armed thugs, and Mark driving the little baby tanker. Two cars in front, two at the back. Now was the real test of whether Nate's theory of them going for the same station was correct. I relayed this information to Nate over the radio. I knew they weren't on our channel, because I could see the passenger in the lead car talking into his handset, so I felt safe in just relaying it all without the need for code. Eyes up, Nate. They're assembling. Channel is safe. I can see them using comms. I felt so professional. Copy. Totals? Convoy, two vehicles in front of tanker, two at rear, three men in each in the tanker driver, twelve hostiles. Load out? Couldn't see all, but minimum four rifles, all carrying at the hip. Copy that. Hey, Nate, wanna hear a joke? This isn't the time, he chided. Oh, cheer up, buttercup, I said with a mock huff, trying to sound all offended. 
It's a good one. There was a momentary pause. Okay, I'll bite, he said finally, his tone suggesting he was already regretting it. A Roman soldier walks into a bar, holds up two fingers and says, Five beers, please. Nate clicked the talk button in readiness to bollock me, but as the punchline dropped, he let go of the button. He wasn't quick enough, though, and I just caught a brief snapshot of his throaty laughter across the radio. When he finally did click the mic again, I could hear the smile in his tone. Business now, Erin. But my work was done. Shit, we both just needed a giggle after the gloom of the previous days, and it put me in a better frame of mind. As the convoy rolled out the gates, I gave Nate the heads up, then settled down to observe the distinctly weakened manpower within the compound. Twenty minutes later, I heard the distant sound of a gunshot. There's no ambient sound anymore, no traffic or humdrum of daily existence, and the echo of Nate's opening shot carried on the wind. It was distant, but it was so invasive to the silence, I caught it immediately. So did the compound. In fairness, they got their heads up from the radio blaring to life, and their QRF rallied quickly as Nate said they would. Another eight men ran to a pickup, armed with an assortment of shotguns and handguns. That's when I realized that some of them weren't handguns. They were the wrong shape. They were machine pistols. Oozes. Maybe not actual oozes, but similar. Light, handheld machine pistols that would spit bullets at a rapid rate. QRF of eight hostiles, no SA-80s, but shotguns, handguns, and I think machine pistols. Assembling in a pickup, now. Displacing under fire, came Nate's shout over the radio, the rattle of gunfire making his words hard to pick out. Three hostiles down, but nine still standing. Two of them have training. Can't do another eight right now, Erin. Copy. I don't think Nate meant... Hey, Erin, I need you to take the QRF on single-handed, there's a good girl. But that's what my brain heard. Nate could handle himself. They were untrained and probably just spraying everywhere, but the two with training suggested Nate thought they had military service behind them. That would make sense. Soldiers coming back from service being chewed and spat out by a civilian life they couldn't function in, it's unsurprising that Bancroft would recruit men of such obvious martial skills into his ranks. Previously, he'd kept those aces hidden, but now Nate was unexpectedly having to deal with two men who knew how to handle those weapons and would have basic tactical awareness. Bancroft had sent his big guns to protect the fuel run. Another eight men added to that mix might mean bad things for Nate. I couldn't bear the thought of losing him, so I did what any mildly dysfunctional person would in that situation. I acted entirely on emotion, applied no common sense, did something spectacularly reckless, and looked out. Picking up my gear, I gave it legs through the trees while the QRF was assembling. They'd come down that country road and they couldn't do it at speed because of how bumpy it was, pick up or not, as it would smash the suspension to all hell not to mention probably throw the six guys in the back of the pickup holding on for dear life. So, I ran like the fucking wind, Nate's lessons swirling through my head. If you have to take a vehicle, then stop it if you can, he said, a ghostly image of him floating above my head as I recalled his wisdom. Okay, so that didn't happen, but if they ever make a movie of my life, I want that in the scene. Stop the vehicle so you have a stationary target and they can't readily accelerate. Make them sitting ducks. Thundering through the trees, I headed at a diagonal towards the exit road. I'd never make it to the end of it before them, so my eyes were raking the ground as I neared the trail before finally landing on what I was looking for. Picking up a thick broken bough from the earth, I stepped out from the trees and laid it across the road. Not fully, to make it obvious, but in a fashion where it looked like it could have fallen from one of the overhanging trees. There wasn't enough space to go round it, and it was too thick to simply drive over, so someone from the back would no doubt jump out to throw it aside. It had to look natural, and I think I did an okay job. 
Then I ran a little further down the trail, back into the trees, grabbed a load of branches and pulled them over my head and upper body, just popping the end of the rifle out and aiming right at the spot the pickup would come down. I saw it appear round the bend at the top, rolling ever closer towards me. All I could think then was, what the actual fuck are you thinking, Lockie? I had a few weeks training with the rifle. I was okay, but I wasn't a fucking lethal sniper like Nate. Still, he'd taught me the basics of standing, kneeling, and lying down while firing, and I made sure the rifle was set to semi. One bullet at a time. Burst in a pinch, but that muzzle ride was a bitch, so avoid if possible. Pick your shots. Make them count. Christ. My heart was like a thunderstorm in my chest from the run and the surge of adrenaline from what I was about to do. The pickup edged ever closer, and as it neared, I aimed down the iron sight for the driver. Keep the vehicle motionless. Don't let them escape. I was about to kill a living, breathing man, and I wondered if I was going to freeze. The truck stopped, one man tossing his shotgun to a buddy while he jumped out of the pickup's rear. As he leaned down to move the log, all I heard in my memory was Nate under fire and knew I couldn't hesitate. The bullet smacked through the windscreen, punching through that little hollow at the bottom of the throat and just above the sternum. I couldn't make that shot again if I tried, but holy shit, that first one went true. The first gunshot scared the shit out of everyone, disbelief causing them to panic, having no idea where the shot came from. So I moved the barrel slightly, aiming at the guy that had just thrown the log from the road in panic. As he turned to get back to the truck in a flurry of arms and legs, I squeezed off a second round, taking him low in the back. Pretty sure I hit the kidney, and he went down like a half-ton sack of shit. He didn't move. Well, not immediately anyway. There were shouts and cries from the back of the truck. The QRF wasn't the elite, thank fuck. They were expecting to just put more boots on the ground and be directed against the lone gunman terrorizing them. Instead, they got a lunatic amateur, though a quick study, that had no idea what she was doing. Plus, they weren't that far away. They knew I was ahead of them somewhere, seeing as how the first round had gone through the windscreen. I kept my head down, wincing as one guy looped his machine pistol over the top of the cab and just let out a random unsighted spray. I wasn't worried, because he was shooting so high and I was flat on my belly, but still, that rattle of gunfire gave me a shiver. Flashback central to Shooty in his sniper perch. Being under fire is no fun. Knowing someone is trying to actively kill you with high-speed lead is an arse twitcher. There was lots of shouting, lots of screaming down their radio that they were taking fire, and I muttered a bit of profanity to myself. The last thing I needed was QRF Revision 2 coming down the road, adding even more bodies to the fight, so I had to take Nate's plan and displace. I couldn't get an angle on them all cowering behind the truck, so I had to move. First thing first, though, keep their heads down. I switched the rifle to burst, sending two volleys downrange at them, the bullets raking the cab and one side of the truck. Nate wasn't fucking kidding. That muzzle ride is a bitch, and I won't be doing that again if I can help it. I couldn't aim for shit. I did, however, get the bit of luck I needed when the two guys I'd put down awakened. The one on the floor with a hole in his kidney twitched and started to rise, while the inside of the cab suddenly filled with screaming as the driver reanimated and pounced on the passenger who had been crouching in the footwell to avoid being shot. A spray of crimson painted the inside of the cab, the screams chilling as the driver ravaged his buddy in the tiny confines of the truck. Nasty. Three down. The first guy I dropped rose silently to full height, completely unseen. I think the guy who shot over the top of the cab must have jumped down behind the tail with the rest of them after unloading, so five of them were crouched round the truck's rear. Otherwise, no kidney would have been spotted immediately. Instead, he shambled towards the truck's rear, drawn to their panicked jabbering, and one poor bastard saw the monster too late. As he peeped around the back of the truck, his intent to try and spy my position, his face collapsed in horror as he found his undead comrade only feet away. 
Before he could raise an alarm or bring a weapon to bear, the thing peeled back its lips and accelerated, as they do in that last moment of ravenous hate. The zombie fell on him, mouth tearing at flesh. Now, when a zombie suddenly appears in a pack of you, I'm pretty sure your fight or flight mode kicks in and you work on instinct. Seeing a hungry undead suddenly pounce on one of them, the other four reflexively scattered. I switched back to Semi and lined up the sight on one guy raising his shotgun to put the monster down. But I squeezed the trigger before he could fire, aiming for center mass. My shot was off. It was too low, but it ripped right through where his appendix should be. He dropped, screaming in agony, the sound jarring my ears. It's far easier to kill an undead. They just go down silently. They don't scream for their mothers or beg for help from their so-called friends. They don't weep and plead and wail. This was quickly turning into carnage. When shit hits the fan with undead, it goes from zero to sixty in, holy shit. In their panic to get away from and deal with the undead, I was briefly forgotten. The two in the cab were dead. Well, undead. The man with no kidney had clearly savaged another. I'd scrambled the guts of another man. Three of them were left, and they broke for it. I'm not proud of what I did next, but it was the only way. Our job was to thin the herd, and as they thundered up that bumpy road in terror, I took aim at one man's back, breathed in and out, and at the end of the exhale, squeezed the trigger. A bullet cut through his back. Where it hit, I was certain it was a death blow, doubtless suffering some spectacular ballistic trauma to a lung. I took pot shots at the other two, but they went high or wide. I'm not good at distance shooting yet. Lots more practice needed, I think. The savaged man had no relief, utterly murdered by the zombie with no kidney, and the two of them fell on the man I'd gutted with a bullet. Honestly, it was probably a mercy. I always read that gut wounds can be agonizing and slow. I'd rather put down a zombie than a screaming man begging for help or mercy. It went very quiet, save for the echo of Nate's distant gun battle and the wet grinding of flesh between undead teeth. Rising from my little hidey hole, I took steady aim as I combat walked towards the truck. The two roamers turned towards me, but I had plenty of space and time to take aim and pop their melons. Then I went to gut wound, and by hell, had those two made a mess of him, ripping chunks from his face. I pulled out my glock and put a round in his head before he started twitching. Returning to the truck, I opened the passenger door and let the dead man lunge out. There was little of his neck remaining, the driver having ripped open arteries to spray gore all over the cab and himself. I slammed the door shut, put him down with the glock, then sidled round to the driver's door and repeated the move, letting the driver lunge out into empty air as I backed away with the door between me and it. As it shambled round the open door, I took aim with the pistol in both hands and scrambled its brains from ten feet away. Holy shit. I'd taken down six of an eight-man QRF. Now, if they had any kind of training or cool under fire, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be sat here writing this. But they panicked. And I got lucky. I really wanted to run further up the trail and put the last undead down, as it was starting to languidly rise to its feet. But I couldn't take any chances edging closer, just in case more reserves came. I didn't fancy my shooting skills at this kind of range, and if I came under multiple volleys of fire, I might end up the one wandering as a slack-jawed corpse. Instead, I pulled out the keys from the ignition, placed a radio handset on the bonnet of the truck, and used the key to scratch a message into the paintwork. It gave a channel number, a date, a time, and had a little smiley face with devil horns next to the lot. Sweeping up as much equipment as I could stuff in my backpack, which wasn't much, mainly shells, ammo clips, small arms. I left the trail and headed back to my own vehicle, hidden about half a mile down the road in the car park of a country pub. Nate, it turns out, got the better of them in the end. He put down one of the soldier boys, plus another three, on top of his original three from when I'd spoken to him, before they decided to bug out, the tanker leaving without being filled for the second run, as we had to leave that alone.
We just couldn't risk Mark or his boy, and losing the tanker might send Jamie Bancroft into a murderous rage that Mark or Charlie might feel the sharp end of. Seven confirmed kills, and I bet he didn't use unwitting zombie allies. Still, by my reckoning, that means they're in single figures for henchmen, based on Shooty's admission of numbers to us. Assuming that was true, they're down to nine. Flint and lock? Shut up, Nate, I'm keeping it. Twenty. Bancroft's bell ends, zero. Fuck Rambo, we're the dog's bollocks. Random thought. Why is that phrase used for something awesome? Did some guy once see a dog licking its genitals and wistfully dream of the same ability, thus equating a canine's testicles with something truly amazing? It's so weird. Nate, however, was not so enthusiastic about my recent escapades. He had a small plaster on his head where a ricochet had splinted some stone near him, cutting him just above the eyebrow. But other than that, he just looked knackered. What the hell were you thinking, Erin? Just like a dad, always uses my first name when I'm in trouble. Taking on eight? You could have been killed. What if they'd been better trained or calm under fire? What if I shove flowers up my ass? I retorted. Will that make my farts smell like lavender? Fuck. What and if can flick my tit, Nate? I didn't die. I took down six guys and saved you having to deal with an overwhelming force. I know, I got lucky, I know I did. But I did, so let's count our blessings. I calmed myself down, softening my tone. Nate, this was meant to be a small hit, but we scored big. There's thirteen less of them. If Shooty's number was true, that puts the number at around nine. Jamie Bancroft has a massive lack of manpower now. King Shit of Turd Mountain has been demoted to Baron Pebble Dash of Little Turd on the Hill. Nate blew out his cheeks and tiredly rubbed at his eyes. He was too exhausted for any further argument. He's such a machine, usually. It's easy to forget he's still a guy in his early fifties. Time is the one enemy Papa Reaper can't beat. Look, I left a message scrawled into the truck's paintwork. Channel 3, noon on the 21st. That's a couple of days from now. We'll rest up, he'll take stock and maybe learn to calm the fuck down, and let's see how big his swinging dick is now that he's only got a handful of goons. I shrugged. We've taken 20 of his guys all told since this started. He's got to take us seriously now. We're not playing anymore. Nate just nodded desperate to collapse into sleep. So, that's where we're at. It's the 20th today as I'm writing this. Tomorrow at noon, we're going to see if Baron Pebbledash is willing to parley. I'll write then. I'm a bit too emotionally blasted to process that I killed living people for the first time a couple of days ago. It came so soon after the apartment block that it's all seemed to blur into a haze. I know I haven't processed it yet, but I know it's coming. I'm not really looking forward to that experience. August 21st, 2010. King Shit and the Old Lion. Well, Bancroft tuned in at noon today. We had ourselves a little conversation and our end game approaches. After this conversation, it truly is shit or bust now. The three of us sat down, Nate and I with a hand set between us, though I agreed to let Nate talk first this time. This was a proper conversation, not one for me to go full locky on Bancroft. The radio crackled into life bang on noon. I'm here. That was it. No threats, no heat in his voice, just a hollow statement. As are we, replied Nate. You're the old soldier, huh? Keep that mouthy bitch off the line this time so the adults can talk. I wrapped my hand around Nate's just to press the talk button and spat out a quick sentence before he pulled it away from me. I'm still here, you rampant spunk trumpet. Impulse control issues, remember? Nate shook his head and I settled back down. I think we can both agree, Mr. Bancroft, said Nate, staring daggers at me. This situation can't go on. 
On that we do agree, answered King Shit, and there should be restitution on your part. Well, Nate did not like that at all. Elaborate, was all he said. Such economy of words at times. This all started when you murdered my brother, said Bancroft. Then you murdered another of my men and stole from me. Then you murdered more of my people at the petrol station with cold-hearted entrapment and ambush. Then you attack us again on two fronts while we're trying to resupply to keep the lights on, and then you came to my home and committed murder on my property. Nate, is it? Well, Nate, it seems to me that all the killing has been done on your side of the fence. As an extra, you've now killed two of my kin, as my brother Connor was killed when you hit our fuel run. You know he served in Iraq. He'd only been back three months before all this went down. Survived the Taliban, but killed by an old veteran. It's a cruel world. His voice hardened over the airwaves, sounding like he was speaking with a clenched jaw but it's made more cruel by Connor being killed by one of his own. Nate absorbed all this in silence, and if the death of a fellow soldier at his hand pained him, he gave nothing away. He let Bancroft sit in silence for a good thirty seconds, staring into space. Then he clicked the mic. First up, I gave your ape brother a chance to walk away, said Nate, dispassionate. He chose to draw and I defended myself. Let's not gloss over the threats he made to my friend, which were less than tasteful. Nate left that with Bancroft for a second, but kept his hand clamped over the talk button. The airwaves were his right now. Second up, your man on the court building opened fire on a vehicle we were traveling in with intent to kill. It was unlikely he knew it was us, as it was not at the scene where your brother's friends were present. So, unless your man went rogue, he was under your orders to take no chances and take any unknowns down. That is not the act of a reasonable leader, if that's the case, but a despot. If he was rogue, then we were within our rights to defend ourselves. It became very clear to Erin and I from listening to your radio chatter and your obvious thirst for blood that your actions displayed, that we had to take the initiative against you. By killing innocent men? Nate shocked even me then, as he laughed down the mic. Innocent? Nate looked genuinely amused by Bancroft's hard-faced claim of his men being innocent. Your dogs follow your orders for whatever scraps you choose to feed them, a man always has a choice, Mr. Bancroft, and your men choose to terrorize innocent people, hoard resources, and kill on command. You mean like soldiers, said Bancroft in a lofty tone. I see what you're trying, but I'm not biting. Our leaders had to be held accountable for their choices, but I'm not going to debate philosophy with a man who keeps slaves, forcing women to be items of property they get used and abused at a whim. Don't try and pat your pockets of morality, Mr. Bancroft, for they are empty, and your accusations are little more than blanks in your gun of superiority. They make a loud bang, but they can't hurt me. I don't know how he did it, but somehow Nate made saying Mr. Bancroft thoroughly disrespectful, like he was using the formal address in an ironic way. Nate's got some skills, yo. There was silence for a time, the three of us waiting patiently. Well, Nate and Freya waited patiently. Patience isn't one of my virtues, so I was as jumpy as a one-legged cat trying to piss on a frozen lake. I really hated this guy. He was rotten at the core. It was a good couple of minutes before the handset crackled into life again. It sounded like Bancroft was outside from the ambient noise around him. Make a lot of noise, do I? There was a challenge to Bancroft's tone. That cold voice was back, the one that spoke when the demon in him awakened, 
and I couldn't help but feel a chill of foreboding. Open it, he said to someone, leaving the mic open. Immediately there were sounds of panic. Those two. The three of us shared horrified glances. Freya's hand went to her mouth, my fists bunched and teeth ground against each other, whilst Nate's jaw tightened. Seeing as how you killed so many of my people, I guess we won't need as many whores to keep their dicks wet at night, eh? The screaming intensified, unintelligible pleading coming through the handset, before a single gunshot made Freya and I blanch. Nate took a long breath, his eyes closing for a second. When they reopened, they were hooded and dark. I flinched again at the second shot. You took two of my brothers. I've taken two of your precious slaves, he hissed. And you know what? I think I might just take a few more. After all, I'm a little behind your body count. A man's choices define him, Mr. Bancroft, breathed Nate, his voice so soft. Despite the heat of the summer day, I shivered. Today you've made yours. Now, I'll make mine. And what choice is that? Nate, he spat in response, draping the old warhorse's name in scorn. Nate paused only a moment, but the brief silence was heavy with dark promise. Then he clicked the mic, pressing the handset to his mouth. Board up your windows. Lock all your doors. Load every weapon you own. Then hide in the basement, Mr. Bancroft, he whispered, cold and hard like a tombstone. Because I'm coming for you. And switched the radio off. August 22nd, 2010. Mission Prep. I've never seen Nate so driven. He spent the rest of yesterday and most of today preparing cleaning weapons, setting up our loadout, going through a basic plan. Tonight, we're going after Bancroft. Yep, you read that right. Tonight. In the dark. I'm pretty fearless, all told, but everything has been done in daylight thus far. The thought of moving in the dark scares the shit right out of my arse, and not because the dark bothers me. What bothers me is how silent the undead are. In the gloom, we won't see shit until one of those hungry bastards is atop us. Nate reckons we'll be fine, because the zombies can't move stealthily, so any that come near us will crackle and rustle through the trees. But I'm not so convinced. I don't like this one bit. There are two primary goals to the mission. Bancroft's death and securing the captives, if he hasn't already executed them. Neither of us have seen Machete's crew in the hits we've done, which is a good thing. That suggests Bancroft is down to the dregs of his force, with probably only one or two solid fighters left. Judging by how panicky the QRF force got when I hit them and the undead stood up, what he's got left are a bunch of street thugs that will have guns shoved in their hands and probably won't be able to hit a barn door from ten feet away. Still, even broken clocks are right twice a day. One lucky shot, intended or not, can still flick our switch. As usual, Nate has a plan for this. Panic is everything, so he uses this term called violence of action. It's all out speed, strength, surprise, and overwhelming aggression to dominate an enemy. It's fast, loud, and fucking mean, designed to incite panic. We know the outdoors layout, so we can plan for that. I say, we. Nate pulled out his ace in the hole. I didn't even bloody know about this. Son of a bitch has a set of NVGs. You know, night vision goggles, the ones you see in movies where everything is green. He's only got one set, and when I asked him about them, he just shrugged, saying he was always prepared for something. I swear, if Nate is an end of the world prepper, I'm going to kick him in the balls. We're leaving in about an hour, and this old bastard looks ready to take on the Taliban himself. He's all in black, which in fairness is his Sunday best anyway, with a black beanie and those NVGs on his head. 
His tactical vest and combat trousers are loaded up with magazines and clips for the SA-80 and Glock. He's painted his face black. He's got these fancy gloves that give him unerring grip. No mechs or something like that. His vicious miniature sword he calls a knife, and a look on his face that scares the crap out of me. And his final pièce de résistance? Son of a bitch has two frag grenades and two flashbangs. What the actual fuck? Hell, I'm only going as backup. Nate says he's doing the compound alone, and honestly, the way he looks, I'm letting him. I like to think of myself as badass, but I don't know what I'm doing in there, and will likely get myself killed, or worse, get him killed. I don't have his equipment, his training, or experience, so I'm accepting sidekick status just this once. I've got two jobs with my athleticism and sneakiness. First, I sneak down to where all those external cameras are on the four corners, and I spray them with black paint. Graffiti for the win! We don't know what they've got internally, so there are probably some around the house. But when he kicks off, I go over the wall and get to that converted barn where the women are being kept and secure them, protecting them against all comers. I asked for a grenade in case shit got real. Nate answered with his expression. No grenade for Lockie tonight. Boo. Nate's first targets will make things go boom. Chaos, panic, mayhem. Then, when he gets in the house, he'll aim for the power, switch it off, go all NVG, then hunt Bancroft down like the predator in his own house. Scary stuff. I'm trembling with anticipation, so I'm going to sign off and get my head in the game. Wish us luck, dear reader, for tonight we aim to topple Turd Mountain. Lucky out. A Particular Set of Skills Nate clicked his tongue in irritation and tightened his jaw. Lying on his belly, shrouded by the night, he lowered the optics and sighed, handing them off to Erin beside him. She lifted them to her eyes, sucking in a sharp breath as she took in the sight. Fucking cunt, she hissed through her teeth. Ten corpses were sat against the wall, five on each side of the front gate, all women. Each had been executed with a single round to the head, their lifeless bodies posed like grisly trophies on display. This is my fault, murmured Erin, pulling the binoculars away and dipping her head in grief. We share the burden, Erin, he said softly. Nate glanced at the young woman, seeing the pain etched in the lines of her jaw. She was confounding at times with her emotional outbursts, popular culture references that went over his head, and her near reckless lack of fear. But she had a good heart. She was unlike anyone he had ever met, and though at times he wanted to throttle her, everything she said and did came from a place of wanting to help, or simply to make those around her laugh. She was a wild flame that was difficult to control, but the light she cast with such an illuminating presence was worth the frustration. She was also a freakishly quick study. As long as he could get her to concentrate, she was a talented shooter with an uncommon ability to think and act under pressure. I pushed us into this, Nate, she answered, determined to accept the blame for the death of the women. I swear, if he's her Charlie, I don't think I'll be able to deal with it. If it hurt the kid, it'd have taken great pleasure in adding him to his shop window, reasoned Nate. The boy was probably Bancroft's ace in the hole, a human shield if everything went to shit. But Nate avoided telling Erin that particular thought. She was already raw with the death of the women, and impulse control was a chink in the woman's armor. She acted almost entirely on instinct and emotion, as she had when assaulting Bancroft's relief force. That had been reckless and unbelievably dangerous. But secretly, Nate was proud of her success. It had not been his intention for her to stop reinforcements supporting those firing on Nate at the petrol station, but she had succeeded anyway. She was a quick thinker and had clearly learned from the lessons he had to teach, 
despite him thinking she was only listening half the time. Erin seemed mollified by his reasoning, nodding. You're probably right, she conceded. Still, I wouldn't mind coating his balls in sugar and strapping him down next to a wasp nest. Nate snorted. Colorful. Erin exhaled sharply, pulling her focus back. So, what's the play? The camera's at the four corners, he said, like we discussed. There are blind spots, so do one side first with the spray paint. We'll wait and see if they send anyone to investigate. Nate retrieved the binoculars, scanning the front of the large house once more before he halted and muttered a curse. What is it? Nate passed the optics back to her. Top floor window, third from the right. Erin peered at the point Nate directed her to. What am I looking at? The window is open. It is the middle of summer, Nate, she replied. It's as hot as a fat man's groin out here, despite the night air. That's a perch, Erin. She always listened more when he used her first name. When he really wanted her attention, that was the way to get it. That's the best window that gives the largest cone of sight of the grounds, with elevation. If I was setting up a hidden shooter, that's where I'd choose. Their last sniper was a bust, she shrugged. Shooty McFook face was pretty useless. Shaking his head yet again at her strange name for the sniper in town, he sighed. Remember, there were two men with service under their belt on the fuel run. One was Bancroft's brother, and I put him down. But another made it back. Bancroft wouldn't have had one of his trained shooters on a speculative lookout post. He kept them close to his side and only unchained them when he wanted the fuel run to succeed. He nodded. The man in there is a trained shooter. And that's bad. Go in the back then, over the rear wall. Nate shook his head. Most of those remaining are thugs, no training, easily panicked. I need the chaos I've planned so I can pick them off. I don't want another man trained in room clearance hunting me, especially one with knowledge of the layout. Erin put the binoculars to her eyes again, scanning the house, then chuckled. I've got an idea, she said, and it will help your chaos plan. I'm not going to like it, am I? He groaned. The grim chortle was a bad sign. When have you ever liked my plans? Anyway, you're going to have to trust me. I trust you. She grinned in the darkness. You almost sound like you meant that. You said it without sighing. What's the plan, Erin? Well, she started slowly. It involves one of those grenades you won't let me have. Nate sighed. For fuck's sake, he murmured. Isaac tried not to flinch as Bancroft leaned over his shoulder, mere inches from his right cheek as he peered at the banks of grainy monitors. His odor was stale, a mix of sweat, liquor, and aged cologne, a shadow of stubble darkening the lower half of his face. Isaac's eyes reflexively flickered to the huge firearm in his hand that resembled a cannon more than a handgun. It was a monstrous beast, its type unknown to Isaac, except that it was some form of giant revolver. But it fitted Jamie Bancroft's malicious personality to perfection. It was a weapon designed to intimidate, to inflict maximum damage. And as he stared at the screen with narrowed eyes, he idly cocked and uncocked the hammer. Every crunch and click forced Isaac to breathe for calm. Where has that feed gone? He demanded, his breath on the verge of being flammable. I don't know, Mr. Bancroft, stumbled Isaac. Everything says there is no issue with the feed. Just as he said it, a second monitor went black, though this time Isaac caught a brief flicker of movement before it did. It was a hand holding a spray can. This one has just gone down as well, sir, he said, protecting himself by pointing it out. If Bancroft noticed it first, he might give Isaac a black eye to match the one he already possessed from his drunken screaming two nights before. 
What's going on? Bancroft straightened, then placed the silver barrel of the cannon against Isaac's temple, causing his heart to seize. Best guess? He cocked the hammer. Someone's spraying the lens with something, he blurted, too terrified to lie. It's the only logical reason. There are blind spots, as I've said before, sir. Bancroft left the barrel placed against Isaac's temple, the metal impossibly cold on his skin as he picked up his radio from the desk. Buckley? Jones? Here, boss, crackled a voice over the line. Go check out the cameras on the left side of the house, exterior wall. There was a pause. Um, which left, boss? For fuck's sake, hissed Bancroft, then clicked the handset again. What the fuck do you mean, which left? There's only one left, you fucking moron. Um, well, is it the left as we come out of the house or left as we were looking at the house, you know, like from the gate? In which case, it would be the right of the house as we come out. Bancroft closed his eyes, blowing out his cheeks as he struggled to control his temper. You're coming out of the house, so it's your left, you dumb fuck. Got it, boss, crackled the response. All I've got left are fucking idiots, he muttered as the barrel moved from Isaac's temple. He released a long, shaking breath as quietly and gradually as he could. Bancroft moved away from the monitors, heading to the table where a bottle of scotch and tumbler awaited him. As he turned his back, Isaac caught movement on one of the cameras facing inside the grounds. Blinking as he watched a dark-haired woman glide smoothly over the wall, drop to her feet in perfect balance, then start a quiet stalk towards the exterior wall of the house. Isaac glanced over his shoulder, finding Bancroft's back still turned as he poured himself a double. Hands on the control panel, Isaac gently pressed a switch to isolate that camera, and then, with a gentle push, moved the joystick and turned the camera to a wider angle. Bancroft turned back just as Isaac finished edging the lens away from the woman. There was nothing but quiet space on screen now. It was the tiniest act of rebellion. But it felt like a victory. Nate watched as two men exited the front door, each carrying Mac 11s, wild and dangerous weapons in the hands of untrained morons like these two village idiots. He recognized both as part of the crew that had first cornered Erin outside the store when Nate had put down Bancroft's simpleton brother. They had not been trusted with firearms while out in the wild, so he doubted they had any shred of ability between them. Still, Firing the fully automatic Mac 11 would create a spray of bullets, and even idiots could get lucky, despite the small caliber of ammunition. A bullet in the head was still a bullet in the head. Nate had watched Erin simply ooze over the wall off to his right and cross the space between the outer wall and the side of the house, cursing as he watched her run right into the field of vision of a camera she had not spotted. Nate gritted his teeth, waiting for the alarm or some form of reaction. Huh, he muttered. As he watched through the optics, he saw the camera angle away from her, concealing her position. The operator must have seen her to start moving the camera so swiftly. He remembered the driver of the fuel truck saying one of the captives was an electronics nerd. From this evidence, it seemed the man in control of the cameras was joining the revolution in his own little way. Putting the binoculars down, Nate picked up the SA-80, placing the stock against his shoulder. Perfectly still, he lined up the left-hand thug in the scope. The two were simply talking, not taking their roles seriously in any way. The goon went down as Nate's round punched through his chest, the gun shot like a crack of thunder in the still of the summer night. He dropped like a stone, and his comrade froze for a moment in shock, staring back at his dead friend. A second crack of thunder struck him down, the bullet smashing him high in the ribs. Two shots, two kills. Nate nodded, satisfied with his work, and moved the sight to track Erin's progress. It took him a moment to find her. You demented little squirrel, he murmured. 
Somehow, the tiny woman had scampered up a drain pipe at one corner of the building and was now on the roof. It had been maybe twenty seconds since he had seen her flatten herself against the outer wall of the house. Now she was edging herself across the roof on all fours, trying to keep her noise minimal. Within moments, she was directly above the window where Nate suspected the trained shooter was perched. There was no evidence of a barrel, suggesting the man knew what he was doing and was slightly set back from the window, his rifle resting on a table just a foot or two back from the open space. Flat on her stomach, Erin slithered to the edge of the roof, reversing herself as she first dangled her legs, then dropped to just her fingers, suspended from the edge of the roof. Her toes found the ledge of the window next to the shooters, and she lowered to that perch, holding herself in place with one hand on the top of the window frame, back flat against it, as her right hand reached inside the large pocket of her loose combat trousers and pulled out the frag grenade. She looked his way, knowing he was watching, and split her face into a beaming grin, waving with the grenade in hand. Nate could not stop himself snorting and shaking his head. Still with her shit-eating grin, as she liked to call it, Erin clamped the pin between her teeth, wrenched it out. Well, she tried to wrench it out. Not like the movies, eh, kid? Nate murmured to himself in amusement as she tugged and shook her head, before finally managing to pull it clear. Nate chuckled to himself, then watched as Erin somehow managed to lean out and away from the window she was perched on. For such a small individual, the strength in her grip was impressive considering the major shift in her center of gravity. Without hesitation, she unerringly looped the live grenade through the wide open space of the window, then pulled herself back in sharply against the wall and braced. If the crack of Nate's rifle had been a thunder in the darkness, then the grenade's explosion was like the sky tearing open. The dull boom within the confines of the room echoed for a few moments, and Nate nodded in approval. Anyone in that space would have just had their night filled with horror, blasted by the concussive wave of the explosion and lacerated by screaming shards of metal as the grenade fragmented. If the shooter was not dead from the blast, then he probably wished he was. With the enemy sniper neutralized, Nate rose to his feet, leaving their bag of equipment in place as he moved through the night at speed, heading for the wall with the blacked-out cameras. Both Isaac and Bancroft jumped at the dull boom rattling the house above them. What the fuck was that? blurted Bancroft. The explosion came only seconds after they had watched Buckley and Jones dropped by a sniper. Isaac did not know much about marksmanship, but he knew the shooter had to be an expert. Two shots sounded, and both men died without even a twitch. Instant kills. Seconds later, the ceiling above them shook as something exploded inside the house. It had to be the woman he had helped. Bancroft had told him to look out for those matching the description of an older man in his late forties or early fifties, and a young, dark-haired woman in her late twenties. The old guy had to be the sniper. They seem like decent folk, Mark had told him the day after the second fuel run hit. They could have killed me that first time, or destroyed the truck, but as soon as I said Bancroft had my boy, they backed off. The woman was nice, more softly spoken than the old guy. Mark had puffed out his cheeks, almost suppressing a shiver. Shit, Isaac, that old bear is a real warrior. He's not playing at this shit. I've seen him in action twice now, and the fucker just doesn't miss. He took seven men down on his own, and one of them was Connor Bancroft. That guy had six years of service and done a tour in the Middle East. The woman didn't do half bad either, said Isaac. She took down six of the eight reserves coming to help, no less than half a mile from the gate. Well, she's obviously had a good teacher. Remember that movie, Taken, Liam Neeson? Isaac nodded. Remember the famous quote? Well, I'm telling you, this old dog has that particular set of skills. Isaac had sworn to himself if he got the chance to help these two people, he would. Even if they weren't wholly decent folk, anything was better than the madman who held them all in thrall. 
He had watched in mute horror as Bancroft executed ten of the twelve women he kept as payment for his minions, then ordered their corpses sat outside the gate for when this Nate and Lockie duo came for him. The man was insane. Find those fuckers, snapped Bancroft, his eyes raking the monitors as he picked up the handset. Sound off, he commanded into the mic. Isaac listened as nine voices came back, the last of them being Bancroft's youngest brother, Caleb. The kid was only 17, but Bancroft had shoved a semi-automatic pistol in his hands and told him to suck it up. All the remaining captives were gathered in the library on the top floor. It amazed him that Bancroft had a library, and Isaac doubted the lunatic had read anything other than a porno mag in his life. There was only one way in and out of the library, with one big window at the opposite side of the house that the woman, Lockie, had approached from. There was no sight into that window for a sniper, and the drapes were closed. His eyes darted about the monitors, but neither of the two invaders could be seen on camera anywhere. No sign of them, sir. Fucking bastards, seethed Bancroft. How fucking dare they? This is my fucking town. Mine! Isaac said nothing, keeping his eyes fixed on the screens in case Bancroft turned that rage towards him. He flinched as a radio was slammed down beside him. I'm going up to the library, he announced. You keep me informed or I swear to God, I will give you a death that will last a week. Send the feeds to the laptop in the library. Of course, sir, said Isaac, swallowing dryly. Bancroft stared at him balefully for too long, Isaac shrinking more with each passing second. Satisfied he was suitably cowed, Bancroft muttered more profanity and stalked from the room, slamming it enough to shake a painting from the wall. Dick, muttered Isaac under his breath. It made him feel better. He turned back to the banks of monitors and nearly had a heart attack. The old soldier was staring directly into a camera. Waiting. Nate dropped into the grounds, the same spot Erin used, knowing exactly where the camera was pointed and avoiding its angle. He slid along the wall to the rear of the house and peered round the corner, finding a camera pointed in his direction. Nate wondered if the first evidence of their unseen ally was a fluke, deciding to test the theory. If the guy monitoring the security feeds was working against Bancroft, this whole operation would get a lot easier. He stared directly into the camera and waited, eventually releasing his rifle and spreading hands, asking the question. A grin split his blackened face as the camera whirred away from him, pointing across the backyard and giving him the freedom to pull out his lockpicks. In seconds, he was in the French doors that slid open to reveal a huge combined kitchen and dining room without a soul present. Taking one knee for a second, he listened intently. His mouth quirked a brief smile as he heard the hum of generators beyond a door at the back of the kitchen. It was locked, and this time he did not bother with the picks, instead just aiming a ferocious stamp at the door. It smashed open, and he descended into a thunderous basement where four large generators were wired into the main phase of the house supply. They might be useful in the future, so he simply switched them all off, plunging the house into darkness. Smoothly dropping the MVGs into place, the pitch darkness was suddenly banished by a green filter over his vision as he swept up the stairs and back into the house. He had no idea of the layout, so was forced to go room to room, moving swiftly and quietly, rifle up and ready, using his power over the darkness to his advantage. A flicker of light ahead warned Nate of someone's approach with a small flashlight. Stepping into a shadowed alcove, he waited in silence, hearing the shaking breath of a man as he nervously edged down the darkened hallways. The light bobbed closer as the unwitting man almost panted with fear in the gloom of the night. In comparison, Nate's heart was slow and steady, his breath controlled and even, the rifle slung round to his back as he silently slipped his knife from its sheath. As the flashlight came into sight in a trembling hand, Nate waited a heartbeat longer until he could see the man's weapon. 
Stepping from the shadows, his left hand immediately took charge of the man's weapon hand at the wrist and pushed it away, the knife in his right hand punching up beneath the sternum to ravage the heart. The man died without a sound, Nate disengaging the Mac-11 from his lifeless fingers and lowering the body quietly to the expensive parquet floor. He stabbed the corpse through the eye to ensure he stayed a lifeless corpse, then wiped the blade on the man's clothing and resheathed it. Checking the man's radio for the channel, Nate changed the one strapped to his arm, an earpiece plugged into it, and accessed the enemy communications. Dave, you near the kitchen yet? Nate quickened his step. Not Bancroft, but the voice was familiar. It was one of his captains identified when first monitoring their overeager and unimpeded radio chatter. Brody, though whether that was a first or last name, he had no idea. The chatter got panicked as Dave failed to respond, until finally Brody demanded everyone switch to the alternate channel. The radio went silent and Nate continued sweeping through the ground floor, listening at each door for signs of life. He heard movement upstairs, but then as he placed an ear to a door, he heard the blurred hum of radio chatter. Slowly, he moved to the side of the door and knelt, reaching out a single hand to pull the handle, gently opening the door. A young man, mid to late twenties, a wall of blank screens in front of him, stared at a handset on the desk, listening intently to its chatter. Nate sidled in, closing the door softly behind him. Don't move. Isaac nearly died of fright. The words were spoken softly, but in a tone that would accept nothing but absolute compliance. He wanted to put his hands up to show he was unarmed, but he was too terrified in case the voice shot him for moving. Name. Isaac, he managed to choke out. I'm not one of them. He kept his voice a whisper. Prove that. You're Nate, right? It had to be. Everyone else in this damn house was loud, brash, and full of themselves. The voice behind him was soft but controlled, in perfect balance. I'm the guy that's been moving the cameras for you and your friend. I want out of here, man. It's fucking awful. Voice down. Isaac immediately clamped his lips shut. How many hostiles left, Isaac? Nine sounded off when Bancroft checked in last, before he left me. When was that? Just after the explosion upstairs. He was silent for a moment. That means eight left. The statement was so matter of fact, Isaac shivered. A man had already died on top of the two he'd executed from distance, but they were just numbers. Plus Bancroft, he whispered, overcompensating. Where is he? Top floor library, answered Isaac. One way in and out, no access via roof or window. All of those he's keeping captive are in there as well. How many? Six, one of them a kid. Are all his guys with him? Isaac nodded. And his bitch wife. You'll spot her a mile off, dolled up to the eyes like she's going to Beverly Hills for a shopping spree. More makeup than a big top full of clowns. Nate gave a low chuckle, which Isaac took as a good sign he was not about to die any time soon. All right, son, you can relax, he said, his voice softening. Isaac blew out a relieved breath and swiveled his chair. He could not see anything except for a silhouette in the gloom, but the man radiated presence, even standing in the shadows. What's the alternate channel? Seventeen. Nate moved in the darkness, going quiet for a time. When he spoke again, it was soft, but it still made Isaac jump. I need your help, Isaac, if we're going to save your friends. Tell me what to do, he said instantly. Good lad, approved the warrior in the shadows. I need you to draw some of his men away to call the pack. So get on the blower, whispering that you're in hiding in this room and you can hear me moving outside the door. Sound scared. That's not hard, muttered Isaac. I think I've already shat myself twice in the past three minutes. Another amused snort. Where's the library? 
out of here to the right. Head in a straight line and you'll get to the main hall. You'll see the main stairs. Up those, you turn left and keep heading down the hallway. Then it does a 90-degree right angle down a blind corner. About 30 feet at the end of that hall is the library door. Fair warning, I think he's got at least one or two guys on the landing above the stairs, and we'll probably have one round the corner you have to turn in cover. At least, there was before you sent the place dark. He sensed Nate regarding him and coughed a little nervously. There are cameras inside as well in main corridors, he explained. I thought you might want to know where his guys were. That's good work, Isaac, said Nate, sounding genuinely impressed. The praise gave Isaac a little flush of happiness. Quick thinking and appreciated. Okay, do your thing, then hunker down here. I'll come get you when it's clear. Isaac nodded. Give me a count of ten to get set, then earn yourself an Oscar. Isaac grinned despite his nerves. He liked the old man. He scared the techie shitless, of course, but he still liked him. Without ever being anything but a thick shadow to his eyes, the old warrior slipped out of the room, and Isaac was left alone. As he hit ten, he gave the performance of his young life. Nate positioned himself at the corner, a grim statue painted black, listening with a smile as Isaac jabbered down the radio in his earpiece. It was a virtuoso performance, convincing Bancroft of Nate's menace to Isaac's safety. Assurance of incoming support was confirmed, and the veteran waited patiently for them to arrive. Running feet echoed down the hallway, and the first soft glimmer of flashlights bounced from the wall opposite Nate. Keep an eye out, one man hissed, then knocked at the door. Isaac, I'm coming. His sentence never finished, as Nate whipped out low on one knee, squeezing two rapid shots. The first hit the speaker in the ribs, folding him sideways as the bullet ripped through his organs. The second hitting the other man in the spine, killing him instantly. Not wanting any undead to surprise him with their reanimation, Nate advanced in a combat walk, squeezing off two more rounds, cracking the skulls of the dead men. His element of surprise was gone now but two more men were down, six to go. His intention initially had been to move fast and loud, to confuse and confound with explosive aggression, maybe even blowing the oil tank at the side of the house or the small tanker truck. Ever versatile to changing dynamics, the brainless complacency of the two men investigating the cameras, Erin's unorthodox removal of the sniper, and the unexpected bonus of Isaac's assistance in infiltrating the house, had allowed him to be more surgical. If Isaac's intel was right, there was just Bancroft and six more goons left, and untrained henchmen at that. With their numbers savagely culled, their panic would only increase. He knew, without doubt, he could execute and pick off the remaining stragglers, but his major difficulty now was ensuring the safety of the hostages. A tiny nail of concern scratched at the back of his mind, wondering just where Erin was. As soon as she had neutralized the shooter on the top floor, he had moved, and by the time he reached the house, she was nowhere to be found. He had not heard any other shots. An explosion of gunfire rattled from above, a screaming hail of bullets being spat from a submachine gun with the scattered wine of ricochets blended in. Nate accelerated, following Isaac's instructions, closing on the rattling of rapid fire. As he reached the foot of the stairs, he peered up, his vision clear in the darkness thanks to the NVGs. One man was facing down the hallway to the right, using a doorway for cover the flash of the SMG's muzzle a bright sparkle in the green filter of his vision. Lifting his rifle, Nate aimed and fired in a single smooth motion, the bullet obliterating the man's hip, and he collapsed with a throat-tearing scream. A quick second round ended his agony, cracking through the crown of his skull. Nate ducked as another man appeared at the top of the stairs, spraying a wild field of fire in his general direction. Chips of white-painted wood rained on him as the bullets shredded the handrail and polished steps. But the man could not see where Nate was, having made himself small against the side of the staircase. The volley ended 
and Nate was about to rise and return fire when the thundering blast of an SA-80 on full auto filled the space of the landing above. Numerous rounds sending powdered plaster and stone into the air as they struck the whitewashed wall. The gunman vanished from sight, having been threaded by numerous rounds. Fuck yeah, came a familiar whoop of victory, followed by the expected volley of insults. Off is the general direction in which you should fuck, and the crowd goes wild. Then followed a hissing impression of applause, followed by a singular low chant of, Locky, locky, locky. It was neither the time nor the place, yet still it made Nate's mouth twitch in amusement. The smile was wiped by another hail of rapid-fire bullets from a submachine gun blasting down the opposite end of the hallway, inciting a yelped, Fuck a duck! from Erin as she dived for cover. Nate stalked up the center of the stairs, waiting for the storm of bullets to abate. As the man ducked behind cover to ram in a new clip, Nate peeled round the corner and went to one knee, his rifle aimed down range as he waited. The man leaned round the corner, about to unleash another bullet storm, but Nate calmly squeezed the trigger. The bullet blasted the man's bicep, tearing through muscle and smashing the bone of his arm, half severing the limb. His wail was almost inhuman as a splash of crimson spattered the white wall behind him, and then Nate was moving. My arm, screamed the man, my fucking arm. His wails were high-pitched and chaotic, eyes only for the savaged meat attached to his shoulder. Fucking help me, you cunts, he roared. Nate slowed his walk as he heard two men hissing at the screamer to shut the fuck up, recognizing one of those voices as Brody. On reflex, Nate unclipped one of the pockets of his tactical vest and withdrew one of the flashbangs. As he reached the end of the passage, he pulled the pin and, without looking round the corner, hurled the flashbang down the corridor towards two men kneeling with submachine guns of their own. He heard the chattering panic of the armed thugs as the projectile skidded towards them, profanity coloring the air as Nate's fingers pressed into his ears. The explosion in the narrow width of the hallway was ferocious, as 170 decibels of thunder addled the men's brains, combined with a seven million candela flash of light, completely overwhelming their senses. With the two men unable to see or think, Nate moved around the corner, rifle up, and quickly punched around through both men with a rapid one-two. He whirled and put a bullet in the head of the screaming man, so as not to leave a reanimating undead in his wake. I want one of those, said Erin cheerfully as she appeared behind him. According to Isaac, there's only Bancroft and one more left, plus his wife, said Nate. Six captives behind the door at the bottom of this hall. Isaac? Nate quickly filled in the details of their unexpected ally. Nice, that boy deserves a beer. Nate nodded. Now we've got an issue, though, he cautioned. If Bancroft gets desperate or gives up, he might just start executing people out of spite. We've no idea where they are in the room. He's probably got a human shield. So if we breach fast, he might just start killing. What about the last flashbang? Nate shook his head. There's a kid in there. Trust me, these things royally fucking scramble you. Plus, if you're too close when they go off, they can inflict severe burns. Too much risk with more innocents than hostiles in the room. So what then? Nate lifted his rifle, cracking another two rounds into the heads of the reanimating henchmen outside the door. We'll have to talk. Erin snorted. Well, this should be a hoot. Bancroft gripped Charlie's shoulder with his left hand. The 357's barrel placed against the back of the boy's skull at a downward angle. The boom in the hall outside had been phenomenal. Then three quick shots, followed by another two, signaled the end of his meager defenses. One old retired soldier and a smart-mouthed little bitch had ripped his kingdom apart. Bancroft had survived the end of the world, gathered all his forces in one place, and was the master of everything his gaze fell upon. Everything had been just fine until Johnny stumbled across this locky woman and her sugar daddy. 
Since that accursed day, everything had spiraled out of control. And Jamie Bancroft was a man entirely used to control. Having it taken from him had him acting like a spoiled child, with wild fits of rage at the incompetency of his men, blaming everyone except himself. Johnny and Connor were both dead, and his last remaining sibling was a couple of months from his 18th birthday. Caleb was pale, even in the gloom of the lightless room. Flashlights were all they had to pierce the dark, and under their sickly yellow glare, Caleb's face was wan with barely disguised terror. His wife, Chantelle, just looked incensed rather than afraid. She had gotten used to the good life, had not been a fan of the dead rising to take over the world, but as they started to carve out their own little kingdom, she had settled into the role of tyrant queen with a plum. Now, two complete unknowns had decimated them over the course of a month. It was unfathomable, and his narcissistic mind forged the illusion of him as the victim of this tale. Evening, Mr. Bancroft, said a voice outside the door. In a fit of pique, Bancroft raised the three fifty seven and fired the door, blasting a massive hole in the wood. Charlie started to cry, trying to crumple away from the monstrous thunder of the handgun. But Bancroft hauled him back up. Fuck you, old man, he spat. You come in here and I'll blow this kid's head off. Nowhere to go, Bancroft, said Nate. All your men are dead. It's just you. So you let the kid and the others go, and I'll let you walk out of here. You have my word. Bancroft barked a bitter laugh. Your word? Oh, well, that's fine then, he said, the words dripping with scorn. What are your other options, Mr. Bancroft? There's no way out of that room, and the lives of those people in there are the only thing keeping you alive. My goodwill is all you have left. I could ruin your fucking day and paint my walls with this kid's brains, and if you do that, I will come in there like the devil himself. That I can promise you. The words were without heat, just a statement of cold fact, and Bancroft swallowed a dry lump of fear. He could not show the unease he felt, not with all the hostages looking at him. He had to be in control. Had to be. I'll make you a deal, old man, said Bancroft. Me, my wife, and my brother walk out of here, and we'll keep the kid as collateral. Once we're in a vehicle, I'll let the kid go. Mr. Bancroft, let me be clear, said Nate, an edge creeping into his voice. The young boy is staying in that room. I'm not letting you walk him anywhere. You haven't earned my trust as yet. Your little display outside the gate doesn't fill me with confidence. And I'm supposed to trust you? You don't have a choice. Jamie, let's just go, said Caleb in a shaking voice. I I've had enough of this. Shut the fuck up, Caleb, ordered Jamie. Whose fucking side are you on? We've already lost Johnny and Connor. Caleb and Connor had always been close, and the youngest of the four had always idolized his hero soldier brother. Connor's death had hit the boy hard. That motherfucker out there killed Connor, hissed Bancroft. And you want to trust him? Soldiers die in war, said Nate from beyond the door. Every death has been regrettable, but you turned a Taliban fighting hero into a criminal and a killer. All the deaths are on your head, Bancroft. All you had to do was leave us be. Shut the fuck up, roared Jamie again, the grip on his temper loosening. You shut the fuck up. Then the loud-mouthed little bitch stuck her nose in. What made you this angry, Jamie? She piped. Were you somehow conceived by anal sex? There's no way being this much of a fucking asshole is natural. Bancroft roared, lifting the revolver and blasting the remainder of the door to splinters, filling the room with a cacophony of thunder from the boom of the gun. 
The 357 was still pointed at the splintered mess in the doorway when a shadow beyond moved into sight. The crack of a rifle was followed by an explosive burst of agony in his right shoulder. The gun dropped from nerveless fingers as he tumbled backwards, and Charlie burst from his grip to leap into his father's embrace. Chantel screamed and raced to him, sweeping up the fallen magnum and turning towards the doorway, but she was too slow. The old man's rifle cracked twice more, putting one bullet in her chest, then one in the head. She dropped like a stone. In the glow of a flashlight, Bancroft saw Caleb fumbling with the Glock in his hand, almost dropping it as tears streamed down his face. Don't do it, kid, ordered Nate, though Caleb seemed not to hear him, the gun still a tangled mess in his awkward hands. He was terrified, his mind addled as he fumbled for a solid grip. Please, Caleb, don't make me do this, pleaded the old man again. The weapon finally came to rest in his hands, and the boy looked up, his eyes wild. Don't fucking do it, Nate demanded, his voice rising. But the gun started to lift. God damn it, roared the old soldier as he squeezed the trigger. Caleb's legs collapsed as the round punched his chest, Glock falling from lifeless hands. God damn it, kid. Nate sounded genuinely pained. God damn you and your fucking stupidity. Nate lifted the MVGs, heart like a brick in his chest. The boy had been terrified beyond all reason, immune to the veteran's pleas for calm. He steeled himself and cracked a second round to prevent the boy's reanimation in the darkened library, before turning his attention to Bancroft on the ground. The man was in agony, eyes darting between the motionless corpses of his wife and brother, one hand clamped to his ruined shoulder as blood poured from between his fingers. Murderous old cunt, he accused through his teeth. He was just a kid. You put that gun in his hand, Bancroft, replied Nate, his chest hollow. I gave him a chance to put it down, but all you Bancrofts don't seem to have any sense in your thick heads. Fuck you. Nate sighed, slinging the rifle to his hip. He smoothly palmed his Glock and absently cocked the slide out of habit. I'd have you patched up, but what's the point? You're rotten to the core, Bancroft. If I let you live, you'll just cause pain to someone else or make revenge your only thought. You're fucking right, I will. Everyone out, Nate said to the room. None needed to be told twice, and the six captives scrambled out of the room towards Erin in the hallway. Once they were clear, Nate turned his gaze down to the wounded man, amazed at the hate still burning in his eyes. I'll fuck- He never got to finish the sentence. The moment he began speaking, Nate pointed the Glock at his face and obliterated it with a single pull of the trigger. It was done. King Shit of Turd Mountain had been deposed, and now, finally, there was a chance for peace from the living. Only the dead remained. August 26, 2010. The Fall of Turd Mountain. Holy shit, the last few days have been crazy. I haven't been able to write a damn thing because there's been just so much to do. So many new faces to settle in. Yeah, new faces. Seven of them in total. I'll go through them all in my next entry. I realise I haven't recorded what happened at Turd Mountain, and I should, what with us being victorious and such. Actually, that's not wholly true. It was a Pyrrhic victory, because we saved seven lives but lost too many more. We couldn't have done anything about those, but they still cut deep. Nate and I went out the night of the 22nd, and from the get-go, it was bad news. When we heard Bancroft over the radio execute two of the women and threaten to take a few more, he made good on that oath. There were ten bodies sat against the wall of his front gate, five either side, displayed like some crazed Madame Two Swords exhibition. Ten of them. 
Of the twelve women he was holding captive to be used and abused by his henchmen, only two were left alive. Thankfully, we have both of them with us now, but as you can imagine, they are seriously messed up. Shit, who wouldn't be? I came within a hair's breadth of that awful fate myself when that freak of a farmer captured me, but I got extremely lucky that Nate turned up when he did. Those two women suffered beyond my ability to imagine. I can remember my own terror when I thought I was going to be raped. These two women have suffered consistent and repeated assault. I won't cry for the men who abused them. The world is a better place without them in it. I'll save my tears for those more deserving. Anyway, my thoughts immediately switched to Mark's son, Charlie. If Bancroft had hurt that kid, shit, I would go feral on him. Nate pointed out, in his maddeningly logical way, that if King Shit had hurt Charlie, he would be on display with the women to knock us off our game. That made me feel marginally better. Marginally. Nate had a plan for extreme violence and chaos, but he spotted an open window at the front of the house, musing there was a sniper in there and one who had a better understanding of how to do the job. Their mode of concealment, being set back from the open window or something like that, showed he had a better understanding of a sniper's perch than Shooty McFuckface did on the court building roof. I offered the thought we should just go in the back, but Nate wouldn't have it. He made a fair point, to be honest. He knew there was an ex-serviceman still kicking about and surmised the shooter set back from the window would be that man. If Nate was going to breach the house, he didn't want an ex-soldier hunting him inside a building, especially one who knew the layout. Enter Lockie's insane plan number 83. I don't know how I did it, but I convinced Nate to let me have one of his precious two frag grenades. He couldn't see the shooter to take a shot himself, but I'd managed to work out a route up the house to the window. I could pop a grenade through that window and eliminate their last real trained threat. Nate agreed. This was a pivotal moment for us, I think. I know I can appear to take everything as a joke, and handling explosives certainly is no jest, so I listened intently to his instruction. Previously, I would have had to argue the toss with Nate over any plan of mine that appeared reckless, but all he did was mutter some curse under his breath, and then move into his instruction, which went something like, Hold this little handle down, remove pin, throw, don't fuck it up and kill yourself. First job was taking out two corner cameras. Having purloined some black spray paint from a nearby farm that Nate remembered seeing, he's got a good memory for a pensioner. I sneaked through the darkened trees. That, by the way, was a horrendous experience. I half expected a silent undead to leap out of the darkness any moment. Telling myself I was being stupid and I'd hear their stumbling through the undergrowth, but the sky was cloudless, and the light of the moon was enough to ensure I could live without a flashlight. I had one anyway, just a little one, in case things got too gloomy. Nate had told me the blind spots to approach from, and all I did was scale the wall underneath one and spray the paint over the lens. Then, once that one was blinded, did the same on the one at the other corner on the right side of the house as Nate was looking at it. Then it was up, over, back against the house wall and wait. Two goons exited the house to investigate the cameras, chatting like they were on the way to the pub. No sense of danger at all, despite their boss pulling everyone inside the house after Nate's menacing promise over the radio. Then Nate hit them with a one-two from the ridge, killing them both. Shit, that was some scary shooting. He doesn't have a proper hunting rifle, so it was probably the edge of effective range for the SA-80, as he must have been somewhere between three to four hundred meters away. The moment Bert and Ernie were dropped, I was on the roof of the house in less than ten seconds. It's a fancy mansion, but it has multi-level roofs and fancy architecture everywhere, which made it a breeze to climb. I slithered over the roof as quiet as I could, assuming the shooter would now be scanning the horizon for a sign of Nate after his sniping of Bert and Ernie. 
Getting my bearings on the appropriate window by peering over the edge, I moved to the window beside it and lowered myself feet first onto the ledge, bracing myself in the deep frame. The curtains were closed on the window behind me, so no need to worry about being seen. Taking a deep breath, I pulled out the grenade from my pocket, holding it like Nate had instructed. Then I just couldn't resist. I knew he'd be watching me down the scope, so I turned to face the spot he was watching from, waving at him with grenade still in hand, with the stupidest grin I could muster. Ripped the pin out with my teeth, leaned away from the safety of my ledge for the best angle, then tossed the live grenade like a boss through the shooter's window. Quick aside here. I say, ripped the pin out with my teeth, but that's not exactly true. I yanked and shook my head from side to side like a deranged puppy with a chew toy as I tried to work the pin out, and my teeth ached from chewing on metal before I finally managed it. Nate keeps leaving really important shit out. I had grand plans of looking like a badass and instead looked like the clueless lucky amateur I am. Sigh. I bet that old swine was pissing his sides laughing watching me through his scope. I heard the guy swear and panic in the brief pause before the explosion. Then it went off. Bloody hell, those things make a boom. I had to jam myself tighter in the window frame as the shockwave of the blast rippled out, crisp and intense. One more thing on the things Nate should have told Lockie about list. Near shit myself. Nate was moving then, no doubt, but I had a decision to make. Our initial plan was for me to defend the barn conversion thing, where the women were being held captive. With ten of those twelve executed, it was obvious that Bancroft had probably dragged all his remaining captives as human shields. The barn was dark and the door ajar, so my part of the plan was pretty much done as of now. I was hovering about on a window ledge, with no direction. So... Like the genius strategist I am, I decided to go into the house. Swinging over to the shooter's window, I swept into the shredded room, the plaster of the walls dotted with evidence of the frag shards, the floor blasted apart in the corner where the grenade had ended up. Quickly scanning the room, I found the shooter in a bad way. Oh, he was dead, but hell, that grenade had shredded him. He was also beginning to reanimate. You know, I really hate that. These fuckers get up so damn fast. The thing wasn't yet on its feet, though, so I slipped the pick hammer from my belt and brained the creature before it could cause me any issue. I couldn't have done the required climb with the rifle slung around me and remain in stealth mode, so my rifle had been left behind. Soldier Boy, however, must have inadvertently shielded his SA-80 from the frag blast with his body, as his was untouched and in full working order. I confiscated his rifle and the two spare magazines he had with him, then decided to hunker down and wait. I knew the next part of Nate's plan, and I wasn't going to mess with his reaper mojo. My part, for now, was done. It was probably no more than ten minutes before the house went dark. I'd been expecting things to blow up and the rattle of gunfire to go off as Nate went mental, but instead... Nate had decided to go in quiet and take out the power at source. I found out later he'd cottoned on to an ally in the house, moving the cameras to allow us to get in unseen. His name is Isaac, and we'll get to our new friends soon. But with this new knowledge, Nate had adapted his plan on the fly to use that advantage. A little more time passed before I heard the sniper's radio go off, as one guy was shouting at someone to respond, though no answer ever came. Strike one for Nate. A couple of minutes later, the guy named Isaac came over the airwaves in a spectacular, Oscar-worthy performance in a supporting role, whispering all terrified over the radio that Nate was outside and he needed backup. He could have whispered, I see dead people, and I'd have believed him. Turns out this was all a ruse on Nate's part, having already hooked up with our new buddy and two men were sent to retrieve him, walking right into his trap. Bang, bang, followed by another quick double tap. Nate had put them down in an ambush, then put them down a second time before they could twitch and reanimate. I made the decision to move out of the room and see if I could hook up with Nate. I was properly armed now and could support him as required. 
Unfortunately, I wasn't well-versed in traversing hostile buildings on my own with live shooters. I rounded a corner, just as a flashlight pointed my way. Two guys at the top of the stairs got eyes on me, and before I had the presence of mind to fire, both of them pointed SMGs my way and pulled their triggers. I just managed to dive back round the corner, plaster dust clouding the air as a shitload of bullets splattered the area I'd been standing in just a second earlier. I stayed there for a while, not daring to lean round and return fire, switching my rifle to full auto. My thinking was a hail of my own might make them dive for cover and give me a chance to properly retreat, maybe go back out the way I came and get back on the roof. Seconds later, though, the more familiar sound of a single rifle shot cracked in the gloom, and I heard the scream of one man as Nate's bullet royally fucked up his night. A quick follow-up shot silenced him for good. The second shooter turned his attention down the stairs, unloading on full auto to wherever Nate was taking cover. So I took the opportunity to wheel round the corner, shouldered the rifle, and spat out a storm of bullets from a fully automatic SA-80. Christ, have you ever fired an assault rifle on full auto? It's like a bucking bronco in your grip. But my superpower of undeserved good fortune meant the wild spray of automatic fire filled the area where the second gunman was standing. At least six of the bullets ripped into him, one of them through the skull. Insta-death, no reanimation, and the crowd goes wild. I got a little carried away with my celebration, pretty much putting an audio spotlight in my general area, and another gunman right down the end of the hallway appeared round a corner, a flashlight on his SMG giving his position away, just before he unleashed a hellstorm of bullets my way. That brief signal of the torch beam had me yelping and diving for cover as an entire SMG clip filled the hallway. It went quiet for a moment as the gunman slapped in a new magazine, but then a single crack of Nate's rifle unleashed some god-awful screaming of, My fucking arm! Seems old dead eye had waited for the gunman to lean back round, then smashed a single bullet through his upper arm, all but tearing it off. As the grievously wounded man pleaded with some unseen friends to help him, I peered round the corner. The dark silhouette of Nate in his familiar combat walk glided down the hall, slipped a flashbang out of his chest pocket and rolled it down the unseen hallway. Shit. The flash of light was brief and bright, but the explosion was skull-jarring, even from my distance. I would not want to be in the immediate vicinity of one of those going off. Scrambled and confused, the men down the corridor were quickly executed by Nate, and a third bullet to the head of the screaming man with the ruined arm returned the house to virtual quiet. I caught up with Nate, where he filled me in on Isaac's excellent assist. Then he put down the two dead that were reanimating outside a door at the end of the hall. He couldn't use a flashbang inside the room, because that's where all the captives were, with Bancroft, his wife, and his youngest brother. It was the end game, and it seemed Nate's option was to try and talk to Bancroft. Flattening us both against a wall, expecting what would come next, Nate started the conversation. Evening, Mr. Bancroft. Most of the door's top panel splintered as a thunderous gunshot came from inside the room. Fuck you, old man. You come in here and I'll blow the kid's head off. Well... Negotiations had started promisingly. All your men are dead. Nowhere to go. Let everyone go, and you can walk out of here. You have my word. Bancroft wasn't having that, naturally, but Nate pointed out he didn't really have any other option. I could paint the walls with this kid's brains. I don't always remember exactly what words are exchanged in these conversations, so my recall of them can sometimes be a bit hazy or embellished, but I will not forget a single word of what Nate said next. And if you do that, I will come in there like the devil himself. That I can promise you. He did it in that colder-than-the-grave voice he has. There's no anger in it, no heat, no fury. Yet somehow that cold burns. I could hear the change in Bancroft's voice as he responded again. That mausoleum tone of Nate's had punctured his bravado. 
He offered a deal to walk out with Charlie, who he'd then hand over when they were safely in a vehicle. Nate wasn't having it, citing his grisly display outside the gates as a reason for mistrust. An argument started inside the room then, with Bancroft telling his brother Caleb to shut his mouth. The youngest sibling sounded terrified and wanted out, and Jamie just berated him, reminding him Nate had killed Connor. Soldiers die in war. Nate said through the door, sensing there was a chance to end this without further violence. Shut the fuck up! You shut the fuck up! This was getting nowhere, but I could sense Jamie was on the verge of losing it. We needed that anger at us, so he didn't pull the trigger on little Charlie. Get ready, I whispered to Nate. I love the fact that he didn't question me, didn't try to stop me. That trust makes you feel like a million dollars. He just nodded, the MVGs still concealing the top half of his face. Settling the rifle into his shoulder in readiness, he nodded at me again. What made you this angry, Jamie? I spat through the door, knowing my voice alone would send him over the edge. One extra insult would tip him. Were you somehow conceived by anal sex? There's no way being this much of an asshole is natural. A strangled cry of rage erupted from his throat, and we both flattened against the wall, outside his angle of fire, as he blasted at the door again, shredding it with his dick-compensating hand cannon. With the gun no longer pointed at Charlie, Nate swept into view, rifle up, and squeezed off a round which punched through Jamie's shoulder, spinning him to the ground as the gun fell from nerveless fingers. Then Jamie's wife ran into the slight glow of a flashlight in the room, hands reaching for his gun as she screamed. When that light hit her face, I almost laughed. The bitch had so much makeup on, she must have had to apply it with a trowel. The light bounced off her thick clown mask, emphasizing the mass of insane shades she had used. Honestly, her face looked as though it had been gang-banged by boxes of Crayola. Nate wasn't laughing, though. As the screaming harridan with bolder hard fake tits swept up the gun and started to turn, he didn't hesitate, double tapping her in the chest and head like a pro. Both of us stepped through the shattered door into the room. Caleb, probably not even 18 yet, had a Glock in his hands, desperately fumbling. He was making a complete mess of it, almost dropping it and recatching it, trying to get a solid hold on the handgun, but making complete tragedy of the whole situation. Frantically trying to handle the weapon, Caleb was as chaotic and confused as a monkey trying to fuck a football. It was a god-awful mess, and Nate gave him the best chance he could. Don't do it, kid, he said at first, but Caleb didn't hear him in his blind panic. Please, Caleb, don't make me do this. There was a genuine pleading to Nate's words, begging the boy to give it up. Then handgun steadied, the boy finally achieving a fierce grip in both hands. Caleb's eyes wild and unfocused, locked with Nate's, stark terror etched into every atom of his beardless face. Don't fucking do it, bellowed Nate. But the gun started to rise. Nate screamed a curse as his bullet smashed into Caleb's chest. God damn it, he roared, pain in every echo of his voice. God damn you and your fucking stupidity. Nate had everyone get out of the room, shouldering the rifle and drawing his Glock as he and the downed Bancroft exchanged some words. The moment everyone was clear of the room, there was no further ceremony. Jamie started to say something else, but Nate silenced him with a single squeeze of the trigger. And finally, we were free. We cleared the rest of the house, switching the power back on so we could do it properly, moving the captives to a part of the house away from all the bodies. Nate stepped outside to put down Bert and Ernie for the second time to make the grounds safe, then returned to the group that we had moved into the kitchen, getting everyone a drink and anything sugary we could to ease any shock or fear. I think most thought they were swapping one captor for another to begin with, as Nate looked like a fucking death machine all in black, with his tactical gear, black face paint, uplifted NVGs, massive crocodile dundee knife, etc. 
That all changed, though, when one of the captives sat peering at me. She was a black woman, mid-forties, disheveled as hell, hair a tangled mess. I hadn't really had a chance to really see any of the captives, just trying to get them away from all the mess and make sure the kid Charlie was okay, when the woman spoke. Is that really you, Erin? Hearing my name snapped my head round, and I looked at the woman more closely. Her eyes were shining with tears, and she looked so happy to see me. When Mark told us of you two and said your name, I didn't really believe in my heart of hearts it was my Erin. And then the thunderbolt of recognition struck. Maria! She nodded coughing a half-sob, half-laugh, then flew towards me, encircling me in a crushing embrace. Maria Williams, Dino's wife, the woman who had taken me in as if I was family, who between her and her policeman husband had set me on the straight and narrow. This obvious familiarity settled everyone right down as Maria and I had a tearful reunion. When Nate returned to find this scene unfolding before him, and then I introduced him to Maria and everyone else, the teary nurse crushed the old dog to her as well. It was awkward as hell, as Nate was dripping in gear, and she couldn't really get near him because of his tactical vest, but it still brought a smile to his war-painted face. Maria looked me up and down again, noting the rifle slung round my shoulder, the Glock now strapped to my hip and the pick hammer sticking out my belt with dried sniper goop on the spike, and raised her eyebrows. You always find a way, Erin, she said, laughing and shaking her head as she moved a loose lock of hair from my face. It was a weirdly comforting gesture, something she did all those years ago out of habit, and the familiarity of it warmed me. Despite my joy at finding her alive and well, there was still one burning question I had to ask. Dean? I don't know is the truth, she said. He was working the day it all started. I never heard from him, and he never came home. She sighed. If he is alive, I don't know where he could be. I didn't say it, but my heart broke. If Dino was alive, he would have fought through hell itself to get back to Maria. She was his absolute world, his safe little harbour in a stormy existence. Without children of their own, they were all each other had. I put on a brave face, hugging her again, forcing myself away from the dark thoughts, and just reveling in finding someone I genuinely cared about, alive and well. Also, she's a frickin' nurse. Medical skills, yo. The thought of Dino out there somewhere, among the mass of the undead, has ruined my victory mood a little. I think I'll end this entry here, and tomorrow I'll introduce you to the new residents of our little community and bring you up to date with what we've been doing these few days since our victory. But Maria is alive and well, and for that I am so fucking grateful. August 27th, 2010. New Arrivals. Okay, so after a day of resetting my emotions, allow me to introduce you to our new crew, my dear reader. This name thing for my journal is really starting to bug me. I still need to sort that out, but I just can't find anything that works. I could write it to Dean, but I'm not doing that while there's still the chance he's out there somewhere. Anyway, I digress. So, you know Maria Williams is still alive. She's a mid-forties black woman. I don't think I mentioned in my first entries that she was black, but then, who gives a shit? We all bleed red. As I've said before, she's a nurse and has been for twenty years, so this woman knows her shit. Go past the fact that she's the closest thing to family I have, from the before times, at least, as Nate Freyer and Particles are my tribe now. Her medical skills are absolutely amazing to have on board. She can tell us the kind of stuff Nate and I should look for that are crucial to the health and well-being of the whole tribe now. I'm so happy she's here, I can't even describe it. 
It was Maria's day off when all the shit went down, which I've now confirmed was the 23rd of June from everyone's stories. Dean was on nights and called her to say he was doing some overtime because shit was getting really weird, and it was an all-hands-on-deck scenario at the local station. That was the last she heard from him. I'm just so glad the last words they exchanged before the end of that call was, I love you. If they were Dean's final words to her, then they're the best ones for Maria to remember him by. Remember early on that I said my phone was out of power? Maria tried calling me but just hit voicemail. She's been thinking these past few months that I'd succumbed to the apocalypse as well. Makes me mad at myself for drifting away and losing touch with them. But you just get caught up in all your own shit, don't you? You drift away from loved ones, forget to check in and just see how they are, let them know you're okay. I'm so glad we got to reconnect, but angry at myself that it took an apocalypse for me to realise just how important they both were to me. Tell the people you care about you love them. Don't say you haven't got time. Make the time. Human connection is all we have. It's what makes us who we are, what makes life worth living. Money, possessions, status, your social media accounts, they're all a steaming pile of shit that mean nothing in the long run. The greatest gift you can give any person is the gift of your time and attention. It's a lesson I've been taught by the end of the world as we know it. So, whoever you are reading this, make the fucking time. Those human connections are priceless treasures we should hold close. Maria was inadvertently picked up by some of Bancroft's men when she was forced to venture out a week after the world died and stood up again. For a moment, she thought she was saved from a pack of five monsters, only to realise the ones who saved her from the undead were the real monsters. She was certain she was going to be raped by the way they looked at her. Maria is a striking-looking woman, even in her mid-forties, and the shade of her skin is just exquisite smooth and hardly lined by time. She was smart, though, thinking on her feet. Once the animals discovered she was a trained medical professional, they left her untouched and took her back to Jamie. I'm relieved, I won't lie. What those poor younger women had to endure was horrific, and I'm glad Maria was saved that awful fate. Bancroft was smart enough to recognise the value of a highly trained and experienced nurse, so she was off limits, acting as the physician for his bunch of goons, and to treat some of the women used a little roughly by those animals. Again, I won't cry for them. If I could raise them up to kill them again myself, I would, for what they put those women through. Savages. We've already introduced Mark Reynolds to our tale. His son Charlie is the fucking bomb. He's nine years old, witty as fuck for a kid his age, and absolutely drop-dead gorgeous. Mark is white, in his late thirties, and his wife, who died when Charlie was a baby from breast cancer, was Kenyan. Charlie is the perfect blend of them both, and has this glowing russet-coloured skin, spectacular hazel-coloured eyes, and a cheeky smile that lights up his whole face. Shit, when he's older, the girls are going to swoon over him. Looks, charisma, intelligence, and humour. Form an orderly line, ladies. Mark's a clever guy who is just one of those old school types who can turn his hand to anything. Carpentry, construction, electrics, gas, plumbing. You name it, this guy does it. He's the ultimate handyman and used these mad engineering skills to make his own hours to look after his boy. Bancroft was one of his clients, and he was working at Jamie's mansion the day the world went to shit. Bancroft wouldn't let him go, but Mark put his foot down and said he wouldn't do shit round the place while his boy was out there. Bancroft's men went and swept up Charlie from the childminder, pretty much just ripping him away, then used the boy as his leverage. Shitbag move. Still, they stay together, and they're an absolute dream as a partnership. Mark's a pretty funny guy and speaks to Charlie like he's much older, because he's such a smart kid. This brings the best out of him, and I love watching them together. Charlie idolizes his dad, and Mark loves every bone of that boy. Mark is the poster boy for awesome single fathers, 
and I'm so glad they're still together. Naturally, Charlie and Particles are now homeboys for life. The kid won't leave the dog alone, and the little attention whore fucking loves it. I think Charlie is the first person that Particles hasn't looked outraged at. I'm sure that dog has some aged human soul. He's so in tune with the people around him at times, it's pretty freaky. Next up is our mole on the inside during the Turd Mountain operation. Isaac Sadler is a tech nerd, a complete geek around computers and electronics. Self-employed, he set up the security system for Bancroft, and when the world went to hell, Bancroft had him grabbed. Straight up kidnapped direct from his home. You can tell Isaac is a funny guy, with an intelligent dry sarcasm punctuated by slightly goofy humour. He's quite shy, though, and every time Freya comes in the room, he looks like he's about to have a panic attack, having no idea how to speak to her without falling to pieces. It's sweet. He's a bit dizzy with me as well, but I think he's a bit more comfortable because, A, Freya is stupidly attractive and makes even straight women go a bit wobbly at the knee, and, B, he can communicate with me because I can talk geek culture with him, like movies, TV shows, comics, fantasy novels, and all that jazz. It's a comfort zone for him. He's a likable guy about my age, maybe a year or two older. I don't know how much use his computer skills will be, but Nate seems pretty set on Isaac looking to hook up a security system like Bancroft around our perimeter. That would be pretty cool, to be fair. Next up, Nora Hardy. This woman is the absolute dog's bollocks. She's a little over 60, with that super matronly look that just tells you she's got stories filled with bucket loads of sage advice and boundless wisdom. She was widowed two years before all this crap, the wife of the farmer that lived nearby to Bancroft's home. Why did Bancroft's animals not just murder this woman? Well, Luckily for her, one of Bancroft's men, who actually had something resembling a brain, noticed the expansive herb and vegetable garden that Nora tended on her property. Recognising the value of those skills, she was brought back to Castle Bancroftstein to do the same. Win for us! Nora's already bringing Grace and Theo's old garden back to life, and she does it with a smile on her face now. Turns out, this woman wouldn't have been out of place in the frontier Wild West. I mean, she can do everything. Sew, crochet, knit, makes clothes, knows how to can foods and make preserves, cooks, bakes, agriculture, animal husbandry. Shit, the woman can even kill and butcher pigs, cows and chickens. The level of skill and knowledge this woman possesses absolutely boggles my mind. If there is one person you want for your post-apocalyptic homestead, Nora Hardy is queen. She's like everybody's grandma, constantly checking everyone is okay, well-fed, warm enough, cool enough, have you had enough to drink, etc. I already love her to bits. I never had the experience of grandparents, but Nora makes me feel like I've got a grandma now. She absolutely adores Charlie as well, spoiling him like he was her own grandson, constantly getting hugs off the little dude. Charlie clearly adores her as well, but then, who wouldn't? She's freaking amazing. So, there's all the positives. Mark, Charlie, Isaac, Maria, and Nora, all happy as pigs in shit now their slave labor is done. They all have a shared experience as well, a tight bond from enduring the past couple of months and finding strength and comfort in each other. It's not the same for Alicia and Laura. Alicia Gray and Laura Mayfield are both early twenties, good-looking girls without a care in the pre-apocalypse world. Not so much anymore. I'm not going to dwell on what they've been through, these two had to endure being sex slaves for two months, then had the terror of watching ten of their group be dragged outside and executed by Bancroft, wondering if they're next. Jesus, what an ordeal on every level from beginning to end. They seem to have gone in different directions emotionally. Alicia is a brunette, Laura a blonde, and they're just as opposite in how they're handling this new change. 
Alicia, in my opinion, is making herself hard and cold, surrounding herself in emotional armor to crush the trauma by forging herself into a warrior. She keeps banging on at Nate, wanting firearms and self-defense training, determined to never let herself or anyone else suffer what she and Laura have survived. Nate understands, but he said it's too early, confiding in private to me that he won't train anyone with that much fury in them, as it will make her reckless. I can see both their arguments, supporting both points of view, which leaves me in a really difficult position. Nate is the best person to judge if someone is in the right frame of mind for weapons training. Earning his trust, however, is a difficult thing. Freya and I have it, but we've been together a little while, and Nate and I have been in the trenches. I'm a complete dickhead at times who frustrates him, but the old dog knows that when the shit hits the fan, I am 100% at his back and will go where he points if it gets the job done. Alicia doesn't have that trust yet, and Nate will want to feel the situation out a little more before he makes a decision. From her point of view, hell yeah. If I'd been through what she has, I'd want all the fucking guns. But if I'm honest, I know I would be reckless as shit. As much as I empathize with Alicia's need to do something, I think Nate is right for now. Alicia needs to settle in, show a little patience, get comfortable with everyone. Then Nate might think about it. We can't live forever with just Nate and I being our only shooters, and I'm still a rank amateur. And we're actually pretty fat on weapons and ammo now after clearing out Bancroft's armory. It'll come, but it's too early. The one I'm really worried about is Laura. She has this haunted air about her. I mean, fair enough, right? But I'm genuinely worried about her. She's just 22 says the sagely and wise 26-year-old, and has been through a head-smashing trauma for an extended period of time, and I'm not sure she knows how to deal with it. She was snatched off the street the day after the apocalypse started and has been in torment ever since. She has no idea about the fates of friends and family, has been thrust with a new bunch of strangers, but now that she has a modicum of safety, all of that physical, emotional, and psychological trauma has space to be processed. She's not sat there waiting for the door to be opened and be dragged off to the house or into the yard to be executed. So her mind now has time to work through all the trauma, and I'm worried about how she's going to handle it. Time will tell. But once again, Freya steps up to the plate. She's taken Laura under her wing, because she's got such a lovely way about her. Easy going, softly spoken, smile to light up the darkest sky. She's just awesome. I remember how much she helped me when I was processing all that horror after the block of flats. And she has a gift of knowing when she needs to say something supportive, or when someone needs quiet, but still wants someone there. She's really good at just being present and available, with no intrusions, all the space you need, but there if you need her. If I was into women, I would marry that girl. She's the only woman that's made me question my sexuality for a brief moment. I'm comfortable enough with myself to say that, so off you fuck with your judgments. It's too early to say if Freya is having any effect on Laura as yet. These things don't get resolved in a few days. Maybe when we all settle into a new rhythm and routine with each other, Laura will start opening up a little, because at the moment she's an airtight container of unresolved trauma and emotion. So, there you have it. Our tribe now stands at eleven. Ten humans, one pug, and the lodge has got a whole lot busier. Everyone has been settled into rooms, with Charlie and Mark obviously sharing, and Maria and Nora have both bonded and opted for a twin room. Isaac is in a room on his own, and rather than stick together, Alicia and Laura have gone their separate ways as well. The lodge is almost at capacity now, so that morning piece I used to enjoy for writing in the main kitchen of the lodge has gone to shit. Charlie is up early and plays outside with particles, trying to teach him tricks. Good luck with that, he's a lazy little turd. 
Mark is up as well because of Charlie, and Nora's body clock has her up earlier than anyone at pretty much 6am every morning. Sigh. I like that we rescued all these people, but I've gotten quite used to my morning peace. Instead, I go make a brew in the smaller kitchen here in the bungalow, then go back and chill in my room to write these updates. It won't matter as much when the weather starts to turn, but on these summer mornings, it was nice sitting at the big island in the middle of the lodge's kitchen, the glass sliding doors opened to let in the morning air and look out over the vista of the grounds. My God, I'm 26 going on 70. Listen to me. Can you pass me my tartan booty slippers and my blanket for my knees while I just grunt and groan myself into this rocking chair? It's taking a bit of time to get used to it being so busy. The first thing we had to do was assess the food situation. Winter will be here before we know it. Three people to ten is a big multiplier in food consumption, and the hot water for showers is having to be regulated. No standing for ten minutes with arms in the air luxuriating from here on in. Once the tank is empty, we have to wait for it to refill and heat up, which takes quite a chunk of the electric from the panels to do. We may need to impose a shower rotor and only take one every two days, rather than the luxury of a daily shower I've been used to this past month. It's a small sacrifice, but if and when that kicks in, it's going to make me irritable and twitchy early on. I just know it. I bloody love my daily shower, that feeling of being clean. Lots of sighing today. Anyway, food. Nate and Mark smashed together that shelving from timber acquired from some nearby farms and installed it in the room where I disintegrated the top knot. Nobody wants to sleep in there, so we ripped out the carpets and turned it into a storeroom. With so many bodies, we soon had everything on shelves and organized, and I have to say, we're in a pretty good position. Based on an average rate of consumption for the three of us, Nate says we have enough for about three months, now there are ten people. Sounds a lot, but it isn't. I'm taking Nate's word for these calculations, by the way. Maths has never been my strong point. If I had a pound for every time I fucked up my maths, I'd have £12.30. Naturally, Nora will help to supplement that, and says if we can acquire her more supplies and seeds, she can expand the garden and start getting more potatoes in the ground and the like. This is good. We're pretty flush on weaponry now. Nate made sure that was the first thing we brought home before anything else, just in case any other scavengers found Castle Bancroft Stein while we were away. There are still places we can hit for food and other supplies, but guns and ammo? Shit, rarer than a rocking horse's turd pile in this green and pleasant land. Again, I'm not going to inventory. That's Nate's field of expertise and is not putting this stuff in the upstairs storeroom. That's all being kept here in the bungalow, under lock and key by Nate. He'll be the one controlling and issuing that stuff. But a quick survey says we're in possession of eight SA-80 rifles, with about 3,000 rounds of 556 for them. About 14 9mm handguns of varying makes and models, but mostly Glock 17s with about the same. Six SMGs, a handful of those Mac 11 machine pistols, which Nate dislikes, as he says they'll piss through ammo in the hands of amateurs who don't control their shots a selection of shotguns in varying gauges with boxes of appropriate shells, and even two AK-47s, but the 7.62 rounds for them are pretty low, which is probably why Bancroft didn't really have them in circulation. They each have about three full magazines ready to use, but there isn't any spare reloads. There's also a shitload of gun cleaning supplies. We are loaded for zombie bear, my dear reader. Bancroft's house is actually a gold mine. We're going to get that tanker and fill it up with fuel. There's a shit ton of foodstuffs over there, as well as medical supplies they purloined from a local infirmary and nearby pharmacies. King Shit gathered a lot of resources to store at Turd Mountain, for sure. Next few days are going to be busy, as we run back and forth to clear it out of said goodies. I probably won't write for a few days, mainly because A... I'll probably be absolutely beat from all the work, and B, I'm a goddamn bard, and no storyteller lists how many cans of chicken soup or boxes of paracetamol they transferred between homesteads.
I'm going to get my shit together and will take my shower at the end of the day when I need it the most. Adios. September 1st, 2010. Love, actually. The weather has turned today. Welcome back to Northern England, where it goes from bright sunshine to totally pissing it down within a day. You know, last night I spent ages copying down all my first entries from those scribbled notebooks to add to this record. Reading them back, I must have appeared like I was on drugs. It was all hyperactive and making light where I can. Then I look at this latest stuff where I've toned it down and sound like a semi-intelligent woman instead of Tigger on cocaine. On reflection, those early entries, when it was just me, I think I was just trying to keep myself sane. I am pretty hyperactive, and I get a kick out of making people laugh, even if that person is an imaginary reader, and I don't like to get melancholy. My moods can swing to the extremes. I'm self-aware enough to realise this. I can be hyper and not take anything serious, seeing the light in everything, which I always try to do. To a large extent, I wasn't lying to Nate when I said I wasn't taking it seriously. Don't get me wrong, I've seen some shit now and I take the dangers very seriously. But I meant it when I said that laughing at this whole shit show was how I wanted to get through it. Life was so fucking miserable before the world suffered critical prolapse, and now that misery has increased by a factor of X. If I let everything blot out the light, then what's the point? There's no point in surviving the end of the world if all we do is mope about how shit everything is. Granted, people like Alicia and Laura have damn good reason to be hurt and scream at the injustice of it all. And everyone here in this lodge has lost someone in some way. Sometimes they've lost everyone and everything they've ever known. But if we all sit and think about that, if we don't try to push forward and make something better of this shithole existence we find ourselves in, we may as well all just give up and turn these damn guns on ourselves. Now, I have my bad days. Believe it or not, despite all my spectacular awesomeness, you've already been dazzled by the adventures of Flint and Locke. Shut up, Nate, I'm keeping it. I do get down at times. My moods are extreme, so when I'm up, I'll do my best to drag everyone around me to my lofty heights of wacky stupidity. When I'm down, however, I'm an absolute shithead to be around. I just want to be left alone, question myself constantly, wince at some of the things I said that I thought were hilarious at the time, and generally tell myself how useless I am, how nobody will ever love me, that I will die alone and all that other good stuff. I'm human. Hard to believe, I know. Please, tone down the applause. You're making me blush. I'm human, and as much as I jokingly say how awesome I am, I am far from fucking perfect. I'm 26 years old, and I've never been in love. I've had boyfriends, flings, one-night stands and the like. Shit, I'm not a nun. I'm a woman with needs. But they've always been that. Just physical needs. I've never met anyone I really connected with emotionally like that. I've never thought, this guy could be the one. My thoughts after sex are usually, I'm fucking starving, I could smash a Big Mac right about now. It makes me doubt myself, makes me wonder if I'm broken in some way, because I know what love is. I'm not a sociopath who lacks empathy. Shit, I've got empathy to burn. When those I care about are hurt, it's like a knife to my heart, and I feel that pain with them. I've seen love portrayed a thousand different ways in prose and in movies, and I know what love really is. It's not the storybook starry-eyed lovers destined to be together that are consumed by a bright and luminous fire of passion. Maria and Dean showed me what love really was. It's hard work. It's compromise, it's sacrifice, it's giving, it's two people working hard to help the other be the best version of themselves. It's living with your best friend. I've never even remotely felt that for any guy I've dated or slept with. I quickly lose interest, throwing them away like some old clothes that don't fit anymore, that look a bit frayed and worn. 
Now the world has come to an abrupt and undead halt, and I have to wonder if I'll ever feel that. Nate's basically become my dad. Mark's a sweet guy, but not my type. Isaac's kinda cute in an awkward way, but he's more like my buddy I can chat geeky shit with and connect to my old life in some way. As much as I crack jokes about Freya making me question my sexuality, I'm not into women, though she makes me wish I was sometimes. I'm still baffled by the idiot who let her go. There's no accounting for the stupidity of some people. She's just so bloody nice. So, where do I go from here? There are no post-apocalyptic singles bars. Online dating sites aren't accepting new subscriptions, and most of the viable candidates now all have the same milky eye colour whose interests are exclusively confined to murdering the living with a rage more fierce than the heart of a star. Sigh. I don't know how I ended up on this little melancholy wonder. I think maybe because of Isaac's presence, if I'm honest. A guy my own age has been missing from my apocalypse experience thus far, and with him here, I guess I'm wondering at what might have been. Isaac's nice, but A, he's more like a friend I like to hang out with and chat shit, and B, even if I was interested, I'd have to live with him when I inevitably cast him aside. And I would eventually cast him aside, because something inside me is broken. Life would be unbearable then. I mean, shit. Can you imagine being forced to live with your ex? Doesn't matter who was the heartbreaker and who was the heartbroken, it would be a wholly shitty experience for everyone, including those in proximity. Holy shit, no. No, I'm not feeling twitchy for our resident tech geek. I think it's just having someone of the opposite sex that I could be with that's brought all these thoughts to the surface. Not that I'm saying he'd be automatically interested in me. Hell, that makes me sound so arrogant. Bloody hell, I'm making a mess of this. Look, I'm no Freya. I'm not drop-dead gorgeous with a radiant soul, just your average woman. Men don't vie for my attention, and I guess I've always just felt like an option for most guys. A handy alternative who might be a bit of fun or a distraction when there's no better alternative. It's just... The thought of a possibility that has my head all twisted up this morning. The chances of making that ultimate connection in these apocalyptic times have been drastically reduced. And that's, well, it's a bit shit, if I'm honest. Bah, enough of this self-indulgent pity party. The last few days have been busy as hell gathering resources, and I'm fucking beat. I love having more people around that I can bullshit with, but as extroverted as I am, I like a little time to myself as well, to recharge my energy. I'm taking today for myself, as tomorrow we're going to a retail park at the far end of town, where there is both a big electronics store and a B&Q. The former we're hitting with the intent to acquire Isaac all the gear he needs to set up some perimeter security on the lodge, cameras on the gate, stuff like that. The latter is for gardening supplies that Nora wants. Fertilizers, seeds, blah blah. Her list is easy to follow. Nate and I haven't the first clue what Isaac will need, so he's coming with us. He started to tell us, reeling off a list of stuff, and I had to jack O'Neill his ass. I can see your mouth moving, I said, and words keep coming out of them, but they're not ones from my world. He laughed. But if we want this done properly... You'll have to come with us, I finished. Um, I was going to say, if we want this done properly, I'll need the things on my list. And your list is made up of random noises, cleverly disguised to sound like actual words, but that, in fact, mean absolutely nothing to simple earthlings like myself or Nate. So, you're coming with us. His facial expression was equal to one he might make if I'd just instructed him to saw off his dick with a rusty knife. He turned a pleading gaze to Nate, expecting the grizzled old veteran to say no at having a complete amateur along for the ride. Erin's right, was all he said. We don't have the time to match up the words on your list to a store full of alien devices. We can watch your six while you gather what you need. That way we can be in and out much faster. 
Don't forget, we have to hit the garden section of the hardware store as well for Nora. The quicker we're done with yours, the sooner we can get Nora's list. Every minute counts out in the field, and we've no idea what we're walking into up there. Isaac was crestfallen. The thought of being out in the field clearly terrified him. Like Nate says, we'll have you back all the way. I put on my best reassuring voice, though that usually sounds like I'm just taking the piss. You just do what you do, and Nate and I will take care of everything else. This is the new world, son, said Nate, softening his usual granite tone a little. And it's a grindstone. Whether it wears you down or polishes you up depends on what you're made of. I turned slowly to look at Nate. Holy crap, Confucius, I said. That is some profound shit. The joke broke the tension as Isaac laughed nervously. He sucked in a breath to visibly calm himself and nodded. Okay, he said, more for himself than either of us. I can do this. Easy peasy, I nodded, slapping him on the shoulder. All you gotta do is go shopping for nerd tech and we'll handle the heavy lifting. Major bonus, you can have whatever your heart desires for free. So that's what we're doing tomorrow. We're going to roll out in the pickup. We haven't had the chance to do a proper fuel run, but Mark siphoned a load of diesel out the white van we took from the little convenience store and transferred it to the pickup to load up its tank. The van is bigger, but the pickup has more grunt in a pinch and is a much sturdier all-round vehicle. There's plenty of space in the back for all our loot, and with just the three of us going, we can fit in there no problem. The plan is to go tomorrow, but we might wait another day or two, depending on this rain. We don't really want to be getting drenched and cold while doing this operation, so hopefully it will ease up and we can get this shit done. For now, I'm going to spend the rest of the day relaxing. Today is not a people day. I'm going to find particles and have the little dude keep me company. September 3rd, 2010 Dirty Harriet So much to catch up on. First of all, I'm writing, so you know I'm not dead, but that could have been very different. There is still a shit ton of undead loitering around town, and we got a stark reminder of that when me, Nate and Isaac rolled past the little retail park. There's a big B&Q, as you know, set at a right angle to a row of another six big units. We rolled past the main car park entrance set in front of all these units, and I heard Isaac swear in horror as we all looked left, crawling past the entrance at a low speed to keep engine noise minimal. The car park had well over 200 undead shambling aimlessly around. I don't know what happened there on the day the world died, but I'm guessing it went to absolute chaos in a snap. There were still many cars in the lot, but there had clearly been some accidents, maybe a minor bump or three, which devolved into violence. I'm guessing there were a few pedestrians run down as well, judging by how some of the cars are positioned. Well, we all know what happens as soon as one person dies, don't we? I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Multiply zombies to the power of... Oh, shit. Things must have spun out of control pretty rapidly, because let's not forget how fast these things twitch and sit up. Within ten seconds of death, the army of darkness begins to rise, and they get murderous, even as they're still lying down. It doesn't even look like any first responders managed to arrive on the scene. A few fights, a couple of accidents, suddenly there are five zombies, then that five bite and there are ten, then the ten bite and there are twenty, and so forth. Some cars looked abandoned, jammed in as they were, the doors still open from the passengers fleeing in panic. Well, murmured Nate, this looks like a bust. I shook my head. No, if you carry on to the next left, there's a smaller car park round the back for about 30 cars, which is also the delivery vehicle entrance to get round the back of the units. We'll be wanting to go in the back anyway. We're still going in, spluttered Isaac. Through that? He gestured with a disbelieving flick of his hand towards the scattered crowd of undead. 
Not through it, I corrected. Round and behind it. Isn't there somewhere else we can get the stuff? I don't know. Is there? I asked. Remember, we haven't got a fucking clue what your list even says. If you know somewhere that might have everything you need, then by all means tell us. Google's down at the minute, though, so you'll have to show us on a map. Isaac moved to respond, then thought better of it, clamping his mouth shut. Security is important, said Nate. If you can do what you say you can, we can't turn this opportunity down. He glanced past Isaac, sat in the middle seat, towards me. We'll have to go as quiet as we can for anything in there. Melee only. We'll take the Halligans. I nodded. I'd been practicing with the weight and heft of the weird spike tools, confident I could do the job. I still had the pick hammer as backup, but I hate braining undead up close. Crunching through skulls to puncture brains is bloody, filthy work. Gives me the shivers. Nate followed my direction, and we cruised round the bend, then into the smaller rear car park, which was blessedly empty. The electronics store was on the nearest end, so we pulled the truck behind the units to the service doors and swung it round so it was facing the right way, should we need to make a quick escape. There were about five undead milling round the back, employees judging by their coloured polo shirts, with logos emblazoned on the chests. They weren't all from the electronics store, but two were, marked by their bright red shirts. Nate surmised that wasn't a good sign. Both red shirts had chunks of flesh missing from their arms, suggesting they'd been bitten by undead and escaped back through the store and out back, where they had succumbed to blood loss, died, and started their undead patrol of the rear. Nate and I cleared the back of the units of those five monsters in quick order. So, I'd like to take a moment to extol the virtues of the fireman's halligan. Shit. That spike takes care of undead in a heartbeat. The weight of the tool behind that hardened spike makes it far too easy to punch through a brain. We dropped those monsters faster than a cut can bleed. It was the first time Isaac had seen me in action. He expected destructive power from Nate. The first time he'd seen the Terminator's granddad was when he was in full combat gear, face painted black, NVGs on his head, and loaded for a hot zone. I, however, was a tiny 5'6 woman in combats and Nikes, swinging a halligan and braining zombies like it was part of my daily routine. That was impressive, he bumbled, staring at me, with a look that was two parts amazement and one part horror. I swear, Isaac, if you add for a girl onto the end of that statement, I will pin your dick to the asphalt with this spike right here, right now. His guilty look said he was thinking it, but he at least had the grace to look ashamed. He won't think it again, or I'll make good on my promise. That dated thinking really grinds my gears. Once the dead were dealt with, we stacked up behind Nate as he quietly levered the tool end of the halligan between door and frame. Once it was deep enough, he gave it a fierce wrench and the door cracked away from the frame, revealing the gloom within. Nate switched on a flashlight attached to his tactical vest, keeping his hands free to grip the halligan, and nodded at us both before stepping into the darkness of the store. I followed just behind as backup, Isaac remaining outside until we cleared the building of any errant undead. Thankfully, there were just three. One of them had a different colour shirt to the two employees we'd brained outside, so I figured she was the manager of the store. The other two were either customers or just people that had sought refuge in the store when the car park apocalypse started. Judging by the bite wounds on them all, the refugees had brought the plague in with them, died, killed the manager, and bitten the other two employees, who managed to make their escape outside. There was a trail of congealed blood, dark and crusted, leading to the employee entrance from the main store. Detective Carter reckons those two we brained out back must have had arteries severed, bleeding out viciously as they tried to escape and getting no further than the store's rear before collapsing from blood loss. I'm going to take a minute out here before I continue with the tale. Everywhere we go, 
All we see is evidence of horrific, unhappy endings for everyday people, and I can't help but wonder what started all this. A biological weapon is out of the question. Nate was monitoring the news and radio in the early days before we met, and this was global, all going off at the same time. I doubt anyone could hit everywhere in the world, in every major town and city, and every little secluded farm or hamlet, with a biological weapon timed to perfection to go off on seven billion people. It's just not feasible. The same goes for a pandemic virus. That would start somewhere and roll outwards from ground zero. There would be time for many parts of the world to react with some degree of response. But this took everyone, everywhere, completely off guard. So, what's caused it? With all the logical explanations defied by the sheer scale and timing of this, in my mind it leaves only one alternative. This is not of this world. Okay, hear me out here. I don't mean aliens, because if there was a race from beyond the stars that could do this scale of global destruction, why do it in this manner? We'd have seen some sign of any such invaders by now. This is an extinction-level event, not a cull or a conquest. When I say, not of this world, I mean something else. What, I don't know, but all I can see in my mind's eye is the soul-burning hate of the living expressed by the dead in their blood-smeared features when you're up close with them. It goes beyond predator and prey, because a predator does what it does to survive. It's a means to an end. The undead, however, go almost feral when they're close to you, bearing their teeth in those deathly silent snarls of pure, undiluted hatred. It feels personal, somehow, like the living have committed the most heinous of crimes against the dead, and this is their vengeful uprising. I don't know. It's strange, but I can't help but feel like the dead are our judge, jury, and executioner, all packaged into glassy-eyed monsters that want to tear us from life as punishment for our sins. And let's face it, Humanity has a spectacular litany of sins to choose from. Okay, back to the recounting of our tale. It was an easy thing to take down the manager and her two undead cronies, baiting them to a ground of our choosing where we could dispatch them in short order. I took one, Nate expertly downed the other two. Then we dragged the bodies to one corner out of the way before retrieving Isaac. I've never seen anyone look so relieved to see me. When I appeared at the door and beckoned him in, he almost ran inside. Being on his own, looking at five head trauma zombie bodies, and knowing there were two hundred or more Zeds just the other side of the building, clearly it made him a bit edgy. The next half hour or so was a little nervy. The big glass front of the store gave Nate and I quite a view over the car park, which was at a slightly lower elevation to the storefronts. We had to keep mostly away from the glass, as there were undead milling about outside the shop fronts. The last thing we needed was to be noticed. In the beginning, Isaac was like a kid at Christmas in the store, scooting around the aisles and loading up a trolley like he'd just won the lottery. He even started comparing one brand with another, reading the boxes with a thoughtful expression, until Nate appeared like a phantom at his shoulder. His approach unseen, he spoke quietly, right next to Isaac's ear. Get a move on, was all he said. But poor Isaac almost shut a whole house, never mind a brick, when Nate breathed beside him. He soon got a move on. That's when shit started to go sideways. A bump drew our attention to the glass doors at the shop front. An undead woman had smacked against the glass like a pigeon, leaving a dirty smudge from the mass of filth and dried blood smeared around her face. Within seconds, two more were beside her, walking into the glass. Then three more. Then... Oh, shit. Nate started hurrying Isaac up. As I watched, more undead were drawn to the woman at the glass, as though she was tapping out a beacon signal with her face, calling them to battle. Beyond her, I could see the mass of undead in the car park all shifting position, aiming directly at the store, as though undead radio had issued a call to arms and their forces answered the signal. Um, Nate, 
I said, watching the scattered mass start to thicken and swell, ambling towards the store. I think we have a problem. Have you got all you need? demanded Nate. The urgency in his tone flustered Isaac, who became babbling about needing two of these and three of those. I don't give a fuck, Isaac, snapped Nate. Get what you need, double time, because once we leave, we're not coming back. Erin, grab your rifle. I didn't need telling twice. I scampered through the back of the store, snatched up my SA-80 and the spare magazines from the truck, which I shoved into the large pockets on the side of my combats, and headed back in. I was gone maybe forty seconds, but by the time I arrived back, the glass shop front was darkened by the press of undead. Holy fucking shit, I murmured. The pressure was increasing as Isaac frantically scooted around the aisles, throwing shit into the trolley, eyes constantly flicking to the building swell of undead at the glass front. The undead don't know pain. They have no need to breathe and are single-minded when it comes to their desire for causing death. As more undead pressed against those at the front, a crack appeared in one of the glass panels as their inexorable crush concaved the glass inwards. Lines raced along the glass, and we were only seconds from implosion. Isaac? Nate's voice was calm, but the slight inflection was enough to convey the urgency of the situation. Almost done, almost done, he babbled, panic starting to creep in. Breathe, dickhead, I said. Calm down and get your shit together. Eyes on the prize. We got your back. Isaac nodded, sucking in a calming breath as Nate glanced my way, a barely perceptible nod, his signal of approval. Honestly, I live for those moments. Nate's approval is so damn important to me, as he's the first person since Dean and Maria that's ever really had my back. The toughened glass weakened under the crush of bodies pressing against it, the lines snaking out across the massive panes in the main doors. Ten seconds, Isaac warned Nate. No more. I'm done, I'm done. As he swung the full trolley round in a 180 to head through the back of the store, the glass doors imploded inwards, and the first line of rushing undead gave us a little more time. As the glass gave way, all the undead at the front smashed teeth first into the floor as the pressure behind them flung them forward once the doors gave way. The monsters collapsed forward, creating a tangle of dead limbs that prevented a rush of undeath streaming through the large store towards us. Back through the door, said Nate, his tone still serene. I can't explain how much that helps in these situations. When that one person is keeping their head while the world around turns to shit, it's like a siren's call for calm. Their calm keeps you calm, as you know, this guy has the situation entirely under control. All you have to do is listen and keep your own head in the game. I, I can't, said Isaac then, panic creeping back into his tone. The trolley's too wide for the doorway. For fuck's sake, muttered Nate, eyes still on the undead as they awkwardly clambered to their feet. I glanced over my shoulder, confident Nate had the zombie situation monitored and saw what had Isaac so panicky. The trolley was indeed too wide for the normal-sized doorway and wouldn't go through. There was just no way any amount of banging and kicking would ram it through, as the cart was narrower at the front but widened, as most shopping carts do, towards the rear. Isaac, in his rush and terror to get to the truck, had ran at speed through the doorway and stopped dead as the trolley jammed solid. He looked up, eyes wild, as he glanced past me to the rising force of undead picking themselves from the floor, his mind frozen by terror. Erin? You know it's serious when Nate goes with my first name. Situation. Fucked, I said. You got this for now. Copy that. Slinging the rifle behind me, I did a dukes of hazard through the top of the doorway, gripping the doorframe with my fingertips and swinging through the half portal above the trolley to the hall beyond. I took a few steps back, then snapped forward with an almighty kick to the front of the cart, ramming it back out of the doorway. Run all of this by hand to the truck and throw it in the back, I said. Keep doing that as fast as you fucking can and tell us when you're on the last one. Isaac looked frazzled by the whole situation. Isaac! I snapped, punching him on the arm to shock him awake. He yelped and rubbed his arm, looking at me with accusation. Did you fucking hear me? Yes, I, I heard you. 
Then why the fuck are you still standing here like a village fucking idiot? And so began the rapid transfer of trolley to truck, just as Nate's rifle barked for the first time. Need a second shooter, Erin, he said, still ice calm. Copy that, I replied, feeling all military. I swear I caught the little flash of a grin from Nate as I replied. But my rifle was at my shoulder, my eyes down the iron sight, the action switched to semi, and off I went. I don't know how much time passed. I know it wasn't a lot, but it felt like an age. Nate was unerring, popping a melon every time. I wasn't so accurate, sometimes going too low and hitting the upper chest and neck, or too high and missing completely. Once they got closer, instead of right across the big store, my accuracy improved and I started dropping more of them. Reloading, I heard Nate say as I kept a steady rhythm of fire down range, and as Nate's rifle roared into life again, I clicked on empty. Reloading, I hollered, following his example. Always keep talking to your fire team, Nate says. You're a team, not a collection of individuals. When one reloads, the others lay down fire. But you can't do that effectively if there's no communication. We've worked in tandem a few times, but this was the first time I felt all of Nate's teachings mesh together in a live situation. But more than this, it was the first time I felt we were really a team, working in perfect unison, with constant communication. It was a fucking horrifying situation as the undead oozed into the store, and there was no way we could take them all before they closed the gap. But still, it felt like we were really partners for the first time, rather than the hardened soldier and his plucky recruit. It felt damn good. Isaac? I hollered back as I heard him pant behind me as he sprinted back to the trolley for the umpteenth time. Talk to us, they're getting closer. Have some patience, he squealed. I'm fucking things up as fast as I can. Both Nate and I snorted at that. The line itself was funny enough, but somehow the despairing high-pitched shriek it was delivered with made it hilarious. Anyone who subconsciously cracks a joke in the middle of a panicked situation is all right by me. My ears were ringing by this point. I'm pretty sure I'll have hearing loss in some form during this apocalypse. Gunfire is fucking loud anyway, but consistent gunfire indoors is like your eardrums being battered by sound. It's physically painful, and I was half expecting to feel blood run out my ears. Agonizing. Last one, wheezed Isaac. Clearly not an athlete. A few runs back and forth through the store's rear from cart to truck had him blowing out his arse. Tut tut. Cardio motherfucker. Go, ordered Nate. You drive, get the truck running, I'll follow. If that wasn't a symbol of Nate's inherent trust in me now, I don't know what is. He fucking hates my driving because I do it fast, he says. Personally, I think he's just a control freak who hates having someone else in control of the metal death machine he's riding in. But giving me the okay to drive when leaving a combat situation? That was real trust right there. He had enough faith in me to do what was right and get us all out alive. Moving, I called, so he knew I was leaving. And he slotted across as I went past him, taking slow steps backwards as he fired on the ever-closing tide of undead. I pushed Isaac along from behind as he was flagging, berating him to get a move on, until we emerged out into the light. Isaac dropped the last of the boxes into the truck's rear, almost falling against the vehicle as the last of his breath exploded out of his lungs. Just as I stepped out into the light, the crack of Nate's rifle echoing behind me, I screamed at Isaac to move. In his constant rush back and forth, his mind clouded by panic, he hadn't seen the single undead that had managed to potter around the edge of the building. It had been shuffling towards him for God knows how long, and it was only eight feet away, its lips already drawing back into its death snarl, silent and hate-filled, filthy claws already reaching out, ready to rend and tear. There was no time for the rifle, slung behind me as I'd been urging Isaac on. Instinct took over, and I reached for the glock at my hip, palmed it smoothly into my hand, raised the weapon, and pulled the trigger, all in one clean motion. Bang. Bullet to the head, one dead zombie that collapsed at our feet. 
Shit, I couldn't do that in one clean motion again if I tried. And I did try, later on back at the lodge. I tried to repeat the move and got the gun stuck in my holster, dropped it, threw it, fumbled like a dickhead with it. Out of 50 attempts, I probably managed it clean only three times. But in that moment, when it had to be done, I must have appeared like Dirty Harriet to Isaac as I stood there, barrel smoking, one hand on his shoulder still, from dragging him aside. I gifted him with a smile of swaggering satisfaction and holstered the weapon. Do you feel lucky, punk? I winked, feeling like a stone-cold badass. Now, pretty please, with sugar on top. Get in the fucking truck. Mutely, he nodded, running round the other side to climb in, while I jumped into the driver's seat and fired up the engine, dropping it into first gear and holding the clutch as I waited for Nate, left hand ready on the handbrake. Nate edged out of the doorway, still firing down the narrow hall, rapidly filling with undead as they squeezed into the space and oozed forward in one bloated, hungry mass. Not bothering with running round the vehicle, Nate simply jumped into the back of the truck and banged on the side. Take us home, Erin, he ordered. We're done here today. We made it home without any further issue, but we're going to have to find a new source of gardening supplies. That retail park is officially out of bounds, because as we drove past it on the way home from the main road, a swarm of undead were shuffling out of the B&Q as well. That's a big-ass hardware store, so there could be a shitload of undead in there for all we know. It's officially off-limits from here on in. I do know of a few garden centres in the local area that we could probably access on back roads, so they'll have to move up the priority list. That's for another day, though. We need to take stock and slow it down a little. Moments like the electronics store ramp up your adrenaline, and the crash that comes after is exhaustion like I've never known. I've done some crazy things on rooftops when free running, things that set my heart racing for their danger. But it doesn't even compare to the flood that goes through you in life-threatening combat. It's a soul-deep exhaustion when that leaves you. Nate is more used to it than I am, but the guy's still just over 50, so it gets to him more than it might have in the past. It wipes the shit out of me. All I want to do is lie down, maybe read a book, probably just sleep. I can't even write when that crash hits, which is why I always wait until the morning after to record the events. That's enough for today, I think. Pottering round the lodge today, I'm going to hang out with my golden girls, Freya, Maria and Nora. Those three are the best. September 5th. 2010. Katie. Tensions were running high until today. We've all been housebound, because for the last couple of days, the rain has been on and off. But when it does rain, it's absolutely battered down, and not the kind of weather you want to go scavenging in. Hmm, I don't like that word, actually. Scavenging, looting, they're such negative words, like we're raiding or plundering. Resource acquisition is more appropriate, but it sounds so snooty and formal. I need to find a better word for what me and Nate do. Sadly, I own the world's worst thesaurus. It's not just awful, it's awful. Shit, it's hard being this funny. What wasn't funny is the tension boiling in the lodge over the past few days. Alicia was a ball of traumatized rage, and of course we can all understand why but she's been handling her ordeal with hyper-aggression as a defense mechanism. On the flip side is Laura, who's little more than a phantom, silent and ethereal as she floats about the place in a daze. I guess we'd all hoped that the two of them would have some kind of bond and find strength in each other from their shared pain, but that's just not the case. Alicia wants to start an argument with everyone, especially the boys, while Laura doesn't want to speak to a soul, though Freya seems to be making progress. I've noticed that even though she's saying little, when we're all together to eat and plan, Laura plants herself next to Freya. My little dude Particles is also excelling as an emotional support dog, and today he managed to evoke the first flicker of a smile from Laura as he licked at her face excitedly. 
He's a smart cookie, that pug. Dogs rule. Everyone's been walking on eggshells around them both, giving them space. Even when Alicia is at her worst, she's being given a great deal of leeway, because none of us really know how to support someone who's been through what she has. Nobody feels they can say anything, because we haven't experienced what she has. Everyone's afraid of being cold or unfeeling, trying desperately to empathize with her plight. But we just don't know how to manage it. That all changed the moment her ire turned on Charlie. The kid is nine years old. He has a certain innocence that needs to be protected for as long as we can, because this world has already stripped much of it away. He's being kidnapped, seen the undead kill, had Bancroft's gun to his head, seen the corpses of men gunned down. Shit, he's seen more than any nine-year-old boy should ever experience. It's testament to Mark's solid parenting and Charlie's own fortitude that he's still a bright and happy kid, despite all the horrors this world has already thrown in his path. Rape and its aftermath, though. That's just something a boy his age just doesn't need to compute right now. He knew that women were captive and terrorized in some way. But the savagery of Bancroft and his men is one thing we need to shield him from right now. Bancroft's men hurt Alicia and Laura. That's the way Mark explained it to him. Charlie didn't need any more, and he accepted that explanation from his dad. Seeing Alicia angry at everyone, snapping at everything anyone might say, that gold-hearted kid decided that Alicia was hurt and angry and sad. He did what any kind-hearted child would do in that instance. He tried to give her a hug, bless his little heart. Don't touch me, snapped Alicia, forcibly placing her hand on Charlie's chest and shoving him backwards. Taken off guard, the poor kid stumbled backwards, planting to the kitchen floor on his ass. He put one hand on his chest where she had pushed him, looking up at her with the glisten of tears in his eyes. What the hell, Alicia? roared Mark, standing from the stool at the kitchen island and rushing to his son. What's your problem? Boundaries, she spat back. Shit, there was such venom in her tone. He needs to learn them. Or don't you teach your son how to treat women? It was a wholly unfair accusation. Mark is such a gentle guy. But Charlie is his whole world. If you want to wake the sleeping lion in our resident engineer, question his parenting or his beloved boy, and woe to you. He's a child, Alicia, bellowed Mark, kneeling beside Charlie and checking he was okay. He's nine years old and just wanted to give you a hug. I never asked for one or wanted one, she retorted. My space is my own. She was all in with her argument. I could understand her fury if it had been someone like Mark or Isaac breaching that personal space. But Charlie's a kid and doesn't understand what she's going through. He just knows she was hurting and wanted to make her feel better in the only way a loving child knows how. He's a child repeated Mark through gritted teeth. He just wants to help you. I don't want or need any help, she hissed. The poor woman was a bit unhinged, and she clearly wasn't dealing with processing her ordeal at all. While Laura's trauma manifested as emotional detachment, Alicia's roared in impotent fury. There was no getting through to her, it seemed, until a breakthrough came from the most unlikely of places. Enough, said Nate into the space between them, his voice flint hard. Enough, he repeated, this time more softly. Alicia, you can't do this alone. We don't pretend to know what you've been through, but Mark's right. Charlie's a kid, and what you just did was a step too far. And what do you know about what I've been through, Nate? she demanded. What makes you think you can say anything about it? The lodge was silent after Alicia's demand, everyone nervous as the issue was effectively brought out into the open, with everyone there. Nate doesn't say things without thinking them through, and I knew better than most what was coming. He was ordering his thoughts, 
letting the brief silence add a gravitas to what he was about to say. What came next blew my mind. Between 91 and 02, Sierra Leone endured an intense civil war. You may have seen it on the news, though a few of you probably would have taken no notice being too young. At the start of May 2000, British forces began a military intervention under the code name Operation Palliser. D Squadron of 22 Special Air Service was my unit. I knew it, I said, slapping the kitchen counter. I freaking knew you were special ops. Remembering myself as everyone turned toward me, I cleared my throat and magnanimously gestured at Nate. Please, continue, I permitted. Nate just raised one eyebrow before turning his attention back to Alicia. I saw some things and met some people who changed me during my time there, Alicia. Never have I met anyone with more strength, resilience, and incredible compassion than a woman named Katie. Nate's eyes focused entirely on Alicia, the whole room silent as they waited breathlessly, myself included. Katie was taken in the early part of the conflict in 92. At the age of 12, she was indoctrinated as a child soldier, an assault rifle put in her hands. Her brother was initiated as well. He was two years younger than her, at just ten. Only a year older than Charlie here. All eyes drifted to Charlie, all of us trying to imagine the horror of him having an AK-47 thrust into his hands and forced to fight. I couldn't do it. It went against everything a sane mind could comprehend. It was bad for her brother, Ahmad. But Katie's experience was much more harrowing, being a girl. He left that statement hanging, not saying it out loud to shield Charlie from the naked truth, but leaving no doubt in anyone's mind exactly what poor Katie endured. She was hurt by men in her own unit, given as a child wife to one of the commanders who was unpleasant to her. And when her little brother, Ahmad, tried to escape at the age of 12, he was captured and brought back to their encampment. My own breath quickened, fearing at what I was about to hear. It was far worse than I could have imagined. Katie was given an order. A heavy wooden club thrust into her hands and told to beat her 12-year-old brother to death in front of everyone as an example to what fate awaited traitors and cowards. She was fourteen, Alicia. Fourteen. She had been a child soldier that had killed grown men in war, had been physically assaulted repeatedly by her own so-called allies, forcibly addicted to opiates to keep her dependent and compliant, and then had to beat her own little brother to death with a club while everyone watched as he begged her for mercy. Jesus fucking Christ. My chest was hollow by this point, more so by the pain I heard in Nate's voice as he recounted the tale. I know him well enough now to see and hear those little nuances that tells me something has affected him, and this wound ran deep. He'd had this woman in front of him, telling him her story with her own words, seeing every flicker of emotion at the memories on her face. Christ, I'd be a bawling mess if someone told me their story with that much horror in it. My heart would absolutely bleed for them. Being forced to kill Ahmad was the straw that broke the camel's back, continued Nate, his voice impossibly soft. That was in 94, and she waited six years, nursing that trauma, forging bonds with those in the same situation as her, before she could make her escape. When our forces landed in Sierra Leone, she led a breakout of 13 other women, all taken as child soldiers, all with similar tales of heartbreak, and fled to the safety of our lines. She was only just 20, Alicia. So what? I'm just supposed to shrug all this off, demanded Alicia, though her voice had considerably less heat. Nate shook his head. 
You didn't let me finish, he chided gently. Five years ago, I received a letter from Katie. How did she get hold of you? I asked. Weren't you like super secret special ops? Nate nodded. Aye, but after I'd left the service, I found her on my mind often. That was my last year in 22 SAS, as 42 is the upper age limit. And in all my years of service through the Falklands, the Gulf, and other operations in Africa, Cady's story had a profound effect on me in a way no other had. I pulled some strings with old contacts to see if they could locate her and sent her a letter, just giving a P.O. box to return to. A faint smile touched his lips. And she returned it. And? Everyone in the room was wrapped by the tale. The war had been over for three years, and she had returned to her home village. Those women she liberated came with her and settled there, having no family to return to. Katie had married and given birth to a son. She was a prominent voice in her community and was growing into a political activist, working closely with UNICEF to extricate and rehabilitate children affected by war. That letter is my most prized possession. Alicia fell silent, the last of her heat cooled by Nate's story and calm demeanor. My point, Alicia, is that Katie didn't get there alone. She kept those women around her. They helped each other, and she allowed herself to be supported as well as giving support. She used that pain, not with anger or hate, but to try and force something positive out of a life destroyed by war picking up what pieces she could to bind back together into something new. Nate sighed then, looking tired and every one of his 52 years, both hands clasped around his coffee cup. Life is too great a struggle on the best of days, Alicia, if you try to do it alone. In our darkest hours, when the demons are at our door, we need to be able to call on someone to face them alongside us. The world is hard enough, especially now. But you need to understand that these people here, sitting around you now, are not your enemies. They will offer an arm to lean on when you feel weak, or a quiet presence to merely sit with so you're not alone, for those times you don't feel like speaking, or can't. He glanced at Freya then, giving her a little nod. This old dog sees way more than I give him credit for. What if I don't know how? Alicia's voice trembled, anger giving way to guilt as her eyes darted to Charlie. You're not a victim, Alicia, said Nate. Katie taught me that. She never wanted to be considered a victim and instead called herself a survivor. You had no control of what happened and you suffered, but you're here now. You survived. So, to start something new, first accept the end of what came before. Forget that victim's anger and find the survivor's strength I know you have. Both of you, he added, looking to Laura. And how do I get there? asked Alicia. You start walking away from where you are. Profound stuff, right? But I had a question that needed answering. Um, Nate, I asked innocently. Did you just quote Winnie the Pooh? The quirk of a smile at one side of his mouth revealed the truth. Busted, he said, finally breaking into a rueful grin. Everyone snorted or chuckled, shattering the tension. This ferocious old soldier, who they'd all seen in his terrifying glory during their liberation when he was geared to the max, suddenly became human to every single person in the lodge. His calm words, the intensity of his story, and advice that pierced through Alicia's rage, then the absurdity of this ferocious veteran of countless conflicts dropping a Winnie the Pooh quote, all combined to humanize him completely. Finally, the rest of the lodge had seen a glimpse of the Nate I knew. They got to see the man himself, not just the fearsome instrument of violence they'd all perceived him as. 
Nate went to his room and produced that very letter from Katie, which was passed around and read by all. Reading it as a group somehow managed to fuse us all that little bit closer, asking questions of Nate, hearing him tell how inspiring he found that meeting with Katie and how much it affected him. I keep discovering depths to Nate that amaze me. When called to arms, he's an absolute powerhouse, calm and controlled, lethal in the execution of his actions. He's experienced things that none of us have, and they've affected him to his core. But under that fearsome granite shell of his, pumps a big squishy heart full of empathy and humanity. He's seen humans at their worst, yet somehow he comes out better than before because of it. Honestly, at times, I'm in awe of him. Things have been calmer since that happened yesterday. Alicia apologized to Charlie, and the kid got to give that hug he offered. This time, Alicia accepted it gladly and with a little smile on her face. She also offered her apologies to everyone, who just waved them away, accepting her with proverbial open arms. These are good people, and I'm glad we liberated them from the awful situation they found themselves in through no fault of their own. But can I just point out, Nate was SAS. I fucking knew it. Called it bitches. Evil be to him. Connor Bancroft leaned his head back against the rough brick wall, jaw clenched against the burning pain in his belly, coughing as thick smoke scratched at his throat. Hot blood slicked his fingers as they pressed to the wound in his midriff, before snorting a dark chuckle at the futility of it. His brother's surviving minions had fled the scene when Connor went down, making a single push to extract him, but their enemy had been waiting for such an attempt. One thundering crack of the stolen rifle later, and Sean dropped, the bullet smashing through center mass. The bullet didn't kill immediately, but Connor heard the man sucking desperately for air, choking and wailing for help in the thick smoke, crying like a baby for his mother. The remaining men had cleared out then, petrified of the demon sniper that had terrorized them. No help was coming. Panic had erupted over the radio from their designated QRF as a second sniper assaulted them, attempting to exit the house grounds. The relief force was not coming, and he had been abandoned by the men he was forced to lead into this expertly laid ambush. Even if their nurse was brought to the scene now, there was no fixing this wound. Connor had seen enough on active service to know when a wound was mortal. The only question to be answered was when he would die. Connor surmised the sniper's victims were rising from the dead, considering the frenzied change in pitch of Sean's screams. No, he wailed, shrill with terror. Get the fuck away! Screaming in horror and agony for only a few seconds longer, Sean's dying wails went silent, replaced by the wet grind of jaws in his flesh. Not long now, then, thought Connor. Sean would rise to join the damned, then he and the feasting undead would find Connor's dying form a mere twenty feet away. His end would be filled with white eyes, crimson teeth, terror, and pain. The Glock was too far away for him to end it himself, having spun from his hand as the bullet tore through his abdomen. The rifle was empty, having blasted fully automatic suppressing fire towards where he thought the sniper was. Trying to move to better cover, he had drawn his pistol to keep a barrage of fire, with no time to reload on the run. But their enemy was too good, having already displaced to another window in a different building. That had only been possible with expert preparation, making a portal between the two shooting positions through the internal walls. The whole ambush was perfectly laid, and despite a tempest of bullets fired from the men under his command, the sniper never stopped moving, taking another man or two down while they were still firing at his old location. Whoever this Nate was, Connor had never seen his like. He was intelligent, prepared, 
and lethal in his execution. Connor had been firing at the wrong place when the enemy rifle cracked again, and a storm of agony erupted low in his guts, the glock spinning from nerveless fingers as he collapsed. He cried out as he was hit, and then dragged himself into the cover he had been running for. Now, he was without a weapon, dying, and only a short hop from one undead that was about to become two. Resigned to his fate, he sighed, lamenting his brother's madness, and he hoped Caleb would be okay. Connor had never wanted any part of his father's criminal enterprise. The military had been his escape from Harry's dark shadow. But when his deployment in Iraq ended in April 2009, he returned home out of concern for his youngest brother, Caleb. As the eldest, and cut from the same soiled cloth as their father, his brother Jamie was left in control of the family business after Harry Bancroft had been locked up two years earlier. Connor never wanted to be a part of their way of life, but concern for Caleb inevitably pulled him back into the dark folds of the Bancroft legacy. Johnny was a brainless thug, and Jamie had always craved power and control. But Caleb was an intelligent kid, introspective and thoughtful, who had dreams of a career in medicine. All Connor wanted was the chance for Caleb to follow his own heart and make a new life for himself away from the drugs and perpetual violence that formed the foundations of the Bancroft name. When Caleb passed his A-levels in 2011 and started thinking about university, Connor would fight to give him that life with everything he had, no matter if it came to blows with his father and Jamie. Even if it meant Connor swore his allegiance to the Bancroft criminal legacy, using all the skills he had learned in service to his country and go against everything he believed in, he would. He would sacrifice his own honor, his own life, to give Caleb the chance at happiness and something resembling a normal future. June 23rd changed everything. In the first three days of the chaos, Connor refused to participate in the mass of kidnappings Jamie ordered. He would defend their home against the living and the dead, but Flat refused to steal people from their homes or the streets. The arguments between the two older Bancroft boys were heated and fierce, ignited when Jamie had sent men to steal the young boy, Charlie, to ensure their maintenance contractor stayed to keep their home in good order. The IT guy, Isaac, was ripped from his home office by armed men. A nurse was taken from the streets on the second day in an opportunistic capture. And even the old lady from the nearby farm, were all brought to their house and forced into servitude. When pretty young women in their twenties were locked into a harem to keep Jamie's men entertained through the inevitable hardships to come, Connor had started planning an exit strategy that would allow him to get his younger brother clear of all the madness. Jamie had often had his people lay a beat down on rapists. It was a weird fork in the road of his twisted code that crimes against women, especially crimes of assault in any form, were treated with pitiless wrath. The enforced enslavement and prostitution of the women was so far from Jamie's usual eccentric morality, Connor knew something had broken in his brother. He doubted if it could ever be repaired, and Connor had no interest in trying to fight that battle. He knew the hearts and minds of those loyal to Jamie would never be swayed. They were simple and greedy men, all violent bullies without a shred of human empathy. To a man, they were black-hearted sheep who needed a shepherd, but one that would feed their lust and greed. And Connor was not that man. Despite his distaste for Jamie's actions, he was still his brother. He was raised in the looming shadow of Harry Bancroft, an old school gangster who valued strength and loyalty to family above all other tenets. Jamie had always been the heir apparent as the eldest, groomed to one day sit upon their black throne, and as such was entirely the product of their father. That hardened personality had been nurtured through the years as their father's method of preparing him to lead the family and continue the legacy. 
But even Harry Bancroft would not have stooped to the depths that Jamie had in the first month of the world's end. Connor still could not believe Jamie had fallen so far himself. He had always been ruthless and uncompromising, but there was a darkness to him now that Connor had never seen before. Even growing up, when the two older brothers had fought like teenage boys do, there was never anything beyond normal sibling rivalry, no extra spark of malice that foreshadowed such a drastic change. He and Jamie would laugh about their fight a few days later, and all would be forgotten. Life would go on. Since June 23rd, though, something in Jamie had died. Or more accurately, it felt like something darker had awakened within him. Jamie was still there in flashes at the start, but that part Connor knew so well had been growing ever more distant, and the former soldier wondered how long it would be until his brother was no more, and all that remained was the cruel and malicious darkness that choked what little light was left. For all the burgeoning darkness that seemed to be consuming Jamie, Connor had still loved him. He was still his big brother, and in the beginning he could never entertain the thought of harming family, that was one of his father's teachings that the former soldier did agree with. Instead, Connor chose to direct his efforts towards redeeming his brother, to right the course he was steering from. Whatever progress he might have made, however, died the same day as Johnny. A month into the world's end, the third of the Bancroft brothers was killed while on a supply scouting mission with some of his moron friends, Johnny had been given one of the many Glocks, but his six idiot minions were armed only with a selection of melee weapons. Connor was mystified why Jamie had allowed their younger brother to go out, into the undead infested world, without adequate protection, and had only discovered this fact an hour after leaving. The choice to inadequately arm their brother and his crew had been fatal in the extreme. After finding out what happened to Johnny, Jamie had killed one of his brother's companions in a frenzied explosion of violence, beating the man to death with the butt of his chromed three fifty seven revolver. While Connor comforted Caleb at their brother's death, Jamie was consumed by a rage so white and hot it seared anyone in his proximity. From that moment, all Jamie's efforts were directed to finding the two responsible, a man in his fifties, and a woman known to Johnny and his morons called Lockie, though they had no idea of her real name. The woman had called the older man Nate. Whoever Nate was, he was a crack shot. Johnny had been put down by two clean shots in rapid succession, one in center mass and a follow-up shot almost perfectly between the eyes. It was certainly not the work of any amateur, instead signifying someone with an abundance of both training and experience. Jamie was impossible to reason with after Johnny's death, as a single goal consumed him every hour of every day. Vengeance. Jamie sent three men out, all armed with scoped rifles from their preciously small stock, to watch key roads through town from elevated positions, desperate for any sign of Johnny's killers. Each was given the instruction to take them alive, if possible, as Jamie wanted their deaths to be long and loud at his own hand. But if not, then ending them would suffice. Take no chances, Jamie had ordered. You see any vehicle that isn't ours, any vehicle at all, then you open up and stop it. Connor had been incensed by the call, arguing against firing on any potential innocents, they should have been fighting the dead, Connor roared, not the living. Until those two fuckers are dead at my feet, Jamie hissed. There are no innocents. Three days later, the call finally came that one of the men had the pair pinned down, having disabled their vehicle. He had them trapped on the main road running between the shopping center and court building, and they had nowhere to go. Steve Briggs had led the QRF in response, the only other former military man in Jamie's employ. Connor had no love for Briggs, as he had taken to the criminal life with gusto, enjoying being the big man in a little pond of amateur thugs. 
When Briggs's hastily assembled QRF arrived on the scene, there was a raging fireball in the road and a massive gathering of undead at the foot of the court building, preventing any further investigation. But there was no sign of Jamie's man or the odd pair they were hunting, and things only got worse from there. For the next few days, Jamie had ordered three vehicles, each with four armed men, to patrol the town in search of Lockie and Nate. The radio was constantly afire with Jamie demanding updates, screaming at the incompetence of their inability to locate Johnny's killers, even as he said how imperative it was they were caught before the fuel run had to be made. He threatened to keep those bitches locked up so tight you'll have to fuck each other if no results were forthcoming in the near future. Jamie was erratic, uncharacteristic of the man before all this madness. Always cold and calculating and cunning like a fox, the stark change into this wild demon, thirsting for bloody vengeance while abandoning all sense and reason, was a visceral transformation not lost on Connor, nor on Caleb. What's wrong with him, Con? Caleb asked after the third unsuccessful day of patrols. The hunted pair were ghosts, though Connor assumed they were simply living away from the main town. Likely, they were sufficiently supplied to wait for the heat to die down some before venturing out again, though getting Jamie to listen to any kind of logic was virtually impossible. When the patrols had returned before dark, the last to arrive without news of success sent Jamie into a spin. Without thought or hesitation, needing a release for the murderous rage rising like bile within him, he pulled out the 357 and disintegrated the skull of the man unfortunate to deliver news of their failure. The murder appeared to soothe his near debilitating fury, an aura of calm appearing to settle around him as the headless corpse collapsed to the earth. But the sudden violence had shocked Connor and Caleb to their core. I don't know, little brother, Connor had answered honestly. Ever since the world died last month, I think our brother died that day as well. What do you mean? Connor had pressed two fingers to each temple, trying to soothe the pulse of pain growing there. It's like I don't know him anymore, Caleb, he sighed. He's lost somewhere, and I can't reach him. It's like... He shrugged, struggling to articulate the hollow void in his heart where his brother once lived. I don't know, Caleb. Like he's been possessed by something. Every day, I'm finding it more difficult to see our big brother in there, you know? Caleb seemed to war with himself for a moment, then took a deep breath, reaching behind him to pull something from the back of his jeans. Connor stared in horror at the black Glock 17 the boy held in his hand. He gave me this yesterday, whispered Caleb, eyes fixed on his brother. Said it was time to sack up and be a man and do what's right for our family. Connor's own fury ignited at the combination of Caleb's words and the sight of his little brother holding a firearm. Caleb dreamed of being a healer, not a killer, and Jamie knew it. It was a bridge too far, and Connor started to rise from his seat. I'll- No, interrupted Caleb, a flash of fear racing through his blue eyes. He shook his head, reaching his other hand out to grasp Connor's forearm and stall him. No, Con, don't. I know what you're going to do, but you can't. You can't go at him for this, not now. He's not right, Con, and I'm worried about what he would do. The threat of tears polished his sapphire-colored eyes to a shine. Because you're right, I don't know who he is anymore either. And you saw him when he shot Alec in the face, right? He didn't even think about it, and afterwards he seemed happier. Caleb did not resist the shudder that visibly ran through him. We've just got to keep our heads down, Con. We've got to find a way out of this. Two days later. War was declared. Six men died, two SUVs were lost, 
and weapons and ammunition stolen when the now infamous pair struck the next fuel run to the nearby petrol station. Only the maintenance man, Mark, returned with a small tanker truck when Briggs led a QRF and prevented the pair from interrogating the engineer. Mark sported a fierce black eye after Nate had struck him with the butt of the rifle. Briggs had walked the scene, and it was only further proof that the older man had military training. His use of ammunition with the rifle stolen from the sniper of the court building roof was minimal and efficient, every shot finding its mark with unerring accuracy. The woman had baited them into the trap, and the old soldier had executed their four pursuers with assured ease. The two remaining behind with Mark had then been ambushed by this Nate fellow. Clinical, efficient, lethal. Whoever this Nate was, he knew what he was doing, that much was certain. Everything had gone silent for a full week. Realizing his rage over the radio might have clued the pair into the fuel run, Jamie's volcanic rage turned to a glacial ice, which made being in his presence difficult and uneasy, as though he stood on the edge of murder and the slightest nudge would push him over the edge. Connor and Caleb steered clear of their brother as much as possible, until Jamie called them both to a meeting a week after the disastrous fuel run. One by one, Jamie moved through the channels on the radio, waiting for a response before moving up, until finally, Nate responded. The woman must have snatched up the radio, though, because a barrage of bizarre statements, delivered in a fake American accent, came over the airwaves in a stream. None of them expected such an unorthodox response, and it threw Jamie off completely, as every demand for respect was met with an ever-increasing level of mockery, until Jamie's ice-cold demeanor evaporated in an explosion of incandescent rage. He smashed the handset into the table repeatedly, streams of profanity flowing from his lips, until the radio was little more than shards. This is what she wants offered Connor warily, seeking to damn the torrent of murderous fury. Don't let her get under your skin. As Jamie turned his gaze towards him, Connor's breath caught in his throat. Madness rippled across the blighted stare of his brother, and for a heartbeat, the former soldier's instincts came into sharp focus. For that brief flicker in time, he sensed a real and genuine threat from Jamie. Get me another radio! He snapped at Brody, one of his captains. Connor exhaled a long breath of relief through his nose, heart hammering as Jamie's eyes turned from him. When the new handset arrived, Jamie pulled in a calming breath, switched to the channel, and spoke in a calmer manner. Listen to me, you little bitch. Are you still there? For the next two minutes, Connor struggled to retain his composure, fighting for a neutral expression as the airwaves were filled with the tranquil music of whale song. What the fuck is up with this little whore? hissed Jamie through clenched teeth. Is she fucking retarded? Connor said nothing, not trusting himself to open his mouth without laughing. They all waited in silence as whales sang their soothing melody over the radio, while Jamie pinched the bridge of his nose and closed his eyes, jaw muscles flexing as he ground his teeth, and his other hand drummed impatient fingers on the table. There, boys and girls, said the woman eventually, affecting a feather-soft tone like a primary school teacher to a group of five-year-olds. Don't we feel all relaxed and calmer now? To his credit, this time Jamie left the handset where it was, remaining in his vexed pose. It was almost two minutes before he answered. The woman was less bizarre in her communication, but no less cutting. Her casual wit and mockery punched through Jamie's need for control like a laser-guided missile, striking at the heart of his defenses. Not once in the conversation was Jamie ever at an advantage, and eventually he was forced to withdraw, unable to intimidate the young woman. Even with threats of throwing her to his men to be abused, a menacing oath that only emphasized just how far his brother had fallen, the woman, named Lockie, appeared utterly immune to any of Jamie's attempts to frighten her. Jamie placed the handset down with more care than he needed to, 
before standing and inhaling a long, frustrated breath. A single, sharp punch to the tabletop was his only sign of anger as he left the room, defeated by the unknown woman and her ridiculous lack of care for the threat he posed. That had been a week ago. With fuel reserves at a low ebb because of the ambushed supply run two weeks earlier, they had no choice but to try again. This time, Jamie had demanded Connor lead the protection detail with Briggs, taking the best of their men to ensure Mark could fill the tanker without incident. At first, Connor refused, wanting no part of the war. But then Jamie's fall was finally complete, and Connor knew that his brother was beyond redemption. You will, Connor. You will lead the protection of this fuel run, if you want Caleb to remain safe. Connor gaped in open horror at his brother's statement. Jamie, are you threatening me with the safety of our brother? I'm saying that we're all going to suffer if we don't resupply this time, replied Jamie, eyes fixed to Connor's, his gaze as crisp and cold as morning frost. Caleb included. It was an oily response, avoiding direct threat against their younger sibling's safety. But the insinuation was sharp and distinct. You'll do what I want, or I will hurt Caleb. Whatever the cost after the supply run was done, Connor would end this. They did need the fuel, but when they returned, Jamie was done. Johnny had brought about his own downfall, of that Connor was sure. The third of the four brothers was a dim-witted bully, and Connor grieved his loss as any brother should. But he knew Johnny. When Lockie had relayed his threatening intention towards her in the radio conversation a week earlier, Connor was not surprised. Nate was merely defending the honor of his friend against a threat, and given Johnny the chance to walk away. As much as it broke his heart, having already lost one brother to this madness, Connor knew Jamie had to go, and he would have to be the one to do it. He needed time to formulate his coup, and would begin planning on their return. Maybe then he could parley with this ferocious odd pair and form a truce of some distinction. The living had to fight the dead, not each other. Instead of planning a coup, however, Connor now sat leaning against a wall, a bullet in his guts, and two undead just feet away. Nate had taken the first man down from a high balcony in an apartment block just behind a row of terraced housing opposite the petrol station, then arced a makeshift smoke bomb, apparently made from newspaper and wrapped in duct tape, down into the road between the station and houses blocked off by their transport vehicles. Thick white smoke had soon shrouded the area, and just as they got eyes on his position, another bullet smacked into a man to Connor's left. Nate had waited for them to get set, out of their vehicles, marked to start cranking the fuel into the tanker, and let them all settle into the notion that things would remain serene. He had waited a good ten minutes for them to get in the swing of their operation before firing the first round, lighting his makeshift smoke bomb and tossing it from his elevation into their midst. Ambush, roared Connor into the radio. Dispatch QRF, now! He didn't hear any reply as he and Briggs, both armed with variants of the SA-80 that had full auto instead of burst, unleashed a storm of bullets to suppress the enemy and keep his head down. But the sniper had already displaced. Both former soldiers ejected their empty magazines and reloaded, raising their weapons and searching for the enemy, but finding the bullet perforated balconies empty. Less than a minute later, another bullet took a man clean through the heart as they searched for the shooter, coming at a more oblique angle from the initial firing position. The sniper was now partially flanking them at a lower elevation than his initial strike, but their vehicles no longer offered sufficient cover from his attacks. The wily old bastard had likely repelled at speed from the apartment block, entering the rear of one of the terraced buildings opposite them, but at a wider angle and closer distance. 
three were dead in no time at all, and as only he and Briggs had any real experience at working under fire, the rest of the men were shouting garbled things at each other in panic, demanding to know where the shooter was, what should they do, where should they fire, and all crashed together in a cacophony of confused mayhem that meshed with the rattle of two SA-80s emptying their magazines as Connor and Briggs opened up to suppress again. They fired even as they combat walked, aiming for nearby cover that would protect them from the shooter's new angle of fire. Bullets riddled the face of the small terraced housing opposite the petrol station, shattering glass and ricocheting both inside and outside the building. Chips of brick, puffs of plaster dust, and splinters of wood clouded the house fronts and interior as sixty rounds ravaged the area they thought the sniper was firing from. The other men, in a panic, simply followed where the two ex-soldiers had fired, blasting off round after round from rifles, pistols, and shotguns in a tempest of thundering lead, desperately trying to end the ghostly assault of their hidden assailant. Fucking amateurs, cursed Briggs aloud at them. Another shot clipped one of the shotgun-wielding men in the hip, shattering the man's pelvis and eliciting a lung-shattering scream of pain and panic as he collapsed in the thickening smoke. Again, a change of angle, and Connor cursed. The man had multiple firing positions predefined and concealed movement between them. It was a nightmare. There was nothing a soldier hated more than a skilled enemy sniper that had carefully prepared his area of operation. Every move could be their last as the killer moved in shadows, those under fire never knowing where the monster would emerge next, or what cover was even viable. As his rifle clicked dry, and with no time to reload the awkward bullpup rifle on the run as he sprinted for cover, Connor slung it to his back, drew his glock, and started firing at where he thought Nate would be. Then the bullet ripped through his guts, a roar of pain tearing from his throat as his legs collapsed beneath him and the glock fell from his grip. It skidded away across the rough asphalt. The metallic smell of his own blood mingled with the pungent aroma of discharged ammunition and the sense scratching cloud of thick smoke from the sniper's makeshift smoke bomb. I'm hit, he cried out in reflex as he dragged himself the last few feet round the corner of a building. Sean tried a courageous run to Connor's aid, ending in a bullet from the accursed gunman. But as soon as he went down, Briggs gave the order to retreat. Bastard. The radio chatter was filled with the panic of the QRF that had been hit on their exit from the grounds of his home, and no support was coming. The survivors, however many that might be, bundled into their vehicles, along with Mark in the tanker, and made their escape leaving Connor alone with only the undead for company. And Nate. One, two, three, four. Clean, efficient, unerring. The enemy rifle barked again and again, but this time its targets were not the living, but the shambling undead. Connor turned his head to see the dark silhouette of his killer phase through the dispersing smoke, the makeshift bomb all but burned out. His walk was a glide, smooth and steady, in perfect balance as he squeezed off single rounds to put Jamie's men down for a second time. Satisfied the area was clear of undead, Nate turned to see Connor staring in his direction, hands pressed to the belly wound, and turned the barrel towards him. Unarmed, wheezed Connor, gesturing to the Glock lying in the road with his head. Rifle's empty, and I've not got long left anyhow. He sighed. Before you do what you have to, a word? Nate emerged out of the smoke, and Connor saw him for the first time. The man was early fifties, but he still looked in peak physical condition. His dark hair was likely kept short, but was starting to lengthen at the top and sides, revealing a sprinkling of silver dusting. Brown eyes, so dark they seemed black from a distance, stared back at him, looking him over, ignoring a slight cut above one eye where a chip of stone or ricochet must have caught him in the barrage. 
It was a nasty scratch on any other day of the week. But in comparison to the hell he had unleashed upon Connor and his men, it was insignificant. Infantrymen, First Royal Regiment of Fusiliers, declared Connor. Two tours of Iraq, last one just over a year ago. He coughed, wincing at the stab of pain in his abdomen. Nate's expression softened, and he lowered the barrel of his rifle, though it was still ready. Royal Marine Commando and a stint in 22 SAS, he replied. Shit, mused Connor. Even his fucking voice has power. Knew you were more than just a grunt, he chuckled, a wry shake of his head. He leaned his head back again with a sigh. Nate, is it? The man nodded once. Connor Bancroft. Connor half expected his world to end the moment his name was heard, but Nate remained unmoved. I'm sorry all this shit had to go down, Nate. He gave my brother Johnny a chance to walk away, and he didn't. That's on him. Nate sighed and slung the rifle behind him, stepping a little closer and going to one knee, though his right hand rested on the glock at his hip. We're just trying to survive, Connor said Nate. Your older brother is making that difficult. He wasn't always this bad, I swear, sighed Connor, closing his eyes for a moment. Something changed in him the day the world started dying, Nate. Day after day, I've seen the dark rising, snuffing out the last of his light. He opened his eyes again, turning his head to face the former Marine. I've been trying to pull him back. The captives, the women, the violence. I fought against it all, Nate. I've tried, I really have. But he's wandered into the dark too far, and now, now he's lost. Nate absorbed the information in silence, dark eyes fixed to Connor's face. You know, after this fuel run, I was going to try a coup on my own brother. For the first time, a flicker of surprise appeared on the warrior's grim features. You were? Shitty look, huh? He replied with a black laugh. I wanted to make peace with you after this fuel run, but had to find a way to take him down while getting his people on side. I guess that plan's down the shitter now, though, eh? Connor's eye twitched as another stab of pain thrust through his abdomen. And now? Now? There's no chance for peace now, Nate, he said with genuine regret. There's only one way it ends now, Marine. He fell silent for a moment. I know I've no right, but... Can I ask one favor of you? You can ask, can't promise anything. Fair enough. My youngest brother, Caleb. He's 17, and I was trying to get him out of the life before everything went to shit. The boy wants to be a doctor, Nate. He's not like the rest of the family. He's a good kid, with a good heart. So... When you and Jamie eventually butt heads, if you come out the other side, all I ask is you take the kid in. Don't judge him by his family name. He's never had a life of his own. And even in this shitty world of shitty living and shitty undead, I want that for him. Nate's expression relaxed. I'll do my best. On that you have my word, brother. Connor smiled at that, fond memories of being amongst his brothers in arms in the sandbox. You know what the Fusilier motto is? Nate shook his head. Evil be to him who evil thinks. At least, that's what it is when you translate it from the French. Connor sighed, feeling himself weaken even as he spoke. Something evil is in Jamie, Nate, and 
I don't think it's ever coming out. Then I'll make sure to put it down. Connor nodded, sucked in a painful breath, then looked Nate in the eye. I don't fancy becoming one of those things. So, if you wouldn't mind doing the necessary. Nate nodded and stood, drawing the pistol from his hip. Good luck, Nate, he said, his voice little more than a whisper. And look after my kid brother, yeah? On my honor. Relief swept through Connor, tugging his mouth into a faint smile of hope that Caleb would be okay before closing his eyes. I'm ready. He never heard the gunshot. September 7th, 2010. I'm sorry, you're what? You know, when I copied over my first entries onto this laptop, I mourned the loss of my full English breakfast all over again. I would do questionable things for a fry up right about now. I miss bacon. I miss eggs. I miss bread. But Nora says she can make bread if we get her the ingredients. God, I love Grandma Nora more with each passing day. She can churn butter as well, if we can procure her the stuff. And, well, if we had a cow. We need to get a farm up and running. I mean, seriously. I would do just about anything for a bacon and egg butty right about now. I'm not built to be vegetarian, and the closest thing I can be to a carnivore right now is eating spam or corned beef from a can. Well, yesterday morning, I mentioned my carnivorous hankerings to Nora, and fuck me backwards, she dropped an absolute pearl of an idea. There's a National Trust place about ten miles from here called Dunham Massey, it has a deer park, where visitors can go and see the nice big house, and deer roam in the grounds. Nora and her husband were big National Trust members, visiting all these protected grand old houses in their grounds. Deer park. Lots of deer. Now, I've never had venison. It's not something that comes across my table, as Mackie D's never did a McBambi burger, but I'd eat a pigeon straight off the bone if I could get my hands on one right now. Nora and Nate chatted about it, because of course both the oldies have dressing and butchering skills. One for survival training, one because she's a badass frontiers woman. So they agreed it would be a good use of time and fuel. We need salt too, and lots of it, because salt was apparently the devil to the spiritual bellends who resided here. I mean, didn't they know that without salt we'll die? The human body needs it. Not much, but some. Anyway, if we can get salt and a small chest freezer, because Grace and Theo didn't bloody freeze anything, it was all made fresh. Mark's done a thorough once-over of all the electrics, consumption and all that jazz, and says if we have a small one, it shouldn't be too great a drain on the power. So, we could hunt meat, kill meat, skin meat, eat fresh meat, cure meat, and fricking freeze meat for later consumption. This is officially my number one priority. Everything else can get bent. Salt, freezer, meat. Om nom nom. Mark says Bancroft has just the one we need in his house, and we could double up the journey by uninstalling the fuel generators from Castle Bancroftstein. I like this name, get over it, and bringing them back to the lodge. Mark can wire them in as backups, but before we do that, we're going to need to build some kind of soundproofed container for them. When they're running, they make quite a bit of noise, so they need to be dampened before we can use them, as we don't want it pulling the undead in like a lodestone. Shitting hell. The list of things we need and jobs we have to do is just accelerating. So, I had to have the conversation with Nate. We need to train some more shooters, Nate, I said. We can't do everything between the two of us, and we need to start taking more hands out to work to gather resources. If we're bringing extra hands, they should be active and not just have the two of us pull sentry all the time. Much to my surprise, he simply nodded. Aye, I know. Mark's got a cool head and he'll take it seriously, because it allows him to protect his son. Now that Alicia has cooled off, I'm willing to see how she fares. 
Those two are the only viable candidates at the moment. Maria might be a good fit as well. Maria? You're thinking of training a nurse to use a weapon intended to kill? Nate shrugged. I'd say a medical professional could be more effective than most. Who better to know just where to put that bullet? Hmm, fair point, I conceded. But I know Maria, and she doesn't like violence at all. She's a healer and a carer. I can't see her toting a handgun. Nate conceded and let the matter lie. Nora won't be going out into the field, but she already knows how to use a shotgun if things get weird here. Pfft, of course Nora knows how to use a shotgun. She's probably got a secret pair of nunchucks under her bed as well to go with a kung fu black belt. Laura's nowhere near ready for a weapon. We'll leave her in Freya's care for now. That leaves Isaac. Nate raised an eyebrow, replying in a dry tone. Because he performed so well under pressure the first time he was in the field? Well, admittedly it wasn't his finest moment getting a trolley jammed in our only exit, then nearly getting eaten by the world's slowest shambling zombie that he should have seen on at least four of his trips to the truck. I stopped and pursed my lips. Yeah, maybe he's not ready right now. They're not like you, Erin, he said. It was an offhand throwaway statement, said without really thinking, and it completely caught my attention. What do you mean? Realizing what he'd said, Nate simply sighed and shrugged a kind of, ah, well, fuck it, gesture. You drive me up the wall with your fast mouth, kid, he said, though his tone was not unkind. One might even suggest it was affectionate. But you keep your shit together far better than I've seen some soldiers in the field achieve. You act, sometimes recklessly, but the only time I've ever seen you freeze was when we found that rodent. He's a pug, Nate, I said. When we found that rodent in the farmhouse. When his former owner surprised you, that was the only time I've seen you freeze on the spot. And you've never done it since. You take it all in your stride, Erin and you've seen things you should never have seen. We both fell quiet for a moment, the memories of the apartment block trying to force their way back in. I shoved that door shut and stuck a mental chair under the handle. Despite all that, he continued, you keep going, always trying to make others laugh, always trying to get on my nerves to make yourself laugh. I hate how well he knows me now. You have the mental strength to deal with all of this bullshit. Whether that's because you looked after yourself for most of your life, I don't know. But you've got the mental and emotional tools to keep going. I'd never heard so many words of open praise from Nate before. His approval was always a nod or a smile or the mere snatch of a statement. Hearing him extol all these virtues with regards to little old me was staggering. And then he dropped a piece of pure, solid gold. You know, I'm actually quite proud of you. Not going to lie, I actually teared up at that. The only people who ever said they were proud of me were Dean and Maria, on how I turned my shit around from the dumbass girl who used to steal and joyride cars. I got my GCSEs, and they were proud. I got my A-levels. And they were proud. Then I went to university, got fucking leathered as I parted for three years, yet still managed to scrape a second in my degree and got to wear the silly board and gown as I received my diploma. Even as I trembled at the mass of student debt accrued in those three years, they were still fucking proud. Mind you, all debts are off now, eh? Nate was partly right. I'd done most of it myself, but without Dino and Maria, I wouldn't have made it half as far. By the way, my diploma was a creative writing degree. Ha! Huh? And who said my degree would be fucking useless? Who's recording the end of the world now, bitches? I'm the bard of the apocalypse. Bow to me. All that aside, hearing Nate openly say he was proud of me was a thorough fisting to my feels. Three years of university for that statement. Suck it. 
Those words punched me hard in the heart and teared me right up. I know I've said I lived for those little moments when Nate signaled his approval of my words or actions, but I didn't realize how important his opinion of me was until he said, I'm actually quite proud of you. Shit. I got all teary again just writing it. Yesterday ranked pretty high on my list of fucking great days. Then I made myself laugh as I remembered Nate's first sight of me was my bare ass pointing in his direction. We've come a long way in a short time, have me and old Papa Reaper. Well, I had to go and get my shit together after that, but we got back on track and focused on our next plan of action. So today, we're going to take the van and pick up with just Mark and Isaac coming along. We were going to take Alicia as an extra pair of hands, but Nate advised that taking her back there might trigger her this early. So her staying back and hanging out with the girls, Charlie and Particles, with all the actual menfolk out of the house, might give her a bit of breathing space. No doubt Freya, Nora and Maria will be able to work their magic on her. We're rolling out in half an hour, so I'm going to get my shit together. Man, I can't wait for a venison steak. Mmm, Mc. Bambi. September 10th, 2010. Graveyard humor. Busy bees, dear reader. I'm bloody knackered. I've never done so much damn physical labor in my life, and there seems to be something to do all the time of late. Being part of a community is pretty damn hard, especially when you're one of its leaders. The thought of me leading anything is laughable, as I'm just not built that way. But what I am is woman of action. I don't sit about on my ass letting other people do the hard work, and shit needs to get done. With Nate the only real shooter around here, and me an advanced amateur at best, thanks to my intense training and on-the-job experience alongside Nate, the others look to the two of us when things need sorting out beyond the gate. Hmm. I like that phrase for going outside. Beyond the gate. It has a nice poetic ring to it. Fuck it, I'm keeping it. Between Freya, Maria and Nora, the homestead is well cared for, both in terms of physical location and the people within. Nora is everyone's caring grandma. Maria is a natural caregiver, and Freya, as I have repeatedly banged on about, is just so bloody lovely, she puts everyone at ease. Well, everyone except Isaac. That poor guy is seriously intimidated by her, which is hilarious, because personality-wise, there's nothing intimidating about her. Isaac's just a typical guy, with a dash of social awkwardness and painful shyness, getting flustered by the presence of a beautiful woman. Seriously, Isaac, she's a bloody person. Talk to her like one. Mark is constantly busying himself around the place, which is great. He's making sure everything is in working order, checking if Nate and I need to acquire anything on our trips beyond the gate. Yes, this works. It's in for definite now. And is currently helping Isaac set up the security cameras around the exterior of the lodge's perimeter. Apparently, the cameras themselves are powered by solar cells, which is pretty funky, so they don't need wiring and transmit on their own Wi-Fi signal to a router or hub or something or other in the lodge. Mark is installing them around the place while Isaac does all the techie setup nerd stuff. Both clever guys. You know, on reflection, we got damn lucky with this bunch. The spread of skills fills so many gaps and it burns me to say it, but Bancroft knew what he was doing with the people he held hostage. Granted, he was a spectacular arsehole in how he assembled them, but the diversity of skills and knowledge covered with this small group of people is fabulous. We could really do with another team to function beyond the gate, though. Nate and I have a constant wish list from the group, whether it's gardening or cooking supplies for Nora, medical supplies for Maria, engineering or techie stuff for the boys, etc. Weirdly, one thing we really need to sort out is clothing. 
With the weather turning recently, I'm acutely aware that winter is coming, and we don't have much in the way of warm clothing for everyone. I don't know how well this place handles the cold, with all these glass doors, though Mark says the place is super insulated. However, the lodge probably wasn't utilised for retreats in the winter, so probably didn't have to be heated. We could conceivably freeze to death in here if the power drains out trying to heat this big place, so Mark is turning his engineer brain into a solution for that. One thing we do have is a plethora, still love that word, of woodland greenery around us. Cheshire is a green county with plenty of accessible firewood, so getting some wood burners in here seems like a sensible plan. Then we can save the electricity stores for things like hot showers, which I will fight to the death for, and important stuff like cooking. Though cutting down trees and chopping wood sounds like back-breaking work, and yet another bloody job that needs doing. You know, I'm having a newfound respect for those who carved out a living from the land back before all this modern industry and convenience. There is a shitload of work to constantly be done, and we haven't even got into the situation of farming yet. Survival is a consistent cycle of hard work and unity. So I tip my forelock to the men and women of the past who had to fight and scrape for every warm night and full belly. For the moment, we've got healthy supplies of canned, dried, preserved food and the like. And with Nora's magical ability to turn shitty off-the-shelf food into a gourmet meal, we don't feel like we're eating badly. Honestly. It's like the woman has some magical pouch of pixie dust that transforms boring fare into lip-smacking goodness. We're definitely past the shitty days of Nate and I eating cold beans from a can and sleeping in the truck, and I won't miss those days at all. Since Nate dropped his proud statement on me, the two of us have really bonded. I mean, we had already through our shared experiences and hardships, but there's a definite change. Nate opening up a bit has relaxed him, and that trust he has in me is really starting to show. He's still always teaching in everything he does with me, and I lap those lessons up like I'm dying of thirst. But now, he can see I'm really listening to him. He doesn't have to try and ram them home. It's made our sojourns, another great word, beyond the gate, more relaxed, and I'm starting to see more of those little flashes of humour from him. He's actually got a pretty dry sense of humour, being all calm and stoic as he is. But the old dude is quite witty when he lets loose. To be honest, I'm glad of it. There were times I thought if I shoved a piece of coal up his ass, he'd shit a diamond the day after. That's how bloody uptight he seemed. Let me give you an example of his more relaxed manner from one of our most recent forays. Another great word. I'm fucking schooling you today. Beyond the gate. Nora told us of a little garden supplies store she liked to use back before the world died, which was a tiny little unit on a small, rural business park out of the way. It was one of those shops that had an online presence, but survived mostly by its loyal customer base. There were ten units on the business park, all of them shuttered from the day the world shut the bed, including a plumber's merchant, some computer repair place, handy if Isaac needs parts, so that one was noted, an electronics wholesaler, and stuff like that. This little park was out of the way from main population centres, so it was relatively quiet. There were no businesses here that any looters would really target when shit hit the proverbial fan, so it was untouched. We rolled up in the pickup, which has become our vehicle of choice for our sorties. They just keep on coming, don't they? And found the store Nora pointed us to in one corner. There were five units on each side, one road in and out of the little car park in the centre of the shop fronts, and plenty of open space. So if anyone, or anything, came wandering into our AO, we'd get to see them nice and early to react. Yeah, that's right. I said AO. Area of Operation. Check me out and my military acronyms. I went pro. I almost sound like I know what I'm on about. Almost. Once again, the Halligan sold me on its diversity and worth as we popped the locks of the shutter and rolled it up, then cracked open the front door. Honestly, these things have endless amounts of use. 
Halligans, the choice of apocalypse tool for all professionals. We quickly and efficiently cleared the building, making sure we weren't going to get surprised by any lurking undead, and then started going through Nora's extensive list. Pots, compost, seeds, tools, pesticides, all the stuff she needed to both extend and maintain the herb and vegetable garden at the lodge. It was really easy going, so Nate and I shot the shit for a while as I confounded him with more pop culture references that went above his head, and he told me what an annoying little dickhead I was, though his tone was noticeably affectionate when he said those things. The kind of tone you use when you're ripping on your bestie and you call them a bellend. It was nice. It was an easy couple of hours' work getting everything that Nora wanted, and we managed to cross absolutely everything off the list she gave us, which was a massive win. There was plenty of gear left in the store as well, so it was a great resource for us to come back to in the future if we needed, and it was definitely worth coming back just to check out the other units to see if there were any useful resources for the future. I'm pretty sure Mark would have some fun shopping in the hardware stores, and the computer repair place could be super useful for our resident nerd Isaac. I'm also of a mind to get a big-ass TV or two, and a games console with some games. Be nice for us all to chill and have a movie night, and for me to destroy everyone at Mario Kart. They might be good group bonding sessions. Also, even though Charlie does great being the only kid in a lodge full of adults, it might be nice for him to have an Xbox or something to keep him busy when his dad's working. Saying that, though, Mark is awesome with that boy and lets him come along, helping him by passing tools and learning as he goes. Mark's skills will need passing on in this new world, but honestly, he brings his kid along because he just likes hanging out with his boy. He really is a great dad, emphasizing just how much of a deadbeat asshole my own was. Mark's a shining example of fatherhood, and his boy is a total credit to him. They're both awesome. Anyway, we'd just loaded the last of the gear into the pickup. Nate was pulling the shutter down to prevent any accidental undead intrusion while we were away, and I noticed movement at the car park entrance. There are some clusters of residential housing near the business park, and there were about ten undead shambling towards the entrance of the car park. I can only assume they heard the echoing bang of us crunching open the shutter and front door, subsequently shuffling this way from wherever they had been loitering. Basically, they were in our way. They're in our way, said Nate, appearing next to me. We could easily drive round them once they get closer, I offered. Nate shook his head. We're leaving now anyway. Let's use this opportunity for you to work on your distance shooting. Get your rifle. Well, I was like a kid in a sweet shop. When we're out, bullets are the last resort if things go to shit. We try to keep quiet if we only get a handful of undead, so we don't draw more in. We'll clear buildings with handguns for pure safety, but any like this in the open will just brain with halligans when we have space to move. Nate giving me the green light for live shooting practice wasn't an opportunity I was going to pass up. I've mentioned I'm good with the rifle close in, but I go a bit wonky at distance, so this was a great opportunity to fire live rounds at distant targets, and ones that were moving. It's a much better test firing at actual undead rather than stationary targets pinned to a tree. Also, the added benefit is the dead are put to their final rest. Every walk down is a little victory for humanity in my book. I'd like to believe there is a human soul, and if there is, my hope is the shambling parody of the person they once were can finally rest when their body can no longer be used by the darkness. I counted the dead, and there were twelve in total. Nate's rifle had a scope, and he was the best of us to have that little accessory, so he wanted me to use the iron sights of my rifle. It would make me a better shooter, he says. Soccer mum, he said gesturing to the distant undead. It took me a minute to realize what he meant. When I scanned the advancing zombies, I snorted. There, in the center, was the quintessential soccer mom. 
She looked supremely white middle class, had all the trappings of a woman who spent her days at home and her evenings transporting her little angels to sporting clubs, shouting at anyone who tackled her babies a little too hard on the field. I put soccer mom in my sights, slowly exhaling and squeezing the trigger, as Nate had taught me at the end of the breath, not pulling the trigger. The bullet was too low, smacking her in the chest and staggering her gait, but she came on. Too low, said Nate softly. A fraction higher. Distance is still the same. I adjusted, repeated the action, and soccer mom went down with a cracked melon. Nice, approved Nate. Next up, Stompy Chav. It was obvious which one he referred to. The one out in front of the pack seemed to have a little more purpose and speed than the others. The hood of a knockoff designer top pulled up over his head as he seemed to stomp towards us. You'll remember, I have a distinct distaste for the chav species from my adventures at my old high school escape. It felt like a personal victory when Stompy Chav went down first time. That's it, said Nate with an open grin, clearly starting to enjoy himself. Our next contender, Janet from HR. It was hard to keep my aim straight, suppressing my laughter. Nate's hard exterior and dry humor was all I was used to, but with the naming of each target, he seemed to be letting himself go a little more. Dare I say, he was getting a little lucky with the labels he gave them, like some of my goofy humor had rubbed off on him and he was giving into it completely. We had... Mary Lou, who looked like a southern belle with fucking cowboy boots on, believe it or not. Lemmy, who looked like the lead singer of Motorhead, as the name suggests. Gollum was a big hit, mainly because I was blown away that Nate actually came up with that one himself. And pop culture references usually go over his head. Do we have a secret fantasy nerd in the old soldier? Oh, matron. Pretty much broke me, as Nate ripped out a fucking terrible Kenneth Williams impression to say it, in his best carry-on movie style. The woman looked like Hattie Jakes. It was awesome. Steadily, I worked through each of them, but each were getting harder as the two of us started collapsing in laughter with each label more stupid than the next. Let's not lose sight here that I was shooting live bullets into the heads of vicious undead, and that they were once people with hopes and dreams. It was pretty dark, us laughing about giving the undead stupid names as I shot them in the head, but Nate put my mind at ease on the drive home when I brought that up. As a soldier, he explained, you're forced into some pretty dark situations. The only way you and your team can keep any kind of sanity is by finding some humor in the shitstorm you're wading through. If you let the darkness in, it might swallow any light left in you. So don't feel guilty, Erin. Hold on to whatever light you can. God knows there's enough darkness to go around. Wise old bugger. By the time we got to the last two, I was really struggling. Paolo from accounts, snorted Nate. He's such a fucking asshole. Then he full on laughed at his own joke. A dark-haired man in a suit, his shirt and tie all messed up and covered in blood, would have been late twenties in life. He was close enough now that my shooting was on point, and as Paolo's melon popped, the stupidity of the situation overtook me, and I totally lost it. There was only one left. You'll have to do him, Nate, I said through my tears of laughter. I can't see a fucking thing. The final undead must have broken his neck somehow, as his head wouldn't sit up straight and was rolling around his chest and shoulders like a ball in a bag. I just managed to point at him and snort out, Bobblehead, before I completely lost it. Laughing, Nate raised his rifle and popped the bobbling head with a single shot. With a string of corpses lining the car park from the entrance to about 30 feet from the front of the truck, it was a grisly sight. The two of us near pissing our pants in goofy laughter was totally incongruous. Another great word, with the bloody evidence of our afternoon's work. 
Without doubt, any survivors passing by would have seen two crazy bastards holding assault rifles, laughing like lunatics with the weed giggles at the twelve strung-out corpses, and given them a very wide berth. We must have looked batshit crazy. We were still chuckling for most of the journey home, and still sharing looks back at the lodge that set us off, making the rest of our folks look at us with bemused expressions. Well, that just made us worse. Nate and I found a new place that was just ours that day. Seeing him just cut loose without any concern for how I perceived him was refreshing. Something has changed between us, at least from his side. Maybe it was him slipping out that praise my way, as it's made him less conscious of how he speaks to me. It's like I've gained access to Nate's VIP room in his head in some way, accepted for all that I am. That feels pretty good. So, what's next on the agenda? Well, we've got the small freezer that Mark targeted from Bancroft's place, there's little point talking about what happened when we went back there. Suffice to say, we cleaned it out of anything useful. There's probably a few things we can go back for, but they're just bits and bobs. The main thing was that small chest freezer, because that's the last thing we needed in place before the big one. Tomorrow, Nate and I are going over to the deer park. Shitting hell, I am so excited. The thought of fresh cooked meat is making my mouth water at the concept. I'm not particularly enamoured by the lessons promised of how to treat and dress a deer, but they're skills that I need. Also, I've always hated the argument of superior attitude vegetarians who get on their soapbox and say, if you had to kill and butcher the animal yourself, you wouldn't eat meat either. In that, my dear tree hugger, you are so very fucking wrong. If it means I get fresh cooked meat, I'll strangle Bambi with my bare fucking hands as I headbutt the little bastard to death before sawing it to pieces with a rusty knife. You have no concept of what I'll do for fresh meat. So, next time I see you, my dear reader, I aim to be satisfied and full of meat. You laughed, didn't you? I bet you laughed. You've got a dirty mind. September 12th, 2010. Oh. My. God. Yesterday, Nate and I headed out to Dunham Mass's deer park. We easily bagged a deer because they're bloody everywhere, no hunting required. Just set up in a spot all quiet, wait for them to wander into view. Then we worked together, both firing to take the same one down. Naturally, the rest of them scattered after the crack of the rifles, but our work was done in terms of bagging them. Easy like Sunday morning. I asked Nate why we didn't both shoot one and double up, because as I said, there were plenty to go around. Apparently, 5.56mm rounds are pretty small for hunting and taking down deer. In the absence of a decent hunting rifle with a proper round like 7.62mm for the job, it was more humane for us both to fire on the same animal to take it down. Unless we nailed Bambi in the heart or brain with a perfect shot, the poor bugger would stagger off and likely bleed out over a long time. Fair enough, I guess. I wanted to eat that deer with every molecule of my being, but I didn't want it to die a slow and painful death beforehand. Incidentally, we have some 7.62 mm but the only weapons we have for firing them are the couple of AK-47s we found at Castle Bancroft Stein, all loaded into the handful of magazines for those two weapons. And we've got a metric fuckload of 5.56mm in comparison. So, here we are. Nate handed me his massive knife and walked me through dressing it, because I said I wanted to learn. Well, that was fucking grotesque. Cut it down to the base of the sternum, then scar along the abdomen, but don't cut deep straight away. Nate couldn't stress that enough, because if the stomach, intestines, bowels, bladder, etc. get punctured while you're doing it, it will make an unholy mess inside that deer that you do not want to experience. The meat will get spoiled by all the mess, intestinal bacteria, digestive enzymes and juices, and all that other nasty stuff. You have to rip out all the innards nice and smooth and just take the meat home. 
It's a bloody awful experience the first time, rummaging your hands inside the day, shoving everything down so you can get the esophagus, sever it, then drag everything down and out, carefully cutting anything away from the carcass to just leave the meat. It's a wholly unpleasant, warm, squishy feeling as you manhandle everything down so you can cut that esophagus, enabling you to rip and pour everything out the split belly. But it's actually pretty straightforward once you get past the horror of shoving your hands into an animal's innards to cut it apart. Utilising our new little freezer at the lodge, we'd prepared and brought some bags of ice in a cooler box, shoving them inside the dressed carcass to preserve the meat as best we could for the transport home. And Bob's your mother's brother, we had ourselves a deer, ready for skinning and eating. And I gained a new skill. A gross one, admittedly, but a girl's got to do what she has to for survival. I wasn't lying when I said I'd do anything for fresh meat, and I proved that. Nora did the business on the venison, skinning and butchering it like a pro. Last night, the smell of cooking meat was nigh unorgasmic, but that was nothing compared to the first bite. Oh. My. God. I nearly burned my mouth, I was so bloody eager, and I just didn't care. It was better than sex, and I will argue that to my dying day. When you've been eating a collection of canned and dried foods for three months, no matter how well Nora prepared them, absolutely nothing prepared me for the opiate-like high of biting into freshly cooked meat. I don't have the words. The feel of it, the texture, the juices. Huh. It actually sounds like I'm describing sex in a really weird fashion. But who cares? But the taste... Oh, sweet Mary, Mother of God, the taste. It was divine. We smashed the shit out of that venison, obliterated it. Every single one of us kept making satisfied cooing noises, sharing dreamy looks like we'd just sat on heaven's throne and getting a head massage from an angel. It lifted everyone's mood considerably, and even Laura's haunted look was put on time out. Even she couldn't keep the smile from her face for that short time. Nora made a mini banquet, harvesting a load of fresh vegetables to go with it, and I can't even tell you how bloody amazing that meal was. I keep trying, but for all the fancy vocabulary I keep throwing out, I just can't do it justice. Nora had made this flashy red wine sauce as well, from all the bits and bobs she'd found in the kitchen, and well, just, yeah... Om fucking nom fucking nom. Uh, amazing. I'm still recovering. I have a few more thoughts on that day we went hunting, and I'll do them in a second entry in a while. I just had to record our venison steak banquet for historical purposes. There are quite a few deer at that deer park, so as long as we're careful, we've got a good supply of meat for quite some time. Protein, yo. McBambi was fucking delicious. September 12th, 2010. Second entry. Final gridlock. Okay, now I've recovered from salivating at the memory of the venison, there was something else I wanted to record in here that absolutely freaked me the fuck out. Dunham Massey is over Old Tringham Way, so it's technically Cheshire, but it's very much on the edge of the Manchester area. We took the back roads up through High Lee and Little Bollington, quieter back roads through smaller rural settlements, avoiding the main roads of the A556 leading onto the M56 motorway. Since all this began, I've wondered where a lot of the people cleared out to. Back in the opening days, a shit ton of people loaded up their cars with essentials and got the fuck out of Dodge in double quick time. And at the back of my mind, I couldn't help but think how everyone trying to drive at the same time was a recipe for complete catastrophe. Driving cars and apocalyptic panic are a potent and explosive mix, as Mrs. Thompson Smythe showed in the opening days when she had the misfortune to run over her own kid in her wild frenzy then got a throat torn out by that same little angel as they reanimated in a snip. Being in control of heavy metal death machines, 
I'm keeping that as my band name. While your mind is clouded by panic and terror, it's just delaying the inevitable. If I was to draw the percentage chances in a pie chart, I would simply draw a circle, label it chances of death if you drive while insane with panic, then colour in the whole circle and write 100% in the middle of it. It's bad news. As we crawled up to the roundabout leading to the main junction for the M56 towards Manchester, I asked Nate to pull up. I needed to see it. I'd not had the chance to see any stretch of motorway since the world died. Whenever you watch apocalypse movies, especially zombie apocalypse ones like 28 Days Later, love that movie and repeatedly thank the powers that be that we haven't got sprinters like that or I'd straight up die of fright. Motorways are empty. Now, I get that many people will hunker down at home, but I think we've established that a lot of people are absolute raging morons. The last thing I'd want to do is get onto a motorway when law and order has gone to hell and the dead have risen to murder the living. Being trapped on a road with no exit is some dumb shit. But lo and behold, my fine fellow English folk never ceased to amaze me in this grand idiocracy we live in. It takes one accident on a motorway, just one, to utterly fuck it in the best of times, when there will be emergency service response coming to help. Imagine a motorway full to the brim of insanely terrified people, driving like absolute lunatics to God only knows where, with no sense of other road users, or care for that matter. Absolute fucking bedlam. All six lanes, three on both sides of the carriageway, were gridlocked. An accident on one side heading away from Manchester towards us was a mess. An 18-wheeler having jackknifed across all three lanes and the hard shoulder, forming an impenetrable barrier across the westbound carriageway. Everyone trying to escape Manchester itself or the airport were trapped with no hope of respite. Naturally, this had caused people on the eastbound to slow down and rubberneck, no doubt, causing a pile-up on the other three carriageways as mangled BMWs and Audis, it's always those drivers, smashed into the rear of the slowing cars ahead of them at a fuck-brained speed. The whole thing must have spiralled completely out of control. With the entire motorway a complete graveyard, many had abandoned their cars and set out on foot. I could see movement in a lot of vehicles, some of them not part of the accident, but with clear evidence there had been a struggle. Good-hearted people going to help the injured found only undead, got themselves bitten or killed, and, well, here we apply our familiar to the power of oh shit equation. Many must have ran back to their cars after being bitten, back to their partners and kids, then turned as they died trapped in there. And then, man, I don't even want to finish those thoughts on paper. I can almost hear the screams of terror in the dusty corners of my mind, and I don't want to dwell on them. It's just too damn depressing, thinking of the small stories of individual horrors in the tight confines of a family car. There are way too many undead shuffling between the cars, on the embankments lining the side of the motorway and writhing in the confines of trapped vehicles. Lines of traffic extend as far as the eye can see behind the mangled piles of cars on one side and behind the truck barrier on the other side. Then, eerily, there is just an empty stretch ahead of the accident extending into the distance. One final gridlock as a monument to the end of the world, captured for all time. Far in the distance, the bright sky of the horizon was smeared with a dirty haze. Fires, Nate observed. So many fires as Manchester burned. Looting, panic, accidents, gas explosions, who knows? Shit. I wonder how bad that haze was in the first few weeks of the world's death throes. I'm glad we're 25 miles from the edge of any city in our little rural and suburban areas here, surrounded by small towns, little villages, and big stretches of countryside. For those living in the cities, I can't even imagine what kind of horrors they endured when everything started going to shit, and if anyone in the city is still alive. I hope so.
as I'd like to think there will always be small pockets of resourceful people that keep their shit together when everything around them crumbles. But I can't even get my head around the sheer scale of the undead numbers in the big cities. Nate and I headed back to the pickup at that point, carrying the weight of desolation. But I felt like I needed to see it. I wish I hadn't. But I'm also glad I did. We have to understand what it is we've lost if we're ever going to figure out how to build something new, something better. I've said it before, I'll say it in the future, and I'll say it again now. The apocalypse fucking sucks, man. September 15th, 2010. Field trips. Last few days we've been beyond the gate gathering resources. They've been simple excursions to some local country houses and farms, staying clear of town and the hordes still wandering round there. Why did we do this? Well, we brought Alicia and Mark along with us as part of Nate's initial training plan. He's been showing them proper handling of both shotgun and handgun. No live rounds fired yet, as he's not going to upgrade them to one of our precious SA-80s until he's satisfied they can handle the gateway weapons. These little field trips were to show them how Nate and I operate as a clearance team, as we don't have a mock-up to train them on, so doing it with single, contained environments is the next best thing, where we're only likely to meet the maximum of a single family of undead. We did give them the Halligans, though. Before they move to firearms, they have to go through the crucible of braining undead in close quarters. If they're going to become field ready, firearms are our last resort. If we can take them out quietly in melee first, we will, because there's less chance of summoning any more zombies to the party. Also, we don't know if we'll ever get ammo resupply. This is sleepy Northern England after all. We were lucky that Bancroft had a stash of illegal weapons, but we can't count on ever finding any more. The nearest military base is near Chester, a good twenty or so miles from where we are, and that's our last resort if we think we're getting too low. It's not a large base, more of a barracks, to be truthful, but Nate assures me they'll still have an armory. Considering the travel we'd have to do to get there, however, it would be something of an odyssey into the unknown, so we'll put that on the back burner for now. For all we know, it could have survived and locked down, so the last thing we need is walking into a military base full of live soldiers with live rounds, with live twitchy fingers on triggers. Alicia and Mark are attentive students. Nate makes me feel like a million dollars at times as well, allowing me to speak and share my experiences, using me as a good example of handling and the like. I bet he was a great officer to serve under when he was in the trenches, you know. He's a good teacher and really makes you feel like you have value. Nate has this thing now where he opens the door and throws out a whistle into the building, listens for any movement of undead, and if so, steps back away from the door and waits for them to come out. Choose the ground most advantageous for you is the lesson there, as in the open. One or two undead are easy to deal with in melee. You just sidestep and flank them as they can't turn for shit so you get the time to aim and brain. Alicia and Mark both got the opportunity to skull puncture zombies, and they both did it with very different reactions. Mark acted like I did the first time I smashed up a zombie skull in close quarters. He puked his guts up. That's how normal people react, because it's a fucking gross and ugly process. So you know Mark will take all of this with the gravitas a sensible person should. Tick in the box for our resident engineer. Nate and I were a little concerned about Alicia, though. Since Nate got through to her with his Katie story and she calmed down, we thought she'd be a bit more level-headed. And in the main, she has. She's listened to us both attentively, asked pertinent questions, hasn't pushed for being armed and firing live rounds. She's basically done everything that Nate wanted from her in the right way, which is why she got to come on these training field trips. However. When it was her turn to drop an undead with the Halligan Spike for the first time, I can't really put my finger on it, but there was a visceral, 
savagery when that spike thunked into a Zed's skull. It didn't affect her like it did Mark. If anything, she looked triumphant, like some battle-maddened Norse shield maiden after killing an enemy warrior. The expression on her face was hungry, like that one zombie was only the starter to whet her appetite, and she was avidly waiting for the main course to arrive. We're going to have to monitor her closely, I reckon. The last thing we need is one of our new field operatives being reckless because she's hungry for more zombie kills. That's how she'll get herself killed. Or worse, she'll get someone else bitten or killed through negligence. I'm a mouthy, cocky little shit that appears to take nothing seriously, and mostly that's true. I make jokes when I shouldn't and enjoy the banter. But when shit gets real, my head is firmly in the game and focused entirely on the safety of me and my friends. You don't fuck about with other people's lives. If you want to fuck about with your own, that's your own stupid business, but woe to you if it endangers someone in your proximity. If it does, I swear I will kick my dainty size three foot so far up your arse, you'll be clipping my toenails with your teeth. For the moment, it's just a feeling. Those signs I interpret from her expression and body language. She hasn't been overt and screamed a blood-curdling war cry to the heavens as she demands blood for the blood god and skulls for the skull throne of corn, but she's still not reacting like normal people do. It's like she's biting down and restraining the urge to scream that battle cry, though. The last thing we need is a wild berserker going all Leroy Jenkins on our carefully crafted plans. One to keep an eye on. We got some handy stuff from our little excursions, though. Nothing amazing, except maybe some really useful stuff at one big farmhouse. The guy who lived there was something of a car enthusiast, with a big-ass triple garage with a vehicle lift, spare parts, but most useful of all, a ton of additives to treat petrol with. Apparently, petrol can go bad. Who knew? Well, Mark did. Seems the guy who lived here must make his living doing custom work on cars, as there were all kinds of tools and resources. It was part mini-warehouse, part workshop. As it's only two miles from the lodge, it will actually make a pretty good colony of sorts in the future. If we take on some more people, we'll soon outgrow the lodge, and the big house here could be a useful ally location with any vehicle or engineering work dealt with by Mark on site. He's not moving anywhere yet, and he won't until he can properly defend his boy with some combat skills, but it's definitely one for the future. For now, at least, it can be used as an off-site safe house where Mark can build stuff. We did find a couple of other farmhouses with wood burners, which is good. We've marked them as they're pretty big, and we'll come back with a bigger team to get them loaded onto a more appropriate vehicle. They look pretty damn heavy, and Mark says the van or pickup aren't appropriate as they're only light goods vehicles. We could do with a builder's delivery truck or something, one of those open flatbed vehicles with a much stronger frame and wheelbase. Ha, listen to me chatting shit like I know what I'm on about. I'm just quoting super smart Mark and his engineering know-how. I'd be the kind of dickhead that bought one of these on eBay, rocking up in my little Ford Fiesta, thinking I'd get it in if I just put the back seats down. It'll be right, I'd say with surety, as everyone around me looked like they'd just found the idiot that had been missing from a nearby village. So yeah, we've had a few easy days. We've dropped a couple of local undead that were milling about in these isolated farmhouses and fancy rich folk estates. There was a lot of money in Cheshire pre-apocalypse, and a lot of quite magnificent houses I didn't even know existed along all these back roads. It's been mental seeing how the 1% lived, with huge home cinemas and bowling alleys in basements, entire gyms for personal use, indoor pools, etc., I think we might have stumbled on a footballer house or two in the area, given the shrines to football careers we found in them. Don't know who they were, don't really care, but their houses, for all their fancy possessions filling them, are powerless now, empty shrines to the dead. Honestly, I don't know why one person needed a house so stupidly big. Some of the rooms in them were straight up empty, with just carpet on the floor. 
Imagine having so many rooms in your home that you left a shitload empty simply because you had no use for them. The end of the world is a great equaliser in the wealth stakes. Waitrose isn't doing deliveries now, you pompous twats. No more gnocchi, quinoa, foie gras, or cashmere-enriched toilet roll to wipe their snooty asses any longer. I found out what foie gras is from the ever-knowledgeable Nora, and was bloody horrified. Did you know it's the liver of a force-fed duck or goose? This process is apparently called gavage. I'm no vegetarian, but that just seems a bit too messed up, even for me. Anyway, weird sadism delicacies aside, it's been an interesting and relatively quiet few days. A nice change of pace. Oh, one of those football houses had a PlayStation, Nintendo Wii, and an Xbox, with all the accessories and a boatload of games for each. So, we brought home the lot, plus a big-ass TV, and Charlie and I have been smashing the shit out of it in the evenings. Also, who knew that Nate was a bit of a natural on Mario Kart? The competition just heated up. I can't just beat the old soldier, sorry Nate, Marine, that's never played console games before. Not at Mario Kart. It's my game. I can't just beat him. I must crush him and revel as his Luigi burns and weeps. Nate laughs about how competitive I am. I laugh harder. And longer. I told you, being this funny is hard. September 18th, 2010. Pain. I need to write this. But now I'm here, I don't think I can. No, I can't. Not yet. I've marked the day. That's enough for now. The pain is too much. It's just too damn much. It's too raw. I can't see for crying, can't catch a breath. I'll try again another time. September 20th, 2010. No. I don't even know how to begin writing this. I don't want to. And yet I have to. I have to. It's only right, but it's taken me two days before my mind would even let me sit here and open this white, digital page again. Two days of hollow, empty grief. Of weeping out every last tear until my well was dry. No matter how much this hurts, I have to do this now, or I'm afraid I never will. She deserves that much at the very least, to be remembered. The four of us were out on a run beyond the gate, just hitting some isolated houses again, continuing Alicia and Mark's training. It was about two in the afternoon when we rolled up, and immediately we knew something was wrong. As we pulled in the gate, Mark jumped out of his vehicle as Charlie came thundering down the hill towards us, no sense of safety as he gathered speed down the slope. Mark caught him just as he started to tumble, sweeping him up and asking him what was wrong. Zombie, was all he panted, tears streaking his face, desperately trying to suck air into his little lungs. That word was like being doused in ice water. Nate and I shared a horrified glance, pulled our handguns from holsters, and charged up the hill. The situation had been dealt with, as we found Nora sitting outside, shotgun in hand, beside a body wrapped in a rug. The old woman was sat smoking a cigarette, her hands still shaking and knuckles white on the gun barrel. With the threat clearly contained, we both relaxed, though my breathing was quick and shallow. Didn't know you smoked, observed Nate softly, holstering his Glock. Haven't for twenty years, said Nora in a quivering voice. Needed one today. Took one from your trade, Stash. Nate just nodded. 
I dreaded to ask, but did anyway, pointing to the concealed corpse. Who is it? Laura, sighed the widow. Did for herself. Guess the demons in her head got too loud, poor love. When she said Laura's name, I'm ashamed to admit that my initial reaction was relief. What an absolute shithead thought to have, eh? That poor woman had endured three months of unimaginable trauma. And all I felt at hearing Laura's name as the deceased was relief. God, I hate myself right now. I'm sorry, Laura. I'm sorry for all the pain you endured, that we couldn't help you, and that you found yourself in such a dark place that all you could do was turn out the last of the lights. I hope you can now find some peace. Had to put her down, said Nora softly. First time I ever shot a gun at anything bigger than a pheasant. Poor girl, strung herself up in a room. It was then that I noticed activity in the kitchen. Nora caught me looking, her already haunted expression collapsing. Her next words froze my heart. Freya found her, she said, and the desolation in her voice spun me into a daze. I wandered through the open glass door as if I was one of the undead, my movements clumsy, sightless eyes uncomprehending everything in the room as I bumped and shuffled my way round the kitchen. I could see Freya was sitting in a chair, but she was hidden by Maria, who was fussing at her with her back towards me. Isaac was beside them, and as I walked in, our eyes locked. His gaze fixed to mine, filled with a painful sympathy that confirmed my worst fear. Maria sensed Isaac's shift and straightened, turning towards me and revealing Freya sat in the chair. My eyes didn't see my friend's face. All I could see was the bloody bandage around her right hand, though my mind didn't comprehend it. Erin, said Freya, drawing my attention to her face. She looked pallid, drawn. Darkness pooled beneath her eyes, her once luminous skin pale and waxen, a sheen of sweat glistening on her brow. No was all I said, shaking my head. No, no. I knew what I was seeing, but couldn't accept it. No, not Freya, not Freya. I heard her, Erin, said Freya, her once musical voice now impossibly weak. I went to check on her and heard her. I screamed for help, burst into the room. Saw her struggling and did the first thing that came to mind. No, I said again, the word little more than an exhale. I reached up for the belt. I wasn't thinking, she said, a listless smile ruining her own foolish actions, even as she recounted them. But she wasn't dying, Erin. She was already gone. She was already one of them. I was too close. She held up the bloody bandages. She grabbed my arm, pulled it towards her, she sighed. I pulled my arm free with all I had, but the side of my hand was already in Laura's teeth. No. I said again, dropping to my knees in front of her. This is killing me, writing this. Killing me. I have to keep stopping. I can't see through the damn film of tears. But I've got to finish. I have to tell this. She put her good hand on my cheek. She was bitten and her clock was counting down, yet still all her thoughts were geared towards comforting me. God, I'm such a selfish prick. She was fucking dying, and she was comforting me. What kind of asshole needs to be comforted by their dying friend? Damn it, Lockie, you're such a useless fucking shit. I can feel it, Erin, 
she said gently. It's like a poison spreading through me, taking me piece by piece. It's cold, and it's dark, and it's speeding up. No, I sobbed, disbelief and denial giving way to the grim reality. There's got to be something we can do. Freya gave me such a gentle, sympathetic smile, and it was like a knife to my heart. Still the caregiver, even as the darkness rose to swallow her. You know a bite is final, Loki. She never called me that. She always called me Erin, and I never minded. She had such a sweet, lilting way of saying it that it sounded like a name I wanted. And because it's final, I want a choice. A uh, choice? I didn't grasp what she was implying, my mind too clouded by heartbreak and denial. You can't let me become one of those things, she breathed, fear creeping into her voice for the first time. I don't want your lasting memory of me to be a monster. A thing of the dark. I don't want even the chance to hurt anyone. What? She wants you to end it for her, said Nate quietly at my shoulder. I hadn't heard him enter the kitchen. Before she turns, go out on her own terms as a whole person, not a thing. Freya's eyes misted with tears for the first time, nodding at Nate's observation. I was horrified. You want me to, to kill you? I'm already dead, Erin, she sniffed. I can't die at peace, knowing you'll see me become one of those things. They turn so fast, Erin. So fast. What happens to someone who turns? What happens to their soul, if such a thing exists? Is it simply gone, swallowed by the dark? She shook her head. Please, she implored. Don't make me find out. Let me go as Freya. Not the thing that used to be her. Even through my grief, I knew she was right. She was on a rapidly decreasing countdown. I could see her sliding away even as we spoke, her once radiant complexion sickening towards death, the life visibly slipping from her while we talked. If this was the one thing she wanted from me, right at the last, who was I to deny her? All I could do was nod and sob, okay, before her arms were around me. I grabbed onto her, desperately mumbling some prayers to whatever force had cursed our world with the dead, begging it to take me in her place. The world wouldn't miss a fuck up like me, but Freya was so, so good. It seemed a travesty, a tragedy that she was taken this way. Like all prayers inevitably do, they fell on deaf ears. If there was any god, he was either absent or a royal fucking bastard for doing this. What kind of grand plan requires the death of such a gentle soul? There is no god. This world of ashes and the dead is all there is. All that matters is the people you care for and who care for you. We have to decide our own destiny, make our own way, and look after each other, because we are all we have left now. Freya finally let me go, smiling with unbearable compassion as she thumbed the tears from my cheeks, then stood and walked outside. Stay in here, all of you, I heard Nate say. Remember her as she was. I'll go with them. There were murmurs of assent. No one wanted to see this. I didn't want to do this. But Freya needed it, 
and I couldn't deny her the only thing she'd ever asked of me. It was the one thing that would give her peace. September 18th was a bright afternoon, but the dark clouds in the distance seemed symbolic, creeping ever closer, menacing, readying themselves to draw a dark curtain over the sun and pour their misery atop me. Freya walked regally, despite her weakening body, moving out of sight of the lodge's kitchen. No one would see her final moments except me and Nate. We embraced again, and she nodded, saying nothing, her expression speaking volumes. She knelt, no fear on her beautiful face, my eyes glancing down at the angry crimson dressing shrouding her injured hand, and it was like seeing it for the first time again. Such a little thing, a bite to the hand, yet it was Freya's death sentence, her recruitment to the legion of the undead, unless I freed her from that obligation. I could feel Nate's eyes on me, watching every move as I slid the glock from my hip, forcing a firm grip on the weapon, though my hand felt so weak. The weapon was live, deadly, and I couldn't keep it straight in my head what I was planning to do. Are you sure about this? I asked, desperate to think of some other way. There's no other way, Erin, she said, her voice feather soft. I know this is a terrible thing for me to ask of you, but I need this, Erin. Don't let me become a monster. Eyes burning with tears as hot as magma, I nodded, moving behind her. Glancing up, Nate's features were expressionless, save for a tightening around his eyes. He was trying to lend me his strength to do what was needed, but I knew this was killing him inside. He was fond of Freya. The two of us had become like foster daughters to him in our short time together. We'd become our own little family before we rescued the others from Bancroft. This wasn't just my pain. It was his too. I lifted the glock, the barrel just an inch from the back of Freya's head, her dark hair glistening like polished ebony in the sunlight. Hooking my finger over the trigger, I felt that coldness on its tip. One squeeze, and it was done. I don't know how long my arm hovered there. So many times I told myself to squeeze the trigger, to just get it done, and every time my muscles froze. I started to cry, silently weeping, the scene in front of me a hazy blur. Breathing was a labor, the weight of responsibility and grief crushing the air from my lungs, and I felt my arm beginning to quiver. I broke. I couldn't do it. As my arm fell away, I choked out a single word through the pain, every atom of me pleading begging to take this awful responsibility from me. Nate. He was there in a second, his hand taking the gun from mine, his voice softer than I've ever heard it. I've got this, kid, he whispered. I swear there was a shake in his voice, but I can't be sure. My memory of finer details is blurred. My head was somewhere else, lost and out of control. But I remember his stoic presence, my safe anchor in the storm of this horror raging about me. It's okay, Erin, I heard Freya say. No accusation, just more damn compassion. Damn it, why is everyone so much stronger than me? Freya asked one thing of me and I couldn't do it. I was too fucking weak, and I passed that terrible burden to Nate again, just like he took the burden behind door number nine. Everyone else keeps carrying my useless weight. I'm sorry, I managed to choke out, so weak I couldn't even look. I turned away, my back to Freya's back, Nate between the two of us. I put my hands on my knees, panting for breath through the torrent of tears. 
You ready, sweetheart? I heard Nate say to Freya. I am, she answered, not a single quiver in a voice while I bawled like a child. Such dignity, such grace. I love you both, she said. And we you, answered Nate. The serenity was shattered by the loudest gunshot of my life. It broke the last of my will, and my body was too heavy for my legs. They collapsed beneath me, all my strength gone. On my knees, I folded downwards, screaming a feral cry of rage, grief, and sorrow into the earth. Then Nate was there again, picking me from the floor, wrapping me in his arms, cooing assurances that it would be okay, that he was there, that he had me, that I was safe. I crushed to him and wept. Freya was gone. Shit, I need a break. I can't write anymore. I'm bawling again, and I thought these past two days had ran me dry. I was wrong. September 21st, 2010. Grief. It took me a whole day before I could write again. I've never lost someone close to me before, and it's taking me some time to get a handle on this. Who am I kidding? I don't have a handle on this at all. I feel like someone has scooped out all my feelings and dumped them in the trash. I'm numb. I still don't feel like this is real, and struggle to accept that I'll never see or speak to her again. Nate did it all. He took the burden from me, and now all I feel is guilty again. Freya wanted just one thing from me, and I couldn't do it for her. The only thing she ever asked of me, and I failed her, begging Nate to carry one more miserable burden when he already carries so much. Being the man he is, though, he took it from me without question or hesitation, and did it first time without wavering. I wish I had that kind of strength. I wish I could have saved Nate one less miserable responsibility. But I was too weak. I'm sorry, Nate. I'm sorry, Freya. Even when we buried Laura and Freya, it still wasn't real. Nora said some beautiful words, but I can't remember them. My eyes were fixed to the patted earth, and all I can see is particles sitting by the grave, staring at it while making little whines of despair. Little dude knows she's gone, and he feels the pain as well. Dogs know this shit, feel it deeply. The two of them had a bond, and now it's being cut. The two of us have been spending our grief these past few days together. Particles is keeping me clinging to the threads of my sanity. I can't bring myself to hate Laura for what she did. She was just a product of this shitty world and a victim of evil people. How can I possibly know what she went through? How can any of us know what the demons in her head whispered to her in the quiet of the night as she lay in bed alone, wondering if the door was going to be kicked open and be dragged out by her hair? Freya's own caring nature got her killed. Her first reaction was to help, overriding her common sense. But this world takes adjusting to. We have to rewire everything we know, and her wires were still fixed firmly in place. She tried to help when Laura was already beyond it, her undead thrashing mistaken for choking in the noose. One little bite. That's all it takes for a story to end and a world to crumble. These are the fine lines of our reality now. Grief isn't something I understand or I'm used to. I don't know how to describe or manage it. Nate says there aren't any hard and fast rules for managing grief. It's a different process for everyone, and it's different each time a person experiences it. Grief, said Nate, is the last and final act of love you can give to those you've lost. 
It's just the love you have that you want to give, but has nowhere to go. Fucking layers, man. Nate never ceases to bloody amaze me. He's the hardest, fiercest, most dangerous motherfucker I've ever known in my life. And he has the biggest damn heart to go with it. If you're ever going to choose someone to be like, dear reader, be like Nate. Think, what would Nate do? Because somehow, the old dog just always gets it right. I wrote that again. Dear reader, I've always wondered what name I should give you, who I should write to. I guess now I know. I'm going to write to you, Freya. I'll tell you everything you missed, who Nate growls at, who gets particles outraged, who makes me lose my shit. If I write to you, maybe it will keep me connected to you in some way. Maybe it's my way of keeping you here, with us. Yeah, no more, dear reader. These chronicles are yours now, Freya, not mine. They're for you. I hope you like them. September 23rd, 2010. Dear reader. Hey, Freya. I miss you. Erin. This has been No More Heroes, an Adrian's Undead Diary novel, Lucky vs. the Apocalypse, book one. Written by Carl Meadows. Narrated by Danielle Cohen. Copyright 2020 by Carl Meadows. Production copyright by Carl Meadows. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. Heroes, an Adrian's Undead Diary novel, Lucky vs. the Apocalypse, book one. Written by Carl Meadows. Narrated by Danielle Cohen. Copyright 2020 by Carl Meadows. Production copyright by Carl Meadows. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. This is Audible. We Will Rise, an Adrian's Undead Diary novel. Lockie vs. the Apocalypse, book two. Written by Carl Meadows. Narrated by Danielle Cohen. Dedication. On the 24th of October, 2009, our family was forever changed when my nephew, Billy, was tragically born sleeping. My little sister also suffered life-threatening complications. Had it not been for the gut instinct of one amazing medical professional on that day, I would have lost my younger sister as well as my nephew. There is often a fierce taboo associated with talking about the subject of miscarriage, stillbirth, and the loss of a child, usually because it makes others uncomfortable hearing about it. It's important that stigma is banished. Why can we talk about the loss of grandparents, parents, and siblings, but not that most painful loss of all? My sister and brother-in-law have repeatedly and courageously shared their incredibly painful story in the hope they could help just one person who may suffer the worst experience any parent could ever imagine and to break the taboo around the heart-rending loss of a child. There is light at the end of this tunnel, as they have since brought three beautiful girls into this world that have brought the sunshine back to their lives after the darkness of Billy's heartbreaking loss. We Will Rise is dedicated to one of the strongest families I know. For my sister, Rachel, my brother-in-law, Nick, and my three amazing nieces, Florence, Elsie, and Nora. Above all, this book is dedicated to the memory of my nephew, Billy. Gone but never forgotten. Billy George Saunders, born sleeping the 24th of October 2009. In our arms for a moment, in our hearts for a lifetime.
Part One. The Rising Dark. October the first, two thousand and ten. Dark new days. Hey Freya. It's been nearly two weeks since you left, and more than a week since I last wrote. The weather has shifted to suit my mood. I think. Autumn has arrived with a vengeance. In the last couple of days, we've all largely been housebound, thanks to a blast of rainstorms that has made going beyond the gate too miserable to warrant the effort. The last thing any of us needs is to get sick with a chill of some kind. The severity of any sickness will be amplified by our end of the world vibe. I have to keep reminding myself that I'm not the only one affected by your loss. You were popular here. Everybody loved you. Particles misses you more than anyone, I think. I've since learned that pugs have not only mastered the expressions of outrage, indignation, and contempt with ease; they also do a hell of a line in heartbreak. The little dude's big eyes seem to be constantly holding back tears, and I've seen him sitting by the glass doors, staring out into the rain-swept yard in the direction of your grave. A forlorn whimper breaking everybody's heart over and over again. Everybody here has lost someone or something, whether it was before the world shat itself or since. So, grief isn't new. Your death, however, has hit the lodge hard. You're the first of our new apocalypse family we've lost. Well, you and Laura. I shouldn't forget about her. She was always so detached, though, and never really tried to fit in. Lost as she was in her sea of pain, while demons from the depths of her psyche raged at her in the quiet. I still can't let myself hate her. I want to, as wrong as that is. I need someone to blame for your death. I need a focus, a place to put this tight ball of rage that, on some days. Just crushes the air from my lungs. Her suicide took you from us, from me. I want to say how selfish she was to do that, to put everyone else in such peril by her actions, knowing that someone else could get hurt. But how can I possibly know what storms raged inside that head of hers? Shit. She was only twenty-two years old and used as an unwilling sex slave for three months. Repeatedly raped by laughing men who would high five each other after using her and the other captives to satisfy their lust, only to be thrown back in a prison waiting for a repeat. What a fucking awful existence! I don't know how I would handle that, so I'm not going to pretend to know what darkness lurked in her thoughts. Anyone on the precipice of suicide. Teetering on that edge with only the slightest of nudges required to fall, doesn't have thoughts of what comes after. That must be the darkest and loneliest of places to exist, if oblivion is the only path you can envisage. And I guess she just wanted the noise to stop, with no thought for what lay beyond. So yeah, the two of you were the first casualties of our new apocalypse settlement. Hence, why I think this has hit everyone like a freight train. The thing that really scares me is that you're unlikely to be the last, given the current state of the world. That terrifies me more than I can articulate. We've done little other than grieve. After your funeral, I virtually locked myself away for the first three days. Selfish is all hell, I know. Considering the hefty weight I hung around Nate's neck in pulling the trigger for me, but I couldn't function. I think I said in my last entry that I've never really lost anyone close to me before. Whenever someone I knew died, it was the obligatory shock and "oh man, that's shit" comment. But I never really felt anyone's death before. I've never really been close enough to anyone except Dean and Maria to, well, to basically care enough. As shitty as that sounds, I knew a big circle of people pre-end of days, but those inside the circle of trust were few. 
Mostly everyone else was in my triangle of suspicion or my square of disappointment. I think I've done three of the grief stages these past two weeks. Denial and anger were certainly my go-to states early on. I couldn't fathom I wouldn't see or speak to you again, or huff with open envy at your radiant skin and flawless features, only to hear that musical laugh you had, which was like the tinkling of a bell, at my fake outrage. Anyone who came near me got the short and snappy version of Lockie, my only desire to be left alone with my little guy particles so we could grieve. I've done a lot of apologizing these past couple of days before I sat down to write again. I don't do depression well. I've mentioned before my moods are extreme ends of the scale. I'm in your face, Tigger on crack, or I'm or after down as washed down with cheap bourbon having a pity party for one. I don't really have a middle ground. Laugh or cry, that's me. I've moved, I think, to the bargaining stage now. I'm looking for meaning. I'm reaching back out to those around me, and as expected, they held no ill will or judgment. The hugs I got from Maria and Nora made me realize I should have reached out much earlier to them, but when grief puts its big boot in the crack of your ass, you don't get much wiggle room. Logic and reason go right out the window. So, here I am, back at the keyboard. I realized just how much my storytelling and rattling stream of consciousness helped keep my emotions and thoughts in some kind of order. And it's weird how therapeutic it's become now. This is my version of lying on a couch and talking about the random shitstorm of thoughts and feelings that make me who I am. It's a release in a way. Lord knows I'm in need of some therapy after everything. I've processed everything this past week. The god-awful fuckery here at the lodge when I heard Ariel's mind break and I had to leave her. The horror of the apartment block and its tales of tragedy pulling the trigger on live people at Castle Bancroftstein for the first time. The sight and stench of the ten women executed there. And then you, Freya. You were the weight that tipped me over, that caused me to crumble under the press of emotion that had been threatening to consume me for weeks. So, now you're my therapist, which is kind of weird when you consider it. It's your death I'm trying to come to terms with after all. Talking to you while you silently listen wherever you are, unable to respond, about your death. Hmm. Yeah, it's weird. But it's all I've got. Everyone has done their part in holding shit together. I mean, it's not like I'm the keystone to our little settlement here but I am Nate's only reliable partner for venturing beyond the gate. He's used this grieving time to start live, firing with Alicia and Mark, busying himself with the familiar, as your death only emphasized just how much we lack in both defense and attack. Nora's knowledge of the shotgun is a handy last resort, as displayed in dealing with Laura's reanimated body. But the woman is in her early sixties and isn't going to be clearing buildings or pulling sentry beyond the gate, Though, I don't doubt she could. That woman is a rock. Nate and I can't be the only active shooters, so Alicia and Mark need to get up to speed. By all accounts, they're doing pretty well. Safe, sensible and steady, at least when doing drills. You never really know how anyone's going to react when the shit hits the fan, until said shit hits the aforementioned fan and it starts flinging around. Still. All the groundwork is done. This situation got me thinking about who else is out there as well. Bancroft's macabre setup won't be the only band of survivors we come across, I'm guessing. And we can't bank on any new communities or individuals we cross paths with being amenable to trade or alliance. People are suspicious, scared, and desperate. And those three things make for an explosive mix. Plus, some people, as Bancroft adroitly showed us, are just fucking rotten. 
sigh. Anyway, I will continue to grieve, but I've had my self-indulgent pity party, and winter is coming. There's a lot to think about and a shit ton of stuff to do, so now I have to put my own feelings aside for the moment and join the collective again. And the best way to start these dark new days is with a hot shower. October 2nd, 2010. Demons at the door. The rain has finally let up, but the world outside is drowned, so we're still getting under each other's feet. There isn't a great deal of personal space to be had, except when sequestered away in our own rooms, so it's taking time to really get used to this new way of life. Still, they're good people, and everyone is making the best of it we can. I'm grateful for Grace and Theo's bungalow attached to the lodge. Though, it's a little emptier without you here, Freya. I can't face going into your room just yet, though I know I'll have to eventually. Hell, sooner or later, we'll have to give that space to someone else. But it's too soon right now. For the moment, it's still just me, Nate and Particles living in here. I decided to use my renewed desire for contribution by helping Nate with the weapons maintenance. He's a stickler for regular cleaning, and to be honest, the simplicity of the task was what my brain needed. I was doing something of value, as I hate sitting idle, but it's not taxing. Nate is also great to be around when you're low, because he's so unobtrusive. If you just want to work in silence, he lets you, and the two of us spent an hour in comfortable quiet, each with our own thoughts, as we worked our way through the weapons that needed attention. I have to keep reminding myself what I asked of him, so I don't forget the burden I placed on him that day we lost you. He took that gun from me, pulled the trigger that you'd asked me to pull, without hesitation or word of recrimination. He takes so much on himself when he must already carry so much from his time in the military, and he does so without expectation or need for gratitude. He just does it, no questions asked, no judgment. I felt it was time I addressed it. We'd been sitting in silence at the bungalow's small dining table, the smell of gun oil hanging in the air, when I finally spoke up. I never thanked you, I said quietly. He didn't look up from his work. For? For? Freya. I had to forcibly push your name out. None needed. In that you're wrong, I sighed. After door nine, he cut me off, still not looking up as he worked at one of the rifles. When you can't carry the weight, you let your team share the burden. You keep putting that burden on yourself, I chided. I can carry the weight. Can you, though? I put the cloth down and looked at him squarely. Can you ever really get used to this kind of weight? I didn't say I was used to it, Erin, he said softly. I said I can carry it. You never get used to it, not if you've got anything left of your humanity. He sighed, putting down the cloth and moving to the kitchen counter, where he checked the kettle's level, then flicked the switch, my eyes drawn to the little red light. Neither of us said a word as he took two cups from the cupboard, spooning coffee from a jar into each, before he turned back to me and leaned on the kitchen counter, folding his thick arms across his chest. You've adapted better than most to this new world, he said. But there are things now that no amount of training and drills can prepare you for. That young couple. His words trailed off for a moment as he swallowed a hard lump, closing his eyes as he took a slow breath, gathering himself before continuing. What we saw in that apartment is unheard of. I've seen the worst of the worst do the worst you can imagine to their fellow man. And I still wasn't prepared for that. But I've learned over a long career and bitter experience how to compartmentalize Erin. 
I've learned to spread the weight over time. But I don't ever get used to it. And I'd never want to. It reminds me I'm still human. I just want this feeling to go away, I admitted. To box it off. Nate shook his head, turning back to the kettle as it came to the boil. We both waited in silence for the light to flick out. Grief doesn't go away, Erin, he said, eyes fixed on the stream of boiling water as he poured. Despite what people say, time isn't a healer. You never really heal from grief. All you do is learn to manage it better. It's a sneaky bastard, though, and you've always got to be aware of it, or it'll creep up on you when you least expect it. I absorbed this, nodding my thanks as Nate placed a fresh black coffee on the table in front of me as he returned to his chair. We sat in silence for a moment again, both sipping at our steaming beverages, sorting through our private thoughts. You're just starting out, he said, drawing me from my mental wonder. I don't expect you to be able to put these things in a box and shove it to the dusty corners of your mind in a handful of weeks or months. You've lost a friend for the first time, and grief never gets easier. But there's something particularly raw about that first experience. It rips a hole in you that you think can never be filled and will forever remain empty. He sipped at his cup again, no doubt recalling that first ragged wound of his own grief that he spoke of. And that made me wonder at it, too. There's still so much I don't know about Nate, and he hasn't talked of his life before the world ended in any great detail. In truth, I haven't asked, even though I've joked before I was going to. Who knows what wounds lie there? I don't want to be the one to aggravate them, and I figure he'll tell me in his own sweet time. If I've learned anything from my first experience of real grief, it's that grief is a very private thing. I wouldn't want anyone questioning me if I wasn't ready to talk about it. So until he is, Nate's history is his own. Freya wasn't even dead, and you were already grieving, denying it was happening asking questions of yourself if there was another way, whether there was something you could do to stop this god-awful thing from happening. He shook his head. There wasn't, Erin. There was nothing you could do. Pulling that trigger yourself at that moment would have taken something that you weren't ready to lose just yet. He put his cup down, and in a rare show of physical affection, he placed his calloused hand over mine his eyes boring right through me. You didn't put a burden on me, Erin, he said, his voice resolute. You allowed me to take one from you, and that's a big difference. Don't ever apologize for asking for help. I cried again then, and Nate held onto my hand, the rough callus of his thumb coarse against my skin as he gently rubbed the back of my hand. He didn't say anything else, just let me purge myself of the swell of emotion that had been building through the conversation. I'd felt such terrible guilt during the time I locked myself away. Guilt that I couldn't do what you asked of me, Freya, and guilt for asking Nate to endure the pain of your mercy killing. I'd thought I was so weak, yet the truth is simpler than that, I've realized. Nate's words reassured me that it isn't me that's weak. It's Nate that is so damn strong. He carries so much weight for me, for all of us. So it has me wondering, who helps him with his burdens? Sooner or later, after so many years of death and misery and pain, what is this man's limit? It seems endless, which has me in awe of him, but for all the strength he has, that strength has to be finite. It has to be. As I dried the tears with the cuff of my sleeve, I made a silent promise to myself in that moment. When that time came, when the weight that Nate carried became too much, when I saw him finally buckle under that strain, 
I would be the one to stand beside him when the demons came knocking at his door. No matter what it cost, no matter how it might break me, I'd do it. Because that's what you do for family. October 4th, 2010. Dark Purpose. So, yesterday, I nearly died of fright. Obviously, I didn't, because here I am, writing about my weird moment of stark terror. But I think I've ruined one pair of pants for all time. Scared the shit near clean out of my arse. With the rain having cleared out for more than a day, Nate decided that a run out beyond the gate would do us good. It was just the two of us, old school style. And I was glad of it. There's a comfortable familiarity when it's just me and Nate. And as much as Mark and Alicia need time in the field, I was glad that this day was just ours. With it just being the two of us, I didn't have to worry about putting on a mask for the others. And it was a chance to find our old rhythm again without any distraction. After all, this was the first sortie out of the lodge I'd had since that dark day a couple of weeks back. Start simple again, we said. We'll just hit a small out-of-the-way convenience store, quick to clear, with potential for fat loot. And that's what we did. There's a little village about three or four miles from where we are, so we decided to go somewhere new. We're lucky in that there's so many places like this around us, out in the greenery of this northern county, that have such small stores. There are two main towns in easy range from our country lodge, one has a population of around 10,000, and the larger one around 20,000. Each town is about three or four miles from where we are in opposite directions, but scattered through the countryside are numerous singular farms, clusters of rural housing, and tiny country villages, with populations in the low hundreds, which is why we're probably able to survive as we are. Shit, I can't even imagine living somewhere like Manchester or Liverpool, which are both around 30 miles from our location. Even our main county towns of Warrington and the city of Chester would be bad enough, as their populations run into six figures. I guess I should count my blessings, if there are any to be found in this end-of-the-world bullshit. Anyway, Heading to one of those nearby villages, this little row of shops is on what passes for a main road through the place, just before a pub on a crossroads that leads to a main road out. They run in a row of five shops in a single terrace, with single bedroom flats above each of them. There's a small local butcher, a tiny pharmacy, a hair salon, a coffee shop cafe, and the aforementioned convenience store. There are houses all along the road before arriving at the small row of shops as well, most of which were bare of cars in their driveways. As a quick side note, I always come back to this question. Where the fuck did all these people go? What location did they have in mind when they threw shit in their cars and headed for the proverbial hills? I mean, we're pretty rural anyway as England goes, so what did they think were the better options? The Welsh countryside isn't a long drive, as Chester is right on the border of North Wales, but the roads to get there would be chaos if they headed onto the motorways. Main highways are just a big, fat no. Lots of traffic, plus apocalypse panic, equals bad. Ha, like I can talk. I went straight for the local bloody high school, and we all know what a genius decision that particular brand of fuckery got me into. You know... One day, when I feel like it and it's a slow day, I'll write about that particular day and the strange detached experience it was. Escaping from my apartment building, the sights I saw as everything fell apart and the fraught with peril run for the school are things I haven't talked about. I probably should. I've never actually written about it, because my opening to these journals was a hyperactive, maddened stream of words as I tried to make sense of my new reality and survive high school for the second time. I've established that particular day was definitely June 23rd after, well, after Nate straight up told me what day it all went to shit. He's all about the deets, Freya.
Back to my near-death experience. The convenience store was locked up tight as we pulled into the small lay-by in front of the shop row, the steel shutter rolled down and sealed by a heavy padlock. Unsurprisingly, the space in front of the shops was devoid of any vehicles. A quick visual scan didn't reveal any shambling undead in our immediate vicinity, so we slipped out of the pickup and did a sweep of the immediate area to be sure, and we were good to go. The pharmacy had already been looted quite heavily. We peered in through the glass front to see shelves swept clean at the back where all the prescription medicines were located. We could also see a figure idly shuffling in the rear, and there was zero doubt that the unfortunate woman was anything but dead. Her head lolled to one side at an unnatural angle, the clear sign of a broken neck. There didn't seem to be any other wounds from the rear, but the dark crust of aged blood stood out on the once bright white shoulder of her pharmacist's coat. There's at least one in there, I said quietly to Nate. He just nodded. I'll open the door and give her a whistle, a new brainer when she comes out. Nodding again, Nate took his halligan in both hands, and once his grip was firm, he gave the signal he was ready. Pushing open the door and suppressing a gag at the rancid stench, I grabbed a pack of baby wipes from a nearby shelf and rammed it under the door to jam it open, gave a low whistle to get the thing's attention, then stepped back to await her bumbling shuffle out of the shop. She did not bumble. She did not shuffle. I couldn't help but gape in frightened confusion as the zombie unerringly worked her way around from the back of the counter through the gap. It was almost like she was using a rope to guide her, with just a few bumps into the counter as she worked her way along until eventually reaching the gap. I'd expected a much longer wait as she aimlessly tried to walk through the obstacle, as these things are invariably dumb as shit, or thought I might have to go into the building and try and bait her out from behind the counter. Instead, her head snapped round, milky eyes looking to me like a targeting system, and her lips peeled back in that silent snarl of hatred that I usually only see in that heart-stopping moment before these evil bastards make their final lunge for you. Nate noticed it too. I glanced at him, my mouth and eyes wide, to find a more inquisitive expression of concern etched into his weathered features. We shared a brief look of, what the fuck, before our attention returned to the undead, steering herself around all obstacles with minimum delay, filled with a purpose and urgency we'd never encountered before. That's when I noticed the second undead emerge, just behind her, initially hidden from sight by my restricted view of the interior. The second one was massively out of place, and truth be told, looked like your quintessential smackhead. Thin as a rake, dirty clothing too big for their withered frame, a mouth of rancid teeth and rotting gums, and a stench that was more than just the alien corruption of the undead. There was a sickness to the creature's stench that pervaded the area around it, a miasma of filth and decay carried through from a life spent craving their next hit of poison to be flushed through their weakening veins, foregoing anything resembling personal hygiene. It was a cloying and fetid odor that infected the senses. The pharmacist's gore-coated mouth matched the bloody chunks missing from the smackhead's calf, forearm and neck, and it didn't take much analysis of the evidence to figure out what happened there. When the world was going to shit, the twitching addict, free from the fears of law enforcement, went to fill his boots with the good stuff. The only wound the pharmacist had was the broken neck, so I reckon she must have tried to fend off the dirty druggie, was pushed into a fall and caught herself on the counter in some way, snapping her neck. Instant death. Meanwhile, her killer started sweeping the shelves clean, probably with accomplices, considering how much stuff was actually missing. Too focused on their treasure trove of prescription drugs, they didn't click to the fact of just how fast the dead turn. The first they would have known of it was when Dr. Death took a bite out of Twitchy McFilth's calf, then climbed up him, or dragged him down, chewing on his arm, and finally his neck. 
exit accomplices in a panic, leaving plus two zombies into the world, stuck in a tiny village pharmacy as a new undead partnership. Waiting. Back to the situation at hand. Dr. Death and Twitchy both moved with chilling purpose through the wreckage of the pharmacy's interior, soundless roars of hatred behind snapping teeth. They moved differently, not faster per se, but smoother, meaner. You might even say, focused. They were both locked onto me like they had laser sights, and the way they looked at me with those sightless eyes coated in that sickly film caught my breath for a moment, and I instinctively took a backwards step. I just wanted to be away from them. Nate, calm as ever, waited for the pharmacist to step out into the open, then dropped her in one smooth arc, the Halligans a spike biting deep into her temple and cutting her strings. She went from silent predator to lifeless husk in the blink of an eye. Not even trying to wrestle with the Halligan, Nate released his grip, drew that mini sword from his hip, and let Twitchy lunge as he exited the store, stepping aside and letting the undead addict topple over the woman he had no doubt murdered. As soon as the smackhead smashed teeth first into the concrete, a sound that I will never get used to, Nate had one knee between its shoulder blades, pressing it to the ground as he pulled back its greasy mop of lank hair and smashed the knife through its eye. Emotionless, efficient, and so very Nate. You saw that, right? I asked him, fighting for breath. Aye, answered Nate, wiping the blade on the corpse, then standing to wrangle the halligan out of the pharmacist's skull. I'll not lie. It shook me. A lot. I've gotten somewhat used to the lunge as they draw near. But holy shit. This thing was on it from the get-go. That thing wanted me dead. Somehow the creature made it feel personal, and that scares me, however stupid a thought it might be. What the fuck was that, Nate? I asked, even though I knew he didn't have the answer. Both of them moved like they had, like they had a fucking mission. Nate nodded. Not the time to be thinking on it right now, Erin, he advised. Get your head back in the game. While I was still trying to get my wits about me and return my heart rate to some semblance of normality, a new voice caused both of us to turn. Keys, old man. There were three of them, two men and one woman. They were probably about my age, but their ragged appearance made them look older. All three were dirty, emaciated, cursed with rotting mouths and flaccid waxen skin covered in sores. Their appointed leader had a hood pulled up and my eyes were drawn to the handgun he pointed in our direction. The two behind him, nervous and twitching, both wielded melee weapons. The second guy held a butcher's cleaver, no doubt taken from the small butcher in the row of shops. The woman had a baseball bat, though she looked like she was shitting bricks, eyes darting from the gunman to Nate. My eyes were drawn to her bared arms, covered in the telltale tracks of heroin needles. They had to be Twitch's accomplices. I can only assume they had taken residence, or already lived in one of the flats above the row of shops. Our arrival had triggered them into venturing out, seeking an opportunity. Nate looked them up and down and, I shit you not, just sighed. Like having an unstable smack head with a twitchy trigger finger was little more than another minor inconvenience adding to an already shitty day. Son, I'm in no mood for this, he said, turning full on to face them. He rested one hand lightly on the glock at his hip, which made Hoodie wave the gun in a threatening manner. The clench in my jaw was aching, and my whole body coiled into a wincing grimace, expecting the report of gunshot any second. Nate, however, didn't bat an eyelid. Don't you fucking dare, old man, ordered the gunman. You draw that gun and I'll cap your ass. Cap my... Nate snorted and shook his head. Too many movies, Sonny, he said derisively. 
let me tell you how this is going to go. Recently, I've lost someone dear to me, and today I've had my fill of death putting these two down. He gestured vaguely behind him to the two lifeless corpses. Have no taste for putting any of the living down today, even though you three smackheads barely qualify as alive. Still, I'm going to give you a pass, despite you filthy junkies probably being responsible for that lady's death. I'm tired, and my friend and I just want to pick up some supplies, load up our truck, and head back to our people. So consider this your lucky day. Now, off your fuck. The three of them stared incredulously at Nate, and I joined them, my mouth hanging open catching flies as he stared back at them, bored by the whole situation. Hoodie recovered himself first. Maybe you missed the peace point in your way? Nate sighed theatrically. Maybe you missed the word replica written on the side of your toy gun, which the morning sun is lighting up for all to see, thanks to that stupid sideways grip. I couldn't help it. I started laughing, and it was only made worse by the look of stark, naked terror that replaced the nervous bravado the three of them had been trying to project. I was nearly choking in a fit of giggles at the stupidity of the whole situation as Nate calmly drew his own weapon. This, however, is a very real Glock 17, which will fire 7.5 grams of solid lead at a speed of around 1,200 feet per second, causing all kinds of merry hell when that ballistic trauma scrambles your insides. I've been firing live rounds since before any of you were even twitches in your daddy's balls. So, I'll give you this one last chance. Then Nate turned it up to eleven, giving them his best tombstone voice. Drop your toys and fuck off. Replica gun, meat cleaver, and bat clattered to the concrete, and the three junkies fled at full sprint, not even daring to glance back. Bellens, muttered Nate, sheathing his glock. The back door of the convenience store was broken in, the junkies clearly using it as their own personal pantry. So we pulled the pickup round back and loaded up with all kinds of edible goodies, bottled water, and essential consumable supplies. A world without toilet paper genuinely scares me, that would do well for our winter stores. They were definitely residing in one of the flats, judging by the fucking rancid pile of garbage and human waste outside one of them. Absolutely vile, especially as their insides must have twisted up not getting their regular heroin fix. Honestly, I'm amazed they weren't all dead from overdosing on the prescription stuff they took, we could have got the gear out of the flat if there was any left, but there was no way I was walking into that particularly fetid corner of the apocalypse. Three junkies, no personal hygiene, for three months in one little single bedroom flat while they're mostly in withdrawal. That tiny abode would look and smell like hell's asshole, so that was a big fucking nope from me, and the motion was seconded by Nate. The encounter with the three junkies and Nate's Shoe fly don't bother me, approach to them, had cheered me considerably. But on the way back to the lodge in the comfort of the pickup's cab, my thoughts turned back to the dead eyes of that pharmacist as a head snapped round in my direction. And the dark purpose contained within those sightless orbs. October 6th, 2010. The Wall. Shit is getting really freaky, Freya. It's like losing you was a catalyst that sparked off some bad juju. I was still all wigged out by Dr. Death's laser focus and purposeful stomp through the pharmacy, but the best way to shrug off shit like that is to jump right back in. Today, we decided to go out on a run to survey new petrol stations. Nate and Mark had done a run to fill up the baby tanker, when I'd been sequestering myself in my room after your funeral. I hadn't even known that until a couple of days back. Nate told me that little factoid on our two-person jaunt to the Smackhead Concord convenience store. 
It was the nearest station to our little country abode, so we decided to scout our next potential source of fuel, as we're likely to be chugging through it come the winter. We can't rely on just the solar power to run that place for all of us and keep it warm. So, until we can figure out some wood burners, Mark can wire in the generators taken from Castle Bancroftstein so we can all still have hot showers, and Charlie can play Mario Kart through the dark and miserable winter months. Power is vital, and we need to make sure we have it, so our best bet is fuel generators. I don't know about the ins and outs of the power they generate, but those four taken from Bancroft's house have got the horsepower to keep us warm through the winter on top of the solar power storage, according to Mark. Ultimately, though, those generators need to be juiced. So, Nate and I decided to take Alicia along with us for some scouting experience, as Mark is currently in the process of doing some MacGyver shit to the lodge and building a soundproofed little outhouse for those generators. I'm amazed how much shit that guy knows and can do. He's been digging out the foundations for it and filling them with concrete today, and he'll be doing some anti-vibration stuff on the floor when it's all set. All the base materials were at Bancroft's place for all the early part, but he still needs bricks to build this outhouse, so that'll be next on the agenda. We'll have to hit a builder's yard and get a proper vehicle to do that, and Mark knows of such a place that's on the outskirts of town, where we can pick up those supplies that's unlikely to be surrounded by hordes of the undead. Got to love this small town living thing. There are back roads to just about anywhere if you know the area. That aside, we have to make sure we've got a steady income of fuel for the winter, so we can keep the lights on and top up the solar energy the lodge would soak up. So off the three of us went in our trusty pickup. Alicia was being trusted for the first time, and was now carrying a pistol at her hip, and a shotgun acquired from Bancroft's illegal armory that has a pump action and can fit six shells in the breech. UK legal shotguns can only have a capacity for three. She wasn't ready for the assault rifle, but she'd practiced with a shotgun, and Nate says she's become quite proficient with it, even attached to it. He says it's like a magic item that she draws strength from when it's in her hand. The magic item? I'm fucking telling you, there's a fantasy nerd buried deep in this old soldier. Sorry, Nate. Marine. First is Gollum references, now he's talking about magic items. Did this gruff old monster while away his boring hours in the service with a secret cabal of D&D squaddies? Though, if he ever says, I put on my robe and wizard hat, I'm ending him. I'm all about the geek culture, but the moment he goes all blood ninja, kaboom, no more Nate. That's just too much weird, even for me. It seems my ability to digress is slowly returning. Back to it, Lockie. When Nate and I planned the hits on Bancroft's fuel runs, I spoke about the next station they would have to raid if their chosen one ran dry. It meant running through the middle of town and down the main dual carriageway that runs through its center. Up the far end of town, there are a couple of larger stations attached to two of the town's largest supermarkets, they were popular and likely have deep reserves, so that was the theory we were working to. We had to scout them to make sure they were even accessible, as remember me mentioning how I thought the supermarkets would be scenes from the ninth level of hell? Well, we didn't even get to find out. You know what's really fucking weird, other than what I'm about to tell you? As we were leaving... Particles was all up in my shit, nearly tripping me over, bouncing round on his tiny legs all freaked out. He's never like that when I leave, as he gets so much love from everyone when I'm out, especially Charlie. Those two are homeboys for life now and cute as all hell together. I kneeled down to calm him, scratching him behind his ears and under the chin. But he looked at me with those massive puggy eyes, and I swear to God, it was like he was pulling his best pleading expression with me. Like he really didn't want me to go. I put it down to him getting used to me being around after the funeral, when the two of us locked ourselves away for a time, and he was my emotional support pug. Plus, when I'd returned from our storeroom the other day, 
He could clearly sense I was on edge and spent that evening snuggled on my lap. We left and I put it out of my mind as I put my game face on. Now I'm back and after what we witnessed, I can't help but think that Particles fucking knew something was coming. It was weird. I joked about him being our lucky pug when we found him, because he did stop us getting sideswiped by a runaway truck filled with the undead. And the little dude basically saved my ass by blowing a zombie's head clean off when I was a certain goner. Weird it is, Freya. Just fucking weird. Right, so we were traveling in the pickup towards the center of town, following the road that passed by the court building where Shooty McFuckface tried to gun us down. It's weird how long ago that seems, yet it was hardly any time at all. But after the Prius explosion that likely drew in a mass of undead, we reasoned any such mass had likely ambled apart over the weeks, drawn away by whatever little sounds captured their mindless attention. We couldn't have been more wrong. What the living fuck? muttered Nate, slowing the pickup to a halt, but leaving the engine ticking over. His words were somewhat ironic, stretching from the burnt-out wreck of our deceased Prius right across all four lanes of the carriageway and up to the court building. There was a fucking sea of undead. There was nothing living about it at all. I'm not talking the couple of hundred that shuffled out of the shopping centre all those weeks ago that I played British Bulldog with. Shit, no. There's got to be nigh on a thousand breathed Nate, answering my unspoken query as to the number. Military folk always seem to have a knack for estimating numbers. My estimate was in the region of a metric fuckton, which is less than, oh my fucking God, but considerably more than, well, isn't this a pickle? Bear in mind this town's population total was probably just over 10,000, so we're talking 10% of the town's population in this wall. How the hell did they all get here from all over town? The explosion of the Prius? Shit, there's been gunfire galore since that day with our running battles with Bancroft's crew. Gunfire echoes for some distance, and those storms of screaming lead and rattling rifles should have drawn the mass away from this location like flies to shit. It doesn't make any sense. They weren't just strung out in a scattered mess in the manner we usually find crowds of undead. This was a wall of the undead, and if you'd handed them costumes and shields, they could have been lined up like the ranks of an undead Roman legion. They were shoulder to shoulder, a dense mass of motionless hate, just waiting, not shuffling, nor ambling in their aimless way. They were an impassable barrier to the far side of town, like undead Spartans and their allies packing the narrow pass of Thermopylae, and they weren't letting us Persian fuckers through to our promised land. They were a monstrous, ravenous wall of darkness. Just waiting. Do they usually do this kind of thing? whispered Alicia, her eyes bright and wide, her disbelief equal to ours. No, murmured Nate. No, they don't. What do we do? I asked. And then the weirdest thing of the whole fucking day happened. The moment I spoke, the spark of demonic life ignited in the undead, and hundreds of eyes snapped round, locking onto us. I say us, but it felt like me. Nate and Alicia had muttered in low tones, and there was no reaction. The moment I'd opened my mouth, just as softly as my two compadres, every fucking head snapped round in our direction, and that tight mass of aberrations began to ooze forward with that same purposeful stomp. I nearly shit my heart out of my ass. That movement is far more terrifying than their hateful looks my way. It's been easy to laugh with dark humour at the brainless meander of the undead pockets we've encountered. I laughed like a maniac when I dodged and weaved through the lesser mass in the shopping centre when I was trying to flank Bancroft's useless sniper. 
but I wouldn't have raised even a titter if the undead had been moving like this on that day. They don't run, thank fuck, and they don't necessarily move much faster. But it's all in the way they move, like they'll walk through any obstacle that stands in their way to get where they're going, like they know where they need to be. And where they wanted to go was exactly where I was sitting. It wasn't just the front rank or a group splintering from the mass. It was the whole fucking horde. Nate, I urged, get us the fuck out of here right fucking now. Aye, he agreed, throwing the pickup into reverse and thundering back at speed before whipping it round in a 180 and getting us the hell out of Dodge. I looked in my passenger side mirror and shivered, seeing the mass of undead still plunging forward, eyes locked to us as we sped off into the distance. We'll leave it for today, eh? said Nate, not turning to look at me. His eyes remained focused on the road, but I heard the note of concern in his voice. He's sharp as hell, and I'm fairly sure he picked up on the fact that the undead legion didn't do diddly shit until I opened my mouth. I'm still freaked out by the whole experience. Particles is on my lap now, staring at this screen as I record the events, as though checking the validity of my words, making sure I haven't missed anything. I don't know what's going on, Freya. Something has changed, and for the first time in as long as I can remember, I am genuinely fucking scared. October 7th, 2010. The Home Front. I woke up still unnerved by yesterday's experience, and in truth, I hadn't really slept much anyway. So I decided to hit pause on another venture out today, and Particles seemed more relaxed because of it, though we still didn't leave my side. Even when I went to take a piss, I came out of the bathroom to find him sitting doggedly, pun intended, outside the door, pulling sentry while I was at my most vulnerable. I'm not really sure what he could have managed in terms of defense, though. He's not exactly a vicious attack dog. I mean, what was he going to do? Distract any potential enemy with his tiny brand of cuteness or majestic withering gaze? Still, it's the thought that counts. Love my little guy. It's about 5 p.m. now, and I decided to spend today hanging about the house and learn some new skills. Nora is basically the font of all knowledge and sagely wisdom. So I thought I'd hang out with her, tending the garden, help her cook, learn some new skills and all that jazz. That woman is amazing, and it really felt like I was hanging out with my grandma. At least, I assume that's what hanging out with a grandma feels like. I never had the joy of grandparents or parents, or siblings. Life was just one big battle for survival and safety from the get-go. But hanging out with Nora, with her gentle demeanor and surprisingly wicked sense of humor, was just what I needed. We got to talking, and I inevitably asked about kids. The fact she was living on her farm alone when the world died always stuck in my mind, and I wondered if she was ever visited by a kids or grandkids. No, she answered, a little hint of regret evident in the way she said it. Sadly, that was never in the stars for me and my bill. She tapped her midriff with the soiled trowel she was using to turn over some earth. Something wasn't wired up right inside me. We tried and tried, both got tested, and turned out it was me. I'm sorry. I said, meaning it with every fiber of my being. She would have been a great mother and an even better grandma. It is what it is, Flower, she replied with a shrug. She calls everyone Flower. It's her thing. I kinda like it. No sense being bound in the chains of things we can't change. Didn't you try IVF or whatever? Or adoption? She shook her head. IVF treatment was relatively new at the time, and has only in the last few years been made available on the NHS. 
it was far too expensive for us. So, we tried adoption, but we got so disheartened by the miles of red tape and hoops we had to jump through, Bill and I finally gave up. We were disappointed late in the process on three occasions, and those three times took up a total of five years of our life in agonized waiting and stress. After the third, we just couldn't face starting the process all over again. I don't know why, but this made me really fucking angry. Not at her, Freya, just to clear that up, but the system. It took all of two minutes for the police and social services to come and drag my six-year-old self away. But shit, if I'd been adopted by someone like Nora and her husband, I'd have been in seventh heaven. How is it that obviously good people can't give a single child a loving home, but the system can stack us all up in group homes where we're left to go near feral or bounce from foster home to foster home, where some of those people are doing it just for the money? Don't get me wrong. There are plenty of truly amazing people fostering kids who have hearts of gold that genuinely care for the kids that pass through their lives as they try to pick them up from the floor and teach them self-reliance, strength, self-respect and good old honest values. But there are those who use it as an income stream and they were the ones I always found myself thrust into before inevitably bouncing back to group homes. Some of those people were fucking Victorian in their methods. Children should be seen and not heard, speak only when spoken to, and all that dated bullshit. Hell, I even got a slap or two on occasion as I'm not exactly famed for my patient restraint. My smart mouth was reddened by many an open-handed slap in my time. They were always clever with it, though, and never did anything that would leave a real mark. If you complained, you were just the problem child with a history of lies, deceit, and incivility. That Nora and Bill couldn't get a child of their own seemed criminal and a complete failure of not just two amazing, loving people who just wanted a child to care for, but a failure of that kid who could have had a home and a chance at a new, normal life. We just got on with our lives, continued Nora. We had a good life together, me and my Bill. Strong and stable, working for each other all the time. And we always talked. That's the key to any real relationship, Flower. Communication. I wouldn't know, I shrugged. That's just because you haven't met the right man yet. She gave me a wink. If it's men you're into. I laughed. It is, though I think my problem is I keep finding boys, not men. They exist, flower. You just have to pan through the dirt to find the gold. Unless it's fool's gold, I snorted. I hate that I sounded bitter thinking back on it. I've said earlier on that I never really got the love thing, except when I was viewing it through a window, an observer on the outside looking in. Honestly, it's never really bothered me. But with the world mostly dead or undead, I realize the pool I can choose from has vastly decreased. There aren't that many fish left in the proverbial sea these days. Well, said Nora, let me give you these two pieces of advice when that opportunity does come along in how to judge its worth. Firstly, your relationship should be a sanctuary, not a battlefield. Whenever you find yourselves faced with adversity, you should remember one simple rule. It isn't you against them. It's the two of you against the problem. See, sagely wisdom from my adoptive grandma. And the second? Love is not a chain that can hold a relationship together on its own. It isn't an all-powerful binding force like you read in books or depicted in movies. Love isn't a chain, but a rope made from hundreds of tiny threads, all bound up and entwined over the years by the two of you, 
to create that strength through patience and partnership. All the little things are far more important than any grand display of romance or act of love. Nora quirked a little smile of remembrance then. My Bill had a wonderful saying that came from his father when his dad was teaching him about the values of being a man. He'd say the greatest way to teach any child about love and respect was by the manner the parents treated each other. I always liked that. I liked that as well, and it rang true for me. Shit, my parents were junkies and my dad was a raging abusive cockrot. It was Dean and Maria who showed me how love really works. Both had incredibly stressful jobs in the police and nursing, jobs that were criminally underpaid considering the amazing and difficult tasks they had to do every single day. But all that stress, all that drama and horror they'd experience on a daily basis only strengthened them. Bearing in mind as well they're both black and both were racially abused regularly in the stressful situations that made up their life. Yet they never turned to hate. Instead, they used each other for strength. Maria said something to me once when I asked how she and Dean managed to do it. Relationships aren't 50-50, Erin. They're 100% all the time, from both people. And in those times when one can't bear all the weight, the other carries their share for a while. Most importantly of all is that you never, ever keep score. I feel better after today. Nora has this aura of calm around her, and Maria is the same. To make sure we're all keeping healthy, Maria is constantly issuing everyone personalized vitamin supplements from the pharmacy halls we've had, keeping all of us topped up in vitamin C, calcium, cod liver oil, omega-3, blah, blah, blah. Both are amazing caregivers, incredibly strong-willed women, and I don't think I could ask for two better role models to aspire to. Nate might be the powerhouse, the great wall that surrounds us and keeps us safe and protected from the violence beyond the gate. But Maria and Nora have quickly become the foundations that our little community is built on. I find myself more and more thankful every day about the people that have become my new family. It's forced me to think about the others and how I should really get to know the likes of Isaac, Mark and Alicia better on a personal level. Charlie's easy to hang with, as I can drop down to a nine-year-old's level in a blink. For most of my life, I've been experimenting with the theory that adolescence won't actually end until my thirties anyway. Nate, Mark and Alicia all went out together today, heading for that builder's yard to acquire an appropriate vehicle to bring back a load of bricks and other useful materials. We need lumber, tools, cement, a proper cement mixer to save Mark having to mix it all by hand, bricks, and all other kinds of stuff. I let Mark deal with that. I should make him a cape with a big H on it for handyman and make him wear some underpants over his work trousers. The level of knowledge and ability in that dude is staggering. Genuine superpower level stuff. Oh shit, I forgot. I had a few games of Mario Kart with Charlie this afternoon, and as we were shooting the shit in our childish glee, he happened to mention it's his birthday at the end of the month. He's 10 on the 27th, and that's the big double-figure landmark that kids get their swagger on for. With it being only a few days away from Halloween as well, we should damn well throw a shindig for the kid. He's got no other kids around to join in the party, so, I'm going to recruit the closest thing to a child here to party plan. That would be me, should you be wondering. I have an evil plan beginning to hatch that Nate will genuinely hate me for, which means now I have to do it. Tomfoolery for the win. I'm aiming to bring that back, Freya. Tomfoolery. It's just such a stupid word. I love it more each time I say it. Everything's been such a deluge of misery and grief of late. So it's time to luckify the lodge and throw a party to put a smile on this awesome kid's face. For clarity, Freya, 
that time I was talking about Charlie, if you were wondering, though I admit I am a big kid at heart. But shit, this plan is so evil to Nate, it'll make the whole thing even funnier. I mean, I can always accuse him of wanting to ruin Charlie's first apocalypse birthday, and his tenth, no less, if he doesn't play along. Guilt, the chosen weapon of all immature assholes. Hmm, actually, it's starting to get a little dim outside. Largely this is due to a thick overcast autumn sky, but still... It's almost 5.30pm, and the three of them aren't back yet. The sun won't go down for another couple of hours, but I can't help being a little worried. Nate's always so damn punctual. October 7th, 2010. Second entry. Where are they? It's 9pm, Freya. I'm really fucking worried now. I've tried Nate on the walkie every 15 minutes for the past three hours, but there's still no answer. The builder's yard might be on the edge of its range. Shit, I hope that's it. The alternative is too fucking scary to consider, but something is definitely wrong. I'm going out. In the dark. Alone. There are no other trained guns here. It's all on me. Fuck. My girl. Where did they all come from? Mark's voice held a note of barely contained panic as the three of them looked down at the mass of undead filling the builder's yard. Nate stared down miserably at his rifle and radio lying at the foot of their precarious sanctuary. All he had was his Glock with two spare magazines. At 17 rounds each, it simply wasn't enough for the task. Well, that's the burning question, isn't it? murmured Nate. Loadout wise, they could never have prepared for the horde that had poured into the yard, but Nate cursed himself for his rare complacency. There were rows of houses either side of the road further down, and small industrial units dotted further up but even if they all emptied, it should not have generated a horde of this magnitude. Nate was having trouble grasping the sheer scale of the undead assembled below them, but even more difficulty in trying to understand the how. Arriving mid-morning, they had cleared the offices and yard of any lingering undead after finding the gates open. There had been only four on the premises in total, and a quick scan of the scene had revealed why. An accident with a forklift had crushed a worker's leg under a fallen pallet, and with no emergency response coming as the world started to burn around them, the poor bastard had died from blood loss and shock. The evidence of blood-stained teeth and another worker in a high-vis vest shuffling around with a ragged chunk missing from his arm told the old marine a clear story. The driver of the forklift had been next to the man, racked with guilt at injuring his colleague, and the speed of the turn caught him unawares. Bitten, the man had retreated into the office where he likely turned after bleeding out, the vast rivers of blood signifying the likelihood of a brachial artery tear. Two people had been killed in the ensuing chaos of his reanimation, and any other surviving employees had fled, some of them likely with bites to accelerate the spread of the menace. Nate and the others had put all four undead down with melee weapons, to keep noise to a minimum. The rest of the day had been largely uneventful, as the three of them worked to assemble everything Mark needed onto a flatbed truck, emblazoned with the name and number of the wholesaler. The truck was fitted with a loader crane just behind the cab, combined with hydraulic stabilizers to deploy while in operation. Able to easily lift huge stacks of bricks, it would be a useful addition to their vehicles, and finally allow them a means to move wood burners from nearby farmhouses into the lodge, ready for winter. After hunting down the truck's keys in the office, all they had to do was locate the materials and tools Mark needed for his planned projects, secure it to the truck, then Nate and Alicia would ride back in the pickup and Mark would drive the loader truck. 
It would be a tight turn on the small country road through the gates of the lodge, but perfectly achievable. All in all, they'd had a positive day. Until they didn't. It was around 4 p.m. when they finished securing the last of the items to the truck. All three were tired, both from the mental drain of forever being on alert and the back-breaking physical labor required in the loading. Then a single word from Alicia dragged their attention to the gate. Zombie! One appeared, then four, then ten, then thirty. Nate had muttered a curse for not checking the street more meticulously. Caught up in their work, they'd grown complacent as the day wore on. With so many, the only option was to start shooting, and Nate gave the order, giving Mark and Alicia a baptism of fire. Anyone going beyond the gate had to carry a sidearm as backup on Nate's insistence. So both carried glocks at their hip, and the two of them were armed with pump shotguns. Neither carried more than 20 shells, though. Six in the weapon, six on the barrel neatly lined up in sheaths, and a further eight in deep, easily accessible pockets. Both carried a 17-round Glock with one spare magazine. Any engagement expected to go beyond that meant that no amount of ammunition should justify them hanging around. If they needed more ammo than Nate had deemed necessary for a regular run beyond the gate, the situation demanded exfil with immediate effect. Mark and Alicia were not trained soldiers, so they needed to move. But the only exit to the yard was quickly filling with undead. Nate's loadout was considerably more, with two spare magazines for his L85 at 30 rounds each, and one primed in the weapon. All told, between them they had around 250 rounds, between 5.56, 9mm, and 12-gauge buckshot. Nate could put consistent accurate fire downrange, but Alicia and Mark wouldn't score a kill shot with every trigger pull. They were still novices. Even if they were crack shots, it still wasn't enough. As they started firing, it quickly became apparent that the 30 they could see were only the tip of the proverbial iceberg. More undead came piling in, slow and steady, lacking the purpose they had seen in the unliving wall blocking the central road through town a day earlier. However, despite their amble, they were relentless and densely packed. Within seconds of the shotguns booming and the steady whip crack of Nate's rifle on semi, the gateway was entirely obstructed and the undead oozed into the yard. There was no way of getting to the pickup, parked near the gate as it was, and the flatbed was perpendicular to the gate and needed fully turning before any escape could be made. Inside the offices, bellowed Mark above the roar of gunfire, the pungent smell of discharged ammunition thick in the air. Nate shook his head, wincing a little as a hot casing ejected from the rifle and caught a bare patch of skin on his arm. The last thing he wanted was being trapped inside a building and the unholy monsters surrounding every possible exit. They needed elevation and time to thin the mass from a point of safety. The bed of the truck wasn't high enough, as grasping hands could still reach the edges, and one misstep could see one of them hauled from the truck and ripped to bloody chunks. Even if they killed the undead around the truck and didn't make a mistake, every downed corpse would become a stepping stone for the advancing rear guard, making access to them easier with every kill. They would end up potentially being the architects of their own demise. No. The truck wasn't high enough, and they needed to thin the herd. With how quickly the undead had filled the yard, it was too dangerous to even attempt a bolt for it now. Keep fire steady, stagger it, ordered Nate. Don't let up, always one shooting. Mark and Alicia both looked pale and terrified, but to their credit, they nodded and focused in line with his command, firing alternately and blasting the nearest targets. Every shot didn't kill, but every downed zombie was an obstacle for those behind to navigate, and Nate was gratified when a pack of them went down in a tumble like toppled dominoes, slowing the encroachment. Satisfied he had a moment, Nate glanced round and spied a blue-painted stepladder, the type used in warehouses to reach higher levels of racking. 
It was more like a wheeled staircase, and scanning the area behind them, the veterans spotted an elevated position that would give them the desired level of safety and immediate respite. Back slowly, he called, even as he ran to the wheeled stairway. Towards my voice. Alicia and Mark did so, and he allowed himself a small smile of pride as the dark-haired woman called out, Reloading! Communication was everything, and it took a level of clear thought to keep that up when under pressure. Now she had calmed down a little since her liberation, Alicia had proven to be an apt student. If they ever got out of this mess, he would upgrade her to rifle training. He was certain she had the chops for it now. Nate kept talking, using his voice as a lodestone to guide his two comrades as he wheeled the stairway into position and locked the brake into position. Sweeping his rifle forward, he turned back and moved between the two of them. Up the stairs, on top of the bricks, said Nate. I'll go last. When you get to the top, fire down on them and slow them as much as you can. Mind you don't blow my head off, eh? On top of the bricks, queried Mark. Move, he ordered. This was no time for debate or reassurance. Time was a luxury quickly dissipating as the undead continued to swell. They easily numbered 300 in total, and Nate swore silently as gunfire rattled his senses. Where had they all come from? His heart pounding, the swell thickened and advanced too swiftly, with no way to keep them at bay any longer. The lead zombies were too close, relentlessly plunging forward, their all-too-familiar lunge creeping ever nearer, when the thunder of two shotguns above him rained down into the mass. Puffing his cheeks out in relief, Nate turned and headed for the stairway, but Miss stepped as he placed his boot on the stairs. Intending to bound up them two at a time, his foot was too near the edge and slipped, sending him sprawling forward, his hands flashing out to stop him from smashing teeth first into the metal. A brief blaze of pain flashed up his leg as his shin smashed against the edge of a step. Wincing, Nate quickly regained his footing and began to move up the stairs. Nate, called Alicia, her voice near panic. It was a warning a proximity alert encased in terror. The brief slip had allowed one of the undead to get too close, and neither Alicia nor Mark were willing to risk their amateur shooting skill on a creature so near to him. As he began to push up the steps, his forward momentum was arrested by a tightening pressure across his chest. Somehow, the undead's grasp had latched to the strap attached to his rifle and reflexively gripped it. His forward momentum would be reversed in an instant as the zombie, a couple of steps lower than him, would drag him down. If he tried to fight it, if he tried to risk battling with the undead, his balance would be destroyed and it would be a grim and ignoble end. Years of training, experience, muscle memory and instinct ignited as he processed all the possible outcomes in a millisecond, acting without thought or hesitation. He reached up and released the clip of his makeshift strap, feeling the weight vanish as the material dragged across his chest and the zombie tumbled backwards, taking his rifle with it. Without looking back, Nate bounded up the stairway and climbed to the top of the brick pallets, turned and gave the ladder a savage kick from the side, watching as it toppled away from their perch to crash onto the concrete and pin a handful of undead beneath it. He had no idea if the undead could navigate upwards, but he was taking no chances. Everyone, okay, he panted, heart pounding painfully in his chest. Too damn close. Both were scared and a little wild-eyed, but unharmed. What now? Alicia asked. Call for backup, now we've got a minute, replied Nate, reaching up to his chest. Frowning, he looked down. What the fuck? The radio was gone. Peering off the edge of their 14-foot platform of wrapped bricks, Nate looked down to where his rifle lay on the concrete. A few feet away lay his radio. You've got to be fucking kidding me. What's up? Asked Mark. When I released the strap of my rifle, it must have caught the radio as it whipped back and unhooked it. 
sighed Nate, pinching the bridge of his nose and closing his eyes. It's down there. What do we do now, then? Without the rifle, that's a whole shit ton of ammunition I've got on my person rendered useless. Ammo count? Still got the two magazines of Glock and six shells left, said Mark after a quick count. Same on the Glock and 812 gauge, sighed Alicia. Nate quickly did the sums. So, between us, we've got a total of seven magazines of 9mm, including those in the gun. So that's 85 and 14 buckshot. Shitting hell, he huffed in frustration. That's not enough for all of them, observed Mark. Probably not enough for even a third of them as it stands. No, it most certainly is not. So what do we do? Right now? Mark nodded in response to the query. Nate laid across the top of the plastic-wrapped bricks. We get our shit together and take a minute. But Nate... Mark, he interrupted, his voice low. Right now, we can't do shit. We're safe for the moment. These brick pallets are a solid platform, stacked to 14 feet, and as heavy as my fucking heart is right now. The undead can't shift this weight. The pallets are wrapped in thick plastic sheeting that would need a blade to cut through, banded with metal strapping so they don't shift. So the bastards down there can't knock the bricks out and fuck their stability. He blew out his cheeks, just wanting a moment's respite. Everything has just gone to shit. I'm paggered, and I just need a fucking minute, Reet. Mark and Alicia both looked at him quizzically. What? he demanded. Paggard? Reet? Alicia looked bewildered. Nate snorted. Whenever he was exhausted or had a few too many drinks, the old Yorkshire slang crept back into his vocabulary, the accent of his childhood having been smoothed out over years in the military. Paggard is exhausted. Reet is right, he smirked. All right. Nate looked at his watch. It was a little after 5.30 p.m. They had been trapped on their brick tower for almost an hour and a half, watching with trepidation as the light began to dim behind thick, ominous clouds. Sunset was only a couple of hours away. Despite the heavy rainstorms of the previous week, the autumn had been unseasonably clement so far, and one of the reasons they had done this run to the yard so soon. Mark could use the more temperate climate to get the generator housing built in readiness for the inevitable cold snap. It would still be cold tonight, though. I don't understand where they all came from, said Alicia, echoing Mark's query from moments earlier. What I don't understand is why they've suddenly gone so docile, murmured Nate. Eh? Look at them, he said, flicking a hand at them. Despite us chatting up here, They've gone all docile, like they don't really want us anymore, now we're out of reach. They always react to sound, but they don't give two flying shits about us now they can't get us. It's weird. Everything's weird nowadays, huffed Mark. Weirder than usual, then. What do we do, Nate? Mark struggled to keep the fear from his voice. Charlie's alone back there. I need to get back to him. Aye, you do. But you need to get back to him alive, sunshine. Try and make your escape now and you'll be dead in a snap. And the boy isn't alone, he's well cared for. We can't just sit here. Aye, we can, said Nate. We wait for backup. There is no backup, hissed Mark. Nate turned to face him, a twitch of irritation narrowing his eyes. I get you want to get back to your kid. But listen to me and listen well. We do have backup. She's about five foot six, as agile as a squirrel on steroids, and one of the most resourceful individuals I've ever known, and I've served with some of the best. No one gets left behind with that kid. No one. As if listening from afar, the radio below them crackled into life, the slight Liverpool accent like music to his ears. Nate, you fucking mentalist, where the fuck are you? 
Nate grinned back at Mark and Alicia. There's my girl, he said with a wink. Right on cue. The moment Erin's voice hissed over the radio, the undead appeared to straighten, their sightless gaze aiming down towards the handset, and the swell moved. I swear to fucking God, Nate, if you're fucking with me, I will cut your old man balls clean off. It'll be easy, seeing as those low-hanging fruits slap the water every time you sit down for a shit. Nate couldn't even laugh as Erin's Liverpool accent thickened with anger. It always became more prominent when her blood was up, just as his Yorkshire accent intensified with tiredness or alcohol. Instead of laughing at one of his favourite quirks, he watched in morbid fascination as the undead moved like a creeping tide in the direction of the radio, crowding it in their silent mass. I'm going to keep checking in, Nate, came Erin's voice, slightly muffled by the density of monsters crowding the handset. And if I find you're fucking with me, those balls will come off with rusty scissors operated by my left hand. And I'm not left-handed. I'll make an absolute pig's ear of it, Nate. Her tone changed then. Nate, 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 for fuck's sake, answer me. His heart almost broke as her tone transformed from mock anger to genuine fear at his silence. I'm here, kid, he whispered. I'm right here. The next few hours were torture. Every 15 minutes, Erin's voice crackled into life, sparking the undead to crowd the radio again. And each time, Nate could hear her fear intensify. The humor was gone, and all he could hear was her pleading for him to answer, shouting into the void of the airwaves, demanding to know what was happening. It was killing him. Then, a little after 9 p.m., her voice came over the airwaves again. It was different this time. There was no humor, no fear, no demands. There was iron in it, a fire-tempered resolve that uttered just two more words into the void before the radio fell silent. I'm coming. Staring down into the hungry undead that clamored around the source of her voice, Nate exhaled a long, slow breath. God love you, kid he whispered, but I'm not sure I want you to. October 8th, 2010. Faith. I don't know what's happening, but I know I don't like it, Freya. I can't help but feel a little arrogant when I say this apocalypse seems personal, but I can't ignore the facts. I will start by saying, with a heady amount of relief, that Nate, Mark, and Alicia are all back at the lodge, safe and sound. I'm so fucking grateful they're okay. But holy shit, what a raging clusterfuck I walked into. It's about 2am now, and I need to write all this shit down while it's still in my head. I can't sleep at the minute anyway, because my ribs hurt like a bastard. Maria thinks I might have cracked one or two in my boneheaded rescue. I'll get all this written down, then I'll take the prescription strength painkillers to knock me the fuck out so I can sleep. I know I'll be all fuzzy in the head tomorrow morning from the tramadol afterglow, so I need to get all this down before I enter the blurry haze of industrial strength pain relief. After trying the radio every 15 minutes for like three hours, I think, I decided I couldn't wait any longer. If something had happened, I needed to at least see for myself, and I couldn't wait until morning to do it. It's getting fucking cold of a night now, and if they were hurt or trapped in some way, they didn't have the gear to survive a bitterly cold night. If I rolled up the following day and discovered them dead from hypothermia, well, I'd never be able to live with that guilt. Erin, what are you doing? Maria asked as I began purposefully getting my shit together. I'm going to get them. Alone? Maria's jaw dropped wide, her gaze disbelieving. In the dark? There isn't anyone else, I shrugged. If they're hurt or need help, then I'm all they've got. I'll have to be enough. You're enough, flower, said Nora from the sitting area. 
The comment caught me completely by surprise, spoken as it was with such quiet conviction. Charlie was sat beside her playing on the Xbox, Nora with one protective arm wrapped around the kid's slim shoulders as the handsome little sod snuggled into her. She was keeping his mind from his dad's absence by sitting with him and have him explain every little aspect of his game to keep him distracted. She looked in my direction, unadulterated support etched into every line of her face, and a set to her jaw that said she believed I could do it, that I could bring them home. And holy shit, did that light a fire in my belly. With Nora's blessing, such unquestionable faith given without hesitation, I could face anything with the soaring confidence of a five-year-old in a Batman costume. Fuck all was getting in my way this night, and that old Spartan saying rolled through my head. Come home with your shield, or on it. I bloody love that woman. I needed to go with a solid plan, though. There were still a couple of petrol-slash-electric hybrids left in the small parking area of the lodge from the gong-banging yoga crowd, including a little smart car. You know the ones, those stupid little two-seater things that look absolutely ridiculous that people bizarrely choose to own. On purpose. Huh, I hope that wasn't your car, Freya. I never asked which one was yours. Well, if it was... What the fuck were you thinking, you mad woman? Not cool, Freya. Not cool. My intention was to come back with our pickup, and if I had to abandon one of the vehicles from our long fallen yogi brothers and sisters, it was going to be the tiny twatmobile. Hey, at least it would be dark, and anyone living wouldn't be able to see me dying of shame as I drove that horrible little part electric go kart. Shit, I didn't even want the undead seeing me drive that stupid little thing. I can just imagine zombies pointing and silently laughing at me as I whiz on by in my toy car. Still, at least it would be quiet. I checked there was enough fuel and charge remaining to get me to the builder's yard, and a quick test saw it hum into life. It would easily do the five or six miles there and back on the country roads I'd use to get where I needed to go. Not knowing what I was running into, I had to plan for every eventuality. Maria put together a first aid kit in case someone was hurt. I loaded up extra ammo in case they had burned through their loadout in some form of engagement, chucked in a large bottle of water, and then I did something I had to ask Nate's forgiveness for later. I went into his room. I didn't know what I was going to be driving into and didn't want to approach the yard with headlights ablaze. So I raided Casa de Nate and rooted around until I found his holy grail, his precious NVGs. It took me about 15 minutes to figure out how the things worked. For a little while, I must have looked like someone's technophobe auntie that had just had one of those newfangled virtual reality headsets plonked on their head, thus displaying a spectacular lack of technical acumen. I banged about in his room with the goggles pulled down and light off to check they worked, had a few seconds of slapstick before switching the light on again so I could piss around some more. Eventually, I figured them out sized the banding properly for my dainty little skull instead of Nate's planet head, and was good to go. Loading up a backpack with 556 shells for the shotguns carried by Mark and Alicia, and some extra sidearm ammo, I shouldered my own rifle and headed out into the kitchen. Everyone was there. Nora, Maria, Isaac, Charlie, and my main man, Particles. This time, my home dog didn't try and harass me into staying. I swear to whatever powers might exist beyond the pale, that pug is in tune with something bigger than us. It's like he knows I have to do this and isn't standing, or jauntily hopping and yapping, in my way. Go and get our boys and girl, said Nora, folding me in a hug. Maria, in her familiar way, brushed a loose lock of hair behind my ear, kissed me on the forehead, and just said, be careful. Isaac grinned nervously. Dirty Harriet in the house, eh? I laughed. You're going to get my dad, right? Charlie asked from beside Nora. 
I went to one knee and held out my fist. You're damn right, little brother. He grinned, fist bumping me as we rolled back theatrically with our monumental finger explosion, laughed, and then the little dude flung his arms around my neck. Jesus, I spent half my life tearing up in emotion at the moment, for good or ill. But that promise to Charlie was one I aimed to keep. I wasn't having one more apocalypse orphan on my watch. I know I keep banging on about how lucky I am to have met such good people, but I think it's worth saying as many times as I can. You know, pre-apocalypse, I could count the good people in my life on half a hand. Dean and Maria, that's it. They're the only positive people I had in my life. Even when I spent three years at university and went to endless parties, there was only ever a string of temporary acquaintances, casual relationships, and a big circle of people that I just... knew. They weren't really people I could rely on, or that I trusted, and never really felt anyone truly had my back, or that I could rely on 100%. I guess being brought up in the environment I was raised in, I had trust issues coming out of every orifice. Guys were always looking for an easy lay, and the girls were pretty shallow and pretentious, or intimidated by my laddish nature. What a fucking crock of shit that is, by the way. Talk about gender stereotyping, and by my own gender no less. Way to empower yourselves, ladies. People first. Gender comes after. If I want to run on rooftops, climb up drain pipes, throw the beat down on someone in the ring, or chug a yard of ale and do a tequila chaser at a party, then I fucking will. It doesn't matter if I have a cock or not. Do the things that ignite a passion in you. If you're not passionate about anything, if you don't seek out those things that make you happy, then you're not living a life. Instead, you're just enduring a meaningless existence. Now, though, I've got a big lodge of people I actually care about, and obviously care about me in return. People that have faith in me and genuinely care about my well-being. And I can't put into words just how that makes me feel. It doesn't matter that we've only known each other for a couple of months. We've been in each other's pockets for all that time, and everyone has been doing their part, working towards the common good, so time doesn't mean a damn thing. Our little community has proved that friendship isn't about how long you've known someone. It's about those people who just come into your life and say, I'm here for you, and then prove it. Friends are the family you choose. You can face anything in front of you if you have the right people standing beside you. Real friends will help you become who you should be, who you want to be. But at the same time, they'll accept you for who you are right now. Just as these people did, as I geared up to go and get the rest of our little tribe. These people here, they're not just new friends anymore. They're my family now. And the marshmallows in this hot chocolate of life. Right. After that nugget of philosophical genius, the hot chocolate of life. Fucking hell, facepalm moment there, Lockie. I should return to my bardic magnificence and try to salvage my linguistic dignity. I boarded my tiny twatmobile with my backpack of ammunition and first aid supplies, flipped down the MVGs and set on my merry way. It's really fucking strange driving with those things, with everything coated by that sickly green filter. In the end, I was glad I'd decided to take the smart car after I'd got underway, as it was small and made it easy to navigate the roads with this new method of perceiving the world. I drove the whole way without headlights, just using the MVGs, because I didn't want to pied piper a whole bunch of undead that could create potential obstacles on the way home as they gathered. Coming back, then fuck it, I don't care, because I'd be bringing everyone back hale and healthy. We could just run the route we took the following day, to take out any walkers that might start drifting too close to our isolated little hideaway. It was super eerie driving alone at night, in the near-silent hum of the electric car, 
and I didn't drive at any kind of speed for a couple of reasons. First, I wasn't yet confident in how I was judging everything in the infrared spectrum, and a crash would buttfuck my entire rescue plan, potentially leaving me injured or walking home in the dark. So hell to the no on that one. Second, I wanted to run on the quiet electric whine and only kick the petrol engine in if I really needed it. As you know, Freya, I am not the most patient of individuals, so it took every sinuous thread of my self-control to not press down on the accelerator. Driving so slowly when consumed with worry for my friends was absolute torture. The smart thing to do, sure, but oh my God, excruciating on my nerves. It took me a good 25 minutes of careful driving as I was checking every which way for encroaching undead or asshole survivors. Added to this was the need to approach off the beaten track until I reached the right-hand turn to the road where the yard was located. For the first 200 yards, there were rows of small terrace houses either side, their front doors virtually on the pavement, before you pass a small cafe diner on the left and a scrap metal place on the right. Right after the diner, there's a left turn which takes you into a small estate of static homes, those little bungalows that old people retire to. Beyond that is another little left turn, which leads into a small cluster of industrial units, where there's a carpet cellar, a garage and tyre place, and other small independent businesses. That little pocket of industrial units backs on to the edge of the large builder's yard, which is just before the main road goes up a slight incline towards some more little side roads and industrial units. I stopped as I came towards the end of those darkened houses and swore quietly to myself. Through my infrared filter, I could see a mass of undead idling outside the gate and spilling into it beyond my sight. There was no way I was getting any closer without potentially alerting them. So, I reversed quietly back down the road a little way, did a neat parallel park against the curb, and switched off the engine. I was fighting a growing panic by this point. Seeing that horde blocking the gate of the yard had my mind spinning towards a dark place, and I was terrified that my three friends had already been added to that mass. I've discovered, however, that I'm surprisingly good at only having that brief flicker of fear before I bite down on it and spit it out for a while. When shit needs to get done, I think I'm surprisingly good at keeping my head on track. Act now and deal with the emotions later seems to be my way of things. The only time I failed in that is when you asked me to shoot you, Freya. Okay, I'm not going back down that road right now. Concentrate on recording events in your own inimitable style, Lockie. You're a bard, so bard this shit up. I couldn't get past the horde in any way, but I had to get into the builder's yard somehow. My best course of action was to advance on foot, cut into the cluster of business units, and go over the fence into the builder's yard. So that's exactly what I did. Holy shit, Freya. That was the scariest two minutes of my life to date. Scarier even than when I was running through the woods outside Castle Bancroft Stein. Alone, in the silent darkness, a filtered green perspective layered over my sight, heading towards a horde of undead. I had no idea if there were any wandering around the small business park beside it, but reasoned any undead would have been drawn by whatever pulled the horde to the builder's yard, given its proximity. Turns out, thankfully, that reasoning was sound. On my stalk past the houses, though, with the benefit of the MVGs, I nearly shat myself on multiple occasions. I could see shapes moving in windows, the listless amble of the docile undead trapped within their homes these past few months. I shudder at the myriad of horror stories that must lie beyond those closed doors. A brief flashback coming to mind of the apartment block and the misery Nate and I unearthed within its confines. The apocalypse continues to suck. I cut into the business units without incident, made my way to the metal fence, and was happy to see that the big main office building was pretty much next to it, a gap of maybe ten feet. The metal fence was those long vertical rails bent into a V-shape with gaps between, 
so I could confirm that no one dead had spilled around the office building into that little space. I was up and over in a blink. The office building itself was only a big single-story affair, though quite high as it must have had a warehouse in it for tools and such. With its sturdy drainage set up, however, I was up the pipes with my backpack and rifle in no time. Edging up the slanted metal as quietly as I could, I lay on my belly as I reached the apex and peered over into the yard. I mean, shit. The yard was filled with undead. I know I'm shit at estimating numbers, but there was easily two or three hundred. Where the fuck had they come from? Considering I'd passed so many houses with dead residents still trapped inside, how had a horde assembled in this little arse end of nowhere? I guess we'll have to ponder that some other time. We'll also have to accept that some things we'll never get answers to. Information doesn't flow freely anymore, and the world is weird and confusing. Also, the smell that radiated from that mass of undeath was an assault on the senses. Rot and corruption pervaded everything, and I could almost taste it on my tongue, like I'd been licking a rancid corpse. Just awful. I did, however, almost fucking air punch when I saw Nate, Mark and Alicia all perched on top of some double-stacked pallets of wrapped bricks. Their little tower was too wide, too deep, and too high, so the platform was just big enough across the four upper pallets for the three of them to safely sit on, a good fifteen feet from the ground and completely out of reach of the undead. I took out my handset and clicked the mic. I knew everyone else was clustered around a radio back at the lodge, listening. Where's your radio, you bellend? I said quietly from my perch. I heard my own voice crackle from below them, smiling as Nate's granite face cracked into a grin, his eyes like weird discs of light in the MVGs. That explained it then. The radio was on the yard floor, surrounded by zombies, and they couldn't get to it. They could hear me, though. Scarily, so could the undead. And when I'd spoken, they'd sparked to life and clustered towards the spot where the radio lay. That sight left me cold. But I had a job to do, and put that aside to process later. Look to your right, Pooh Bear, I said. I'm on top of the main office. All three faces turned towards me, and I stood up, clicking a little flashlight on and off so they could see my position. All three waved. Mark and Alicia hugged, which... Let me tell you, was a big thing for Alicia, letting a man's arms around her. And their relief was palpable. I smiled. Nate's smile, however, was a little different. It was... smug. Funny. It was like he'd been expecting me all along, and my appearance elicited a little self-satisfied grin that said, I fucking knew it. Made me smile again. Hey, fellow lodgers. I whispered for everyone's benefit into the handset. You're live on Big Brother, so please do not swear, and most certainly do not respond at volume, because the undead are everywhere right now, and I'm in hiding. Give me one very quiet response, so I know you can hear me. I'd turned my handset's volume right down to minimise the chance of the monsters hearing me up on my perch. We're here, flower, came Nora's crackling whisper. I heard her response on the radio lying among the undead. So that cheered me, knowing Nate and company had been able to hear me while I was losing my shit at his selfish ignorance of my demands regarding his whereabouts. They knew I'd be on my way. So I guess that was the reason for Nate's smug mode. Everyone, I've got eyes on Nate, Mark and Alicia. All three are in good health, appear to be injury-free due to their happy hugging, jumping, and general victory twerks. No further responses, please, as I need the airwaves to try and sort out with Nate what we're going to do. But Charlie, your dad is absolutely fine, and I'm going to bring him home. Okay. They followed my instructions and didn't respond to avoid risking giving my position away. 
but I couldn't help a little grin of my own as I imagined the collective cheer back at the lodge and Charlie's grinning face as my news was delivered, no doubt getting the world's biggest hug from Nora. All I had to do now was keep that promise. Scanning the yard, I could see our pickup pointed front first towards the gate, just a few feet from the opening. There was an ocean of monsters between them and the vehicle. There was also the big truck they had planned on using, fully loaded and secured with bricks, bags of sand and cement, a small cement mixer, bags of plaster, plasterboard, varying bits of lumber and all that good stuff. They must have been literally finishing as the horde arrived, which is some shitty look. The truck, however, was pointed in the wrong direction. It was at 90 degrees to the gateway and the cab was pointing away from the gate, so it would either have to be reversed out or turned round fully further in the yard where there was space to swing it in a three-point turn. An idea started to form. A reckless and stupid idea, but that's all we really had, and I was the only one with the appropriate skills to pull it off. Nate, I said over the radio, are the keys to that crane truck in the ignition? He turned to Mark and asked the question, which made me swear as Charlie's dad shook his head, dug into his pocket and lifted them up so I could see. Bollocks. Have you got the pickup keys? Nate pointed to the vehicle. Okay, so that was a bonus. The keys were still in the ignition. Where's your rifle? Nate pointed down into the mass. I later found out that he'd had to unclip the rifle strap as a zombie had somehow grabbed it and started dragging him back, otherwise he'd have been a dead man. Shit, things must have been close and tense for Nate to nearly get himself killed. He's usually five steps ahead of the game. When that strap whipped back, it had caught the radio hooked onto the top pocket of his tactical vest. In one swoop, he'd lost his primary weapon and his means of communication with home. I quickly rolled my eyes along the outdoor containers. You know the ones, like you see in the movies that are stacked up in shipyards, and stacked pallets of materials that created long outdoor aisles for all the big stuff that couldn't be stored inside the warehouse. Their brick tower was at the very end of one of those aisles. There was a gap of around 15 feet between the edge of the office building and two of those big containers stacked on top of each other, and they're about eight feet high each. The lowest part of the roof was about level with the top of the stacked containers, but my worry was I would be running down at speed and have to go straight across. My intended target area wasn't at a lower elevation, which would have made the whole thing easier, as I could have hit it with my feet and gone into the safety roll you do at the end of parkour leaps to disperse your impact and keep momentum. With the extra weight and baggage on my back, it was a difficult jump and I couldn't do the safety roll, even if I could land feet first, so I would have to time it right. My only real chance was to try and land at the lip in a cat jump, gripping the edge with my hands as my feet cushioned the impact against the container wall, then pull myself up. Piece of piss, right? I'm coming to you, was all I said. I caught their expressions, which clearly said, you're going to do what? I don't know why, but whenever I do something that people clearly think is either insane or impossible, those reactions give me a little kick. When Nate said I had a hero complex a while back, he wasn't totally wrong. However, I don't do it for the praise and recognition, like dads who change their own baby's nappies or clean the house once every three months, then expect to be lauded as heroic and noble by their wife for doing something they should be doing anyway. However, I do have a borderline insane desire to help, and that was given to me by Dean and Maria. They do such thankless jobs on a daily basis, but they did those jobs because they wanted to make a difference. To help others. Mine's the same. I'm only human, though, full of flaws and insecurities, and now and again it does give me a little buzz when I get the chance to colour outside the lines a little. Everyone likes to be liked, no matter how many times they say they don't care what people think of them. If I don't know someone or I don't like them, then I don't care what they think, unless they think I'm awesome, in which case they are obviously correct. Deep down, though, 
everyone gets a little kick out of someone saying, Dude, that was awesome, before demanding the highest of all fives. And this was going to be spectacular and absolutely fucking stupid. But realistically, it was the only way I was getting my friends out of this alive. Packing the radio into the backpack and zipping it tight, I made sure the rifle was tightly slung across my back in a diagonal from shoulder to hip, slipped the backpack on over it so it didn't flap about, then altered the straps of the backpack as tight as I could without affecting my mobility. The moon provided enough light as the sky was pretty clear, so I took off the MVGs and packed them away too. Shit, if I lost those, I'd have to leave Nate behind, as he'd straight up throttle me. But I'd never be able to judge the run and jump wearing those things anyway. Once they were safely stowed, I stood up, sucked in a breath, told myself what a fucking moron I was, and started a hurtling run down the far side of the roof, picking up a pants-shitting amount of momentum. I had one chance to get this right. One stumble or fall, or if I missed my grip on the landing, and I was going ass or teeth first into the concrete yard. If the fall didn't kill or cripple me, the nearby undead would get to me before I'd have any chance to get my shit together. As I hurtled down, I was acutely aware, in the periphery of my vision, that the banging of my feet on the metal had drawn the horde's attention. My focus, however, was entirely on not dying from this insane jump. When you leap in parkour, there's a brief period where time seems to slow. The moment you leave the safety of your launch and you're in the air, your whole world shrinks to the point of your landing and control of your body. You're beyond the event horizon, the point of no return, and there's a weird hybrid of heart-stopping fear and absolute freedom that is hard to articulate. Imagine adding, there are zombies waiting to eat you down there if you do fall to that mix. This was a literal all or nothing moment. The balls of my feet cushioned against the container's metal side, and my hands locked to the lip with arms slightly bent, adrenaline burning through my veins as I hauled myself up. There's no feeling like it. It's even better when you hear your mates cheering for the insane thing you just did. Once I was on top of that container, Navigating the containers and stacked pallets of assorted materials to the brick tower of my buddies was relatively simple. As I traversed the top of the outdoor aisle, concentrating on my route and balance, I had a wholly unnerving experience. You ever see that card trick magicians do when they have one card on the top touching the edges of the deck? They move the top card along like it's a magnet, and the other cards rise and fall on their edges as the trickster moves it, like a wave going back and forth. Well, I was the top card in the magician's hand, and the zombies below were the rest of the deck. Where I moved, they swarmed and followed, almost forgetting that there were three other living people above them, clamoring beneath my location as I moved along. Eerie shit, Freya. Eerie shit. You, said Nate as I dropped onto their brick tower beside him, are a few bullets short of a magazine. Then his big arms were round me, and he actually kissed the crown of my head. But fucking hell, I'm glad to see you. You all okay? I asked. All three nodded, and I was happy to see that was the case. They were all hungry, thirsty, and cold, but uninjured, and that was such a relief. I'd been going mad with worry back at the lodge when I didn't get any answer from them, so seeing them now up close and being assured they were all okay was like a vent for the pressure of my tension. I dropped the backpack off my shoulders, then passed my rifle to Nate. There's more ammo for the rifle, glocks and shotties in the bag, and a bottle of water, I've only got the one, so the three of you will have to share it to wet your whistles. Nate's grin was wide as he unzipped the backpack, and as he did so, I was certain he murmured something like, that's my girl, but I can't be sure. The three of them shared the bottle of water, and the gasps of relief were nigh on orgasmic as they washed their dry mouths clean. So, this is weird, huh? This every zombie hates lucky thing seems to be a regular occurrence lately. Nate nodded. 
Every time your voice came over the radio earlier, it was like a shock in their collective arse. They'd crowd the radio, despite just standing there before that, all idle. Well, that puckered my butt. I really don't like this, so you can see why I said at the beginning that this feels weirdly personal. However, in our current situation, it was an advantage. My initial plan involved bouncing all Tigger style across the various elevations to get to the truck with the keys, then going all Grand Theft Auto on them with that big bastard as I turned it, letting my three friends jump down onto the bed of the truck, get Nate to the pickup, then we all clear out. Granted, that plan would have been far more cinematic when they inevitably make the movie of my outstanding heroism, but there was now a much simpler and safer plan, where the only risk would be to me, and not to my friends, or to the truck tires as I crushed undead bones beneath them. The guys had worked so hard during the day acquiring all these valuable materials. Losing them to a flat because a bony spike fucked the tire would be a royal shitter. Hearing how the undead seemed solely intent on devouring me, as much as that terrifies me beyond my ability to convey, I forged an entirely new plan. Well, let's use this to our gain then. I'll draw them off if they want me so bad. Then you three get down into the empty space, get in the truck and the pickup when you have a chance, and get ready to move. Nate looked at me aghast. You'll do what? I'm the only one that can, Nate, I shrugged. These fuckers, for whatever reason, have decided to make me zombie enemy number one. There's plenty of space for me to run in this yard, so I'll draw them off in a mass while you three blast any rear stragglers that are in your way and get the vehicles out of here. You can also pick up that rifle you tried to throw away, I added with a wink. I'll leave everything with you and just use my sidearm to plink a few of them to get their attention. If they react as they have been doing, they'll just come for me. We only need to thin the herd to give you three a chance to safely drop down, retrieve your rifle and radio, get in the vehicles, then get the hell out of here. If it doesn't work, I can always go up again and we'll make a plan B. We've got more ammo and you're rifled up again, so we could probably take them all over time. I'd rather we didn't burn through all the ammo, though, or risk jams from overheating or dirty weapons. And how do you get out? Same way I got in. I can lead them all the way to the back of the yard to give you time. I tapped the NVGs, now in Nate's hand. You'll have to alter them to fit your Jupiter-sized bonds again, but now you can shoot freely, you're better with them. I'll take my little flashlight to see where I'm stepping where the moonlight doesn't reach, plus my Glock for protection, and I'll be faster and lighter than I have been. I don't like this, Erin, said Nate. Hey, I got here to save your grumpy ass, didn't I, Eeyore? He snorted. I was going to keep hitting him with Winnie the Pooh references for a good while yet. Ever since I busted him on his KD story to us all, when his profound ending wisdom was quoted from Pooh Bear, I've been milking that one for all it's worth. And I am not yet done. I could see his internal war raging, but I knew he was going to agree, by the fact he was already opening the straps on the MVGs to fit his giant head. One condition, he said eventually. You take your radio and you let us know you're safe and clear. We're not driving all the way back without knowing you got out safely. Deal, I said, taking the proffered handset from him and clipping it to my waist. You guys just head back, put the kettle on, and I'll follow you back in my twatmobile. You what? Never mind, I said with a dismissive wave. Let's do this, shall we? There's a little guy waiting for his dad back home. Mark beamed at that as he refilled his cartridge holder and pockets from the ammo bag. Once we were all set, I fist bumped my three homies before moving back along the top of the materials aisle, trying to ignore the hungry eyes staring up at me as they followed my every move. They were on both sides of the aisle, completely surrounding Nate and the others, so they couldn't clamber down at any point. So, I made my way back towards the main office roof, doing the jump in reverse. 
It was a hell of a lot easier this time around, without all the extra awkwardness and weight of the rifle and backpack, and the fact I was running along a flat surface and not a downward sloping one. I made the jump easily, ran along that slanted roof towards the back of the yard, found a suitable point I could return to and climb back up with ease, then dropped to the yard and flicked on my flashlight. Shit, it was so dark, and I was questioning the sense of my plan. Suddenly I longed for the sickly comfort of the MVGs. I need to get some of those, if possible. Actually, the better, less insane plan is to never come out at fucking night again. Night has the ability to terrify far more than the day ever could. Your imagination runs wild at every tiny sound, every looming shadow. I'd never been afraid of the dark, but these days I'm bloody terrified of the silent, monstrous things that hide in it. In this new and messed up world, we really do have things that go bump in the night, and lunge, and bite, and murder. Running to the end of the aisle, just to escape the heavier darkness that existed between the towering aisles of containers and materials, I looked down to the front of the yard, seeing the ominous silhouette of the undead mass rippling like waves as they shuffled to the position where they thought I was, then clicked the handset. Get ready. Firing in three, two, one. I aimed the Glock down to the front of the yard and squeezed off a single round in the horde's general direction, then lifted up the flashlight to draw them in. I should have been happy that my plan seemed a good one, because the horde took my cue and the monstrous, boiling mass of nightmares began their ominous, slow charge towards me. But then, who can really be happy about a monstrous, boiling mass of nightmares starting an ominous slow charge towards them. It was a chilling experience, seeing the faceless horde swarm towards me, their twisted features shrouded by the night. After about a half minute, it looked like the whole mob was coming my way. Another half minute passed before the crack and boom of my friend's weapons echoed in the night, muzzle flashes strobing the darkness behind the horde. Ever see that Doctor Who episode, Freya? Blink. The one with the weeping angels who don't move except when you blink, and each time you do, they're a little nearer. Yeah, it was like that. Every time the flashes of gunfire lit up behind the horde from Nate and the others, the front ranks of the undead seemed to teleport that little bit closer. The best part, however, was when I heard the thunder of the flatbed's diesel engine rumble into life, and then a few seconds later, the familiar throaty roar of our beloved pickup. They were on board, safe, and ready to get the hell out of here, so that was my cue to start moving. I didn't want the horde any closer than they had to be. The job was done, so it was time to depart. I returned quickly to the point I'd marked for getting back to the warehouse roof and scampered up it, headed up and over the apex and thought, hey, I can just run down the slope and easily leap straight over the fence. So that's what I did. And that, my lovely Freya, is where I did myself an injury. Note to self, Running parkour jumps in the dark, with only a flashlight to lead the way, when you can't really see where you're going to land properly, is fucking retarded. Don't get me wrong, there weren't any big obstructions, as I would have seen them when I scanned the area with my flashlight. But when I soared over the top of the fence, landed on my feet on the ground and went forward into my shoulder-tucked safety roll... There was a half-broken brick on the concrete, and I managed to roll right over it with all my weight halfway down my back on the right side. For a moment, I thought I'd managed to shoot myself somehow, but my Glock was safely tucked into the holster at my hip. I am a safe and responsible firearms owner, Freya, because Nate would put his massive boot up my dainty little butthole if I were anything but. But Jesus Christ, that agony was sharp, sudden, and fierce. It knocked the shit out of me, and it took me a minute just to make sure I hadn't punctured my lung or some other horror, even though it felt like I'd taken a direct punch to my lung. Fucking hell. It hurt at the moment of injury, 
And it's still hurting now. Sucking in difficult breaths and moving gingerly, I decided to pull out the Glock and walk back to my little electric transport with gun and flashlight up. There was less need for stealth now, and I wasn't making any rapid getaways anytime soon. So I opted for the, if anything approaches me now, it's getting a nine mil in the face approach. I made it back to the smart car, roared in pain as I slid into the seat, closed the door, and sat there for a minute or two while I returned my heartbeat to something resembling normality. I didn't want to hang around too long, but I thumbed the mic on the radio. I'm out, back in my vehicle. All is well, I panted. I'll meet you back at the lodge. Copy that, said Nate. There was a little pause before his voice crackled over the airwaves again. You're a fucking lunatic, Erin, he said. But at least you're our lunatic. Thank you. I laughed, which caused a fresh blaze of agony in my ribs. Everyone said Nate, and I could hear the smile in his voice. We're coming home. A cheer came over the radio, and my pain was forgotten for an instant at the sound. Relief, happiness, celebration. We were whole again. Then, Charlie's voice came through the handset. Thanks, Lucky, he said, the joy in his voice evident. Love you. Oh my God. That was a punch in the feels too much. Right in the heart, kiddo. Right in the fucking heart. You're welcome, little dude, I wheezed, half from pain, half from welling emotion. Now, make sure that kettle goes on when they get home, as I'm gasping. Because, Nate, tonight, I had to fight, uh, uh, for my right I left it hanging. I could virtually hear his eye roll from where I was sat. Then his voice came across the airwaves, a flat sigh as he finished it. To poor T. I both laughed and screamed in pain again. When I get back, I will request the highest of fives for that Pooh Bear. Nate got a Beastie Boy reference and a dad joke in one fell swoop. I'm telling you, Freya, that guy's got layers. Jesus, this was the single longest entry I've ever written, I think. I started at 2 a.m. It's now close to 5 a.m. I'm beat. I'm in pain. I've just dropped two tramadol, and I expect to disappear into a pharmaceutical haze shortly. But I'm happy. Everyone came back alive and unhurt, well, apart from my likely cracked rib. We got the truck full of building and construction supplies, and Charlie still has his dad. The thing I learned yesterday above anything else, though, is that these people have faith in me. They put that faith in me without question, and I delivered. And that feels, well, that feels awesome. The end of the world is fucking awful for the horrors it's unleashed. But I can't help feeling that in a selfish way, it's actually been good for me, in a really fucked up sense. I feel like I'm growing as a person, even in these few short months. And a lot of that is down to the people around me, Nate above all. And this strong sense of community and family we've quickly built. Some good has come from this cosmic fuckery, at least. I'll have a think on this weird vendetta the undead seem to have against me, and chat to the others, but not for a day or two. Right now, I need pain relief, and I need to sleep more than I've ever needed anything in my life. I'm signing off, Freya. Time to visit Dreamland. Last night was a big win from a shitty situation, so I'll leave you with this final statement. Fuck yeah. October 12th, 2010. Recovery. It's been a few days since I've written anything, 
largely because I've spent most of it smacked off my tits on super strong painkillers. My head hasn't been able to focus on stringing words together in any form of coherent structure, so I've taken a few days just to rest and grin, like the drugged up fool I've been. Thankfully, I'm seeing improvement in my back and breathing. Because of the rapid healing, Maria did use as I was lucky and didn't crack a rib. It's more likely that I pulverized the crap out of the muscles there. The area is quite a special mix of black, yellow, and purple bruising. But I'm starting to feel a little more mobility, so I've stopped taking the prescription strength stuff and now just chomping anti-inflammatories. The last thing I want is a drug addiction in an apocalypse. I'm not doing anything strenuous on Nurse William's orders, and I've done three days of head fuzz on tramadol for the excruciating pain, which is enough. Now I just want it to heal so I can get back out there. For one thing, I need to set Operation Birthday into motion for Charlie. That kid has been through so much, and he's such a sweetheart, even despite all this bullshit, that I am determined to hit the pause button on this apocalypse for just one day. An apocalypse pause, you might say. The English language is so versatile, you can just take whatever you want, mash it all together, and still make yourself understood. Mark has set himself to work while it's dry and started constructing the outhouse to contain the generators. After the builder's yard, it became painfully obvious that we don't have anything like a QRF, and that needs to change. So Nate put it out there. Isaac is determined to do his part, it seems. He's got the camera system up and working, and now I can switch on this laptop, and there are two others here with the same capability, to look at the feeds surrounding our perimeter. There are even a couple that look left and right up the country road that passes us by, so we can see if anyone or anything approaches. It's pretty cool, actually. Now that project is complete, though, Isaac is finding himself at a loose end and wants to pitch in beyond the gate. As our little incident a few days back highlighted, we really do need everyone to be a shooter, should the situation demand it. So Nate has been working with Isaac on all the basics. Biggest surprise of all? Maria is also learning. Huh, I never expected it from her. So maybe there is something to what Nate said. Maybe a medical professional is just the kind of person who would excel at firearms. Apparently, Nate worked with snipers in the SAS who doubled as highly trained combat medics who could often go on to medical careers with the level of training they received. With Nora's home front shotgun skills, this will mean that everybody will be an active shooter, and I can only think that's a good thing. It's also pretty shitty that we all need to learn how to kill stuff, but that is the sad reality we live in during these dark times. Maria, it turns out, is a natural. Nate had to scold Isaac on numerous occasions early on due to bad habits from video games and movies he thought applied to real life. He was very soon corrected, and, as Isaac is obviously terrified of incurring Nate's displeasure, he soon knuckled down to be a model student. He's a clever guy and quickly learned that when it comes to combat, Nate knows best. Alicia has upgraded to the rifle. Nate has given her one of the variants that has semi and burst, like I carry. Pooh Bear himself has switched his scope to one that has semi and full, as he can handle that muzzle ride. Sometimes, dumping out a 30-round magazine in about three seconds might be needed, and if that situation ever does arise, then only Nate has the chops to handle that kind of rate of fire at the minute. I did it once when we hit Bancroft's house to liberate our new friends, and it shocked the shit out of me just how fast the rifle dumps them out. I felt like a cartoon character holding onto a high-pressure hose pipe as it just ran away with me. That's been the order of things the past few days. Nate schooling Alicia, Maria, and Isaac, while Mark constructs the outhouse for the generators, in preparation of wiring them in, ready for winter. Nora looks after us all, and while I've been recovering from my injury, Particles has hung out with me and Charlie while we play video games. 
I am officially Charlie's new favorite person, by the way. Since bringing his dad home safe, the kid has become my handsome little shadow. It feels like I've inherited a little brother, and you know what? I like it. Having someone look up to me like that will keep me on the straight and narrow, I think. Mark's done such a great job of raising the kid, I feel it's my duty to continue that and not make a mess of all his hard work in shaping such a smart, good-hearted boy. I have officially adopted Charlie Reynolds as my honorary kid brother. It occurs to me the children are the future of our new world, and I can't help but wonder how many are out there. It's been four months since our reality shifted, and with winter creeping ever closer, I'm concerned for how many survivors will make it through. We've seen evidence of fires in both nearby towns that consumed numerous houses, and with no widely available central heating, burning natural fuel like wood is the only way any survivors will make it through the winter. I'm worried there are people out there we could potentially help that will fall foul of the cold weather and make fatal mistakes. I worry a lot these days, it seems. What was it Nora said to me? Don't be bound in the chains of things you can't change. That was it. Good advice, but hard to follow. We have space here at the lodge for some more people. We have fuel, warmth, food, fresh water, clothing from raiding houses, and a major advantage of well-stocked security with an ex-Special Forces operator as our guardian and tutor. I mean, shit, we've probably got it as good as it gets in this bullshit world, I think. Let's face it, I doubt there are many survivors like Charlie and I at this time, sat here playing Mario Kart while the dead roam and hunt the living. I think about how good we have it right now, and I am bound in the chains of this thing I can't change, because I want to change it for others. The thought of a family unit shivering in the cold, terrified of venturing out, and nothing but makeshift melee weapons to take on the undead with if they do. Well, that just makes me uncomfortable. There have to be other survivors out there, and I desperately want to find and help them. I think I'll chat to Nate about that later on. When I'm ready to head out beyond the gate again, I think that's what I'd like to do. I don't really know how we go about locating survivors, as anyone with any sense is holed up tight and suspicious as all hell, especially if their only other human contact since the end has been with the likes of Bancroft's lunatic crew. I don't know. Food for thought. All I know is that we have it pretty good, and we should look to share that good fortune with others. There are eight humans and a pug living here. We could conceivably double that. It wouldn't leave much in terms of personal space, but if we could give even one family safety and shelter, then we should. Every human life saved is a big middle finger to whatever monstrosity planned this uprising. Flipping the finger to assholes is one of my favorite hobbies, even if they are divine cosmic entities. I'm purposefully not thinking about all the weird zombie bullshit at the moment. I'll come back to that in a day or two, when I've considered it all. Right now, I can hear Nora booming out dinner is ready. So, I'm going to eat my fill and while away the evening in a highly competitive tournament of Mario Kart with my new little bro. October 14th, 2010. Why me? Feeling much better today, Freya. My back is most definitely on the mend, and I'm not scoffing ibuprofen anymore, just dealing with a bit of soreness and lingering stiffness. But my mojo is coming back. I'm so happy about that, as I'm a hands-on kind of girl. I don't like lazing about when everyone else is busy doing stuff. Nate rolled out heavy today, taking everyone with him, leaving just me, Charlie, Nora and Particles back at the lodge. I got really antsy and wanted to ride along, but I was scolded by pretty much everyone to take it easy. They weren't going out on some major loot run and doing house breaching or anything. 
they decided to take that loader truck from the builder's yard to a farm a couple of miles away that had a big wood burner in it and bring it back here. Many hands make light work and all that jazz. It was a good chance for Maria and Isaac just to work on vigilance pulling security, and the building was cleared by me and Nate a while back, so there was little chance of contact. They would likely need extra hands because the stove is a beast, and they had to get it out of the farmhouse before the loader crane could even be used. Mark, being the expert planner that he is in all things engineering, made sure that one of the things he loaded up at that builder's yard was a pallet jack, and a fancy high-lift one that rises to a height of around 800 millimetres and could bear just over a ton of weight. He's so smart. Anyway, that's what they did today. Nobody got any serious injuries, just a few minor bangs and scrapes from the labour. Though I did hear tales of some terrible profanity when things got stuck, or some ingenious lubrication that was needed to finally get the beast out of the farmhouse so Mark could grab it with the loader crane. They've left it covered on the truck for tonight, as I don't think anyone could face pissing about with it after their fun times at the other end. Mark brought all the stove piping back as well, but has to do some prep work inside before it can be installed, like brickwork for heat reflection and such things. A good day's work from everyone, but it's really got me twitchy to get involved again. Did I mention I hate being idle, Freya? Hate it. So, I guess it's about time I addressed this whole anti locky movement the undead seem to have. I think it's safe to say now, without any shadow of doubt whatsoever, that the following statement is true. This apocalypse is not natural. I know that's a completely boneheaded statement, because the dead have risen to murder the living. This isn't man-made, though, nor is it some rapid mutation of an unknown virus that's gone pandemic. I've said from the start that the hate these things have for you as they lunge, it's dark and deep-rooted. However, it's always been a primal savagery, like the monsters are working from instinct. See or hear living, hunt living, kill living. Once living is dead, stop eating and let the new foot soldier rise to join the undead legion. That itself is a tactic, and yes, it could be the method a virus or parasite would use to reproduce. Reproduction and survival are the two basest instincts of any organism, and the fact that we can put the undead down with a brain trauma might suggest any parasite causing this is rooted in the brain. Even a parasite is difficult to validate, though, as it doesn't matter how someone dies. Everyone gets up as an undead, no matter the manner of their passing. But none of the above reasoning stands up with the recent change in behaviour I've seen, and it certainly has no explanation when an undead pharmacist a thousand-strong wall of undead blocking the route through downtown, and another horde in a builder's yard, all react in a specific manner of focused animosity towards me as an individual. I know I can be a bit of an arrogant bellend at times and joke about my awesomeness, but strip that right away. Others have seen it, Nate above all. He's seen it every time, from that little sortie when we first saw the change in the lady pharmacist, how the downtown unliving wall reacted when I opened my mouth, and the crowd of zombies that largely ignored Nate and the other two on their elevated perch, yet the things swarmed the handset when my voice crackled through it. I don't care what anyone might argue in response. That shit is personal. But that leads to one unanswerable question. Why me? I can't help but feel that there is an agency behind the undead somehow. And after your death, Freya, that agency has switched tactic. It's weird, as though my deep abyss of grief was the catalyst in a change to their behaviour. But I just can't fathom why. Any agency with any kind of sense would see that Nate is way more of a threat than little old me. That guy is a one-man army, so I would have thought whatever force has sparked this uprising 
would see Nate Carter as more of a menace. Instead, that entity, for want of a better term, has decided to focus on a foul-mouthed woman with a stupid sense of humour that uses sarcasm as a primary method of attack. Maybe that entity is a bit dumb. Shit, I hope so, as that would make the fight back a little easier. Is this a permanent change in their behaviour, I wonder? If it is, that means me going beyond the gate would put everyone else at risk. If I'm some kind of zombie flypaper, that means I'd have to stop going out, and quite frankly, that would send me insane. Hmm. Let's say, for argument's sake, that the builder's yard incident was some kind of trap for me. The one way to really get under my skin is to go after my friends, as I'll come in windmilling, all British Kung Fu style with my keys in tiny fists, when it comes to looking out for those I care about. Essentially, the guiding hand of the undead, if such a thing exists, made an error. It laid the trap well in containing Nate, but by focusing on me when I was there, it actually allowed the others to make their escape. To me, that suggests it's not a direct puppeteer, if you follow my meaning. If it was in direct control at that moment, splitting its force would have been a more effective tactic. Sent half the mass after me, but hold back enough to contain Nate, Alicia and Mark on their perch. Instead, the whole horde came for me, thus letting my friends clear the rear stragglers enough to mount up and ride off into the sunset. That feels more like the horde was assigned some basic instructions to follow. See Locky, eat Locky. And that was a mistake, though it doesn't make things any less personal. Shit, I don't know. I'm spitballing to you, Freya, and I won't get any answers. This is all musing and conjecture. The bottom line is this. When I'm healed fully, the first thing I need to do is go out beyond the gate. We need to actively search for undead and see if they continue to react like this. I need to know if this is a permanent change in the undead modus operandi, or whether this was some kind of inexplicable random occurrence. That's all I can do for now, as I doubt I'll ever get any real reason why this suddenly went personal or why I have any kind of significance at all. There's absolutely nothing special about me, other than my fast feet and even faster mouth, but that doesn't seem significant enough to warrant an entire apocalyptic vendetta against little old me. I reckon in another couple of days I'll be fully healed, then I can do this little experiment of my own. I want to set Operation Birthday into motion, and there is some risk in it, considering where we have to go. But I need that risk to fully test the undead reaction. You'll notice, Freya, that I am being deliberately vague about the details of Operation Birthday. Where's the fun if it's not a surprise? Even to you, wherever you may be. Okay, I've done my musing on this weird shit. I'll take a break. I think next time, as I'm still healing... I'll finally lay out how I ended up at my old high school on the day the world shat razor blades in its pants. I think that should be recorded in here as it was that day, after all. Wherever you are right now, Freya, I hope it's bright, peaceful, and smells of summer flowers. I miss you. So does Particles. And Nate misses you more than he lets on. I think he kind of adopted us both as foster daughters in that little time where it was just the three of us and our little puggy dude. Maria and Nora are amazing, but they're like mother and grandmother figures to me. Alicia, understandably, is all laser focus in becoming a Valkyrie and lacks a bit of warmth, so she's not really the girly type. I miss having my girly BFF to hang with. There's a big Freya-shaped hole in my life that I can't seem to fill. Shit. Nate was right. Grief does creep up on you when you least expect it. My lips getting all quivery, and there's a familiar tightness in my throat again. So I'm going to save this here, grab my emotional support pug, 
and go cry in my room for half an hour. Miss you. October 15th, 2010. The day the world shit the bed. It's that time, I feel. My back is almost better and I'm likely to start getting super busy again all too soon. So, before things get wild again, Freya, I present to you the day the world shit the bed and how I ended up at my old high school where I first started scribbling this journal in shitty school notebooks. This is a twofold story, in that it also contains a little personal history. I've recorded that I went to university and got myself a creative writing degree, thus preparing my bardic magnificence for these apocalyptic tales. But such a diploma is treated with more than a little scorn by prospective employers. I never knew what I wanted to do with my life. Do you know, I actually considered taking a shot at being a stand-up comedian, Let's face it, I am hilarious. Yes, I am. No, you, shut up. 21 years old, fresh out of university with a half-ass degree, I was not a particularly desirable employee. I didn't have any employable skills, seeing as brutal and sarcastic honesty is not considered a core competency for many vocations. Who knew? I ended up in the first of many dead-end jobs, with no prospects and endless days of monotonous routine. Data entry clerk, office junior, admin clerk, receptionist. Jobs that just didn't suit me. I'm sure they were fine for many people, but I need more mental stimulation. I get bored easily, and if I don't love what I do, then I hate what I do. It's that simple. Working was a necessary evil required by society so I could pay my way. I also hated nine to five, never more so than summertime, when I'd sit in a stuffy office wearing a smart blouse, grey skirt, black tights and comfortable shoes, looking like a clone of every other person in the building as I stared out at the blazing sunshine. I wanted to be out in that weather in a park or on an abandoned site where I could run free and get the parkour buzz from testing myself. I am not a high heels kind of girl, unless it was on a night out. My preferred uniform consists of running shoes, loose athletic or cargo pants, vest top and hoodie. By the way, the hoodie is the most underrated of all clothing items. Not quite warm enough to go bare-armed while jumping ledges and climbing. Throw on a hoodie. Feeling cold? Throw on a hoodie. Feeling like shit about yourself? Throw on a hoodie. Can't be bothered wearing a bra today? On with the hoodie. Just want to lounge all day and make no effort while you eat ice cream? Yep, hoodie. The hoodie is the Swiss army knife of comfort clothing. After three years of shitty office jobs slowly destroying my soul, I moved into more blue-collar roles. I worked in factories, which I hated, because it was just a different monotonous routine and fucking loud. And as we know, I am something of a social animal. Being unable to shoot the shit to help pass the grind of a working day was even more soul-destroying than staring at a spreadsheet containing data I just didn't give a shit about. Eventually, I ended up working in a warehouse, and I found my place a bit more there. I started working shifts, and that gave me better freedom in the summer months. Working four days on, four days off, followed by four nights on and four nights off, suited me way better. I had time in daylight to run free or go the fight gym and work out my angst on the bags and sparring in the ring. If I needed extra shifts for money to buy or replace stuff, they were there. It didn't stimulate me mentally, but the banter in the warehouse was more fun and filled with hours of piss-taking, which was way better than dealing with petty office politics. Of course, you still had to deal with irritating supervisors who went mental with a tiny sliver of power over other human beings and delighted in making your life miserable, but that's par for the course in any job. Some of the heat I got was my own doing, in fairness, I was forever shortening my supervisor's name to Dick, which he didn't seem to like. Mind you, 
That's probably because his name was Robert. It wasn't great money, but for where I was in my life at this point, it suited me far more than the daily drudge I'd been enduring. I finally managed to save up enough for a deposit on a rented flat of my own. Had been living in a shared house with three freaks up to this point, so when I moved in, it was the greatest feeling in the world. When you've been bounced between foster and group homes all your life, and then resided in shared dormitories in university, followed by shared housing with strangers, I cannot express how amazing that first night in my own flat was. It was a single bedroom with a tiny bathroom and a singular open living room kitchen area. But it was mine. I wasn't wondering if one of the freaks was trying to pick the lock to my door so they could rummage through my underwear while I was at work, trying to sneak a creepy look at me in the shower or stealing my shit out of the fridge that clearly had my bloody name written on it in permanent marker. I was three months away from my 26th birthday, which is May in case you were wondering, Freya, and I had my first true taste of real freedom. Four months after moving into my own little private slice of heaven, the world went and shat itself. And here we are. On that day, I was on my first day off after a stretch of four nights in. It's hard to get your body clock in any kind of circadian rhythm, as you're always fucking about with it. So I was still asleep when a commotion in the building woke me up around 11am. I live on the top floor of a three-story building, There are four flats on each floor, much like that apartment block Nate and I discovered untold horrors in, but the residences were on a much smaller scale. There were no balconies either, though the flats above ground level had large patio door-style windows with a little guardrail just above waist height, so you could open it wide in the summer and let the breeze in. The walls were like paper as well, So if someone banged the front door of the building, or their own apartment door, the whole goddamn building would hear it. Still, it was a small price to pay, and for the most part, I was lucky that the people in my building were mostly conscientious about not being arseholes. I was used to a banging door now and again, or the dull thump of hip-hop bass from the stoner bellend living below me in number eight. I was not, however, prepared for the screaming I heard both outside the building and within it on the ground floor. It was heart-stopping being woken like that. In nothing but my pants and a tee, I flicked open my bedroom window blinds, swung the window wide and stuck my head out, peering down into the bright morning with sleep bleary eyes. It only took a second for them to snap wide. A paramedic in his green uniform was sat on the small patch of grass just outside the building, being tended by his frantic female colleague. His right arm was a mess, a blood-covered ruin with a ragged chunk torn clean out of his bicep. I think an artery must have torn because the blood was everywhere, pumping out in gouts as his friend desperately applied a tourniquet to slow the bleed. He did not look well, I could see that much, even from my elevation. There were a few other people hanging out their own windows, asking what was happening, getting irate with the clearly distressed paramedics as one of them was trying to save the life of the other. People can be such fucking assholes, Freya. Here was a first responder with an obvious life-threatening injury. His colleague, and probably friend, was desperately trying to save his life, and people were hanging out their windows, demanding to know what was occurring, then getting angry at the paramedics because they were too busy to answer any queries. Well, being the hero of the common people that I am, I let those assholes know exactly what I thought of their dick-like antics, told them all to leave the medics the fuck alone, and then laughed as all the bellends turned their ire towards me. I will have a verbal slap fight with anyone at any time of the day. I get a kick out of it because, well, I'm really good at it. Other people will lose their shit way faster than I will. Poking idiots with a proverbial stick is just one more thing I can't put on my CV for prospective employers. It's very frustrating. It appeared the paramedic had lost too much blood because he soon expired despite his mate's efforts. 
Obviously, now I know a bite is fatal in itself, so there was nothing that poor woman could have done to save her friend. She sat there for a moment, head bowed and openly crying at her friend's demise, which shut the gawking residents up. As we all watched on, wondering how this particular situation had arisen, the dead paramedic twitched, and the woman sucked in a surprised breath, immediately resuming her medical treatment. Fatal mistake. Even as the man twitched, someone in a window below shouted out a warning. No, he cried. It's on the news. I thought that was a weird thing to say at the time. Her face was so close to her reanimating colleague, and she had no time to react as his eyes snapped open. His arms encircled her, crushing her down towards his waiting jaws. Her screams soon died as her undead friend gnawed his way through her neck, gouts of blood erupting from the awful wounds, panic exploding in every window as they quickly slammed shut. I stared down in mute horror, watching as the newly raised undead ceased the wet grind through his colleague's throat, releasing her before climbing awkwardly to its feet. Seconds later, the woman gave that violent twitch, and within a minute, we went from two live paramedics to a pair of undead monsters now hungry for flesh. I knew what I was seeing. I'm a big pop culture fan, love a good horror movie or book, and it took me a minute for my brain to accept that what I had just seen was indeed a zombie rising from the dead. Closing the window, I remembered the neighbor's attempted caution and sat on my couch, switching on the TV. I watched for a good twenty minutes, flicking over every channel, seeing the same thing over and over again. Pictures and video from across the globe, the haunted, disbelieving stares of news anchors trying to deal with this live situation, their minds clearly on their own loved ones. One newsreader, during a live broadcast, just stopped talking, shook her head, and declared, I'm done. Just walked off in the middle of it. That's when I really knew shit was real, despite what I'd just witnessed outside. There was something more jarring about that news anchor, a consummate professional I'd seen on TV for more than 10 years, just up sticks and fuck off during the most momentous global news event in human history. Her exit was like a slap to my face. But what I did next was really weird and detached. I went and took a shower, as normal, like any other day. I know, weird, right? I think this is where the start of my hyperactivity began. Looking back at my very first entries, it reads like I was on drugs. After watching that news anchor just clear out mid-broadcast, a shower seemed like the only sensible thing to do. How long would the water be available? When would I get clean again? There were two fucking zombies outside the front door of my building, and I was taking a shower and washing my hair like I was getting ready for a normal day. There was bedlam erupting in the building below me. Lots of shouting and swearing, screaming and panic. And I was luxuriating in the shower like I was in a shampoo commercial, lathering my hair, then calmly running a comb through it after conditioning. I came back into my little living space, one towel around my body, the other around my head, and sat on the couch staring at the TV some more while I ate a breakfast of granola and yogurt. It was close to midday by this time. Finishing my breakfast, I dropped the bowl and spoon in the sink and put the kettle on for a brew, turning the TV off. That's when I noticed how quiet the building had gone. Getting myself dressed, I didn't bother with the hairdryer, instead combing my locks back into a tight ponytail. Looking back with clearer vision, I think I was in some kind of daze, my brain in hyperdrive as I absently loaded some snacks and bottled water into a backpack and weirdly, a comb. A few spare hair bubbles, boxer tampons, other random shit, and then thought to check my phone. Just as I turned the screen on to look, I saw I had about 15 missed calls from Maria, noticed the power said 1%, then the bastard little thing powered down for the last time. Almost seconds later, the power went off in the building, so any chance of pumping charge into the device was gone. I tossed the phone and charger in my backpack anyway, 
and don't ask me why, as I have no idea. Throwing in a few spare bits of clothing, I then zipped it up, strapped it to my back, and ventured out my front door. Well, I didn't get far. Remember, this wasn't a large building. On each floor, there's just a small entry door from the stairwell. Then you're faced with two doors on the wall facing you, and one either side, with just a tiny space before them all. My flat was an end one, number 12. So I came out and went through the door into the stairwell, and was immediately punched in the face by the smell wafting up from below. Yes, Freya, you know what that smell was, but it was the first time I'd ever experienced it, and I involuntarily dry-retched. I peered down between the handrails, and my eyes were immediately drawn to the fucking sea of crimson in the ground floor hallway, before a shambling figure shuffled through the ocean of blood, unmindful their fluffy purple slippers were sloshing through all that vileness. I recognized the figure as Sylvie, an old woman in her late seventies who lived on the ground floor. I always liked Sylvie. She was of Jamaican descent, and I always loved hearing her talk. There's something rhythmic about those Caribbean accents that captures the imagination, like funky street music that just draws your attention when you hear it. Sylvie, or at least the thing that used to be her, must have heard my dry retching as her face snapped straight up, white eyes fixing to me with blood and gore crusting around her mouth. I don't know for sure what happened, but I'm theorizing that Sylvie must have had a stroke or a heart attack or something to that effect. I remember her once telling me she was on heart medication and the doctor was forever telling her to take it easy. But if you'd ever met Sylvie, that woman took orders from no man. She was a bright ball of Caribbean sunshine with a deliciously wicked laugh to accompany her equally improper sense of humor and always struck me as someone that grabbed life by the balls and dared it to make its move. Everyone's met one of those old ladies that you just know has stories that would put even the lewdest of contemporary tomboys to absolute shame. I reckon Sylvie had a litany of spicy indiscretions that would make their antics look like an episode of children's TV in comparison. And that belly laugh was just so full of joy. A bit like TV chef Rusty Lee, but with an added dash of wickedness. She was ace. I've surmised that the paramedics were there to treat her. She died and bit the first guy, both of them scarpering outside to slam the front door shut on her. We know what happened from there. Other undead shuffled into sight through the gap, eyes turned upwards towards me, and I recognized a few other faces from the building. Some must have tried to make it past the seemingly harmless, dazed old lady, and instead got a fatal lesson in the predatory lunge of the undead. Basically, the ground floor was now an impassable barrier of shambling zombies, and two more undead first responders were bumping against the other side of the front door anyway. Anyone left in our building was trapped. Everyone except me. I went back into my flat, locked myself in, and moved to my patio-style door in the living room. It opens inwards, so I did that, hopped over the other side, and gripping the thin railings, I inched myself down until I was hanging from my fingertips, my toes just inches from the top of the same window guard of the flat below. That was when my stoner neighbor, Rodney, opened his own window door. The fuck you doing, lad? I don't understand the lad moniker at the end, when I obviously have boobs, but this was Rodney's linguistic peculiarity. He ended every address with lad, whether you were man, woman, child, dog, cat, wasp, or penguin. The fuck does it look like I'm doing, Rodney? I snapped, hanging from my fingers. Move back and let me swing in, you bellend. Rodney, being a stoner of gargantuan proportion and a small-time dealer, and probably small-time because he smoked most of his stash, obeyed instantly with a vacuous look on his face. In fairness, he usually had that look on his face. Rodney was not a young man who spent much time in this plane of reality. If anything, the waking world was a mental holiday for him. His flat reeked of weed. It pervaded everything, and I'm quite sure that stench is locked into every fibre of his dirty furniture. 
His kitchen was a pigsty with crusts, even mold, encasing every pot, plate, and cup. A beige carpet stained by multiple fizzy drink spills and pizza drops, and shit just everywhere. It's funny what you remember, even this far on. Even though there was a zombie apocalypse erupting all over the globe, I swung into that flat and remember thinking that the stench of the undead might be preferable to Rodney's malodorous apartment. Honestly, I'm amazed there wasn't a cruise ship of cockroaches chilling in every corner with their shades on, sipping mojitos as they enjoyed their all-inclusive getaway. Just rancid. What you doing climbing, lad? Well, Rodney, when one elects to climb, it is usually for one of two very good reasons, to go up or to go down. His blank look just made me sigh. Any form of sarcasm was going to be lost on a man who was unlikely to remember his own name for the best part of a year. Do you know what's going on, Rod? I asked. The detachment was starting to leave me at this point, and I think where my initial hyperactivity started to ramp up. You've seen the news, right? He shook his head. Just got up. Ain't no power, lad. Thinking we might need to call the building manager. I stared at him for a moment, rapidly blinking, then risked fungal infection by grabbing a fistful of his sauce-stained shirt and dragged him to the window, pointing down at the blood-soaked paramedics. Words would not sink into his sense-resistant brain, so maybe a visual aid would help him. See those two paramedics? They're zombies. Look at their eyes, Rod. They're all white. You can't get out to the building through the door because about five or six of our fellow neighbors are shuffling around in rivers of blood and will fucking eat anyone who goes down those stairs. So, in answer to your question as to why I'm climbing, I'm climbing down to get the fuck out of here and find somewhere safe. Because right at this very fucking moment, the world is ending. I waited for a second longer then punctuated it with one final addendum. Lad. Rodney blinked once, long and slow, and gave me a queer look. I imagine that's the kind of look he gave to cans of deodorant or air freshener in the shop. It was a look that said, I'm not buying it. He started laughing and nodding like a simpleton. Yeah, good one, lad. I groaned. There are people who embrace adversity, rising to whatever challenge fate chooses to put in their path. They grab life by the throat and throttle the shit out of destiny, making it their bitch. Meanwhile, the Rodneys of this world are asleep on the toilet, shit-stained tighty whities around their ankles, with a half-smoked spliff hanging from their mouth. This guy was so permanently blazed out of his mind, he likely couldn't pour piss out of a boot without instructions on the heel. I had no time or inclination at this point to argue with him. I was already in hyper-survival mode, so all I could do was shake my head at him, swing my legs over his window guard, and give him one final look. Good luck, Rodney, I said. I have no doubt in my mind that Rodney is dead. He probably moves with more purpose and intelligence now he's a zombie. Gah, I shouldn't joke about shit like that. The guy was dumb, but he was harmless. He likely died a horrible death, so I shouldn't make a joke of his end. The two paramedics were beneath me, so I lowered myself as much as I dared in order to stay clear of their grasping hands and bunched up to brace my feet against the brick. Sucking in a couple of quick breaths for courage, I then released my hands and pushed up and back with all the strength in my legs to clear the two undead, flipping over in a looping backward somersault, lengthening my body to control the spin, and landed on my feet. A couple of backward steps later to catch my balance, I spun as the zombies turned, and off I ran. I don't own a car, as I couldn't afford one, so I had no vehicle. I tried the ambulance sitting in the car park of our building, but one of the paramedics must have had the keys on their person, so that was out. At this point, I wasn't thinking too clearly, still working on instinct and adrenaline burning in every fiber. All I knew was that my building was unsafe, so I had to get away. However, I didn't have a destination in mind. 
I thought of Dean and Maria, but they lived in the next town over, about an eight-mile drive from where I was, so that was my initial long-term goal. For the moment, I was a bit lost at sea. My phone was dead, and I didn't really have anyone else to call. This is what I was talking about in an earlier entry. I knew loads of people, had plenty of numbers in my phone, and could always find someone for a night out or just an evening of kicking back and chilling. But I realised at that moment, I didn't have anyone in my contacts list that I thought, it's a zombie apocalypse, I'm heading to X's house. I just didn't have that person to fall back on. So, it was Lucky versus the Apocalypse, round one. I'm going to pause there, Freya. I've been writing a while, and I've probably got another day of rest before I can get out beyond the gate again. So I'll finish my tale tomorrow, I think. Lucky hungry, lucky eat, and play Mario Kart, because Charlie's hollering for me, and I don't like to disappoint. Peace. October 16th, 2010. The day the world shit the bed, part de. I am feeling much better today, Freya. Got my full flex on with only a little bit of stiffness, so after today, I'm going to be ready for heading out beyond the gate. Finally. It's been around eight days of pain and immobility, which has resulted in me being borderline stir-crazy. I need to get out there and see if the undead have still got a hard-on for me. I can't abide the thought of having to remain within the lodge's confines permanently, but if my presence is going to endanger everyone accompanying me, I might have to. I chatted to Nate about it last night, laying out my test mission to ensure Operation Birthday goes ahead for Charlie. He wasn't particularly enamoured by my idea, saying it was a pointless risk for something so frivolous. So I had to blast him with the guilt cannon. Nate, Charlie is nine years old, yet in that short amount of time on this earth, he's lost his mum, been taken captive, had a gun held to his head, is a child of an apocalypse, and a week ago had to deal with the fact that his dad might not come home either. He's got no other kids around him and nothing like any kind of normal existence. For one day, just one fucking day, we can let him be a kid again. Yes, there's risk in my stupid plan. And no, we don't technically need to go there to get the stuff I want. I know all this, which is why I just want it to be me and you, so it doesn't put anyone else at risk. I looked him square in his dark eyes then, jutting my chin out defiantly. You can come with me, or you can stay here if you think the risk is too great. But I'm going, and I'll do it alone if I have to. I'll gladly risk my neck against the undead if it means that for just one day, Charlie can have a birthday like a normal kid, with a party and presents and games, surrounded by us, his adoptive family. Nate was silent for a time considering every angle, as is his way. After a minute, he sighed. Sometimes, Erin, I can't tell if you're on too many drugs, or not enough. I laughed. So does that mean you're in? He nodded once. Aye, we'll throw the kid a shindig. As you say, just you and I on that sortie, though. He considers every angle, and we'll work up a sensible plan for sure, but it's just further proof that Nate Carter, the Terminator's granddad, has a big squishy heart behind that stone exterior. Right, that was the only thing of note for me to scribble down. I was filling you in on the second part of my insane day when the world crashed and burned. I'll settle down into my rocking chair by the fire, open up my great tome of legend, and ask you to gather round, children, as I continue the tale of how Lucky ended up back at her stupid bloody high school as the world crumbled around her. Where was I? Ah, oh, yes, I'd just left my building, realised I had nowhere to go, had no vehicle, and was completely without any kind of plan. It wasn't my best of days. At this point, I was crippled with indecision and trembling with adrenaline. 
I'd gotten clear of the mess in my building, but had no plan of where to head next. Being on foot seemed like a really stupid idea initially, but without a vehicle of my own, I wasn't really sure what to do. My building is down a side road leading to a dead end, so I headed up past the little cul-de-sacs that branched off that side road. I witnessed numerous households frantically loading up cars with essentials, zipping in and out of doors as they returned with boxes of food and clothing to throw in the back of their vehicles, every face twisted with wide-eyed fright. Couples had arguments, screaming at each other, while small children cried. No understanding of what was happening, but sensing something was off by how unsettled and frantic their parents were. I saw the same pattern of behavior as I jogged past each of the three little avenues. Even then, I idly wondered where they were planning to escape to. Everything I'd seen on the news earlier implied that main highways were already fucked beyond imagination. Emergency response was broken and non-existent, as the bedlam was becoming exponential with each hour that passed, and wondered what plan all these people seemed to have that I didn't. After all, if everyone was having the same idea, weren't they just going to move the chaos from the relative safety of their home to wherever they planned to flee? Panic is a scary thing, Freya. You never saw it, locked away in your yoga retreat as you were. People often make bad decisions when they're in fight or flight mode, especially flight. It's a visceral and emotive reaction, a base survival instinct where the only thought pervading every action is just to get away. The trouble was, however, that there simply wasn't anywhere to get away to. The chaos was everywhere, and each minute ticking by only added more mayhem, more blind panic, more unthinking action to the shit pile. Kids crying because they can sense their parents are scared really gets to me. There are few feelings worse in the spectrum of human emotion than blind terror of the unknown. Those kids, used to seeing their parents as their safe harbor, knew something was wrong. They could sense it from the frantic actions of their parents, their hurry between house and car, the snapped comments at each other as a mother held a toddler close, asking her husband what the plan was, only to be met with an angry response of, just get in the car. Real fear comes from uncertainty. I think it was Lovecraft who said, the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. That certainly rang true from my experience on that particular day. I quickly realized that being on foot made me more mobile, able to react better to situations, and I wasn't prevented by any traffic holdups. Even in a small town like mine, it takes only one asshole to blaze through a red light as another vehicle is turning across the carriageway, and then, blam! The resulting collision snarls up the small junction, other cars try to drive around the wreckage, making shit worse, and some people with a conscience try to help. But we know what happens to them, huh? Some good Samaritan thinks they're pulling someone from a wrecked car, but they're already dead. They reanimate, they bite, and so all across town, at junctions and crossroads, in supermarket car parks, we apply the familiar equation of multiply zombies to the power of, oh shit. There are numerous roads in this small town that Nate and I can't use when we venture that way, simply because there is a string of cars blocking them thanks to accidents like these. Some people try to pull a U-turn and go the other way, but some vehicles are traveling down the wrong side of the road, trying to bypass the national British pastime of queuing and just end up exacerbating the problem. Being in a car on June 23rd was probably the worst situation to be in. The town is small, the roads are mostly A and B roads and therefore single carriageway, and one accident, just one, at a key junction, can stop the whole area dead. I've seen lines of abandoned vehicles 50 and 60 cars long, snarling up key roads through certain parts of town, and you'd never see that kind of gridlock, even on a busy day, even with temporary lights and roadworks in place. You always see vast, empty roads in towns when you watch dystopian movies. 
but that's not what I experienced. I've seen strings of abandoned cars where a single accident has royally fucked the whole area, with undead shuffling between those vehicles or writhing in them after retreating to perceived safety after being bitten. A single incident occurred, and zombies awakened from the dead killed in those accidents outright or had subsequently died from untreated injuries. More accidents from panicked drivers stacked atop the already shitty situation, and the slow rampage of those ever-increasing numbers of undead caused mass panic. People fled their vehicles, gripped by the primal terror of the undead. Where those people went, I couldn't say. As with all months in, I imagine many of them are shambling around as undead as well. I'd like to think some more resourceful ones have managed to survive. I can only hope we get the chance to help some of them if they're still kicking, because with winter so close, that will undoubtedly kill off a large portion of those who survived through summer and autumn. The north of England can have shitty weather at the best of times. In winter, it'll be as cold as a politician's heart, and without proper resources and shelter, the death toll will only rise. I appear to be philosophizing and musing a lot, rather than just recounting my tale, but I think these things need recording. I need you to have a sense of what it was like, Freya, as I've never known anything like it. It was almost 2 p.m., the sun was shining bright, and it was a balmy summer day. But the world around me was a frenzy of action and a cacophony of noise. Always in the distance, there was shouting or screaming, distant booms of unseen explosions and collisions, and black plumes leaking into the sky from countless fires. The rhythmic thumping of a police helicopter overhead was a constant, the acrid smell of fire and blood clinging to the air, as frantic people in vehicles or on foot with wide, wild eyes rushed to unknown destinations in a vain hope of shelter and safety. I was standing at the end of my road, staring around me in complete horror, as my sleepy little town collapsed around me. It's my most common saying, but I'll say it again and again, Freya. The apocalypse sucks. I decided to stick to shortcuts through housing estates, rather than going anywhere near a main road. I had visions of dickhead drivers mounting pavements to get around jams on the road, so I needed to keep on the move while avoiding the constant threat of being run over. I decided to cut through a council housing estate, where I could see any cars coming and would have plenty of space to run if needed. Hopefully, it would also keep me away from the epicenter of any erupting clusters of undead. I was given a sharp and violent lesson that day, that the living can be far more monstrous than the undead. I'm not going to cast aspersions or stereotypes on council estates and say they're all bad people, because they're not. But, as a general rule, they house a higher quantity of those below the poverty line, and poverty inevitably brings with it a higher chance of crime. They can be rough places to live, and I know because I've lived on them. Desperate people will often do desperate things to survive, especially when the situation is more desperate than anyone could have foreseen. Throw an end of the world vibe into that poverty-stricken existence, and shit gets real. People lived from week to week, sometimes day to day. They didn't have reserves of food or supplies, so once shit started collapsing, the council estates became war zones. I was horrified to discover roving gangs, openly armed with knives, bats, iron bars, and even a couple with small snub-nosed revolvers. The small convenience store at the centre of the estate, which just consisted of a couple of aisles of basic necessities like food, booze, cigarettes, and everything else you'd find in your local spa shop, was a fucking mess. As some of these hastily assembled mobs assaulted the store, they clashed with each other, fighting over the meagre resources in a frenzy of close-quarter violence, and fearless in doing so because they knew by now that no police would answer any call. What the violent human monsters didn't click to, however, was that every one of their downed victims was now a danger to them. A few went down and stayed down, their skulls and brains already ruined, so they gave the idiots a false sense of power and security. 
Some who went down with stab wounds and subsequently bled out, though. Well, we all know what happened to them. Things got chaotic as I watched dead gangbangers climb from the floor and lunge on former buddies. Some didn't need to rise, just reaching out to grab an ankle, haul their reanimated bodies in a single motion, and bite meaty lumps from their skinny legs. The small car park outside the store was a bloody battleground, with the violent, the dead, the dying, and the undead all over the asphalt. Some idiots thought they were in a video game, or put on an air of bravado, and thought they could take the undead on and get those precious supplies. Freya, you cannot sustain melee combat with the undead in any kind of number. You just can't. But some of these idiots had watched too many Zompok movies. Human muscles and lungs get tired. Brains are flooded with adrenaline. Decision-making is impaired, and weapons get lodged in skulls. There are so many things that can go against you in the midst of all that chaos. Added to this, most of these madmen weren't exactly prime physical specimens with a solid fitness regime. The undead, however, are tireless, relentless, and possess a singular purpose. Kill everyone. Other roving groups of bastards seemed to be using this new lawless existence to exact personal vendettas, kicking in doors of houses to beat someone to death who may have pissed them off at some point, or other vile acts, as the terrified screams of women only served to highlight. Based on what I saw on that estate that first dreadful afternoon, if this is some kind of divine judgment, then quite frankly, we fucking deserve it. Base animal instincts were at the fore, and we clearly failed our first test, as humanity resorted to selfish acts, brutality, and the sating of darker urges that would usually be hidden away from normal sight. With no threat of punishment from the cops, public order disintegrated in a frenzy of violence and horror. It was at that point I realized that wherever I might run to, I would likely see more of the same. I couldn't stay near people while the collapse was in full force, so I needed to get somewhere that people would be running from and not towards. That's when my old high school came to mind. If it wasn't already empty, the school likely would be soon as it was near the end of their day. The main building on campus was three floors tall. It had a canteen that might have some food in, even if there were only some vending machines. And it might have a usable vehicle or two abandoned there I could use when shit calmed down. Honestly, I just needed to get somewhere I could just sit for a moment and think. Everything was just noise. It was half a mile to the school from where I was, but it was an urban run. Violence was erupting all over the estate, so I'd have to be vigilant, smart, and fast. I knew the place pretty well, so I kept to the smallest paths and back alleys. Council estates, if you know them well, have little paths linking the various clustered rows of housing, allowing you to stay clear of the main thoroughfare for large stretches. I kept to those as much as I could, despite not being the fastest route to my ultimate destination. The last thing I needed was a bunch of armed wankers spotting a lone woman and thinking her an easy victim, as they toured the estate in their ten-year-old Renault Clio with flashy rims and large-bore exhaust in an attempt to make the crappy little hatchback sound like an American muscle car. I was just about to hit the last leg of my odyssey. Halfway down one of these narrow alleys, three guys in hoodies, baseball caps, and knockoff tracksuits turned into the alley at the far end, stopping as they laid eyes on me. They were somewhere between 18 and 20 years old, max, skinny in their ballooning oversized hoodies with hardly enough facial hair to make even an attempt at a single beard between all three of them. I didn't want to go back, as the only other route from here was gambling on main thoroughfares. My only realistic way was through them, if I hoped to find some kind of shelter before it started going dark. The longer I was out in all this madness, the higher the chance of getting killed. The creepy little boys looked me up and down, like I was a hunk of meat on the spike in a kebab shop, licking their lips in greasy anticipation. They didn't say anything initially, but they shared that unspoken hungry look between them, nodding to each other that, yes, they did think what the others were thinking. 
They were all taller than me, and no doubt had come to the unanimous unspoken conclusion that this little dark-haired girl, just five and a half feet tall, would be an easy takedown. In their arrogance, they thought they didn't need the hammers and screwdrivers they carried for weapons, so they were held low and unready as they advanced in a line towards me, licking scabby lips in anticipation of what was to come. I mean, three young men against one helpless little girl. It would be a nice little distraction for them, eh? Oh, Icarus, fly not too near the sun, my child, lest thy waxy wings should melt. In other words, you're about to get a kicking bell end. Contrary to the world of stories in books and movies, fights are not long and protracted, with blows being traded back and forth, and heroic second winds allowing the good guy to rise from the jaws of almost certain defeat. When you're in a fight for your life, there's only one thing that matters, and that's winning. Hit fast, fight dirty, and end it quick. Not expecting little old me to have more than ten years of mixed martial arts under my belt, I waited for them to get up close, affecting the look of paralyzing terror that they expected to see from a woman. It made them feel strong, in control, and relaxed. As they got within around six feet of me, my expression changed as I full-on roared at them with all my fury and exploded into motion. That brief second of hesitation as I screamed at them, freezing them in surprise, was all I needed. I smashed my right fist into the central thug's Adam's apple, as it makes an inviting and sensitive target. And if you get throat punched, you aren't doing shit afterwards. Also, if you know how to punch properly, you can royally shit on their day. Punch through the target, not at them. The guy stumbled back a few steps before collapsing to his knees, hands clawing at his neck as he desperately tried to breathe. Without pause, while the other two stood shocked by the explosive attack, I used their slack-jawed bewilderment to hit them both simultaneously. I put my hands on the chest of the guy on the right, shoving him into the wall with all my might to keep him off balance, while smashing my left heel down onto the other guy's toes, crunching the fragile digits to dust. His yelp hit a pitch only nearby dogs would hear, and that was the end of his afternoon. Hell. Think of the pain when you stub your little toe, or stand on a Lego brick in bare feet. I'd just smashed down with all my strength and weight into a small point containing little flesh and tiny bird bones, protected only by the thin material of a dirty knockoff Nike trainer. It was like smashing his flimsy little digits with a bone jackhammer. And none of those little piggies were going to mark it after that. These guys were thugs not real fighters with any form of training. And the overwhelming violence of action, one of Nate's favorite sayings, I imposed on them, hadn't even let them gather their less than average wits in those opening couple of seconds. One guy was on his knees trying to suck oxygen into a smashed throat. Another was down howling at a high frequency while holding his toe dust, while the third was pushed into a wall and off balance. As an abject lesson and punishment for their intended crime, I hit the last guy spread against the wall with a sweeping upward arc of my right foot between his legs, like a Steven Gerrard thunderbolt, kicking his balls hard enough that I half expected to see three Adam's apples appear in his throat. He went down without a sound. Men make a special kind of face when their balls are smacked with that kind of force. Their lungs empty of air so there's no sound, and their face gets twisted in a mangled expression of disbelief and horror, as though someone has just surprise-rammed a barbed dildo into their rectum using a mallet. It's the kind of face that suggests they'd rather be dead than feel that special kind of pain. I know this for a fact because this was not my first scrotum kick. I have multiple points of data gathered through the years to prove my hypothesis. Science, yo. The three thugs were down in as many seconds. Leaving the three little pigs to choke, squeal, and silently pray for death respectively, I left them to their shared misery. Stepping over their choking, crying forms, I picked up the pace and hit full sprint. I finally made it to a fence that ran along the back of the school, hopped it, and made my way towards the nearest entrance. 
there was still a lot of students milling in the car park, probably having been told by parents to wait until they were collected. But I could see that some bad shit had already gone down in the school. Some kids were carrying injuries, some had blood on them that wasn't theirs, accompanied by the blasted stares of those trying to make sense of horrors they had witnessed. Oh shit, what if some of those injuries they're carrying are bites? Was my immediate thought. I did not want to be anywhere near these teenagers if they started dying and reanimating. There were no zombies in the car park yet, but I emphasize the word, yet. Nobody really took any notice of me as I wandered past them towards the language and mathematics building. I'm quite youthful looking and small in stature, so at a glance I probably looked like a sixth form student, especially as I had a backpack strapped to me. I drew a few stares when it looked like I intended to enter the school, as every other student and teacher remaining were outside milling at the fire assembly point in the car park, waiting for parents to collect them, or hoping emergency services would arrive. They never would. Well, most of the teachers were outside. As I headed towards the doors, a combined look of warning and bewilderment from an older man near the entrance made me spin on my heel and find my way to the rear of that particular block. Spying an open window on the top floor right next to a solid metal pipe bolted to the brick, I had a quick glance left and right, then pipe climbed to the top floor, leaned over, grabbed the edge of the window, transferred to the thin ledge, and shimmied my way into the classroom I would call home for a few days. I watched the horror unfold as Mrs. Thompson Smythe careened through the gates and set off the shitstorm in the car park as she tragically mowed down her own kid and a few others. Some other kids succumbed to bites, as I suspected they would, who then turned and attacked their classmates. And just like that, the apocalypse was in full flow at the school. I started writing two days after that, so I know now that I started writing on June 25th. Why did I start to write? My head was royally up my arse after day one, and with only my own company, I was going a little mental. I had nobody to talk to, nobody to call for help, and the only people left in the school were zombified. I figured that maybe if I started writing shit down, it would help me to try and bring some order back to my thinking. So, I acquired some school notebooks from another classroom on my floor with some pens and started what would become this. My Chronicle of Lockie versus the Apocalypse. I look back now and have to let out a grim laugh. I was out of my fucking mind in those early days. I can be hyperactive, a fact I think you're familiar with now, Freya. But shit, reading back those first entries from when I was still at the school, putting my crazy nervous energy into trying to make it some kind of hilarious Shaun of the Dead escapade. I can look back now with clear vision and see just how messed up I was. It wasn't until Nate came on the scene that I started to level out. As my journal continues, I'm still there with my usual hilarity. Shut up, I am hilarious. But there is a level of clear-headed calm that begins to seep in as I take in just what a fucked up world we live in now. In more ways than one, Nate has saved me. It wasn't just his initial appearance rescuing me from the deprivations of that would-be rapist farmer. It's the clarity and calm he's brought to my mental well-being that's had the greatest impact. Huh. Most people go to church to find their saviour. Me? I just go and chat to the grumpy old marine in his rocking chair in the next room. Love that guy. Phew. That was an epic tale of action, suspense, and apocalyptic philosophy. But I'm glad it's done. I think that was the last piece of notable lucky history I needed to record. Having this injury, and thus having bugger all to do, has allowed me the time and space to get it down. As of tomorrow, however, I am back on the roster. Nate and I are going to do our test run beyond the gate to see how the undead are reacting to me, and to set Operation Birthday into motion. Time's ticking on that clock as the 27th gets ever closer. I won't lie. I'm a bit nervous after all the undead tomfoolery. I said I was bringing that word back of recent weeks. But I'm excited at the same time. 
I hate sitting on my ass. And tomorrow, my lovely Freya, Loki versus the apocalypse is back on. Bring it. October 18th, 2010. The cupboard under the stairs. I am pleased to announce that Nate and I are not dead. Yesterday was my first journey beyond the gate since pulling Nate's ass out the fire and wrecking my back muscle, and it felt awesome to be gearing up with him again. Equipment and weapons checking, Nora confirming we'd eaten and taken a pee before leaving, Maria ramming fistfuls of vitamin supplements in our mouths, and vehicle checks. Operation Birthday was officially underway. So, a little bit of a reveal as to my plans. Downtown in that shopping center, where I played chicken with a zombie horde after blowing up our Prius, there's a small party shop. Balloons, fancy dress costumes, party poppers, candles, banners, the whole nine yards. It was an easy way to get everything we needed in one hit, so we could spruce up the lodge with a party feel and add a little splash of vibrant color to an otherwise dark and dreary existence. The shopping center is basically one long central pedestrian walkway, with shops, banks, cafes, restaurants, pubs, and so forth, lining each side of it. We didn't have to go anywhere near where that pant-shitting legion of undead were located across the main carriageway, as there's a service road that runs off behind the far side along a river, which meant we could pull the pickup behind the party shop and go in the back door. We'd be a long way from where the wall of undead were, as they were located about four-fifths up the length of the town centre, and we'd be right down the bottom in the very first fifth. There was a good half a mile between us and them, if they were still there, as we weren't pushing our luck that far to go and check, and they'd have to navigate into the shopping centre through some alleyways from their location. Even then, they'd have to come all the way down the hill, then squeeze through a tiny alley wide enough for just two people to get round the back where we were. Exceedingly long description shortened, we were good, and the wall of the dead wasn't an issue. We took a long, circuitous route anyway. The service road is mostly used by delivery vehicles, and we eventually pulled up behind the little back door of the small independent shop. And it really was small. Once you go in, the left to right wall is 20 feet at most. You know the type of stores I mean, Freya. Small, cosy shops that would feel claustrophobic if you had more than six people in at any one time. The back door was intact. Unsurprising, really, as we didn't expect anyone looting on the day the world died to be bothered with a small store that had balloons and fancy dress. Such things are not considered essential survival supplies. Unless your plan is to add a little colour to the dead world by hunting zombies dressed as a giant gun-toting banana. We fell into our rhythm and cleared the area first, making sure there were no shamblers sneaking up on us. They were not, and so while I stood sentry with my eyes facing out, Nate grabbed a halligan from the back of the pickup and used it to crack the door open. Thankfully, no hell stench came wafting from the store's interior, but Nate did his whistle test anyway and waited. With no response, we switched to pistol and flashlight, then entered the store. I am happy to report that it was free of any undead incursion. This was my show. So, once we'd cleared the building, Nate dropped out of the door again to pull security while I went party shopping. I kept nipping out to throw stuff in the rear of the pickup, and Nate didn't really take any notice of the shit I was piling in there. He's too professional, which is what I was counting on. I wanted to keep my cards close to my chest until we were away from the store, and he didn't have the chance to veto me. I spent a good two hours in there, because there were racks and racks of fancy dress costumes. Cheap shit ones for purchase made in China that could likely be bought from eBay for a fiver, and some high-quality ones that were rentals. That was where my attention was. I was extremely happy with my selection of fancy dress attire for our little apocalypse family. Yes, Freya, all our little family. All of them. Mwahahaha. I got balloons, 
some little cans of helium to blow them up, sparkling birthday banners to hang up, plus some blue tack to stick them up with, and I also grabbed a handful of birthday cards so everyone could write one out, making sure I got a massive one that would stand out from the rest that Mark could give his birthday boy. It's a simple thing, I know, but it feels bigger. We can't do this all the time, but with everything Charlie has been through, it just feels right. He's had to, and will continue to have to, grow up much quicker. He won't go to high school, he won't get nervous before asking a girl to prom, and he won't experience college or university to make the happy memories that most of us are blessed with. He's never really going to enjoy just being a kid. In a couple of years, should we live that long, he'll be 12, and it won't surprise me at all if he's walking around carrying a small caliber revolver on his hip or pot-shotting undead with a small rifle. He's the first of a new generation where his firsts will be the first life he saved, the first wound he took, the first zombie he killed, and the first bullet he fired. Shit. What a depressing thought that is. Before all this shit went down, if you told a 12-year-old boy he'd be carrying a live firearm to kill zombies, they'd probably high-five and air punch, thinking it was the coolest shit in the world. The reality of it is far more distressing. So, in light of him losing his childhood quicker than most, we can still mark the big one zero with a fancy dress party. One little light of humanity in a dark, inhuman world. After I gave Nate the nod I was done, he looked visibly relieved as we loaded up and rolled out. The last part of our little sojourn still had to be tested, though. We needed to find an undead or two and test their reaction to me, and we weren't enamored with the idea of heading to the Great Wall of Hate uptown. As we'd rolled out about 7.30 a.m., and now it was only a little after 10.30 a.m., we still had the best part of the day left. So, on the very edge of town, we decided to pull into a little cul-de-sac that had some high-end detached houses. There were five houses in the little circle at the end of the road, three of which still had vehicles on the driveway. We surmised that people in these houses had decided to lock down, and we would either find survivors we could possibly help, or at least some undead to run my little test. Sadly, we did not find survivors. I was in a good mood on our journey back from the party shop. High-spirited, you might even say. One of those houses, however, sucked all the joy out of me. I was brought crashing back down to reality with a hard stop. Four were devoid of presence, either living or dead, two of them being the houses without vehicles out front. The two that did have a vehicle outside, but no sign of living or dead inside, we assumed escaped on foot or were away on holiday when all this bullshit went down. Bing bong! All flights into the UK are cancelled due to unforeseen global apocalypse. The team at Undead Airlines apologise for any inconvenience. The last remaining house in the circle was a stark reminder of the horrors hiding behind closed doors. Once we experienced that house, all I wanted to do was go home. We knew it was bad when we popped the door open. It was like the halitosis of the dead exhaling out of the doorway. There was no doubt there were undead inside, because the cloud of fetid corruption that hissed out of the open doorway was straight up evil. There's no other way to put it. It wasn't just rotten, but aggressive and acidic, like a targeted assault against your senses. I can never find the right words to describe the putrescent stench of the undead, even though I keep trying. The best single word I can think of to convey its foulness is... violating. It violates your senses, burning the eyes, souring the tongue, and invading your nostrils to squat there like a hobo that's shat himself. Just fucking dreadful. Nate didn't need to whistle test. The moment we peered into the hallway, we saw a dead couple who I guessed were in their mid-thirties when alive. They were skinny, though, like 
way too skinny, as though they had slowly starved these past few months. Their faces were sunken and sharp, their fingers skeletal with thin layers of pale skin stretched over the bony digits. I couldn't help but feel remorse when I saw the state of them. This little cul-de-sac was literally two miles from the lodge on the wealthier outskirts of town. We'd driven past this little avenue of houses so many times on our various runs beyond the gate. They must have heard the throaty engine of our pickup pass them by on numerous occasions, or the gunshots of our firearms training in the distance, and cowered behind their curtains, fearful that bandits or raiders were coming to assault them. After hearing Nate crack open the front door with the Halligan, the undead couple turned towards us. I held my breath in anticipation, waiting for them to lock on and do that weird, purposeful stride towards me. However, they did not. They had the same glassy, vacant look common to the undead, shuffled aimlessly towards us with blank expressions, and only twisted their lips into that silent snarl at their usual pre-lunge distance. They didn't focus solely on me, and were equally interested in munching on Nate. Weird, like whatever was driving them at the pharmacy, the main road through downtown and the builder's yard, was now simply absent. We let them stumble into the open and brained them with ease, saving bullets and unnecessary noise by spiking their melons with the halligans. Just another normal day in the apocalypse. Until we went inside. My heart sank the moment we entered. Pictures dotted the wall in the entrance hallway, matching the couple that lay with their heads caved in outside the front door. Right between them in those pictures, however, was a little mousy-haired girl. She was no more than five years old. Nate, was all I said, gesturing to the picture. He glanced at the framed photo. His jaw tightened a little, and he exhaled long and even. But I know him well enough now to see the little signs of distress that nobody else will spot. To my eyes, I witnessed a visible sag to his posture. Nate's whole demeanor hardly moved to the untrained observer, but I saw his entire body radiate sorrow, each little sign melding together into a single, unspoken sentiment. God, not again. Then we heard the scratching. Where the parents had been stood when we popped the door, there was a little cupboard under the staircase. There were deep scratches and smears of old, dried blood on the outside of the once white door, with broken pieces of bloody fingernail embedded in some of the grooves. The undead parents had stood there, scratching at the door, trying to get at their tiny daughter as she trembled in the darkness. Only the mother had wounds, the father must have died, and when he turned, it must have been a flurry of shock and panic. The mother had likely bundled their precious daughter into the cupboard to keep her safe, while she tried to deal with her reanimated and now murderous husband. She clearly failed, killed by a hungry bite to the back of her neck, severing an artery. There was a massive pool of dark, thick crusted blood on the kitchen floor tiles, evidencing her awful death. I'll do it, said Nate. No, I replied, feeling sick to my soul. No, Nate, let me take this one. You've taken too many already. Erin. I held up a hand. No, Nate, not this time. This is how life is now. You're right, I wasn't ready before. With Freya. I released a shaking breath before inhaling a deep lungful of courage. But now, I am. And I need this. My voice shrank to almost a whisper then, and what I said next was more for myself than for Nate. I've got this, Nate. I've got this. I could feel his dark eyes on me, assessing the truth of my statement. Look at me, he said, and I obeyed. He locked his gaze to mine for a few moments, then his own expression turned resolute. Fuck the noise, he said. Use the clock. Then he placed a strong hand on my shoulder, 
squeezed once in support, and retreated outside. Whatever he was looking for in my eyes, he must have found it and stamped his approval on my personal need to get this done. He's my rock, and honestly, I can't imagine life without him now. I draw strength just from his presence, and I needed all of his might to get this done. Alone, I stepped to the small, blooded door, hearing the little nails scratching at the wood inside. I swallowed a nervous dry lump that felt like broken glass as it went down, drew the glock, mimicked Nate's check for a round in the chamber, and twisted the small brass knob. The little girl tumbled out into the hall as I stepped back, her weight having been pressed against the door when she sensed the living beyond it. She was dressed in a tiny off-white nightdress with a faded pink unicorn smiling as it leaped over a rainbow. She was barefoot and covered in filth, with no visible bite or mortal wounds on her little form. My heart almost shattered inside my chest as I realized the little girl must have pissed and shit in that dark little prison, unable to escape even by accident as there was no knob to turn on the inside of the cupboard door. She had been trapped, alone in the dark, as her murderous parents tried to claw their way in. And all this after hearing the terrified shrieks of her dying mother. For an unknown length of time, she had been trapped in the darkness with silent, scratching demons outside her only door. No food, no water, no light, and no hope. I mean, fuck. I can't even comprehend the level of terror a five-year-old would feel in that sightless hell. She probably faded from dehydration, but not before she'd been forced to lie in a lake of her own filth. The stench emanating from her was just pure misery. White eyes stared up at me from the laminate wooden floor as she climbed to her feet while I backed away. In the picture on the wall, she'd had such pretty hazel eyes that glimmered with the light of innocence and security. All that remained of that bright and happy girl was a white-eyed husk, caked in human waste, with shredded fingertips that reached for me as she stumbled forward. I lined the pistol with her head and didn't hesitate. I'm sorry, I whispered as I fired, but the glock's thunder in the confined hallway swallowed my apology. Sheathing the pistol, I spun on my heel and walked right past Nate with my head in hands, climbed into the passenger seat and slammed the door shut. I didn't care if there was anything of use in that house, I just wanted to be away. Wordlessly, Nate climbed into the truck, hummed the engine into life, and we came home. He never said a word, but he didn't need to. Just him being there was enough for me. I couldn't write yesterday after that, hence why I'm doing it today. I needed peace, and I needed particles. And I cried my fucking heart out in my room for two hours straight, until I was borderline dehydrated myself. That house makes me feel absolutely shit, Freya. It had been within our power to help those people, but we just never knew they were there. We'd driven past those houses so many times, and never thought to stop there. Yesterday and today, I said, if only, so many times. Freya, those two words alone don't have much of a punch. But when you stick them beside each other, they gain a power that can fucking break you if you let them. I'll cry for them. I'll feel every stab of guilt for what might have been but it only makes me more determined to do something about this fucking mess, to make something of it for those who are left. There will be many more days when I feel like this, that much I know. There will be more days where I struggle to collect the shattered fragments of my heart and I feel like I can't go on. However, I also know this truth. You might see me weak, but you'll never See me quit. Part two, family affairs. October 21st, 2010. No reason why. 
I've been thinking a lot these last few days. I know, dangerous, right? But seriously, I've taken a few days to consider the weirdness with the undead. Why the change after your death, Freya? Why the sudden shift where the undead focused entirely on me, then after the builder's yard, everything reverts back to how it was? I decided that last night I would throw it out to the rest of our little community as we had our evening meal. Mark and Alicia saw the evidence themselves at the yard, how they were largely ignored once I was on the scene, and how the dead crowded round my voice coming through the radio, like dogs hearing their absent owner's voice over the phone. Alicia was also with us when the Wall of Undead marched towards us downtown. The prior couple of days we did some house clearing for supplies, and to give Isaac, Maria and Alicia more time in the field. Mark was busy with the generator housing and wood stove prep work, which incidentally gets full installation tomorrow, as we'll need lots of hands to get it in place, and he's best left doing useful stuff like that. Mark is best coming out beyond the gate when there's stuff we might need his engineering brain for. He's just got too much skill and know-how, and there's always stuff he can be doing on the home front. We're going to convert the double garage next to the bungalow into a workshop for him, and find a table saw and some other tool stuff I stopped listening about when he and Nate were chatting. Isaac, Maria and Alicia came out with me and Nate, and we rolled in two vehicles, our trusty pickup and the white van we took from the convenience store what seems like a decade ago. Our plan was to start hitting houses on the outskirts of town to give Maria and Isaac some live trigger time against small pockets of undead that could be easily managed. It would also serve to bed Alicia in as part of our new fully-fledged security team, and to just generally take it easy, doing simple resource gathering without venturing too far from the lodge. If we're going to take the fight to the undead and clear large areas of town, best to start small and work in a pattern. We ignored the cul-de-sac of housing where I shot the little girl. I wasn't ready to go back there just yet, so we moved on to the next fancy pants housing area a little way down. We found some good stuff, but I won't list it as inventory bores the shit out of me, as you are all too aware, Freya. It was interesting having Maria along, though, as she took stuff that Nate and I never even think of. Clean bedding sheets, pillows, towels, that kind of stuff. We're always looking for food, tools, cleaning supplies, and useful clothing, but never even thought of stuff like bedding and towels. Nate had to put the stoppers on her a few times, though. Maria, we can't take everything, he chided. Our space is limited, and we can't empty every house in the town into that lodge. Think of it like a triage. She laughed at his medical analogy, nodded, and started being more selective about real essentials. Medicine and vitamins, however, she wouldn't be moved on, and Nate wouldn't fight her on those anyway. If we found any form of medicine or vitamin supplies, we took it all. That stuff always tops our list. Isaac and Maria both took down their first zombies with a handgun. Isaac did okay. But Maria? I mean, shit. I'm sorry I ever thought her caregiver nature would be a hindrance to her. She palmed her glock slow and smooth, both hands solid, feet planted, and squeezed off a single round to drop a zombie stumbling out of an open door like a stone-cold pro. I looked at Nate in surprise, and he just had a half grin on one side of his mouth, reminiscent of a teacher's pride in a star pupil. I am pleased to announce that our caregiving medical professional is officially a zombie-killing badass. So cool. Isaac did fine, but he was still a nervous amateur. You could see he was thinking of everything in little steps, trying to remember he was doing everything right while Nate was watching. He did, but he took a little long to get himself set and took three rounds before he popped the melon. He's still learning, but he'll be fine with more field time and hard practice, I think. Ha, <laughs> listen to the wise and sagely pro here. I've been shooting for just under four months and chatting shit like I'm some spec ops ninja. Still, I've got a lot of trigger time now, and as flighty as I seem, I secretly practice my handling all the time. 
If you do something enough, your brain wires up a hard-coded program for that skill. You move from conscious competence, where you know how to do it but have to think about it, to the desired stage of unconscious competence when it becomes second nature, allowing you to multitask. You can see the difference in Maria and Isaac. She's practiced it way more, as well as having a natural affinity for it. Alicia is the same now, as she does nothing but practice with weapons. It drives her to be better, and as long as she can keep her head cool, she'll be a real asset. That girl does not fuck about, and takes her security role very seriously. As long as we don't see that savagery we witnessed when she first brained a zombie with the Halligan, Alicia will join our top-tier defence, along with me and Nate. I've wandered off on tangents again. Reading my journal entries is like watching Billy Connolly live on stage. I'll wander off down a merry road of tangents and side notes, but I'll eventually find my way back to what I was trying to actually talk about. My point about the house clearing was to illustrate how the small pockets of undead we came across were back to their normal, aimless selves. Gone was the purpose, the drive, and the singular focus towards me. I'll admit my relief, because I hated the thought of having to stay in the lodge while others went out and did the grind. At the same time, though, it unnerves me. Why did it happen for that short period? And why has it reverted to the same threat level as it is for anyone else? This is what I put to the group. We laid out everything we'd seen at the little pharmacy where it first appeared, then the wall of undead downtown, which Nate and Alicia both confirmed there was no reaction from until I opened my mouth. Finally, there was the builder's yard, and both Mark and Alicia were quite animated about that experience. They saw firsthand how every zombie came stomping after me when I played carrot for the undead donkey, allowing them to gun down some rear stragglers and make it safely to the trucks. I laid out what I felt and just put it right out there. This apocalypse was not a virus, nor was it some chemical weapon. It was not man-made, and it was not a natural viral mutation. There was something more at work. Like God or the devil? asked Maria. She's never been religious, but Dean was. Not in your face religious or ram it down your throat religious, though. Faith was just something he'd been brought up with and was very personal to him. I think it also gave him some comfort in an incredibly stressful job and let him find some peace amid everything he'd seen. I shrugged. I don't know. I don't believe in magic sky fairies, nor in horned demons in a plane of fire tormenting souls for eternity. I'm not saying there isn't something out there we don't understand, because the longer this goes on, the more I have to believe there is something out there that sparked this bullshit. I just can't give it a name right now. It does feel a little like we're being judged, offered Nora. I was so happy to hear that from someone else, because that's what's always been eating at me. It does feel like a punishment, a slow death for humanity, with the dead as our judge, jury, and executioner for all the death and misery humanity has inflicted upon itself. I said as much to the group. Nora nodded her agreement. When you put it like that, Flower, it's hard to argue with the logic. There's no real logic to any of this, Mark mumbled round a mouthful of pasta. No, there isn't, I agreed. But even in all these twisted knots of logic and musing about supernatural or divine intervention, why this brief period where it felt like I was being targeted? Nobody had any answers to that. I didn't expect any, and I doubt I will ever get one. There's so much that will likely go unanswered about this shit show. I have to wonder, though, if this happened once, who's to say it won't happen again? If it does, we'll deal with it, said Nate after I voiced that thought. We can't control it, Erin, so all we can do is carry on. We're all still adjusting, so let's just go one day at a time. Sensible, practical Nate. I get the impression that he isn't convinced by my theory of some agency behind the undead uprising. 
He can't explain it, but that doesn't mean he's on board with the dark force I'm suggesting is out there, even if Nora is backing my play. He's right about taking it one day at a time, though, because we can't do anything about it if there is some force playing an undead fiddle. So it drops back to Nora's sagely wisdom about not being bound by the chains of things we can't change. I hate it, though, because it's different for me. They haven't briefly been the sole target of the dead, and the reason why I was, even for that brief time, messes with me when I'm not busy doing something or trying to get to sleep. It's easy to impart that wisdom when hordes of undead haven't focused entirely on you for no apparent reason. There's no sense behind it, because even if there is a divine, alien, or supernatural force behind the eyes of the dead, what the hell makes me so bloody special? I was nobody before the world collapsed, and now I'm just a woman trying to survive like everybody else. Maybe there is some wisdom in Nate's and Nora's advice. I'm tying myself in knots trying to figure out the why when I've got no frame of reference or starting point to work with. For now, the undead have reverted back to their shambling, see human, eat human randomness. I can't go any further with my train of thought, considering the great dearth of any solid reason or extra knowledge. So I suppose I should drop it for the moment. I'll try, but it won't be easy. October 25th, 2010. Come get some. I'm finding I leave bigger gaps of late. We've been pretty busy, and truth be told, I get bored just recording every little event. I'm not a historian, so I'm sorry if you want all the tiny details, Freya, but that just isn't me. I write when I feel I have something of worth to write. If I need to scribble down some bullshit to order my thoughts, I do so. If I've got a fantastical or interesting yarn to spin, then I do so. Just clearing houses and assembling useful resources is now our business-as-usual mode. So unless there's something really amazing, intriguing, or harrowing to report from that task, I tend to just let it slide. I use my writing to either stimulate or settle my whirlwind of thoughts, and just writing down what we gathered that day or how many undead we put down isn't really worth the effort. Also, when I get back now, I'm usually bone-fucking-weary. Today, however, I have something of worth to write, as we found recent evidence of other survivors. We tend to stick to clearing little cul-de-sacs or clusters of upmarket housing on the edge of town. Our reasoning is that those places are more likely to have useful resources, and if we're going to spend precious bullets, we're going to ensure there is at least some kind of payoff for it in terms of resource rewards. We need to spend some bullets so Nate can track the improvement in Alicia, Isaac and Maria, as they need active firing experience with hostile targets. Alicia is officially promoted to the A-Team. That girl is a stone-cold slayer of the undead now. She's calm, focused, and accurate, making every round count whether she goes with shotgun, pistol, or rifle. Nate's been full of praise to her face, and you can see the visible effect that validation has on her. She stands taller, shoulders back and beaming with pride. Almost single-handed, Nate has managed to rebuild Alicia's sense of self-worth and given a purpose. Nate's real skill isn't how deadly he is with weapons. His real skill is bringing the best out of you. If you're a dumbass, he'll tear you a brand new asshole with his verbal assault. Equally, if you're on point, he's full of praise, and you know that praise is genuine because he's been so brutal in his criticism prior to it. It motivates the hell out of you because all you want is that nod and thumbs up. I know what Alicia is feeling right now, because I've felt it when Nate gives you that approval. It feels like he can take on the apocalypse with only a spork for a weapon. It's also really great to have a third solid person to pull security. Alicia has really dropped into that soldier mentality, though, 
and when we're on mission, she's even started referring to Nate as Sir. He didn't start it, it was something she decided to do herself, but he hasn't discouraged it either. If it helps her stay focused, I'm not going to stop her, was all he said when I asked him about it. Fair enough, I guess. She drops the formal address when we're back at the lodge and is just back to being called Nate, so no harm, no foul. Maria is a solid student, by the book and no fucking about. All she gets is praise, and I expect nothing else from her, to be honest. She is not a toe-in-the-water kind of woman when she applies herself to a task. She's more likely to run and yell, Cannonball! Maria goes all in or stays out, and with regards to firearms training and tactics, she is firmly entrenched. Isaac is still playing catch-up to the two women, but he's definitely improving. Since his slow fumbling a few days back, he's clearly been focusing on all those checks, stance, safe drawer and all that jazz. Nate congratulated him on his application, and Isaac just about prevented himself throwing out celebratory dance shapes. He was much more accurate, and you can see with each bullet fired that confidence is visibly taking shape. I reckon he'll be okay. All this is a precursor just for me to extol Nate's awesomeness again. I hope he never reads my journal, because he'll have all kinds of shit to use against me. So, back to the survivor evidence. While we were clearing houses on a little circle of nine fancy detached abodes, Alicia called out to us all after she'd cleared one house of undead. We do the open door and whistle test, trying to bait any undead to us so we can take them out safely in the open rather than in the confines of a house. Nate and I can blast through a house as a duo now, but we've been doing it a while and know each other. The rest of them need proper training on that, and before we go there, Nate wants them all to be confident weapon users. Clearing buildings in a safe manner is a whole new set of lessons, so where we can, we bait them out first. Alicia cleared a house after no one dead came stumbling out and called us over. We went over as a full group, as Nate didn't want to leave Maria and Isaac without supervision in these early stages. Plus, when someone says they've found something of interest, you can't help but mosey on over for a sneaky peek. Two single mattresses from upstairs had been dragged down into the living room and placed near the hearth. Nate examined the ashes in the fire and reckoned they were only a couple of days old. There was no sign of any stowed equipment, though. The kitchen had been ravaged of all usable foodstuffs, and when we popped open a door leading to the basement, a rotten stench came rolling out, gagging the lot of us. It wasn't the stench of the undead, though. That's awfully specific and alien. No, this was just the actual dead. Nate went down alone, telling the rest of us to keep an eye out, then soon came back up and closed the door behind him. We opened the patio door in the kitchen and stepped into the backyard to suck in some clean air. There are three bodies down there, he said. A man, woman, and what looks like a teenage boy. They were definitely undead at some point, as the man and woman are both covered in bite marks, and the boy has ligature bruising around his neck, so I think he must have hanged himself, which started the bullshit dominoes falling. Detective Carter for the win. Someone put them down, and put them down well, he continued. The man and woman look like they've had their skulls done by a small axe, a camping hatchet maybe, judging by the size and shape of the wounds. Whoever's using it hit clean and hard, so I'd say they were physically fit and quite tall. The boy, however, was done with a small caliber pistol. The wound looks about the size of a thirty-eight and done from point blank. People with guns is worrying, observed Maria. She's not wrong. The only reason we're armed to the teeth is because we stole illegal firearms from a small-time arms dealer who had a recent delivery and a full stash. Added to that, we raided farmhouses for shotguns and associated buckshot. Never forget, this is England. Your average citizen has never seen a real firearm up close, much less own one and possess the knowledge to use it. Firearms are only in the hands of licensed shooting club members, and they tend to be shotguns or twenty-two hunting rifles, 
law enforcement, or criminal elements. Aye, agreed Nate. I think it's the last resort, though. Two mattresses in the room suggests two people, or maybe a family unit with a small child that sleeps with a parent. The hatchet seems to be the main go-to for defence, with a small thirty-eight revolver to pull them out of the shit if things go to hell. That suggests a finite and small amount of ammunition. Nate doesn't miss a fucking trick, does he? He looked each of us in the eye, his tone grave. From here on, nobody does any house alone. If we stumble across a survivor that's scared and paranoid, two guns pointed their way will make them rethink any reaction fire. If there's only one, they might pull the trigger first so they can run. That was a sobering thought. We've been so focused on the undead in the houses, the notion of stumbling upon a scared and hungry survivor with a firearm hasn't really been in our thinking. Again, because this is England. Every homeowner is more likely to have a bat for defending their suburban paradise, not a thirty-eight revolver. Guns are rare, but they're still out there. Illegal firearms were still on the streets, and you have to think that for anyone to have a realistic chance of survival as time goes on, the ones most likely to stay alive are those who have access to one. A baseball bat won't do shit for you against the undead. Cracking a skull and traumatizing the brain isn't that easy. Whoever these survivors were, they knew how to survive. Or at least one of them did. I'm excited but also scared. Excited there is real evidence of other survivors, other people we could possibly help. But scared, because those survivors might shoot one of my friends, either by design or by accident. Either way, it means we have to move much more carefully from here on in, and best to roll as heavy as we can. It has made me particularly aware regarding the lack of body armor we have, Nate has his tactical vest, which I think might be fused to his body, but the rest of us don't. With the real threat of startling someone and flying bullets, it's something we need to address. I'll have a chat to Nate about that tonight. I can't abide the thought of losing one of my little family to the murderous undead. Losing them to a bullet, fired by a scared human we wanted to help, would be just too much fucking awful luck for my frail sanity to take at the moment, I think. But all that aside, the silver lining is that there are still resourceful people out there fighting back and surviving still, four months on. Humanity has been a royal pain in its own arse for so long, and stupid people do stupid things to each other, which has likely brought about this purging of us. However, we're also a stubborn bunch, with those still possessing the fight and intelligence to stick a middle finger up to the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And that gives me hope. We shall not go quietly into the night, motherfucker. October 26th, 2010. Operation Birthday. It's 11 p.m., and tomorrow Charlie turns ten. It's a big day. After Charlie went to bed tonight, we moved like a well-oiled party machine and started hanging banners and balloons and wrapping presents. Yes, presents. When clearing out a house the other day, we found a stash of stuff in an upstairs wardrobe in the master bedroom. I think the kids' parents were those super-organized type that buy Christmas presents four months in advance. There was a trove of stuff, and I demanded we each take something so everyone could give the kid a birthday present. Admittedly, we had to take the rolls of Christmas wrapping paper there as well, so we'll have jolly Santa faces and red-nosed reindeers splattered all over it. But who gives a shit? The kid will get to open presents, and age-appropriate ones as well. There were a couple of Lego sets, one of them pretty big as well, so it might have been a main Christmas present for one lucky kid. It was the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars. Charlie loves Star Wars, according to Mark, so we gave that one to him to hand his boy. It's only right the largest card and the fanciest present comes from his dad. Other stuff was some smaller Lego sets. I chose Darth Vader's TIE Fighter because, duh, it's cool. 
a couple of board games, some art stuff, books, and even a big tin of swizzles, sweets. Shit, I love those, so I'm glad me and Charlie are so tight. Palmer Violet's for the win. After we'd set up the lodge and given it the full makeover, we stepped back, stared around, and nodded. There were many high fives. Then Mark suddenly broke down into tears. Not sad tears, Freya. He was just completely overwhelmed that we'd all gone to so much effort to give his boy one big day. That little slice of normal that would carve the biggest smile into his handsome little features. He started thanking all of us. That was when Nate just shook his head. Don't thank us, Mark, he said. We're just doing what we're told. The banners, the cards, the balloons, the presents. Everything was Erin's idea. I've seen her dig her eels in a few times since I've known her, but she was willing to walk through the fires of hell itself to give Charlie this day. If you want to thank anyone, it's all her. That just set Mark off more, which set me off, which set everyone else off. Mark just folded me in a bear hug, crying happy tears and thanking me again and again. It was nice. Mark and Charlie are awesome. He's such a good dad, and Charlie's like my adopted little brother now. I feel a duty to look after my little dude. To do something good for them both was amazing. Charlie gets to have a big celebration and be fussed over for his 10th birthday, and his dad can sit back and drink in those happy smiles, watching his kid just be a kid for a day. That is what it's all about, Freya. Never underestimate the power a single act of kindness can have on someone. Kindness is a language which the deaf can hear and the blind can see. I can't remember who said that right now, but it's so true. We, as human beings, elevate ourselves through the act of lifting others, and those acts of kindness should be their own motive. We do them because it is right and good to do so. No agenda, no cost, and no expectation. We are made kind by being kind. Stick that in your pipe and smoke it, apocalypse. Tomorrow I will not write. Tomorrow is all about the newly minted 10-year-old Charlie Reynolds. And I'm going to spring my evil surprise on Nate. This will be the best day of the apocalypse thus far. See you in a couple of days, Freya. I'll update you the day after. Lucky's gonna get a party on, oh yeah. October 28th, 2010. Party on, dudes. Well, it's about 8 p.m. and I decided to have an early night because I was so tired after yesterday's shindig. I threw that in air quotes because it was only partly true. I came to my room to write, as it's going to take a while, and I am quite tired after drinking alcohol last night. But really, I'm being a coward and avoiding a whole bunch of awkwardness. I'll get to that soon enough. First off, let's get the good stuff out of the way before I get to the shitstorm of my own making. Charlie woke up yesterday and came downstairs to a collective cheer. When he saw the lodge all decked out, a pile of presents and cards on the table, and everyone hollering happy birthday at him, he positively beamed. He was so excited. His reactions to the cards and presents as he opened them, so unashamedly joyful, that I knew the risk of hitting the party store had been worth it. Nate gave me the nod, and my face started to hurt from the smiling. The day went by with Charlie being fussed over. Mark still got some work done soundproofing the generator outhouse he's built, while I sat with Charlie for about three hours as we worked on the Millennium Falcon. There's something therapeutic about building a Lego set. You kind of switch off your brain, idly chatting shit, and time just rolls by without a care in the world, except finding piece A to attach to piece B. It's relaxing. Also, chatting bullshit and joking about with a ten-year-old lets me forget about the real stress of the apocalypse, even for just a little while. 
as the day wore on towards late afternoon, it was time to get ready for the party. We would have music, courtesy of a laptop with speakers loaded up with tunes. We would have food. We would have sweets. Charlie insisted we help him with the big tin of swizzles. Oh no, what a terrible chore that would be. And the grown-ups would kick back and enjoy a few drinks. We never really relax, and we've collected a shitload of booze on our journeys beyond the gate. So it was time to just kick back and enjoy the day. Then came my big reveal. Fancy dress for everyone. Everyone. Nate gave me a look of, everyone except me, right? Everyone, Nate. As the evening came, allow me to regale you with the marvellous selection of roles we would play for the evening. Nora had us in stitches as she was full-on dressed up as Mrs. Doubtfire, even throwing out the, hello, dear, with real aplomb. The funniest shit was that she stayed in character all night. As we got deeper into our cups later in the evening, it just got funnier and funnier. My ribs are still hurting from laughing. Love that woman. I had to be careful with Alicia, as I didn't want to give her something provocative. The last thing she'd feel comfortable in was something overtly feminine and flesh-bearing. So I was pretty made up with finding an adult-sized costume of Jessie from Toy Story 2 in the store. She had her little plastic six-shooter, big red cowgirl hat, jeans, shirt, waistcoat and boots. She looked epic, and I could see her visibly relax when I pulled it out for her. She got right into the swing of things and bought into the whole fancy dress party notion. Two for two. Isaac got his swagger on when I gave him a Han Solo black and white ensemble, complete with blaster. Every Star Wars boy wanted to be lovable rogue Han, rather than whiny Jedi wannabe Luke, so no complaints there. Maria looked the absolute bomb. She's a damn good looking woman, and the dark tone of her skin is just gorgeous. Against the blazing turquoise blue of the Princess Jasmine dress, from Aladdin, with the same coloured headband, she looked fucking knockout. How do I know this? Nate isn't visibly affected by much, but when Maria appeared in that Princess Jasmine outfit with a dramatic twirl, I swear he nearly snorted the bourbon he was supping out of his nose. Lucky scores again. Also, Nate and Maria? Hmm, you know, that would work. Not yet, because we don't know shit about Dean, even though we should really be accepting that he's probably gone. But Dean and Maria were childhood sweethearts, and if he is, gone for good. She won't get over him quickly. I should really talk to Maria. She's been avoiding the whole Dean conversation. I need to see where her head's at regarding his fate. Mark and Charlie were next, and I'm quite sure this is some of my best work to date. Mark was painted all green. Because yes, I got some body paint at the party store too, and the pair of them were Shrek and Donkey. Charlie was in a full grey donkey outfit, his grinning face sticking out with a mahoosive donkey head on the top. Oh, my swirling heart. I swear, the pair of them were cute as all hell. I'm amazing at this shit. I'm building the tension here. You just know I'm leaving Nate till last. I'll go next. Obviously, having a smart mouth, slightly goofy sense of humour, and being generally awesome, I went for a gender-bended Captain Jack Sparrow, mate. Savvy? My hair's getting super long, so I had Maria help me put it in a load of little braids, had the big tricorn hat, long coat, boots, fancy eye makeup, everything. I rolled my pirate swagger all night long. I'm fairly certain, however, if I say savvy one more time to anyone in this lodge, I'm getting decked. I said it a lot, like at the end of every sentence a lot. Savvy? Good times. For our penultimate contestant, we have Particles. Well, I wasn't going to leave him out of the festivities, was I? Especially when I saw the shop had fancy dress costumes for pets as well.
I think I may have forever damaged mine and particles close bond, as the withering gaze he gave me, forced to trot round all night long dressed as a hot dog with mustard and everything, clearly asked me this question every time we locked eyes. Am I a fucking joke to you, human? Outraged. But, my lovely Freya, there could only ever be one true winner in this competition. Despite the breathtaking Maria as Princess Jasmine, the hilarious Nora in her role as Mrs. Doubtfire, the world's cutest family unit as Shrek and Donkey, my pirate awesome, you savvy? And Particle's raging disgust at being paraded as junk food. The moment Nate walked into the room, there was only one true champion. Nate Carter, ex-Royal Marine Commando, former special operator with the 22 Special Air Service, the Terminator's granddad, and the Grim Reaper's unfriendly kind of threatening dad, stole the show. As super fucking Mario. Bright red shirt, super blue dungarees, giant red hat with an M plastered in a white circle at the center, and a gargantuan foam mustache stuck to his top lip. Freya, let me tell you, it was glorious. The whole room collapsed in laughter, not just because this giant ferocious ball of deadly awesome was dressed like a cartoon, but because his facial expression was so fucking stern and incongruous with the frivolity of his costume. Freya, we all just lost it. Nate was not amused. Eventually, his ferocious demeanor cracked, mostly because who can stay mad when a ten-year-old is absolutely pissing himself laughing? And not just a chuckle, oh no. Charlie was crippled with paroxysms of proper uncontrollable belly laughter that was on the verge of causing respiratory failure. It was funny as hell anyway, but it was cranked up to eleven when Nate turned to me and with a completely straight face and total dead pantone said one line. Tomorrow, I hope a bird shits on your face. That was it. I needed medical help. I couldn't fucking see, couldn't breathe, and thought I might die from too much funny. I had to prep Maria to apply CPR any moment as I collapsed from lack of oxygen. Nate soon got into the swing of it, and once he got a couple of bourbons down him, and started chatting with Maria, I should point out, he chilled the fuck out, and soon he was smiling as warm and genuine as I've ever seen. The guy has been carrying so much, always looking out for us, always focused and on point, so I think it did him a power of good to let go for just one night. Engaging in conversation with a beautiful, age-appropriate woman would no doubt have helped as well. Nate's just over 50, Maria is 44 and looks good with it as well, so a couple of drinks and a chat with a beautiful, intelligent woman of his own generation went down a treat, I think. They seemed to get on really well. There were games. I officially suckered musical statues, because once I've got a couple of drinks in me, I basically turn into a ten-year-old anyway and spend more of my time trying to distract other people so they'll lose rather than sorting my own game to win. I'm the most competitive person in the room when sober, but after a few drinks, I'm more concerned with pissing about and having a giggle. Nate was a certain shoe-in for musical statues, as he's basically made of granite anyway. And what do you know? Old Stony McGrumpy Chops wins the musical statues game by a landslide. He tried to say it's because of his sniper training and having to remain motionless for hours, but that's just smoke and mirrors. Really, it's because he's a big, grumpy golem. On one of our house clearances, we found a ready cake mix, chocolate fudge, no less. Nom, nom, nom. No eggs or flour needed, just add hot water and oil, mix, put in the oven, and boom, chocolate fudge flavored cake. We stuck some candles in, and we gave Charlie our own rendition of happy birthday, and he got to blow out ten candles. Kids love that shit, but as an adult or even a teenager, that must be the most awkward moment in existence. Seriously, 
What are you supposed to do for those 15 seconds? Where do you look? You sit there, a slightly nervous and borderline hysterical grin on your face, not knowing what the hell you're supposed to be doing for that time and just praying for it to end. It's only made more uncomfortable by the fact that half of your impromptu choir are belting the words out with over-enthusiastic gusto, while the other half are self-consciously mumbling the lines just so they don't look like miserable sods. You'll catch one of those eyes in your axis of awkward, both gazes haunted and pleading with each other, praying for this torment to end. Honestly, if the devil and hell do exist, old Lucifer could put that one in his eternal torment playbook for sure. Torment option 666. Have happy birthday sung to the tortured soul in a perpetual loop until the stars burn out and die. I think I'd request a vinegar-coated whip to my butthole for eternity instead. Ultimate cringe moment. For a ten-year-old, however, he just beamed through it, then had a fuck yeah smile on his lips as we all cheered his monumental success at blowing out ten tiny candles. All in all, the party was a huge success. Everybody had an awesome time, and it got to about 9pm when Charlie was super tired from all the excitement and ready to hit the sack. Before he retired, my little dude came over to me while I was on the floor chatting to Isaac. Dad said you organised everything for today, Lucky. Is that right? Hey, we're all here, little man. Everybody did this for you. Savvy? She's just being modest, Charlie, said Mark. It was all her idea, so she deserves the credit. Charlie didn't say anything, just flung his arms round me, the donkey head atop sliding forward a little to bonk me on the forehead. This day was the best, came his muffled voice. Thank you so much. That was the best bit of the whole damn day. It was a close-run thing with Particles towering disgust at being dressed as a hot dog and Nate's reveal as the grumpiest Super Mario in history. But it edged them both out. Operation Birthday was a resounding success, and for this one day, Charlie got to be a normal kid. As Charlie pulled away and went off to bed, I watched him go, my face hurting from the half-drunken grin of pure happiness. Nate caught my eye as Charlie disappeared, and he gave me that little grin of his, tipped his glass of bourbon my way, and went back to his conversation with Maria. The adults continued to drink for another hour or two, but eventually started drifting away. We don't do all-nighters here, Freya, too much shit to do. One by one, everyone started saying their good nights and drifted away. It was about midnight, and I have a terrible fear of missing out at parties, so I wasn't hitting the sack until I was the last woman standing. Nate said his good night last and disappeared, leaving just me and Isaac. We shut the shit for another half hour and laughed about stupid stuff because basically anything can make me laugh when I'm drunk. I go hyper loopy, so I'm fun, or annoying, to be around when I'm drunk because I'm a happy drunk. Everyone's my bestest best mate in the whole wide world and I become a hugger. During one hug, we pulled away and I was about to say something, but Isaac leaned in and planted a kiss on my lips. The initial shock drew me back, and we said nothing for a second, just looking at each other. And like the dumb drunk bitch I was, I ended up having sex with him. Mostly clothed, urgent, and frantic, outside on the cold porch where we'd been sitting. Jack Sparrow and Han Solo going at it hell for leather like some weird porno crossover parody, all animalistic and frantic at the end of October in the cold unprotected sex, no less, making my dumb choice even dumber. Getting pregnant in a fucking apocalypse. Oh, hell no. I feel like such a fucking dick, Freya. I don't feel that way about him. There's nothing long term there, but I was drunk, I was in high spirits. I hadn't had sex for so long, I felt my insides were shriveling and dying a lonely death. And the world is fucking shit out beyond the gate. I guess, I don't know. I guess I just wanted to feel something. 
Everyone likes to be desired, right? Everyone likes to feel wanted. Ultimately, we're all alone, but we spend our lives trying not to be. I don't know. I get horny when I'm drunk. Isaac isn't unattractive. I was in a good mood. And I just wanted to get laid. When I've had alcohol, I don't think ahead. It's a massive failing of mine amongst many others. That whole impulse control thing I've mentioned before, huh? I was done then and said my goodnight and went to bed. My horny lust had been sated by a three-minute quickie on the porch, and I just wanted to sleep. Today, things were... awkward. Well, 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 if it isn't my old nemesis, the consequences of my actions. It's bloody hard to avoid someone when they live in the same building as you that is mostly communal space. Isaac gave me a beaming, conspiratorial smile in the morning, and I gave him a vanilla one, like I gave to everyone else. I've purposefully managed to stay around other people all day, as everyone was recovering from hangovers, so going beyond the gate was just a big fat no. It's been all about the chill today. We watched movies together, chatted, I played one of Charlie's board games with him, and generally we just hung out. It would have been nice if not for the fact that Isaac was trying to orchestrate an opportunity for it to be just the two of us. Instead, the chill day was fucking exhausting as I dodged him constantly, not giving him the opportunity to address our brief sexual liaison. I know I'm going to have to address it, but today I was hungover to shit, and I just wanted to chill with everyone and work on garnering particles' forgiveness for garbing him as a hot dog. Every time I looked up, though, Isaac's gaze was fixed on me. Men, they're so fucking fragile. If a dude bangs a woman just for sex, he's a player, no matter how hurt the woman might be. Gender flip that, and I know I'm going to get the whole... Do you just put out then? It doesn't mean anything, question from him. Simple answer. Yes, I fucking do. It's my body. We were consenting, albeit horny and judgment impaired, adults, and there was no pre-written agreement that it was anything more than just a brief encounter. I still feel guilty, because I'm going to have to let him down, and it can go one of two ways. He'll take it on the chin like a man. I'll apologize if he thought there was anything more to it than a brief liaison in the moment. He'll be a bit hurt and get past it. Option two, which is the most common in my experience, is that he'll turn sulky, maybe even unpleasant, and it will eventually explode into a full-blown argument with hurled accusations that will be impossible to have without everyone else in the lodge witnessing it. There just isn't the space. I have a feeling it's going to be the latter, Freya. The jutting jaw and staunch refusal to look at me as I said goodnight to everyone tells me he's going to stew on it all night, constructing all the accusations he wants to throw at me. I couldn't face it today. To quote with nail and eye, I feel like a pig shat in my head. Maria already knows of my stupidity, I had to confide in her, and she got me a morning after pill from the collection of things we've taken from pharmacies. Obviously, I got my ass chewed out by her in a whispered conversation for my dumb fuckery, but I deserved it, and she means well. It was stupid, doing it without protection. Tomorrow is likely to be as much fun as gargling with the contents of a hobo's piss pot, and just as uncomfortable. For tonight, however, I'm just going to sleep. All that bullshit is future Lockie's problem. Present Lockie is too damn tired. Good night, Freya. Still miss you. Tonight more than ever. October 30th, 2010. Drama. Freya, I am not a fan of drama. Admittedly, this drama was of my own making, but I don't have the time, will, or care to gently massage the male ego that's taken a bit of a slap. There's far more important shit to do than coddle Isaac's fragile masculinity. 
I would probably be more sympathetic and less harsh had he not been such a fucking dick about the whole thing. I felt better yesterday morning after sleeping off the hangover and rehydrating. However, when I awoke, it was absolutely pissing down with rain. Not a little, but a lot. Too heavy for us to go out on a run beyond the gate. The last thing any of us needs is to get soaked to the bone and pick up a chill. Which is a point Nate and I had a conversation about, now I think on. Remember that service road that runs behind the shopping centre? Well, much further up, there's an army surplus store, which will have good gear in. Waterproofs, BDU clothing, tactical glasses, shooting gloves, backpacks, camouflage gear, water bottles with filtration, Arctic quality sleeping bags, cartridge belts, weapon cleaning kits and all kinds of other good stuff. The popularity of war games like paintball and airsoft has people playing at soldier and wanting to look the part. There's a big market for it, as people spend shitloads of money trying to look like something out of a spec ops movie, even though they're shooting harmless little balls at each other, and their name is Barry from accounting. What it does mean, though, is that these stores now carry a massive range of useful gear. Nate agreed it was worth the risk going back downtown, but we should roll with both the pickup and van. We could load the white van up to the gills with useful stuff and just sort it all when we got back here. It might even be useful trade stuff, if we ever actually meet someone who doesn't want to kill us. We're not doing that until the rain lets up, though. We need that gear, as we can't spend every shitty day indoors. This is Northern England, and shitty weather is kind of our jam. It'll be fine, just make sure you wear your big coat, is something of a northern mantra. We can't stop clearing houses and gathering resources just because it's a shit day, but we need proper outdoors gear to make sure we don't get soaked to the bone and sick. We're going to wait for the rain to let up and put that at the top of our shit we need to do list. Incidentally, our little inventory room has had to be extended to a second one upstairs. We've gathered so much stuff that we've had to take over a second bedroom in the lodge. That reduces space for any survivors we might find. But as we haven't found anyone else who wants to be friends as yet, it's not such an issue. One thing on my mind is this. If we do start finding survivors and our community grows, what the hell are we going to do with them if we start finding a few? This lodge is amazing, but it has limited size, and the more people we bring back here, the more of a drain on our food it'll be. We eat well at the moment, really well considering the shit state of the world, and Nora is keeping a decent garden on the go to supplement our diet, but we still have to be careful with it as it is. Sooner or later, we're going to need more space, and ultimately, we need farming on the go. We can pull in all kinds of food from houses, shops, warehouses, and the like. But long term, if we want human society to continue, we need agriculture. I have no idea why I'm thinking that far ahead. Pre-apocalypse, planning what to do next week was the way too distant future for me, the future didn't tend to go past tomorrow for little old Erin Locke. And here I am, musing about the fate of human society and the need for renewable agriculture. It's like I don't even know who I am anymore. Okay, back to the drama. Sigh. Stuck indoors as we all were, the showdown was inevitable. I could tell the moment I walked into the communal space there was tension in the air. I was greeted by my fellow lodgers, and as I got my various good mornings, eyes immediately flicked from me towards a grim-faced Isaac who was purposefully refusing to acknowledge my appearance. I guess the cat was well and truly out of the bag. The negative vibes were strong in the room, like a preachy vegan had just turned up to a barbecue and was dragging everyone's mojo down. There was no avoiding it any further. So, I beckoned Isaac to me, said we probably needed to talk, and took him through to the bungalow, as Nate was already in the lodge communal space, chatting to Maria and Nora. Sit down, 
I said, gesturing to the small dining table. I'd rather stand, he replied tersely. The tone of our forthcoming discussion was clearly established by the petulant defiance, but I kept my cool. Whatever, I sighed, seating myself. Look, Isaac, I don't know what you were expecting to happen afterwards, but I'm going to be blunt. We were drunk, in high spirits, it was a fun distraction, but ultimately, it was just a one-time thing. So, that's it? You just use me and throw me aside? Um, I didn't use you. It takes two to tango, and if you'd care to remember, it was you who kissed me. And you responded? I nodded. I did. I was drunk. I was happy. It had been a good day, and I'm a happy drunk and can be impulsive. Alcohol lowers inhibitions and decision-making. It was just an in-the-moment thing, Isaac. There's no casting you aside here, as we were never together. It was two drunk, judgment-impaired, consenting adults. My judgment was not impaired. I'd been thinking about it for a while. I really like you. My heart sank. This was going to be harder than I imagined. This wasn't just an ego hit after being spurned post-sex. Isaac had been sitting on hopes of us being a couple for a while, it seemed, and that was just never in my thinking. I liked Isaac as a friend. We had a good laugh and he had a decent sense of humour, but I'd never looked at him in a romantic fashion when I was sober. Our brief genital collision had occurred because I was in a good mood, he wasn't unattractive, he made the first move, and I just wanted to get laid. I didn't have consequences in my head, just an itch I wanted scratching, a physical thirst that needed quenching. I relayed all of this to him as gently as I could, but I think the line of, I've never thought of you in a romantic way while I was sober, was the killer. I probably should have worded that better, or maybe just omitted those last four words entirely, because his sulky, hurt expression hardened the moment those words left my mouth. So, do you always just put out when you've had a drink? And there it was, just as my prophecy had foretold. I was willing to stay calm for the most part and try to do this gently, but that comment poked the bear. Fuck you, I snapped, which made him blanch. I don't think he expected such a blunt and aggressive response, which shows he doesn't really know me at all. I may get flowery and creative with my insults most of the time, but sometimes the classics are all you really need to get your true feelings across. He recovered his anger and responded with a snide. Yeah, well, you already did that and you're making me fucking regret it, you whiny little bitch, I hissed, making him blanch again. It could have been something we both enjoyed and moved on from like a pair of adults, but you're acting like an obsessed teenager. That one visibly stung him, I could see it on his face, but he'd poked the bear, and now the beast was awake. And pissed. Do you think giving me shit about it is going to change my mind? I demanded, that acting like a spoiled brat that's just had his Xbox confiscated is going to sway my opinion and make me see you in the way you want. I snorted in derision and shook my head. All you're fucking doing is making sure it never happens again, in any fashion. We've got to live in each other's pockets for the foreseeable future, so I suggest you put on your big boy pants and suck it up, Isaac. It was one time, we were drunk, and that's it. I banged my fist lightly on the table as I said, that's it, just to punctuate the point. The dickhead was too far gone, though. I'd let him stew on it all night, and all the things he'd conjured in his mind to say, no matter how fucking stupid, were coming out no matter what. So, as usual, it's all about you, then, he huffed, not helping his whiny little bitch image in the slightest. As long as you're okay, fuck anybody else's feelings. For fuck's sake, Isaac, I stormed in response, my accent thickening as it always does when my temper goes. 
Your perception of how things should be and your personal feelings on the situation are entirely your fucking responsibility. I've told you my side, been honest about it, and all you keep doing is respond with childish fucking snapbacks. I'm fucking trying here, Isaac, but you're making this impossible. This is an open and shut case, and I'm sorry if you're hurt, but you need to get right with it, because this... I pointed a finger quickly between the two of us. This is done. It was a one-time thing at a drunken party, and there was no invested emotion on my part. So, whatever you need to do in your own mind to get right with that, please do so. But stop fucking trying to take little malicious bites out of me, okay? So why couldn't you tell me this yesterday? He said, his whole body in outraged mode, as he folded his arms across his chest and stared back at me defiantly. Why leave me sitting there for a whole day, avoiding me? Were you ever going to talk or just hope I'd forget about it? Seems like everything always has to be on your terms. Some people don't know when they're beaten and just keep walking back into the punches. I pinched the bridge of my nose and closed my eyes as I fought for calm, a habit I seem to have picked up from Nate. He does that when fighting for calm, usually when I'm saying words. Isaac, I said slowly through clenched teeth. We all had fucking hangovers. The last thing I wanted was a confrontation like this when I had a banging head and a mouth that felt like a zombie had taken a necrotic shit in it. This conversation would likely have gone much worse had we both done it when bone tired and hung over. It would have saved me being ignored all day. Instead, you just avoided me. For fuck's sake, I screamed then, shocking him into silence as my anger boiled over. Just shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. I've had enough of this shit. I love a good debate as much as the next person, but this isn't one, Isaac. This isn't a debate. Stop fucking attacking me when I've been honest. I jabbed an aggressive finger at him and swear I was a heartbeat away from punching him in the face. Acting like a dick doesn't make yours any bigger, so stop trying to make yourself feel better by tearing me down. I can't do a tombstone voice anywhere near as chilling as Nate's, but I was at the end of my rope now, and I swear, if Isaac had tried just one more whiny snide comment at me, I was going to fucking deck him, right there in the bungalow. We're done, I hissed like an icy wind. So fuck off and leave me alone before I fucking hurt you. I think he realized it was no idle threat. He blinked a couple of times in shock, saw my bunching fists, jaw muscles locked and flaring nostrils, before deciding retreat was now the only sensible option. Of course, he had to have the last say in our little head-to-head -head by slamming the door in a huff on his way out. Pfft. Men. Actually, that's not fair. A real man might have been hurt, but he wouldn't have whined and complained like a spurned teenager and thrown barbed comments just to try and win the argument. I was honest to a fault, and I can't do any more than that. I'm not responsible for how someone chooses to feel about me, and certainly not to blame when I don't meet their expectation. Different versions of us exist in the minds and opinions of everyone that's ever met us. We can't control what filter they choose to view us with, so Isaac needs to go away and take a look at himself, instead of wailing on me because the feelings he chose to have weren't returned. Harsh? Maybe, but still fucking true. I'd probably have more sympathy if he hadn't been such an arse about it, so instead he gets the middle finger treatment. At least this is out in the open now and we can move on. Well, try and move on in Isaac's case. He needs to get his shit together and quick, because if he starts being an asshole while we're beyond the gate, Nate will bench him in an instant. Maybe that needs to happen so he can get his shit together. Personally, I learned a valuable lesson from this whole experience. I learned that everything happens for a reason. And usually, that reason is you're bloody stupid and make bad choices. Okay, that's enough for now. Next time I write, it'll probably be after the surplus store, 
if this rain ever lets up. November 1st, 2010. Alpha and Omega. It rained for another couple of days, and I tried to spend as much time as I could in my room. Isaac and I have largely been avoiding each other. He's been in broody sulk mode and snappy with everyone. He's largely ignored me, which I was okay with, but that means his sarcastic little nips have been targeted at everyone else. Today he went too far and cut Nate's exceptionally long fuse too short. There had been a couple of times where Nate had cut Isaac short with a hard glare of warning or a quipped, hey, when Nate felt he was going too far with someone. After a couple of days of it, though, I could tell Nate was starting to get pissed by Isaac's petulance. Childish peak is not something a man like Nate Carter will abide from a so-called adult. I have a childish sense of humor, but I never throw childish tantrums. Isaac finally crossed the line today, and oh mama, did he get put in his place. He had a bit of a headache, and the rule we've set down in the lodge is that if anyone needs any form of medication, we go through Maria. She's the trained medical professional as a highly experienced senior nurse practitioner, so even if you want an ibuprofen, you go via Maria. Isaac said he had a bit of a migraine and asked if he could have something for it. Maria chuckled. If you've ever had an actual migraine, you'd know there's no such thing as a bit of one. I'll get you some paracetamol and we'll see how you fare. That won't touch it, he complained with a huff. I need something stronger. Isaac, I'm not giving you prescription painkillers for a headache. Maria's tone brooked no further argument. As far as she was concerned, the debate was over. How do you know how fucking bad it is, eh? He snapped. Language, warned Nate from his seat at the table, coffee cup in hand. He has a thing about bad language round Maria, Nora, and especially Charlie. He's proper old school like that. An accidental shit can slide by without incident, but the F-bomb is the big no-no around them. Even I watch my foul mouth when those three are around, as I know Nate doesn't like it. He swears like a trooper when we're out and about, but neither of us would ever drop the F-bomb when little Charlie was in earshot, because he's a kid, and I don't swear like a fishwife in front of Maria and Nora anyway. It'd be like swearing in front of my mum and grandma. You just don't do it. Isaac, however, had decided today was going to be a special day, a day when he did what no sane person would even dream of doing. Fuck off, old man, he quipped. It's a free country. Well, shit. Nate didn't explode into motion, or even get animated. He deftly placed his cup back on the table, stood, turned his dark eyes to Isaac, and ominously moved towards him, slow and deliberate. I'm sure I heard Isaac's spine turn to water as Nate closed on him. The old marine stopped about two inches from Isaac and looked down on him. Isaac is about five nine in height, but Nate is a good six too. He's a big guy, but it's not just his height. He's thick and broad, a solid, aged powerhouse, but his presence is bigger than any physical size. He filled Isaac's vision so all our tech guy could see was Nate and nothing but Nate, before that tombstone voice filled the lodge as cold as an arctic gale. Even though he spoke softly, the whole place had gone still and quiet, like everyone knew what was going to happen the moment Isaac opened his stupid mouth. Say that to me again, boy, he breathed, because men have died for less. I wasn't even the target, but I near shit myself. Hardly any oxygen was consumed in the lodge for a few dangerous seconds. Everyone held their collective breath, and the whole place was charged with tension as we all waited for Isaac's response. I felt kind of sorry for him. Sure, he was a dick, and he shouldn't have spoken to Nate or Maria in that manner. But holy crap, 
the look of abject terror on his face was a sight to behold. I honestly don't think I've ever seen anyone that scared in my life. Even people fleeing the undead monstrosities could run or scream or wave their arms or flail about like a lunatic. Isaac was frozen near catatonic by Nate's statement and presence, and he'd hardly done fuck all. Alpha and Amiga, side by side. Now, I really did feel sorry for Isaac, as a dark stain bloomed on the front of his trousers. Many would laugh at the thought of a grown man wetting himself in fear, but it's nothing to laugh at. Not at all. Can you even imagine being so frozen with fear that you lose control of your bladder? How fucking terrified do you have to be for that to happen? Nate, said Maria tenderly, placing a gentle hand on his arm. That's enough. There was an inaudible whoosh as everybody breathed in again, Maria's soft words breaking the spell. Nate nodded and returned to the table, sipping at his coffee like nothing had happened. Go and get yourself cleaned up, said Maria, with a heartbreaking amount of compassion. Shit. Once the threat was gone, you could see Isaac's expression just crumble as he became aware of his lapse. Humiliated, he mumbled something like an apology to Maria and fled the room. Everybody else turned away and went back to their business as Maria sat at the table to have a quiet word with Nate. A lion doesn't care about a puppy yapping at its tail. But woe to that fucking puppy if it forces the lion to turn. Hope. Dean took two steps back from Sarah, refitting the plugs into his ears. His eyes remained fixed on the young woman as she steadied her grip on the pistol. Remember, squeeze the trigger, don't pull it, he instructed. Sarah acknowledged the instruction with a nod, her features fixed in concentration. Auburn hair tied back from her face in a single tight braid, and both hands on the glock, she aimed at the archery target 30 yards away. It was a tricky shot for an amateur, but Sarah had applied herself like she did to every lesson, proving herself a competent handler of the weapon. From short range, she could hit the painted silhouette of a human torso and head every time, smacking the bullets into center mass and the head without fail. The undead, however, were unaffected by center mass, so accuracy was key. With her ears plugged against the noise, Sarah's fingertip squeezed the trigger. The handgun barked, and Dean grinned with pride as a puff exploded from the target's painted head. What a world we live in now, he thought with regret, where I'm smiling at an 18-year-old's successful headshot. Nice. He winked, one hand reaching to grip the girl's shoulder for a light squeeze of congratulation. For four months, Dean had been the de facto leader of the survivors at Crenshaw School. Both he and Sarah had birthdays in September, and it was now almost the end of October. Dean had turned 46 on the 8th, and Sarah 18 on the 19th. She was the eldest of the surviving students, and easily the smartest. Academically adept, Sarah's emotional intelligence was also more advanced than her peers, and probably beyond her years. Losing her mother when she was just 13, having such a strained relationship with her father, and living at the school during term time had combined to make Sarah Walsh supremely self-reliant. Though she had cried when Dean told her of his last conversation with her father, she then adapted, locking her grief away. Neither of them fooled themselves into thinking he made it out of Jester. Sarah was a tough girl. Tough woman, Dean corrected himself. She was 18 now, barely an adult, but an adult nonetheless. Despite the awful state of the world, Dean couldn't abide the thought of putting firearms into the hands of children, but once Sarah turned 18 and shown she had the right mentality for it, he agreed. 
It was simple fact that supply runs outside the school walls were getting more difficult, and doing anything alone was fraught with peril. As much as he hated the thought of endangering Sarah after promising her father to take care of her, this was the best way to protect her. She had to be able to survive in this new world with an ability to protect herself and others. It had not been easy these past four months, despite the school's numerous conveniences that made their continued survival possible. Artesian wells, a huge solar power array across the roofs of virtually every building, backup diesel generators wired in, a huge tank of diesel at the rear, which had been three quarters full, an on-site maintenance area with a massive wood shop and selection of tools, and so much more. The huge fees paid every term by wealthy parents had been smartly invested by the school's governance, and the early transition to solar power was genius, involving an initially steep capital outlay, but one that would ultimately pay for itself over the subsequent years. The term fees kept going up every year, but the energy bills were coming down, making the school more profitable year on year. Graham Smith, the only remaining teacher that had stayed on site with the last of the children, was well-versed in the solar power aspect of the school. Being the head of science, and both a physics and chemistry graduate, his natural scientific leanings meant he was interested by all aspects of it, and being the school's key liaison with the contractors overseeing the installation project. Crenshaw could afford to pick elite staff and pay top wages, keeping the wealthy parents subscribing to their school's mantra of producing the future elite, and Graham Smith was certainly picked from the top drawer of candidates. Sarah was now only the third adult on site, along with Dean and Graham. When the police officer had arrived at the school four months ago, only Graham and 12 students remained. One of those children, Thomas, was already dying from a bite and Dean had endured the grim task of putting him to rest for a second time, when the toxic wound eventually killed him. Five more had been lost since then. In the first couple of weeks, one girl had died in the night. Angela had been a timid, shy child that suffered with asthma. Struggling to breathe in the early hours and finding her inhaler empty, she tried to get up and alert someone for a refill, but fell against a bedside table and broke her neck. Three more girls died in that small dormitory as the child reanimated and unleashed a silent, murderous rampage on her sleeping schoolmates. One girl of 15 years named Jennifer James, or JJ as she preferred to be called, had retained enough presence of mind to escape the dorm and raise the alarm. JJ had the good fortune to be the one sleeping nearest to the door, and thus the furthest from ground zero, allowing her the opportunity to escape the unfolding horror. Four more walking child corpses that Dean was forced to put down and bury. The last one they lost was a boy named Sam, just a few weeks earlier. He was 13, and one day just vanished. They searched the grounds for him, but never found a body or sign of the boy. All they could assume was that he'd decided to strike out on his own. What had possessed him to do so, Dean could only imagine. Maybe he just had to get home and thought he would be stopped if he revealed his intentions to the two adults. It was impossible to say. Now, there were just eight remaining on site. Dean and Graham were the eldest. Sarah was now technically their third adult, and the other five residents of their small community were all kids between the ages of 14 and 17. The surviving children had adapted as well as Dean could have hoped for, given the unnatural situation they had been thrust into. JJ was the only girl after the dormitory massacre. The other four minors were all boys, though the eldest, Zane Upreti was in the same year as Sarah and would turn 18 at the start of December. He was desperate for the chance to shoot, but Dean refused his pleading. In his opinion, anyone that eager to fire a live weapon needed to learn temperance and patience. The other three boys were all true miners. 
Daniel Mason and Joseph Evans were both 14, and Alex Chang was 15. Alex, he discovered, was a hell of a shot with a small compound bow. The boy had been doing archery since he was 10, a sport catered for and encouraged by Crenshaw School, and the boy of Chinese heritage was a prodigy, having been the county champion for his given age group for the past two years. It was a skill that would no doubt come in handy, and Dean encouraged the boy to practice as much as he could. Having watched him shoot, the police officer was doubly impressed with his genuine ability. Alex was fast, smooth, and unerringly accurate with his bow. It would be a while before he was willing to let the boy accompany him on a supply run, but his skill with the bow would undoubtedly be an asset. From shorter ranges, he never missed the stationary head targets. A moving, murderous, undead skull might be a different proposition, but the foundations were definitely in place. Uncle Dean? Sarah's voice pulled him from his thoughts. Sorry, sweetheart, I was miles away. What did you say? I asked if you thought I was ready. He sighed. Sadly, yes, I do. Sadly? Dean put an arm round her slim shoulders and planted an affectionate kiss on the crown of her head. Yes, sadly. You're 18 and should be thinking about university next year and planning a bright future to make golden memories. Instead, here you are with a handgun at your hip, ready to venture out into a vicious world where you might have to shoot at living people and who might shoot back. Over the past few months, Dean had heard the reports of gunfire here and there when out on supply runs. Mostly, they were single shots of small arms or a shotgun, likely putting down approaching undead, and thankfully never in earshot of the campus. On one occasion, back in late August, though, he'd heard a ferocious explosion of gunfire while out on a supply run, the obvious sounds of multiple rifles and shotguns shattering the air somewhere in the distance. That kind of firepower and aggression unnerved him, considering he'd never had to fire a bullet in anger in all the operations he had served as an SFO. Firearms were such a rarity, especially in his rural county, so hearing that level of firepower being traded was genuinely unsettling. There were at least two heavily armed groups in the two small nearby towns, and worse, it sounded like they were at war. After hearing that thunderous battle, Dean had withdrawn and confined his supply runs to small villages dotted through the area or isolated rural clusters of housing. Food was a problem. Fresh, clean water was not, which was a boon, and there was enough diesel in the tank on site for the generators they were using. Now they were all clustered into a single building. This winter at least, with the diesel in the tank and the solar power providing them with plenty of stored energy, they would be able to stay warm through bitterly cold nights. Food, however, was their most pressing need. They were not gathering enough dried or canned foods from the smaller villages to keep them going, nor were they going to get essential vitamins and minerals to supplement what they consumed from their limited diet. Maria had forever been laying out various vitamins for him on his way to work, making sure he stayed healthy, and every time it made him laugh. He sighed audibly, and Sarah caught the look on his face. You're thinking of Aunt Maria again? There was no question, just a statement. I am, he admitted with a wan smile. Sarah said nothing more, just folding her arms around his waist and putting her head on his chest. I miss Mum, and I miss Dad, she admitted. Even though we weren't close, he was still my dad. I wish he were here. Me too, sweetheart. He was always a good friend to me and Maria, and he loved you. I know. They held on to each other for a moment more, lost in remembrance. The day after securing the school, Dean was adamant about returning home to retrieve his wife. The panic from the children gave him pause, though, 
as they thought their savior was about to abandon them just a day after clearing the undead on campus. Dean was a trained, specialist firearms officer, and actually equipped with those weapons, having taken the small remaining stash from the constabulary HQ armory. It was not much, but it was a far more potent defense than most had, and the thought of their newfound protector disappearing and leaving them to their fate caused panic among the children and their remaining teacher. What if we have an incursion of the undead again? asked Graham, pushing his spectacles up his nose while blinking rapidly. Usually his glasses were in no need of correcting, and it was more of a nervous habit. This school is out in the country, five miles from the nearest town, with the closest rural houses at least a mile away, said Dean. There's unlikely to be a horde coming this way, as the nearby towns are still in the process of collapsing. Crenshaw's grounds are surrounded by four feet thick and eight feet high hedgerows that a thinking human couldn't get through, or over without some serious effort and problem solving. Behind those is a ten-foot fence of metal bars encompassing the whole campus. Graham, this is probably one of the most secure locations remaining. There's nothing to worry about. What about looters or the like? Dean swallowed down his frustration at the comment and kept his voice low, but it hardened to emphasize his point. Graham, you and I are the only adults on campus right now, and I need you to pull it together. The last thing I need is you putting the frights on these kids by making up a whole bunch of what-ifs, okay? Chastised, the middle-aged teacher had nodded. Of course, of course, my apologies. Breathing calm in again, Dean softened his tone. I understand your anxiety, but you're all going to have to get used to staying here and me being off-site. I'm the only one with any training and experience, which means I'm going to have to do supply runs in the future. What I need you all to do while I'm gone this first time is to make an inventory of everything we have in terms of food and medicine, okay? There's a lot of mouths to feed here, and we're going to have to get used to eating some pretty bland meals. But first thing we need to know is exactly what we do have. Are you going to get Aunt Maria? asked Sarah. How can he be your uncle? piped up one boy, who Dean now knew to be Joseph. He's black and you're ginger. A few of the other kids laughed nervously, and Dean was about to shoot the boy down, but Sarah beat him to the punch. See what happens when you let cousins marry. She shrugged nonchalantly, throwing a casual thumb Joseph's way and rolling her eyes. The laughter was more genuine this time as Joseph was silenced by Sarah's wit. My wife and I are Sarah's godparents, said Dean. Her father and I were very close friends, and we've been in her life since she was born. Sarah's smile wobbled for a moment as Dean said, were, and he cursed himself inwardly. There was nothing he could do about it now. This was life. Will Aunt Maria still be at home? I rang her early yesterday morning when things were starting to get difficult and told her it was best to stay put, but you know what she's like. If she sees someone in need, she won't hesitate. It's just her way. Once the mobile networks and landlines went down, I couldn't get hold of her anyway, and I came here for you at John's request. Maria's smart and resourceful. She can hang fire for a day or two, though I'd feel better with her here. He looked around at the canteen they all sat in. This place seems like the best option to ride out the storm, so I need to go and get her and bring her back here. He turned and looked pointedly at Graham. And not just because she's my wife. She's also the senior nurse practitioner at Vale Infirmary, and pretty much runs the place when there is no supervising consultant on site. The notion of having a trained medical professional on campus definitely appealed to everyone. Could you do a final sweep of the grounds before you go? 
Again, Dean kept his voice calm, reminding himself that these people were mostly children and scared, which they had every right to be. He was only human, though, and the longer he left going after Maria, the more frustrated he became. I swept the whole grounds yesterday, Graham. Every last inch, every single building, one by one, room by room. The campus is clear of any walking dead, and all the living are in this room. Where my house is, I don't think I'm going to be able to get all the way in my vehicle, because likely some of the main roads will be snarled up. So, I have to account for doing the last mile or so on foot. As you can imagine, it's not like I can just sprint. I have to move slow and careful and vigilant. So, I need to go now, leaving me enough time for contingencies and so I can get back long before dark. The words were delivered with a tone of silk, but wrapped around an iron resolve. Dean was absolute in the desire to extract his wife from their home, and there was no way any argument would move him. As anticipated, there was no possibility of driving the SUV to his front door. The primary junction he needed to take was impassable, with accident after accident piling together to make a mangled heap of ruined flesh and twisted metal. He could take another route to loop round the far side on a different road, but there was no guarantee the issues on that route were any less than the one facing him. It was best to approach on foot. Dean had emptied his vehicle of all weapons, locking them in a room in the admissions building and handing the key to Graham for safekeeping during his absence. Everyone had been given strict warnings to stay away from the room. Firearms and explosives were no joke. All Dean had brought with him was the G36C in hand and the Glock sheathed at his hip, with two spare magazines for both rifle and handgun. A light Kevlar vest was strapped to his chest, rather than the heavier plate carrier he would wear for an SFO operation. He needed mobility, and he was not used to going distances in the heavier IOTV. Providing no gun-wielding living came near him, which should be unlikely, it was superfluous anyway. He attached a suppressor to the G36C's barrel and had it primed to semi. Against any undead that ranged too close, he wanted noise at a minimum, and single shots should be all he needed. Inhaling a few deep breaths for courage, he made a quick sign of the cross on his body, whispered a silent prayer, and then locked the SUV. It was time to get his wife. Signs of survivors were still around on the second day of the fall. Hurried individuals or small clusters of people darted in the distance, staring clear of each other out of fear, and the journey was a harrowing ordeal of undead to wade through. All the traffic accidents and fights among the panicked living resulting in lethal injury, either by accident or design, had left clusters of undead roaming the streets. By the time he had gone half a mile, he was already switching out an empty magazine on the rifle and reloading. He could not afford to gun down every monster he laid eyes on, instead concentrating his efforts solely on the heavier clusters directly in his path, or ones that might impede his return journey if he did not deal with them now. Hopefully, that return journey would be smoother, as the suppressed snap of the discharging rifle was far less intrusive than its usual echoing crack, and there were still other noises to distract and draw the undead. The eerie silence that would blanket the town over the coming weeks had not yet descended. Panic and chaos were still very much in full flow. Any path cleared now would make the return leg with Maria less taxing, so it was better to expend the rifle while he possessed the advantage of suppressed fire. On the way back, he would happily make a din with the Glock if it meant he and his wife could get to the SUV quickly and in one piece. It was a relief when he finally turned onto his road and sprinted down the street, pausing only to crack a few shots at blooded undead in his way. Drawing out his keys as he reached the door, he swept inside and closed it behind him, moving the rifle to his hip and drawing the Glock. 
Praying he would not have to put down a reanimated version of his wife, he sucked in a breath and called out Maria's name. Silence. The earplugs were out so he could hear any little sound in the house, but there was nothing. No scrape of foot or bump of furniture, no relieved return of his call as Maria responded. There was only stillness. He moved through the house, clearing the building one room at a time, until finally he moved into the kitchen and opened the fridge. Taking out an unopened carton of orange juice, he twisted the cap and slaked his thirst, wondering where she had gone. There was no sign of struggle in the house, which meant she had left of her own volition, probably to render aid to someone. It was her way, and one of the many reasons he loved her. Dean's eye was drawn to the mantelpiece, where a photograph stood in pride of place. It was their wedding photo, taken 20 years earlier, both beaming with joy on their happiest of all days. Placing the carton of juice aside, he dismantled the frame and took the photo out, kissing it and folding it once before sliding it into a pocket on his vest, all while fighting the burn of tears in his eyes. Where had she gone? He waited in the stillness of their home for almost four hours, whispering prayers for her to walk through the door, but they went unanswered. Heartbroken, Dean knew she was not coming home. With no idea where to begin a search and no means of contacting her, he resigned himself to the futility of waiting any longer. Grabbing a large camping rucksack from the attic, he filled it with whatever food and medicine he could feasibly carry from the house, plus a few personal mementos, including the small leather-bound Bible his father had given to him on his 18th birthday. Strapping the rucksack tightly to his back and testing the weight, Dean moved the rifle back into position and left his home for the last time. He closed the door behind him, but did not bother to lock it. If it could offer shelter to some survivor in the future, then at least some good would come of their empty home. Maria, he called out to the empty street, hearing the crack in his voice. It was a futile hope, he knew. The slimmest of chances she might be with an elderly neighbor in need. That was her way and who she was. It was why he loved her. Only the echo of his voice answered in the quiet street. Maria, he called out once more, a little louder. Still no response, save for the sight of a solitary undead man shuffling into view out of a driveway, drawn to Dean's despairing cry. Whispering a final prayer for her safety, and his heart a shattered remnant of its former glory, Dean knew deep in his soul he would hear no reply. Without looking back, Dean fought his way back to his SUV and set out for his new home, fighting tears all the way. Since that day, Dean had poured all his energy into making the Crenshaw campus as safe as he could make it. They all moved into a single building which had a clear view of the entrance gate, and Dean selected a room for himself on the first floor. If required, it would give him an elevated firing position over the open killing ground from the front gate to the admissions building at the forefront of campus. Lower windows were reinforced with lumber from the wood shop, and all the food was stored in the small canteen of the dorm building. Each of the four large dormitories had their own mini canteen, multiple bathrooms, kitchen and dining area, and communal space for socializing. Dean took the room reserved for an adult dorm supervisor and stored all the weapons and ammunition in what was essentially a small, self-contained apartment. It had its own tiny bathroom with shower cubicle, toilet, and sink. In the main space, there was a desk and chair, two-seater couch beneath the window, and a single bed in the corner. This was home now. Graham took one of the larger single rooms, and Sarah did not have to move. Final year students had the luxury of their own dormitory room in whatever hall they resided in, and this was her dorm, so she had no need to move. The only addition to her room were her newest possessions, 
a light Kevlar vest, a dark Glock 17 with holster, two spare magazines, and two boxes of 9mm ammunition. Zane also had his own room as a last year student, but he was forced to move his possessions from another building. And JJ was upgraded to a single room, as she was the only other girl and needed privacy. The three remaining mid-teen boys all moved into a shared room that once would have housed six, but now there were just the three of them. The four halls were each named for the elements to give them more of an identity rather than just letters or numbers, and their small band of survivors had taken residence in fire. He was not sure why, but that name just seemed appropriate to Dean. Dean had done numerous supply runs, clearing houses of undead and useful resources. But after hearing the thundering war in the distance back in August, supplies were harder to come by. For safety purposes, he was only striking at isolated clusters of housing, but they weren't generating the supplies they needed to keep a balanced diet and their immune systems strong. They desperately needed to supplement their vitamin intake, and Sarah had pointed out that both she and JJ needed sanitary products, something a mid-forties man would never have considered. Their small band of survivors sat in the communal space on comfortable seating, each nursing a hot chocolate, the instant kind made by adding hot water to powdered mix. Dean mourned the lack of milk, as he would give his right foot for a good cup of tea right now, the October night outside was cold, and it had been raining hard for a couple of days, keeping them all housebound. Dean thanked God again for the welcome advantage of solar power and heating, and the hot beverage was comforting. He counted their small blessings. It was October 31st, and there would have usually been Halloween celebrations at the school for those living on site. The remaining children were older and did not think to celebrate it, and Dean felt no desire to push them. The world beyond their walls was infested with the walking dead, so it was time to focus on the living. I think we're going to have to take a chance and go to a pharmacy, announced Dean when everyone was seated. We need vitamin supplements, the ladies need specific products, and any medicines we get will be vital. The cold snap will be coming, and we're likely to pick up colds and sniffles along the way. Do you have one in mind? Asked Graham, smacking his lips after sipping from his cup. Dean nodded. There's one I know at the very top of town that's down a side road, just enough off the beaten track that it can't be seen from a main road. It's not massive, it's out of the way, and I'm hoping any looters won't have thought of that one, instead going for the easier access ones. In truth, it's also the closest, I don't want to go any deeper into town than I have to. It sounds risky. It is, agreed Dean. But we can't survive without some element of risk, which means I need hands to help while we provide security. He turned to Sarah. Time for your first test out in the field with a live weapon. You up to it? To her credit, Sarah remained perfectly calm. I've got your back she said with a single nod. Dean grinned. We'll need two more just for speed of moving any goods out of the pharmacy and loading up, so Zane and Alex, you're coming too as our elbow grease. The two boys shared a surprised look that was half excitement and half fear at venturing out into the land of the dead. Don't get carried away, warned Dean. You do what I say when I say and don't mess around. This is serious business, you hear me? Yes, sir, both boys intoned with eager nods. Shall I bring my bow? Asked Alex tentatively. Yes, but only as a last resort. This is a test as well, Alex, to see if you've got the temperament to let me consider you using that skill on the regular in the field. Skill is only one part of being on active duty, Attitude is just as, if not more, important. Understood? The boy nodded. Absolutely, loud and clear. Okay then, as soon as the rain lets up and we've got a dry day, we're going to move out. The rain finally receded, 
and after a full dry day and the sky clearing, Dean set the outing into motion. Alex and Zane were both strapped into light Kevlar vests, helping to underline the very real danger that existed outside the walls of the campus, and Sarah checked and double-checked her weapon. She was nervous, but that reassured Dean in a small way. Nerves meant she was taking the danger seriously and lessened the chance of any complacency. Dean took his usual loadout of the Glock and G36C, and the four of them climbed into his Range Rover. In the boot, they'd loaded up a few backpacks from the school to make carrying any medicines they could recover quick and easy. This was a get-in, load-up-and-get-out mission. Direct to the pharmacy, do what they needed to do, and return to the school. After that, Dean would start planning their next move in hunting for more food. Having Sarah to back him up would hopefully help speed up those operations, and he reminded himself to organize building clearance lessons with her. Having so many differing buildings on campus would give him varied options to test her developing skills. But for now, they were distant plans. Everybody ready, he asked as he closed the driver door. He turned to look at the two boys in the back seat. All good? Both boys gave a nod, clearly nervous. We're ready, said Sarah, gifting him with a smile of reassurance. She looked so much like her mother at times. Each day, the likeness to the late Andrea was growing. All right then, buckle up. Let's get this done. The drive was relatively simple on the quiet roads. As they approached a right turn that would take them towards town, his three young passengers gaped at an old accident that had occurred back in the early days, when a speeding BMW coupe had smashed into a small Mini Cooper as it pulled from the junction, scattering debris all over the road. The three of them gasped as they passed it, seeing an undead woman still strapped into the Mini, the white eyes and silent snap of her jaws a chilling accompaniment to the broken arms reaching for them. In the back seat of her car, the tall sides of a child's seat poked up above the rear window, though the twist of the metal prevented them from seeing if there was a child still strapped in. They were not ready for such sights yet, so Dean thanked the Lord for such a small mercy. Is that what it's like everywhere? asked Alex in a small voice as they made the turn. It is, confirmed Dean. Out here you'll find little hope, only tragedy and sights you can never unsee. The three youngsters remained silent at that. Dean did not like to seem so negative or dramatic, but managing their expectations was more important than protecting their innocence. While he did not feel the need to force such macabre sights as undead children still strapped into car seats on them, they needed to know that the things they might see would affect them. The dead had risen to murder the living, and society as they knew it had fallen. Life was forever changed. As they started passing a few clusters of housing on the outskirts of town, the three passengers stared out of the windows constantly, drinking in the stillness of the world around them. The road was devoid of traffic, no people were tending their gardens, no red-faced joggers with their earphones in, and no cyclists frustrating drivers by taking up the whole lane on the winding road. It's so still and silent said Sarah absently, her eyes drinking in the apparent tranquility. Like we're driving through a landscape painting. That's a neat way to describe it, replied Dean. It won't stay like that, mind you. We're approaching the top of town now, so sightseeing is over, sweetheart. Sarah turned to look at him, forcing an expression of tight focus to her youthful face. She nodded, saying nothing more, and idly rested a hand on the gun sheathed at her hip. As he neared the end of the long road, Dean could see there was already a mound of twisted metal across the approaching junction. He had not entered town this way before, but it was the easiest way to access the small pharmacy, which was about 200 yards from that junction. 
When he had visited town on some of his early excursions, he had used a couple of different routes that kept him far from the town centre, where traffic accidents would have caused difficult snarls in road access. He breathed a sigh of relief as he neared the junction. From a distance, he had imagined a mountain of mangled vehicles and undead interspersed among them. As he neared, however, it was clear that much of the traffic must have been able to get around the obstacles by mounting paths and grass verges usually reserved for pedestrians. As he neared, the vehicle jolted as he mounted the small pavement, using the same tactic as previous drivers. Driving over a wide, flat grass area and following the road to the right, he spied the small left turn where the pharmacy was situated. There were corpses littering the scene of the accident, which drew the eye of the three youngsters as Dean concentrated on driving. Uncle Dean? Yeah, he said absently as he stared carefully round an obstacle. I can see about twelve or thirteen dead in the road. Not undead, but dead. And? From what I can tell, they've all been shot in the head. That gave him pause. Say again. They all look like they've been shot in the head, and quite recently, as they don't seem particularly rotted or bloated, as though they've recently been put down. Worried thoughts of the warring armed groups entered his mind, but he kept his fears to himself in case the younger ones started to panic. Well then, we best just get in and out as we planned, eh? He tried to keep his tone casual. Anyway, we're here now. He gestured to a small glass-fronted store that looked like it was just another house in a small row of terraces. Only the large glass window and a green and white cross on the small sign jutting above it signified its difference to the handful of residences. Looks like someone already looted the place observed Zane as they pulled up to the curb beside it. The glass front of the door was smashed, and the door itself was half open. From her closer vantage on the left side, Sarah moved her head about, angling to look through the window. Most of the shelves are actually still untouched, she said. I was half expecting this in truth, said Dean. The main thought on people's minds will be the strong stuff, like the codeine, morphine substitutes, tramadol, or the opiates, that kind of stuff. Addicts and criminals will have taken the opportunity with the new lawless existence to take what they need for a fix. That's not what we're here for, though, even though they would have been a bonus. We want ointments, dressings, cold and flu treatment, antibiotics, cough linctus, female sanitary products, and every bottle, box, and packet of vitamin supplements you can find. How do we know what's of use? asked Zane. Dean reeled off common antibiotic names picked up from two decades of marriage to Maria. Having a nurse practitioner for a wife lent itself to simple absorption of information over time. If in doubt, take everything you can, said Sarah. Hold up, said Dean, as they all moved to get out of the car. Nobody's going anywhere until I've been in that building and made sure it's clear of living and dead. It's tiny, started Zane. Can't we? Complacency kills, Zane, cut in Sarah, ending any debate before it could begin. We wait here. Dean smiled approvingly at her. You'll be just fine, sweetheart, he thought with pride. The police officer swept through the small pharmacy in less than a minute, checking the back office and small storeroom as well. The tiny store was free of living or dead, and he stepped back outside, beckoning the three of them from the vehicle. Okay, good to go, he declared. The shelves behind the counter are mostly swept clean, but in the back storeroom there are unopened deliveries and extra storage boxes. The looters didn't think beyond the prescription stuff behind the counter, so let's move and get what we need. I want to be out of here as soon as we can. Sarah, help them for now while I stand watch. If things start to get edgy out here, I'll holler. The young woman nodded and immediately assumed a position of command over the two boys, even though Zane was only a few months her junior. Her confidence was infectious, though, and the two boys responded to her without question. 
They had been going only 15 minutes when the chugging of a diesel engine caught Dean's attention. His eyes drifted up the road they had taken, and he watched in creeping dread as a Humvee rolled into sight, crawling toward them. Thankfully, there was no light machine gun mounted on it, but there was the visible top half of a black-clad man looking his way, a bolt-action rifle in hand. For now, the barrel was pointed up. Stay in the store, hissed Dean, just as Sarah was approaching the door. Get everyone back, I'll try and deal with this. Sarah said nothing, following his instruction and ushering the two boys to the back of the store. The Humvee was a military transport, not the commercial Hummer model purchased by those with deep pockets looking for status. It looked like an older model, desert tan in color, but it was clearly up-armored. Such vehicles could be purchased commercially from surplus by those with pockets deep enough, but the sight of it left Dean feeling cold. The men in the vehicle could be ex-military, or they could just be maniacs with access to money and guns. Neither option was comforting if their intentions were hostile, but if they were, he would rather be facing the latter. He raised a hand in greeting, trying to disarm any situation immediately with a friendly smile and visible display of non-aggression. The Humvee rolled to a stop around 20 feet away, and Dean sucked in a breath as the man sticking out the roof lowered the rifle in his direction. The vehicle opened, and three more men exited, all of them dressed in combat BDUs, military boots, armored in light Kevlar vests, and a variety of sidearms at their hips. A couple of them looked to be carrying semi-automatics, but the man who strode to the fore of the group had what looked like a three fifty seven Magnum revolver at his side. The leader, if that's what he was, carried no other visible weapon, and strode forward, confident his comrade's Ruger was fixed on Dean from the top of their vehicle. If Dean even twitched in a manner they did not like, a twenty two rifle bullet would come his way, and there was little he could do about it. Behind the leader, one man carried a Mossberg shotgun, while the other held an MP5 submachine gun with a folding stock, much like the couple Dean had appropriated from the constabulary locker. The leader probably had a larger weapon in the Humvee, but was confident enough that he did not need it. The three junior men all looked to be in their late twenties, while the leader looked to be early thirties. All of them had close-cropped hair in a military fashion. Dean was outnumbered, and most definitely outgunned. Good morning, he said to the lead man. His eyes shrouded by a pair of aviator sunglasses, the man nodded once, reaching up a hand to scratch at his stubble and affecting a casual stance. Morning, friend, he replied. His voice was deep and graveled. He gestured to the rifle across Dean's chest. Have to say, seeing someone with that kind of hardware out here is damn rare. I'm a police sergeant and authorized firearms officer, he said, purposefully leaving out his specialist title. The less they knew about him, the better. When everything went to hell, I grabbed what I could. Got this, a little bit of ammo, and the Glock. Not much, but it's kept me alive. Mm-hmm, intoned the man. You look like you're pulling sentry standing here as you are. Anyone else inside? Dean's heart sank. Just a kid, and we're picking up supplies. Where's the kid, then? No offense, mate, but with four armed guys rolling up in an armored Humvee and pointing a rifle my way, I'm inclined to tell her to stay where she is. Her, eh? The way he mused aloud twisted a tight knot of fear in Dean's belly. Well, I guess we are being a mite unfriendly, what with you being so open and honest. He lifted his arm to the rifleman on the vehicle and gestured for the man to lower the weapon. The barrel dropped and the man moved from behind the sight, but it was still ready. I appreciate the gesture. The name's Dean Williams. Tucker, the man said. 
He gestured to the three men in turn, finishing at the rifleman. These are Lloyd, Simmons, and Tips. You seem to be pretty well equipped, Mr. Tucker, and organized. Are you part of a survivor community? The four men laughed as though Dean had made a witty observation. You could say that, Officer Dean. The address sounded like mockery. Dean sensed things were going to turn no matter what, and it was all just a question of when. He affected a more relaxed pose, as though merely readjusting his feet, but slowly inched back towards the pharmacy door. Oh, I haven't come across any other survivors. Heard a big gun battle a couple of months back, so I tried to stay out of town until necessary. He kept inching back in almost imperceptible increments. You did? Tucker was intrigued by that knowledge, which worryingly suggested that his group had not been part of that battle. Interesting. Where are you and your girl holding up? Are there any more of you? She should come out so we can say hello. Lloyd and Simmons chuckled at that. No disrespect, Tucker, but we've only just met, and I'm not really willing to give away a safe location to a bunch of armed strangers. We can certainly talk about opening up an alliance, though, for trade. This time it was Tucker who laughed. Trade? Officer Dean, we don't need to trade with you. He tapped a white band of cloth wrapped around his left bicep. For the first time, Dean noticed all four men had the same band. Tucker turned his arm so Dean could see the insignia. Embroidered into the white cloth was the image of a black sun rising over the horizon. We are the future, Officer Dean, said Tucker, his voice taking on a strange tone. Gone was the casual arrogance, replaced with something like reverence. The dark resurrection has finally come, just as the first disciple prophesied. And we are his children of the resurrection. We are the chosen to reclaim this world and gather the remnants of humanity so we may rebuild a new and better existence. We are ready, and we will rise. We are ready and we will rise, repeated the three men. There were few things more dangerous in the world than zealots. Dean had thought he was readying to defend himself against opportunists, or possible gun nuts who fancied themselves as feudal lords over a new territory. But this, zealotry was something he was totally unprepared for. So, as you can imagine, Officer Dean, we have no need to trade. Tucker's voice had lost its zeal, once more returning to the smug arrogance of their early interaction. We are well supplied, armed, and number in the hundreds. I think you and your young friend should return with us to join our restoration. It was not a suggestion, and Dean had no choice but to act. He moved, sharp and sudden, while the four men were still overconfident and relaxed, turning and diving through the pharmacy doorway. Behind the counter, he roared at the three youngsters, just as Tucker's shout of outrage signaled a barrage of gunfire that shattered the glass front of the store. The four of them cowered behind the pharmacy counter as the boom of the shotgun and rattle of the MP5 ripped through the shelving, exploding packs of diapers in a puff of fibers and shattering bottles of cough medicine. The thin back wall was shredded into clouds of plaster dust, perforated by buckshot and the stream of rapid fire from the submachine gun. Zane and Alex curled up small behind the counter, hands clamped over their ears, terrified tears on their cheeks as they leaked from tightly closed eyes, as the small pharmacy was torn apart in a thunderous barrage. Officer Dean, shouted Tucker as the assault fell silent. Do not make this more difficult. You are outmatched, despite your pretty hardware. I will give you five minutes to consider your position. 
If all inside do not come out with hands raised after those five minutes have passed, you will give me no other option but to assault. He sighed theatrically. We are not the enemy, Officer Dean. Our goal is to unite the remnants of humanity under the First Disciple's benevolent rule. If you had seen the miracle we have, you would not be so quick to judge us. And what miracle would that be? Hollered Dean in response, stalling for time. The First Disciple can command the dead, said Tucker. The home he has provided for us, that which he has named Ascension, is a haven of life where the dead may not roam. That gave Dean pause as he tried to wrap his mind around Tucker's declaration. Command the dead? What in the Lord's name was that supposed to mean? Those who do not choose to join the children of the resurrection are the enemy of humanity's restoration. If you do not surrender and come of your own volition, Officer Dean, then you will leave me no choice. If you will not obey us in life, then you will do so in death. Your five minutes begin now. What are we going to do? whispered Sarah. Dean turned to look at the three frightened faces staring at him, hoping for salvation, their trust and faith in him absolute. It broke his heart. Honestly, I don't know, he admitted. Your five minutes are up, Officer Dean, called Tucker. I would have your answer now. I'm coming out, he shouted. Don't shoot, just me first, okay? Agreed. There was no other solution Dean could find. Fighting them alone was out of the question, as they would likely breach from the rear of the building while pinning him at the front. He could not fight them alone, and refused to risk the lives of the three youngsters. Needing time to figure out a solution, the only way to gain that time safely was by complying. Taking a deep breath, he moved into sight, holding the rifle above him, one hand on the barrel and the other on the stock. Tucker nodded in satisfaction as he appeared, and seemed a man of his word. The shotgun, SMG, and rifle all remained pointed his way, but no order to fire was given. Walk round your vehicle, hands still up, and get on your knees. Tucker's confidence was so high, he had not bothered to draw his own massive revolver. Hands on hips, a tiny smirk haunting the corner of his mouth, he watched as Dean slowly made his way round his bullet-shredded SUV into full view and lower himself to his knees. Good man, sensible. Now, very slowly lower the rifle to the ground. Dean obeyed. Again, nice and slow, take one hand and draw the pistol with two fingers and throw that with the rifle. Dean moved his hand slowly towards the clock, keeping his eyes on Tucker. Simmons suddenly crumpled as he was threaded by three rounds, a burst from an unseen rifle ripping up his chest, neck, and head as the MP5 went spinning from his hand. Half a second later, Tip's face vanished as a high-velocity round smashed into the bridge of his nose, the rifle falling from nerveless fingers as he lay still. His lifeless corpse then slipped from sight into the Humvee. At the initial three-round burst, Lloyd's shotgun spun around looking for the unseen assailant, shocked at the sudden assault as his two companions were executed. With Tucker unprepared, no guns trained on him, and his hand only inches from drawing the Glock, Dean snapped the weapon out of the holster and double-tapped Lloyd in the chest and head. The first round hit the Kevlar vest, punching the air from his body, but the second hit him just below the left eye, and he collapsed. Tucker whirled back to Dean, his hand moving to draw the revolver, but a second three-round burst from Dean's unseen savior ripped him from hip to chest up his right flank. The police officer reacted from his kneeling position with another two rounds into the zealot leader, finishing the work his savior had started. 
In barely three seconds, Dean was saved. His eyes followed the trajectory of the bullets to his left, the Glock still ready. Two people emerged from different locations about 40 feet apart to join each other. One was a tall, broad man who had the confident walk of a warrior born, smooth and balanced, with a rifle slung across his chest. A smaller, dark-haired woman emerged from a position closer to Dean, though he could not make out any features without his glasses on. She was no soldier, as she almost skipped and danced towards the taller man, handing off her rifle to him. Then she turned towards Dean, running to him at pace, a look of purest joy lighting up her familiar features. Dear God, he breathed as her face came into focus. Sheathing the Glock in shaking disbelief, he choked. Erin? Dean! She cried, waving like a lunatic, bouncing, skipping, and pirouetting, even as she ran. Dino! Erin, he stumbled again. Erin! It was her. She thundered the last few paces, and he opened his arms wide, the speed and excitement of her leaping embrace nearly knocking him off his feet. Laughing, he folded his arms around her, tears of pure delight and relief streaming down his cheeks. Erin, by God, he half sobbed. You're alive, thank the Lord. You big stupid ball of pant-shitting dumb fuckery, she laughed through sobs of her own, still not letting go of her crushing hug. We thought you were dead. Her words resonated deep within him and he pulled her away, setting her down and gripping her shoulders. He drank in the face he remembered, brimming with light and life. But her words awakened an urgency in him. We, Erin nodded, her brown eyes racing over every feature, hardly believing he was in front of her, before she remembered herself and slapped her forehead. Shit, yes, we, Dean. Her smile widened, if that was even possible. Dean, Maria is with us. She's alive and with us. She's okay. Dean dropped to his knees with a relief so overwhelming, it sucked every shred of strength from his limbs. Maria and Erin were alive and together. He offered a prayer of thanks for watching over those most precious to him, even as he choked out a sob. Thank the Lord. You still banging on about that magic space fairy, laughed Erin, as excitable as a five-year-old on Christmas morning. Never mind the Lord above, Dean. If you want to thank anyone for me and Maria still kicking, thank this guy. She threw a thumb over her shoulder at the older man as he approached. Dean Williams, meet Nate Carter. If it weren't for this grumpy old Pooh Bear, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Dean climbed to his feet and offered his hand, which the man took and nodded. Good to meet you, Dean, he said in a voice like a low rumble of thunder. Erin's told me a lot about you. He was a little older than the police officer, maybe early fifties, but he had the look of a man to walk the mountains with. As the two men clasped hands and Dean thanked him repeatedly, he saw the way the old warrior glanced at Erin as she bounced around in happy circles on the balls of her feet, and his smile only widened. It was the same way Dean looked at her, the same way he smiled at her boundless energy, and Dean knew without doubt that Nate Carter was a good man that genuinely cared for Erin. Sarah, Alex, and Zane nervously edged out of the ruined pharmacy, drawn by the happy din. Is that your goddaughter, Sarah? Asked Erin as she caught sight of the three youths. It is. Oh, shit. Maria's gonna explode. Erin's smile was almost painful for its width. Well, isn't this just a great fucking day? Nate had already moved to the bodies of the four men, examining them. Do you know who they were? He asked. Never seen them until today answered Dean, one arm around Erin, the other pulling Sarah to him. Alex and Zane were staring at Nate with the awe only young boys could have for a real warrior. But we should have a talk about them, as I think they're going to be a problem for everyone. 
Nate just nodded and moved his exploration to the Humvee. All that can wait for now, said Erin with a wave. Dean, Maria is about two minutes down the road, she said, pointing back in the direction they had come from. We're down at the army surplus store, come on. Hold your horses, Erin, said Nate. Let's finish what your friends here started. Gather up the weapons, and I'm not going anywhere without this up-armored Humvee. Erin laughed and turned to Dean, shaking her head and rolling her eyes dramatically. Boys do love their toys, eh? Dean smiled in response, and for the first time since the world collapsed around them, something sparked deep within him. It was bright and warm, filling his soul as he watched Erin perform another happy pirouette. Hope. November 3rd, 2010. Reunited. Well, butter my butt and call me a biscuit. Dean is alive, alive and well. We found him, and holy crap, I don't think our timing could have been more perfect, as he was teeth deep in shit when we stumbled across him. Was it coincidence? I remember teasing Nate about Particle's supernatural lucky status, and quoting V for Vendetta with the line of, There is no coincidence, only the illusion of coincidence. I have to wonder if there's some truth to it now, though. With all the weirdness surrounding the undead getting temporarily frisky for yours truly, it's made me think a lot about the force that caused the undead to rise. There's more out there than we know or can ever understand with our tiny little mortal minds, but the timing of us finding Dean just when he needed us? I don't know. That's the simple truth. I have, however, decided to award a name to the celestial or supernatural force that's making the dead get all psycho on humanity. I can't keep calling it this force or that bastard. So, for the purposes of referring easily to this cosmic fucktard in my future writings, I am giving the celestial bellend an identity that is easily remembered, that captures the essence of this dark force tormenting us. Captain Evil. Not my best work, I'll grant you, but it's easy to write, solidifies the dickhead easily in my mind, and clearly identifies what I will be referring to in the future. Also, it's whimsical, therefore my own personal rebellion and middle finger to it. I could call it the Lord of the Undead, or the Dark Spirit, or some other dramatic name, but that would make it sound like it was cool. So, fuck you, Captain Evil. I'm getting all whimsical up in your business. I'm so happy right now, as my poetic opening to this entry can attest to. We went out heavy to the army surplus store, leaving just Mark, Nora and Charlie under the protection of particles at the lodge. There was little issue taking the same service road, even though the surplus store was further along it. We smashed the back door in, snigger, before clearing it nice and easy. No problem. Nate and I took first shift on sentry duty outside, while Maria, Isaac and Alicia were like worker ants, in and out with stuff and loading up the van. We intended to rotate out every half hour or so, letting everybody take a turn at security and sharing the burden of manual labour. But just as it got towards the end of our half hour, there was an absolute storm of gunfire that erupted nearby. And when I say nearby, I mean it was freaking loud from where we were. There was the distinct boom of a shotgun and a staccato blast from a submachine gun with the shattering of glass and all kinds of din. What kind of idiot is making that level of noise? Huffed Nate. They'll draw in every undead for miles with that racket. Come on, he gestured to me. The rest of you, gear up and wait here. It only took us a minute to jog up the road to where we could hear voices. No further barrage of gunfire had followed the initial explosion of noise, but even the men talking weren't trying to be quiet. It sounded like they were even sharing a joke. Bloody lunatics. We edged down an alley to the corner of a building, allowing us to peer round to find four men all facing a ruined little pharmacy. 
one man was popping out the top of an actual Humvee. That's an up-armored vehicle, said Nate, peering down his scope. The man up top has a 22 bolt action rifle. Looks like a Ruger 7722. The two on the ground have an MP5 and a Mossberg 500. And what passes for their leader just has a 357 Magnum at his hip. And Nate's specialist subject on Mastermind is... Nerd. I don't like the look of them, I offered. Why the hell are four guys with that kind of weaponry driving round in an armoured vehicle and shooting the shit out of a pharmacy? Well, obviously there's someone in there, answered Nate deadpan. There's a Range Rover parked right outside. It's shot to shit now, mind. He clicked his tongue. I think you're right, though. These assholes are going for serious overkill, and they all seem to be wearing some kind of insignia on an armband. They don't sit right with me. So what shall we do? Well, for all we know, the person or people inside could have killed one of theirs or stolen, it's too hard to say. It looks like they're waiting for them to surrender rather than assault. We're not going to walk away though, right? I asked. Nate shook his head. No, we'll have to take sides one way or the other. And if I was a betting man, I'd say the person or people in the pharmacy are less likely to be assholes than these toy soldiers acting like playground bullies. Clearly Nate doesn't like bullies, especially ones with guns. I guess he's seen too many of them in the service. His tale of Katie and Sierra Leone comes to mind again. Also, since I forced him into taking on Bancroft to liberate our little family, He's a lot more receptive to interventions. I read a quote somewhere, I can't remember where. When hope has no champion, evil rules all. Nate is definitely one of hope's champions now. He's all about standing on the side of right these days. And I like it. If we're forced to act, we need to do so quickly, he murmured. I'm going to move for a clearer face on shot on the guy with the rifle on the Humvee. Your first target should be the guy holding the MP5. The guy with the shotgun is less of a threat to us at this range, and the leader only has a holstered revolver. Let's wait and see what happens, got it? All over it like a hobo on a hot dog. I nodded, lifting the rifle to my shoulder and taking a bead on the bell end holding the machine gun. He graced me with his raised eyebrow, gave a little snort and shake of his head, then glided gracefully away to a position about 40 feet away. The four men were so focused on the pharmacy and each other, none of them were turned in our direction. Sloppy, considering how much noise they had just made. Undead could have appeared at any moment, and they just weren't being vigilant at all. A little side note here as well. Why did no one dead venture into this area after all that noise? There should have been a shitload milling about in this area, with the wall of undead blocking the main road from a few weeks back. Even if they were no longer bound by Captain Evil into that dense mass, the sheer number should have been milling and wandering for days. Surely some of them should have wandered up this way, and then drawn by the gunfire. I mean, was there something at play here? Were we meant to find and rescue Dean, and given a little respite to do so without the undead getting their filthy claws involved? It's weird, and makes me wonder if Captain Evil is only one side of a celestial coin. I mean, there's yin and yang, order and chaos, matter and antimatter and so forth. Every force has an equal and opposite force, right? Well, if there is a celestial player for our team, they need to get their ass off the bench and get in the game. Because at the moment, it feels like we're playing against a Premier League team and we're fielding the Dog and Partridge pub team on a Sunday morning after a night of tequila shots and half our team are still pissed. This isn't an even playing field. So if there is someone playing for little old humanity, they need to do more than just hold back some undead for 10 minutes. I appreciate the gesture, but come on, get in the fucking game already. Anyway, Nate got in position and I had my eyes on the bully boys and eventually the leader hollered out that five minutes was up. Someone shouted from within the pharmacy that they were coming out. 
and I blinked rapidly in disbelief as I saw Dino himself, weapon held aloft in two hands, walk out of the pharmacy with all those guns trained on him. I glanced over at Nate, and he was already looking at me. I looked back at the unfolding scene and looked back to Nate again. He raised an eyebrow. I nodded, my expression hard and jaw set. And God love him, he seemed to understand. We were going to hit them. I was going to hit them no matter what, and he knew it. Without any argument, he just moved his eye back down his scope and waited. Fucking hero. I wasn't sure I could properly drop the guy with a single round, so I flicked the rifle to burst, aimed low, knowing that muzzle would walk up, and waited. Dean was on his knees, his own rifle on the ground as his hand slowly reached to a pistol at his hip. Just as his hand was about to touch it, I pulled the trigger. Sweet as a nut. The first round popped the guy high in the chest, and the muzzle ride did the rest for the other two, finally coming to rest in his ugly face. A millisecond after I pulled the trigger, Nate fired a single round and popped the rifleman's melon. The other two were so taken by surprise that their heads went on a swivel, and Dean snatched the handgun from his hip and double-tapped the man holding the shotgun like a boss, while I was already moving my sight to the leader. Glocks with no safety are always ready to party. The leader's weapon was halfway out when my next burst ripped up his flank, smashing his hip and ribs, and Dean fired twice again to finish the job. Three seconds maximum. With the bad guys down, I just skipped my way over to Nate, handed him my rifle so I could run, and just said, that's my Dean, and I was off. I nearly knocked him clean off his feet when I leaped into a hug with him. We were both a mess. He couldn't believe it was me. And when I remembered my idiot self and told him Maria was alive and she was two minutes down the road, the wind went right out of him. Pure relief. Freya, this had to be the best day of the apocalypse thus far. Charlie's birthday was pretty damn good. But reuniting Dean and Maria? Shit, I was a mess. Dean had three kids with him. One of them I recognized from photos in the house. Sarah Walsh is a redhead, not long turned 18, and the Williams are her godparents. She had a pistol at her hip, so I guess Nate wasn't the only one teaching Dean's girls how to shoot. The other two were boys, Alex and Zane, and a bit younger than Sarah, I think. Alex looks to be of Chinese heritage, and Zane is subcontinental Asia. I think he's Indian, maybe Bangladeshi, I don't know. I'll find out at some other point. Turns out that when the world fell apart, Dean was asked by Sarah's dad to get her from the private school she boarded at, which is in the local area, apparently. Dean secured the campus with the kids and one teacher that remained, after clearing out a gun locker at the HQ where he worked. They've lost some people in the four months that have passed as well, which sucks. There are eight of them remaining in total, including Dean. I had no idea there was a fancy country private school anywhere near here. There's a different private high school in one of the towns, but it's in a residential built-up area and doesn't have boarding facilities. I had no idea this Crenshaw school even existed. Today I learned. Dean also did go back to their house, but Maria had already been taken by then. There was lots of hurried sharing of stories, and while it was amazing watching Maria and Dean be reunited, my heart did go out to Nate a little. After we gathered up all the weapons and gear from the assholes, Nate climbed into the Humvee, as there was no way he was missing that opportunity for a big new toy, and told us to walk back down to where the others were. He'd take the vehicle round the top end of the service road and meet us behind the surplus store. Dean's SUV was the one out in front of the pharmacy shredded by the gunfire, so we were going to have to transport them all back home, or at least get them a vehicle. We called our mission short for the day, and decided to take them back to our place first, to sort a vehicle and some supplies. We had plenty, and Dean was no random stranger that we needed to build trust with. This was the man that helped put me on the straight and narrow. My entire moral code was constructed by Dean and Maria. He's family. Maria stood and stared for a moment as we approached on foot. Freya, 
I can't tell you how happy I was in that moment. Maria's eyes moved from Dean to me and to Sarah. Her hands slapped over her mouth in shock. Then the couple were hurtling towards each other like the final scene in a romance movie. It was very cinematic. After they were reunited, Maria then folded Sarah in a crushing hug, hardly believing she was there as well. There were many happy tears, many hugs, and I got my fair share as well from them both. When Nate pulled up in the Humvee, he was a little awkward, first time I've ever seen him that way. He hovered in the background, still being all professional and keeping watch, while survival stories were hurriedly shared. Maria eventually spotted him on the periphery and went to him, thanking him for bringing her family back to her. She hugged him and planted a little kiss on his cheek, raising an affectionate hand to touch his face, and returned to her husband. I think Nate's been burning a candle for Maria, and it was hard to see him take a deep sigh as she moved back to Dean. It was a resigned, ah well, kind of gesture, punctuated with a little shrug to himself. Don't get me wrong, he was happy to have reunited Maria with her beloved and give her such joy, but it's also kind of sad. He caught my eye, realized I'd seen his little moment, and just smiled and nodded, letting me know everything was okay. Dean was pretty amazed with our little lodge and said that tomorrow we should all go over to the school, everyone, just to see the place. We now have two allied sites. But then... There's plenty of room at the school, said Dean. We should all band together. It's a great sight. And there it was, the fart in the elevator. I hadn't even thought about that, and then realized Maria would move out of the lodge for sure. With both Dean and Sarah there, it was pretty much a given. Dean was the only trained shooter at the school, as Sarah was new to it, and he wasn't going to abandon them and move here. It didn't make sense to move them all out of there and cram them into our smaller space. We glossed over that decision for now, and to her credit, despite their reunion, Maria said she wasn't going to just move to the school today. She still had responsibilities, and we could all talk about the future in the days to come. After they hung out with us for a couple of hours, we gave them some food and medical supplies, gave them a vehicle to get them home, the black astra we took from Shooty McFuckface at the court building, and they went back to Crenshaw before their people started panicking about their absence. Tomorrow, we're all going to Crenshaw, all of us. There are eight here, so we're going in a convoy of three. Nate will drive the Humvee, taking Isaac, Mark and Charlie. Alicia will drive the van loaded up with some more supplies we're going to take them, with Nora as her passenger. I'll be driving our trusty pickup with Maria and Particles riding shotgun. It should be an interesting day, I think, and likely quite awkward when the moving question comes up again. I'm happy as a pig in shit right now, because everyone I consider as family are alive and well. That's just bloody awesome. However, I do think this is going to change the dynamic of the lodge completely, I'm certain it's a given that Isaac will move to the school, and honestly, I'm okay with that. The two of us having distance will do everyone a power of good. I can't see how Maria wouldn't move in the next few days either. She's got her husband back and her goddaughter. She's been around since Sarah was born. They've known her way longer than me. That's going to be too definite moving out of the lodge, which actually saddens me. This is my home now, the first place I've really felt was home. It was great having my own flat for four months, but home is really where the people most important to you are. Home isn't really a place, it's people, I guess. But this lodge has so much significance for me that moving out just doesn't feel right for the moment. For one thing, Freya, this is where you're buried. Moving away would feel like an abandonment of your memory somehow. Shrug. Mark's skills might be of more use over there, and where Mark goes, so does Charlie. Personally, I think Alicia will be wherever Nate is. She wants to be a warrior, and there's no better teacher than our resident one-man army. There's a very real possibility that our lodge might reduce to just me, 
Nate, Alicia, Nora, and of course, Particles. So today has been somewhat bittersweet, I think. It's amazing, and I wouldn't change it at all, Freya. But I also think it signals the beginning of a new phase for us. And an end. Anyway, there's no point in dwelling now. It's been a tiring day emotionally, and we've got some further discussions to have with Dean about those people. From the brief garble he did about them, they sound like a cult of nutters, but suggested there were hundreds of them. And they talked about their leader commanding the dead, which is all kinds of weird. Either way, we're going to the school tomorrow for a tour to meet our new allies and to have further discussions about these heavily armed lunatics calling themselves the Children of the Resurrection. Well, that's not a creepy name at all, is it? Night, night, Freya. Wish you were here. Part 3. Dreams of Light and Dark. November 5th, 2010. Changes. Remember, remember the 5th of November. It should be Bonfire Night, or to give it the correct title, Guy Fawkes Night, where we staunch, stiff upper-lipped Brits celebrate the failure of the 1605 gunpowder plot to blow up the Houses of Parliament during its state opening. We give pennies to our children who have constructed effigies of the conspirator for whom the day is named, which we later cheer and toss on a huge fire so we can watch them burn. I mean, how fucked up is that when you consider it? Yay, our children are burning effigies of a national traitor from four centuries ago. Go Wars! Parliament declared a national holiday, first celebrated a year later, to mark foiling a plot to kill the King and Parliament as a reprisal for oppression of Roman Catholics in England. Hearts and minds of a peace-loving God, eh? We don't like how your religion is oppressing our religion, so we're going to blow you the fuck up. Oh yeah? Well, fuck you, we caught you out, so we're going to burn your ass, then make all our children celebrate it for the rest of time. Sucks to be you, guy. Not much changed for the next four centuries. Religion has a lot to answer for. Actually, not fair. Dean is religious, and he doesn't want to start wars on Muslims or Sikhs or Buddhists or other denominations of the Christian faith. That's the kind of religion I'm okay with. You do you, but don't tell everyone else to follow the teachings of something that gets all the credit when something goes right, and when something goes wrong, it's all just part of a plan. I'm not sure I can get behind a plan as to why somebody's four-year-old just died of leukemia, or there are diseases ripping entire third-world countries apart, along with famine and drought. Assholes live to their nineties when good people are struck down before their time by cancer or heart failure or something else from the litany of things that can stop our clocks. Okay, Lockie, time to get off the soapbox. That was meant to be a jovial opening to my entry, and instead I went off at an oblique tangent. Long story short, I have no problem with religion. You do you and the things that make you happy. I only have a problem with people who force their religious beliefs onto others and try to dictate their behaviour. Yesterday, we went to visit Crenshaw School in our little convoy, the first time the whole lodge has gone out. I have to say, the place impressed me. It's hidden from the country road by hedgerows and trees, and if you don't know it's there, you'll go right past it without ever knowing. There's a turn onto a road that runs for about a quarter mile, which arrives at a huge double gate of iron bars, revealing the wall of metal fencing that runs round the whole campus. The site is huge. I mean, I'm comparing it to the lodge, but even compared to my old high school, it's massive. I think that's largely to do with how much space there is. There's so much greenery, and the site spreads out over a large area, so no part of it feels constricted. The buildings on campus are modern and state-of-the-art, apart from the original school, which is now the admissions building and administrative centre of the institution. The original school was built in the 1920s, so it has that old-style Victorian look to it. It's stylish, imposing, and full of character, 
But beyond that, the rest of the site is extremely contemporary, with every building's roof plastered in solar panels. There's even a massive on-site tank for diesel, which feeds into heating and backup generators by an underground pipe system. Honestly, it's absolutely amazing. It's secure, it has self-sufficient power in solar energy, plus the diesel backups, and it has artesian wells for fresh, clean water. It's actually damn hard to argue against moving there, considering the sheer amount of space there, and the eight of them are housed in a single dormitory building. That building alone has enough space for the rest of us to move in, but there are three more halls of that size, just as dormitories, and even a small cluster of houses further back, where the on-site maintenance people would live. Not little rooms, but actual two-bedroom, two-floor houses. I mean, holy shit, how much did it cost for one kid to come here for a year? Truthfully, if I had kids, and I had the money to send them to a place like this, you damn tootin' I'd do it. The place is breathtaking. After we'd had the full tour and all the introductions were made, we sat down in the communal area of Hall Fire where they make their home, as apparently the four dorms are named after the elements, and talked of the future. Particles was clearly loving all the attention, as the younger kids were thrilled to have a dog on sight. But the pooch himself gravitated to a girl named Jennifer, or JJ as she likes to be called. She was the only survivor from the girls' dorm when one of them died and killed the other three, with only JJ managing to escape unscathed from that horror. She's the only girl here other than Sarah, and she seems hardened by that experience. It must have been pretty bad shit that went down. But as usual with his spooky dog therapist instincts, Particles seemed to chill her out as he sat on her lap and let her stroke him. It reminded me of when we first got to the lodge, Freya. I remember you being a bit wild-eyed, and little old particles seemed to bring you out of yourself. I swear that pug has superpowers. Your lodge is great, Dean started, but it's small. It just seems like good sense to move everyone here. More safety in numbers, more space for expansion, plenty of power and backup power capability, Clean water, a secure perimeter, maintenance area, tools, and other resources. The lodge is nice and out of the way, but it's smaller. It doesn't seem logical for us to remain split into two small groups that are so far apart. It's what, about a ten-mile drive between the two sites because of roads we have to avoid. Not easy to respond quickly to if there's a problem, and it will probably be the very edge of radio range and maybe beyond it. Ah, yes, I should mention that. When Dean cleared out the locker, as he keeps calling it, he took a case of ten secure channel radios that the specialist firearms unit used on operation when all geared up. Those ten radios are all on their own encrypted channel and can't be listened into as they're tuned to this encoded channel, but they have a range of between six and ten miles, based on how built up the area is, so I'm informed. We'd be pushing it using those radios over two sites. I could set up the same camera system here as I did for the lodge, offered Isaac. Have you got the extra kit? asked Nate. Well, no. I'd have to repurpose what we've used at the lodge. Uh-huh, was all Nate responded with. Nate isn't a fan of moving. I can sense it. He's not arguing against it, just that he seems to be gathering information and isn't enthusing over a move. There are better facilities here for me to work with. Mark seemed almost apologetic. There's a full workshop, maintenance garage, store for parts and tools, some lumber, more space to park the tanker and the loader truck. He said it all looking at Nate. I think everyone wants Nate to sign off on it from a tactical point of view. What about you, Erin? asked Dean. Talk about a rock and a hard place. Dean was all for it. Nate wasn't convinced as yet. And now I was smack bang in the middle of the two most important male role models in my life. I owed everything to both of them. Dean, along with Maria, set my pre-apocalypse life on the right course. They straightened me out and saw the person I could be if I avoided the wall I was running headlong at. 
but since the fall of the world, Nate has been my rock. He gets me, and few people do, and has this unwavering faith like when we rescued Dean. All it took was a look and an unspoken assertion that this was important to me, and he had my back, with no argument or question. Just a nod and his eye behind the scope. Nate's also given me the skills to survive. He's taught me how to shoot, how to make smoke bombs, how to hunt, how to gut and dress a deer, how to maintain weapons, building clearance tactics, vigilance. Shit, I wouldn't be sat in that room with a decision to make had it not been for Nate. It was almost like asking me to throw my support behind one or the other. And I thought that was a bit unfair of Dean to put me in that spot. In fairness to him, though, he's only just met Nate and doesn't know just how important the gruff old Marine is to me. It's a great place, Dean. It really is. Dean started to nod, but I felt bad as I put the brakes on any celebration. But the simple fact is that wherever Nate is, that's where I am. If he thinks we should all be here, then I'm all in. If he wants to wait a little longer, then I'm at the lodge with him. Everyone is free to make their own choice, and I'll not argue against anyone wanting to move here. But since all this started, Nate and I have been a team, and I won't change that. Wherever we go, we go together. I glanced over at Nate, and he seemed more relaxed in his chair, a little smile on his lips as he looked back at me. I think he was relieved, like he was unsure which way I'd swing on the issue, and my clear statement of support was a weight off his shoulders. After all the weight he's carried for me, like dealing with that awful scene in the apartment block and the pregnant woman, and taking the responsibility of your last request, Freya, I wasn't going to leave him because I thought it might be more convenient. If Nate says he's going to find this bunch of cult nutters and take them on alone, he'll have me chattering in his ear all the damn way. Remember, we're Flint and Lock, action heroes. We're the ultimate buddy movie. Dean looked disappointed for a moment, but he doesn't have it in him to hold a grudge. That's just not his way. I think it also emphasized to him just how close Nate and I have become living and working so closely together. For those first few weeks before we found the lodge, it was just me, Nate, and our lucky little pug. Fair enough, he said and didn't push me any further. As foreseen, Isaac jumped at the chance and was the first to state his desire to move. Maria was almost apologetic when she declared her intent to move, but we all understood. Her husband and goddaughter were here, so this is where she needed to be. I'd like to move here, said Mark tentatively, his eyes still on Nate. Charlie and I could take one of those houses down in the maintenance area, Having our own little house would be nice, and it is more secure here. Plus, although they're all a few years older, there are kids here closer to his age, rather than just being stuck with a bunch of adults. I resent being called an adult, I chimed in, eliciting a laugh. Nate nodded. You do what's best for you and your boy, Mark. You don't need my blessing. Actually, Nate, I do, said Mark, surprising everyone. Nate, if it weren't for you and Erin, none of us would even be at that lodge in the first place. We'd still be a slave to Jamie Bancroft, or likely dead from one of his rage tantrums. All of us owe the two of you everything, and I can't in good conscience go anywhere without that blessing. If you want me to stay and help at the lodge, I will. You both pulled us from the fire, taught me how to defend my son. You took us in and gave us a home and security and purpose. You gave us a family. Without you and Erin, I wouldn't even have a chance at a life with my son. He laughed and shook his head. So honestly, Nate, I do need your blessing. My already high estimation of Mark went through the bloody roof at that. I hold Nate in the highest esteem, and it was genuinely heartwarming to hear that from someone else so open and honest. Nate was quiet for a moment, digesting Mark's words. The whole room was silent before he sighed. 
They're kind words, Mark, and I appreciate them. But Erin's the one who takes the credit for that. I was against getting involved to begin with, but she fought so hard I had no choice. Don't you try and give me the credit, you swine, I laughed. You went through that building like a one-man army, and the whole thing was your planning. It doesn't matter who did what, interrupted Mark. However it happened, both of you came through for us. Like Lockie just said, the two of you are a team. If you want my blessing, then of course you have it, sighed Nate. Whatever you feel is best for Charlie, you've got my full support. Mark looked relieved. It was obvious he wanted to move to Crenshaw, but I think he was genuine in his promise to stay at the lodge with us. With Nate's blessing, though, it was like a weight had been lifted from him. So, as expected, Maria, Charlie, Mark, and Isaac agreed to move. Just like that, half our little family was ready to go. Then, I was doubly surprised as Nora chimed in. It's nice at the lodge, she said into the quiet. But there are so many young people here, I think I'd like to come here myself. There's a lot I can teach them, I think. And these young people have to face a future in this new world. God damn it. The logic was sound. Nora has so many useful skills and an absolute trove of knowledge for simple living. Having her pass that wisdom onto the younger ones here makes so much sense, it's painful. She's in her early 60s, so people with her kind of knowledge need to pass it on, just as Mark does. He could teach one of the older kids his skills, as well as passing that knowledge to Charlie. So, we were left with just the three of us. Me, Nate, and Alicia. I'd already placed my marker, so all eyes were on Alicia. I'm still learning, she said. For the moment, I need to be where Nate is and continue that. It's a skill that needs to be passed on. So I was almost right. I called Alicia wanting to stay in Nate's shadow and the other four wanting to move. Nora had been the wild card I hadn't considered, but I should have. With all the kids here and her natural maternal instincts, I shouldn't be surprised she wanted to surround herself with young people and pass on her wisdom and knowledge to the new generation. Can't argue with that. It does leave me a little concerned, though, that the three top-tier shooters from the lodge are all unconfirmed at the minute. Basically, it's all Nate. If he moves, so do me and Alicia. If he stays at the lodge, so do we. Hey, Charlie, I said. When you move here, will you look after particles for me for a while? Yeah, of course I will, Lucky, he said. But aren't you going to come here? It won't be the same without you. In time, I'm sure, I said, not knowing if that was true. But until then, it might be best for him to live with you, as I don't want him left in the lodge on his own if the three of us are out and about. Can you do that for me? He leaned over, offering his fist. I obliged with the bump and subsequent theatrical finger explosion. And so the ancient oath swearing of the exploding fist bump sealed our pact. Obviously, we all came back to the lodge last night. Today, the sorting of resources has begun and will continue for the next few days while everything is organized, vehicles packed, Vehicles like the tanker and loader truck are moved, and sorting out what resources they take to the school. It's pretty busy, so I probably might not write for a while. Oh, that's a lie. We had a conversation about the cult nutters, but I'll write that in the morning before we start the busy day of organizing and packing. Right now, my heart is feeling a little heavy, and the mood is a bit somber in the lodge. There's no real excitement as everyone digests the fact that our relatively happy little home is coming to an end. It's a new start for many, and it means a growth in the community. But with just Nate, Alicia, and me here, well, it'll feel empty. There's been so many of us for a while, and I'd gotten so used to it. I don't know how I feel. Future luck is problem. I'm a bit down, I'm tired, and while I still have him with me, 
I'm going to chill and snuggle down with my lucky pug. I suppose for something new to begin, I guess we have to accept the end of what comes before. Not sure how long it'll take me to accept this, though. November 6th, 2010. Squirrel turds. Before I throw myself into the work of the day, I've risen early to summarise our discussions regarding these children of the resurrection that were about to cart Dean and the three kids off to their special asylum. In short, they are loyal to someone calling himself the First Disciple, and they have a home base somewhere in the area with hundreds of people, if the little group's spokesman was to be believed. This place is called Ascension, which just worries us right off the bat, because when people start throwing dramatic names like First Disciple, Children of the Resurrection, and Ascension around, you're very unlikely to get anything resembling good sense out of them. When Dean offered to be allies initially, they laughed at him and said they didn't need to trade. He thinks they were going to take them back to wherever they were and possibly use them as slave labour, or maybe try and condition them to their way of thinking. From what the leader said to Dean, when his voice got all distant and his eyes got a faraway look in them, this first disciple is their hope for humanity and wants to reclaim the world, building a new and better existence. Sounds cool, right? But calling this bullshit the Dark Resurrection, which I'll grant them does fit the uprising, and saying it was foreseen in prophecy by this first disciple individual, that does not sound like a stable and rational leadership. It sounds like a cult. Still, cults are always started and led by charismatic individuals, and those who buy into them are either vulnerable, lost, or just looking to be part of something. To get hundreds, though, and to be well supplied with weapons and armoured vehicles, and have that many people all together at the end of the world, that implies preparation. That last bit was Nate's observation, by the way, about the preparation. He's right as well. We've cobbled together all the armaments we have, mainly through good fortune and taking them from bad people who had them. It sounds like these nutters were actually ready for the end of the world. Not only ready, though, it sounds like they wanted it. And there's nothing that worries me more than an Armageddon cult. It's one thing an individual being prepared should the world shit the bed, but it's something entirely different when a whole community is built on the premise of the fall. Anyone wanting the end of the world, I have said before now, is a complete turd of a person. Everyone wants change, but to actively wish and be prepared for the fall and near extinction of the human race, and gathered already in the hundreds, I will be my very British self and go with classic understatement. I'm not too fond of that idea. Here's the real kicker, though. None of us could figure out what they meant by their first disciple being able to command the dead. This took a guy, the asshole leader with the revolver that Dean and I perforated between us, boasted that their homestead of ascension was free of the dead, that they couldn't roam there, and their first disciple must have done some kind of display to prove this magic trick. Dean said Tucker referred to that as a miracle he had witnessed. There are two options here. Number one is that this first disciple is a clever illusionist and con man to pull off this miracle. That would be pretty difficult to maintain over time, though. The longer the undead menace continues, the more likely your lies are to be discovered. The second option is way more unsettling. My mind drifts back again to the change in the undead for that short time. It was brief, almost like the flex of a muscle, like a test or trial run? Don't know. It does suggest that this isn't just a plan of Captain Evil to raise all the dead, then sit back and chill, scratching its celestial butt crack while it waits for the zombies to kill all humans slowly over time. There's more agency to it.
here's my unsettling option. Is it possible that Captain Evil has made this leader of theirs into some kind of evil Jesus? I know that's throwing it out there and overreaching a little, but something's just not right. There has to be a purpose to all of this somehow. It can't all be random. I just don't see why this little slice of rural northern England would be the epicenter for the end times, though. And I still don't believe that. The world is a big place, and we're a tiny little piece of it. I can't see the coming of any evil Jesus in such a sparsely populated county of England. Still, we need to investigate the truth of these weird powers and figure out if their guy is playing some exquisite game of misdirection or Captain Evil is at play in some way. We'll figure that out over the next few days while we all let it simmer in the back of our minds. Today and over the next few days, it's all about moving people out and settling them in. I'm going to have a private chat with Nate as well at some point over the next few days, I want to see where his head is at. The more I think about these children of the resurrection, the more I think they're nuttier than a fat squirrel's turd. Safety in numbers in a secure remote location like Crenshaw seems like good sense now. As much as I love this lodge and that you're buried here, Freya, we might have to be sensible about it. This place will always make a good fallback or safe house to run to, but there doesn't seem any sense in just three of us staying here with those lunatics out there. I won't push him, though. I just want to see where his thinking is. I meant what I said. Wherever Nate is, that's where I am. Right, shitloads to do for the next few days. Lots of back and forth moving stuff, transporting vehicles back and to. There's going to be a bit of fuel usage, so I guess we'll have to think about a fuel run. And also... It's time for more hunting. We've been so busy we haven't been back to the deer park in a while, and I'm hankering for a venison orgasm. And so the exodus begins. We Will Rise John Maddock was a fraud. His entire adult life had been empty, devoid of meaning and direction as he stumbled from one dead-end job to another, adrift on the sea of life with no sight of land. Always wanting something more, some meaning to his existence. Lady Luck had never been his ally, only a spiteful trickster that toyed with his existence for her own twisted amusement. Maddock was intelligent, quick-witted and charismatic, able to make his life anything he desired if he just possessed the drive and determination to apply himself. However, this was the root of all his trouble. For there was one undeniable truth even he could not refute. John Maddock was lazy. He wanted the get-rich-quick scheme, the big win for a small investment, or the long gods gamble for that one big score. For all his intelligence and charm, John Maddock wanted the world to give him what he felt he deserved, rather than using the tools he had been given and applying them. Every career ladder remained unclimbed, even though he knew he was smarter than his managers, his arrogance too overpowering to keep the obvious disdain for his superiors concealed. He wanted the world around him to see his gifts, to recognize that charm and intelligence in all its glory. But the narcissist within prevented him from holding back. Not content to be the whispering power behind a throne, he wanted to sit upon it, reveling in the glory he felt was his due. But the doors leading to every throne he pursued were slammed in his face. He told himself such positions were beneath him anyway. There would always be someone he had to answer to, someone with more power and sway than he could ever attain, because he was not born to privilege. He had not been blessed with the finest private education or network of contacts to open those doors for him. Without the drive to be an entrepreneur and willingness for hard work, John Maddock was doomed to a life of insignificance, 
a mote of cosmic dust that would go unnoticed in the vastness of time and space, like so many others. That was, until he read a single quote from the science fiction writer, L. Ron Hubbard. You don't get rich writing science fiction. If you want to get rich, you start a religion. For the first time, Maddock applied himself, working those dead-end jobs while he wandered the dark paths of the internet, scouring old-style forums and message boards, and tapping into the newer tools of social media to gather weak-minded fools to him. Within weeks, he was a subculture online celebrity, a voice for the disaffected. Within months, he was speaking to a massive online congregation. So many disaffected souls, drifting on that aimless sea with no purpose in life, found an empathetic listener in Maddock. He heard them and understood their pain and disillusionment with a world that ignored them. They were life's outliers, alone, with no family or friends and no purpose. They all craved to be part of something and to feel connected in a community where they had meaning and value. The world had made them pariahs, cast aside to watch others have all the advantages and all the breaks that they were denied. Maddock echoed their cries of inequality and injustice, transforming their meek whines of disparate discontent into a single roar of unity. He assured them all that a great equalizer was coming. The pillars of society and civilization were trembling and on the verge of collapse, corroded by the avarice and capitalism of the evil 1% who greedily retained power for themselves. A new age was just over the horizon, when the world would be reset and all those riches would mean nothing. But if they were to claim their rightful place in this rebirth, they had to be prepared. Maddock gave them all a solemn oath to guide them, to unite and lead them through this great change, and they would be his children of the resurrection. The meek truly would inherit the earth. Throughout history, the end of the world has always fascinated every religion and culture. The promise of the world being reset contained a heady allure, allowing those abandoned by current society to claim the rebirth as their divine due for all they had been forced to endure. It was an easy hook for Maddock to bait. The donations to his religion started small, then gradually gained traction. Soon he was able to leave those meaningless jobs behind, with enough income to sustain him while he focused on expanding his growing influence. The donations were enough to keep him comfortable, but he had to continually preach to his online masses and keep them engaged, constantly needing to fire their conspiracy theorist minds with all kinds of laughable junk he found in the darkest corners of the internet. It wasn't enough, though. His natural apathy started to creep in again, his work ethic waning as the donations remained steady, but not enough to warrant his continual level of effort. Until fate finally smiled upon him. After a sermon about the need for readiness posted online to his ever-growing followers, Maddock received a private message from a young man named Oliver Hargrave. Heir to a vast fortune of old Cheshire property money, Hargrave had lived a life of privilege, but still felt like an outlier. He was socially awkward, despite all his advantages in life, laughed at by his peers and paranoid that those befriending him, or those seeking to court him, were only interested in his pending fortune. The tragic irony of his dilemma was not lost on Maddock, as Oliver Hargrave gift-wrapped himself to one interested in him for that exact purpose. Oliver wanted to be part of the new order when the pillars of society crumbled. He wanted his wealth to do something good when those end times came, and begged to help Maddock with his readiness. He had a site in the Cheshire countryside that could be donated to the Children of the Resurrection and renovated at his cost. 
He would install solar power, drill wells, have water treatment and filtration in place, fields for agriculture and animal farming, gather resources such as dried foods, fuel, vehicles, even weapons and ammunition from a vast network of contacts. If you had the funds, anything was possible. Hargrave, in his social isolation, had studied preparation for the end times and knew what they needed with a promise to project manage and fund it all. His sick father was dying of terminal cancer, inoperable with only months to live, and Oliver Hargrave was heir to a fortune worth in the region of 400 million pounds. Maddock had laughed long and loud, dancing for joy in his one-bedroom flat, air-punching at finally achieving his heart's desire. Oliver Hargrave was his golden goose. A few years of milking it, watching the community grow and gather, giving sermons, being magnanimous, and manipulating the impressionable young man was all Maddock needed. After two or three years, Hargrave would be his loyal dog and sign the purse strings of the Hargrave fortune to Maddock, and the false prophet would disappear into the night, taking all that wealth to some non-extradition country. Sun, sea, and sand would be his future, finally living the life of perpetual comfort he knew he deserved. Moving north from his tiny flat on the outskirts of London, Maddock had watched the children of the resurrection grow these past three years. The purposefully renovated site for his expertly crafted cult was now populated with almost 500 people. Agriculture, animal husbandry, engineering, medical staff, and a working infirmary. They even recruited trained security specialists from former veterans unable to find a place in the civilian world, or army reservists who would unlikely pass a psych evaluation for professional soldiers. They had it all. The site was surrounded by purpose-built farmsteads, tasked with specific crops to rotate, and dairy farms with cattle, sheep, swine, and their main site even had an old-school windmill constructed for milling grain and silos to store their output. Maddock had marveled at the infrastructure in place, Hargrave's near-savant level of planning and organization a wonder to behold. Disaffected souls from across the country began to arrive at the commune, giving their lives to a cause he had fabricated, and one he would ultimately betray. A year earlier, in 2009, Maddock had gathered his followers together and proclaimed that the end of days was nearing. By the end of 2010, the world would die and be reborn anew. It started the clock ticking on his machinations with Hargrave, but the young man, his father long since dead, was alone in the world. Maddock had insinuated himself as the young man's surrogate family and confidant, having been ever present in his life for three years as they watched their community grow. The time was approaching when Hargrave would finally cast off the chains of his wealth and truly be ready for the resurrection. Maddock had inwardly laughed to himself when he spoke that line. He was quite proud of that one, and Hargrave had looked thoughtful, as though realizing that he was finally ready. The resurrection was upon them. Everything was in place. Maddock had played the role of benevolent prophet for a little over three years, passing his 40th birthday during that period. He wanted to enjoy what remained of his life. And though he lived in exquisite comfort with his every need attended, his life as their prophet had always been stamped with an expiration date. Plus, it was exhausting having to play his role to keep his followers engaged. Eventually, they would expect a commitment from him, an undeniable and tangible truth to the sermons and promises he had delivered, so 2010 was the platter of knowledge he served to satiate their hunger. This was their last year of preparation for the coming apocalypse, and as their excitement was reinvigorated with his revelation, 
Maddock began the process of planning his exit strategy while they were distracted. However, on the 23rd of June 2010, the world did end. And that was not part of his plan. It's happening, beamed Oliver, bursting into the dining room of Maddox's house as he was eating breakfast. Naturally, the prophet had his own living quarters, attended by acolytes eager to please their revered leader, usually young women that could serve multiple needs. Recovering his poise at the sudden interruption, Maddock turned and raised a single imperious eyebrow in the young man's direction. Oliver was animated, his eyes bright with wonder as he placed the laptop on the table in front of Maddock. Look! Maddock released a small sigh of displeasure at his morning peace being disturbed, but indulged his wealthy benefactor. He turned his gaze to the screen as Oliver switched the volume on. It took all of Maddox's considerable acting skills to keep his expression and body language neutral, as he spent the next 15 minutes switching between channels, reading online news releases, and staring at images of violence across the globe. Aerial pictures of cities in chaos and flame were shown on every continent, in virtually every country. Video footage from ground level revealed white-eyed people tearing at their fellow humans with their teeth, biting bloody chunks from them like monstrous savages. The most terrifying of all the releases were those who openly said that the dead were rising. What the hell did that mean? The dead were rising. Confusion reigned over all the channels. How had this happened overnight in every country, on every continent across the globe? No terrorist organization could pull that off without some cells being detected along the way. It was just too big to contain, too perfectly orchestrated to come from nowhere without some form of detection from paranoid intelligence services. And what virus could do this in a single night to the whole world? Any pandemic would still have a lag time from ground zero to spread across the globe. It just didn't make any sense. This was everywhere, all at once. Oliver hung at his shoulder, eyes dancing between the images on the screen and Maddox's blank expression, waiting for some visceral reaction from his spiritual leader. All his sermons, all the promises he had made to them, had come to fruition. It was the end of days, and John Maddock, prophet of the resurrection, had spoken truth. You were right, revered prophet, whispered Oliver in breathless wonder. He never uttered Maddock's title in private, and it gave the false prophet pause. Oliver only used it in public among the other resurrectionists, Maddock had been sure to reinforce his image of family and confidant with Oliver in private, building that intimate trust and making him use his name, talking as close friends and making the young man feel part of his secretive world. For Oliver to say it now, when it was just the two of them, and with such reverence, only reinforced how the world had suddenly transformed. You were right! About it all! laughed Oliver, a sound of exultant disbelief, like someone below the poverty line staring at a winning lottery ticket in shaking fingers. And now, thanks to you, we are prepared for this dark resurrection. Dark resurrection. The words sent a wave of foreboding through Maddox's body, rippling like freezing meltwater through his veins. The dead were rising. It was a dark resurrection, and he had foreseen it all. Yet they were all lies, all of them. He had never been specific about the method the world would end, only that society would collapse. Specifics were a dangerous game to play, and the disjointed souls that had slipped into the cracks of society would find their own theories and answers. He had fed them all manner of conspiracy theories to highlight the pervasive corruption throughout society, 
spoon-feeding their confirmation bias, and anyone could spend hours looking at the horrors that humanity inflicted upon itself and the Earth to draw conclusions from where the fall would inevitably originate from. It was often the topic of discussion among his followers, and he let them debate their theories amongst themselves, retaining the stance of a perfect politician and never committed. Instead, Maddock merely offered words of praise and recognition for their freedom of thought and fascinating ideas. He had only predicted the resurrection itself, not the agency that would bring about its genesis. They should have been debating it still, as he absconded with Hargrave's fortune. But the dead rising? Like some twisted version of a horror movie? Who could have predicted that? Prophet? Maddock recovered his poise and affected an air of false confidence as he turned his gaze to Oliver. Gather all our brothers and sisters, he commanded in his most imperious tone. I would address them all within the hour, but, for the moment, leave me alone to collect my thoughts. He forced a smile to his lips and placed his hand on Oliver's forearm in a reassuring grip, more to steady himself than for the younger man's benefit. Go now. Our time is finally here, my brother. Oliver was radiant as he nodded, moving to pick up the laptop, but Maddox stayed his hand. Leave it, he ordered. I would look upon the resurrection a while longer. Oliver bobbed his head. Of course. As the young man left, he was still smiling as he closed the door, leaving the newly crowned prophet of the resurrection alone. As the door clicked shut, Maddox's eyes drank in the unfolding apocalypse on the device. Sucking in a deep breath, he exhaled a single word. Fuck. Exhausted by maintaining his facade for that first day, Maddock collapsed on his bed, waving away the two young women desperate to please him. With his exalted status now confirmed, they were sexually ravenous, eager for his divine touch. He had neither the strength nor the will for sex, no matter how their lithe bodies might stir him. What he needed was a plan. He had never accounted for being an actual leader through a genuine apocalypse. John Maddock was not cut out to be a true prophet and divine icon to 500 people through a real apocalypse. His goal had been a long con, with the only aim to steal Oliver's fortune and live a luxurious life of hedonistic comfort. The future of the people he intended to abandon had never been his concern. Now, everything had changed. There was no escape to a sun-drenched tropical getaway, with lazy days spent by his private pool being waited on hand and foot as a lauded socialite, renowned for hosting all the best parties. He wanted adulation, but not the type he had to work for. Responsibility was not a game he desired to play. Right now, sleep was all he needed. In the coming days, he would have little time to himself. He would have to craft some new aspect to his false religion, some great pretense to maintain his illusion, and try to figure out if there was any way he could escape this twisted nightmare of his own making. Lady Luck had baited her hook, and like a fool, he had taken the bite. He should have known better, thinking he had the perfect plan. What a grand cosmic joke his life was. Exhaustion finally claimed him. Without even kicking off his shoes, Maddock collapsed into the oblivion of sleep. It was cold. So very cold. This was not the cold of winter, though, a mere absence of warmth that could be banished with the blaze of a fire. It was a bleak darkness that seeped through every pore, icing the blood as though frost was gathering on the very marrow of his bones. It was a dream, he knew. He was lucid, 
Aware that his body was sleeping off the numbing exhaustion the end times had wrought upon him. There was no chaos here, though. Unlike the jumble of clashing thoughts and emotions raging in his mind during his waking hours. It was just dark, cold, and endlessly empty. He was alone. John Maddock. The voice in the dark was a challenge for his mortal senses to experience. It didn't lap into his eardrums as a gentle wave of sound, but reverberated in every molecule of his being. A sickening whisper of pure malice invading every part of him, finally manifesting in his mind as something his mortal reality could comprehend. Sibilant, with a demonic rasp clinging to the malevolent hiss, the inhuman whisper sounded in his mind like the moist crunch of footsteps in wet gravel. Paralyzed with a terror that threatened to snap his sanity, he was unable to even shiver as the voice's dark caress slid down the nerves of his spine. You have sinned, John Maddock, it breathed. You have led these people with empty promises, made yourself into a false prophet and idol, and your only true intention was betrayal. Maddock desperately wanted to beg for forgiveness, but he remained motionless, petrified by the demonic presence violating every fiber of his mortal body and soul. Humanity is judged from this day, John Maddock. Judged because of those like yourself, who live only for their own comfort, their own needs, at the cost of their fellow man. Today, John Maddock, your dead have awakened, and they will judge you all. Tears rolled from his eyes, freezing solid in the biting cold that clawed at his dream flesh. There was nothing to see, just an empty blackness in which he floated, devoid of sensation, save for the crippling dread and the frozen tears upon his cheek. Lies. Greed, hatred, deceit, betrayal, cruelty, murder, continued the malice. This is all your kind know, so the children of my dark resurrection will be humanity's end. Your time upon this earth is no more, John Maddock. Humanity is irredeemable. Desolation, soul-deep and crushing, pervaded every atom of Maddock as his dream self hung alone in the silent, eternal abyss. Was this his fate? Oblivion, perpetual darkness until time itself died. His sanity threatened to shatter with the concept. Or can you be redeemed? The question was a lifeline, a shining light of hope cast into the black sea of devastation in which he drowned. You, John Maddock, have always dreamed of being special, standing center stage in the theater of your unremarkable life. The voice softened a fraction, but it was enough for Maddock's hope to flare. Were you to be granted the chance to atone for your decadence and sloth, for your boundless and selfish pride, would you grasp it? For the first time, his weightless body relaxed enough for him to sob a response. Yes, with all my heart, yes. The words exploded from him in choked relief, his intent genuine and heartfelt, desperate to redeem himself to the dark divinity holding him in the void. The pause that followed was an eternity, and the silence a gargantuan emptiness surrounding him. Maddock could still feel the presence of the divine entity, for it was divine, of that he was certain, but it said nothing for an age while it measured the depth of his sincerity. Your followers believe in you, John Maddock, came the voice in his mind again, 
blowing through his senses like a mournful gale and the whispering breath of the dead. You will not betray them again, for they are the hope for all humanity. They are the children of my dark resurrection, and you are my first disciple. But know this, John Maddock. There are those still living who will bring about the end of all things if they remain unhindered. What would you have me do, my lord? He had no care for how desperate and sycophantic he sounded. Pride was an empty gesture against this towering, timeless presence. Always, John Maddock, the enemies of humanity will come in three, for three is the accursed number. They will be wolves in sheep's clothing, professing unity and compassion. But just as you have been, they are the betrayers of the people they swear to protect. Their tongues speak honeyed words, but the sweetness obfuscates the bitter venom beneath. And you must not be swayed. You must remain resolute if humanity is to have its chance at redemption. How will I know them, Lord? pleaded Maddock, eager to please. This is your test, John Maddock, cautioned the darkness. Redemption must be earned, not freely given. I understand, he replied in meek contrition. Forgive me. I will, however, grant you a gift to bind your followers closer still. Maddock realized with growing relief that he would survive this encounter with the dark force of his dreaming. He would awaken. As the enemy are three, so shall we be three. When I release you to your waking world, you will choose two of your followers loyal to you. I will give you a gift that you in turn can grant your two most loyal supporters. You must show your people this gift, even as you accept yours. But it will come at a price to each of you. Nothing in your redemption shall ever come without cost, John Maddock. This is the price for humanity's failure. He listened in mute awe as the darkness revealed its magnanimous gift, fear of the act he was required to perform, shifting to a trembling excitement as he realized the power he would be entrusted with. Awaken, John Maddock, breathed the darkness, its sibilant rasp fading to an echo. And rise. Maddock shivered as he woke, the hiss of the dark, eternal voice still echoing in the shadowed halls of his soul. Was it just a dream? Nothing more than a vivid nightmare? One trembling hand reached to his cheek. Crumbling under the warmth of his fingertips, he touched the icy track of frozen tears against his skin. All eyes stared at Maddock every expression expectant and defier with reverence for the man who stood before them. John Maddock, prophet of the resurrection, was resplendent before them, his blue eyes sparkling like the summer sky. The gleaming pure white of his cotton shirt, buttoned to his neck, was a direct contrast to the black shimmer of his silk waistcoat. Black trousers and boots completed his simple ensemble, but as he stood gazing out at faces that adored him, he seemed a man out of time. He was a preacher of a bygone age, reborn to guide his children through this dark resurrection consuming the world, radiating power and assurance in this time of greatest uncertainty. There were no whispers or muted conversations. All attention was focused entirely on him alone, as they waited in breathless anticipation for him to speak. 
brothers and sisters, he began, then smiled as though catching himself in error. My children, he corrected with a benevolent look of affection. Our day is finally here. Even as I speak, the pillars of humanity crumble under the weight of the rising dead, called from their eternal slumber to judge our species for its vast litany of sins. We are ready, and we will rise. We are ready, and we will rise repeated the crowd with passion, echoing their community's mantra that Maddock had penned at the beginning. He had thought it catchy and laughed at the time, but now he felt the truth of it in his blood. Last night, I was visited in my dreams by the Lord of the Dead, he who wakes the damned and the dark judge of all humanity. He waited for disbelief or outcry, but none was forthcoming. The acceptance of his words warmed him to these people, and he inwardly cursed himself, forever thinking of betraying such good, honest folk who invested all their trust and faith in him. He would never take them for granted again. I have learned of what is to come, of the trials we must face, and I caution you all that it will not be easy. For humanity to retain their existence on this earth, the Lord of the dead must be appeased, and our redemption must be earned and paid for. We are ready, and we will rise, intoned the crowd again. But we are not alone, my children, announced Maddock, passion creeping into his words as his tone rose in pitch. The Lord of the Dead has granted me a gift, and it is a gift I may share with two of you, to aid us in our divine quest to redeem humanity of all its terrible sins. Maddock sighed theatrically, a pained expression of remorse clouding his features. But, as with all redemption, there is often required sacrifice. It causes my heart such pain for me to ask this of you, my beloved and devoted children, who have worked so hard and done so much for us to have our chance at salvation. He gazed out among them, meeting as many eyes as he could. But for this gift to be granted, I must bear this terrible burden and ask one of you for the greatest sacrifice of all. A man in his mid-fifties, thin with a waxen complexion, moved through the crowd with one skeletal arm aloft. Maddox's followers parted, allowing the painfully thin man free passage to stand before his prophet. I will gladly give myself a sacrifice, Revered prophet, said the man in a weak voice, though he did his best to infuse it with all his remaining strength. I am dying anyway, and the cancer eating me from within is slow and painful. I am a burden, revered prophet, but in this I can serve our community. Maddox stepped down from the platform, placing a hand on each of the man's sharp shoulders, his blue eyes boring into the man's yellowing orbs. What is your name, my child? George Watts, revered prophet. Behold, boomed Maddock, behold the noble and courageous brother George, who would give us the gift of his life, and in return, allow us to receive the Lord of the Dead's reward. Brother George, called the crowd in celebration. Brother George will rise. Maddock beckoned to Jacob Tyler, the most senior of his security team. In his early forties, 
Tyler was every inch a soldier, his head shaven clean, with hard features scarred by battle and eyes that had witnessed the myriad of horrors humanity could inflict upon itself. The traumatic memories remained carved into a gaze forever haunted by those ghosts. Your knife, Jacob, commanded Maddock, holding out his hand. Jacob looked horrified for a moment. Prophet, you must not sully yourself, he pleaded. Allow me to. No, Jacob, chided Maddock with a small shake of his head. Redemption must be earned, and for the Lord of the Dead to grant me his gift, then I must bear the weight of this sorrow. This is part of my penance. He gifted the soldier with an assuring smile. I will not be sullied by this, Jacob. I will be reborn. Then use my pistol, Reverend Prophet, begged Jacob. Again, Maddock declined with a gentle shake of the head. It must be thus, Jacob. I must shed blood with my own hand if we are to rise. We are ready and we will rise, chanted the crowd in a single voice. Jacob looked pained as he drew the large blade from his hip, offering it hilt first to Maddock. The prophet gripped the knife, feeling every grain of the leather binding the handle, one hand still on George's shoulder. Kneel, brother he said softly to the dying man. George lowered himself in obvious discomfort to his knees, turning his gaze upwards to Maddock, exposing his throat. I am ready, revered prophet, he declared without fear, and closed his eyes. Stand back, Maddock commanded the crowd. All must bear witness. The crowd bowed into a concave, all clamoring for space so they could watch the unfolding drama, eyes bright in anticipation, though many were equally wide in anxious fear. Taking a deep breath to steady his own nerves and the shake threatening his hold on the blade, Maddock stepped behind George and placed the cold steel against his throat. Not daring to pause in case his courage faltered, Maddock drove the sharp edge into George's flesh, driving deep, parting tissue and muscle, hot blood running over his hand as the sharp tang of blood filled his senses. With the razor-sharp blade deep in George's throat, Maddock dragged the weapon from left to right, severing muscle, tendons, and the life-giving blood vessels of the man's neck. Though inwardly repulsed by the sensation, Maddock retained a neutral expression as he stepped back from his bloody labor. George collapsed, hands involuntarily clawing at his ruined neck, choking and gurgling as his thin blood poured in a torrent to his lungs, drowning him in the very fluid that once sustained him. Cries of shock and alarm rang from the crowd, hands snapping to mouths in horror as they watched the cancer-ridden man die a choking death, eyes flicking from the dying farmer to the blooded hand of their revered leader. George lay still in a mercifully short time, his weakened heart giving out before he could drown in his own blood. An eerie silence fell upon the crowd as they stared at the lifeless form of their fellow brother, lying in a puddle of his own blood, waiting for what came next. It happened no more than twenty seconds from the end of George's thrashing. His corpse twitched violently as the dark charge of the divine sparked within the cancerous husk. Peace, my children, assured Maddock in a boom, as the man's eyes flicked open to reveal Iris's painted white. The demonic force within had awakened. George's lips peeled back with primeval hate, a silent rictus of hunger carving his once gentle features into a dark and primitive predator, the glassy orbs fixing on the crowd as they shrank from the rising horror. Awkwardly, the creature that was once George Watts clambered to its feet. Now was the true test. As the demonic form shambled towards the masses, its wasted arms reaching for flesh just out of its grasp, Maddox's voice cracked like a gunshot through the rising tumult of the crowd. 
Hold. Exhilaration coursed through Maddock as the thing halted mid-reach, arms falling lifeless to its sides, awaiting his next decree. Kneel, he commanded, barely containing the triumph in his voice as the undead fell to its knees, just as it had moments earlier when George offered himself in sacrifice. The sharp, metallic taste of blood filled his mouth, though there was none there. Power. Raw, exultant power of the divine. And it was his. Jacob, he trembled, beckoning the awestruck soldier forward. Prophet, the warrior inquired, eyes wide and shining. For this moment alone, the haunting ghosts of his memory were exorcised by reverence. Put our brother to his final rest. He has earned that much. Without hesitation, Jacob Tyler drew the pistol from his hip and executed the undead George with a single round to the head. The corpse collapsed for a second time, but this time it did not rise. Climbing to the platform so all could remember this moment, Maddock cast out his arms as though he would embrace them all. Crimson drops flicked from the hand still warm with George's blood. My children. The radiance of the divine descended with the silence, every breath held, every eye fixed to him. This is our reward for Brother George's sacrifice, for your devotion and dedication, for your faith. And now, my children, I am no longer your mere prophet, for my words are now our truth, and I have been touched by death itself. From this day forth, I am your first disciple of the resurrection. The crowd exploded in unfettered acclaim, the touch of the divine upon them all. We are ready, and we will rise, they roared as one. Over and over, the crowd thundered the mantra until it eventually devolved into a three-word frenzy. We will rise, we will rise, we will rise. Maddock allowed the joy to smother him, swallowed by its ecstasy. A beatific smile radiating from his lips and his eyes wet with tears of rapture, he finally lowered his head and drank in the divinity of the moment. His hands bunching to fists, John Maddock, first disciple of the resurrection, whispered triumphantly back to the crowd through clenched teeth. We will rise. November 11th, 2010. It's oh so quiet. Well, I'm sitting here at the kitchen island in the lodge, tapping at my keyboard all alone. Nate is already asleep, as is Alicia, and it's just little old me sitting in the quiet. It's so quiet. Everybody has moved to Crenshaw, and we've been back and forth for a few days to settle everyone in. I swear Particles looked at me with the thought of, damn you, betrayer of worlds, when I left him in Charlie and Mark's care. It's like he knew he was being left there, and I was clearing out. I feel like such a turd. Maria has moved into the mini apartment in Hall Fire with Dean. Mark and Charlie have taken one of the three small houses down in the maintenance area, where Mark will be working most of the time. Isaac has moved into one of the single dorms used by older kids in the same building as the rest of them. Nora has planted herself in one of the houses near Mark and Charlie as well, and that makes me happy. Nora thinks the world of them both, and she and Charlie have developed a special bond. I'm glad she'll be close to them, and those two won't be isolated far from everyone else. We moved the tanker over there, the loader truck, the van. They still had the Black Astra and a couple of others. The three of us just kept our beloved pickup, and you would have to drag Nate's cold, dead body from that up-armoured Humvee. Everywhere we go on outings beyond the gate now, We'll do so as a trio, so we've just kept the two vehicles. 
We moved the bulk of the resources over, dug up Nora's vegetable garden, and transported that over as best we could, and we've left ourselves with plenty of supplies. One of the sticking points were the guns and ammo. Nate was adamant about retaining them, no matter Dean's training as a specialist firearms officer. Everyone who carried a sidearm got to keep their Glock, and he was happy to hand over some shotguns and ammo for them, as we've plenty of both. But he flat refused to just hand over the bulk of the stuff we've gathered, like the SMGs, the twenty two rifle, the big three fifty seven revolvers from Tucker and Jamie Bancroft, the L-85 rifles, the AK-47s we got from Bancroft, and all the other stuff. Nate was clear and concise that every single one of those weapons had been fought and killed for by me and him, and he wasn't just going to hand them over. Side note, Nate has told me to stop calling the rifles SA-80, as that's just the family, not the exact model. Apparently, it's an L-85A2, so henceforth, I shall be calling them L-85s. He's such a pedant when it comes to guns. It made for a bit of tension with Dean and Nate, which I didn't enjoy, as I can see both arguments. There are more people at Crenshaw and more that will need weapons training, which Dean can do, but I sort of stand by Nate. We've fought and killed for every one of those weapons and bullets we've acquired. We're the only two out of the lodge that battled the living who were using them to shoot back at us or terrorize innocents. Just handing those over into someone else's care doesn't seem right, even if it is Dean. Plus, Nate and Dean don't know each other that well yet. Nate was happy to let everyone go with their sidearms, the spare magazines they had for them, and an extra box each for refills, plus the shotguns and ammo for them, as I said. If they needed any more, they would talk about that. After all, we had just handed over most of the food and other resources we'd been gathering over the months while we were risking our necks. Handing over all the weapons and ammo was just a bridge too far for Nate, and I can see his point. Still. It's weird sitting here at this moment, Freya. For a while, it was just you, me, Nate, and our lucky pug, and it never felt empty then. Now it does. I've grown used to everyone being here, seeing people in the morning and saying hello, chilling out in the evening with my adoptive little bro, and getting sagely wisdom from Nora. Now it feels like we're some distant military outpost on the edge of the realm, a skeleton crew of forward observers going through the motions. We're going back over to the school tomorrow anyway. We need some of those radios of Dean's, so the three of us can talk freely when we're out and about without the fear of unknown eavesdroppers. Those radios fix to the belt, but have earpieces and fancy throat mics with comms buttons, so we can speak much easier on the move, keep our communications quiet without the radios blaring out, and their transmission is encrypted. If we're going to be out and about looking for evil Jesus and his fruit loops, we need those communications to be stealthy and secure. We also have to decide on a plan that we all agree on. Evil Jesus and the Resurrectionists, sounds like an awesome metal band name, are a problem, that much is clear. Their idea of restoring humanity seems to be via a zealous dictatorship where everyone is a lunatic believing in this individual's power to the point of deification. And that shit is always a problem. November 13th. 2010. We're hunting wabbits. We have a plan, it would appear. I'm happy to report that the tension between Nate and Dean has gone, largely thanks to Dean. As soon as we arrived yesterday, he asked for a quiet word with the two of us and apologized if he seemed pushy, reiterating his gratitude for all that Nate had done to this point, not least of which was looking out for me and Maria. He said he absolutely understood Nate's position, that they had to get to know each other a little better and learn to trust each other as individuals, and not just because they are attached to mutual friends. He wanted a fresh start. Nate visibly relaxed at all that. The two men shook hands, and I breathed a sigh of relief. 
These are the two most important men in my life, and I desperately want them to get on and ultimately be friends. Kudos to Dean for just sorting that out. I can't help thinking Maria had some influence on it as well, as she's probably filled Dean in on Nate's character a lot over the past couple of days. And you can see that Dean now sees more than just the soldier and protector Nate appears. He's trying to get to know the man, and that makes me happy. Dean is such a good dude. Doing that straight out of the gate made all the conversations that came after easier and more relaxed. Everyone put their heads to the task without tension. Well, nearly everyone. Isaac is still harboring some resentment towards me. I can sense it. He's not being overt with Nate around after the incident, but I can see it in the looks I catch here and there. I'd really like to cancel my subscription to his issues, but as long as he stays out of my face with his childish peak, the less chance there is I'll have to deck him. I can't be arsed with any high school drama, even though we're at a high school. There are enough teenagers here to have that covered. What does concern me in this little situation is the way I caught Sarah sneaking sly glances at Isaac. I told you, I'm observant and good at reading people, and I think our newest adult has developed a bit of a crush on the tech guy. He's ten years older than her, and while they're both adults, I swear if he hurts that girl by trying to use her as some kind of emotional revenge tool that he thinks will make me jealous, I will beat the living piss out of him. She might be eighteen, but only just, and technically would still be in her last year of school. The only emotion he will evoke in me, should he choose to travel that road, will be great vengeance and furious anger. The girl's been through enough already. Drama aside, Dean issued the three of us with those radios and charging docks so we could power them up at home. He ran through the operation of them, mainly for the benefit of me and Alicia, and now I feel like a badass with my earpiece and throat mic. So we discussed what to do about our nutters. Their home base can't be too far away, mused Nate. Otherwise, that Humvee wouldn't have been in town. One vehicle of four men seems like a recon mission, as they weren't loading up with supplies or hitting any particular targets. They were just roving, looking for survivors, it would appear. Comes, asked Dean. There's a radio mounted in the Humvee, but it's encrypted and needs a code punching in to operate, so it's useless. As soon as I press the key to take it out of standby mode, the screen lights up waiting for a code. These people are smarter than the Bancrofts and have better equipment. We could dust it, offered Graham, the middle-aged science teacher. All eyes turned to him and he blushed. I have a lot of time for this guy. From the stories told, all the staff just cleared out over the course of the day when they realized how bad the world was getting. Graham Smith, head of science, stood his ground and was the last teacher on site because he refused to leave the last dozen kids alone with no adult presence for guidance. Heroism doesn't always require body armor, guns, and the willingness to run headlong at danger. Sometimes being a hero is just ordinary people doing the right thing, no matter their own fear. Dust it, asked Nate. Graham nodded. Is it a dark keypad or light? Dark, says Nate. In which case, we can take some cornstarch from the home economics room, and we'll need a very light and soft brush, maybe the kind ladies use to apply rouge. Rouge, love this guy, so old school. I've got one, offered JJ. Well, excellent. Have you touched the number pad at all? He asked Nate. No. Once I pressed the standby to click the screen up and saw it asked for a code, I just swore a bit and put it back in the dock. Graham laughed nervously. In which case, we can dust it with the cornstarch and rouge brush, and it will cling to the residual skin oils on the keypad, as long as they didn't wipe it by rote. It won't tell us the code, but it will likely show the numbers used most often. That has to be a better starting point than nothing, eh? Every single one of us stared at the science teacher for a moment, then laughed. 
Graham, that is bloody genius, I said. Yay for science. The man pushed his glasses up his nose, despite them not needing correcting, and laughed nervously yet again. I think for a moment he thought we were all scoffing at his idea, and his relief at having made a genuine contribution was huge. After that, he hardly had a smile off his lips. Being a valuable member of the team will do that for you. I think he might have been feeling like something of a spare part, surrounded by people with weapons training and active combat experience. But never forget about those clever geeks. They'll think of shit you just won't. We got on with that straight away and let Graham do his thing as a few of us leaned on the Humvee while he worked. After he carefully brushed the cornstarch off until only the thinnest of amounts were remaining, there in all their glory were five numbers that had clearly been used more than the others. And by more, I mean the only ones that had been used. Zero, one, two, three, and six. As soon as I looked at it, I could hardly believe my eyes. Nate, how many digits are in the code? I asked. It asks for six, why? I laughed aloud, shaking my head in disbelief as I slid into the Humvee and punched in six digits. And the radio came alive. How the hell could you figure that out first go? exclaimed Nate, looking at me like I was some kind of prodigy. Graham Dean and the few others who had come to watch all gave me the same look. Children of the Resurrection, I shrugged. They're all about this dark resurrection. So what's most important to such a bunch of nutters? Dean was the first to catch on, chuckling as he shook his head. The day of their resurrection. I grinned back at him. They're zealous nutters, not hardcore paramilitary, so they've used the bloody date of the world shitting the bed as their code because of its significance to them. 230610. 23rd day of the 6th month, 2010. Stone cold bell ends. Arrogance, corrected Nate. They probably didn't consider they'd actually get cracked by anyone, or at least anyone who was a threat. But the dogma they spouted at Dean that they're all so proud of also seems to be their weakness. He gave a satisfied smile in my direction and winked. Now we can listen to their comms, so that'll be the first job before planning anything else. Learn as much as we can and maybe, just maybe, get a bead on where this place they call Ascension is. Maybe get eyes on it. Dean nodded. And see if there's any truth to Tucker's claim about their numbers. Aye. Erin Turing, that's me. Code cracker extraordinaire. No communications were coming through, which suggests that here at the school we might be out of range. In a way, that makes me happy, as it suggests they're a decent distance from us. However, it means we might have to drive around some to set markers. Nate is convinced they wouldn't go too far beyond radio range, but we don't know what range they have. They could be using repeaters somewhere to bounce the signal and extend their range, this will take some time and will involve a chunky amount of diesel, as Humvees with their beastly six-litre engines aren't exactly economy vehicles. These beasts drink more than university students in happy hour who've just had their student grant drop into their account. Also, which miserable fucker decided to limit happy to an hour? That's just such a glass-half-empty mentality. Because of the fuel consumption, we'll need to top up some jerry cans to keep with us. We could drag all the radio equipment out of it and remount it. But honestly, if we do accidentally bump into more of these crazies, we'd rather do so in an armoured vehicle. I think the next few days are going to be super boring, Freya. Lots of driving about on back roads to range out and see if we can pick up any comms. They could literally be anywhere in the county, and we're pretty much smack bang in the center, so it's basically shut our eyes and point on the map. Trial and error of panning through dirt until we find gold. It might involve staying overnight in a cleared building or three as well, as we don't really want to burn fuel coming back each time. This could take a while, but until we get a solid lead, there's little else for us to do. We don't want these Fruit Loops stumbling upon us, 
So tomorrow, Nate, Alicia and myself are going to stock up the Humvee with food like MREs, sleeping bags we took from the surplus store, small propane stoves to cook canned shit on, and extra ammo. After getting used to the food Nora masterfully prepares, I'm not looking forward to those little silver packets as they look about as appetizing as a tramp's toenail fungus. Also, this will be a chance to see more of the area around us. We've stayed very localised because it's sensible, but I'm intrigued and nervous to see what kind of state the rest of our fair county is like further out. There are areas more rural than where we are, so I'm genuinely hoping we might stumble across some other survivor communities. That would be amazing. Even better if they don't shoot at us. We're going on a loony hunt, so it might be a while before I write again. I'm not taking this laptop with me, as it would be too distracting. It's game face time. Apocalypse road trip. Shh. Be very, very quiet. We're hunting quazes. November 17th, 2010. No luck. We've come back to the lodge after three days out and about, and still haven't heard anything on the comms as yet from the Looney Asylum. We've circled out north and west so far, towards the county's largest population centres of Warrington, Runcorn and Chester, all on back roads. The closer you get to either, the more difficult the roads become. Rush hour traffic going in and out totally boned all the entry roads, it seems, even on some smaller roads we took. People obviously had the idea of trying alternate routes when they saw a traffic jam, and all they succeeded in doing was fucking up those roads as well. If these lunatics were so prepared and sensible about it, they have to be east or south after what we saw these past few days. It just doesn't make any sense that they'd set up their end-of-the-world community close to the largest populations. They have to be out in the more rural areas, but we needed to rule this area out at least. We stayed out for three days and two nights, returning to the lodge tonight for some rest in warmth and comfort. Nights are getting cold now, and sleeping in the Humvee, even in Arctic quality sleeping bags, is not comfortable. We tried one night in an isolated house we cleared as well. Man, am I glad we have power and heating. I fear for those who might have made it this far with winter creeping ever closer. I have a feeling that December and January are going to be so cold that it might freeze the piss in your bladder if you're stuck out there somewhere. We're having one night here to rest and resupply. Then we'll go and check in at the school tomorrow on our way out and make sure everything's peachy. We did see signs of other survivors, usually marked by piles of garbage and human waste dumped outside houses that suggested people had been hanging on. When we checked those abodes, however, we found them empty or inhabited by the undead versions of those survivors. It scares me how many people have died so far, even out here in the sticks. Once more, I'm truly thankful I wasn't stuck in a big city when everything collapsed. If it's this bad so far away from the cities, imagine what it's like in them. The thought of the undead numbers in the likes of Chester, Warrington, Liverpool and Manchester makes my butthole snap tighter than a bull's when the flies are out. All of these places are only between 20 and 30 miles from us, and if I think too long about the undead infestation somehow being drawn to us here en masse, well, I don't think I'll ever sleep again, quite frankly. Don't be bound by those things you can't change, eh, Nora? Brief rest, sleep in comfort for tonight, then tomorrow we resupply from here, pop over to Crenshaw to check on the family, then we're back out. I don't know why, but I've got this really ominous feeling. When we do eventually find them, and we will, of that I'm sure. I have this knot in my guts that we won't like what we find. I'm going to luxuriate in a warm, soft bed. I'm absolutely shattered and just need a good night's sleep, I think. Nighty night. November 20th, 2010. Contact. We haven't found the resurrectionist home base, 
but we did find evidence of their idea of humanity's restoration and a solid lead. Join us or die seems to be their method of recruitment. We pushed east to southeast, heading over towards Holmes Chapel, Macclesfield and Congleton. Out east you'll get the big money areas of Alderley Edge, Wilmslow and Prestbury, often dubbed the Golden Triangle of Cheshire. There are, or were, billions in that area, and property values were in the clouds. Not that those mansions and wealth are doing them any good now. Zombie apocalypse, the universe's method of dealing with the 1%. Bet capitalism never saw this shit coming, huh? There are vast rural areas in East Cheshire as you head towards the Peak District National Park. We know it's a long shot trying to find this group because this is a big county with loads of little villages and towns clustered all over the place, separated by vast stretches of greenery. The three of us chugging along in a Humvee hoping to hear the radio crackle to life was always going to be a Hail Mary, but with no other point of reference to start from, it's all we could do. It's doubtful we'll have to go too far, because it wouldn't make sense for one Humvee to range massively beyond their radio range on a scouting patrol. Why come to one of our two towns when there are others dotted around the place they could go to? It suggests that we're within a reasonable distance from wherever they're situated. Yesterday, though, we found the signs we were hoping for. Actually, that's completely fucked up. We found signs we were looking for. But shit, we certainly weren't hoping for this. We'd done a trundle northeast, then curved south when we had no luck, and we stumbled across a beautiful, spacious little village. I forgot to look at the sign, so I can't remember its name. But this was a place you needed fat loot in your bank account to live. Small clusters of drop-dead gorgeous houses, big open spaces, and further along in the village was a picturesque parish church that looked like it had been constructed in the Dark Ages. It could probably only handle maybe 40 people max, but the area around it was breathtaking. Being an urban girl, I really should have paid more attention to the glorious countryside round here before the world died. There's so much to see, and it's a pity now I'm only seeing it when it's dead. Anyway, just before this church, I think it was called St. Peter's, there was a small road opposite the ancient building that drew our attention because we spied the vestiges of black smoke in the distance. It wasn't thick, but it was a blue sky day, and the thinning plumes were spotted by Alicia, who was looking left while I was trying to peer past Nate on the right and look at the quaint little church. Once she pointed it out, Nate drew back and we swung down that road, which was about a hundred yards, ending at a big gate. Well, what used to be a big gate. The metal grating looked like it was smashed open with force, as it was twisted and hanging from its brackets. We arrived at a massacre. The smoke that caught Alicia's eye was the last vestiges of a vehicle fire that had exploded either by design or accident when the bullets were flying. It was a gated community of five stunning detached houses, each of them at least five or six bedrooms, huge space between each, all with big driveways and triple garages. The kind of house that someone like me only finds on the internet or sees on TV. Beautiful. Or used to be, anyway. This little community must have been surviving okay. Out back, everyone had vegetable gardens, greenhouses growing plants, and they must have been sharing resources between them. We found evidence that a couple of them owned firearms as well, probably for hunting or shooting clubs. In the living room of a couple of houses, behind shattered windows, we found shotgun cartridges in one, and in the other some 22 casings. Next to those discharged ammo casings, we found dead people. Not undead, but properly dead. All had multiple bullet wounds, so it looks like they were killed in a gunfight, then put down for a second time with a headshot. Humvee trucks, said Nate, after we'd cleared the area to make sure there were no bad guys around. Judging by the space between the wheels and the tread, I can see. It's virtually identical to our vehicle. Looks like they just drove through the gate and ripped it off. There are other vehicle tracks as well, maybe a pickup or two. So what? They just assaulted? 
Nate shook his head. The bodies in the houses were ready for them, behind cover. There's some blood over here, so I think they must have winged one or two of them. None of the dead seemed to be like the four assholes we found. They just looked like normal folk. I think the attackers came to talk first, and when they didn't get the answer they wanted, they came back with reinforcements, blasted through the gates, and massacred everyone here. Check out Sherlock Carter over there. He's probably right. There were 11 bodies in total. But here's the kicker. Three of them were kids, not even in their teens. The youngest victim was about eight or nine. I am sick to my hind teeth of finding dead kids. The sight of each one takes away another little piece of my soul, but the living purposefully attacking and killing them? No, just fucking no. That is not on. It's bad enough that starvation, dehydration, disease, the drop in climate conditions, and the goddamn undead are killing our children. For the living to be doing it on top of all that, I'm not having that shit on my watch. I really want to dick punch these fuckers, I declared with feeling. Amen, sister, muttered Alicia. How long ago do you think, sir? Sir, honestly, I have to stop myself from laughing out loud and taking the piss when she says it. We're not there yet with Alicia in terms of snappy piss-taking banter, and she's taking this soldier shit really seriously. But I think if I start ripping on her for that, it'll be a step back in her progress. Instead, I have to settle for sighing quietly to myself and rolling my eyes where she can't see. Yeah, how long, sir? I know, I know what I just said. Look, I'm not fucking perfect, but it's like a physical compulsion. If I don't release it in some way, it's like physical pain for me. Just know that I said it in a really serious way, so she didn't cotton on I was piss-taking. I did it on the sly, rather than pointing and laughing at her and making childish. Oh, please, sir, can I have some more, sir? How long ago do you think, sir? Statements in a high-pitched mocking voice while dramatically fluttering my eyelids. I'm such a bad person. Alicia was so focused on waiting for Nate's answer, she didn't realize my childish amusement. But Nate did. He answered immediately to help disguise my sarcasm, but not before he shot me a warning glance that said, Pack it in, you bellend. I packed it in. Probably late this morning, he said. It was a little after 2 p.m. by this time. That vehicle's mostly just smoldering now. They don't fuck about, do they? I observed. A few civilians with a couple of guns between them, and they come blasting in here with three vehicles and probably ten guns. Talk about overkill, I added, sifting my foot through the pile of 9 millimeter and 556 brass lying about. This time they came with automatic rifles. Why kill them, though? They were going to take Dean and Sarah off to the sanctuary before we intervened. Why just kill a bunch of civilians? Maybe they insulted their first disciple or beliefs, I shrugged. You can't reason with that kind of zealous crazy. You've only got to say one thing that they decide is offensive to their glorious leader, and bang, bang, you're a heretic of their crazy religion and must be purged. One man is delusional, and they call it insanity, muttered Nate. Yet when the delusional are many, they call it religion. Detective and philosopher. Nate's peeling back all the layers today. It's a bit out of the way, don't you think? I mused. You know, to just come here. If you're right in what you say and they came first, talked, then went off to get reinforcements to assault, then they can't be that far away. Nate raised an eyebrow at that. You might be onto something. And then, as if solely to validate my statement, we heard the radio crackle into life in the Humvee for the first time. Like we'd had rockets shoved up our butts, we all shared an excited, holy shit, glance with each other, then all cheesed it to the Humvee and leaped in, crowding close to the radio to hear what was said. It wasn't overly exciting at first, just a standard call out from a patrol saying they were returning and were about five minutes out. But then they said something really odd. 
We'll need one of the triumvirate to open the dead gate before we arrive. The triumvirate? As in three leaders? Do they have three disciples, and it's just the first that gets the glory? And what the hell is the dead gate? I capitalised that, as it sounded special. A voice came back with confirmation, and that someone called Tyler would see the dead were parted. Freya, I do not like the sound of that shit at all. These people give me the ass clamps. Though we do have one name now, Tyler seems to be one of the ominously named Triumvirate, but I've no idea if that's a first or last name. Well, I'd say we're getting closer, said Nate. This area feels a bit too hot for the moment, though. Let's head back home and regroup. Now we know what area we're working in, we can plan a bit more. I have no fucking clue where we are, I admitted. Nate sighed, started up the Humvee and drove us back here. He still didn't tell me where we were. I think he did it just to teach me a lesson as punishment for my sly sarcasm on the whole sir thing. Well, it's taken the best part of a week of crawling around, sleeping rough, and seeing yet more dead children, but we're edging closer to them. I'd call it a win, but I'm thoroughly sick of seeing more humans that could have allied with us get killed for fuck all by a bunch of selfish asshole pricks. These resurrectionists need an atomic wedgie filled with razor blades, then salt poured into those butt-slicing underpants. Colourful? Yes. But I really don't like them. November 23rd, 2010. Ascension. We found them. Turns out this place they call Ascension was only about three miles from the gated community they butchered. And it's massive. By massive, I mean it's like a proper settlement. The central part of it is basically a small village of about 30 custom-built houses, all constructed around what looks like a renovated late 19th century mansion. But there are other buildings that look like prefab residential homes all over the place in little clusters. They have working farms all around it, with cattle, sheep, chickens, pigs, tilled fields that I imagine were full of crops before they were harvested, fruit orchards for things like apples, plums, peaches and pears, silos for storing milled grain, and even a working windmill to grind those crops. They have a security force that must reach into a hundred, as we saw armed guards everywhere around their main centre, patrolling the walls. Yes, they have walls that have actual bloody ramparts and towers dotted along it, and even a guard or two at each of the farms we could see. The whole settlement must cover miles if you count the size of the fields on the outlying farmsteads. The centre, though, is like a fortress, with that community protected by more custom walls, which we could tell were custom as the brick was very new and matched the newly fabricated homes. They had properly laid asphalt roads within the compound, an industrial area for cutting and treating lumber, a machine shop with lathes and mills for working metal, and, we're pretty sure, they have a building which looks like a small hospital or infirmary. Basically, it's a perfect place to restart humanity in a post-apocalyptic world, apart from one minor detail. We found out what the dead gate and parting the dead meant. Freya, outside their front gate is an immobile wall of docile undead, around 300 in number, just standing there, facing outwards, and not pushing against the big wood and iron gate. No aimless shamble, just a legion of inert undead sentries with vacant eyes facing out at anyone who might approach the gate, which sits at the end of a road about 400 yards in length. We don't even know how to process this. I'm reminded of the wall of undead across the town centre carriageway that seemed to be waiting for yours truly. It's that same kind of dense mass, just waiting for something to happen. There's so much activity within the walls of the compound, the undead should all be pressed against that massively thick gate, mindlessly pushing against it, desperate for the living flesh inside. 
We watched from a hillside overlooking a chunk of the compound, a good quarter mile away from their outer wall, in a little copse of trees, the three of us looking through scopes or binoculars, trying to take in the sheer scale of the settlement. All three of us swore aloud when we witnessed the parting of the dead, as a convoy of two SUVs and a commercial box truck stopped before the undead sentries. The massive gate opened, and a man stepped through, appearing to issue a verbal command. And then, the undead blocking the road, parted. Like some fucking evil Moses parting the undead sea, the security guy's command was obeyed, and they split to either side of the road, letting the vehicles drive by them and into the compound. Once they were in, the man shouted a command again, and they closed together once more. What in all hell's name is going on? breathed Nate. Evil Jesus seems to have an evil Moses on his security detail, I said aloud. Um, yeah, I haven't told Nate and Delisha about my evil Jesus name I used for their first disciple in my journal, so they both gave me one of those looks. So, I started, clearing my throat, Captain Evil has an evil Jesus, who seems to have his own evil Moses who can part the undead sea. Captain Evil, they queried together. This force driving the undead, I had to give it a name. I can't keep using different words, so I gave the shithead a name. Anyway, this first disciple of theirs is evil Jesus, obviously, and we've just witnessed evil Moses do his thing. I turned thoughtful for a moment, one finger on my lips. You know, we could do with finding an evil Judas. Erin, chided Nate, stopping me going off on a ramble. Look, this is undeniable proof. Proof of what? asked Alicia. I've always said from the off that this wasn't natural. The undead are hateful and not as mindless as they seem. They're pretty vacant until they get up close, but that look when they do has purpose, and that purpose is killing. They stop biting and eating as soon as their victim is dead, so they're not feeding, just killing. Also, have you noticed that no matter how long they might have been a zombie, they don't rot? It's like they're trapped in a frozen bubble of time from the moment they die, and they only start to decompose again once you pop their melon. We had all the weirdness downtown, and at the builder's yard, and now this. End of the world cultists who can use the undead as sentries. I threw up my hands. This isn't just an apocalyptic event we're stuck in. There is something more going on, something bigger than we can get our heads round, and there is a player moving pieces on a board we can't see, playing a game we don't know the rules to. That's a big stretch, said Nate. It's weird as hell, I grant you. But you're talking about us being moved around a board like the old Greek gods are playing with our lives. Call it God, call it the devil, call it what you want. I put on my serious face, as I do actually possess one of those. I choose to call it Captain Evil, because, well, everything it's done is basically evil. We're being wiped out, Except for this particular bunch of bellends, who seem to be given a pass. Why? By your logic, that does make them the chosen of humanity then, as that Tucker guy claimed to Dean. Nate still wasn't convinced by my argument. He's a practical guy, and here I was, sitting on a hillside, talking about cosmic forces fucking with us. Even with all the lucky-hating zombies he'd seen when that weirdness started, and the obvious influence of something on those zombies guarding Ascension's gate, I still think he's struggling with the concept of this being, I don't know, celestial or divine in some way. No, it doesn't, Nate, I said with a firm shake of my head. The chosen of humanity are killing innocent civilians and kids, like at that little gated community near the church. I'm not having it. Nuh-uh. I have to hope that if Captain Evil is one player on the board, then there's also one batting for our team. If there isn't, then it means it's just up to us. Hardly sounds fair, commented Alicia. Life is neither fair nor unfair, I said. At best, it's impartial. We make of it what we will.
Nate raised his eyebrow. Which book have you quoted that from? I snorted ruefully. Busted again. David Gemmell's Lion of Macedon, I admitted. Doesn't make it any less true, though. One day, I'm going to hit you with a true lucky mic drop of philosophical wisdom, and boom. I mimicked an explosion around my head. I'll blow your tiny minds. Stay on target, chided Nate. My mouth dropped open. Was that a Star Wars reference, Nate? You said you'd never seen it. Erin? His voice was flat and cautioning. I sighed. Look, I know you'll both think I'm crazy, but you haven't had the undead get a rotting hard on for you like they have for me. I've been thinking about this shit a lot because I've had no choice but to face it. You lot might be able to shrug and say, yeah, that is a bit weird, and then move on with your day. But I can't. Something else is going on, and that down there is just the final piece of proof I needed. That down there is visible control over the undead. That's no virus or side effect of a chemical weapon or parasite. There is a force behind the undead, and it's dark. They both stared at me in silence for some time, my eyes jumping between them. Alicia looked unconvinced, but, like teacher's pet, her eyes drifted to Nate and waited for his reaction. She'd just agree with whatever he said. I felt like climbing over the asylum wall to steal into the apple orchards, just so I could grab one for her to give Nate. Hmm, I'm starting to sound a little jealous, because she's now a star pupil too, and defers to him so much. I really should wind it back a bit. Still doesn't change that she's a kiss-ass, though. I see where you're coming from, he said eventually, though his tone suggested he wasn't convinced. We'll have to have a think on this. What are we going to do about this bunch of cockroaches then? They're just going to keep pillaging the area. Nate sighed. I know you want to do something, Erin, but this isn't the Bancrofts. This isn't a small-time operation where most of their combative force were just dumb thugs. Down there are real veterans, most likely, or people with more of an affectation for weapons. They're also organized with those numbers, and I could see on one of the fields they were putting trainees through physical paces. This is an entirely different prospect, almost paramilitary in its organization. We need to listen and learn. Fuck that, Nate, I said. Alicia nearly fainted with my insubordination, as she probably saw it. We could sit here for days or weeks on end and learn absolutely nothing by radio traffic alone. They seem to keep it to a minimum. I need to learn names, ranks, structure, and watch how much they come in and out to see if there's any regularity or patterns we can anticipate. We have no knowledge at all to work with, and we can't just blindly take on a force of this size. That's just stupid. Truthfully, we might never clash with these people again. We're far enough away. I shook my head again. No way, Nate, no way. We can't just do nothing and allow them to range out and kill innocents. We're not the guardians of this world, Erin. We're not responsible for every life. Nate gave me a look that pleaded with me to be reasonable. We can't save everyone, he added in a conciliatory tone. Sometimes it's just not possible, no matter how much we want to. I know, I'm not thick. I looked the old marine dead in the eye. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't fucking try. Again, he was quiet for a time. Alicia just bounced her head between us as we batted this back and forth. She'd just follow Nate's lead no matter what, but I won't. If I think he's wrong, I'll bloody well tell him. Personally, I think it's what makes us a good team. I'm impulsive, emotive, and idealistic. I'm not dumb. I realize I have these flaws, and they can lead me astray into making some bad decisions. Too often I'm driven around by my heart, while my head is stoned in the passenger seat, grinning like an idiot, tongue lolling out the window, shouting, Road trip! Woo! 
I've always worked on the premise that as long as I survive and I'm only putting myself at risk, bad decisions make the best stories. Nate is a thinker, practical, considered, logical and rational. I tell him what I want to do and he usually comes up with a way to do it that doesn't get us killed. I think it's a great partnership. Head and heart, order and chaos, yin and yang. This time, though, he stood his ground and played the veto card. Recon, Erin, he said in a tone that brooked no further debate. I'm going to come out here over the next couple of weeks, watch the settlement and listen to the radio. I'm not getting involved in this fight until I know how to fight them. I huffed. You can't listen to the radio in the Humvee and watch from this hill at the same time. I'll come stay out here as well, declared Alicia. I'll listen to the radio in the Humvee in a safe location and take detailed notes while Nate has eyes on them. And I can talk to Nate on our radios and relay the comms on our secure channel. It's terrible to say it, but I felt like punching her in the nose at that moment. It was two on one, and I wasn't winning this. Nate's expression said his heels were firmly dug in, and I'd be the unstoppable force striking against his immovable wall if I pushed any further. It would just devolve into arguments and finger-pointing. So this time, I gave Alicia a visible eye-roll that said, of course you fucking will suck up, and let it drop. I was in a bad mood, Freya. I feel bad about it now, but at the time, I was pissed. No excuses, except that I have huge personality flaws that make me who I am, and I can't change them, as I'd lose the core of what makes me, me. As long as I'm not an extreme asshole, I'm okay with it. I'm not one for hiding how I feel, for good or ill. Honesty is my jam. I'll stay at the school a while then, I grumbled. However many days it is since we've been out searching, I imagine there hasn't been much in the way of runs beyond their gate. So while back up Dean in house clearing and resource gathering, you two can have your little cult watching vacation. I'm not built for sitting around scratching my ass crack. I was pissed, okay? I can be a bell end when I'm angry or frustrated. Nate just raised an eyebrow and the conversation was over. So here we are, back at the lodge, and tomorrow Nate and Alicia are going out on a long watch for a week or so. I'm going to take my laptop over to the school and hang out there for the week. I'll reacquaint myself with Dean properly, maybe back him up on some missions to collect fun stuff. I'm a bit pissed, not just at the inaction, but also Nate's unwillingness to buy into my theory of Captain Evil's existence and general fuckery with this ongoing bullshit. Yes, Nate is super logical and rational, and nothing I say is either of those. But then a zombie fucking apocalypse isn't exactly logical or reasonable, is it? I'd say it was a good reason for taking a step back and evaluating your standards of what's considered rational. Never mind the fact that the undead are obeying evil Moses. Gah, I'm frustrated. These people are bad news, I just know it. We've seen evidence of their shitty nature in that massacred community, and when they tried to cart Dean and the kids off to their weird settlement. They are not good people, and they'll continue to be wankers if nobody stands up to their bullying ways. I'll leave it with Nate and his little shadow. Maybe him staring at that undead sentry wall doing the bidding of evil Moses over and over again will change his thinking while we're apart. I'm going to devote my energy into something constructive and work with Dean on gathering resources. Tonight, Freya, I am in a royally shitty mood. I wish my little homeboy particles were here, though he probably still hasn't forgiven me for the hot dog costume and abandoning him at the school. It's healthy when Nate and I disagree, as we both need to have our say. But this is the first real time I've felt like he's sided against me, and Alicia being his little cheerleader got under my skin way more than I should let it. I'll get over it. I'm only human, though, and I feel a bit down about the whole conversation, especially after recounting it here. So I think I'll sign off. Tomorrow I'll go over to the school and hang there for a week or so, and try and find my mojo again.
I'd really like a game of Mario Kart with Charlie right about now, as that always leveled me out. Kids have a way of giving your perspective a shot in the arm. Before I somehow manage to make you miserable, wherever you may be, with the little dark cloud following me round, I'll say my goodnight and switch the lights out on this thoroughly shitty day. Love ya. November 25th, 2010. Progress. Last couple of days have been pretty cool, actually. Reconnecting with Dean has been awesome, as he's just so good at staying calm and a great communicator. I could easily see him talking someone down off a ledge. He's got such a calm aura about him, similar to Nate, but with distinct differences. I love Nate to bits, and the calm he projects is absolute competence and surety. If you don't know him well, he can appear a little cold and distant, like he's all business all the time. He's the kind of guy you want around when shit is getting crazy, and he'll be this little harbour of calm in a storm, shielding you from the howling winds and crashing waves. Dean's calm is different. His aura is one of warmth and understanding, like you know you can go to him with whatever's troubling you, and he'll settle your nerves, won't pass judgment, and he'll just listen and help you take some weight you've been carrying. Without Nate nearby, Isaac seems to have reverted to being a dick again now that I'm around. Luckily, with the campus being larger and easier for us to space out during the day, I've mostly avoided him. I've been crashing with Nora in her little house down by the maintenance area, spending time with Mark, Charlie, and my little pug dude, who appears to have grudgingly forgiven me for my crimes. He allowed me to pet him, but he looked at me a few times with an expression that said, I have forgiven you, but not forgotten, and if you do that to me again, you're fucking dead to me, human. Funny what kind of signals you can get from a dog, just through the way they regard you. Pugs are so expressive. They've all been pretty busy on campus while we've been out, just getting the place sorted and settled into some kind of rhythm. Nora wants a tractor, because of course she knows how to use a bloody tractor, so she can till up some of the greenery around here and get a proper harvest on the go. The vegetable garden we potted up and transported over here from the lodge is great as a starter, but she really wants to get a bigger setup on the go. Dean remembers seeing one on a farm not too far from here, so we're rolling out to get that very shortly after lunch. Nice easy start to going back out beyond the gate. Yep, that phrase still works here. I told everyone about what we'd found while searching for the resurrectionist settlement, and when Mark heard about the Humvee plowing through the gate at that small cluster of housing, he decided the wrought iron gate wasn't strong enough at the campus entrance. His project at the moment is going over designs for new gates. He also wants to set up some kind of mechanism he's been drawing out that can use deployed police stingers, so if anyone did charge at it, they'd get their tires flattened. Some kind of spring action cleverness for quick release, and winches or windlasses, or whatever they're called, that can be turned to reset the mechanism. It does mean we need to find some of those stingers, so we'll keep our eyes out for any police vehicles on our journeys out. There's lots of little and large projects in that manner on the go, and I won't list them all because honestly, I get bored writing about them. I don't know the ins and outs of them all, or how even a tenth of all this shit works. We have labour, as the kids can help as they're all older, and it's a chance for them to learn valuable skills along the way. Basically, everyone's been busy. Maria has converted the school nurse's office as her little infirmary, and has all the medicines firmly under lock and key. Mark's constantly on the go doing something. Nora is forever busying herself with food things, and there's a nice little stores set up to organise all the resources being brought in. Zane, the eldest of the boys who is just a month from being 18, is a bit of a spreadsheet whiz, and has built some kind of inventory control system using something called macros. Meh. When people start talking about stuff like that, I go all Jack O'Neill when one of his Stargate scientists starts talking. Their mouths are moving, but all I hear in my head is... Blah, 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 I'm hungry, 
blah. Well, we're going to have lunch, then go and get Nora's tractor and something called a rotary tiller that needs to be used with it so she can make clod-free seed beds. Every day's a school day. And here, that is literally true. November 28th, 2010. Nomads. I'm excited, Freya. Today we found some new friends, but also in the process discovered there are some other asshole survivors as well. Nowhere near the problem of the loopy death cult out east, or even the danger of Bancroft's armed thugs. But they're definitely a threat to any other local survivors out there, and to us if we don't stay on point when out beyond the gate. After we'd sorted Nora's tractor and tiller the other day and brought it back to campus, Dean and I decided we needed to start collecting more foodstuffs and supplies. So, we had a powwow with everyone and decided four of us would head on out with two experienced guns and two novices in the team. I find it hilarious that I'm considered experienced and a shining example of good sense, as that's never happened to me in my life before. Still, Dean and I were the two leads, and the two coming out for more experience would be Sarah and... Bloody Isaac. If we were working in pairs, then Dean should oversee Isaac, and I'd look after Sarah. I had to tell him why, and he sighed, shook his head at me, then agreed. Also, Dean said it might be nice for Sarah and I getting to know each other a bit better. We're both super important to Dean and Maria, so if we could be friends, that would make them happy. Perfect excuse for the pairings. Dean gets to assess Isaac because he's already trained Sarah, and Sarah gets a female role model in the field. Me, a role model. I'm still laughing as I write this. What a world we live in. We went out in two vehicles. I took my trusty pickup and had Sarah riding shotgun so we could chat a bit while Isaac and Dean were in the van. I like Sarah. She's witty, really smart, like really smart, and I discovered a fun fact about her that I'm going to want to see in action. Turns out her mum was something of a piano prodigy, and Sarah's been playing the piano since she was five years old. Music is a passion of hers, and she was planning on applying to fancy music colleges after finishing school this year, with ambitions to be a concert pianist. It had always been a dream of a mum, Andrea, and she'd never pushed Sarah into it, but she just loves playing the piano. What's that old saying? If you find a job you love, you'll never work a day in your life, or something like that. There's a big grand piano in the school music department. As such, I've made her pinky swear, the most solemn and binding of all oaths, to play me one of her favourite pieces when we get some downtime in the next couple of days. That drive was nice. I like her. She looks a little awkward because she's all skin and bone and has that naive, innocent look about her with her auburn hair and freckled face. But the girl is strong, independent and tough. Girl power for the win. Seriously. If Isaac messes with the little crush she seems to have developed on him, I will staple his scrotum to my pickup and drag him round campus by his balls. Colourful, I know, but in a short time together, I feel like I've really bonded with her. She possesses a natural affinity for sarcasm, and she's got the smarts to do it well. I am officially adopting her as my new sidekick. Oh my God. She plays piano. A piano has keys. Lock and keys. We have a full female action movie duo ready and waiting to be signed up for the new summer blockbuster. First order of business was heading back to the lodge. I forgot to mention that Nate agreed to the moving of the security system equipment to campus. It has more value here than our little isolated outpost of three people. If they can have a camera at the end of the road that leads to the gate, cameras at the gate, and strategic places around campus, that's a no-brainer. So, before we went house clearing, we headed back to the lodge and spent about three hours there disconnecting, unmounting, and boxing up all the equipment Isaac needed. It was a much quicker and easier task to disassemble than it was to install, which was a bonus. 
If he can set that system up over on campus, that gives him a good project to be ongoing with here. Also, while Isaac's doing that, it means he isn't coming on missions with me while I'm here. So I don't have to put up with discovering eyes on me every bloody time I turn around. I'm always thinking, contrary to popular opinion, I'm not as dumb as Nate looks. Seriously, if Nate ever reads this journal, I'll be in so much trouble with him. It was a little before noon when we'd finished that job, as we'd left at 7 a.m. Days are a lot shorter, so we have to head out at the first creeping sign of light if we want to get a full day's work done before returning home. We all filled our bellies at the lodge from some of the canned goods there, and ate a quick lunch. Then, we decided to start clearing out another cluster of mid-range houses a little further down from where that little girl under the stairs was. I shivered as I wrote that. It still upsets me thinking about it, so I'll quickly exit stage left from that one. Sarah and I were out front in the pickup as we turned into the circle of eight houses, with Isaac and Dean behind in the van. Both vehicles stopped as we saw a group of about 20 people in the small circle, all their eyes fixed on one house. They were dressed in puffer coats and other jackets for warmth, all with hoods up over baseball caps and beanies. To a man, they carried a selection of savage-looking weapons in their hands. Machetes, heavy one-handed hammers used in construction. I think they're called club hammers or lump hammers, real skull-cracking beasts. Hatchets, those curved ice axes that climbers use that look more like a small pickaxe. Fire axes, and a whole host of other vicious-looking weapons. In fairness, every one of them was useful for braining zombies, which is probably why they had them. They hadn't bothered with things like baseball bats or that kind of stuff. This selection of weaponry had clearly been accrued over time with the purpose of killing the undead efficiently with single head blows. Most worrying was that the two apparent leaders carried basic firearms in hand. One guy carried a Mossberg pump but it was a UK legal one that could only hold three shells, so had probably been found in someone's house that was part of a clay pigeon shooting club or something. The second guy had a small snub nose revolver, a little Saturday night special piece of junk that definitely wasn't legal. There are people in that house, said Sarah, pointing up to the top front window. Sure as shit we could see movement, with people at the window's side peering out fearfully. Dean, there are people in that house, I said into my radio. Copy. I think we know who the aggressors are. You're damn tootin' we did. The mob of armed men turned towards us as we entered the cul-de-sac. The two with guns stepped to the fore, their obvious intention to intimidate. They could all see by now that the two in the lead vehicle were young women, and they were all male, aged between late teens and late twenties. A few of them shared nods and excited smiles. Time to show them their numbers don't mean shit, I said. Ready? Sarah nodded. She was scared, as she should be, but she drew the glock and we both opened our doors, buzzed down the windows and stood behind the doors as shields. There was a mutter of surprise as Sarah pointed her glock out from cover and I rested the barrel of my L85 against the rim of my window. Dean and Isaac followed suit. Isaac got out with his Glock up and moved a little wider of the van, and Dean moved forward with his G36C up and pointed right at them. Their little snub nose and three-shot 12-gauge suddenly seemed inadequate in the face of two semi-automatic handguns and two rifles. Seeing this sudden standoff and the chance of salvation, the top window of the house opened and a woman in her early thirties shouted out to us. Please help us, she hollered. We've got a ten-year-old boy in here. Well, that sorted out exactly which side of the fence we were sitting. I let Dean open the conversation, as I tend to antagonize things. It's time you gentlemen went on your way, I'd say. The group looked towards the one holding the shotgun for a response. I should point out that this guy was not a looker. He was fucking ugly, like old man toenail ugly, as if the content of his mean-spirited character had shaped his features. This ain't none of your business, 
Fugley stated with bravado. Despite the current state of affairs, I think it is, replied Dean. I'm a police sergeant, you see, and I took an oath to protect the innocent. It doesn't matter that the wages have dried up and I don't have anyone to answer to. It's who I am. It's a fucking pig, shouted one moron from the back. Well, duh, he's just said he's a police officer. Spot on observation there, Einstein. Don't have to take no orders from no pigs no more, sneered the leader. I almost shot him for crimes against the English language right there and then. However, Dean dropped the fucking mic on him. And I am no longer bound by the laws of this land to use non-lethal force against brainless thugs. So I guess it's a good day for us both. That slapped the cocky smugness clean off Fugly's face. Me being who I am, I just straight up laughed at Dean's comeback. It was an absolute peach, and such wit should be recognized. He continued to talk while Fugly was still oiling the gears of his tiny brain. I'll give you a moment to gather your wits, as I appreciate it might take a little longer than most. But then I expect you and your merry men to clear out before this sheriff starts shooting. There are two automatic rifles and two semi-automatic handguns pointing your way. And if I give my people the word, we'll have every one of you down with a bullet in your guts before you can think of that witty comeback you're working on. There was a quiet moment of tension as the ugly bastard considered Dean's casual threat. We'll see you again, pig, declared Fugly, lowering the shotgun. The nomad's got you marked. Then he looked at me and put one hand on his crotch, sneering a filthy leer my way. Me and my boy will see you too, honey. He gave his crotch a faint thrust my way while still touching himself to illustrate his intentions. I just laughed. Have worn heels bigger than your dick, my little chipolata, and squeezed out wet post-curry turds prettier than you. So, unless you want me to give you a 556 makeover on that bag of smashed arseholes you call a face, do as the nice officer says, and fuck the fuck off, eh? Even some of Fugly's minions had trouble stifling a laugh at that. Sarah was almost in fits, shoulders shaking and snorting like a piglet as she tried to suppress her laughter. Eloquent. I couldn't see Dean's face as he was behind me, but I could hear the smile as he said it. Fugly's butt crack smile was slapped off his scabby lips, and his features clouded over with barely contained violence. His face twisted with as much hate as the undead do just before they lunge. Freya, this guy is not a good dude. I feel like not shooting him there and then might just cause pain for some other poor survivor down the road, and that worries me. However, putting him down then with his gun pointing down and his crew edging to leave without eating a bullet would have been cold-blooded murder. I can't go down that dark path, because there's no coming back from it, and probably the kind of fuckery that contributed to the dead sitting back up to judge us all. I don't have room for hate in my heart, so I have to be better than that. I do have a little space in my heart for some go fuck yourself, though. Gun still lowered in his right hand, Fugly raised his left in a finger gun and mimicked shooting me, like I was going to be intimidated. Nomad's got you all marked, bitches. Then he put his arm in the air and spun it in a circle. We're out. We kept all our guns trained on them as they moved past us in a line on foot, waiting a good five minutes after they'd disappeared before relaxing even a tiny bit. Sarah, Isaac, stay here and stay ready. Keep your eyes out for any sign. The two nodded. Erin, you're with me. The two of us approached the house, slinging our rifles down as we waved up in a friendly manner to the window. It's okay, it's safe now. My name is Dean Williams, and I was a police sergeant before everything fell apart. This is my foster daughter, Erin Locke. I was blown away. He'd never said that before, even though that's how he and Maria had always treated me. I got a warm, squishy feeling inside when I heard that, and it cheered my mood considerably. Are you all okay? I shouted up. Is anyone hurt? No, 
the woman shouted down, her eyes still looking out beyond Isaac and Sarah to make sure the thugs had gone. We're from a small community just out looking for supplies, I continued. Are you okay? Do you need help? The front door opened and a man in his thirties appeared. He was mixed race, probably from one black parent and one white, judging by the beautiful russet colour of his skin. It's the same colour as Charlie's, where the perfect blend of both parents has created this glowing skin tone that sits smack bang in the middle of the white and black jeans. The most striking thing that caught my eye, however, was his green eyes. They were like polished jade, absolutely gorgeous, and they sparkled even brighter when contrasted with his darker skin. He looked physically fit, if a little thin. A thick beard shrouded the lower half of his face, and his dark hair was long and thick. The newcomer took us all in quickly, assessing us, and I almost had Nate's voice in my ear telling me this guy had seen action in some way. He was vigilant, took us all in at a glance, was ready to act if needed, but wasn't threatening in any way. Confident, despite the rifles slung across our chest. A timely intervention, officer, he said. His voice was deep with a hint of southern accent. Not thick, cockney, but just a hint to the way some of his words were pronounced. Nice to meet you, I said, stepping forward and thrusting out my hand. Erin, but everyone calls me Lucky. Elijah, he replied. Then with a smile added, but everyone calls me Eli. Okay, Freya, I'm not easily giddy, and Eli is a decent-looking guy with that lovely skin and amazing eyes. But holy shit, when he smiled, he was drop-dead gorgeous. You know how they say some people smile with their whole body? That was what happened to Eli. His face shined, his eyes seemed brighter, and his whole posture changed to warm and friendly. I am ashamed to say this, but I actually went, ha, huh, yeah, cool, as he shook my hand, like some fucking giddy teenage geek girl that's just been noticed by the hottest guy in class. I am never lost for words, never. But when that pretty bastard hit me with that smile, my mind went all foggy and my tongue felt about three times too big. I feel like such a tool now. I'll give you the rundown on our new friends, as there were five of them in total. Elijah Beckett, who henceforth I shall just refer to as Eli, is 30 and a trained paramedic. Talk about striking gold. Not only that, but I was right about my feeling. He served in three medical regiment in the British Army for six years as a CMT. That's combat medical technician for the uninitiated, which I was. He's a fully trained soldier, which is great, as it means another able shooter. But this is a guy who had to patch people up in the field while under fire to keep them alive until they could be evacuated to a military hospital. It's like the military battlefield version of a first responder, from what I can gather. I imagine that takes some serious call to patch someone up while bullets are raining down. Plus, more medical support for Maria is awesome. Eli served in Afghanistan too, at the big military base there called Camp Bastion, and has seen active duty under fire. I don't know why, but when he said the camp's name, I got a little shiver, like someone had just walked over my grave. Weird. Anyway, with Eli is his younger brother, Theodore. Side note here. Elijah and Theodore Beckett. You just don't hear cool as fuck names like that round here. Everybody is Dave, Steve, Mike, John, Andy, and all those other common names. Elijah and Theodore Beckett sound like something out of a movie. Awesome names. Theodore is early 20s and is on the autism spectrum somewhere, though he seems quite high-functioning. Apparently, he's got perfect recall, like full-on eidetic memory, and also has savant syndrome. Eli says he loves to draw and has beyond normal skills, able to recreate anything he's seen from memory in perfect detail. That's amazing, and I look forward to seeing that. Eli left the service when their mum died. 
While Theodore can generally take care of himself, he struggles with the difficulties of emotional engagement and refuses to make eye contact with anyone except Eli. He speaks in a sort of flat, almost robotic manner, like his mind is always somewhere else and his mouth is doing the speaking for him. It's devoid of emotion from what I've heard so far. Eli used his skills learned in the military and flew through paramedic training so he could have a civilian job and be near his brother who needed him. Well, my candle for the green-eyed saver of lives just started burning a little brighter. What a thoroughly decent and noble thing to do. After seeing how the brothers interact this evening here on campus and how sweet and gentle Eli is with him, I'm fairly sure I heard my ovaries screaming. The other survivors are a family unit. Clyde Ritchie is a big Scottish fellow in his early thirties. Can you get a more Scottish name than Clyde Ritchie? He's a mechanic and welder by trade, so again, an awesome skill set. He moved to Cheshire to be with his wife, Ellie, which is short for Elizabeth. Again, she's early thirties, really pretty and very warm. I think she might be the best find of the lot. Freya, she's a hair stylist. We are a shaggy, messy bunch of apocalypse grunge hippies at the moment, so getting haircuts is high on the agenda, I think. We'll need to get her the supplies and hit a salon for them. But fuck you, oh split ends of doom. Your days are numbered. Their son is Max, who is the same age as Charlie. When we came back to campus, well, those two hit it off like they were best friends in some former life that have just been reacquainted in this one. They love all the same things. They spent all evening chatting away, giggling and playing video games. And Mark and Clyde got on like a house on fire as well. A mechanic and an engineer? Shit, those two will be geeking out all over things clunky and oily. We decided to put the Ritchie family in the third and final little house in the maintenance area. Max and Charlie can hang out, and Mark and Clyde will likely be working closely together, so it makes sense. Letting the little family units with boys the same age live next to each other just seems right. I have no doubt that Ellie and Nora will become fast friends as well. I'm so stoked by how happy Charlie is now. Having a kid his own age, who he gets on with so well, is amazing. Eli and Theodore were put in one of the small staff houses that's across from Hall Fire. With Theodore's special needs, putting him in a large dorm with others might be a bit of a sensory overload for him. Eli nearly wept in joy when we told him, and was so damn grateful it nearly had us all in floods. The five of them were blown away by Crenshaw. Power, hot showers, clean water, food, vehicles, security, heating. All five of them spent most of the afternoon on the tour in a daze, hardly believing their luck. Clyde got a glass of water from the tap and laughed like he had just seen the most incredible invention of the era, shaking his head in awed disbelief. They've all had it pretty hard, and it's a testament to their tenacity that they've lasted this long just scavenging house to house, keeping on the move, avoiding the undead where they can. Max is a little trooper, and it can't have been easy for Theodore. I'm not shortening it to Theo in my journal, so I can get it right in my head. Apparently, it's one of his idiosyncrasies that we need to be aware of. His name is Theodore, so we have to call him by his full name, or he gets upset. The last thing I want to note down are these so-called nomads that we scattered. Eli and Clyde both said they'd had run-ins with smaller groups and just managed to avoid them, but they're a bad bunch. They must have some smarts to have lasted this long, so at least one of them must have a strategic brain. But there is definitely a large group somewhere in town making a home base, and they have smaller groups that go scavenging. Eli has seen two other groups with people that weren't in the mob we sent packing, which suggests that there are more than the 20 that chased the Becketts and the Riches into that house about five minutes before we rolled up. We'll have to keep an eye out for them, as they're a bit of a wild card now when we're house clearing. For the first time, it feels like we're directly competing for resources against another local group. We're clearly better armed, but that just means they might get sneaky. 
We can never afford to be complacent with the undead plague, but thinking humans have the potential to be far more dangerous, especially vengeful ones. For once, though, we got somewhere in time to help strangers, and for that I am thankful. This feels like a huge win. Tomorrow, I'm going to make Sarah play the piano for me and make good on her promise. I'm feeling good after this win today, so I'm in the mood for some music. November 30th, 2010. White Clouds. We've been really busy settling the newcomers for a couple of days and doing stuff around campus. Boring everyday stuff. Checking things, taking stock of stuff, blah, blah, boring, blah. I never got my piano concerto from Sarah. Today, however, I did. We had a quiet hour in the afternoon, and I ambushed her. Just the two of us, I said, as I just really wanted to hear her play. She took me to the music department, which didn't look like any bloody music department in any school I ever went to. In one room, which looked like a little Victorian library, a grand piano stood in one corner next to a huge bay window, the wide sill scattered with cushions to create a little chill-out spot looking out over the school's green fields. I sat on the bay window and asked her what she was going to play. Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin. I mentioned those because they were the only three that I knew and I told her so, not having a clue which one it would be if she started playing. No, I'll play a modern one, she laughed. My mum passed in 2006, and this was released a couple of years earlier by an Italian composer and pianist named Ludovico Enaudi. I nodded like I'd heard of him. I hadn't. Mum fell in love with it and would forever play it. When she died, I played it at her funeral. My mouth dropped at that. That seems really personal. I said softly. If it's too hard, play something else. She shook her head with a little smile. No, it's the piece I always go to when I want to think of her. Whenever I play it, I feel connected to her, like she's with me, her hands on mine, guiding them on the keys. That is some deep shit for an 18-year-old woman to drop. I was already tearing up. I haven't played it since... Well, since everything. She paused for a moment. Since Dad went too. She sighed, gave me a heartbreakingly sad smile, and sat down at the keys. Just sit and listen. I hope you like it. What's it called? Novule Bianche, she answered. Which translates to... White clouds. I took my place by the window, settled myself in, not knowing what to expect. And then she started to play. Music has an unquestionable power on the human soul. It can break hearts, evoke memories, call tears of joy and bring hope. When you hear the right piece of music, you feel it. It speaks to you as if the music was yours and yours alone. This was Sarah's tribute to her parents, her connection to them, and I felt every single note. The music is breathtaking, a gentle waltz of notes that draws you in and captivates your attention. Soft and harmonic, I found my eyes drifting to the window, the ghosts of memory rising to haunt me. Door number nine, the child under the stairs, and you, Freya on that final day. Just those early notes lowered me into a deep well of remembered sorrow. Then the tempo picked up and somehow lifted me. I was no longer sad for the loss of you, but thankful for the time of knowing you. And then Sarah's fingers burned with a life of their own as the tempo and pitch rose, her slim fingers dancing elegantly, eyes closed as the music poured out of her and into the piano. Freya, it was pure serenity. Tranquil, haunting, effortless and beautiful in its simplicity. 
The serenity of it carried me away, drifting into my own thoughts, desires, fears, and hopes, yet not allowing me to dwell on any of them too long. My life floated by me in all its misery and glory. For those six minutes, the horror, the death, the tragedy, the thoughts of hardships to come, the people I feared to lose, all of them floated by like the white clouds of the composition's title. It was acceptance of all the pain that had brought me to this moment, and for what yet lay before me, it gave me hope. For those six serene minutes, nothing could hurt me or cause me pain. There was no guilt, no heartache, and no anger, just those six minutes of freedom as my heart and soul were uncaged to just be. All that existed was the music. If told I had just six minutes to live and asked what I wanted for my final moments, it would be to close my eyes, lie back, and let me leave life without fear or guilt by having this song played to me. Never has my heart felt so free. It was pure rapture. As Sarah drew to the close, I pulled my eyes from the window and looked over at her, seeing the tracks of tears leaking from closed eyes, her fingers flickering on the keys of their own accord. She didn't need her eyes and knew every note by heart, like her mum's hands had been guiding them. She played for herself, for her lost parents, and it touched the deepest part of her when she did so. When her hands finally moved to her lap and the last echoing note faded, she wept in earnest, the gates to her grief finally cracking wide. It was the first time she had played such a deeply personal piece of music since the world collapsed around us, and it pierced through the last line of her emotional defense. She was strong, enduring, and inspiring to have adapted to this new world, but she had never truly grieved. I moved to the seat next to her, put my arm around her, and held her until the tears ran dry. The power of music, Freya. It can take you away from the world for a while, but it can also heal. Sometimes, when words will fail, music can speak louder to the human soul than anything I know. It says what you can't express in words, despite my poor attempt in this journal entry. It brings peace and can make you whole. Sarah has a powerful gift to share, never more so in this dark and broken world. I feel privileged that she allowed me to share that moment with her, and in her own grief and sorrow, that she managed to give me such a gift. I feel good, Freya. For the first time in a long time, I feel genuinely at peace. And even if it's just for this one night, it's a gift I will treasure. December 1st, 2010. Everything is what? All my good feeling disappeared in a shiver today. I checked in on Eli and Theodore to see how they were settling in. Eli invited me in for a brew, and I found Theodore sitting at the small table, surrounded by art supplies raided from the school. Eli says it keeps him calm. I said hello to Theodore, and he looked up, showing something like excitement for the first time. I've said he's not very expressive, but he did this little bounce thing with his upper body, like he was someone who desperately wanted to tell a secret but knew he shouldn't. Eli obviously noted the change. I hope everything is well, Theodore. Here's another idiosyncrasy of his personal condition I've learned. If you ask Theodore a direct question, he won't answer it. You have to word everything open-ended like Eli did. It's really fucking hard to do. She's here, Theodore responded in an emotionless voice. It starts tonight. Not for her, no, not for her, but it does start. What thing? I asked. See, it's hard. 
I'd like to hear about what's starting, Theodore, said Eli. He's way better at it. I have to think so hard about turning a question into an open-ended statement that invites further information. Then he did something that made even Eli suck a breath with shock. Theodore turned to me and looked me dead in the eye. And he doesn't do that with anyone except Eli. He'll look to your side, at your feet, at your chest, not in a weird way, or above your head. But Theodore responded to Eli's statement by looking me right in the eyes and then said this. It's all three. Everything is three. Tonight is the first dreaming. But not you. No, not you. You have to be last. He then seemed to just fade away, back to his blank stares and drawing on his art paper. He didn't offer any more words until I was leaving. Eli apologized and we had a quiet chat in the kitchen over a brew but it weirded me out a little. So once the coffee was done, I felt the need to be away. Just as I was leaving, Theodore held up a drawing he'd done in black ink without looking up. For you. Oh, thanks, Theodore, I said with a forced smile. I was still a bit unnerved by his cryptic outburst, but I took the picture, said my goodbyes, and scooted back to Nora's house where I was crashing. Freya, I'm a little freaked out. The drawing is of me, and let me just say, it is absolutely incredible. It looked like a photograph made from black lines. Honestly, the detailed accuracy was mind-blowing. Savant doesn't begin to cover it. What's really weird about it, however, is what I'm carrying in the picture. Eli told me that Theodore draws from memory, he doesn't have emotive or abstract expression like other artists do. He is detail-focused and draws still pictures from his perfect recall memory. He doesn't make anything up. He's not creative in his art, being more like a photographer that develops his negatives with ink by hand. I expected to be carrying a gun or a backpack or something that I have actually carried at some point. Instead... In my hand, holding it high, was a flaming torch. And I don't mean a flashlight that's on fire. I mean an old school torch like you see in medieval times, sitting on a sconce on the wall, or like what the Statue of Liberty holds aloft. Add to that, what the hell is the first dreaming, and everything is three? Freya, I am freaked out to hell by this, I keep staring at the picture and shivering. I really wish Nate were here. I haven't seen him for a week, but just having him around would likely calm me down. I hope he's okay. Home. You're up, said Nate, gently nudging Alicia from her slumber. A week of sleeping in the isolated farmhouse was taking its toll on both of them. Nate had more experience and had endured far worse in a long, active career. But he was in his fifties now. Sleeping in the cold and taking a shift at night sentry duty were days he had hoped were long behind him. Alicia had no such experience or training. She was a tough woman, especially considering the harrowing trials of being Bancroft's captive, but this was a mentally and physically sapping experience. Alicia was learning the hard way that most of a soldier's time was spent doing mind-numbingly boring duties and not going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the enemy. Listening to bursts of tedious and inane chatter in the farmhouse all day with the Humvee's radio was taxing. Hours seemed to stretch on forever, especially when there had been nothing of interest on the radio for a whole week. Alicia did not think so, anyway. Nate was pleased to see she kept detailed notes of any communication and times they occurred, and she would relay them to him as he was sat in the hide constructed on the hill overlooking Ascension. While Alicia thought she was just writing dreary notes and reciting boring communications, 
Nate was starting to build a better picture of their structure and key personnel. As he watched, Alicia's additional audio allowed him to add some context to his observations. For the moment, though, all he wanted was sleep. Alicia nodded, all bleary-eyed, as she rolled off the bed and dragged herself to her feet. It was a little after two in the morning, and Nate shoved the hot, black coffee into her hand as she rose. Mumbling her thanks, she shuffled out of the bedroom into the next first-floor room along the small landing, closing the door behind her. The room went dark as her flashlight disappeared. There had been no signs of anyone near the little base of operations, which was a good couple of miles from the cultist settlement. Nate would make the journey from here on foot to his hide each day, about a mile and three quarters each way, where he would stay all day observing the settlement. Getting eyes on it overnight would be a boon, but staying in the outdoor hide was just too much of a risk. For one, it was just too damn cold of a night. Secondly, the undead were silent predators, and he could not take the risk of falling asleep and being pounced on. Their senses were inhuman, and he had no way of knowing if it was just sight and sound they used. Considering what he had seen on first contact, and in the week since, he could not be sure of anything these days. The disagreement with Erin played on his mind for the whole time, and her wild theory of a dark celestial agency was difficult for him to digest. Admittedly, the dead rising to destroy the living should have changed the boundaries of what he should consider possible, but the thought of some dark force moving pieces in a game of its own twisted making was a little too far for him to accept at the moment. The hurt on her expression when she thought he and Alicia had united against her was still raw, though. They had always been a great team, as frustrating as she was at times. Leaving it as they did left a knot twisting his insides that he just could not seem to pick free. Nate stripped off his tactical vest and boots, slipping into his thick sleeping bag on his bed in the twin room, before falling back onto the pillow with a grunt. The batteries on the radios were almost done, and they'd have to return home tomorrow. A couple of days of comfort and warmth, a resupply, charging the radios and the spare batteries to full, and then it would likely be a return to this spot and start the observation again. He was unsatisfied with the intelligence gleaned so far, and there were still too many spaces that needed coloring in before he considered it acceptable. With another heavy sigh, he closed his eyes. The garden was in full bloom a riot of color bordering the lush rectangular lawn of vivid green. The rich intensity of the lilac, the gentle sweetness of the mock oranges, delicate tones of jasmine, and the strong headiness of the gardenias were an explosion of fragrances that flooded Nate's senses as he breathed them in. The garden was still and quiet. No buzz of insects or bird calls disturbed the scene which remained motionless without even a breeze to stir the blooms in their beds, as though he existed within an exquisite painting. Sitting on the decking's swinging lawn chair, he knew it was not real. It was only a dream, though a pleasant one, for it had been more than twenty years since he had sat in this spot. It had always been his favorite place in the world, and the only time in a life of frantic motion and violence that he was ever truly at peace, sitting in his back garden in the summer, beer in hand as he watched her play. Nate swallowed a hard, dry lump as his throat constricted, his eyes threatening tears as the dark phantoms of memory rose from their slumber to taunt him. Avoiding the shadows of those bleak thoughts, he turned his gaze around the bright garden, looking for Maggie, his ex-wife. His heart froze in his chest as he realized someone was sat beside him on the swinging chair. Dark hair, dark eyes, and a face that would make Helen of Troy turn green with envy with her glowing skin. Nate's ability to speak was taken from him as he stared. She was looking out over the yard, a serene smile touching her lips as she drank it in. This is a beautiful garden, she said.
He struggled to find his voice as he stared in wonder. Freya? She turned, her smile so radiant and pure it almost burned him. The young woman appeared suffused with light, a paragon of such joy and purity that the sight of her almost unmanned him. She spoke again, and it resonated through him like the voice of an angel, melodious and uplifting, as though it was in tune with the harmony of creation. Hello, Nate. He began to stumble an apology, but she placed a soft hand upon the rough skin of his own and shook her head. What you did, Nate, what I asked Erin to do needs no apology. If anything, it should be me asking for forgiveness. I placed such a terrible burden on Erin, and I should never have asked her. With the knowledge I now possess, it scares me to think how close I came to breaking her. If she had pulled the trigger then, we would have lost this war before our first true battle was joined. The words confused Nate, but he said nothing, still drinking in the sight of the young woman he had so adored. Perrin and Freya had become his surrogate daughters in those early days of the fall. Before any of the others had been liberated from Bancroft's cruel grasp, the three of them, and Erin's rodent she called a dog, were all that was left in the world. Keeping them safe had become his purpose. What you did was not something to apologize for, Nate, she said, her dark eyes regarding him with something like pride. You saved her from a torment she would never have recovered from. You saved her. Those words were like cooling ice to the burning guilt in his heart, and he felt his shallow breath flow easier. This feels so real, he whispered, marveling at the cool touch of her hand upon his. It is, and it isn't she said with a mischievous smile. Nate, I need you to hear me now. I mean, really hear me, okay? He nodded, and Freya scented herself with a calming breath. Nate, Heron is right about all of it. He frowned. All of what? The end of all things. I don't follow, he said, confused. Nate, humanity is being judged for all its sins. Our dead have been chosen as the harbingers of this punishment, and will remain so until our completed destruction, unless we can find a way to earn our redemption. The veteran digested this, feeling the tangled knots inside him tighten. Erin was right about all of it. It's hard for me to grasp, he admitted. It's just so, so big. I'm just a marine. Freya laughed then, an exquisite lilting sound that seemed to bring the garden to vibrant life. The aroma intensified, the colors deepened, and a warm, comforting breeze seemed to sweep through the garden and bring peace to him. He should have been confused and afraid and doubtful, but instead he knew that Freya was speaking the truth. He knew in the marrow of his bones that this dream was somehow real. Nate chuckled Freya, shaking her head as if he had just cracked a bad joke. You are not just a Marine. We all have our parts to play, just as I did. Mine was to die, so I could sit here with you. Seems like a shitty part in the play, he grumbled. Why take a young woman like you, with all her life ahead of her, I gave Erin a taste of something she'd never really had. I was a friend that accepted her for who she was, that didn't want to change anything about her, and expected nothing from her. I've come to realize something about Erin since my time here, trapped in this endless day.
Realize what? When you expect nothing from Erin, she gives you everything. It's one of her gifts. You've seen it yourself, Nate. If you're simply there for her, if you ask nothing of her, nor demand anything from her, she gives herself freely. You knew, in the deepest part of you, that when you, Mark, and Alicia didn't come home that night, you knew that Erin would come for you. You let her be who she is, and that person is one that refuses to leave a friend in trouble, no matter the risk or cost to herself. Nate nodded, the ghost of a smile haunting his lips. Aye, she's a mad one. Freya laughed again. Nate, she is fearless and reckless and takes maddening risks. But she does it all from a place of love. She patted his hand and turned her gaze back to the glory of the garden. She's the very definition of an empath, Nate. When the mood around her is up, she's on top of the world and a bright flame that draws others in. When those around her are hurting, it cuts her to the deepest depths of her soul. It's why she fights so hard for light, Nate. It's why her humor is so ridiculous, why she laughs about situations that don't usually warrant such whimsical comments. What do you mean? Nate, she feels everything ten times as hard as you and I. Her joy is like an explosion of light in the dark, and her depression is heart-crushing despair. She can't face the terror of that darkness, so she fights it with every shred of light she can find. It's the only way she knows how. It was such a simple and elegant way to describe Erin, and yet Nate realized just how true it was. There was no middle ground with Erin Locke. She was crying in the dark or laughing in the light. She's special, Nate, said Freya. I know. Freya shook her head. No, Nate. I don't mean just special to us. I mean, she's special, in that she has a part to play far greater than most in humanity's redemption. Nate stilled. What? Three is a powerful number, Nate as it always has been through many cultures and beliefs. There are three people that our fate rests upon, a trinity. And if they pass their test, we will be freed of the dead and given our chance to rebuild something new, something better. And Erin is one of these three. Freya shook her head. No, Nate, the burden of the trinity is not hers. The soul must be an everyday person, so their trial is all the greater. Their greater burden of responsibility requires a grand crucible to endure before humanity has any hope. Erin is already filled with such light. It makes her unsuitable for the greatest test. But that doesn't mean she isn't important in her own way. She sighed. But... Our trinity is broken and divided, Nate, scattered far and wide, and we don't know how long it will be until they are united. We can't see them here on this side of the veil. They are too far from us, so we cluster around Erin. So why is she special? If there is anything left of humanity to be saved, our soul must survive their crucible and our trinity unite. Until such events occur, the fight continues, and there need to be those who hold the line for them, bright flames that push back at the darkness as a beacon of hope for others. There must be sanctuaries to shelter survivors. There must be those willing to show the powers that have brought this down upon us, that we are worth saving. We can't wait for the soul to fail or succeed, or we'll perish for sure. 
So, we have to continue fighting and gather around those flaming torches of light and hope while our trinity endures their crucible. And Erin is such a flame, he whispered. Freya simply graced him with a gentle smile of confirmation. But she can't do it on her own, Nate. As I said, everything is always in threes. She's fearless and emotional, with the heart the size of a mountain. But it makes her vulnerable. She needs you, Nate. You're her anchor, the strongest link in her chain that prevents her being swept away in the storm of everything she fights against. She is the flame, but you are her shield, and she is your redemption. My redemption? Nate shivered. Freya's expression softened as she turned back to him, aching in its compassion. She knew, he realized with dread. Freya knew. You're her armor, Nate, she said, her voice as soft as a petal. Her shining defense against the darkness that will shield her from all that seek to extinguish her light. But in turn, that same light can burn away all the guilt and shadow that you carry from your life of violence and regrets. Nate, she's already brought some meaning, some purpose back to a life you thought empty of such hope. But now comes the hardest part of your task. You will always protect her, teach her, shield her, and support her. That's who you are. But for her cleansing fire to burn away the last of your darkness, she needs one thing from you, and that is the hardest thing to give. And that is? He asked in a tremulous voice. He already knew what Freya would say. The truth. Freya placed both her soft hands upon his. Nate, you have to take her home. Nate's hands went to his face so Freya would not see his silent tears. They were rough hands that had brought so much death, so much violence to a world already overflowing with it. But for all his courage in battle, for the countless enemies of evil intent he had fought and killed, for all the innocent lives his actions had doubtless saved, this was the one truth he was terrified to face. His greatest failing, his greatest betrayal, his cowardice. I don't know if I can, Freya, he whispered, the memories breaking free of their shackles deep in the darkest part of his soul where they lay caged. If I take her home, she'll know I'm not the man she thinks I am. He looked at her through reddened eyes, the tears burning like liquid fire. The person Erin sees, the way she talks to me, the way she's always there no matter what, the way she looks at me like a daughter looks at a loving father. But if she knows the truth... Nate shook his head. I don't think I could bear to lose that, Freya. The Nate that she sees. He drew in a shaking breath. I like that version of myself. He has purpose, doesn't desert those who need him, because she won't let that Nate get away with it. But if she knows the truth, if that look turns away from me... He felt breathless, despair threatening to crush the last of the air from his lungs. Freya, that might break me. This place, this dream garden of his old home from a happier time, had cracked his armor. The peace of Maggie's lovingly tended garden had seeped into all the floors of his emotional walls constructed over the years, and Freya's serene compassion was driving deeper into those cracks. Nate Carter was not a man to give open displays of emotion, but here in this dream garden, he was defenseless. 
They sat quietly for a moment as Nate gathered himself, sucking in great breaths, his throat tight and painful as an emptiness expanded in his chest. That swelling void was a vacuum of fear and despair, but it was soothed by Freya's tenderness. The truth always finds a way, Nate, she murmured, her voice like a whispering breeze into the silence. Secrets can be poison, even if only to yourself. And this wound you carry is toxic. You can shut out the truth like you can the sun, but it will never really go away. It will still be there when you venture outside. She'll hate me, Freya. Misery hung from every word. How can she not? Take that which is your greatest weakness and let it become your greatest strength. She will find out eventually, and then she will wonder why you didn't think she was worthy of this truth, given the significance of it. Freya lowered her head and placed the tips of two soft fingers beneath his chin, tilting his head up and forcing him to meet her dark eyes. She has you on a pedestal, Nate, and the fall from there would be much harder than choosing to step down from it. Tell her your story. Make yourself vulnerable. Let her see how human you are, and let her judge the truth for herself. But, Nate, she interrupted, shaking her head once with firm resolve. You're afraid she will despise you, but surely you know her well enough that hate is not her way. She loves you, Nate. Freya held to his hand as he gathered himself, knowing she was right. For all she had been through in her childhood, Erin was still the most inherently good person he had ever known. A lot of that credit went to Dean and Maria, of that he was certain. They had shown a troubled kid love and respect, and in the light of their faith, she had bloomed. But it did not make the choice any easier. Okay, he said finally, nodding more to reassure himself than Freya. She smiled leaned over and planted a gentle kiss upon his cheek. So, it's all true then, he asked. God, the devil, this is judgment. It's not so simple as the Christian belief, Nate. I prefer to think of it as light and dark. How much do you know? Freya smiled. It's more about how much I can tell you, Nate. He snorted, wiping away the drying tears. Right, okay. Well, I just have one question then. The dead changed for a short time after your death and became entirely focused on Erin before reverting back to their usual emptiness. Why? Freya took a deep breath, her head tilted as though listening to something in the distance. The dead are crude tools, Nate and the force behind them isn't pulling the strings all the time. That which I call the dark thought that Erin killing me would break her, and it would have had her faith in you not been so strong. She knew, as much as it pained you, that you would take that burden from her. She wasn't ready, yet in that moment of weakness proved her strength. Erin's strength comes from putting her faith in others, not just herself, and she has more faith in you than any other living soul. We think the dark got angry for a time at its failure. For that little while, we think it tried to frighten her into hiding behind her safe walls, making her fear she would endanger her friends if she went out to face them. She struggled with that. Freya nodded. But then, the dark made the worst mistake it could make. It trapped you, made you bait, trying to break her or make her do something reckless and get herself killed. If she hid away and you died because she did nothing, the guilt would destroy her. 
Nate laughed then, wiping away the final tear from his cheek, his mood lightened. But old Scratch wasn't counting on her flipping the finger, huh? Freya laughed and shook her head. No, she faced every fear she had, because the one thing she feared more than anything, Nate, was letting you down. The dark has a little more to learn about humanity, I think. All it knows are our sins, our cruelties, our hatreds, and all the dark places of our collective soul. She grinned, her face radiating unfettered joy. I don't think it understands the power that love can give us mere mortals, and it certainly underestimated Erin's threshold. She has enough love for all of us. So it just gave up? Erin is special, but she's not the only one bearing the torch out in the night. I'm sure the dark will try something else, only this time it will likely use a scalpel rather than a hammer. Nate nodded. The children of the resurrection. There are many pieces, Nate, and the board is bigger than we know. These battles rage across the globe, and we are just one small skirmish in a war for our survival. But it doesn't make it of lesser value. She stood up and walked barefoot on the lawn, leaning to pluck a white gardenia from one of the blooms and breathing in its scent. I've always loved gardenias, she said, floating back towards him on light feet. She offered the white flower to him, which he accepted in both hands. It's time for you to wake up now, Nate. We miss you, he said. I know, and I miss you both too, and that little rascal particles. I'll see you again, I'm sure. Now, wake up, Nate. He wanted to say something more, but his eyes snapped open in the dimly lit room to find Alicia standing above him with a steaming cup. His sudden alertness startled her, caught halfway in the act of nudging him awake. The farmhouse was starting to lighten with the dawning sun, and Nate opened the sleeping bag. Swinging his legs out, he pulled on his boots and left them unlaced before accepting the hot beverage with a word of thanks. Was it just a dream? It had felt so real. Where did that come from? Asked Alicia. Huh? He followed the direction of her finger to a white flower that rested by the pillow. A gardenia. Nate picked it up in shaking fingers, staring at it in wonder. Nate, sir, you okay? Alicia's concerned questioning brought him to his senses. Hmm? Aye, sorry. Still a bit foggy from the sleep. Weird dreams, he added absently. So, what's the plan for today then? Same again? Nate sipped at the black coffee, rolling the gardenia's stem between finger and thumb. No, he said finally. No, Alicia. Today? Well. He stared at the white flower in his hand and sighed. It looks like I'm going home. This has been We Will Rise, an Adrian's Undead Diary novel, Lockie vs. the Apocalypse, book two. Written by Carl Meadows. Narrated by Danielle Cohen. Copyright 2021 by Carl Meadows. Production copyright by Carl Meadows. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. This is Audible. The Devil's Due, an Adrian's Undead Diary Novel. Loki vs. the Apocalypse, Book 3. Written by Carl Meadows. Narrated by Danielle Cohen. Dedication. He does all kinds of dedications in his own books, but I imagine rarely gets one himself. So this time, I'm going to change things up. For giving an unknown a crack of the whip and allowing me to dabble in his fictional universe, 
for letting Lockie, Nate and Particles plant their own flag in Adrian's apocalypse and for being just a generally all-round good human being. This one goes out to the AUD progenitor-in-chief. I'd like to dedicate this third volume of Lockie's trilogy to Mr. Chris Philbrook himself. As Adrian and Lockie both say, love that guy. Thanks for rolling the dice, Chris. Part 1. The Shield. December 4th, 2010. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. Nate and Alicia came home yesterday, and I knew straight off the bat that something was off. They arrived at the school in the Humvee, and my initial happiness at seeing them hale and healthy hit the brakes when I saw Nate's expression. I don't know how to describe it. Nate isn't particularly expressive anyway, at least not to the untrained eye. I think I'm a bit more in tune with him, and I thought he looked... nervous. I've never seen him look nervous before, but he had difficulty holding eye contact with me. Usually those dark eyes bore through me like twin drills. Nate is big on eye contact, which is what usually intimidates the crap out of people when they first meet him. Nate's face tells people to fuck off more than his mouth does, and that gaze feels like he's boring into your soul as he decides your worth. Alicia just looked tired, but there was definitely something off with Nate. I thought he might be feeling guilty after the way we left things, and maybe he was, but it soon got flipped on its head the moment I greeted him. Walk with me, was all he said, as everyone came out to greet them, eager for their news. We wandered away a little so we could talk. What's up, Buttercup? I asked. Something weird happened last night. With Evil Jesus and the Resurrectionists? Still a great name for a metal band. He snorted and shook his head. No, while I was sleeping. It's probably your age, Nate. Incontinence in the old is fairly common, so you shouldn't be ashamed. No judgment here. He snorted again and seemed to relax. No, you dickhead, he chuckled before turning serious again. I had a dream last night. Of Freya. Well, that stopped my smart mouth. Nate knows I'd never joke about you. That wound is still too raw and fresh, even a couple of months on. It was just a dream, Nate. Have you dreamed of her? I thought about it and realised I haven't. Since your death, I haven't dreamed of you at all, Freya. Considering the lake of grief in which I'm forever treading water, I find that, in classic British understatement, a bit odd. I write this journal to you, so in many ways you're always on my mind. How is it that my subconscious sleeping brain doesn't conjure you at all? That seems... well, that just seems odd. Mind you, odd is something of a relative term these days, eh? Nor had I until last night, continued Nate after I answered. Erin, it was so real. I remember every sight, every scent, every word we shared in conversation, like it happened just a minute ago. You're weirding me out, Nate. Well, it's going to get weirder. This time his gaze returned to those twin drills locking to mine. Erin, I'm sorry I ever doubted you. It was hard for me to get my head round, but now I'll back you 100%, no question. Doubted me? The words threw me a little, and I didn't register the apology straight away. Erin, you were right. About all of it. Captain Evil, as you lovingly refer to it, is a real thing. There is an agency behind the undead, and we are being judged for all the horrors we've inflicted on each other. Freya came to me as a messenger from, well, our 
team. He spread his hands and shrugged, unsure how to explain it. Said there's a way to end all this. The responsibility on some group of three called the Trinity. But they need time to fix things and pass some test that'll determine whether we get our second chance. Mind blown. I was still recovering from that bombshell when he dropped another. Freya said, you had a big part to play, Erin. Though the burden of all humanity didn't fall to you, there was still a role for you as part of another trio. Hey? She said everything is three, that the number has power. I went cold as Nate quoted Theodore's freaky statement of those exact words. Everything is three. Those tasked with bearing the flaming torch of hope against the darkness are many, but still come in threes. These torch bearers are people fighting the smaller battles all across the world to hold the line for this trinity and ensure humanity is still fighting, still existing, should they succeed in their task. To build shelter, safety and sanctuary for the living, paving the road to something better if the Trinity succeeds. His fierce expression softened then, and his smile gentle. It was almost... proud. And you're one of those flames, Erin. I've sat and pondered this all night long, because, let's face it, it's quite a lot to take in. Firstly, I don't doubt a word of what he says. I've been the one advocating a supernatural or divine force behind this whole thing pretty much from the outset, so I'd be a bit of a dick to now turn around and tell Nate he was going mental. Nate believed the power of this dream, and for such a practical man to be swept away in this sudden change of direction and opinion, that dream must have punched home pretty hard. He told me it was in his old backyard, from a house twenty years ago, the garden filled with flowers. And when he woke from the dream, a white gardenia was next to his pillow. That is some freaky shit right there. Apparently, you also told him why the undead went all weird after your death. They wanted to break me in the wake of your passing, terrify me into hiding from the world in case I got any more of my friends killed, much like I mused when it all started. And, by hiding away, I couldn't be the person that our team needs me to be. When Captain Evil tried to mess things up at the builder's yard, I came anyway, and that apparently pissed on the celestial fucktards chips a little when we all got away. The dead are crude tools, as Nate put it, and Captain Evil has countless battles to fight against humanity to ensure our destruction, so it doesn't put all its efforts into me. Small mercies, I guess. I'm still a target, but now Captain Evil is likely to change tack and try some different angle. It's extremely satisfying to know my big middle finger to Captain Evil poked it in the eye and pissed it off. But what I really can't get my head around is the question I was asking regarding the shift in undead behaviour. That question hasn't changed, even though it's now confirmed that, yes, I am indeed a personal target for the evil force directing this shit show. And that question is, why me? Nate being chosen, now that I understand. He's a warrior, and if you're getting into a fight for the fate of humanity, he's your team's first pick without any hesitation. But Nate kept saying I was the flame, and he was my shield, like he's in some backup support role. No idea who the third one is. Would have been nice for you to drop that little bombshell as well, Freya. I'm no leader. The very thought is laughable. I struggle with crippling indecision about what to have for breakfast, so don't put the fate of swathes of people in my little hands. I will drop that fucking ball and blow the championship game. 
By all means, I'll fight the good fight, and I've said from the beginning that we have to be better, that we have to fight back against the dead, and we should ensure safety and security where we can. That's just being a decent human being, which is something humanity has been sorely lacking. It was that lack of care for each other that caused this whole fucking mess in the first place. But shit, don't make me lead anyone. We've got wiser heads here. Nate and Dean are experienced peacekeepers, and Dean is the calmest, most compassionate head there ever was. We have Maria and Nora as well, two intelligent older women with wisdom and heart. Real inspirational types. What the hell is our team doing choosing me to lead this little slice of the apocalypse rebellion? Bloody hell! Talk about handicapping your team's chances. We're starting five shots behind the enemy if you put me in the captain's role. No thanks. This coming right after Theodore speaking about the dreams, saying, everything is three, just like Nate did, and drawing a picture of me holding a flaming torch. I feel like I'm suddenly going nuts. It's one thing jumping around, telling everyone your theory about Captain Evil and the Dark Force running the show. Having all these freak occurrences, like Theodore's drawing and weird statements, immediately followed by Nate's complete conviction after a dream talk with our dead friend, then finding a flower from his garden 20 years in the past beside him when he wakes up, well, it's all just so... sudden. It's a lot to swallow being told that, yes, Lucky, all your theories were right, so well done for being so spot on. Having a theory is one thing, but finding out your wacky theory is right? That's a lot to digest. And then to get in. Oh, by the way, you're also a pivotal figure in your own little way, so get right with that. Well, what the hell am I supposed to do with this kind of revelation? I filled him in on what happened with Theodore and showed him the drawing. Nate just nodded as if further confirmation of everything he'd just revealed, and I asked him to avoid telling anyone else just yet. I'm having trouble coming to terms with it, so it's going to be pretty difficult for everyone else, I think. I can just imagine dropping this little bombshell to our assembled community. Oh, hi everyone. Just a quick note that I'm now chosen by Team Light as special to lead our own little pocket of humanity, holding the line while we wait for someone out there to take the big test to see if our species is allowed to continue. So, Nate and I are like the Blues Brothers on a mission from God, okay? Hey, that kind of makes me like Joan of Arc, yeah? Pfft, they'll look at me like my nose has just transformed into a penis. Joan of Arc. Joan of Snark, maybe, but I'm no leader. And by the way, Freya, where the hell is my dream with you? I miss you like crazy. I sit here writing these journals to you and you leave me out. Not gonna lie, that stings. I thought we were BFF homegirls. Sigh. I'm all at sea here and need a little help. Nate had one other thing he wanted to talk about, which helped in bringing me back down to earth a bit. Weirdly, he wants to go back home, just me and him, as he says there's something I should know before we continue forward. I might be wrong, but Nate seemed more nervous about taking me to his house than he did about telling me about our divine selection for Team Light's frontline defence. Weird. Anyway, that's what we're doing tomorrow. We're not taking the Humvee, just me and him in the pickup. I've no idea what to expect, and not really sure why this is so significant. Nate is just Nate. His history is his own, and I've no need to ask him his personal business. He seems adamant in wanting to share it, though, while at the same time looking... scared. I mean, I'm not really sure what scared Nate looks like, because if the devil himself popped up in front of us, Nate would probably punch him in the balls and headbutt him as he folded over, calling him a bell end all the while. So much to take in. But the bottom line is that Captain Evil has a celestial hard on for me, no matter what. It's a lot to digest and get right with.
but I've never shied away from any fight in my life. So, great celestial darkness or not, I'll say this to the black-hearted Toss Fountain. Bring it, dickhead. December 5th, 2010. The Guilty Truth. I don't really know how to process this. I feel like punching Nate in the face and hugging him to death at the same time. The stupid thing is that the matter he thought I'd want to punch him for was not the thing that got my blood up. Okay, I'm being cryptic, so I'll just dive in. The garden from Nate's dream was not our destination. That dream abode was the house he shared 20 years ago with his ex-wife, Maggie. Nate being married was the first bombshell of the day, and when I pushed him on that, he just waved it off and said I'd have everything in good time. That house isn't up north anyway. It's apparently way down south near Plymouth, where he was based with 4-2 Commando back in the day. When he retired from his special forces stint after Sierra Leone, Nate moved up here to take a job with a company called Forge International, a private military and security contractor based somewhere in Cheshire. That explains what he's been doing since departing his run in the SAS a decade ago. He's got way too much skill and experience to just sit idle, and there's far more money in the private sector than the service. Nate owns a small flat in a tiny nearby village, just a few miles the other side of town, only a mile or two away from where he and I first met. It took a slow drive of about an hour to get there, as we had to take a number of back lanes to bypass main roads through town. Back as a power couple in our trusty pickup, the conversation died after Nate put a hold on questioning him any further, and the two of us rode in silence. I should note here a weird little factoid. In that entire journey, we didn't see a single undead. Not a sign, either in the roads or moving near isolated buildings. Nothing at all for the whole journey, like we were the only two living souls left on Earth. Eerie. Even when we trundled through the quaint little village, it was barren of both living and undead. A ghost town of silent phantoms, unseen and unheard, was all that greeted us. The only noise disturbing the picturesque stillness was the throaty rumble of our diesel engine, and once Nate killed the ignition, it was deathly silent. We parked behind a small row of local shops, with Nate's flat located above one of them. A small convenience store, a little local butcher, and a chippy. These little villages love having their own local butcher, it seems. It wasn't what I expected. For someone who must have been getting some serious bank from private security, it was a tiny place to call home. Nate's vast experience must have commanded a serious wedge of cash, especially with the long list of active service and combat experience he could reel off, but material possessions clearly weren't something high on his list of priorities. As we climbed out of the pickup, I could hear Nate sucking in breaths as if to calm his nerves. His discomfort made me nervous in turn, because I had no idea why he'd be so edgy when just coming to the tiny flat he called home. Walking up the steps, he stopped outside the first of four doors on the left and turned to me. He opened his mouth to say something, decided against it, then simply pushed down the handle and opened the door. It was as small as it looked. A single bedroom, small bathroom, and the living room and kitchen combined into a single open space. It was sparsely furnished, but immaculately kept, and the only sign of time's passage was the gathering dust from his absence. There was a single big armchair facing a modest-sized TV, with a small coffee table between the two, bare of any ornament. 
A narrow wooden bookshelf stood tall in one corner, laden with a variety of books, from military history and survival manuals to a selection of fiction novels, most of them appearing to be military in nature, or crime thrillers. Wouldn't you know it, the complete works of Tolkien too. I knew he was a fantasy nerd. A complete collection of Winnie the Pooh books on the bottom shelf split my stupid face in a grin. They were so out of place with all the darker, more adult titles and non-fiction books. Explaining his ability to quote Milne when he reeled off his story about Cady in Sierra Leone. It did beg the question, though. Why did he have Pooh Bear books on his shelf? I straight up asked him. They're a reminder, he said softly. Reminder of what? He paused for a long moment then and I could see he was gathering the courage to say the words aloud. Wearily, he sat down on a tall stool beside the kitchen counter. My daughter. I used to read them to her when she was tiny. Well, I nearly fainted away. He'd never mentioned his ex-wife before today, but I was amazed he'd never thought to mention a daughter. What the fuck, Nate? I blurted. Why didn't you tell me you had a kid? Because she died 20 years ago. The statement was like a punch to my heart, an audible struggle in his tone as he forced the words out. Even so long on, the pain seemed raw. But then I remembered his advice about you, Freya. Sage words that... Nobody ever gets used to grief. They only learn to manage it better with time. Nate didn't appear to be managing it, though. The grief in his voice was fresh and raw, as though his emotional wound was torn open by speaking it aloud. Shit, I'm sorry, I whispered. Can I ask how? Leukemia. She was diagnosed when she was four and died on her seventh birthday after a tough battle. Couldn't find a close enough match for a bone marrow transplant. So wit beat her. He gave a smile of such aching sadness, my heart nearly shattered at the sight of it. She was a fighter, though. Lord above, how tragic is that? Christ. I knew Nate carried some weighty burdens from his time in active service, but losing your only child to blood cancer at such a tender age, on top of everything else? Then I reminded myself of the pregnant woman behind door number nine and what Nate did so I didn't have to. And then you, Freya, again, so I didn't have to. So much pain, so much death. So much horror in one man's life, and yet he kept going. But then he revealed what he feared to tell me. I wasn't there, Erin, he said quietly, unable to look at me. His eyes were turned down to the carpet, his fists clenching and unclenching reflexively as he spoke. I can face any enemy handle bullets flying and artillery booming, power through in the face of war's many horrors. Yet, the one thing I could never face was the slow deterioration of my baby girl. I was helpless against it, frustrated there was nothing I could do and that I'd no enemy to fight. His voice dropped to an almost inaudible whisper. I ran, Erin like a coward. Ran? He nodded. I left Maggie to deal with it all, wanting to be anywhere else. I wanted to be somewhere I could fight and work through my grief by avoiding it. I needed control back. So I kept signing up again and again, deploying with my mates to wherever we had an enemy to fight or mission to achieve and I left Maggie at home with our daughter to endure it all. He sighed with a shaking breath. 
alone. My next whisper wasn't a question, just a simple statement. And she died while you were away. Nate nodded. The doctors said she didn't have long, and like the coward I was, I deployed again, knowing I'd never see my baby girl again. Knowing my daughter wanted her daddy there at the end to comfort her, to tell her it was okay to go now. Knowing my wife would have to deal with all that grief, all the funeral arrangements, and bury our baby in the ground without me there. He looked up finally, eyes locking to mine, red and raw from the streaming, silent tears. And I went anyway, because I wasn't strong enough. And I'm the worst kind of man there is. His voice cracked with the last statement. I've seen Nate emotional before, and the glisten of tears in his eyes but I've never seen Nate weep, and it cut me to the bone. He's always been a tower of strength and fortitude, but seeing this incredibly strong man break down in grief and self-loathing was hard for me to see. It must have been harder for Nate to let me see it. I moved away from the bookshelf and sat on the edge of the coffee table, facing him. I didn't want to hug the big idiot straight away, as I didn't think he wanted it. I sensed his story wasn't done. It was a long time ago, Nate, I sighed. You were younger, and none of us are perfect. Shit, I'm one of the least perfect people there is. Follow Nora's advice, and don't bind yourself in the things you can't change. The fact that twenty years later... You're still carrying that guilt around with you. Shows you're not a bad person, Nate. Because bad people don't feel remorse. You made a mistake, and yeah, it was a bad one. But it was a long time ago. I felt the burn of my own tears start to sting. You've got to let it go, Nate. You've got to forgive yourself. Nate shook his head. Maggie despised me after that, and rightly so. She filed for immediate divorce and said she couldn't even bear the sound of my name in her ears, let alone ever look at my face again. I deserve this pain, Erin. Bullshit, Nate, I said, hardening my voice a little. Look at all the good you've done since. Katie and what we've done here. Charlie and his dad are together because of what we did. Maria and Dean have been reunited, and those other kids saved with Dean when we stopped those nutters carting them away to their cult village. And don't forget Alicia rescued from Bancroft's torment. You've helped rebuild that woman's sense of self-worth almost single-handed. Shit, I wouldn't be here without you. If you hadn't happened upon that farm on the day we met, I'd be dead, or even worse than dead. I shook my head refusing to let him destroy himself with self-hatred. You made a terrible mistake, Nate, but you were in pain and you didn't know how to deal with it. But it was twenty years ago and you've probably been spending that time trying to make up for it. He coughed a dark laugh at that. No, I haven't, Erin. I've just been doing what I do for all that time deploying, whether in the service or private contracting, and pulling triggers. All those people in this community of ours, that's your doing, Erin, not mine. I was against the risks, said those things weren't our problem, and you made me do it by force of will. He made a small, huh, sound, as he gave a faint shrug and shook his head. Erin, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have done it any of it. I don't believe your bullshit, Nate, I snapped back. I don't believe that for one fucking minute. A man who carries that kind of personal guilt for 20 fucking years like a heavy weight round his neck won't continue to walk away. 
You hate yourself, and a man with that kind of guilt wants to atone and is desperate for redemption. Desperate to set things right. The moment I said, redemption, Nate's head lifted, surprise carved into the deep lines of his face as he stared back at me. Lucky shoots, she scores. You're a good man, Nate Carter, I pushed, willing him to believe it. I'm generally a good judge of people, and there's sweet fuck all I've seen since knowing you that makes you anything else. You made a shit decision, and I agree, it was shit. I totally get why Maggie reacted as she did. But she was grieving as well, Nate. Neither of you were in your right mind. Who can be watching their little girl go through that kind of shit? It's not fair. It never is when kids are sick like that, and I can't even imagine what that does to your head and heart. I mean, for fuck's sake, I fell apart at the death of a friend I'd only known a few months. Your daughter? I blew out my cheeks and shook my head. Shit, Nate. No one could ever know how they'd react to something like that until it happened to them. That's pretty much as bad as it gets. He stared at me a while wiping the tears from reddened eyes before he spoke again in the smallest, most vulnerable voice I've ever heard from him. You don't... hate me. And I realised why he was so nervous of coming here and telling me of the wound tearing him apart inside. He was afraid I would turn on him. Jesus fucking Christ, Nate! I snorted, shaking my head. How the fuck could I ever hate you? You've saved my ass countless times. You've taught me how to survive in this messed up world. Taught me skills I can use to protect others. And you've helped save so many lives and get rid of some really bad people. You've taken on some fucking awful burdens these past five months or so, just so that I didn't have to carry them the apartment and Freya being most notable. Christ, Nate, those two things would have broken me into little fucking pieces if I'd had to do them. I just wasn't ready for that kind of shit. He stared at me, hovering in disbelief. So I dropped the nuclear emotional bomb. Hate you, Nate. Hate you. Fucking hell, you senile old twat. I could never hate you. Because I fucking love you, you big dumb bell end. You've been more of a father to me in the past five months than my stupid fucking sperm donor was in the six years he kicked me around. Between you and Dean, I've got two fathers that I'm proud of. So don't you ever dare think I could hate you. As that emotional bomb exploded, the blast of it shattered the last of Nate's defences. He wept silently again, but this time I think it was more in relief. He'd built himself up so high in readiness for my rage and disgust that when the opposite happened, it smashed the wind right out of him. I let him have his private moment of weeping relief before eventually I stood up, moved over to him, and threw my arms around his big, dumb neck. His arms circled me, and he wept himself dry before finally pulling free, bashfully unable to look up as he dried his tears away. What was a name? He went still, his body tense. Eh? Your daughter's name. I know your wife was Maggie, but you haven't told me your daughter's name. I'd like to know. I don't know why, but it felt really important especially with Nate's sudden tautness. He drew in a long, deep breath, and then said it as he exhaled. Her name was Erin. Holy fucking shit, Freya. Holy fucking shit balls. His dead daughter carried my name, and I thought back to that very first day when Nate saved me from that creepy old farmer. When I introduced myself... Nate got a weird look on his face, 
and I'd always thought it was because I was being my usual loud-mouthed self, and he was bewildered by my weird sense of humour. Now, I can't help but think that weird expression was because I introduced myself with the name of the daughter burning a guilty hole in his heart every waking hour. She was seven when she died, twenty years ago. And I'm twenty-seven on my next birthday in May next year. I'm the age his daughter would be now. Fucking hell, I murmured without thinking. Nate chuckled ruefully. Hi. <laughs> Nate has a similar look to me, with dark brown eyes, dark hair. And I had to wonder. Have you got a picture of her? He nodded. In the bedroom, on the stand next to the bed. The bedroom was immaculate as well, the bed neat and tidily made. I guess some military habits are hard-coded into the guy after so long. It was tight and flat, not a wrinkle in the bedclothes, and I sat on it as I lifted the small picture frame and stared down at the photo. Ah, oh, Freya, she was such a cutie. It was obviously from when she was smaller, about three or four, and definitely before she got sick. Her smile was wide and innocent, full of the simple joy only a child can possess, when the world is a magical place with so much possibility and completely ignorant to the grim realities of life. A dark-haired child with dark brown eyes stared back at me, her tiny face radiant with a smile of unsullied joy. My name, with dark hair, dark brown eyes, and would be my age today were she still alive. Stunned, Unable to speak or move from the bed, I stared at that picture in shaking hands. My God, I must have been a walking, talking reminder of his lost daughter all this time, and he's never said a damn thing. Nate appeared in the doorway then, moving in a hurry with a strange note of near panic on his face. His eyes weren't on me, but the stand from where I'd taken the picture, and my head slowly turned to see what had him all in a pickle. The picture frame had concealed something hidden behind it that I hadn't registered when lifting the photo, fixed as I was to the child's picture. Now, though, my eyes locked to what Nate was so afraid of me seeing. On the stand lay a small revolver, and beside it, standing on its one flat end, was a single round. I frowned at first, wondering why he'd left a usable weapon behind when leaving home on that day. The significance of it being behind his daughter's photo with a single bullet for six empty chambers soon registered, though, given the context of his panicked flight to the room. Nate, I said in a low tone, swallowing dryly as I turned to meet his gaze. What the actual fuck, Nate? He closed his eyes, crestfallen. What the fuck, Nate? I demanded again, standing. Gently laying the photo aside, I swept up the revolver in one hand and the single bullet between thumb and forefinger of the other, holding both up before me. I said nothing else, just stood there holding out the evidence before him, his head low and eyes down in shame. You weren't meant to see those he sighed. I fucking bet I wasn't, I blurted. Jesus hell, Nate, tell me you haven't been playing Russian fucking roulette all these years. Sighing, Nate slumped to the end of the bed, back turned to me, unable to look at me or the weapon. Not all the time, he murmured. Oh well, that's fine then, I choked, every word dripping with sarcasm. While I was still in the service, I was always occupied. I had a mission and my brothers to keep alive. I had purpose. When I left the service at the end of my stint in 22 SAS a decade ago, that quiet became a heavy burden. His head lifted, but he still didn't turn around, instead staring back through the open bedroom door. It was the silence. Erin, 
the quiet was my worst enemy, because all it did was turn up the volume in my head. When you're used to the bullets flying, when you've always had a mission, a target, a goal, and no thought of any existential bullshit required because your only thought is how to keep you and your mates alive. How do you then live in such deafening silence? Without anything to occupy me, all I heard in that quiet was Maggie and Erin and their accusations. Jesus Christ, Nate! I huffed, angry as all hell, as I slumped down on the bed myself, staring at the gun and bullet in my hands. Why didn't you speak to someone? His shoulders moved in a shrug. This may come as a surprise to you, but I've a little problem handling my feelings, let alone talking about them, he said with wry, bleak humour. And playing dice with a loaded gun was your preferred option. I just wanted the silence to end, Erin, he said, and the despair in his words broke my fucking heart. But I was too much of a coward to do it definitively. So, I left it to chance. I'd put the round in a chamber, flick it shut, and spin it a few times. Then I'd put it to my temple and squeeze once. Just once. If it was my time, then it was my time. If not, then carry on. Nate, I chided, shaking my head while still staring at the small revolver. How many fucking times? Not many. It was usually around the hardest time. Her birthday. Which is? September 18th. Dear fucking Lord above, the hits just keep on coming. On his daughter's birthday, the same day she also died, I gave a gun to Nate and pleaded with him to take your death from me, Freya. The hardest day of the year for him and I put a fucking gun in his hand and asked him to take the life of someone he'd come to regard as a daughter. Is there no fucking end to this man's suffering? Why did you leave it here when the world fell apart? Don't know, he admitted. Thought if I left the picture behind, I could leave the gun with it. On that day, something made me leave it all here, and I convinced myself I had to go, that I had somewhere else to be. In a softer voice, he added, And I'm starting to think that something was you, Erin. What does that mean? I was a complete sceptic about all your theories, and though Freya said it wasn't as clear-cut as the Christian versions of God and the devil, there is something bigger at play. That much is clear now. The change in the undead, the dream with Freya, waking up with a white flower from that dream garden next to me. It's all so... so big. Now. He blew out a long breath, his body deflating from my rear view of him. So now, I look at everything that came before. This feeling I had to leave, finding you at the farm, remembering how stunned I was to hear you say your name, and you looking like I imagined my Erin might look if she was still alive. You're so full of life, Erin. You remind me so much of her. He laughed then, as a brighter memory bloomed in his mind. She had a smart mouth too, and a goofy, uncouth sense of humour. She got sick a little after her fourth birthday. But just before that, I remember her loudly declaring that farts were the most hilarious thing in all existence. He chuckled again and shook his head. So, to prove a point, she forced one out and only succeeded in shitting herself. Despite everything, through my own burning eyes and anger at the gun in my hand, I snorted a laugh. 
In fairness, that does sound like something I'd do. Nate rumbled a genuine laugh and nodded. I didn't want to come here, he continued. I never wanted you to know any of this or put any of it on you. It wasn't fair to make you feel like you had to bear the role of a daughter I lost. Freya said the truth would set us both free, allow me to really move forward. But I couldn't bear the thought of you hating me, Erin. I like this, Nate. The one that helps people. The one that does the right thing. But that, Nate, only exists because I don't want to let you down. I climbed across the bed and knelt behind him, dropping both gun and bullet to wrap my arms around him from behind, resting my head between his shoulder blades. You're a fucking idiot, Nate Carter, I sighed. The only time I'll ever hate you is if you ever think of spinning a bullet and putting that fucking gun to your big planet-sized head again. You hear me? His hands reached up to clasp mine around his chest. Copy that, he promised in a quiet breath. We left the revolver and its single bullet in the flat. When leaving this time, however, Nate took the picture of tiny Erin Carter in its frame and brought it home. Nate seemed lighter when we returned to the school. With his burden shared and his fears put aside of being Lockie's most hated, He's now amenable to us all being one community here at Crenshaw. I can see, can feel, the change in him already. I'm still fucking furious with him for putting that gun to his big stupid head even once. I'm looking out this window now as I type and think how none of this would exist without him. I'd be dead or still strapped to that fucking awful rack in the barn. Bancroft would have grown unchecked, terrorising Alicia and those other women still, maybe adding more captives to his kingdom. Dean and Maria would never have been reunited, and Dean, Sarah and the two boys would have been dragged off to the lair of mad end-of-the-world cultists. Nate has been the pebble in this apocalyptic pond, and every positive ripple that's rolled out from the moment he took down old McRapey on his farm has been because of him. Hate him. Never. Fucking furious with him? Massively. But I still love the guy. He might keep saying that I'm the special one. Thanks for that, Freya. But the truth is that Nate Carter, retired Royal Marine Commando and SAS operator, and father to a daughter long lost, is the real fucking hero of our story. So much pain. So many burdens forever taking more and more on, never saying a word of complaint, and all for one simple reason. To keep us safe. To keep me safe. Now we both know the truth, and we both know that something bigger than us is at play and the stakes are super high, I guess it's time to get to work on that. I don't know how we do it, or even what the fuck it is we're meant to be doing. But tomorrow is a new and brighter day, I hope. I wonder who this trinity are that have the entire fucking fate of the human race in their hands. Shit, I'm glad I wasn't that fucking special. This is more responsibility than I'm comfortable with. Hell, I'm the girl who goes to the shop with the specific need to buy milk and toilet roll and comes back with cake. I can't be trusted with the fate of the human race, so at least Team Light had the good sense to give the big job to three other poor bastards. Nobody waiting to be saved from the scourge of the undead will be thrilled by me entering the room, trying to remember what I was there for as I wander off eating cake. Nate said you told him that everything was three, just as Theodore did. All these little mini trinities exist. Or Minity, as I'm now calling us, because I can. Holding the front line so the main men and women can get their shit done. So there's me and Nate. But who the hell is the third member of our Minity? I also need to speak to Theodore and Elijah again. I need to speak to Theodore because he clearly said that everything was three and the first dreaming would start. And that's exactly what happened.
is Team Light in touch with him somehow. And I need to speak to Elijah because, well, because he's so damn pretty and I find his presence oddly calming. He's just so chill. I'm tired and I'm going the hell to sleep, Freya. I'm hoping I get a turn in the dream garden sooner or later. I'd love another chance to speak to you. Miss you so damn hard. Night, night. It's been emotional. Literally. December 9th, 2010. Worky, work, work. Busy, busy, busy. Nate, Alicia and my good self all moved to Crenshaw the last few days. It was sad leaving the lodge, because you're buried there, Freya, and I feel like I've abandoned you somehow, but I know this is for the best. With evil Jesus and his resurrectionists, rock on, out there, and now these royal fuck trumpets calling themselves the nomads as a rival for resources, it makes sense to keep everyone together. Pool all the skills and resources, and safety in numbers. Alicia has taken a room in Hallfire with most of the others, but Nate and I took one of the little staff houses across from it, a little two-up, two-down affair. It's right next door to the one Elijah and Theodore live in. And the best bit about moving to Crenshaw? I got my pug back. Particles has officially forgiven me, it seems. I swear that dog knows when things change. He's even being affectionate towards Nate, and that's never happened before, because Nate usually scowls at him and calls him a rodent. It's Nate's biggest character flaw. But lo and behold, like the dad who said he never wanted a dog and then won't leave the dog alone once he's got it, Nate sits in a chair in our little living room of an evening, brew or bourbon in one hand, a good book in the other, and that little dog whore is asleep in his lap. Little pug skank, just giving it up like that. Honestly, it's nice. Some of Nate's sharp edges seemed filed down a little since he opened up, and I like it. When it's time for game face, special forces Nate gets right back in the saddle and doesn't miss a beat, but on the home front he seems to be coming round to the idea of being part of something, and that makes me so damn happy I can't even articulate it. So much to get through in this entry. After moving here, Nate and Alicia gave us a rundown of their findings from observing Ascension. In truth, there wasn't all that much, except discovering the names of this weird first disciples to... Subdisciples? What do you even call the disciple of a disciple? Disciple once removed? Shrug. The first disciple, none of us have a clue, because they talk about and to him on the radio like he really is some second coming, and they just call him First Disciple or Revered Disciple. Freaky shit. However, we did learn the other two, a Jacob Tyler and Oliver. Second name of Oliver is unknown at this time, but Nate has pieced Jacob Tyler together because he always seems to be the one moving those undead sentries from the gate every time there's a patrol in or out. Sometimes he gets called Jacob, sometimes Tyler. Thus, he get the picture. At one point, Nate observed some kind of communal gathering in the central compound but couldn't see the actual events. It seemed like a regular occurrence lots of people attended, maybe a third of their number. Some kind of religious sermon or address they do weekly, maybe. Buggered if I know. Other than that, we don't really have much to go off. The hide that Nate set up is the only viable spot in the vicinity to get any kind of wide view. There are a couple of other high spots where the wall can be overlooked, but they tend to be views partially obstructed by buildings or trees, so the one we have is the only useful one for clear observation. We're not really sure what to do yet, and we've only had the one chance engagement with them, though we've seen evidence of their violent tantrums by way of the executed gated community. As there's a lot of them, we can't go picking a fight. So the question really is, should we bother with them at this time? After all, 
we've got a more pressing matter since the discovery of these nomad wank bags terrorising any other survivors they find. This was a bittersweet discovery from the Riches and Becketts. The nomads seem to be quite young, or at least judging by the groups they've seen. Late teens and early twenties, and all they've seen out and about were males. Bad because they seem to be assholes of the worst bullying kind, reveling in this new and lawless world. But the upside is the fact there must be more survivors out there if these nomads are a scourge to them. We just need to try and find them first. The fact we faced off against a group of twenty, and that's not their only group, is worrisome though. Yes, we appear to have major fire superiority over them, as only a couple of that twenty carried minor firearms, while the rest had a wicked assortment of melee weapons. Enemies that want to kill you that can think, however, are way more dangerous than the predictable shambling hunt of the undead. When we go beyond the gate to gather resources now, we'll have to roll heavy to deter them with an overwhelming show of firepower. Six of us with rifles, shotguns and semi-automatic pistols should deter a bunch of thugs with machetes and three-shell shotguns. Hell, Nate's worth twenty of those dick springs on his own, even without a gun in his hand. Never mind firearms trained extras like Dean and Eli as well. I forgot to write about my conversation with Theodore. Jesus, I'm getting all boxed up because there seems to be so much going on and so much to worry and think about. Well... I probably forgot about it because that conversation was a bust. It's really hard doing that don't ask a direct question to Theodore thing, especially when all you have are questions. With Eli's more experienced hand at it, he phrased my questions in that open-ended manner, but Theodore didn't have any further weird insights or messages from beyond. It's intensely frustrating, like it was just a freakish one-time thing. We've decided to go out on a resource gather again, into the same general area where we found the Ritchie family and Brothers Beckett. Nate being Nate, he'd rather take the fight to the nomads and remove the threat, so I think part of him is hoping for a second engagement with them. The ideal situation would be to capture one of the turds alive so we can drill them for intel. None of us like the idea of roaming scourges, harrying potential new friends we could help. Our new boy, Clyde, also offered up a bright idea we're going to action as priority for now. It's damn cold of a night and will only get worse through January and February, and Clyde is aware of a small business full of propane bottles. There are a few holiday parks dotted around the area, and this small business likely supplied them with gas for caravans and whatnot. The really big bottles that Clyde called size W. But I've no idea what that means, so... Do with that information what you will. However, there are numerous smaller bottles as well for the home gas heaters, which they also sell in their shop front. The garage that employed Clyde purchased their varying welding gases like argon and acetylene from this gas wholesaler, but as they sell propane as well, it could be a good way to top up our heating needs to get through the winter and save our other power reserves. Plus, if Clyde can get some welding gas and accoutrements, maybe he can armour up our pickup into a crazy Mad Max apocalypse warthog. Holy fucking shit. I love that idea. I'm going to explore that. There's a scrapyard up by that builder's yard, so there's a metric fuck ton of metal we could take from there. Clyde will totally have the skills for that. How have I only just thought of this? I'm slacking Freya. The warthog is my new mission in life. Let's armour and spike that pickup to the balls and see how the nomads like that shit when we roll up in an armoured Humvee in my new warthog. Yeah, baby. We'll have to get some wood burners installed in the school halls when the weather gets better to save a drain on our solar batteries and diesel generator stocks. But this winter, we could grab a bunch of those small bottle gas heaters and a bunch of propane bottles. Seems like a sound plan as a quick fix for our first apocalypse winter. The only downside? The place is up near the builder's yard, where Nate and the others got trapped some time back, so it's likely there's still a heavy undead presence round that area. It's not past the yard, so that's a win. It's a little further on from the right turn that bears onto the road running up to the yard. 
The gas shop is about 50 yards or so past that turn, which is why none of us saw it, in a little fenced yard on its own, set back from the road. It does mean any noise we make could draw that horde down towards us, though. On the plus side, as Captain Evil isn't specifically dancing their strings as it was that day, they should be back to their shambling, moronic selves, so we'll see them coming in plenty of time if we post a sentry on that corner. It does mean we should travel in force, though, taking more active shooters and ammo than usual. The gas shop seems like a quality resource, and Clyde says their bottle truck might still be there, so he's going to come with us and bring some tools and good diesel in case he needs to work on it to start the bitch up. That truck has a hydraulic tail lift at the back for loading and unloading bottles, and racks built into the open back of the truck for safely strapping bottles in place for transport. Seems like a winning plan. So, tomorrow we're going to roll out prepared for war. Naturally, me and Nate will go. Eli has volunteered to come along as an experienced shooter, and the fact that he's a trained paramedic and former army combat medical technician is a huge bonus. That means Maria can stay at the school, giving us trained medical personnel at both ends. I like that we have this capability now. Sarah wants to come for more experience. And bless him, Dean is letting her do a thing. Dean is staying at the school, so we don't have all our experienced shooters out and about. And he's very much seen as the school's de facto leader. He's always so calm, authoritative, organised, really good with people, and an all-round stand-up dude. I promised Dean that Nate and I would look out for Sarah and keep her close, and he seemed happy with that. Isaac's coming, which is a pain, but we need the labour and he can shoot. Alicia is obviously coming, because that girl is now a stone-cold badass of a shooter and officially in the upper tier of experienced security now. How many is that? Me, Nate, Alicia, Isaac, Elijah, Sarah. Six shooters. Four experienced. It's still funny I'm classed as experienced. And two more novice shooters in Sarah and Isaac. Non-shooters coming are young Zane, who'll be starting his shooting lessons soon. He turned 18 a couple of days ago, so as he's now an adult, Dean is okay with him learning to shoot. For now, he's just coming as labour. Clyde is coming as our mechanic and knows what he's looking for but doesn't have any firearms experience, which will obviously have to change. He's a big dude, and I just have this feeling he's going to be a shotgun kind of guy, which would be handy, as we've got quite a few shotguns and a shit ton of ammo for them. Surprisingly, the science teacher Graham wants to come and help out, so we're cool with that. We'll need hands just for labour, freeing up the guns a little. I think the scientist in him just fancies a nosy around a gas wholesaler, plus he's not left Crenshaw since the world shat its panties, and I think he's simply curious to see the world beyond the gate. So that's nine in total. Shit, that's our biggest mission yet. Dean, Maria, Mark and Nora have all got firearms experience, so if there are any issues on the home front, they've got enough to hold the line and we should be in radio range. Nate and I still haven't discussed the dreams with everyone yet. Our new larger community is still quite fresh, and dropping a supernatural bomb like that at the moment might just freak everyone out. So we're keeping it to ourselves. For the moment, it's business as usual. I still need to figure all that shit out, and I haven't managed it in the past few days. It's just so fucking... weird. Rest up, and tomorrow, roll out. December 12th, 2010. Willow Park. Shit, it's been a few days, and I've got a lot to cover... I better crack on, so no time for fancy introductions. I'm all about the business tonight. We rolled out in three vehicles a couple of days back. Nate drove the Humvee, because he's basically in love with it, accompanied by Alicia, Zane and Graham. I drove at the rear of our convoy, with Sarah and Eli in the pickup for company. 
Isaac and Clyde were sandwiched between us in the black Astra we gave to Dean. Yes, that same black hatchback from Bancroft's crappy sniper all those many moons ago. There was at least one shooter in each vehicle, but we stuck Isaac in the middle because he's still a relative novice. I'm still getting the looks from Isaac, and now Eli is getting them as well, much to my irritation. There's clearly a streak of jealousy, though thankfully Eli seems oblivious, or is purposefully ignoring it. We really don't have time for this shit. The journey to the gas shop was relatively straightforward, with only a few easily ignored wandering undead along the way. As we arrived at the gas shop, there was a large SUV parked across the open gate and a big white van inside the fenced yard with its rear doors open. Two men stood by the SUV and looked frazzled by the approach of our convoy, considering our lead vehicle was an armoured Humvee, and they shouted to their companions loading horizontal gas bottles carefully into the van. There were five men in total. The two men by the SUV had shotguns, but the other three appeared armed only with makeshift melee weapons. Their nerves only intensified when our convoy rolled to a stop. Nate, stepping out of the Humvee with a military-grade rifle over his chest, followed by Alicia armed with the same, put them visibly on edge. They didn't overtly threaten us because, well, because they weren't stupid. As we all poured out of the vehicles carrying L-85 rifles and Glock 17s, a look of dread resignation clouded their features. We don't want any trouble, said one of the men nervously, gripping the shotgun tightly, though he ensured the barrel remained down. He was around Nate's age, maybe late forties or early fifties, with a thick beard and lengthening dark hair, both streaked with silver. He was big too, about six four, broad chested, and looked like he could punch through brick. The other armed man to his left appeared mid to late twenties, and obviously related, with an equal stature and similar features, just more youthful. And we're not here for any, replied Nate amiably. We're just out gathering supplies for our community, like I guess you are. Nate looked over his shoulder and waved me forward. I'm Nate Carter, and this is Erin Locke. Fucking hell, I said excitedly. People who haven't tried to fuck with us. I turned to Nate. Is this a first, Nate? I think this is a first. Might be a first, he agreed with a stoic nod. Friends call me Locky. I said with a grin, stepping forward and thrusting out a hand. Doug Archer, he replied, obviously bemused by me taking the lead instead of Nate. I could tell because he took my hand, looked at me with a little confusion, then glanced at Nate for confirmation. This is my son, Finley. Finn, the younger man nodded, and I shook his hand too. Everyone relaxed as introductions were made, and it probably helped that I had a stupid, excitable grin on my face the whole time. Generally, if someone is smiling with childish happiness, they're probably not going to start a fight. Well, unless they're a really special kind of psycho. We chewed the fat for five or ten minutes, and they introduced the other three men, who I've completely forgotten the names of for the moment, because Doug seemed to be the man to talk to. He and his son both had UK legal Mossbergs, both just three shell capacity, as they're part of a shooting club, or were, down in Somerset, and were looking to try some of the ranges and events up here. Yes, Freya, Somerset. They have that awesome West Country accent that makes them sound super rural. Ooh, are ah, all right, my lover. Shut up and drink your cider. I just bought you dart. I promise that's the last time I'll attempt an overly stereotypical West Country accent in the written format. I just had to put it out there, simply because I think it's ace. Anyway, Doug and his wife, plus Finn and his wife, with their two ankle biters aged six and three, are big caravanners. They came up to lovely Cheshire for a family break to see the northern sights and arrived, if you can believe this shit look, the day before everything fell apart. Worst holiday 
ever. What a rectal prolapse of bad luck that is. Their second day here and everything went to absolute hell. They remained at the rural caravan park to see how things transpired because a five-hour drive of nearly 300 miles to the southwest seemed like a big risk. Boy, was that the right decision. They're part of a little community called Willow Park, about four miles from the gas shop. They were here stocking up on those big propane bottles for the park homes so they can cook and keep warm. Doug and Finn, with their hunting shotguns, are the only ones with any firearms and have essentially become the leaders of their little survivor community. There are about 30 people at that park, though about a third of that number are kids, from anywhere as young as three up to the age of 16. There are a couple of rows of about 40 fancy houses a quarter mile up from the park, which they've scavenged clean of all useful food and resources, helping them stay alive all this time, coupled with various supplies already at the park. Having put down about 40 to 50 undead over the months, they're pretty worried about food come the winter and also concerned with their dwindling ammunition. Between them, they've got around 25 shells left for the two shotguns, and after that, all they'll have are makeshift melee weapons. Those shotguns are probably the only reason they haven't been killed doing house clearances. Why haven't you taken the bottle truck? I asked, nodding towards it. Seems pretty precarious lying big bottles down in the back of a van. You work with what you got, Doug answered with a shrug. Truck won't start. Clyde is here for just that reason. I said, hiking a thumb at our big Scotsman. You'll be taking the truck then, sighed Doug in resignation. Just leave us enough gas for our people, would you? I laughed. Fucking hell, Doug. We're not here to just take everything. We don't need the big bottles. If Clyde can get that truck working, we'll load it up with everything we can, and if you're agreeable, we'll drive it back to your place with as much as we can. We only need the smaller bottles and some of the little home heaters from the shop to top us up. Oh, and any welding gas. All five men were genuinely surprised by my offer, and Doug looked to Nate for confirmation. Pfft, old guys. Don't look at me, pal, said Nate. If Erin says that's what we'll do, then that's what we'll do. Are all your people okay? I asked, basking in the glow of Nate's unequivocal support. Elijah here is a paramedic and former army combat med tech. If you've got any sick or injured, he can take a look. And Clyde is a whiz of a mechanic if your vehicles need a once-over. Eli just nodded his agreement, and I swear I saw the glisten of tears in Doug's eyes. Utter disbelief. Here we were, a bunch of highly capable and extremely well-armed strangers, just rolling up and offering help with no strings attached. You'd do that. Doug, I said, turning serious. If the living can't help each other out when the dead have taken everything else, then what's the fucking point of us being here? There don't seem to be that many of us left. If you've got 30 people at your place and kids to boot, then what kind of people would we be if we just left you to it? The deal was sealed. Clyde got that bottle truck working after about an hour's work, draining the tank and putting fresh diesel in it, doing some other fiddly stuff I don't understand, and after a few attempts, got the engine turning over and gave it a few revs. After that, we spent a couple of hours loading up all the bottles that both groups needed and loaded about six of the home heaters from the shop front in the back of my pickup. Once done, we went to Willow Park to meet our new friends. Well... Actually, that's not entirely true. Clyde revving that engine and us generally clinking and clanking about caught the attention of the mini horde at the builder's yard up the road. They took a while, and Alicia was watching down that long road just in case any of that horde made their way towards the noise. Contact, said Alicia over the radio. Undead coming from the yard. Me, Nate and Eli all moved to join Alicia, forming a firing line across the end of the junction, watching the shuffling horde gradually appear and shamble their way towards us. It wasn't a dense mass, like on the night I pulled their asses out of the fire at the yard, but it was still heavily populated. 
We're going to have to take care of these sooner or later, Nate, I said, especially if we've got new friends a few miles away. If a couple of hundred undead get drawn over to their gate and they've only got two three-shot weapons. Nate nodded. Semi only, he instructed the three of us. With four of us and each carrying three spare magazines, we should have ammo enough for the job. Pick the shots and try not to double up. Spread out in an even line and aim for those directly ahead of you so we thin out the mass and don't try and shoot the same targets. I'll start first with the scope at extreme range to thin the herd. The rest of you wait until they're at medium range where you can put them down with iron sights. Everyone clear? There were three resounding, copy that, from us, and we did as instructed. Seriously, Nate is an incredible shot. These things were about 400 metres as they came into view, and that's pushing the boundaries of the L-85. He let them get to about half that, knelt against a low wall of the nearest house to steady the rifle, and then started firing steady and smooth. There were little puffs of distant gore from Zed heads every time Nate squeezed the trigger, and the empty vessels crumpled to the road. Every single one of the thirty rounds popped ahead. Holy fucking shit, murmured Eli, seeing Nate in action for the first time. Eli's amazed reaction made me feel super proud of Nate. I know how good the old wolf is, but seeing someone else with military experience genuinely awed by Nate's skill made me appreciate him all over again. I got lucky, Freya. So damn lucky. Nate Carter is the fucking man. Reloading, he said out of habit, switching magazines and doing the whole thing over again. Sixty shots, sixty popped undead skulls. That, my friend, is fucking skill on an epic scale. Once he switched out his second magazine, the rest were closer, within a hundred metres. Okay, the three of you start putting lead downrange, he said. Let's see how far the two of you have come, and let's get a look at Eli. It's been a while, said Eli with a wry grin. Don't judge me too hard. I'm usually patching people up while bullets fly over my head. Means you can keep your wits, said Nate with a nod. Now, eyes on target, people. Less talky, more shooty. I turned my face slowly towards Nate, mouth and eyes gaping open in shock. Less talky, more shooty. That's like something I would say, not Nate. He met my gaze, one corner of his mouth quirking in a smile, before flashing me a conspiratorial wink. I have to say, this new Nate is even better than the old one. I think the three of us did okay. Not many rounds went awry, and once a few got within 50 metres or so, all three of us were pretty unerring on the headshots. It did us good and was cathartic, like a first major victory over the undead in some time. It really felt like we were making a difference in reducing the numbers, and Nate must have seen it in the three of us, because he called Isaac and Sarah to the fray as well, to give them some live trigger time with the glocks on the stragglers getting close. It was only minutes before the rest of our crew and Doug's people were all watching the five of us put down the slowly advancing scatter of undead, with Nate on overwatch, interceding from time to time when things got a little too close for comfort. He split his time between watching the undead, cleaning up any burgeoning problems, and adjusting the technique of us all, focusing a lot on Sarah and Isaac. Nate was clearly impressed with Sarah. Eighteen years old and already been through so much loss for a kid her age, she was smooth and solid like a boss. Two hands on the gun, steady and unflappable, and switching out magazines like an old pro. She was ten feet tall when she got words of praise from Nate, and it only spurred her to greater effort, rather than letting it go to her head, which is a trait Nate likes. Talented at a piano, and behind the trigger of a clock. Welcome to the new world. Isaac is improving, but he's just not a natural. He works hard, but there's something awry with his hand-eye coordination. Close up he's okay, but at any kind of range, he has to adjust quite a bit. Lots of low shots hitting chest and neck or a high miss. 
I doubt Nate will want to put one of the precious rifles in his hand, as his spatial awareness and depth perception seems a little off. We've got eight L-85s in total, four of them allocated to Nate, me, Alicia and Eli. The other four will be reserved for those who stand out, and I'm telling you now, it won't be long before Sarah is the next of us to have one of those in hand. Girl power runs strong in Team Nate. After we'd finished, the road was littered with corpses, and if we ever head to the builder's yard or scrappy, we'll have to do some serious clean-up down this road. There's no getting any vehicle up there without crunching over rotting bodies. You guys really know what you're doing, observed Doug when we were done, clearly impressed with the efficient victory. For us, it was good trigger time in a bit of catharsis, but to Doug's people, we must have looked like natural-born killers. We've had the best teacher, I said, hiking a thumb at Nate. This old dog is a former Royal Marine Commando and SAS operator. If they were impressed before, they were genuinely awestruck after I dropped that nugget. You only have to say SAS to a Brit, and as far as they're concerned, you don't get better than that. It's a pretty fair reaction, to be honest. If Nate is a yardstick for the elite of British Special Forces, then they must be fucking lethal in a fire team. After we'd dealt with the undead advance and gotten our little slice of vengeance on Captain Evil's infantry, we finished up our labour and headed over to meet Doug's people at Willow Park. Doug owns his own construction company, so he's got years in the building trade, and his son Finn works for him as a fully qualified electrician. Our luck in finding useful skilled folk seems to be unending. Doug's family is a full fifth of the 30 remaining on the park. There's him, his wife, then Finn and his wife and two kids. There are three other families with kids, two families of five and one of four. There are four couples with their caravans, as young as early 30s up to early 60s, and the final couple who own the little park are in their late 50s. A lot of people there made the grave mistake of breaking for home when everything started falling apart. It's a surprisingly large park and feels empty with only 30 people gathered in one section for security. There are berths for about 40 caravans or mobile homes at the back of the park and around the same number of static homes which the owners rent out or use themselves when on a little getaway. Since the park is largely empty, the remaining residents have moved out of their mobile caravans and taken up residence in a single block of the static homes, what with the owners unlikely to return any time soon. They're larger and better for those with kids. The statics also take their gas supply from the big propane bottles for heating water, powering gas stoves and running the gas heaters. The electric supply has long since died and they don't have any solar power here, just a couple of petrol generators. They don't really have the spare juice for them though, so they've really rolled back the years here and reverted to a far simpler existence than we enjoy. Naturally, when we rolled into the park in force, there was initial fear at the sight of our Humvee and the assortment of military-grade arms we carry. When we started talking, though, and Doug started singing our praises, I nearly fucking cried for how happy they were to see friendly faces. Eli got one of the medical kits assembled by Maria and started treating some minor injuries, giving people the once-over in basic health checkups. While giving those checkups, he smiled at everyone to set them at ease, waving away the constant stream of gratitude hurled his way. We passed out clean water and any food we had with us, and I nearly had my arm jolted out of its socket from the numerous vigorous hand shakes I received, each one warm and filled with such simple relief and joy. But Freya, they looked so downtrodden. Fresh water is clearly an issue, and once I saw everyone together, it was clear they've been surviving hard. They don't have spare fluids beyond drinking water to keep a regular hygiene regimen, and the sight of dirty-faced kids almost broke my heart in two. I think most of their supply has been from captured rainwater or scavenged bottled water and other beverages from those nearby homes. We're lucky being able to keep clean and healthy, and because we keep clean, the smell of these people made my heart ache. They were obviously immune to it, but we weren't, 
and Accordnate's expression as he watched Finn's daughter of six skipping in happiness, draped in dirty clothing as her grime-smeared face beamed with joy. I know what he's thinking. What if this was my daughter? Trust is the hardest commodity of all in this new world. But seeing these people, it was obvious they were no threat to us. Quite the opposite, in fact. They needed our help, and I'm damn well going to give it them. The following day, I was planning on going back again, taking them a shitload of crates of bottled water, food, hygiene stuff like toothpaste, toothbrushes, soap, clean clothing and some medical supplies we'd scavenged. Nothing we couldn't afford to give, though when I announced my plan there wasn't immediate unanimous agreement. Who were these heartless dissenting voices, you ask? Well, there was actually only one. Guess fucking who? Should we really just be handing over important supplies to a bunch of strangers? Said Isaac, right in front of everyone. I don't even know if he actually expected support. Personally, I think he just wanted to undermine me in some way, but the dickhead clearly doesn't know how to read the room. Everyone looked at him like he'd just asked if it was okay for him to have a shit in the middle of the carpet. Every other face had a, what the fuck, Isaac, expression pointed his way. You were a stranger until me and Nate cracked you out of captivity, I said, doing myself proud with how calm I stayed, considering all I wanted to do at that moment was dick punch him for being such a tosser. And you don't seem to have argued against us feeding and sheltering you. How much stuff have you collected on your dangerous missions beyond the gate, Isaac? That shut him up. I was hoping after Nate made him literally wet himself because of his shitty attitude, it might curb his stupid peak a little. But my growing friendship with Eli seems to have knocked the sense out of him again. There are kids there, Isaac, said Mark, his tone harder than I've ever heard from him. As the poster boy for single dads, he's pleasant and mild-mannered all the time, but that particular papa bear will have sharp fangs and vicious claws if you do anything that might harm his boy, and that protective paternal nature naturally extends to all children. The question isn't, should we be taking supplies to them? said Nora into the tense quiet. What we should talk about is when we move them here. We've got plenty of water, extra hands to work around here will be welcome, and yes, it'll put a drain on our food, and we might have to be a little more careful, but are we really just going to leave hungry, dirty children with no real safety or security when we have the power to do something? I'm with Nora, I said. They're exposed out there, a third of their number are kids, they're dirty, skinny, with only two shotguns and dwindling ammunition between them. Doug's a builder, his son's an electrician, and could probably maintain the solar banks and batteries. And there might be other skills in the rest of that community of major value to us. I stared daggers straight at Isaac, shrinking under the weight of popular opinion. But above and beyond whatever skills they have, they're living, breathing people who need our help. They're not the nomads, nor are they disciples of evil Jesus. They're just trying to survive in this messed up world. It's the right thing to do, agreed Dean with a nod. Anyone else against me making that offer when I take them some supplies? Every head shook in the negative. They all remember their time as captives, or struggling to survive out in the cold, until Nate and I started things off at the lodge, and Dean came to secure Crenshaw. Between the three of us, and I'll never use this against them all unless I have no other option, but none of this shit would be in place if it weren't for me, Nate and Dean. As long as my two dads are supporting me, everyone else can suck it. I mean, that's an oversimplification and not entirely fair, because the likes of Maria, Nora and Mark will always back our plays. But you get where I'm at. Nate and Dean's votes are worth the most in my eyes, along with Maria. The tension broke as particles waddled up to Isaac and sat, staring up at him with that expectant look of, well, human, on his little face. 
Isaac stared down, confused, before his face twisted in horror. Yes, Particles dropped a particularly malodorous dog fart at Isaac's feet, then sauntered away from him with a puggy swagger after leaving that early Christmas present to choke him. See, my home dog knows when people are being dicks and has his own unique way of contributing to the conversation, even when it's a fart to clear the room. People half laughed and half choked as they broke for the exits to escape the farticles of particles, no further discussion was needed. Wow, this has been a long entry and I'm beat. I'll do another in the morning after I've slept and cover our chat and offer with Doug. Right now, I'm struggling to keep the little black letters from blurring on the page. Always so freaking tired now, Freya. Surviving is hard. December 13th. 2010. The Offer. Okay, so I've got a coffee and it's relatively early. I like my mornings quiet and relaxing, easing me into the hard work that inevitably follows. I want my day to romance me a little before it does its best to fuck me, and Nate is up asking his usual question. What the hell are you writing in that thing? With our scene set, I'm ready to catch you up on the offer we made to Doug and his people at Willow Park. Just four of us went in the Humvee. Me, Nate, Dean and Maria. We're the effective leadership representatives, and it was also a chance for Maria to cast her eye on any sick or injured as well. Eli has mad skills from a first aid stance, but Maria has been a senior nurse practitioner for over 20 years, and Elijah isn't too proud to bow to her superior experience. Honestly, I felt a little out of place with such senior people. An experienced police sergeant, a qualified to the eyeballs medical professional, a former special forces veteran, and me, a mouthy warehouse worker whose only real qualification is a diploma in writing stories. You have to chuckle when you think about it. I just seem like the complete opposite of what Team Light needs as one of their special folk. I still think Doug and his people are a little confused by this foul-mouthed woman in her mid-twenties being our community spokesperson with such older, wiser heads beside me. But them's the breaks. Apparently, Team Light has decided my role for me, so I've just got to get on with it. Not that we're dropping that bomb on anyone right now. For the moment, me and Nate are still the only ones in the know on that front. It's just more sensible that way while we figure shit out. However, rocking up with a Humvee full of water, food, medicine and other such crucial supplies, I don't think they really cared. Doug's people hardly believed how their fortunes had turned in such a short space of time, finding well-supplied allies willing to share without any demands in return. The four of us sat down with the entire population of Willow Park in what passed for the park's on-site bar. It was big enough for everyone to congregate, and my three most favourite people in the world again deferred to me to deliver our offer. Nate has inside info on the supernatural selection, but Dean and Maria don't, so the fact that the two of them looked to me to make the offer was a real show of support. I love those two so much. So I straight up made the play. We had space for them at our location. We had power, clean water, the ability to shower, which, let me tell you, I think that sold most of them straight away. Weapons and ammunition, the skills with those weapons, our protective hedgerows and solid metal fencing that prevented undead simply wandering onto site safe space for the kids to run and play, and all the other myriad benefits that their relocation would bring. Basically, they're up for it. They've been surviving alone and with such difficulty for so long, the idea of warm buildings, clean water, regular meals, security in numbers by armed people led by a former SAS operator and specialist firearms officer, and two trained medical professionals, well, why wouldn't they? There were a few questions, though. How are decisions made? asked Doug. I mean, what kind of input do we have? 
Everyone gets to stay, Doug, I answered. We're a community, and any big decisions are put to everyone. We're not into keeping secrets, as that serves no one. Sometimes, though, we may have to pull rank. We? The four of us here will veto something if it's not in the best interests of our survival. Between myself, Nate and Dean, we're the ones who essentially provided the safety and security for everyone now living at Crenshaw. And the ones who've put our necks on the line the most in terms of resource gathering. Finally, the inevitable question I'd been waiting for was asked, as Doug had obviously been mulling it overnight. No disrespect intended, Erin, but how's a young woman like yourself the elected spokeswoman for your group? He gestured to my older companions. No offence, but here you've a military veteran, a police officer and a senior nurse, all older and more experienced. I didn't get the chance to answer. Joan of Arc led an army in her teens to victory at Orléans, Patay and Troyes, said Nate. Alexander the Great conquered two million square miles, stretching from Greece and Egypt all the way east to India before the age of 30. There's no age limit on leadership qualities, Doug. She might seem youthful at times when she speaks and appear a little unorthodox, but that's part of a charm. What you can be sure of is that when things seem at their darkest, Erin somehow finds a way to shine a light into that murk. She's been the driving force behind every good act our people have done, and everyone in our community owes their safety to her in some part, whether large or small. Including me, added Dean. Had Nate and Erin not appeared when they did, I wouldn't be here, along with three youngsters from the school. Nate kept his eyes on Doug. And she single-handedly rescued me and two others from an undead horde, in a creative manner that I doubt anyone else would have been able to pull off. Hell, she went out into the night on her own, with no idea what she might be facing, because she knew her friends needed help. He looked at me then as he added, This young woman has courage to burn, and she'll kick her way through a brick wall if it means being able to pull someone she cares about to safety. I'm very rarely speechless in my life, as you know by now, but the conviction in Nate and Dean's statements floored me. We all want to be thought of highly by those whose opinions matter to us, and the opinions of Nate, Dean and Maria are more important to me than anyone else left alive in this messed up world. Hearing them openly say such kind words in my defence really straightened my spine and lifted my spirits, as Maria sat beside us nodding at every single word to add her own show of support. Clearly the impassioned endorsement of the two men went a long way with Doug and his people, as all eyes turned towards me. Many were surprised, as you'd expect, but they all regarded me with a definite newfound interest. What can I say? I said with a dramatic sigh and a shrug, keeping my tone light. I'm a friggin' delight. A scatter of snorts and chuckles broke any lingering tension, and the atmosphere in the room relaxed again. Doug asked if we could step outside while they discussed it between them, but it was no more than five minutes before they called us back in. It's unanimous, he announced with a grateful smile. What's next? Well, I mused aloud, it'll take us a few days to get some of the other halls set up in readiness for you all, make sure you've got power to the other buildings and all that jazz. I guess all we really need to do is set up a day and we'll roll out in force to escort your convoy. What about the caravans? asked Finn. Dean answered first. Do you really need them? You'll have solid walls and most of the things you need. If you ever need to come back here for anything personal, it could be arranged, if important enough. It seems unnecessary trying to move them. Load up all you can into as many vehicles as can make the trip, and we'll bring our van with us for any supplies here. You've all been living in the static homes anyway, I pointed out. 
What date is it? Asked Doug. Do you know? It's December 11th, I responded instantly. Doing this journal makes me constantly aware of the date at all times. They seemed shocked. They knew it was maybe late autumn or early winter, just because of the weather, but I think hearing that it was only a couple of weeks until Christmas really rocked them all. OK, well, give us a few days as we figure out everything this end. Say, three days from now? The 14th? We agreed on the date, hung around a bit, and got to know some more names, which I'm not going to list, before heading back after a few hours. So now the work is going on in earnest. Yesterday and today is all about getting space ready for people, and tomorrow we're bringing them here. We've already decided on a heavy convoy. Nate will lead the way in the Humvee with Alicia and Eli as his main two guns, in case of trouble, and Eli's medical skills in case something does go wonky. Dean and Sarah will ride with me in the pickup because, yes, Freya, after Nate watched Sarah's mad pistol skills in the last couple of days, he's upgraded her to one of the L85s. The kid's a boss. I really like her. All our six active rifles, Dean uses his own G36C, will be at the front and rear of the Willow Park convoy, at the centre of which will be our white van to carry any bulk supplies back to the school. Isaac offered to drive with Clyde riding shotgun in case of any vehicular problems along the way. Also, that riding shotgun is a literal description, as it seems my prophecy tree bears fruit once more. Nate's given Clyde the shotgun basics, and he's happy to carry one. Amazing that people who'd likely shy from guns in the past are happy to carry now, especially people like Clyde with a family to protect. We've got plenty of ammo for the shotguns, and hopefully it won't be needed, but it's getting him used to carrying it, I guess. Hell, I can hardly remember what it's like to walk around without at least a Glock strapped to my hip anymore. As we go out beyond the gate all the time, I'm full up with a combat load of Glock, rifle, spare magazines for both, radio on my belt with earpiece and throat mic. I mean, shit, it's really hard to do parkour with all that stuff hanging off me in the field. Well, impossible, actually. Oh, yeah, that's one really great thing about living at the school I should have mentioned, actually. With all the open areas, crazy buildings of differing heights and spacing, fully equipped gymnasium and staircases and ledges all over the place, part of my daily exercise routine now is keeping my tracer skills honed by playing around on campus. For one hour a day, I get to take my Glock off and get my parkour on. Dean and Maria are forever shouting at me as I soar between two rooftops or transfer from one ledge to another with a cat jump. That's the parental concern there, as I'm constantly getting the be careful commands from them both. It's funny. I'm spending most of my time in the gym now, though, with crash mats, trying out new things, because the ground is pretty treacherous at the moment, with smatterings of rain and frost making rooftop runs a bit reckless. So, an influx of new people is on the way, and we're doing what I'd always hoped we would, making a safe place for the living and flipping the middle finger to Captain Evil's brainless minions. This place is going to get busy soon. Exciting stuff. I'll write again when everyone's settled in and the job is done. December 15th, 2010. Blame. Life can be unbearably hard at times in this new world. Today, life should be moving forward with all its old potential. Today, somebody should be starting their dream job. Today, someone should be walking down the aisle as friends and family watch on. Today, kids should be going to the parties of school friends, carrying gifts in shiny paper with smiles as bright as the sun. Today, somebody should be gathering their courage to finally ask out that person they've been hiding feelings for. Today, somebody should be hearing, I love you, for the first time. Instead, we mourned our dead. I feel so fucking low, Freya. 
This guilt is tearing me apart. If I hadn't been so eager with my stupid hero complex, desperate to save everyone, then maybe this wouldn't have happened. How the hell do I look people in the eye after this? How can I possibly suggest any course of action without them questioning me, or me questioning myself? I really don't want to write this shit down, but I've made a rod for my own back with this journal. I can joke and laugh all I want with my stupid, sassy ways, but if I don't write down events like this, then I'm not doing them justice. I'm not doing it right. I chose to, need to, make this journal and chronicle everything for you to help me sort through the whirl of thoughts and emotions that batter me. And that means I've got to take the rough with the smooth. We rolled out from Willow Park with a total of 11 vehicles in our convoy. Nate led the way in the Humvee with Alicia and Eli alongside him. After him was Doug and his wife in his SUV, along with the couple who owned Willow Park as passengers. Right behind Doug was his son Finn with his wife and two kids in their SUV. A van owned by a couple was next, carrying a load of supplies, then a minivan with one of the five-member families. Behind them was a car with one of the couples. Isaac and Clyde in our van were next, sandwiched in the middle of the civilian convoy with the other two families, one of five and the other four, in an SUV and car respectively. The last couple in their own small vehicle came next, then right at the rear providing security was our pickup with me driving and Dean and Sarah as active guns. Eleven vehicles strung out in a line, with a total of 38 people, and 30 of those feeling good about their upturn in fortunes. And then hell opened its gates. We were about halfway done on our route home, and everything was rosy, with little undead presence other than random wanderers here and there. To get back to Crenshaw, we had to go through the area on the outskirts of town where our first contact with the nomads occurred, so naturally we were on edge. However, if they were hanging around the area, we didn't honestly think a bunch of thugs with machetes, axes and a couple of guns would dare to take on a convoy of this size. Nobody could be that stupid. We couldn't have been more wrong. I was driving up the rear, and as we moved through a street with an open park on the left, a common place for dog walkers, and a row of houses lining the road on the right, I watched in abject horror from my position as three hooded figures appeared out front of some houses. Fire bloomed in their hands and then arced through the air to smash against the fourth, sixth and eighth vehicles in our convoy. The glass molotovs shattered against the side of the Willow Park van and the car containing one couple directly in front of Isaac and Clyde. A wash of burning fuel coated the side of the vehicles, bringing them to a panicked stop as they scrambled to escape their flaming vehicles out the passenger side. Things were far worse for the poor family of five in the SUV, just three cars ahead of me. By complete freak occurrence, the man driving the vehicle had his window three quarters down, and in a million to one shot of tragic misfortune, the petrol bomb sailed through the portal hole, only smashing once inside the vehicle. God save them, wheezed Dean, as liquid flame exploded within the car, dousing the entire family, all strapped into their seats. Thick smoke roiled out of the open window and even in the cab of the pickup. The deathly shrieks of the family jarred my bones, the three kids included. I will never forget that sound, and it will haunt me until the end of my days. Every drop of blood in my body was chilled by the dreadful screaming of burning children. We hardly had time to register that when around ten more figures appeared at upper windows or in the small front gardens alongside the fire bombers. A storm of gunfire erupted across our convoy. Freya. We got it horribly wrong. Those nomads only had minor weapons in our first meeting with them, 
but every one of these ten wielded pistols or shotguns, unleashing an absolute hellstorm of gunfire along the length of the convoy before we had a chance to react. Worst of all, one man held up a machine pistol and pulled the trigger, dumping the entire long magazine in seconds, raking it along the length of our column. The world erupted in a thunder of flames, screaming lead and violence. And then we were out and returning fire, Nate's voice firing into life across our radio channel, eerily calm in the midst of such chaos. Eli, full auto high with me. The rest of you suppress ground level. No holding back. Nate and Eli, both armed with full auto variants of the L-85, unleashed a counterstorm, dumping out a barrage of suppressing fire from the front of the column, using the armoured Humvee as cover. Glass fragmented in the upper windows, and chips of brick powdered in the air as 60 high-velocity rounds battered the upper floors where some of the attackers were positioned. A few vanished as five, five, six rounds punched into them, while others disappeared from view as they dived for cover. It was no time for single shots, and I switched to burst, just to put as many rounds as I could into the general area of the ground-level assailants, Dean and Sarah following suit, with support from Alicia beside Nate. Whether I hit them or the other three did, I can't really say. Adrenaline was high, and all that mattered was preventing another volley, especially from that damned machine pistol, so the six of us with rifles just opened the fuck up with all we had, filling the area with shrieking lead, so if anyone stupid enough were standing, they'd get a mouthful of bullets for their trouble. The heat from the flaming vehicles was intense, and even above the thunder of our weapons, the continued screaming from inside the SUV was horrific. Chilling. Can you imagine the sound of children being burned alive? soaked in petrol as their world is just filled with flames and agony. Fucking hell. I feel sick just writing this, but I can still hear them now. I didn't sleep much last night, and I don't think I will tonight. I don't know if I'll ever sleep well again after hearing that. Everything happened in a blur. After their initial assault and our counterfire, it was over just as quickly as it had started. Our ambushers were either dead, wounded or fled, because once we started trading fire, it was glaringly evident that our fire superiority was colossal in comparison. With Eli and Nate dropping entire magazines of 30 rounds each in about three seconds, there was no way the bastards were hanging around for a head-to-head -head with three shell shotguns and six round revolvers. Their trap was sprung, They'd unleashed unholy fucking hell on us, and once they knew they were outmatched, their survivors fled in the satisfaction that they'd hurt us. And they did hurt us. Viciously. The first two petrol bombs coated one side of the van and car in burning petrol, but that was all. Alicia put those out with an extinguisher from the Humvee, so there was no chance of them blowing, but the front tyres on the vehicles were compromised by the flames and wouldn't be going anywhere, and we certainly weren't hanging about to swap a tyre. The third, however, murdered an entire family. A couple and their three children, ages eight, twelve and sixteen. Freya, my heart is fucking sick. While me, Dean, Sarah and Alicia pulled security and kept a watch for any of the bastards thinking of taking a second shot and picking off any errant undead drawn to the noise. Nate and Eli moved along the column behind the vehicles, running triage and giving medical attention for the vehicle passengers targeted by the assaulting gunfire. The centre of the column had taken the brunt of it. It was an unholy fucking mess. The other family of five in the SUV behind the first firebombed vehicle were now a family of three. The driver, the family's father, had taken a round to the head, killing him instantly. His nine-year-old daughter, sitting directly behind him, was ripped up from bicep to throat by a scattering of buckshot and died on the spot. The rest of the family escaped out of the vehicle, the mother screaming as her now undead baby girl grasped towards them hungrily, 
her ruined face, white-eyed and furious at being unable to reach them while strapped into her seat. The car behind, carrying two of the childless couples, now only had one pair remaining. The two guys must have been sat in the front together, with the two women in the rear. The driver and his wife right behind him were shredded by the bulk of the machine pistol's rake, each taking multiple rounds. The other two people in the car had minor injuries, but alive without the threat of imminent death, and were quickly patched up. The worst of the non-fatal injuries was Finn's daughter. A bullet at one end of the rake had punched through her rear door, thankfully taking some of the sting out of the round, but it still smashed into her little thigh, and her screams, and those of Finn and his panicked wife, still ring in my head. We were lucky not to have more bad injuries or deaths, but nine of our new friends died, and three were injured including a girl of just six. Once we were sure fire wasn't being returned and Eli tended the injured, Nate rose like an avenging angel from behind the vehicles and waved me to him, his expression a dark cloud of icy rage. With me, he said curtly. Pistols up, let's make sure these fuckers are down. I nodded grimly, slinging the rifle behind me and slipped out the Glock. Nate took the lead and swept the area clean, putting down the dying or the dead for a second time with bullets to the head. There was a vengeful satisfaction in finding the dead man holding a machine pistol. At least that fucker was gone from this life. I recognised a handful of them from that first group when we rescued Eli and company, though their butt-ugly leader wasn't among the dead. Those we found alive were too messed up to question, already on a slippery slope from the mortal coil, so Nate helped them along. Most were already dead from a head wound or reanimating, getting put down for a second time. We did, however, find one on an upper floor winged by Nate or Eli in their suppressing barrage, who wasn't in any immediate danger of death. He'd been clipped in the shoulder, likely a ricochet cracking his collarbone, and as he fell, the little bastard must have banged his head and knocked himself out. When slapped awake, his day got infinitely worse when finding himself divulged of weapons and propped on his arse against the wall beneath the shattered window, with Nate and I sitting on the side of the bed opposite, both our pistols pointing at his face. His injury wasn't life-threatening, just really fucking painful, but he forgot all about that pain when Nate's tombstone voice whispered out, his rage on the cusp of detonation. Who the fuck are you? And what the fuck is your problem? Nate's words hissed through the gaps of his clenched teeth, and the guy, no older than twenty, near shat himself on the spot. I, I'm Steve, he stammered. I was just following orders, man. Mama told us to wait here, said you guys were bad news and we had to deal with you. Mama, I frowned. Your fucking mum sent you out to murder innocents. No, she's not our actual mum, he wheezed. Just the shot caller. Are you a nomad? The guy nodded. Yeah, yeah, a prospect. What? Prospects. Gotta earn the patch. No questions asked. It wasn't... What the fuck are you banging on about, you retarded toss fountain? I cut in, my own anger threatening to boil over. You've got to be fucking kidding me, muttered Nate. I looked at him, waiting for answers. Who the fuck do you think you little tosspots are? You're no hell's angels. You're a bunch of beardless pricks playing it outlaw. Hell's Angels was a name I recognised. Seriously? A biker gang? Are they even a thing round here? Small-time wannabes, maybe, thinking they're one percenter outlaw MCs. The patch is the insignia they wear, their badge of honour. Prospects get told what the fuck to do, when to do it, and no questions asked if they want to be a full member. You know a lot about this. Served with a guy from a real MC family. He had good stories. Nate leaned forward menacingly, keeping the Glock back from the wounded man's face, but very much in his eyeline. 
The threat was precise and clear. Where the fuck do you murderous cunts go home, and how many of you are there? I have never heard Nate drop the sea bomb Ever. His fury was titanic and barely held in check. The dickhead with the messed up shoulder was one wrong word away from a full magazine of 17 rounds being put into his face. They'll kill me if I tell you. The kid tried to force defiance into his voice, but it came out as little more than a wheeze. I nearly shat myself as Nate blasted around through Steve's right knee, destroying it. No word of warning, no flicker of emotion. He just lowered the barrel and squeezed the trigger, then hovered it over the left knee. Believe me, son, there are worse things than just dying. Normally, I'd rage at Nate for something like that, one, because blowing bits off people piece by piece isn't the way I like to do things, as it's messed up as fuck. And two, unexpected gunshots from two feet away indoors are fucking loud and make your goddamn heart freeze. However, Nate was in no mood for my scolding today. I could read the room well enough to see that Nate wanted vengeance for the innocent deaths, and nothing I'd say would dissuade him. I stood up to wave down at the rest of our group that we were fine, then turned back to look at Nate. No matter what it took, no matter how vile or terrible an act he might undertake to get what he wanted, Nate wasn't going to let Steve die until he sang like a scared little bird. And you know what? That fucking scared me. Steve knew it too. Nate's gaze remained fixed on him as the old wolf slowly unsheathed his monstrous knife with his left hand, gun still held in his right, letting the light glint from its polished blade. Pointedly, he tapped the curved tip against the man's uninjured knee. Crying through the agony of his ruined joint and cracked collarbone, his face waxen and eyes streaming with pain and terror, Steve started to sing. Vale College Campus, opposite the high school, he wheezed. There's about 40, most of them prospects. Mama's the old lady of the former club president, but he died. He was banged up the day before everything went to shit. She runs the show now, and there are five full nomads with her. They do what she says, so we do. The fuck are you doing with machine pistols? I don't know, choked Steve. They've got some guns, a couple more of those machine guns, but mostly shotguns and pistols. The guns only get handed out for specific jobs. We have to earn them by bringing back supplies or people using knives and clubs and shit. I'm o count. You can tell when Nate's really pissed because he drops to the barest number of words required to make his point. I don't know, man. Honest. Agonised and pleading, terrified he couldn't give Nate the answer he wanted, Steve's terror was real and convinced Nate he didn't have detailed intel. You bring back people. Somehow, Nate's voice managed to sound more dangerous as it dropped another octave. Steve's face told us both that we wouldn't like the answer he had for us. He's waiting. I urged, gesturing to his unblemished knee. Fuck, man, he wept, crying now with dread. We just do what we're told, right? Nate's hand moved too quick for the eye. The wicked sharp tip of his blade pressed between Steve's legs, eliciting a high shriek from the injured man that was more terror than the pain of his current wounds. One flick of Nate's wrist and he would be a bloody eunuch. Mama says they need people to do the menial work, he squealed, staring in horror at the blade pushing against his scrotum. And the guys need women to keep them happy. I took a deep breath. What the fuck is wrong with the world? What the fuck is this constant need for domination and control to make women possessions, to use and abuse as they see fit? Wasn't the fucked up situation at Bancroft's house bad enough? Somehow, this being condoned and managed by a woman made it worse. How many innocents, breathed Nate, pushing the knife deeper into Steve's shrinking sack. Exactly. 
and where. When they're not working, they're locked up in a couple of classrooms on the top floor of the tallest building, under guard. Maybe fifteen? All women? Steve just shook his head. And Mama, where does the bitch queen live? In the library, main building, right in the middle. Entrances. Only the main college entrance and one side fire exit are used. That comes out near the rear car park, panted Steve, still staring at the shining blade between his legs. It's where they keep all the vehicles, but they're behind a locked gate. Both entrances are guarded at all times, and all other exits are sealed or barricaded on the inside. Guarded inside or out for those two access points? Both. Time to leave, Erin. Nate's instruction was flat and lifeless. He got no argument from me, as I knew what was coming next. For what Steve and his thugs had taken from us, this time I didn't argue with Nate. Within seconds of me stepping clear of the room, another blast from the Glock closed the book on Steve's story. I didn't flinch. The convoy was a mess. Eli managed to stabilize Finn's daughter, but it was vital we got back to the school with urgency where Maria could assist. We couldn't afford to take the dead with us, as survivors had to be crammed into the vehicles still operational. It was a squeeze, but we managed it. Dean took the grim responsibility on himself of putting our reanimated dead to rest, a thoroughly unenviable task. Putting down a family of five burning undead, plus a little girl strapped into her seat, reaching hungrily for her mother and two older brothers as they wept nearby, a task's better suited for hearts far stronger than mine. We limped back to Crenshaw without further incident. Our people were waiting as Eli called ahead with the situation to Maria, and everyone turned out to help however they could. Before disappearing to check on his granddaughter, Doug approached me with a blasted expression. What kind of war have you dragged us into? He challenged. If I'd known there was going to be trouble like this, we'd have stayed where we were. We've lost friends, Erin. Many of them children. My son almost lost his little girl. I visibly winced at every accusation, a stab of guilt accompanying every word. I'm sorry this happened, Doug, but there are bad people out there that we can't control. These ones we've only recently discovered. You'd likely have clashed with them eventually. He shook his head. Within days of meeting you, nine people, all of whom I've worked and survived alongside this past half year, are dead. A third of us, Erin, and my friends. An entire family murdered, one couple dead, another family broken, and our son's baby shot in the leg. We'll talk about this more but I've other priorities right now. I wanted to argue back and fight my corner, but just didn't have the will. Every word of Doug's was like a punch to the guts, because you know what? He wasn't wrong. This all happened yesterday, and I'm writing this first thing in the morning before I go out among the people. Thankfully, Finn's little girl will be okay. But man, the archers are pissed at us. At me. This was not the happy unification of our two communities I'd hoped for. In some ways, I think things were made subconsciously worse for the Willow Park people by the fact that none of our group were killed, so we didn't even share their grief. Isaac took a scratch when a bullet shattered the window on the driver's side of the van, but it was very minor. So, while we came out virtually unscathed, Doug lost a third of his people to a fight he feels they had no part in. Nate's out for bloody vengeance. He's ready to do his one-man army thing and go after these people. He probably would have already if it weren't for Dean and Maria calming him down. I've never seen Nate so filled with rage. He's usually the calm strategist, but this has really got under his skin. But we have to be smart about this. Innocents can't get caught in the crossfire again. Dean raised some pointed questions, though. Dealing with all the trauma as we were, it hadn't crossed our minds until we had time to review the ambush. Why the hell were they waiting there for us? 
And how did they know to be there on that day? Steve said this mama character specifically told them to wait there and that we were bad news. That sounds awfully like Captain Evil's dirty fingers in the mixing bowl to me. That's a slimly travelled route for us since moving to the school from the lodge. We only went by that way as it was the best route to skirt the centre of town for access to the builder's yard area and gas shop and the vicinity of Willow Park. I doubt they've been hanging about there every day for the past two and a half weeks since our brief contact with their group. I can't see them loitering in one small area, in that kind of number, just on the off chance we might pass by. Something feels off. I can't think about this anymore at the minute. I've got to try and patch things with the Willow Park people as I'm public enemy number one right now. I need to see how they're all doing since the attack and at least have the common decency to show my face. The all I really want to do is curl up with particles and cry for the dead. I know it's going to be a bad day today, Freya. I might not write for a few days. Doing this entry wiped me out. I hate doing sadness and misery. It really takes the wind out of me, leaving me empty and lethargic. Today will be a hard day. December 18th, 2010. Cat out of the bag. Today, Nate dropped the bomb on everyone when defending me from Willow Park, as they've been personally targeting me with all their hostility these last few days. It hasn't been a pleasant experience being the focus of so many pointed fingers, accusations by bereaved family members and friends, and generally blamed for the whole raging shit show. Nate, however, finally reached the end of his rope with it, knowing me well enough that my guilt would leave me taking it on the chin without response. Doug has been especially critical. I knew my youth would come up at some point again. He clearly thinks I wield too much influence in comparison to the older heads around me. We assembled as one large group, and the Willow Park people clustered together, separate from the rest of us with Doug at their head. Accusations started flying again, and I did my best to walk the middle ground, but then Doug snapped out the words that set Nate off. I knew something would go wrong. You're too young, and I don't know why these people think you're so damn special. Because she is, Doug, snapped Nate like a cold bite. It blew through the room like a winter wind, silencing everyone. Nate has a presence, never more so than when demanding attention. If he talks and expects you to listen, you damn well listen. Then Nate went off on a long speech and told the whole community everything. His dream with you, Freya, the stuff about this trinity entrusted with giving humanity a second chance, how I'd been chosen as this flame at the centre of our own minor trio with a small part to play, how Captain Evil, he left out the captain when he said it, had targeted me after Freya's death trying to break me, the change in undead behaviour, and he dropped in the lunatic cult twenty-odd miles east able to command the dead at will. Doug, people are going to die, he said at the end. The world is filled with monsters, and not all of those monsters are the dead. It's damn bad luck that your people took this hit, and we're all deeply sorry for it. But your people were dying a slow death at that park, and you fucking know it. You were almost out of ammo, and the groups managing to survive with any real success are those with access to weapons. Even your group would have been up shit creek without your two shotguns. He let that nugget of fact settle with them, accompanying it with a pointed stare that Doug couldn't hold, before continuing. You can't fight the hordes with axes and clubs, and that's where you were going to be in weeks, maybe days. Sooner or later... You would have crossed paths with these people, or the resurrectionists, as they start ranging out this way in larger numbers. His tone softened a little then. We're right sorry for what happened and grieve with you, 
But don't put all the blame on Erin, and don't you dare put that blame down to her age. Your people made a choice, Doug, and take a look around. You don't seem to mind the sudden influx of food or clean water or the ability to shower, the medical expertise or the strong borders. This world is a pile of shit right now, and shit happens and will carry on happening. That's just a sorry fucking fact of this life. Don't try and put the guilt you feel for taking your people into that ambush onto Erin, because that ain't fair. That last line punched home like an arrow, and Doug's visible reaction confirmed the truth of Nate's words. I don't give the old Marine enough credit for how perceptive he is at times, and he was right on the money with that observation. Doug is racked with his own guilt for taking his people away from what they knew, with his granddaughter getting hurt in the process, never mind the deaths. He wanted somewhere to put that, and I guess I was the easy target. It's that poisonous phrase of, if only, rearing its head again, and Doug must have been beating himself to death with it. Feeling the weight of it too heavily, he decided to lighten the load of that burden by hanging it round my neck instead. The special stuff was pretty hard for everyone to swallow. Nate is the most practical person in our community, I think, so him saying everything had a little more weight than if it spewed out of my mouth. If I'd said a word of it, everyone would likely assume it was me being me and pulling some kind of weird prank on them. Nate, however, possesses a gravitas that makes people listen. I still didn't think anyone believed it, but then Dean spoke above the muted conversations as I just stood there, feeling awkward in the crossfire. Have any of you dreamed of the living since all this began? You could have heard a spider squeak out a fart in the following silence. Everyone frowned, thoughtful, before sharing awkward glances at each other. Dean continued into the quiet. I've only dreamed of people who I know to be dead, or think likely are dead, since June 23rd. I never realised it until Nate spoke of his dream just now. I've no dreams of my dad, dead 15 years, but I know my mum was alive before June 23rd, living in her Manchester flat, and I've dreamed of her. Survival in the cities is unlikely at best, I imagine, and I've come to terms with the fact she's gone. He turned to Sarah. I've also dreamed of John, but not Andrea. Sarah nodded. I've dreamed of Dad too, but not Mum, even though they're both on my mind all the time. Similar stories started emerging through the room. Nobody has dreamed of any living soul, and only dreamed of those likely to have fallen since the day all this started. Everyone fell silent as Nate spoke again. Freya said something in my dream that didn't make any sense at the time. He rubbed at his jaw thoughtfully. Trapped in this endless day. That's what she said. He nodded, assuring himself his recall was correct. I didn't register the meaning at the time. Like time has stopped, I murmured. And there was a really creepy moment as every set of eyes turned slowly towards me. Nervous under the silent regard of everyone, I blundered on. Like everything just stopped the day the dead started rising. Maybe that's what Freya meant. As the dead awakened, has everything else paused until these Trinity people do what they have to do? Like our dead are in purgatory, unable to move on until all this bullshit gets sorted out, or until Team Evil wins out and we're all gone. This is a bit much to swallow, huffed Doug. The dead speaking in dreams, sending messages, a trio of special people tasked with the salvation of all mankind. He threw up his hands and snorted in obvious derision. It's all a bit far-fetched. I don't know if you've noticed, Doug, but the world is currently infested with walking corpses trying to murder us. I softened my sarcastic tone before poking the bear any further. 
I think our benchmark for what's possible has moved a bit, wouldn't you say? You likely all saw or listened to the news before all media collapsed. This wasn't a virus or terrorist attack, as this didn't start in one place and roll out from ground zero and spread. Hell, I've been covered in zombie goop so many times that if this is a virus, I'd have been infected multiple times over. This started everywhere, all at the same time, as soon as the date ticked to June 23rd. I clicked my fingers. Just like that, every corpse, everywhere in the world, just sat up and started killing, and panic did the rest. Added to that, have you noticed yet that the walking dead don't rot? Their decomposition is frozen until you squish their brain, then the rot comes on like a rocket. Tell me how natural that is. The undead did change for a while after Freya's death, said Alicia, usually quiet in larger gatherings. A wall of undead waited for us in the middle of town and didn't react until Erin spoke. Then when me, Mark and Nate were all trapped by a horde, they largely ignored us but reacted strongly to Erin's voice over the radio. I didn't want to believe any of it myself, but I can't ignore what I've seen. She turned and met my eyes. They were targeting her, that much I believe now. Nothing about any of this is natural, so who are we to say what is or isn't happening? I gave her a nod of gratitude for the support. And let's face it, said Nora, the fact that there might be some people out there able to end all this surely gives us something we've been lacking for a long time. Hope, I finished. Nora gave me that grandmotherly smile of approval and nodded. Hope, she echoed. You're asking everyone to take a lot on faith, said Doug. For we live by faith, not by sight, declared Dean in a clear voice. Are you quoting scripture? Dean nodded. Corinthians, I'm not saying this is God or Satan, and I won't force my own beliefs on anyone. But there is wisdom and comfort to be found in the good book for those who seek it. I'm not saying you need to have faith in a deity you don't believe in, or that may be judging us. All I'm saying is that faith can be placed in those around you. You may be feeling guilty and projecting that onto Erin, but us being divided serves only the enemy seeking to hurt us. He smiled in a conciliatory manner. Don't seek to lay the blame for the recent tragedy at Erin's feet, Doug. Everything she's done since this started is encapsulated by another scripture quote and she shouldn't be forced to carry the burden of guilt for what just happened. She'll carry enough of it on her own anyway. An accurate observation there, Dino. And what quote is that? asked Doug. Dean turned to look at me. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly, Defend the rights of the poor and needy. He turned back to Doug after giving me a smile and a nod. My wife was saved from captivity by the actions of this young woman. Isaac, Mark, Charlie, Nora and Alicia would still be in the grasp of a madman were it not for the courage and willingness to help from Erin and Nate. And all that courage and willingness came from her added Nate. She practically annoyed me into doing it. That got a few bouts of nervous laughter. We too have suffered loss, Doug, continued Dean, and none of us can promise that the loss and grief will end here. The world is a dark place to be right now. He looked over at me again, pointedly. So, we gather round the light where we find it. I was super uncomfortable under the keen regard of everyone. I think my discomfort may have helped a little, though. Had I been standing there, hands on hips, chin high, with a cape flowing behind me like I was some damn hero, a lot of those words would likely have fallen on deaf ears. 
They were expecting gazes, though, like they were waiting for something profound to finish it all off, to cement this idea that I was somehow this flame of hope they should all be gathering around. Shit, I'm so not comfortable with this. At all. I have the capacity to burn a fucking salad when making one, so having the faith and hopes of all these people resting on me just freaks me out. I don't want that kind of responsibility. I'll help until there's no breath left in my body. But please, for fuck's sake, don't ask me to lead you. But they wanted to hear, needed to hear something from me. I looked to Dean, Maria and Nate in turn, the three people that mean most to me in the world. All of them nodded, their support total. Then, like a fucking champ, I felt particles at my feet. He'd gone up on two legs, his front paws resting on my shin and his big eyes looking up at me. Somehow, that little puggy expression said to me, You got this. I smiled, picked my little dude up in my arms, and his presence calmed the storm of discomfort whipping about in my heart and head as he settled against me, turning his outraged expression to the crowd and daring them to give me shit. Particles fucking rules. I haven't had a profound dream like Nate has, I said at last. At least, not yet. I can believe he's chosen as one of this supposed trio to protect this little corner of our world. And as much as it makes me uncomfortable thinking I might be chosen too, Nate isn't a man given to whimsy. Fact, agreed Nate, garnering another bout of chuckles. I'm not comfortable with any kind of supernatural responsibility, nor being chosen for anything. All I want is to try and do right by people. A code given to me by Dean and Maria, who took in a messed up, smart-mouthed kid and straightened her out. I wouldn't be who I am without them. Maria's hand slipped into Dean's and gave it a squeeze. I don't pretend to be anyone special, and I never want to be treated like I am. I fart in bed, I get hormonal once a month, I'm a complete arsehole to people when I'm tired, and I swear a lot. So much swearing, sighed Nate in a deadpan tone, eliciting more laughter. The old dog is getting funnier by the day. I grinned at him before turning serious again. But I'm human, and I will make mistakes, and I'll regret every one of them to my dying day. I'm sorry for the people you lost, and sorry to those who got hurt too. But like Dean said, it won't be the last time we grieve together. It keeps me awake at night, fearing who we might lose next, and I question every decision I make, every action I seek support for. But everything I do is towards one goal. I sucked in a breath for courage, and Particles turned his head up towards me again, sensing my disquiet. Again, that look said, You got this, human. When the moment comes and I take my last breath, I'd hope to have lived for something I believed in and that I'm proud of all I stood and fought for. Of all the eyes that might judge my life, it's those I see in the mirror I fear disappointing the most and those whose opinions truly matter to me. We have a chance to do things better than before, but nothing good comes without a cost. I can't promise we won't make mistakes, and I can't promise this will be the last time we grieve for those we lose. I don't want you to just have faith in me. I want us all to have faith in each other. We're all responsible for how we choose to live our lives, and whatever weird forces might be at play in choosing individuals for biblical-level tasks, we all have a say in how we build whatever comes next. I sighed then and spoke directly from the heart. One day, if we're lucky to leave behind anyone to remember us, all any of us will be is a memory. Given the choice, wouldn't you want to be a good one?
and know that you made a difference to just one person's life when they needed it the most. A profound silence greeted the end of my little speech, and I thought I'd made a complete fucking mess of the whole thing. When I gathered the courage to look around the room, however, many stared back at me with the shine of moisture in their eyes. The open hostility has since retreated, at least for the moment, and the group parted ways to absorb the bomb Nate dropped on everyone. Hopefully our words got through to them and we can all start moving forward. I'm so tired, Freya, and after all this, I could really do with you dropping in and saying hello in my dreams. I feel like I'm wandering in the dark and entirely reliant on Nate's light to find my way. And still one question remains unanswered. If Nate and I are two of our little torchbearer trio, then who's the third? And when the hell will they make an appearance? I can't hold Nate off any longer now. We've got to put a stop to these nomads before they do any more damage, either to us or to any more innocent survivors. Tomorrow we'll start recon over at the college they reputedly call home. Who is this third person, Freya? I wonder where they are right now. Account of Three Tori watched from the bed as Jacob dressed, her eyes inevitably drawn to the handgun at his hip as the former soldier strapped on his belt. The sight of it was a constant reminder of their new reality, though mundane compared to the unnatural gift bestowed upon Jacob and Oliver by their first disciple. Got a big operation the day after tomorrow, he said absently. I'll be going outside the wire for the first time since the resurrection. I'll be glad to get out and have a change of scenery. Oh, are you getting bored of the scenery? She purred, one long leg slipping out of the blanket as she lay on her side. Jacob smiled, eyes roving up the exposed flesh, then along her bare arm and shoulder, the long length of her hair trailing down her chest like a golden waterfall. She discreetly positioned the blanket just above her breasts, teasing just enough to elicit a laugh and shake of his head. Not this particular picture, no. He leaned over the bed and kissed her. You're the reason to keep coming back. Nice save, she smirked. Laughing, Jacob continued readying himself, perching on the edge of the bed to pull on his boots. There's a big supermarket distribution centre to the west, near the town where Tucker disappeared. It's a massive warehouse, so we're going out with a big crew. We expect there'll be a large undead presence there, as the place employed around 2,000 people, all told. Plus, survivors likely chanced their arm over the last half year in the hope of supplies. To save the drain on ammunition and noise, I'm going to ensure the dead behave. There'll be bottled water, dried food, canned goods, cleaning products, hygiene stuff, and plenty of other useful supplies. He pulled a lace tight. There's a lot of mouths to feed here, and the farms are great, but we've depleted our preserved food stores much more than expected. The mouths seem to be getting less, though, she observed, trying to sound nonchalant. Jacob stopped and sighed. Tori, we've talked about this, he said over his shoulder. Some things can't be avoided. There have to be sacrifices so the many can live. It's the way of things now. She nodded and affected a yawn, letting the subject drop. Jacob would not be moved on it, but then he was one of the triumvirate, the three men able to command the walking dead to his will. That dark gift bestowed by the first disciple was the greatest of honours in his eyes, returning a purpose and meaning lacking in his life since leaving the army. Have you seen my ankle holster? He asked, eyes moving round the room. I haven't seen it for a few days now. No, she said, pretending another casual yawn. You were quite feisty a few days ago, though, and we were tearing each other's clothes off in a hurry. 
It might have been kicked under some furniture. Jacob grinned in remembrance. You were particularly hot and heavy that day. Tori shrugged. Sometimes a woman wants what she wants. I'll have a look around for it. He leaned over and kissed her again. What would I do without you? I'm sure you'd find some other starry-eyed woman willing to warm the bed of the first disciple's most trusted follower. You wouldn't want for attention, I'm certain. There's only one woman's attention I need or want, he said, his face close to hers and voice a low gravel. Nice save again, soldier. Jacob grinned, retreating to finish lacing his boots before donning his tactical vest. I'll see you later, he asked. I'll check my calendar and see if I can fit you into my busy schedule. Kissing her one more time, Jacob lifted his rifle from the rack on the wall and left her alone. The moment Jacob departed, Tori shuddered and leapt from the bed, turning on the shower to scrub herself clean. It was a credit to her skills as an actress that Jacob was unaware how revolting his touch was to her. But once alone, her expert facade crumbled. She raked at her skin with the soap and cloth, desperate to wipe every particle of his scent from her body, shivering at the memory of his rough and roving hands, despite the steaming water. The cult's mentality had always fascinated and revolted Tori in equal measure, studying the subject a decade earlier for her thesis in psychology at Oxford. Mere study of the topic, however, was never enough. Driven by a need to expose the madmen and charlatans exploiting the vulnerable for their own twisted design, Tori was never content to simply examine the ashes after the cult fires had burned out. Instead, she used all that knowledge and experience to seek justice for those unwittingly subjugated, transferring her academic studies into the field of investigative journalism. Exposing the foul sects manipulating their vulnerable masses by destroying them from the inside became her life's work. After discovering the Children of the Resurrection just over a year ago, she traced the cult's expansion back to its inception, delving into the history of their prophet, John Maddock, only to discover an unremarkable man somehow making himself a revered voice for the disaffected and outliers at the edge of society. With the massive fortune of Oliver Hargrave backing the growth of his religion, Maddock was catapulted from total anonymity to the leader in a settlement of hundreds. Tory's suspicions regarding Maddox's motivations moved her to infiltrate the cult and gather intelligence from within, going undercover in the Children of the Resurrection four months before the world collapsed around them. Exposing him as the fraud she believed him to be would catapult her career into the stratosphere, with endless book deals and seminars if she cracked this case. It would transform her career into a prize-winning one, Living among the resurrection cult and pulling back the curtain to expose Maddock for the fraud she knew he was? Well, that would be the making of Victoria Cates. More than any desire for recognition, though, she wanted the people he manipulated to really see the man behind the performance. She needed him to feel the consequences of every twisted deceit. There was no doubt Maddock intended to bleed the fortune of the young and impressionable Oliver Hargrave, abandoning the people so expertly fooled once complete control of the Hargrave purse strings was his. Maddock was a consummate performer, charismatic and intelligent, but with a history of failed careers and crumbled attempts to make an easy fortune. Nothing of his former life suggested anything akin to spiritual or religious beliefs, or an affinity with any doomsday preparation ethos. He was a classic case of psychopathic narcissism, hell-bent on achieving adoration, control, wealth, and personal comfort. For four months, she quietly gathered intelligence, integrating herself as a loyal and devout follower, 
making friends among the community and establishing herself as a popular mid-level leader. She did not rise high enough for major scrutiny by Maddock himself, but enough to give her sufficient access to observe the man in his interactions at intervals. Initially, she considered beguiling the awkward young Oliver Hargrave, as Tory was aware men found her attractive, and what a valuable weapon in her arsenal that could be. However, when she inadvertently stumbled on Oliver in a passionate tryst with another man, that option was removed from the board. Oliver had never been overt about his sexual preference, and Tory could only speculate as to his reasons. Maybe his old money family disapproved. It was impossible to say, and she would never truly know, but in the wake of this discovery, it became glaringly obvious to Tory's keen eye that Oliver was besotted with Maddock beyond the reverence of being their leader. With Hargrave off the board as an option for gathering intelligence, Tory opted to integrate herself among the masses, her goal instead to make herself popular among the people. Tory found them to be largely simple folk, many of them soft-hearted and gullible, or socially awkward individuals chewed up and spat out by life's many trials and tribulations. There were the vehement ones, of course, who ardently believed in, and wished for, the end of society, steering clear of those individuals as she identified them. Their suspicions were easily aroused, even if her manipulations to gather intelligence were subtle. The bulk of the resurrectionists, however, were the lonely, isolated, awkward or gullible. They just wanted to be part of something. Tory made substantial progress, but then, on the 23rd of June, the world did end. The children of the resurrection now existed as both her rock and hard place. They provided safety and security against the collapse of society, with openly armed men and women, plus clean water, power, medicine, food and shelter. Yet the day after the end of the world was announced, everything changed. Tori chanted with the rest of the followers to retain her cover, but watching Maddock speak of the Lord of the Dead coming to him in a dream had been chilling, a performance to rival any Academy Award-winning actor. Claiming this dark spirit granted him a gift able to shield them from the horrors beyond their walls, his performance ended with the cutting of a dying man's throat as they all bore witness to his dark miracle. Tori had been horrified, even more so as she witnessed the reality of the rising dead for the first time, as the cancer-ridden corpse of George Watts climbed to its feet, its eyes painted a sickly glowing white. Maddox's voice boomed with power, sending a wave of ice rippling through every fiber of her being, the taste and scent of blood coating her senses, and the assembled followers watched in awed horror as the monster obeyed him. Such was the birth of Maddox's dark gift. The terrifying ability extended to Oliver Hargrave, rewarded as the architect of their settlement, and Jacob Tyler, the man tasked with leading the armed security of the resurrection and Maddox's own personal militia. The black price of that gift was now all too stark. Initially, the followers reacted with joyful glee, protected thanks to George's sacrifice, a dying man's last gift to his community. But George was only the first. The dark gift was discovered to be finite and demanded regular renewal. For the three men to retain their unnatural command of the dead, each were required to offer a sacrifice to the monstrous force that unleashed this terrible darkness upon humanity. Every week, the blood of three living people had to be spilled in tribute for their continued protection. Maddock and his two chosen disciples, each required to cut the throat of a living sacrifice and spill blood with their own hand to retain their chilling power. Desperate people appeared at their gates, begging for shelter, initially welcomed with open arms, only to be later betrayed. 
Raiding parties ranged out from Ascension, looking for more captive survivors to be offered as sacrifice to this dark force and allow Ascension's people to remain sacrosanct. Maddock persuaded his followers they were the chosen of the resurrection, spared and protected, providing the lives of outsiders were offered in their place. Despite the dread price, at first the followers felt nothing but shameful relief. They were protected, they said. Smaller sacrifices must be made, they said. It was a lesser evil to protect the greater good, they said. In Tori's experience, from a career delving into the darkest corners of humanity, there was rarely anything that could be deemed a lesser evil. No matter how it might be perceived or measured to soothe a troubled soul, evil would always be evil. The people swallowed the stories Maddox spooned with little question. With hearts starved of courage by the world's end, they ingested any lie, even one to themselves. It's necessary, and though tragic, humanity has to survive. There are always casualties in war. Better others than our own. Lies. Wicked lies to justify acts of supreme cowardice. Inevitably, though, the flow of survivors outside the walls became scarce. Locating them became increasingly difficult, and then one day, six weeks earlier, their reserves of captive sinners ran dry with the day of the sacrifice at hand. With no outsiders to lie on their bloody altar, three of their community were found guilty of crimes against their own. They were thieves, declared their illustrious leader, stealing from their brothers and sisters, attempting to purloin extra food for themselves at the cost of the community. Such betrayal could not be abided, according to Maddock, for it was a litany of such selfish actions that resulted in humanity's apocalyptic judgment. An example must be made and the first three of their own people were sacrificed for the triumvirate to retain their power over the dead. Raids outside the wall became more frequent and frantic in the hunt for captives, but the second week arrived with their basement dungeon empty. Three more of their own were found guilty of fabricated crimes, always the required three, and they paid in blood for Maddock, Hargrave and Tyler to keep their grisly power. Quiet discontent began stirring, though only behind closed doors, fearful the triumvirate would select such malcontents for their next victims. Tori had to find some way to survive and keep herself from becoming a slab of meat on their altar of sacrifice. With Maddock picking and choosing women to warm his bed, and Oliver clearly uninterested in the advances of women, Tori set her sights on Jacob. It took every ounce of her considerable performance skills to seduce him and engage in a passionate physical affair with the former soldier, knowing his hands were stained by the blood of the innocent. She put it all aside, playing the role to perfection despite her revulsion, ensnaring Jacob with all her female wiles and making him desire her, even love her, so that he would kill anyone daring to suggest her for the sacrificial altar. With such newfound status, she was protected from the ritual killings and hoped to exert some of her influence to protect the downtrodden. Day by day, the ruse was harder to maintain. On the nights Jacob blooded his hands with a sacrifice, his ardor and passion were more intense, as though the act of renewing his power aroused him, and each night with him destroyed another little piece of her soul. The seventh night was the hardest of all, forced to mirror his fervent need, wrapping him in her web of seduction and bringing him to the height of pleasure and passion so he remained ensnared in her web of influence. Afterwards, she was left sickened and solid, as though the blood from his hands seeped into her soul as he poured at her, blotting out any light left within. Her relationship with Jacob began as a matter of simple survival, and in hope she could help the innocent population of Ascension. 
but her influence was too limited, and Jacob's zeal too strong. Recently, however, another option revealed itself, and now Jacob handed her a potential exit to explore it. There was another group of survivors outside their wall, as Jacob spoke often of them. There are three the first disciple declares a threat, he'd said one night as she lay in his arms after sex, continuing the skin-crawling ruse of affection. And that time draws closer when our triumvirate will overcome theirs. Apparently, the time has to be right, something about the mystic power of three. Either way, they're out there somewhere. The first disciple says if we can sacrifice even one of those three on our altar, we'll never have to make another sacrifice again. The deaths of even one of these people will satisfy the dark spirit, and we can start moving forward. Where are they, do you think? She whispered, forcing her question to sound like casual conversation. About twenty-odd miles west. Tucker and his crew went missing over that way, and the first disciple says the dark spirit told him they died at the hands of those evil ones. Evil ones. It was hard not to pour scorn on Jacob when he said such things. If another group directly opposed Maddock, Tyler and Hargrave, then they weren't the evil ones. They were the hope for them all. With Jacob's revelation regarding the resource operation into the area where Tucker went missing, this might be her only chance to escape and find sanctuary elsewhere. Only security personnel were permitted to venture outside the wall, or those with the exact required skills for a specific task, and even those selected individuals would be heavily escorted. Tori's skills fell into neither category, though she managed to convince Jacob into teaching her basic firearms operation. Naturally, he had no desire for her to join the security force, so she promised to drop the subject, providing he taught her how to defend herself properly. He agreed to the compromise if she let the other request go, and now Tori had the means and ability to protect herself at a basic level. A few days ago, in a night of pretended passion after his sacrificial ritual, she slipped the small revolver in its ankle holster beneath the mattress. When he returned to duty the following morning, Tori carried her contraband back to the small room in a dormitory building she called her own. Acquiring any more ammunition was impossible, so the six rounds would have to do, but it was better than nothing for protecting herself against the undead when she finally made her escape. The notion of being alone in a world of the murderous dead terrified her. But the thought of staying with Jacob and the monstrous living was far more chilling. The sword of Damocles hung ominously over ascension. Without intervention, the blood would continue to flow, and that sword would eventually fall. The dead were puppets of some dark force a fact impossible to deny given all she had witnessed from Maddock, Tyler, and Hargrave. The undead were killers by nature and design, but Maddock and his cronies chose their path, justifying it as some warped vision of a greater good. Power and control were their real truths, elegantly dressed in an illusion of saving humanity. Drying herself off and rubbing her skin red with the towel, Tori dressed and left Jacob's house, praying her time enduring his sickening touch was finally at an end. Later that day, the knock at Tori's door almost caused her heart to seize in fright. The urgent rattle came just as she was zipping up a small backpack of supplies. In readiness for her escape, she stuffed food, bottled water, spare batteries, a flashlight, and some articles of clothing into the bag. Quickly placing the ankle holster with the small revolver into the backpack, she stuffed it under her bed. The moment Tori opened the door, Catherine swept into the room in a frenzied state of distress. Almost thirty, she was a homely, dark-haired woman, overlooked and forgettable in the pre-apocalyptic world. 
Shy, soft-hearted, and timid, she still found the strength to escape an abusive relationship with her baby son, Samuel, two years earlier. Since arriving at Ascension, she had fallen in love with Gerald, ten years her senior and a former warehouse manager who was part of the inventory management team at the settlement. Chet's broken his ankle, puffed Catherine by way of greeting, her voice hushed and frantic. Oh no, Tori closed the door. Here, sit down. Is he okay? A pallet slipped and crushed it. Tori, the doctor says they might have to amputate his foot. Tori sat the frazzled woman down, taking a can of fizzy orange from the cupboard and cracking it open. Have a sip of this and take a breath. Catherine accepted the drink and supped from it her eyes a little wild as she turned her gaze to the taller, blonde woman. Tori, Gerald's skills are easily replaced, she said with a quiver. They can easily teach someone else to manage the stores. His recovery time will be a drain on resources, and while he sits idle, I'm terrified. She left the sentence unfinished, but her fear was plain. Gerald might be seen as a burden on the community, and the triumvirate would find a way to select him in the next trio of sacrifices in a couple of days. I was wondering if you could... Well, you know... Catherine was afraid of saying it aloud, but the fear for her man pushed her onwards. I was hoping you might be able to speak to Jacob... What with you two being so close? This wasn't the first time someone came with such a plea in the past few weeks. Tori's position gave her great influence with the common people of Ascension and their best hope of salvation. Being so close to one of the triumvirate gave her power in their eyes, able to influence Jacob in steering choices away from their loved ones, and she was warm-hearted and approachable with it. It was an unenviable position, though, because for all the good she might be able to achieve in staving off a sacrifice, ultimately one would still be made. Saving one person only moved the burden of sacrifice to the loved one of another. The only way to stop the madness was an end to the unholy trio empowering themselves with innocent blood. This other trio Maddox sort might be the catalyst for that change. All she had to do was escape and somehow find them. Gerald should be fine, Catherine, she assured. They can't fabricate a crime for an injured man in the infirmary without obvious suspicion, and they're all about making it look like the offending individual could have committed a crime. His injury will actually keep him safe for now, as it goes against their narrative. She took the woman's hand. But... I'll do what I can. I promise you. The woman lifted Tori's hand to her lips and kissed it, an act that discomforted the journalist more than she let on. Bless you, Tori, said Catherine, almost sobbing. He's so good with Samuel. You know he said, Daddy, for the first time the other day. He was so happy, Jed welled right up. Catherine shook her head, her voice little more than a breath. I can't bear the thought of losing him, Tori. A hollow chasm opened in Tori's heart as she hugged Catherine, reassuring her again to do all she could before closing the door behind the woman, leaving her alone with only despair for company. Knowing she would never have that conversation with Jacob broke Tori's heart. The day after tomorrow, the heavy convoy was heading out to this distribution centre, Tori already located Jacob during the day, telling him she was unable to see him this evening or tomorrow evening before he went on mission. Her pretense of feeling unwell and coming down with something, and therefore not wanting to chance making him ill before such an important duty, was accepted with a loving smile from Jacob as he complimented her thoughtfulness. The moment they were back from the distribution centre, he would check in on her, he promised. More lies followed about looking forward to his visit while falsely wishing him safety and good luck. Her intention was to hide in one of their trucks the night before they moved out. 
Escape was her only goal, and the hope of never enduring his revolting touch again. It was the good people trapped here that pained her, like poor Catherine's little family. She might escape, but what of their fate? Many of the people were friends to her now. They weren't all blind zealots, though an unhealthy number of those did reside within Ascension's borders. Most of the people were just the forgotten of society, the timid and the gullible, or those simply lost and looking for some meaning to their lives. They didn't deserve the fate of sacrificial lambs upon a dark altar, just so some pre-apocalypse con artist and his close henchmen could maintain their control over this new world. Within their walls, humanity accelerated its own demise, when they should be saving lives and rebuilding the human race. Theirs was a madness of extinction proportions, and something, or someone, had to stop Maddock, Tyler, Hargrave, and all the other zealots blindly supporting them, or the good folk just wanting peaceful lives would be the ones to inevitably suffer. It was mid-January, and Jacob alluded to some wild plan of Maddox involving the mystical number of three. All Tory's instincts screamed the third day of the third month, only six or seven weeks away now. Escape was her only option, as her plan really was for the greater good. At least, that was what she told herself. Tory opened her eyes breath catching as her gaze danced over the water. She instantly recognized the location, and the familiar sight eased her initial shock. Sat on the porch steps of a large log cabin, halfway up a hill overlooking the sparkling expanse of Lake Windermere, Tori released a contented sigh as the bright summer sun illuminated the shining water, while lazy white clouds drifted through a sapphire sky. Tree-scattered hills of emerald green encompassed the vast body of water. Tiny white buildings dotting one border of the lake below to her left, marking the picturesque town of Bowness on Windermere, home to around 2,000 people. Many summers were spent here as a child, and she adored the Cumbrian Lake District. Being city-born and surrounded by urban sprawl, the vast swathes of green countryside and sparkling lakes were like being transported to a fantasy world as a child. Fields and woodlands were there to be explored. Wildlife never seen in the shadow of London's towering grey spires teemed all around, and crisp country air breathed deep, free of the city's choking smog. Her father was a cardiovascular surgeon at a top private hospital in London, but her mother always brought Tori and her younger brother to the Lake District for three weeks of the summer holidays, visiting Tori's auntie in the little Windermere town. She and her brother played for hours in the countryside with their two cousins, and she was never happier as a child than when staying in the large cabin overlooking the lake. Her father would steal away to join them for one of those three weeks, and they would wander the countryside on hikes of exploration, swim in the lake, or take a boat out onto the waters. It was magical. This is beautiful. Tori started at the soft voice behind her and turned. On the bench beneath the cabin's kitchen window sat a young woman of astounding beauty, almost angelic in appearance. Her hair was as black as midnight, but shimmered like dark silk as the sun's rays kissed it eyes deep brown like a doe's hide. Draped in a simple white dress, suffused with light, her small feet remained bare on the polished wood of the porch. Tori estimated her somewhere in her twenties, but such was her presence she appeared somehow... ageless. Who are you? asked Tori. The woman was unknown to her, and she wondered why this vision had been conjured to her lucid dream. My name is Freya, answered the vision, her voice light and musical. Tori felt no unease at the woman's presence. In fact, she felt just the opposite. 
Freya's presence was as serene and calming as the spectacular vista of the lake beneath summer's blazing eye. Do I know you? Have I ever known you? Freya shook her head slightly. No, Tori, we've never met before this moment. But now is the right time for us to talk. The right time? Tori frowned her confusion at the beauty on the porch. What does that mean? Tomorrow night, you're planning to escape the place called Ascension. So this was the last time you'd sleep before then. This was the only time we could talk safely. When you sleep in the bed of that man, you're unreachable, as though shrouded in darkness. It's uncomfortable to pierce, and too great a risk, in the event we played our hand too early and brought you to the attention of the dark. Tori shivered at the last words. The dark. The name slithered through her senses, coiling around her spine and chilling her bones. It sounded aptly bleak. I don't understand. Freya turned her gaze from the scenery for the first time, and Tori felt tears well at the corner of her eyes. In Freya's eyes, she discovered pride, regret, and boundless compassion all perfectly entwined within a single glance. You've been so strong, Tori, enduring what you have, said Freya, her voice like the touch of silk upon the skin. And you've come to see the truth about many of those people at Ascension. They're not evil or dangerous zealots. They are lost lambs in the field of life, unable to find their place out in the cruel wild and need someone to help guide them. Maddock prayed on that, just as the dark preyed on him, appealing to the shadows already lurking within his selfish heart. He's a coward and betrayer, and only a true believer now because the dark appealed to that part of him craving satisfaction. Power, importance, adoration. These transient things that have no true meaning no true worth in the spectrum of human existence. Who are you? whispered Tori. Someone simply playing their part in her own small way. A part of what? Freya smiled, which only served to enhance her unearthly beauty. You've seen enough now, Tori. You know there are forces greater than our understanding, and our very existence is judged across this world for allowing its ruination. A great war rages for a chance at redemption. One final throw of the dice for salvation or our ultimate destruction. Thousands of battles are fought across our darkened world, and while some will be victorious, so many will be lost as humanity embraces the darkest aspects our kind is cursed with. Is there any hope? Freya's lips quirked in another smile. Despite the many defeats in this desperate battle for survival, still we fight, though greatly outnumbered, and our hearts heavy with loss. There are those who still hold the torch of hope aloft for us, holding it high in this darkness so others can find their way through the night. We desperately need one of those torchbearers now, Freya, sighed Tori. Ascension crumbles under the weight of that darkness, its foundations slowly decaying with Maddox's madness. And they exist, Tori, which is why I'm here to reassure you. Tori's heart soared in hope that her promise to Catherine, to all those desperate for salvation, might be kept. Please, she begged, tell me. You're on the right path, Tori. Your plan for escape will bring you close to them. 
I'm here to reassure your faith in the path you have chosen is true. What are their names? How will I know them? Freya laughed then, a melody of such lightness and life that the colours of the vista surrounding them appeared more vivid, the air crisper, and the sun a little brighter. A symphony of birdsong exploded somewhere in the distance. You'll know the flame, my dear Tori, because she's the brightest, most colourful light shining in the night. There was genuine love and affection in Freya's description, and the merest hint of a life once lived. Her shield is her shadow, an old warrior without peer, with a heart as great as his ability for war. And he loves the flame as if she was his own daughter. All weight from Tori's heart lightened at Freya's depiction of the pair, expressing such deep, heartfelt affection for these two people, and so far from the chilling zealotry of Maddock and his cronies, it shined a light into the darkness of her misery. And what of the third? It's three, isn't it? Because Maddock fears three people. Freya's gaze fixed to her. Why, Tori, that third is you. You are the faith to their flame and shield. You're the third of our torchbearers. Tori blinked for a moment, one hand sweeping through her blonde hair as she gathered her wits. I... that doesn't... I mean... what? She shook her head. That can't be right, Freya, coughed Tori in a half-laugh of utter disbelief. Faith? I have no faith. I've never believed in any higher power until I saw the evidence of it when Maddock commanded poor George's corpse, moments after murdering him. Faith isn't confined to deities, Tori. The most powerful faith of all is that we have in ourselves and others. Faith in something, even if that's as simple as a different way of life. Those people in ascension, innocent in this war of ours, place their faith in you, Tori. Seeing her bemused expression, Freya continued. When the knives are being sharpened, they come to you, knowing you will listen, and knowing you'll do all you can to help their loved ones with the influence gained through acts of incredible self-sacrifice. You've seen the evil of Maddox's choices firsthand, and how they've been embraced by those closest to him. You placed your faith in those opposed to them, in the hope that your new friends can be liberated from the chains of fear binding them. Freya tilted her head a little as she regarded Tori. Your plan to escape wasn't just for you, Tori. Your plan, since hearing of the enemies that Maddock despises and fears because of the Dark's manipulation, has been to escape in the hope of finding people who can help them. You're putting yourself at risk, and all your faith, in people you don't know, to help those who need it, because you believe they will. Because you have to believe it. Tori absorbed Freya's words in silence, mind reeling and unable to form a coherent response. She opened her mouth to say something many times before words failed her again. You didn't go into the field of investigative journalism for glory, said Freya softly. You did it to expose the evil of others, to shine a light in the darker places where many refuse to look because it doesn't touch their lives. Freya grinned then in remembered amusement. The woman you seek, my friend, said to me once that those who say out of sight, out of mind, obviously never experienced a massive spider disappearing in their bedroom at night. Tori laughed, the joke breaking through some of her tension. She sounds wise, in an unconventional way. 
She is, Tori, more than you know. Heart of a lioness, a mouth as foul as a drunken sailor, and I miss her terribly. There's a reason she was selected as our flame, and that reason is because of that heart of hers I so adore. She's flawed and rough around the edges, but if there's one thing she won't do, it's go quietly into the night and let the darkness win. She really is a rough diamond. Then I guess I should go find this flame. Freya nodded, gracing her with another radiant smile, though tinged with sadness. This won't be easy, Tori. But with all you've endured so far, I have faith that you will find her, and our torchbearers will finally unite. Now, get some rest, Tori, for your fight is almost upon you. Before I go, do you appear in dreams like this to the others? Will they think me mad if I meet them and tell them I was sent to them by a woman called Freya in a dream? Freya laughed richly again. No. The shield and I have already spoken, and the flame isn't ready to see me yet. But she's always believed something greater is at play. She burns bright and hot, and with that potty mouth of hers, you'll know her when you meet her, have no doubt. Freya beamed her smile of light and life one last time. You just need to have faith, Tori. Tori winced as the truck jolted over a pothole in the road, jarring her beneath the piled tarpaulins in the rear. Her bones were cold after concealing herself in the box truck two hours before sunrise. The multiple layers of thick clothing, large puffer coat, gloves and woolen hat pulled down over her ears might stop her freezing to death, but the two hours before dawn were long and uncomfortable. Sneaking into the back of the unguarded truck with a thick blanket to wrap around her while she waited, Tori hid under the pile of coverings in the far corner of the truck, praying the militia would not examine too closely before setting off. Faith, the dream woman said. Have faith the path you have chosen is the right one. As the convoy assembled a little after sunrise, her heart thundered as activity intensified outside. Her breath froze as the box truck's rear doors rattled open and the easy banter of the men echoed in the space as they joked through their final checks. Within seconds, the truck door slammed shut, breath exploding from her lungs in relief. Within the hour, the diesel engine rumbled into life and Tori was on her way out of ascension. Five box trucks, two Humvees, and two pickups made up the convoy, transporting a total excursion of 32. Eight sets of hands designated to do the bulk of the heavy lifting, all with forklift or warehousing experience, and the presence of 24 militia meant around a quarter of the settlement's armed force was off-site, emphasizing its importance to Ascension's agenda. With Jacob's presence, the undead were unlikely to be an issue, but the possibility of clashing with other survivors ensured Jacob brought his best, and most blindly loyal, troops on the mission. The journey was slow and jolting, but when she felt them turn and the brakes gradually applied, she looked at the watch on her wrist. 8.45 a.m. As they came to a halt, Jacob's familiar voice boomed out his commands, muffled by the thick wool of her hat and the coverings concealing her. His thundering tone brought the unnatural taste of blood to her mouth, signifying vocal commands for the dead to step aside. She shivered again, though this time not from the cold. The commands resounded for the next 15 minutes over and over again, suggesting a massive number of the white-eyed walking dead. Like a shepherd of the damned whistling at his undead flock, Jacob moved them into position, pulling them from within the giant warehouse so the laborers could work without danger. Tori dared not move until the demonic creatures were shackled into position. 
Jacob wouldn't send them away, preferring their presence to remain long after they departed for home. An undead horde were perfect sentries for the warehouse with the resurrectionists absent, protecting the valuable supplies within so they could return at a later date for further resupply. Only when the men relaxed and the work began in earnest would she dare to make her break for freedom. Another half hour passed before Jacob was satisfied the warehouse had been whistled clear of the dead, and she froze in breathless panic as the truck's engine hummed into life again. Familiar beeps sounded as all five of the box trucks reversed to open loading doors in readiness for their cargo, and she breathed a quiet sigh of relief. The doors at the truck's rear swung open and were pinned to the sides as she waited in hidden terror, expecting someone to sweep the coverings from her at any moment and discover her treachery. Instead, the men simply got to work. After 15 minutes, enough time for everyone to settle into a working rhythm, Tori dared to take her first look outside through a small gap in the coverings. The truck's rear was backed up to a loading bay, with distant movement down the long aisles of the gargantuan warehouse. Mercifully, the coast appeared clear, as many of the armed men were inside the building escorting the workers, in the event any undead stragglers had been missed. Knowing she had little time once she started moving, Tori shifted the covers and stood, lightly stepping down the length of the truck towards the open door, careful not to shake the vehicle or have her heavy footsteps overheard by a nearby sentry. She peered out of the truck's rear to ensure the coast was clear and dropped to the concrete, quickly shifting to her belly, crawling beneath the high wheelbase truck to assess her next step. She couldn't see much to her left, except the line of trucks on consecutive bays, and the boots of some of the militia as they took a smoke break between the vehicles. Switching her gaze to the right, she clamped one gloved hand over her mouth to prevent crying out. Around sixty feet away stood a dense legion of the dead packed into a tight mass, their feet planted as though shackled to the spot. Their upper bodies and heads, however, still moved and swayed like stalks of undulating reeds in a breeze, a rippling animation of the dead as it flowed from left to right and back again. Sightless eyes stared in their listless, vacant manner as the living labored, their bloody and ruined forms a grim tapestry of the varied and violent manner of their deaths. From the ground, it was too difficult to make an accurate estimate, but at a conservative guess, Tori thought there must be more than five hundred of the creatures packed into the dense mass just standing there, swaying, waiting. Tori shivered, and the cold of the concrete started seeping through her layers. Whether her shiver was a product of the frigid ground or the sight of the rippling wave of waiting undead, she could not say. Whatever chilled her, Remaining immobile was not an option, as this was her best window of opportunity. The moment the militia and workers identified all the key items to carry home to Ascension, the trucks would become a hive of activity as the loading ensued. For the moment, they were still mapping the inside of the warehouse, trying to locate and identify all the crates and pallets in readiness for loading. In an ideal world, Tori would aim for one of the pickups or the Humvees and make her exit in a vehicle. The moment an engine fired into life, though, it would attract the attention of the armed men, and they could simply choose the safe option of lighting her up with their weapons, thinking her some random thief of opportunity. No. The sensible option was to break in a straight line across the open concrete and scramble up the steep grass bank connecting to the main road passing the warehouse. She could cross the carriageway and head for any nearby housing estates, losing any pursuers in a maze of small streets and gardens. She was certain they wouldn't pursue one lone stranger for any time if it put their mission at risk. Ahead of her, one of the pickups was parked at a right angle to the trucks. A quick break across the open space, hide behind the vehicle's tail, then a second sprint would see her clambering up the steep bank to freedom. 
having maintained a strict physical fitness regime since the fall of the world for just such an occasion. Tori was swift on her feet and able to run for miles. She just needed to make it to the road at the top of the bank and she would be away. Anyone chasing her in a vehicle would have to leave via the main vehicle entrance and loop around the access road before joining the main carriageway. By that time, she could be across the roads, into the cover of residential estates, and the chase would be over before it began. Rolling from under the truck, she stood and edged to the rear, daring to peer round towards the entrance, almost swearing aloud when she saw a second mass of undead equal to the first. This group also faced inwards, and two walls of silent, rippling undead sandwiched the living operation, staring vacantly into space under Jacob's dark spell. Blessedly, no militia waited in that open space. Sucking in three quick breaths for courage, Tori kept low and quiet, horrendously exposed to the undead regard as she moved swiftly across the open space, not even daring to exhale at any volume as she reached the rear of the pickup. She shuddered in revulsion while crossing the open ground. In the periphery of her vision, hundreds of blank stares watched her fearful rush across the concrete, undead heads turning to follow her in a swaying mass as they silently observed her hurried progress. The bank was only twenty feet away, and she took another calming inhale before moving again. She was halfway to the bank when a command whipped across her senses. Freeze! The voice was close, too close. Hands in the air, turn around, nice and slow. Tori's heart collapsed in recognition, turning to obey his command. Jacob registered surprise as she faced him, never expecting the heavily clothed and backpack-wearing stranger to be the woman he loved. As far as he was concerned, Tori was ill in bed and waiting for him back home. Tori? His voice softened upon seeing her, the barrel of his handgun lowering for a brief moment as he processed her presence. But any sliver of hope died instantly. Realization darkened his expression as Jacob's jaw set, brow furrowed, and the gun rose with purpose once more, pointing directly at her chest. You lied to me, he hissed. All these months. And what? You were planning on fucking leaving all that time. Just waiting for this chance. There was no point denying anything. Dressed in heavy winter clothing, a stuffed backpack strapped to her body, accompanied by her attempt at stealth, all combined to damn her even as she cursed her ill fortune. She hadn't seen him, standing behind the front wheel as he was, maybe kneeling out of view while checking his bootlaces or something to that effect. It didn't matter now. She hadn't seen him and tried to run by him in full view. There was no way of reaching for the stolen revolver concealed at her ankle without Jacob emptying the whole magazine of his pistol into her. It was over. Jacob! People are being sacrificed, she sighed in resignation. How long before I'm next? I'd never let that happen to you. His tone was firm. You should know that. You say that, Jacob, but what if the first disciple orders you? What if he takes a dislike to me? Sure, I'm good with people and have plenty of friends and a decent organizer, but I'm not crucial, am I? I'm no soldier, or mechanic, nurse, farmer, or any other skill that's necessary for Ascension's survival. She shrugged, hands still aloft. I'll be under the knife before all of them, and there aren't any more captives in the pit waiting to be sacrificed, so now we're killing our own. If this is what it costs to be a part of this community, I can't face it. I live in constant fear, Jacob. We all do. The soldier relaxed again, though his gun remained ready. There was less menace to his stance, but he wasn't about to let her leave. Get in the car, he said, his tone softening. 
We'll talk about this when we get back. No. Jacob blinked at her blunt refusal. No, he repeated, hardly believing her answer. There isn't any choice here, Tory. There's always a choice, Jacob. I could go back, but I won't. That means you have a choice to make. Either shoot me now as I walk away, or don't. Either way, Jacob, I'm not coming back. He looked at her, disbelieving, as though her words were somehow the ravings of a lunatic. Tory, we have safety and security. The power of the sacrifice keeps us all protected. Look around you. He gestured to the motionless walls of swaying undead. Look at what the power grants us the ability to do. We're not menaced by the dead. We're their masters. Tory's expression mirrored Jacob's disbelief, but for entirely different reasons. Shaking her head and struggling with his lack of understanding, Tory sighed. Jacob could not, would not, see it, blinded as he was in the belief of his own power. Jacob, ascension has become like any other corrupt state. She kept her tone soft and unthreatening. We, the many, suffer for the comfort of you, the privileged few. How is that any different from the world we lost? Even beyond our own people, charged with fabricating crimes to assuage your guilt over the murders, how many human lives have we sacrificed for this so-called greater good? People we could have welcomed, people we could have saved. We have resources, skilled people, a wonderful location. And yet in a world overrun with the walking dead, we add more to their dread legion every week. Do the sums, Jacob. Sooner or later, you'll have to give up that gift, and fighting the dead will be our only remaining option. Yet three of you swell those numbers weekly by cutting the throats of people we could have saved. She implored him to see reason with every fibre of her being. Sooner or later, there'll be nobody left to sacrifice. Then that gift will fail, and you'll have a thousand enemies to face, waiting at your gate. She heaved a regretful shrug. And you'll be left alone to face them. For a moment, Tory thought his armour was pierced. But that moment vanished as his features clouded with bleak and furious madness. The zealot rose from its brief slumber and awakened with black intent. There's a third choice, Tory, he hissed malevolently, moving forward. I take you back by force, and I cut your lying throat myself. Burned by the acid of his tone, Jacob closed the distance before she could react, pressing the barrel of his pistol beneath her chin. Her teeth clattered painfully together as he applied upwards pressure. Before that happens, maybe I'll have you one last time, eh? Eyes glittering with dark purpose, voice sibilant with foul amusement, something truly dark awakened in Jacob, a jarring shift as though the man was replaced by a malicious spirit. Don't worry, this time you won't have to pretend to like it, he sneered. The change in him was stark, terrifying, and for a moment Tori couldn't think as his free hand wrangled her towards the pickup, barrel still painfully beneath her jaw. Flinging open the passenger door, he shoved her into the cab. You can fight if you want, he mocked. In fact, I'd rather you did. There was such evil in his tone, a malice never exhibited even when performing the sacrifice, as though a long, caged darkness had finally cracked the lock on its prison. It hissed into wicked life before her, a lustful and violent gleam in his eyes as he sheathed the pistol at his hip. Trapped, unable to escape, Tori's breath came in short gasps as Jacob fumbled at his belt. Don't worry about your genes, 
he smirked. I'll just cut them off with my knife in a minute, then... His sentence remained unfinished as Tory snatched the small revolver from the ankle holster, pulled it free, and fired without hesitation. In the tiny confines of the pickup's cab, the gunshot was like the detonation of a bomb, leaving her ears with a painful whine. Jacob collapsed, hands clawing at his ruined throat. To avoid his tactical vest, Tori aimed for his head, but fired too early in her panic to be free, and the thirty-eight round smashed through his larynx. Horrified by the look in Jacob's wide, disbelieving gaze, her eyes fixed to the hot blood gushing between his fingers, vainly trying to stem the torrent. Dim shouts pushed at the wine in her ears from somewhere behind, and as she scrambled from the truck, Jacob collapsed to the concrete and lay still. No more gurgling or choking sounds escaped, and Tori had only a heartbeat to process she had just killed a man before chaos erupted. The moment Jacob slipped from life, his dark enchantment of the undead died with him. Demonic life ignited in the thousand motionless monsters, cries of alarm from the living lost amid the rattling thunder of gunfire as the jaws of the undead vice closed. The two monstrous walls shielding the operation were now the fanged maw of the undead beast, closing on both flanks towards the open loading bay doors. The things moved with relentless purpose, faster than she expected, as they swarmed towards the booming weapons and panicked cries of the trapped militia and workers. The dam had broken. They were no longer shackled, and the torrent of undead gushed towards those still within the warehouse, closing the distance with a speed and murderous resolve that threatened to stop the beat of Tori's heart. Staring in mute horror, her breath coming in short gasps, Tori's mind fixed to the inevitable fate the innocent workers would suffer, trapped with no escape from the dark army advancing towards them. No matter how good a shot those soldiers were, there were simply too many of the undead swarming towards them, and too quickly. They would be pushed back into the warehouse, forced to close the loading doors, their only hope of escape out of a fire exit on foot. Their vehicles were lost to them, now a scatter of metal islands surrounded by the creeping tide of dead. The fog clouding her mind vanished as the corpse at her feet twitched violently, struck by dark lightning that snapped Jacob's eyes open, his head leering round to locate Tori with lips drawn back in a noiseless snarl. Blood that choked him only seconds earlier painted his bared teeth crimson, fingers hooking to malevolent claws as they reached up for her. Gasping, Wheezing, too frightened to possess any presence of mind to fire again, Tori retreated from Jacob's ravenous grasp and fled. With the small revolver still in hand, she crossed to the steep grass bank and began a frantic scrabble to the top. As she reached the summit and clambered to her feet, Tori turned to survey the massive concrete yard below, where the undead massed at the loading bays. Panicked by the sudden change and unexpected speed of the monstrous assault, none of the Ascension militia thought to close the loading doors, reacting instead with visceral fear, futilely trying to kill as many of the creatures as they could from unfavorable ground. Inexorably, inevitably, they were pushed back into the distribution center, and unless they found their way to another exit, the relentless, hungry sea of dead would be their end. Looking down at the corpse of Jacob, she found him standing, merely observing her. No mindless attempts at ascending the steep bank, no sign of immediate pursuit, expression as blank as a mannequin. Jacob's corpse stood motionless, head tilted slightly to one side in near thoughtful regard. One clenched fist slowly lifted above his head. Tori gaped in wide-eyed shock, throat raw as though swallowing shards of glass, as Jacob's dead fingers flicked out from his raised fist in a count. One, two, three. Fucking hell, she quivered into the cold air. 
Jacob's corpse remained unmoving as the rest of the undead swarmed the ascension party, staring up at her, utterly disinterested by the cacophony of gunfire and terror behind it. Uncertain because of the distance, just for a moment, Tori swore the corpse's mouth split into a grim, knowing smile. Wanting nothing more than to be free of Jacob, either living or dead, Tori turned on her heel and set off as fast as her legs would carry her, as a storm of screaming and gunfire echoed in her wake. December 20th, 2010. Nomad HQ. Nate and I spent some time watching Nomad HQ for a couple of days. Songbird Steve's scared as shit intel was good. Both of us needed to feel like we were doing something to combat the murderous bastards. Despite Nate being ready to unleash his Samuel L. Jackson-style great vengeance and furious anger for their devastation on our new Willow Park friends, he still got the good sense to do it smart. We need all the intelligence we can gather before opening a six-pack of fuck you up on them. We also needed a little time away from campus to let everyone digest the special locky bombshell Nate dropped. They might be more comfortable discussing it between them while Nate and I aren't around, and it means I don't have to think about it either. For the last couple of days, it's just been recon for me and Nate, staying out for two days and one very fucking cold night, and I'm writing this now we're home to run over what we observed. Vail College is a sixth form college for students aged 16 to 18 and directly opposite a high school of the same name. It's a relatively large site and sits on a main thoroughfare through one part of town, so we cleared out a house on the road opposite and observed as best we could from that vantage point. We've never had to drive past this way before, as it's a different route to the centre of town that we've never bothered with, as it was always out of our way. Plus, we expected the roads to be cluttered as fuck with wreckage. I've seen myself how much of a clusterfuck school areas got on the day the world soiled itself. The nomad's presence in that immediate area shows evidence of work in clearing a path through said wreckage and putting down the undead, but they haven't done much in the way of corpse removal. We tried a few houses until we found one that didn't stink like the devil's toilet the morning after spicy curry night. Some of them were just awful, with brained corpses left to fester where they'd fallen, so it took a few attempts to find a vantage that wasn't tainted by rotting cadavers and already cleared of resources by the nomads to ensure they wouldn't return. From the upper floor window of the house we selected, we gained a good view of the vehicle entrance. We agreed it was likely the entrance they used more frequently, with a closable gate to keep out any wanderers, making it the most secure. Despite them supposedly being a motorcycle gang, even a small-time one, there was no evidence of fancy Harleys, only a handful of dirt bikes, pickups and vans. Diesel is obviously the way to go, and dirt bikes are more agile than big, sweeping Harleys for getting round fucked-up roads littered with traffic accidents, so petrol usage is confined to those noisy little wheeled hair dryers. The house also gave us a view of the three-floor building where Steve claimed the prisoners were locked up, and evidence of their presence was confirmed in some of the top-floor windows. They seemed to be split across the four classrooms facing our way, and through the scope, Nate observed what I dreaded. The far room on the left has around six women, he said quietly. All of them look to be in their twenties. Excluding present company, your gender can be real fucking bastards, Nate. Nate just nodded, his eyes still scanning the area through the scope. No arguments here, kid. Seen it too many times in my life than I care to say. Some of the women who survive those ordeals, like Katie in Sierra Leone, are probably the strongest people I've ever known. He pulled his head away to look at me. And Alicia. Why do I feel like you're about to waggle your finger at me? 
Don't think I haven't noticed your eye rolls when she backs my words or calls me sir. You need to lay off it. It's a bit weird though, Nate, I said, getting a little defensive. Come on, even you must feel uncomfortable by it. He just shook his head. Not at all. She's handling what she went through in a healthy way, Erin. She's turned her focus to something positive, and whatever she needs to keep those demons at bay, we should be supporting, not mocking. To be blunt, you're being a bit of a dick about it at times. Well, shit, Nate, I huffed. Don't mince your words. Tell me how you really feel. I won't lie. I felt a little attacked at the time. But honestly, I think it's because I knew he was right. I look back on the journal entries where I've taken the piss at her being teacher's pet and now wince at what I wrote. I'll leave the entries there as that's what I was feeling at the time, so my contrition here has the right context. We all have to keep on growing because none of us are perfect and I'm certainly not. I do feel a bit of a shithead now because of it, though. We've no idea what she's battling in her head at night, Erin. Alicia is still here, a strong and valuable member of our community, turning into a damn good shooter and top-tier security for us to boot. She's dealing with that trauma and noise by focusing her demons into protecting others. Laura ain't here because that noise got too loud. He looked at me squarely then, his voice grave. Broken things don't get healed by time alone, but by intention and positive action. Laura losing her battle meant we ended up losing Freya by proxy, don't forget. What we think might be trivial actions could have catastrophic consequences. Well, that fucking told me, eh? He sighed then, softening his cautionary tone. Just wind it back, okay? We don't want her feeling like what she does is trivialised, because it's the one thing keeping her sane and on point while those wounds scar over. Suitably chastised, I shut my smart mouth and just agreed. All his points were fair, and truth be told... I have been a bit of a dick about it, but it stops here. Positive reinforcement only for her now. Shit, I feel so guilty about it. She's survived horrors I can't even begin to imagine, and here I am, taking the piss because innate she's found a man she looks up to and trusts with absolute certainty, which, after her ordeal, is no small thing. I shouldn't be wailing on her for that with my stupid sense of humour. Nate moved on after that, not dwelling on it once he'd said his piece and satisfied his warnings had been heard. We never saw this mama character in our observation time, but I did see the twat I unlovingly refer to as Fugly, the guy who thrust his crotch towards me and shot me with his finger gun when we sent them packing from Eli and company. He was in a thick jacket and must have earned his patch as he was wearing the sleeveless black leather vest with the white nomad insignia on the back over his coat. Honestly, it looked stupid because the winter jacket was thick, ballooning out where the vest was pulled over at the sleeves, so it looked partially inflated with air. abso fucking lutely ridiculous. Strutting round like the king of the world, though, he was obviously loving his new improved status as he lorded it over the lesser prospects. I pointed him out to Nate, and he had a look-see through the scope. Christ, you weren't kidding, he murmured. He's so ugly, I don't even think the fucking tide would take him out. I sniggered at that because it really hit my funny bone. Nate's got a wicked dry sense of humour at times. He doesn't let loose often, but when he does, it's usually gold. Clearly the status to full nomad brings a step up in arms as well, he observed. There's a semi-automatic pistol at his hip. Looks like a CZ-75. Decent nine mil weapon, and surprising to see one in this country. Glock 17 is the common sidearm for British military and law enforcement. CZ would have to be imported illegally, originating from the Czech Republic and used a lot by their military and police.
Honestly, you're such a fucking nerd, Nate. A good craftsman knows his tools, he quipped back. Doesn't change the fact they seem to have firearms beyond small revolvers and low-capacity shotguns. Probably not many, seeing as it's just those with the patch that have the upgrades. But if they've a couple more of those cheap Tech-9 junk copies they hit our convoy with, it means they've had a pipeline in the past to better illegal arms. Most of their sentries walking the grounds are armed only with melee weapons. That we can see, said Nate. Maybe they've got a little junk revolver stuffed in the back of their belt in case walkers get too close in number. Either way, junk guns or not, assume every hostile met in there is armed with lead. Are we really going to assault this place? I asked. It's pretty big, and clearing that would be a nightmare. It's not like you have a spec ops team at your disposal. There's me, you, Dean is highly trained, Alicia is on point now and have no fears on her part, and Eli has had all the same basic infantry training for room clearance. That's a five-count fire team properly drilled in room and building clearance. There's about 40 of them, strung out all over the place, with no proper training, communication or cohesion. They're thugs, Erin. I'm not worried about any assault, because if we move smart and tight, we'll mow through their thug ranks. What I am worried about is safely securing the hostages. The minute we start firing, the nomads will be alerted and will either reinforce the top of those stairs and rain lead down on us if we try to force our way up, or worse, they'll pull those people out as human shields. I stared back through my small binoculars, scanning the layout of the college buildings. What if I could get inside one of those top classrooms and hit the bell ends up the arse before you assault? Nate looked up from his scope. Come again? I'll have to scout it from some other angles, because I can't see a solid metal pipe bolted to the brick from here that'll take my weight, only that plastic shit and they can't be trusted. I lowered the binoculars and glanced his way. Schools and colleges are playgrounds for tracers, Nate. There are buildings of all differing heights and levels, and if I can get a good look around at different angles and figure out a route to the top of that building, those windows are big enough for me to swing in if someone inside opens one for me. Nate returned his gaze to the top floor again, confirming what I'd already seen. The three-floor building was older, with newer extensions bolted on at the rear as the campus expanded over time. That original building, however, contained good-sized windows that could open wide and easily let a duchess of hazard, like me, climb down from the roof and swing in. Those windows being open for airflow were no danger to the captives escaping, as it was a sheer drop and most of the building's face was glass. There was zero way of free climbing up or down it without falling. The overhang at the top meant someone would have to lean away from the window to reach up and grab it, releasing their foothold to hang all their weight on their fingertips before pulling themselves up. Unless you've got the skills and the right developed muscles to do that, it's pretty much setting you up for a bad case of concrete poisoning after a long fall. For your average Joe, there was no escape from those rooms. For someone with years of parkour and urban climbing, however, coming down off that roof and into an opened window should be relatively simple, if done with care. You'd be on your own up there, though, Nate said thoughtfully. At least until the four of us could get to you. We've no idea how many guards are up on that floor in the corridor, and there are multiple classrooms with hostages. I'll go in the end one with the women being used for... Well, being used. They're more likely to be receptive to a chance at salvation. They're right at the end of the corridor, so I'd only have to defend one way, and me being a woman will likely make them more trusting towards me. I could hit and hold them from the back before they know what's what, while you guys storm in and up at them. Depending on the number there, I might even be able to secure the staircase alone. The door will be locked, and you can't pick it. I snorted. Nate, there are six women in their twenties in there. 
You think if they don't knock on the door and play all helpless, the arrogant chumps outside won't want to peep in and have a look at what's wrong? Like you said, these are dumb thugs with barely a beard between them, so they're inexperienced and likely naive. Plus, I doubt they're all applying for Mensa anytime soon. Guard duty is a henchman job, so likely won't be done by any senior members. And all those pretty women asking for a big strong man's help. I snorted again and shook my head. Shit, he'll swagger in like he was fucking Batman, and then I'll kick his fucking head in. Nate openly laughed at the extensively scouse manner I hacked the last sentence with. Personally, I think he gets a bit of a kick out of my accent when it cranks up. It seems to be the basis of a plan, and I still have to do some solo recon on foot to get a clear picture of the exterior layout. I'll need to work out if I can get a suitably traversable and stealthy route to the top of that building to carry out my dickhead plan, so I'm going to do that tomorrow. Nate insisted on coming to provide cover if shit goes sideways. I don't want to carry a rifle and the like if I have to do some recon climbing, so I'll need to go light, which just means my encrypted radio for comms with Nate and a sidearm in case anything goes tits up, so Nate's coming as my overwatch. We want to keep the circle small on this stuff while we're at the planning stage, keeping it to the tactical inner circle of those likely to be involved in any assault. Me, Nate, Dean, Alicia, Elijah and Maria too. When we floated this recon plan past them earlier, the friendship between our two primary warriors was finally sealed by the gift of firearms. If you're providing overwatch for Erin, you'll want a proper tool for the job, said Dean. He disappeared for a few moments, returning with a long silver case. Nate popped it open to reveal the most hardcore weapon I've seen to date. It was all black with a brown handle, with the biggest fucking scope I've seen in my life, and all kinds of fun stuff in the case. Nate got a complete eye boner when he saw it, glancing between the rifle and Dean with mouth open. Honestly, he looked like a poor kid who's just been handed a brand new Xbox, widescreen TV, and selection of the latest games for free. How long have you been sandbagging that? laughed Nate. Shit, Dean. A PSG-1. Dean grinned. Police SFO issue marksman rifle. There was one left when I cleared out the locker at the constabulary the day I left, so I took it for a rainy day. I can use one to a fair level, but marksmanship wasn't my specialty. I focused on CQB assault and tactics. Erin's mentioned you've got real sniper training, and I think we know each other well enough now, so this is my gift to you. It'll be far more effective in your hands than anyone else's. Nate handled it almost reverently, like someone had just handed him their newborn baby. It's got a bipod in the case, rangefinder and wind meter. There's a hundred rounds of 762 stashed away that I swept up with it, which is everything I have in that calibre. Nate laughed actually laughed out loud, partly in amusement and mostly in disbelief. Well, he chuckled finally, you're definitely on my Christmas card list, Sergeant Williams. Apparently, this is a really good rifle, judging by Nate's reaction. A proper marksman rifle with a stinking long range, Nate says it's possible to hit a full thousand metres in the right conditions at its top end, which, quite frankly, is a ridiculous range to what we've been operating with. With Nate's eye behind the giant scope of this beast, he's just become the most dangerous man in Apocalypse Britain, I think. He ran off almost immediately to his makeshift practice range on a backfield to sight the weapon in. Once again, yay for Nate being on my team. Tomorrow, the two of us are heading back out, so I can recon my route, while Dead Eye Carter plays Overwatch with his new high-powered and ridiculously scoped boom toy. Tonight, though, I'm just glad to be warm again. Returning back here reminds me to be thankful for the benefits we have. Two days and one night out in that house with Nate watching Nomad HQ, 
and holy balls, it was cold. Even with the heavy clothing and Arctic-quality sleeping bags from the surplus store. My heart aches for survivors trying to weak out an existence without the many comforts we have. One thing I'll never do is take my good fortune for granted. Hot shower, clean clothes, hot chocolate and a warm bed. I'm so profoundly lucky and it just makes me want to help others even more. Can't help anybody without my beauty sleep though. Night night. December 21st, 2010. Risk assessment. I can do it, but it won't be easy, given the treacherous winter conditions. It's bloody cold every day now with frost each morning, plus it's wet too, so there's one stretch of the route where I'll be seriously risking my neck. I can't see any other option, though. I'll have to go to the very rear of the long stretch of buildings and work my way right along the whole thing, going up gradually, and there are two parts where I'm badly exposed. There's a real chance I could kill myself doing this given the conditions. The first three quarters are relatively simple, until I get near my goal. The only way up to the top level height near the end, however, will be doing a split wedge climb. For the uninitiated, that would be you, Freya, the split wedge is pretty much what it says on the tin. You wedge yourself between two walls, one foot and hand on opposite walls. Using the outward pressure, you push against each surface to move up the space between them. Push and hold with your feet while you move your hands up, then push and hold with your hands as you flick your feet up. Wash, rinse, repeat, until you reach the top of the climb, transferring both hands and feet to one lip, or whatever surface you can find to finally pull yourself up. For any of these chimneys between two nearby walls, however, the move gets really dangerous the higher you go, because one slip of hand or foot and all that wedged pressure vanishes. If that happens, there's no getting it back once lost. Downsville all the way. I've never done a split wedge climb that high before, as it should only be used for heights that you're comfortable dropping from if things go awry. I've certainly never done one near the end of December. Winter parkour was something I saved for the indoor gym, or for easy runs, climbs and vaults, where there's no major threat of injury. Or death. Making that wedged wall climb of about 20 feet will take me to the same level as the roof of my target three-floor building. The only caveat once up there is that I'll need to make a running jump of about 10 feet to the same elevation. I know, it doesn't sound much for someone who's been doing this for years. But remember, I'm only 5'6 in height, and my standing precision jumps aren't the 7 and 8 feet that taller, more heavily muscled guys can pull off. 10 feet in a running jump is a fucking chasm when carrying extra weight, like the radio and sidearm on a belt, plus the rifle and spare ammo as well, as it'll mess with my speed and balance. The roofs will be wet and slippery too, I imagine, and if I fall short on the jump or slip as I launch, we're talking one less lucky in the world, because that fall is about 50 feet to solid concrete. Naturally, Nate and everyone else are entirely against this level of danger. The plan is being kept behind closed doors, with the inner circle aware of what we're planning in earnest. Others know we plan to go after the nomads at some point, but they don't know how advanced those plans are or any details. It's insanity, Erin, said Nate. It's too much risk. I agree, Dean chimed in the others adding their support to vote my plan down. And what about everyone on the top floor? I argued in return. What if the nomads do line them all up as human shields when the bullets start flying? No matter how much we might be hurting for what the nomads did to the Willow Park lot, this isn't a mission of vengeance we're going on. Our primary goal, our only goal, should be getting those people they keep captive out alive and safe. Culling the nomad threat is just a byproduct of that, or something we could do later if need be. 
I gave a nonchalant shrug, indicating I wouldn't be moved. I'm doing it, so you'll all have to suck it up. Even if I do fall and break myself in half, you can still go on with the initial plan. Erin, there's too much risk, said Nate again, shaking his head. You can't do what you need to do as the flame if you're dead. I'm still a little uncomfortable with how set Nate is now on this whole torchbearer thing. I, however, see it a little differently to him. And what good am I in that role if I'm unwilling to help others who aren't in a position to help themselves, just because I have to put my neck on the line? I can't afford overcaution, Nate. This isn't reckless. I'm not taking dumbass risks just for shits and giggles and a cheap thrill ride. I mustered all the iron resolve I could to my voice. I know I can do it. Yes, it has risk, but if I didn't think I could do it, I wouldn't even try, as a 50-foot drop to concrete isn't something I'd ever take lightly. I'm not born to be wild, Nate, but equally, I'm not born to be mild, either. Nothing great ever comes easy or without risk. Nate was wavering, but I could tell he still wasn't convinced, and I suddenly realised why. It wasn't just because he cared about my safety. You can't protect me all the time, Nate, I cautioned, softening. I know you take this role as my shield seriously, and I love you for it, but I'm a grown woman, and I'm the only one here with the appropriate skills and experience for this task. If you can tell me any other way to secure the safety of those hostages before any frontal assault, then I'm all ears. But you know there isn't. We've already tried and thrown out every other idea. Profound silence followed my statement as everyone glanced at each other. Nobody had any answer because there wasn't any other option. So the plan stays. We don't want to hit them just yet. Nate wants to run through the plan with all involved. Me, Alicia, Eli and Dean. They're the fire team breaching and entering and I'm going solo up top to secure the hostages. We'll probably bring a couple of extra in as backup closer to the time, but there'll be guns staying outside the perimeter in case things get a bit dicey and we need a QRF. Meanwhile, tomorrow there's a side quest to retrieve a load of supplies from that little hair salon Nate and I discovered in the village with the three junkies and their toy gun. Ellie wants to be useful and tidy everyone up, and I admit even my hair is getting way too long for me to be comfortable with. Sooner or later, I'll end up getting this massive ponytail trapped in something, or a Zed will hook it, and that shit will get me killed in today's world. Plus, we're all starting to look like we belong in a hippie commune with thick mops of hair and bushy beards. I have to say, though, Nate really suits a beard, mainly because it's sprinkled with silver and makes him look even more commanding. He's the definitive image of a grizzled old war leader with his salt and pepper hair and beard. Such a manly man is our Nate. This should be a relatively simple mission. Go to the salon, empty it of all supplies, and pull out one of those pump-up chairs with adjustable height. Nate was against it without any of the primary shooters being involved, as his first question was obviously who was going to lead it. Doug and Finn Archer are eager to go, and Clyde too, because it's for his wife. The first two guys are actually very experienced, considering they've been doing all the supply runs for Willow Park since it started, so we can't really argue with their inclusion. Isaac wants to go too, as does Sarah, who, let's not forget, has been upgraded to the rifle by Nate. The run should be relatively easy, in fairness, the area is pretty clear. They can double up and collect some more supplies that may still be in that convenience store. And I said to Nate that as our community grows, we're going to have to start trusting people. Me, Nate, or Dean can't go on every single mission, and simple resource gathering with a specific target in an area we've already been through will be good experience for everyone. 
It'll also help integrate our two groups a little more, having a combined mission like this, letting Doug's people know that he's a trusted member of the community. If he thinks we're always running overwatch on him when he's been leading their group of survivors for so long, it might drive a deeper wedge into our current uneasy truce. A couple of younger members like Isaac and Sarah won't feel like a threat, and Doug was present when we took all those undead down by the gas yard. He's seen Sarah in action. Grudgingly, Nate agreed. The five of us need to run a few mock-ups of what we're planning to do here on campus, and Nate needs to drill the others into his fire team. Dean's training and experience will be invaluable. Doug, Finn, Clyde, Sarah and Isaac will go on a little mission for a couple of hours to clear out the salon and cherry-pick any good supplies remaining at the convenience store next to it. Two vehicles are enough, with just our white van to carry the goods, as the Willow Park one was rendered useless after the Nomad assault, and that trusty black Astra hatchback as a following vehicle. Clyde will go in the van with the Archer boys, with Sarah and Isaac following in the hatchback. Now, I have to say, that last pairing I'm not so peachy with. I know Sarah is crushing on Isaac a bit, as all the signs are there. Little sweeps of hair behind the ear as she talks to him, coy smiles, and I've caught her staring his way numerous times when she thinks no one's looking. It's really sweet and innocent, so I can't stand the thought of him using her as some pawn in a game he thinks will make me jealous. I really like Sarah, and I think we've the potential to be good friends. She's sweet-natured with a big heart, has an enviable craft with sarcasm, which is always a winner in my book, and tough as hell. Two months on from our clash of genitals, and Isaac's still being a bit of a tool towards me, and he's pretty snide towards Eli as well, who's just so laid back he doesn't rise to it. Nothing's happened between me and Elijah, but Isaac clearly has an issue with our obvious growing friendship. Not much I can do about it, though. I'll just see how this plays out. If he does hurt her in any way, though, I will smack him in the dick. With a hammer. That's on fire. I hope the mission goes well. We could do with something to help our two groups bridge the trust gap, despite Nate and Dean's vocal support and the speech I dropped from the heart that seemed to get through to them. It's going to take time, though, and they're still grieving lost friends and family members, so I can't really put a clock on it. We're all just figuring this shit out as we go. Hopefully this little side quest will help us get the main campaign back on track and be the start of the two groups pulling together. Hope. That seems to be the word of this apocalypse. It's the only thing keeping us going some days, I think. December 22nd, 2010. The hits keep on coming. There's no avoiding it now. The bastards have forced our hand. This morning, the nomads hit our people when they went beyond the gate. Nate is like a raging volcano, blaming himself for allowing them to go out without top-tier experience. But from the sounds of what went down, it wouldn't have made a difference. It was planned. Again. I don't know how they're getting their intelligence, but it can't be anything natural. And I'm starting to get really fucking pissed at how much influence Captain Evil has for his team. Meanwhile, we're just left to our own fucking devices and have to muddle through as best we can. The rules are either stacked in their favour, or our team has a shit middle manager who keeps delegating all his work to underlings who haven't been given the project briefing. They didn't even make it to the damn salon. Each vehicle had one of the older radios, as we keep Dean's encrypted channel ones for key operations. And within ten minutes of them setting off, it blazed into life. My blood ran cold as I heard Clyde roaring down the radio they were under fire from a small group, their vehicles disabled. Remember those police stingers I was talking about that Mark wanted to use for protecting the gate? Well. 
The nomads must have located a couple from police vehicles and deployed them as our people approached. All the tyres of the van were blown out and Isaac had slammed on the brakes in an attempt to stop but didn't manage in time. The front tyres rolled over those hollow spikes and that was the end of the Astra's mobility. Then the shooting started. It wasn't the thundering barrage that happened with the Willow Park convoy, and no machine pistols were involved, thankfully, but the staggered steady boom of shotguns and pistols were evident. When we ran outside, we heard the gunfire echoing in the distance. They were so damn close, which means they know where we are, and they've been waiting on one of the routes we have to take from the school as we pass through a small rural village on our way to town. All the fire came from the right side, so those who could piled out of the passenger doors, keeping low as about six or seven guns opened up on them. They all took injuries in some form, though thankfully no one died. Bloody miracle. Doug was hit in the thigh by some buckshot ripping through his door, and fragments of glass ended up in Finn's eye from shattering windows, which makes me sick even writing, because I've mentioned before my spine-chilling aversion to eye injuries. Clyde also took some errant buckshot to the chest, but only a few pellets. He's a mess, but in no danger of dying. Sarah took a thirty-eight bullet to her right shoulder, and was lucky it didn't hit an artery. It's probably cracked the bone a little as well, flattening against it. Maria had to dig the little bastard out when we got them back here. Isaac took a round to the leg. I've given him a lot of shit, even in my last entry. But to his eternal credit, he pushed Sarah out, screaming at her to get away and not wait for him. He put her before himself, and that's the bravest damn thing he's ever done. She could see the nomads advancing on the car as they reloaded, in agony and unable to lift the rifle to return fire because her right arm was useless, she fell out the far door and got to cover behind the brick wall of a garden where the others fled for concealment. The nomads kept their heads down with staggered fire. It was clear they weren't trying to kill them, only suppress, and Sarah recounted to us through her tears how she heard Isaac swearing and fighting as the nomads dragged his injured form from the car and away. Within a minute, they heard the rumble of a diesel engine, plus the rattling roars of dirt bikes, and they were gone before we arrived moments later in the biggest damn QRF we've ever had. Even Willow Park people came out unarmed to offer vehicles and aid, just as a show of numbers to drive off any remaining attackers. Eli and Nate did first aid at the scene, radioing back reports to Maria as she prepared her makeshift infirmary with the help of some Willow Park volunteers. Once they were stabilised, we rolled back in force and got them treated. One thing we are sorely lacking are IV bags for antibiotics or fluids. The small store we have will be depleted by this latest collection of serious injuries. Clyde is largely okay, and the buckshot pellets that hit his chest were deep, but mostly just superficial and painful. Doug's leg is a raw and bloody mess, but he'll survive and recover with time, providing he avoids infection, though he'll have some pretty spectacular scars. Finn is likely going to lose the sight in his right eye. I can't talk about this in detail, because I feel genuinely queasy when talking about eye trauma. Maria had to put him under as best she could, so she could tweeze all the fragments from his eyeball. Nope, gag reflex kicking in. I'm stopping there. Suffice to say, given the extent of the injury, Maria is doubtful he'll ever see out of that eye again. What a fucking shit situation that is. Sarah is away with the fairies on pain medication, but Maria and Eli got the bullet out of her arm and pumped her full of antibiotics to stave off any infection. She'll survive. She'll be sore for some time, but she was lucky it was in a meaty part of her arm and nothing major was damaged. It's just going to hurt for a while. Both medics surmise the bullet lacked its full punch because the small junk revolver used didn't have much of a range, so in that sense, she was quite lucky. Isaac's fate, however, is unknown. We know he was injured, and we know he was taken alive by the assaulting nomads, 
We haven't heard anything yet, but we're expecting to. Isaac had a radio on his person when he was taken, and the college where the nomads make their home base is within range. We're leaving the channel clear in case they contact us, while we move forward with an alternate plan that Nate is formulating. Why an alternate plan? Well, Isaac will know we were planning some form of retribution for the Willow Park attack, but he wasn't privy to any of the details and doesn't know anything about my stupid plan to traverse the aerial highway and come in through the top floor. Small mercies, I guess. If they're ready for us now, though, it changes everything. Freya, I'm really worried about him. December 23rd, 2010 Lucky out Last night, the radio came to life. We were clustered around it as we had been for the whole day, waiting for contact. Then around 9pm, a voice crackled over the airwaves. I want to speak to the woman calling herself Lockie. It was a woman's voice, a northern accent I couldn't place, like some mangled mess of Yorkshire and Lancashire. I could tell she was older by her voice, fifties maybe, and graveled by years of heavy smoking. I looked at Nate and Dean, who both shook their head for the moment. Dean was the one who reached for the radio. She's not here right now, so you can talk to me while we locate her. My name's Dean. Carol, replied the ogre-like voice. But everyone calls me Mama. I'm listening, Carol. The woman held the mic down so we could hear her throaty, derisive laugh. <laughs> I have one of your people, a very talkative and weepy young man named Isaac Sadler. One of yours, yes? You know he is, said Dean, a hint of warning in his tone. Let's not play games, Carol. You've attacked our people without provocation twice now. Good people have already died children among them, and other lives forever changed because of your violence. Now you're holding one of ours hostage, and our information says he's injured. Oh, he's fine, Mama said in a dismissive manner. With a doctor here, and she patched your little boy up. He's in no danger, just a little sore. Glad to hear that, Carol. He was very talkative, though. Told me all about how you planned to come and deal with us and how you all think this lucky woman of yours is special in some way. She snorted a laugh down the mic. At least, I think it was meant to be a laugh. It sounded more like a pig choking on a bucket of mucus. Of course, he resisted a little to begin with. So, one of my boys persuaded him to be a little freer with his information. Like I said, with a doctor here, so we patched him back up real nice for you. Every fist around the table bunched, every jaw clenched tight, shared fury clouding every look. I don't much like your manner, Carol, warned Dean the calm in his voice completely at odds with the rage etched into every line of his face. You want your boy back, then you trade him for your little messiah. This lucky woman. For Isaac. One for one, and all this is over. Why do you want her? Mama made a show of sighing down the mic, as though bored of the conversation. Dean. I've me own people to protect. I've been shown things you wouldn't understand, allowing me to lead me own group to some measure of safety. If I want that to continue, then she's the price I have to pay. One stranger for the safety of many. Not even a contest. I waved at Dean to pass me the radio, as this was the point requiring my involvement. Dean and Nate shared a look, a shrug, a nod, and then the handset came my way. I'm here, fucknut, was my grand opening. 
let me take a wild swing at the thing we wouldn't understand. Your dreams are leading you to pockets of resources and other survivors, am I right? The brief silence, rather than another smug retort, told me I'd hit the bullseye with my first shot. Eventually, she replied. Go on, she urged, some of the cocksure arrogance gone from her tone. You've been having dreams, probably somewhere dark and cold, I imagine. You see, some of our people have had similar dreams. But their dreams seem to be in bright, sunlit gardens, having conversations with dead friends who they loved in life. I bet you were alone in yours, weren't you? And I bet there wasn't a fucking daffodil in sight. Nervous laughter rippled around our table. I was mad at this ogre, and because my blood was up, my accent thickened again. I carried on, not giving her a chance to reply. Carol, Mama, Mrs. Grotbags, or whatever the fucking hell you want to call yourself. What you need to realise is that whatever you think is giving you dreams for security and protection, you are dead fucking wrong. You've pulled on the wrong colour kit and taking the field for the wrong team. I'm not the messiah, just a very naughty girl. Nor am I a spiritual leader or any other kind of bollocks. I'm simply someone trying to do right by not only my people, but by any people. In case you missed the memo, the dead are the real enemy. Killing and hurting our people puts you on the wrong side of the fence. You're a cocky one, for sure, crackled the reply. Here I am, with one of your people at my mercy, and you're insulting me. I'm letting you know that I won't take any of your twisted games. You're not baiting me with Isaac's safety, and you're not going to guilt me into giving myself up when you've already shown you're unworthy of any trust. Why give one back when you can do a two-for-one, hey? Disbelieving eyes stared at me from around the table as I charged on. If they were expecting me to play nice with this vicious ogre, they don't know me well enough by now. This twisted bitch wanted to play games, and she wasn't getting that satisfaction from me. I could kill him, here and now, warned Mama. Like fuck you will, I snapped back, because you know he's your fucking shield. Isaac's told you we're planning to come for you, and this conversation doesn't change a damn thing. You think you're okay with your junk guns and your teenage thugs who think they're fucking Mad Max apocalypse gangsters? Well, let me fucking tell you what I've got, you cunt. I've got a former Royal Marine Commando that also served in the SA fucking S with fucking decades of combat experience, as well as a highly trained police firearms specialist with qualifications and training out of his arse in close quarter combat tactics and counter-terrorism response. I've also got another ex-military man who served tours in Afghanistan and been under fire from the fucking Taliban. My blood was boiling by now and I'd gone full scouse on her. The rest of us have been trained for months by these exceptional people and you've experienced up close the military-grade firepower we have. So let me ask you this, Mama. Would you be willing to bet your last menopause pill on your bunch of playtime outlaws or my real fucking warriors? The silence was profound, both across the airwaves and around the table, as all eyes stared at me in a heady mix of both shock and, I think, a little admiration for my gutsy stand. Then I got all I needed. Nate nodded, winked and gave me that little smile of his. With Nate on board, I clicked the mic again before Mama could respond. If you've got any fucking sense left, Isaac will be alive when we come for him, and come for him we fucking will. Isaac's life is the only thing that'll stop me putting all of you in the ground, because let me make this nice and clear for you, Carol. If I get there and that boy isn't breathing, I'm gonna go fucking biblical on your geriatric ass. Do you fucking hear me? I waited only a breath. Sleep tight, bitch. Lucky out. Then switched the radio off. Naturally, after my little outburst, my middle finger tactics raised some concerns. She might kill Isaac out of spite. 
cautioned Maria. Did you have to be so aggressive? Yes, I affirmed with everything I had. Yes, Maria, I did. Because that animal is a puppet of Captain Evil. And that means, in my mind, she's weak and selfish. And what she wants more than anything is to survive. She's like every other narcissistic prick in the world, in that she wants power and control. And when you take it away from them, it seriously fucks with their mojo. It was the same with Bancroft. Mess up their toy box, and they end up throwing tantrums and getting sloppy. What if she uses the other captives as shields now? Asked Eli. I shrugged. I can't control every variable, Eli. How can I? On that front, what will be, will be. But I gave nothing away about them. I only mentioned Isaac, and I did that for a reason. Nate chuckled. If she knows we're coming, she's actually likely to leave less of a guard on those locked rooms and direct her forces to the main entrances. He nodded again. Smart, kid. Real smart. I beamed. Happy he'd picked up on my on-the-fly plan. I can always trust Nate to see the bigger picture. Exactly. Fifteen or so people out in the open needs crowd control, and she doesn't know that we know about them. Isaac isn't party to that information. So, if the captives are locked up in rooms, just leave one or two monkeys to guard them, because how can anyone possibly get to them without coming up those stairs. Except you, said Eli softly, because she's no idea what you're capable of. Shit, Erin, I just thought you were going mental, he chuckled. Well, in fairness, I was going a bit mental, but it all had a purpose. Take away her control of the conversation. Put the fear of the almighty up her shriveled old arsehole by laying out the level of experience and firepower that's heading her way and warning her that Isaac's health is the only damn thing that might keep her alive. She's no crazy zealot, just a selfish prick being manipulated by Captain Shit for brains, preying on her flaws and mercenary nature. Dean blew out his cheeks shaking his head a little with a nervous chuckle. And with her other captives locked up tight, she redirects more firepower to her personal protection, trusting locked doors to hold the prisoners. He grinned, a little bit of pride in the expression, judging by what he said next. You were way ahead of us reading and executing all that on the go. I affected a mock haughty expression, as if the compliments were merely my due, answering in a posh tone that was probably the worst impression of the Queen that has ever been voiced. And that, my dear Dean, is why I'm special, don't you know? I expected my wisecrack to get some laughter, but instead I was knocked a little off guard by the fact the rest of them just nodded, as if it were just fact and not my usual piss-taking ways. That was quite sobering. Now it's time for plan B. We can't go right this instant, and we needed to be shitting bricks for a day or so. Leave them twitchy and not sleeping well to hamper their effectiveness for when we do arrive. So that's what we're doing today. I swear, if Isaac isn't whole when I get there, Hell's Fury will have nothing on mine. Isaac may have been a dickhead of late, but he's our dickhead, and he put Sarah's welfare beyond his own when he was wounded and bullets were flying. That was an act of pure heroism. Hold on, buddy. We're coming. December 24th, 2010. The night before Christmas and all through the apocalypse... It's not lost on me that today is Christmas Eve. We should be wrapping presents and getting all excited, coming together as a community, if only for the kids. Instead, we're equipment checking, running through the plan again and again, and setting up what we can of a QRF. With Sarah, Doug, Finn and Clyde all injured, they're out of it, and they were four of our shooters. Isaac, too. 
Our only real backup guns are Maria and Mark. I don't really want either of them to come, but we might need Maria's skills. Plus, she's a fucking great shot. And Mark has a kid, so I don't want him in harm's way. But he straight up overruled me. Doesn't matter how much of a dick he's been of late, said Mark. Isaac's still family. Such a great guy. Loyal and noble as all hell. Some of the Willow Park people will be hanging back as well, just as drivers for the aftermath. We'll need to transport the captives back with us if successful. Ultimately, it's shit or bust with what we've got, and we've had to adapt the plan a little. Dean, Alicia and Eli will be a three-gun team. I'll be going in the top, like I planned. Nate's changed his role up a bit, but if anyone can move through that building solo and be okay, it's Nate Carter. Our most potent weapon will clear the decks for the fire team's opening assault, then follow them in. I need sleep today, because the five of us doing primary assault are moving out later to plant ourselves in that little house as an overnight operating base. The nomads won't expect us to be travelling in the dark, and then we can all position ourselves with the cover of the murky dawn. Maria, Mark and the others will leave at first light. Those two will have one of the secure channel radios, and the five of us will all be hooked up. Yes, Freya. On Christmas morning, I'll be a gender-bended Santa going up a chimney, onto a roof, and the presents we'll be dropping off won't be wrapped in shiny paper. Because we have machine guns. Ho, ho, ho. Flint and Lock, action heroes, are doing their own messed-up version of Die Hard in a college on Christmas Day. Kill the bad guys, save the hostages. What a world, Freya. What a fucking world. I'm out. Time to prepare and rest up. Merry fucking Christmas. The Greatest Gift of All I'll fucking gut her boyfriend for that raged Mama, slamming the handset to the table when Lockie refused to respond. Leave him be, advised Mace, the primary source of good sense to balance the emotive fury of their matriarch. Carol, Mama, Sullivan, had always been a large woman. Not just overweight, but broad and stout, a fleshy block of anger and vitriol. Some of her excess fat had been burned off by their enforced apocalypse diet, but she was still a big woman in comparison to the forest of slimmer people surrounding her. Every eye was inevitably drawn to her when she entered the room, because her sour presence was just as intrusive as her physical size. Her once long blonde hair, now almost white, gave her a crone-like appearance to match her spiteful personality. Sparking another stale cigarette, the nomad matriarch exhaled a plume of thick smoke, adding to the choking cloud hanging in the air. Her son, Louis Junior Sullivan, nodded in agreement with Mama's desire to gut Isaac, just as he always did. Like a loyal dog, he never disagreed with his mother's words, and like an echo of her actions, he too lit a cigarette. Mama turned her flat, pudgy face towards Mace, offended by his challenge. You heard that woman, right? He continued. Carol, when that convoy was ambushed, they returned fire with some serious fucking hardware. We haven't got anything like that kind of quality. Just a couple of junk tech nines, a handful of decent pistols, and after that, we're in low-capacity shotguns and junk Saturday night specials. Plus, we're not exactly flush with ammo. The last six months have drained us down to the bare bones, and I wouldn't be surprised if even half a gunfight used up the last of it. Our hardware isn't in the same league as theirs. If what this lucky woman says is true, with ex-military and firearms officers, plus a fucking former special forces guy, we should seriously consider trying to make peace with these people. You kill Isaac, there's no telling what they'll do. Pussy, sneered Junior from his mother's side. Shut the fuck up, puppy, 
snapped Mace, whirling on the younger man. The big dogs are talking. Junior might be Mama's son, but Mace was technically the senior nomad as the club's vice president, and his own nickname wasn't given just as a shortened version of his surname. Mace's reputation as a bare-knuckle brawler was near legendary, and no man in the club dared stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, having been a promising amateur boxer before being drawn into the club life by his small-time gangster father. Mace was a natural talent. His trainers convinced he had a real shot to go pro if he'd stuck with it. But that was another time. Another life. Junior blanched and closed his mouth. He was just into his twenties, but Mace approached his mid-thirties and a patched member for fourteen years. His intention as VP was always to take the reins when Mama's husband stepped down or got too old, then shifted away from playing gangster. The Nomads weren't an outlaw one percenter motorcycle club, and playing at being small-time criminals was just embarrassing. Low-level drugs, amateur extortion, and small-time one-off arms deals to common grassroots criminals was no kind of future for a tiny club like theirs. They weren't players, merely dipping a small toe into waters too deep. But the younger crowd had been seduced by too many movies and TV shows, fancying themselves as outlaws. Embarrassing. You might wear that VP tag on your cut, Mace, but I'm the one in charge, remember? Mace stared back defiantly at the woman. You'd never be able to sit at the head of the table before all this went down, even with these freaky dreams. Yet here I am, Thomas, and the dreams are what allow us to prosper. You've seen the evidence. And what are you doing with that? He demanded. You're handing off women to the guys to be used, force others into servitude using fear, and now you're taunting a group that are way better trained and armed than we are. He threw his arm in a general direction behind him. Have you seen what we are, Carol? Boys playing at outlaw, thugs. Half of them hold pistols sideways or think a shotgun can be fired in one hand for fuck's sake. That idiot bulldog is the worst of the lot. That ugly piece of shit would never have earned the patch in the old world. Shit, that streak of piss would have been chased out of our presence as soon as he rolled up with his fake fucking pimp limp. And let's not get onto your sick and twisted tower games in the gym. Times change. Thomas, she said, using his name like an errant child being scolded. This is the new world. And I'm the one granted the visions that lead us to crucial supplies and people with skills to help us survive. The other patches all support me. You are the one outvoted, Thomas. Because of the five patches left, one of them's your low IQ son and two are his fucking mates who share a single brain cell between them. So you get the three to two majority by proxy. Let's not forget that me and Dong voted against letting you lead because of some shitty dreams. Oh, I'm well aware of that, Thomas, she said in a dangerous tone. Don't think I haven't forgotten about the betrayal of you and your retarded friend. Dong isn't retarded, and you're not killing their guy. Mace's stance was firm. We're not all fucking dying for you. I'm not killing him right now, said Mama, that hint of a malicious smirk at one corner of her mouth. Disgusted and unable to deal with mother and son a moment longer, Mace stormed from the college library, slamming the door behind him. Is it all true? asked Mace, passing a bottle of water to Isaac. The younger man accepted with a nod, wincing as he sipped at it. There were definitely a couple of loosened teeth from the beating Junior meted out. His face was a mass of bruising, one eye swollen to a thin slit, and his thigh tightly wrapped with the dressing Doc Emma had changed the night before. 
about all those boasts? Isaac snorted with a nod. I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that Nate Carter is a walking army. He's fought in the Falklands, the Gulf, Africa, and other places he likely hasn't told us. I've seen him in action. And Locke is his protege that's been with him since all this walking dead bullshit started. I mean, she's effectively been personally trained by the SAS, Mace. I don't think either of them know what fear actually is. You ever heard of Jamie Bancroft? Mace puffed out his cheeks with a nod. Shit, yeah. That guy was fucking ruthless, like his old man Harry. Not a guy to be fucked with. Nate and Lockie took them all out, Mace. All of them. Nearly 40 guys, and all the hardware they have now was taken from him. Nate and Lockie started that fight with a shotgun each and Nate's pistol. Now, they're armed to the teeth with military-grade rifles, semi-auto handguns and ammo pissing out their asses. This isn't the first time I've been held prisoner. I was Bancroft's first, as were a few others, and Nate and Lockie went to war for us when it was just the two of them. Isaac shrugged. They're here, Jamie isn't. Mace rubbed his jaw thoughtfully. Shit, Isaac. I never wanted any of this. Is it too late? In Nate's mind, probably. Lucky, though. Isaac sighed and shook his head. She's different. She's all about saving people and hates having to fight the living. All she wants to do is fight the dead. But people like yours keep getting in her way. Mace regarded him for a moment. You've got a thing for her, he observed. Isaac laughed, wincing at the pain in his face. Is it that obvious? Mace nodded with a small grin. We had a brief thing, just one drunken night, but I've liked her from the off. Oh, Mace, she's something else. Most guys probably wouldn't give her a second glance. She's not unattractive, but most would likely say she's just average and no head-turner. He sighed wistfully and shook his head. But it's not how she looks, Mace. Shit. There's just something about her. It's like an energy that draws you in. Even before the world fell apart, I've never met anyone like her. Isaac released a heavy exhale of regret. Truth be told, since then, uh, I've been a bit of a tool to her. I think she's got a thing for one of the new guys, and in fairness, he's a decent bloke. Hasn't stopped me being an arsehole, though. Mace chuckled. The heart wants what it wants, mate. Sense doesn't get a look in. Truth, sighed Isaac. But she's so fearless. Personally trained by the scariest motherfucker I've ever seen in my life, Lockie just doesn't have any quit in her. If she says she's coming, you can bet your life she is, and Nate will be right at her shoulder. All these cocky dickheads you've got around you. Lockie would probably sweep them aside these days, never mind what Nate will do to them. Quite frankly, They'll be lucky if it's Erin who gets to them first. I would not want Nate for an enemy, he added with real feeling. I don't know how it got to this, admitted Mace, rubbing his eyes wearily. Walking murderous corpses are everywhere, and here we are, doing their job for them because of some stupid fucking dreams. Something bigger than us is going on, Mace. Lockie is special. Chosen by on high or something to unite people and make a safe place for the living. You say your hag of a leader has dreams, but hers wants you guys to dominate and control. Lockie and Nate want to protect, want to build something better. Can you honestly say you're playing for the right team here? I don't know about all this divine bullshit, Isaac. 
I know something is going on. Otherwise, Carol's dreams wouldn't have led us to easily acquired resources in areas clear of the dead or pointed us to where survivors were hiding like the dock that patched you up. It's all too specific to be a complete lie. He rolled his head around his shoulders, trying to loosen the tense muscles of his neck. Then listen to your gut feeling, Mace, urged Isaac. You could help stop all this shit before it goes completely west. Help us. I'll make sure Lockie and Nate listen to you, and that you and your big mate aren't like the others. You've treated the other captives right. I could tell that from how different Doc Emma is around you than the others. Get us out, you and your buddy with us. Then let Nate and company do their thing. Mace sat quietly for a moment, considering the younger man's plea. I'll have a think about it and talk to Dong. It won't be easy. I wouldn't wait too long, Mace, warned Isaac. If I die, hell will seem like a good place for a holiday with the pain they'll bring. Nate and Lockie won't wait long before striking. I might have been a dick to Lockie for a while, but I'm still one of theirs. And one thing they'd never do is leave one of their own behind. A day later, on Christmas Eve, any choice was taken from Mace. Junior and his two patched buddies, Ink and Dixie, swept past Mace with wicked smiles curling their dry lips. What's going on? Junior stopped, a supreme smugness painted on his face that turned Mace's stomach. This was bad. We've just put your boy on the tower. We're taking bets on whether he'll last till his people come. Mace gaped at them. What the fuck? The tower was Mama's twisted creation, a test of endurance devised as malevolent entertainment for her boys, and a baptism of fire for prospects hoping to rise through the ranks. In the centre of the gymnasium, a solid tower of bricks had been constructed, standing about ten feet in height and six feet square. Most of the tower was thoroughly cemented and solid, with just the top layer being loose bricks lying atop the stack. Once the tower was complete, prospects rounded up nearby undead, baiting them out of houses in the immediate area. Through a single fire exit on one side of the gymnasium, the undead were ushered into the large open space, and then all the gym fire exits welded shut from the outside. The only way in and out of the gymnasium was the main double door, in from the college itself, which was constantly guarded, heavily barricaded, and chained. When a victim was selected for the tower, prospects armoured themselves head to foot, carrying long staves to push at the undead while bearing large, makeshift shields made from acrylic in imitation of police riot gear. Ten prospects would then use their shields to escort the victim to the tower. Forcing them to climb atop the bricks, the ladder was knocked away and the sentinels would finally beat their way back to the exit. Some prospects were lost to bites, adding to the number of undead. Sometimes they would get too close for comfort and need braining, the corpse left to rot in the building, creating a vile charnel house of the gym. Once clear, the doors would be sealed up again, and the twisted show would begin. The nomad bets were simple. Once the doors were closed and locked, the timer would start, and bets placed on how long the unfortunate victim would last. Able to watch from the level above through a layer of thick safety glass, they would jeer from their safe vantage, taunting the unfortunate star of their grisly show. Victims were given food and water enough for a rationed three days, but none ever lasted that long. They tried breaking for one of the doors, only to find them welded shut, take one of the loose bricks to try and fight the undead, or simply give up on life and throw themselves into the mass. With almost seventy undead clamouring around their precarious perch, taking them on hand to hand with a brick was suicide. Sometimes the star of the macabre show was given a small revolver with a single round. 
Bonus bets were placed on whether the poor bastard would use the bullet on themselves, and how long it would be until they did. Are you mad? demanded Mace as he swept into the library. Didn't you hear anything I said? Mama glanced back with a smirk as she finished buttoning her shirt over her heavy cleavage. Also finishing dressing was her newly patched minion, the ugly young thug who had taken the nickname Bulldog. He thought it was a cool, tough name, not realising Mace coined it because his face contained all the beauty of a bulldog licking piss from a nettle. Mama liked young men and how empowered it made her feel, even ones as butt-ugly as bulldog. If they wanted to rise through the ranks, then Mama needed her sugar. Even the thought was nightmare fuel. Next time, be a dear, a knock before entering, she chided. Who knows what private moment you could have walked in on. Mace shuddered and tried not to vomit in his mouth. What the hell, he snapped. Isaac on the tower? Mama clucked her tongue. But my dear boy, I'm not killing him, and his people are coming for him. If his confidence in his friends is so high, I'm sure they'll rush in and save him. She ended the sarcastic statement with a mockingly sweet smile. You're going to get us all killed, he warned in a tight voice. Ain't no little bitch and no granddad gonna take us down, scoffed Bulldog. Gonna see how tight that little bitch is when she comes around, just like I promised her, bruv. He grabbed his crotch and pulled a truly sickening face that involved sticking his lizard tongue out of his mouth. Mace rounded on the thug. Who left your fucking cage open, dickhead? I swear, if you don't shut your fucking mouth, the next thing to come out of it will be your teeth. Bulldog blanched, struck by the force of Mace's threat, the heat of his rage forcing an involuntary step back. It's done, Thomas, declared Mama, brushing imaginary dust from her clothing, disinterested. This is how it is. This is how the dreams want it. Fuck that and fuck you, he spat. Don't start that shit with me and lay the blame for your sadistic games on fucking dreams. Own your twisted shit, you psycho. Mama sighed. I thought this would happen. She gave a nod to the ugly man at her side, who pulled his handgun clear and pointed it at Mace. Clapping her hands, two more of Bulldog's young thugs entered the room behind Mace, one with a revolver, the other a shotgun. What the fuck are you doing? He grated through clenched teeth. I think maybe you should spend some quality time with our guests. Then, when all this is over, you and I can have a good talk about what comes next and the chain of command. Bulldog's face split into a nauseating grin. Gun out and down, real slow. Yeah, bruv. Nate watched Erin through the powerful scope as she crossed the open space at the college's rear. Dean, Alicia and Elijah remained out of sight, primed for their advance on the college entrance once Erin gave the all clear the entire operation relying on the young woman's success. The grey pre-dawn murk of Christmas morning smeared everything, making it difficult to pick out Erin's tiny form once she disappeared from view. Movement on the low, rear roofs a few moments later quirked a smile to Nate's lips, Erin sweeping across the low rooftops, image growing ever larger in the scope as she navigated the rearmost building towards him leaping like a cat to grab ledges and haul herself up. The extra weight didn't seem to slow her. Far stronger than her short frame suggested, Erin moved with a smooth, elegant glide, always in balance as she arrived at the base of the dangerous ascent. Nate switched his sight to ground level, checking the positions of the four sentries, but their sleepy, unprofessional lack of vigilance was no danger to her 
each one facing away from her as they idly chatted. Unaware of the demented squirrel above and behind them, Nate switched the scope back to Erin just as her hand pressed the mic on the radio. Her voice was low and clear, the throat mic of the police SFO radios picking up every syllable like a crystal. If I die, delete my browser history, she said, eliciting a quiet snort from Nate. Not until I've had a good look, replied Elijah in an equally soft tone. Morbid fascination says I need to know just how depraved you are. There was no answer, but Nate smirked at Erin's beaming smile through the scope as she readied herself for the treacherous climb. Elijah was a steady, calm head, and Nate considered how good he'd be for Erin. He was eminently likable. The two of them had obvious chemistry, and they complemented each other well. Erin was a wildfire, an emotional cyclone roaring with life, while Elijah contained the strength of a calmed ocean. Tranquil, at ease, but with depths of hidden power if the storm awakened. If there was one person who deserved a little joy in their life, it was Erin. If the burden of the living's defence was to hang on her slim shoulders, Nate thought the least those powers could do was give her a little personal happiness along the way. The former marine licked dry lips as Erin ascended, body facing outwards as both arms and legs alternated the pressure against opposing surfaces. Holding his breath as she shuffled upwards to the summit, Erin was past the event horizon where a safe fall was possible, and he waited in agony for this torment to end. Nate's breath hissed in a low chuckle as Erin transferred both hands to one ledge, hauled herself up, stood, threw her hands in the air in her best Rocky Balboa celebration, before performing a bizarre kick and crotch thrust reminiscent of Michael Jackson. Get on with it, you bellend, muttered Nate into the mic. Erin halted, grinned in his direction, and waved happily like a small child at a parent before edging forward to assess the last part of her challenge. Her celebratory expression shifted to focused intensity as she stared down the fifty-foot drop between the two classroom buildings. Shoulders rising and falling as she supped in a breath for courage, Erin marked her approach with long, backward steps, eyes fiercely locked to her launch point. Nate's breath stopped again as Erin charged with sweeping, graceful strides towards the edge, her body tucking in perfect balance as she soared over the gap, landing on the balls of her feet and dispersing the impact across her body by using her hands to spread the force. This time, there was no pause for any victory dance, instead moving directly to the edge of the roof. Holding her rifle by the barrel's tip, she leaned over the edge and used the stock to knock on the window below her. Here we go, people, said Nate into the radio. Stand by. As a cruel joke, Mama interred Mace with the six captive women. Naturally, they shied from him, clustering together in one corner of the room. But over the course of the previous day and night, an uneasy truce formed. Mace had never been party to their torment and spent his time apologising profusely, his inability to protect them from the nomad savagery clearly a weight on him. Gradually they relaxed, though they remained separate. A light knocking on the window startled him from miserable thoughts, and he blinked twice in disbelief. Holding the barrel of a rifle, leaning over the roof so her head and torso were visible, was a dark-haired woman, her long locks tied back in a tight ponytail which hung below her upturned head. What the fuck? he muttered to himself. How the fuck did you get up there? Moving to the window, he opened it. Well, said the woman in a soft tone, this is a turn-up for the books. Do the nomads like to swing both ways? I thought there were only women in here. Mace was not really sure how to answer such a bizarre opening. Um, no. Who are you and how the... Shh, she said, finger to her lips. 
Less talky, more opening the window and backing the fuck up. There's a good dickhead. Still bewildered by the odd woman's appearance and manner of speech, he obeyed, opening the window wide and stepping back. A moment later, the small woman, rifle now strapped tightly to her back, lowered herself from the roof's overhang until dangling from only her fingertips. With fluid grace, she swung her legs forward and back to gain momentum, then swung forward once more, releasing her grip to fling herself feet first through the open window, landing deftly inside the classroom with hardly a sound. Jesus, you've got some balls, observed Mace, leaning out the window to gape at the concrete fifty feet below. Ovaries of stone, homeboy. She shrugged, accent clipped by a hint of Liverpool dialect that sparked recognition. Now, who the fuck are you? Her voice remained low. He's one of them, said one woman in a small voice. Like a gunslinger of the Old West, the glock at the woman's hip was out in a flash as she moved two paces back, his eyes inevitably drawn to the yawning barrel staring back at him. Her once cheery disposition was replaced by a bleak menace. Whoa, he hissed, hands up and out to placate her. There's a fucking reason I'm in here. You're lucky, right? The dark-haired woman nodded. Physically, she wasn't classically attractive, maybe even a little plain in Mace's estimation. But there was a quality to her presence that made her attractive, just like Isaac said. Dark brown eyes regarding him beneath a furrowed brow demanded answers. Look, I'm here because I've been trying to help your buddy, Isaac. They've set him up in their twisted tower game. So he's a lifer now. I know what you might think of me, but honestly, me and my buddy are outnumbered and Carol's got all the little shits wrapped around her finger. Me and Dong have never touched any of these women. They can at least confirm that, right? He looked to the six women, begging for their mercy. In fairness, he's telling the truth, Lucy confirmed, the strongest and de facto leader of the six women. He and his big friend never touched us, and I have heard Mace here arguing against it. The doctor, Emma, said as much as well. He and his friend are the only two with any good in them, I reckon. Lockie remained staring for a moment, her expression still hard. Still could have done something, she said. Mace shrugged. Mate, there's about 35 of the little scrotums, and there's me and Dong. There's only so much two men can do. So we've done what we can. She stared at him for a moment longer, then holstered the pistol, snorting a quiet laugh. When all this is over, you're going to tell me why your mate is called Dong. That sounds like a story. Mace blew out his cheeks in relief. Deal, but I warn you, it's pretty fucking boring. Lockie hit him with a genuine smile then, and Mace instantly understood why Isaac was so taken with her. When she smiled, her whole being illuminated. Her features were no longer plain, but fierce and striking. You get all that, she said, the question catching Mace off guard. All what? asked Mace. Lockie held a finger up to her lips, shushing him, and he noticed the earpiece for the first time. Hot mic, said Lockie eventually, just so my people know what's what and can hear this conversation. Okay, how many are outside the door? Only two in the corridor. Two stairwells lead down from the long corridor on this floor, one dickhead stationed at each. Carol's pulled most of the guard to the entrances, her quarters at the library, and guarding the ways to your mate in the gymnasium where the tower is. Lockie frowned. Tower? What tower? Mace gave her a brief explanation of Carol's twisted game to entertain her minions, and Lockie's obvious disgust poured out. What kind of fucked up shit is that? She hissed in horrified disbelief. Jesus fucking Christ, pal, that is some twisted shit. Mace spread his hands apologetically. Oh no. When I found out they'd put Isaac on the tower, my challenge to Carol was hard. And here I am.
Lockie listened to her radio for a second, nodding. If we got all the captives unlocked up here and took out those two fuck nuggets, could you get everyone out of the building? Mace nodded. There's a fire exit at the bottom of the stairs nearest our door. It leads out this side of the building, he said, pointing to the front-facing window Lockie entered through. It'll only take a second to clear the internal barricade with so many hands. Hear that, Nate? You'll be able to see them come out. She listened to the response, nodding at the instructions before looking back to Mace. I'm putting serious faith in you, buddy. We're going to take out your Bert and Ernie outside the doors. Then you're going to get all the hostages out and head straight across there to that house. She pointed at a semi-detached house facing the college. Number 83 that has the top window open a smidge. The house is safe, so you keep everyone there till we're done, yeah? Understood. I swear, you pull a fast one and betray us. Hell hath no fury like a lucky lied to. I'll give you a gunpowder vasectomy. I like my balls where they are, so no worries there from me. Lucky grinned again, and Mace once more was struck by the illuminating smile. So, let's seal this unholy alliance. I'm Erin Locke, and as you know, my friends call me Lucky. Tommy Mason. Friends call me Mace. yippee ki yay Mace, she said, her smile infectious. Let's fuck some shit up. Mace knocked urgently on the door. Denny, he called. Denny, one of the girls has collapsed. Denny! You better not be fucking about, Mace, warned a voice beyond the door. For fuck's sake, Denny, come and check and then get Doc Emma. I'll back up right away from the door. We all will. Hands on show. Back up, cautioned Denny, his warning accompanied by the audible jangle of keys. The lock clicked, the door creaking open, Denny's small pistol peeking ahead of him through the gap. Satisfied Mace and the other five women were sufficiently backed up, his eyes moved to the motionless woman, face down in the middle of the floor. Ah, oh, shit, he muttered, stepping into the room. Denny froze as the barrel of a Glock appeared from behind the door, the weapon cold against the skin of his neck. Welcome to the party, pal, whispered a woman's voice. Mace grinned as he relieved Denny of his revolver. Call your buddy, ordered Mace quietly. And don't try anything, as I don't fancy that woman painting me with your brains. Ho, 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 breathed Lockie with quiet menace. Lenny, shouted the prisoner. Give us a hand in here, would you? Fuck's sake, Den, came the huffed response. Lockie leaned out from behind Denny and raised an eyebrow at Mace, childish amusement painted on her features. Denny and Lenny, she snorted. Are you having a laugh? Denny and Lenny, really? Mace spread his hands. Don't fucking ask, okay? He stepped past the terrified Denny to wait just inside the door. I've got this one, he said, switching the revolver to his left hand. The voice was almost to the door. Seriously, Den, what the fu- Lenny's sentence remained unfinished. As he appeared in the doorway, Mace took a giant step forward as he came into sight, unleashing a ferocious right jab that smashed Lenny's jaw and teeth like a battering ram. He hit the ground faster than a brained zombie and lay still. As he grabbed Lenny's ankles and dragged the unconscious man into the room, Lockie's mouth dropped open. Holy shit, she coughed. Not just Mace from your surname, then. His face is all wonky like a Picasso. Shit, man, he looks like he's been kicked in the face by a horse. What about him? asked Mace, gesturing to Denny. Ah, Lockie slipped the gun into its holster and took a step back. By all means, age before beauty. After you. Denny tried to throw his hands up and beg for mercy, but Mace's right hand hit him in a sweeping hook with an audible crack. Denny spun a full circle before his unconscious body slammed into the floor. I could watch that shit all day, murmured Lockie. Okay then, game face on. You get their keys and get everyone out of the locked rooms.
she clicked the mic. Stand by, Nate. Give us two minutes from now, then start the show. Nate counted steadily down, scope fixed to his first target, and opened the mic at the end of the count. Firing in three, two, one, fire. The rifle boomed in the confines of the bedroom, the round smashing through the first target's sternum. The second round was already screaming down range as the guards blanched at the sudden thunder. A second man folded before they could even voice their fear, crumpling as the high-velocity round smashed a fist-sized hole in his back as it ravaged his body. The semi-automatic rifle reaped another soul as the two survivors started to run, obliterating a man's spine. As the last survivor reached cover from Nate's wrath, the fire exit facing the Marine opened and a stream of people rushed from the building. Simultaneously, Alicia and Elijah flanked Dean in a narrow wedge as they advanced towards the entrance at an oblique angle to the quivering sentry. His precious cover was useless against the three rifles advancing on him at his flank, and Dean's rifle barked twice, double-tapping the exposed guard in chest and head. Nate nodded in approval as Dean expertly guided his two other fire team members over the comms. Even as contact was called on entering the building and gunfire exchanged, Dean's voice never wavered, calmly issuing orders to the others in a clear, steady tone. Nate's respect for the police sergeant soared as the three disappeared from view inside the building. With no other external targets, Nate collapsed the bipod, placed the rifle back in its case, and closed the lid. Sweeping up the L-85, he flung the strap over his shoulder, rifle ready across his chest, and exited the house to meet the first refugees outside. In the house now, he ordered, waving them past. Heads down and wait for us. Go, go, go! Nate grabbed the man he assumed was Mace by the arm as he passed. He had an eye for spotting fighters. Touch the rifle in there. Mace raised his hand. I'll sit on my hands, big man. Just go help your girl. Nate smirked and moved towards the college, gunfire echoing inside the building from two locations. Dean's fire team didn't need Nate's support. He was Erin's shield, so the old marine sprinted across the road and into the campus, heading straight for the open fire door at the front. Nate followed the echo of Erin's rifle exchanging fire with booming shotguns somewhere in one of the corridors. The number of doors on the walls sent his senses into overdrive, but there was no time for door-to-door -door clearance. According to Mace's expectation, the nomads would cluster in groups defending key points with numbers, rather than spread out in ambush. With no time to clear every room and door, he stalked centrally through corridors, rifle up as he followed the thunder of Erin's exchange. He found her crouched at a corner, swapping out a magazine as plaster puffed off the wall opposite her. She grinned as he appeared, pleased to see him. Situation, he asked. There's five of them blocking the other end of this hallway. According to Mace, this is the only way to the sports building and gym, she replied. I need to get to Isaac as a priority. A wicked grin of satisfaction split her youthful features. There were seven to begin with. Nate winked. That's my girl. How are they shooting? Staggered. Erin shook her head. Like the amateurs they are, all unloading in a panicked frenzy. Most of them are clicking dry about the same time. Capacity three weapons and small six shooters. I bet they're slow reloaders too. You full? Lucky and loaded, she replied with a grin. Fingers and ears then. Get ready to advance and put them down. I've got one left. Nate held up a flashbang with a grin. Erin beamed. Yeah, baby, bring the thunder. Nate chuckled and peered round the corner to check distance. The corridor ended in a junction with hallways leading left and right, shooters hiding behind each corner. With a wall directly behind them, there was no chance of the flashbang overshooting. Ready in three, two, one. Nate wrenched the pin and skidded the flashbang across the corridor's smooth floor to thump against the back wall. 
Cries of panic barely started as the monstrous detonation rattled the hallway, a thick cloud of dense smoke accompanying the explosion to fill the corridor's junction. Senses addled and overwhelmed by light and noise, the defenders struggled to focus, staggering half-blind in the confusion, coughing and spluttering as two vengeful figures, their steps in perfect harmony, phased through the clearing smoke with rifles up. Stalking down the hallway side by side, Nate and Darren squeezed off singular rounds in steady cracks, and all five remaining defenders were down in seconds. The two previously killed by Erin must have reanimated, forcing the remaining five to put them down. They lay in ragged ruin, heads devastated by point-blank shotgun blasts. The pair fired extra rounds into the heads of the fallen, ensuring no reanimating corpses were left in their wake, and Nate stayed close to Erin as she followed the directions given by Mace. As they entered the top viewing floor of the gymnasium, both stopped in horror as they absorbed Isaac's plight. Sat atop a ten-foot brick tower, his leg was bandaged with crimson stains showing through the dressing and looked like he'd suffered a ferocious beating. His face was awash with bruising, one eye almost swollen shut. Surrounding him on all sides were undead, arms hungrily grasping in silence towards him as he stared down into their mass. Isaac, shouted Erin, banging on the safety glass. His eyes lifted at the noise, the mass of undead turning to them, and his face lit up with hope. Fucking hell, Nate, there's shitloads of them, she cursed. Mace says the only way in and out is ahead, then down some stairs to a barricaded double door. We've got to get down there, bait the undead to us and gun them down. Copy that. They moved further along the upper level, spying the stairs down. But just as Erin neared, Nate's hand snaked out and dragged her aside. The crackling rattle of a machine pistol exploded from the base of the stairs, shredding the air where Erin stood only a second earlier. As they moved back to their cover, shotguns boomed in unison. Fuck, roared Erin as they backed up to their first position by the safety glass, a jutting wall for cover. Fuckity, fuck, fuck. No grenades left, Erin. Looks like they've put a heavier guard on the door, knowing we'll go for it. I'm gonna fuck this bitch up when I get my hands on her, promised Erin, her fury impotent and helpless. Let's at least try and thin the herd for Isaac. Without waiting for Nate to respond, Erin switched her rifle to burst and punched three rounds into the safety glass, then smashed the weakened panel out with the barrel of her rifle. Even in the midst of this awful situation, Nate twitched a proud grin at the move as she resisted the natural inclination to reverse the weapon and use the wider stock to break the glass. Always keep the barrel forward, just in case of any surprises, he taught her. No lesson he had to teach ever went unheeded. Well, this is a bit of a pickle you've got yourself in, she shouted to Isaac, voice echoing in the wide space of the gymnasium. He laughed, wincing at a stab of pain in his face. Did you get lost? I've been waiting for ages. Traffic was a nightmare. Total gridlock. Her relief at finding him alive was palpable. Hang fire. We're going to thin the herd. Isaac nodded, and Erin started firing single rounds down into the undead. With the glass safety panel removed, Isaac heard the conversation between the two as their voices carried in the space between Erin's shots. This is too slow, warned Nate, rifle pointing down the corridor to cover. And too fucking exposed. I'm not leaving here until he's safe warned Erin with stubborn finality. Those words lifted him more than she would ever know. Despite all his petulance and childish jealousy, she still came for him, point blank refusing to leave without him. Just that single small exchange encapsulated Lockie and Nate's partnership. The old Marine urged caution, reason and logic driving him to protect her, Erin, however, was led by her heart, not her head. The flame burned hot and fierce, pushing back at the darkness and refusing to leave anyone in shadow, no matter the cost or risk to herself. 
From his vantage, Isaac saw how exposed she was shooting from that position, but she refused to let Nate dissuade her. She wouldn't leave until the undead threat around him was neutralized, then return in force with the rest of her team to clear out the living, blocking her path to him. From his vantage in the gymnasium, Isaac's attention was caught by the group of eight nomads creeping up the stairs, one with a machine pistol, the others with semi-automatic handguns and shotguns, edging to where they could shoot at Erin from cover. Incoming, he roared, pointing. Nate snatched Erin from the open panel in one strong arm, dragging her to cover just as a staggered barrage of fire whipped through the space Erin had been standing just a second earlier. No, she roared in defiance. Nate, we need to clear the undead. I'm not leaving him. Erin, we can circle back with Dean's team. Let's secure the rest of the building, deal with the others, then come back here in force. No, they'll kill him to spite us, screeched Erin. If we leave him now, that's it, Nate. We need to do something here and now. We're pinned, Erin. Our only way is back for now. You step to that open panel and you're a sitting duck. I'm not leaving. For the first time in all his life, Isaac felt no fear, a blanket of peace draping across his senses. For a moment, through the rotting slaughterhouse of the gymnasium, he swore he caught a brief scent of flowers. Erin didn't know just how right she was. The nomads had no intention of letting him live. One advantage to the undead's eerie silence was the nomad voices carrying beyond the door they were stationed behind while waiting for Erin's arrival. Brash and arrogant in everything they did, the thugs unwittingly revealed their strategy a day earlier as they postured. Mama says take the girl out when she comes for him. But if it looks like she's gonna get her little boyfriend out, then put him down. Either she goes down, or the geek does, to fuck her shit up. The following laughter, spite-filled and hateful, cut him deep and resigned him to his end. In his heart of hearts, however, he still clung to the hope Nate and Lockie might find a way. They always found a way. It's what they did. Now, though, Pinned, outgunned, and with no options left to push through the attackers, Lockie couldn't get to him. Worse, her overpowering need to save him would get her killed. Nate was right. There was no way she could take down the undead or the nomads guarding the staircase without exposing herself. Her impassioned refusal to abandon Isaac would be her end, as the nomads had no intention of letting her take Isaac alive. If they couldn't kill her, then they would kill him to spite her and break her spirit. With so many lives resting on hers, there was only one way to keep her safe. Picking up the small revolver and aligning the round with the barrel, Isaac stood. There was no pain from his injuries anymore. No fear. Just peace. She might not be able to save him, but just for once, he could save her. Lucky, he cried, his voice a booming echo in the gym. The crowd of undead turned their attention back to him, shuffling silently in his direction. She popped up on her toes, face barely peering from her covered position, set back from the window. For just a moment, her incessant struggle with Nate's immovable strength ceased. Save yourself and everyone else, he pleaded. There's no time. That face he loved creased into a frown, twisting in horror as she realized his intent as he raised the revolver. Isaac, don't you fucking dare, she screamed, struggling with Nate's iron grip. The old warrior was the only thing keeping her from leaping into a hailstorm of gunfire. I'm so sorry, he said, heartbroken, the barrel of the gun pressed to his temple. Again, for a moment, the brief scent of flowers touched his senses. Peace. It's the only way to keep you safe. Isaac, no, she screeched. 
then darkness. Nate's heart was hollow as the single gunshot echoed in the cavernous space of the gym. Erin's wild scream of grief shattered the following silence as Isaac toppled from the platform, his lifeless corpse tumbling into the mass of undead. With no life to take, the shambling monsters ignored the heavy thump of Isaac's body as it crashed limp to the bloodstained floor. No! Isaac! No! No! Erin shrieked and struggled in one strong arm, still desperate to get Isaac as the hurricane of her grief swept every shred of logic away, eyes streaming and throat raw from horrified screaming. He's gone, kid, Nate grunted, tight and breathless, as he struggled with the writhing woman. I'm sorry, but we've got to get out. Don't make his sacrifice in vain. Isaac! She cried again, her screaming collapsing into sobs. Isaac! Nate backed out through the doors, dragging Erin with him into the corridor beyond and safe from the sights of nomads waiting to gun them down. With Isaac's body no longer in her vision, Erin's heaving sobs dried, her grief mutating into white, hot rage. I'm going to kill that bitch! She hissed through her teeth, more venom and wrath in her voice than Nate had ever heard in his long life. From anyone. Eyes red and her cheeks streaked with tears, she swung her rifle up and thumbed the mic. Status Dean, she demanded, her usual light tone heavy with dark purpose. Mostly clear. Last group of about ten have barricaded the corridor in front of the library door. We've got them pinned but could use a little support. Alicia took a bullet from a revolver, but she's okay. Hit the vest, but might have cracked a rib. She's struggling a little. We're coming. We just have to find a route. Don't start the party without us. Copy that, acknowledged Dean. Split up, said Erin. I don't know the way to the library from here. One of us might be able to find it if we take these two corridors. We're not splitting up, said Nate firmly. You're not thinking straight. We go back out the fire exit I entered, work our way round outside to the main entrance where the others breached, and follow the brass breadcrumbs. Erin rounded on him. A gale of screams and shouts threatened to howl from her, but Nate was a silent mountain, unyielding and immovable. His defiant stance and granite expression blunted her rage, knowing it was one battle impossible to win. Nate was her shield and protector, and he wasn't letting her go anywhere alone while consumed by a bloody need for vengeance. She stared for a moment before releasing a shuddering breath as some of her heat cooled. Lead on. There's about ten of them behind the barricades, said Dean, as the two groups linked up, stacked at the end of a hallway junction. Round this corner to the right, the corridor runs for about 25 feet to a dead end, and the library door is on the right-hand wall. Erin nodded, and without a word, snatched one of the two flashbangs hanging from Dean's IOTV. Before anyone could react, she wrenched the pin free, stepped into the corridor, and launched the flashbang with all her might, smoothly stepping back behind the wall with fingers in her ears. Nate ground his teeth at her reckless exposure, fortunate they were little more than amateur thugs. Treading the waters of her stormy sea of grief, only vengeance could calm those crashing waves, and woe to those who stood in her path. A heartbeat after the detonation, Erin swung her rifle up, a bold combat walk stalking the centre of the hall, single rounds whipping down the corridor like she was born to the trigger, squeezing with repeated tight control and discipline as she cut through the hapless defenders. Ruthless, efficient, never once hesitating in her advance, Erin blasted the thugs as they floundered. What the hell? huffed Dean, bewildered by Erin's furious lone assault. He looked to Nate for answers. Isaac didn't make it, he grunted. Stepping out behind Erin and gliding in her wake, Nate added his own fire in support as the two of them scythed through the helpless nomads. Oh, murmured Dean. Oh, God, no.
With the battered defenders crushed beneath the weight of Erin's towering fury, the pair reached the barricade and pulled the makeshift blockade apart. Drawing her glock, Erin coldly put rounds into the head of every downed nomad, whether dead or dying. The lack of emotion, usually animating her features, her concern to Nate. Erin was not in her right mind. We're here, you fucking cunt, bellowed Erin through the door. I told you I was going to get biblical on you, so make your peace with the devil, because I'm taking an eye for an eye, bitch. I take it your little boyfriend didn't make it then. Mama's graveled voice lacked any fear. If anything, she sounded amused. Nate's hand snaked to Erin's shoulder as she moved to burst through the door. No, kid, he whispered. That's what she wants. There'll be guns trained on the door waiting for it to twitch. I'm not fucking waiting, Nate, she grated, shoulders heaving with a desperate desire to avenge their fallen friend. Only Mama's blood could cool her boiling rage. They're amateurs, he said, twitchy. As soon as this door moves an inch, they'll all start blasting, mark my words. Now, stay to one side. Nate beckoned the others down the corridor. Give me that other flashbang. Dean complied. Stack up and be ready. Alicia, sit the fuck down, you look done. Everyone else against the wall and plug your ears. He fixed Erin with a cautionary gaze. You don't fucking move till I give the go order, you hear me? She nodded once. Erin, do you fucking hear me? Reason returned to her eyes, expression clearing as the force of his question broke through the gates of her rage. I hear you, Nate, she said softly, her voice calmer. I hear you. He stared at her for a moment, ensuring the armor of grief and fury was pierced, and nodded once. Weapons check. Everyone sounded they were good to go. Cover your ears, and nobody moves until my go signal. Copy? They all acknowledged the instruction, Erin included. Dropping to one knee beside one of the library's double doors, Nate placed his right hand low and gave the door a hard shove, pushing it inwards as he moved back behind the wall. As he expected, a wild barrage of fire sprayed the twitched doors. The blast of a machine pistol on full auto riddled the wood, and combined with multiple shotgun blasts, the cheap doors were virtually obliterated by the panicked deluge. As the thunder inside the library ceased, Nate primed the flashbang and tossed it unseen through a ragged hole in the doorway, hearing it bounce once on the hard floor before discharging. Go, 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 urged Nate, a second after the detonation, his rifle up. Plowing into the room with Erin alongside, Dean and Elijah followed as they formed a firing line inside the library, covering every angle as they advanced inwards, just as they had practiced. Stupefied by the flashbang's detonation, the nomads were shredded by gunfire as they stumbled and staggered, unable to defend against the furious assault. The eight men went down in seconds as the four shooters cut through them with consummate ease. Only Mama remained still stunned by the blast, and Erin prowled towards the huge, white-haired matriarch with menacing intent, pressing the barrel of her rifle against the woman's temple. I told you I'd come for you, bitch, hissed Erin, little more than a breath. Still dazed, Mama barely registered Erin's words, but there was no mistaking the press of a hot barrel against her head, and she froze. Erin. Nate's voice echoed in the large open space of the library. You're not an executioner. This isn't you. She's unarmed, on her knees. The guys out there were enemy combatants that you had to put down, as they'd have died from their injuries anyway. This is different, Erin. This isn't you. She needs to fucking die, Nate. Erin's voice trembled, grief leaking back through the cracks in her rage. All her twisted fucking shit, everything she's done, what she made Isaac do. She's got to go, Nate. She's got to. Aye, he agreed in a soothing voice. But not like this, Erin. 
You pull that trigger like this, you'll lose something. And it's something you'll never get back. Trust me on that. Don't let her win like this. Not like this, Erin. Tears streamed down her cheeks, bottom lip quivering, shoulders rising and falling as Erin struggled with the assault of sorrow and wrath battering her heart. Tension gripped the air, all eyes on the diminutive woman standing above the kneeling elder, rifle barrel pressed to the white-haired head beneath her, finger quivering over the trigger. Nate released a slow exhale of relief as Erin sagged, stepping away and moving the barrel from Mama's temple. I won't be like them, she said, likely for herself rather than anyone in the room. I can't be like them. I have to be better. Nate nodded and slung his rifle behind him. Stepping beside her, he placed a reassuring hand on Erin's shoulder and squeezed gently. Yes, kid, you do, he smiled. And that's why you have me. In one smooth draw and fire, Nate smashed around from the Glock through Mama's skull before anyone could react. Cold-blooded murder would lessen her light. But him? Just one more black mark in a life of violence, but one to save Erin's soul. He could live with it. I don't just watch your back, Erin, he said as she stared in shock at the woman's corpse. I'll protect you from more than just the living and the dead. Sometimes you need protecting from this. He tapped his left fist above her heart as the right holstered the Glock once more. It's your greatest strength and your most potent weakness that the dark will target. As soon as you start killing in cold blood, you'll lose what light you've got left. I couldn't bear to see that. I won't. Let that happen. We need that light, Erin. We all need it. Erin stared with red eyes, the quiver in her lip greater with each word he spoke. I stopped fighting my demons when you let them in, showing me how much stronger than them I could be. He twitched a wry grin. Now my demons are on our side. Erin snorted, a coughing sound that was half laugh, half sob, before the dam finally broke. Wrapping his arm around her, Nate drew the small woman to his chest as her tears flowed in earnest, grieving for another fallen friend. December 25th, 2010 Fuck Christmas I'm drunk, Freya. Not a one eye north, one eye south level of drunk, but enough to take the edge off. Edge off what, you ask? Why, that would be my grief, my lovely Freya. Isaac died today. No, wait. That's not right. That doesn't sound right. It's too mundane. Too ordinary. It was more than that. No. Today Isaac sacrificed himself. For me. I can't write this yet. I thought I could, but I'm just not ready. I'm burned out. Empty. Hollow. Again. Hey. Lucky, how would you like a dead friend that all you did was talk shit about for the last few weeks? Here's an extra sack of guilt as a bonus gift. Merry fucking Christmas. December 28th, 2010. The Raid. I'm going to have to power through this. It won't be as stylishly detailed as I usually do, as it's just so fucking raw right now. The last few days have been blurred by tears and grief and sorrow and... Sigh. 
I need to get this down now before the details start getting hazy. Sometimes having such a good memory is a curse, though, because you remember pain in all its agonizing detail. In the early hours of Christmas morning, Nate set up his new sniper rifle back from the upper floor window of our little operating base, while I made a circuitous route through a housing estate to reach the rear of the college. Dean, Alicia and Eli were escort for part of the way until they reached their staging point. Then I was off on my own. The early part was easy, and I soon made it to the chimney between buildings, sucked up my courage and split-wedged my way to the top without fault. After a little victory dance of relief and a stern warning to get a move on from Nate over the radio, I gave him a wave and then made the jump to the roof of the building I intended to infiltrate. When I leaned over the edge and tapped on the window with my rifle, what I wasn't expecting to see was a man. I'd specifically gone for the room with the six pretty women provided as unwilling entertainment for the nomad wankers. Turns out the guy's name is Tommy Mason, but everyone calls him Mace and was a rebel against Mama's rule. He was an original patched member of the nomads before the apocalypse rained its shit down on us all and not one of the chavs playing gangster. In his early thirties, maybe, Mace is tall, has a sort of dirty blonde hair and beard, and quite a rugged looker now I've seen him showered and tidied up. He punches like a fucking jackhammer as well, with something of a history in boxing. Once the girls confirmed he hadn't been involved in their ill treatment, I got the lowdown on the situation from Mace, and we devised a plan to get all the captives out. One less thing to worry about, and let us concentrate on finding Isaac. Writing his name set me off just now. You don't notice any difference, Freya. No time passed for you reading this. But the truth is, I wrote his name and had to stop for twenty minutes while I sobbed my fucking heart out again and worked to pull my shit together. Mace baited the first sentry in, with one of the girls lying face down, feigning a collapse. And as the sentry entered the room, I slid from behind the door and pressed my glock against the back of his neck. When the guard appeared at the door, I witnessed the reason for Mace's twofold name firsthand. He straight-armed the guy, Lenny, in the face, with the most ferocious fucking punch I have ever witnessed. Bone and teeth just smashed, and Lenny went down like he'd been hit by a runaway train. I've done mixed martial arts for many years, as you know, but only to an amateur personal defense level. But holy mother of mercy, the technique and power in Mace's jab was off the fucking chart. I wouldn't be surprised if he could brain a zombie with a punch like that. Unbelievable. It was like Mickey One Punch O'Neill the character from Snatch played by Brad Pitt. Bang. Night-night. He did it again when we needed to put the second guard's lights out on the quiet, and I stepped back to let Mace have the honours. This time he whipped round a short right hook from the hip. Even with a short swing, the poor dickhead spun a full 360 before he hit the ground like a sack of shit. Honestly, Mace's punch is like a magic trick. You're awake. Abracadabra, and now you're not. I gave Nate two minutes before starting the show as Mace took the keys, unlocking the other three classrooms, ushering everyone out and down some stairs to the fire exit we cleared. We left the two unconscious bellends locked up in the classroom. Honestly, they might even still be there. I can't remember anyone dealing with them. Some things are hazy as hell at the minute. Mace gave me directions to the gymnasium, and then as Nate's final count came over the radio, I wished everyone luck. Three booms from Nate sounded in rapid succession. At the first shot, Mace pushed down the bar, and everyone flooded towards the house. As Mace left, he asked me to look out for his mate, Dong, who wasn't an enemy. We couldn't miss him, he said, as he was over six and a half feet in height. 
Once they were gone, I started my walk through the corridors, rifle up, listening to Dean's smooth instructions to Alicia and Elijah in my earpiece. Man, he's so damn calm when under fire. We're lucky to have him. I got to the end of a corridor where Mace warned there would likely be resistance, and his intel was spot on. Peering round a corner, I managed to get the jump on a group waiting at the end of the corridor. I sent one round down the hall into a thug's ribs before they reacted, then had to dive behind my wall as return fire came in a hurricane. The dumb shits were all unloading, so I flicked my rifle to burst and leaned round as they all clicked dry. The first three-round burst raked up one moron, but the next few just suppressed them. I needed them to know I had some serious firepower, because I knew as soon as Dean's team breached, Nate would enter via the open fire exit and just follow the thunder until he found me. When he did, I was just swapping out my first magazine. Remember those two flashbangs Nate possessed when we assaulted Bancroft? He only used one. He'd brought the other one with him and slid it down the hall where it detonated, allowing the two of us to just walk through the idiots and put them down. Then, we arrived at the gym. Mace had already prepared me, but it was still fucking twisted to see it. Isaac sat on top of a brick tower in the middle of the big open space, about ten feet up, with about seventy or eighty zombies grasping at him. Other bodies were scattered throughout the gym, having been put to final rest for whatever reason, but they were in varying states of decomposition. Dried blood and gore smeared the walls and floor. Horrific, like something out of a horror movie. And Isaac had been sitting in that festering charnel house for over a day. He lit up when he saw us. But when we tried to get to the gym's only viable entrance, eight heavily armed goons at the base of the steps opened up on us, with my fuck-for-brains mate Fugly at their head. With no other explosives left, trying to walk down those steps would have been suicide. If it wasn't for Nate's quick reaction, I might have been perforated by one of those damn machine pistols from the off. Unable to get down the stairs, I shot out one of the clear safety panels on the viewing level so I could talk to Isaac and start popping undead melons. Nate didn't like it one bit, saying we were too exposed and we could circle and come back. I, however, was convinced if we left Isaac then, they'd have killed him just to spite us, or for some twisted fun. That's the kind of fuck-up Mama was. Isaac called out a warning we had incoming, his vantage of the whole level much wider, and again Nate reacted to save my bacon, dragging me back just as more fire came down the corridor at us. I don't know what happened to me. I just lost it. I was so convinced that we had to get Isaac out now that I wasn't listening to Nate's life-saving logic. I was defiant, refusing to leave Isaac alone in that gym, surrounded by undead. I'd be dead for sure without his vigilance. Then, Isaac called out my name. I peered up, stopping my struggle with Nate's arm of granite coiled round my waist for a moment, and went up on my toes, so I could see him. Save yourself, there's no time, or something like that. Like I said, hazy. I frowned, and was about to pour scorn over his noble intentions, then saw the rising revolver in his hand. Some of the victims, forced to play the twisted endurance game, were given a thirty-eight with a single round, apparently. The nomads bet on whether the poor fucker on the tower would use the bullet on themselves. Isaac was standing on the tower, a really strange look on his face. Never a truly courageous man, Isaac did his best, but lost his cool easily in stressful situations. Some of us just aren't cut out for high stress levels, though he was off the chart heroic in pushing Sarah to safety at his own expense. We all deal with it in our own way. But there was no fear on his face at all. He seemed... I don't know. 
He seemed like he was resolved to it. At peace with it. I fucking wasn't, though. Don't you fucking dare, I screamed, realising his intent. Panic and terror clouded everything else as he pressed that gun to his temple. I'm sorry, he said with a smile of such heart-shattering regret. But it's the only way to keep you safe. God damn him but he didn't even hesitate, and I screamed in horror as his lifeless body toppled from the tower and thumped to the floor, ignored by the shambling dead. I don't remember a great deal of what happened for a time then. Horror, disbelief and grief blinded me, and I just remember screaming and struggling, Nate trying to calm me, his grip like iron preventing me from wandering out into the nomad cone of fire. He eventually managed to manhandle me through the doors and out of the gym building. Once Isaac's body was out of my sight, the crushing fist of grief in my guts opened, the emptiness inside filling with rage as hot as the heart of a star. Frightening, now I look back and reflect. I'm an emotional sod, but it was like every emotion I've ever felt in my entire life, all forged into one blinding streak of fury. It was like I was detached from my body and I'd just become an elemental of pure, undiluted rage. The only thought in my head was the bitch responsible as I demanded an update from Dean. Nate cut through that rage after I demanded we split up to find a route. He wouldn't be moved and I can get a lot around Nate most days, but in that moment, even blinded by fury, he was a rock and a hard place at the same time, and I didn't fancy getting caught in the middle. Never split the party. Golden rule. When we finally located them, Alicia's vest was off and cast aside, her face twisted in pain. On their advance through the college, she'd taken a thirty-eight to the torso. The vest stopped the bullet killing her, but Eli says it's cracked a rib for sure. She's okay, but she's been sore as hell these past few days. Cracked ribs are a royal bummer. I've had a couple in my time from falls or fights. There's nothing you can do except be careful, strap them up and wait them out. Every breath is agony, never mind trying any form of activity. God help you if you need to sneeze. It's like getting hit in the torso with a sledgehammer. Dean gave us the quick lowdown on the situation. Makeshift barricades made from metal cupboards and heavy wooden tables were erected at the end of the corridor in front of the library door. Without any clear thought or good sense, I unhooked one of the two flashbangs attached to Dean's heavy tactical vest and stepped brazenly out as I wrenched the pin and launched the grenade like I was hurling a cricket ball back from the boundary. I was lucky the amateurs weren't really prepared or expecting someone to be so bloody stupid. Luck is clearly one of my things, because I should be dead. Anyone with any kind of sense would have fired, not gaped, at the woman with no raised weapon stepping into the corridor. They didn't fire, though, and I stepped back round the corner, ramming my fingers in my ears. The moment it detonated, my rifle was up, and I just started walking and firing. Nate joined me seconds later, and between the two of us, we put them all down. Unsighted, unhearing, and utterly defenceless, it was just too damn easy. I drew my Glock as we tore the barricade open, putting a round in the head of every one of them, whether dead or dying. I didn't want any rising undead getting in the way of my vengeance. I was ready to breach like an enraged lunatic when Mama baited me with Isaac's demise through the door. But once again, Nate stopped me, taking calm control. He switched it round, baiting them with a twitch of the door. On edge, the armed thugs blasted everything they had while we waited either side of the door. Then Nate tossed Dean's second flashbang through a splintered hole, disabling any further defence. Alicia remained outside, struggling as she was, but the four of us breached like avenging angels and gunned the last eight nomad defenders down, ensuring all of them were headshot to prevent reanimation. 
Mama was on her knees, overwhelmed by the flashbang and subsequent violence of action as the four of us stormed into the room and blasted her defenders to meet. You don't see many obese people six months into an apocalypse. So far, I've only known five chubby apocalypse folk, and Mama was all five of them. She was the stereotype for every yo mama joke ever conceived. Seriously, with her white witchy hair and a face like a smashed crab, she resembled something that should be living under a bridge, demanding answers to riddles for those wanting to cross. I was ready to execute her. She deserved to die, and I pressed the barrel of my rifle against her head. Even though dazed and confused, when that hot metal pressed against her, she froze solid. I told you I'd come for you, bitch. It didn't even sound like my voice. It was like I was hearing someone else say the words. Someone harder. Someone meaner. I was lost, Freya. Adrift on a sea of grief and rage and heartbreak with no sight of land. The only thing that stopped me was Nate's calming voice, though I can't remember everything he said. I think I trembled about her having to go, and Nate said something like, don't let her win like this, or something. I know he said, this isn't you, Erin. I was on the verge of just saying, fuck you all, and squeezing that trigger. It would have been so easy but Isaac's words haunted me. Save yourself. If I pulled the trigger then, if I executed the bitch in cold blood, even despite all the awful shit she's done to people, how can I say I want something better? I'll kill to defend those I care about, and to defend those who can't defend themselves, but if I just stand here and execute this evil bitch in cold blood... Does the flame die with me? Is this a test that shithead hoped I'd fail? Would I give Captain Evil his final satisfaction in dousing that flame of hope with yet more guilt and remorse? Would it be the first step out of the light and into the dark? Then, Nate's words. This isn't you, Erin. The one person beside me since all this began who feared I'd hate him for his past mistakes. He's a new man now. He's better, stronger, more caring and more open. With his darkest truth accepted and forgiven, he's started on the road to forgiving himself. I couldn't disappoint Nate. Anyone but Nate. Hallow with the rifle, taking a step back. I won't be like them, I said for myself and for Nate. I can't be like them. I have to be better. Nate's hand reached to my shoulder, squeezing it in reassurance. Yes, kid, you do. And that's why you have me. I jumped as Nate's pistol appeared in his hand, and without hesitation, he executed Mama for her crimes. Once again, Nate took away my burden and did what had to be done. He didn't do it because Mama deserved it, though. He did it, so I didn't have to. I remember everything that he said next, though, as the gunshot shocked me back into focus. I don't just watch your back, Erin. I'll protect you from more than just the living and the dead. Sometimes you need protecting from this. He tapped a lightly clenched fist over my heart. It's your biggest strength and your most potent weakness. As soon as you start killing in cold blood, you'll lose what light you've got left. I couldn't bear to see that. I won't let that happen. His voice turned iron then. We need that light, Erin. We all need it. That did it. I broke. 
The grief came flooding back, yet at the same time, those tears were of gratitude. Gratitude for Nate. He understands me like nobody else, stands right at my shoulder through everything, for good or ill. Whether it's dragging me out of a bullet-riddled hallway or stopping me becoming a cold-blooded killer, Nate is there, protecting me from everything. Protecting me even from myself. I love that big dumb planet head so much. Stick a fork in me. I'm done. This was hard writing. Hard to relive in the telling. I'll loop back round when I can and talk about the new people and the aftermath of the raid. I'm a royal fucking mess at the moment and struggling to function. I hope you find peace, Isaac. I'm sorry I was such a dick to you. What you did was unbelievably selfless, because I know you gave your life to protect mine, and a debt like that can never be repaid. I'll just have to try, in everything I do, to ensure your heroic sacrifice was not in vain. I'll try to be worthy of the gift you gave me. Shit. I really am done now. Part Two The Faith December 29th, 2010 Sanctuary I was a mess yesterday. After I finished writing, I tried to numb the pain with bourbon again. Instead, all I managed to achieve was make myself spectacularly maudlin. I found myself going next door to the small staff house where Elijah and Theodore live. It was dark and cold, and I didn't know what the hell I was even doing there as I knocked. Even as Elijah opened the door, rubbing at his eyes, I said nothing. Just stood there. He knew something was off, saying nothing and just taking my hand to draw me inside. A half bottle of booze swung limply in the other hand, and Eli took it gently from me, setting it down, and led me upstairs to his room. I didn't resist. I was just numb. Grief, guilt, and anger had burned me dry. I was a dazed, empty vessel, with no fucking clue as to why I was knocking at his door, barefoot in the dark winter night, wearing only an old tee and the three-quarter length shorts I slept in. Elijah guided me into his bed, and I lay down on my side, staring at the wall, not seeing him at all. Still without a word spoken, he slid in beside me, covered us both, then his arm wrapped over me from behind and pulled me into him, warming my shivering form with his body. Nothing else, Freya. No advances, no whispered honeyed words. Recognising I was lost, cold, and feeling terribly alone in a procession of simplest, wordless actions, Elijah gave me sanctuary, gave me his warmth, and showed me I wasn't alone. He was just... there. I didn't know what I wanted when I knocked on his door. I know it wasn't sex. I didn't feel the need to reaffirm life as some might when grieving traumatic loss. This morning, now my head's a little clearer, I guess I was just scared to be alone with my guilt. The tragedy of the Willow Park deaths, the injuries to our people when Isaac was taken, and the tipping point of Isaac's sacrifice were finally too much weight to bear. For just one night, I wanted someone to take it from me, to feel safe, protected. On some deep subconscious level, Elijah was the one I was drawn to. People look to me now, with all this flame of hope business, and I can feel that pressure building. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it. There's no clear instruction of what comes next. I'm making it all up on the fly. What I do know, however, is that people have expectations now. 
Even if they're not fully convinced by the whole weird notion, it still feels like they expect me to confirm it somehow through words or actions. Like it's my role to convince them of the truth and the burden of proof is mine. I haven't got a damn clue what I'm supposed to do or say. It feels like I can't let anyone see me weak and only strength is allowed in the light. If I want tears to fall, they have to be spilled in the dark. It's a lonely place to be, and a scary one. Eli just seemed to know what I needed last night. No words, no need to talk, just a comforting presence holding me until I fell asleep. Seriously, it was the best night of sleep I've had in a long fucking time. When I awoke this morning, Eli remained unobtrusive. He didn't mention the previous night or press me for any reasons. Instead, he just made me a coffee in the morning and we sat at his little table chatting comfortable small talk while Theodore scribbled away on one of his drawings. He's just so easy to be around. Just as I was about to leave, I turned and hugged him, whispering a quiet, thank you, before disappearing out the door. There's nothing quite as powerful as the gift of someone's presence when you need it the most, without expectation and freely given. Maybe that's what Nora and Maria meant when they bestowed their worldly advice on me. Relationships should be a sanctuary, not a battlefield, to quote Nora. And Maria's sage wisdom? In those times when one can't bear all the weight, the other carries their share for a while. Most importantly of all is that you never, ever keep score. Eli asked for nothing, expects nothing, and gave me more than he'll ever really know by being a sanctuary for me when I needed it the most. Nora said I'd just know. I'll never be sure, because I guard my heart like a lioness guards a cubs. But hell, as first auditions go, Eli smashed it. He didn't even make the morning after awkward. He's just so... calm. I don't know if you've noticed, Freya, but calm is not something I do very well. I'm not exaggerating when I say I'm all or nothing, laugh or cry. Honestly, I must be a nightmare to be in any kind of relationship with, which is probably why I've never found anything I'd consider worth holding on to. I imagine I'm a lot of effort. For the first time, though, I'm starting to think it's possible. December 31st, 2010 New Year, New Beginning Today marks the end of a truly shitty year. I'm not in a party mood at all, and nor is anyone else. Too much to do, too much fallout, too many new people to integrate and settle. And many of us are grieving, whether that's the Willow Park people or those of us who knew Isaac well. All I want this new year is for my friends to stop dying and the living to stop being fucking wankers to each other. I'm sick of the living killing each other. I'm sick of having to fight my fellow humans. The dead are everywhere, yet they've been relegated to little more than environmental hazards when we go beyond the gate, and just something we need to be vigilant of should one of our people keel over from natural causes. It's exhausting. I just want people to be safe and be decent human beings to each other. But it feels like we're always waiting for the next human threat instead of planning a war against the undead. That is the real fight. We've still got evil Jesus and his resurrectionists out there, and I just fucking know there's something coming with them. I just know it. I can't face an all-out war with them right now. They've got hundreds of people and probably a hundred active shooters. Any war would be costly as fuck for both sides, but mostly for us. 
Most of our experienced fighters are injured at the moment in some form, so we need to find a better way with those people. I can't face mass casualties in a costly and bloody war that will end up a Pyrrhic victory, where the cost of success is so high that we end up dying out anyway. Remember Fugly, the nomad bell end that thrust his crotch at me? Yeah, that little shit must have bailed. He's still out there, and I don't like that at all. When we went back to the gymnasium to clear out those eight nomads, they'd already scarpered. I'm thinking Fugly, who Mace tells me calls himself Bulldog. He is now truly nomadic with his little crew of shitheads from the gymnasium. I hope he gets fucking eaten by the dead, and I don't really wish that on anyone, as it adds to their number. I'm not saying I hate him, as I try not to hate. Hate is a road that leads to Captain Evil's dark place. I'm just saying... I wouldn't be averse to Wolverine doing Fugly's prostate exam. Fuck Bulldog. I'm keeping Fugly. It suits him better. I like dogs, and I don't like Fugly one little bit. In the aftermath, we also found Mace's other, good, nomad friend that goes by the handle of Dong. When shit got real... Dong simply sequestered himself away in a classroom, and when it was all over, he surrendered with hands in the air and completely unarmed. Now, I expected the story of his nickname to be something spectacular. Mace warned me it was boring, and he wasn't wrong. Dong's real name is Richard Biggs. Dick Biggs. Thus, Big Dick. And finally, we arrive at Dong. It's still a hilarious name, and I have to try and not laugh every time I hear someone say, Dong's a big one, isn't he? I'll take whatever smiles I can get. Naturally, there's still a bit of suspicion around the two of them, especially as Dong is massive. Not gonna lie, I just snig at writing that. At about six and a half feet, with the proportional width to go with it, Dong has an imposing presence. That time I straight up laughed aloud. I need to get past this. Twelve-year-old Lockie is in residence. Maybe my New Year resolution should be resisting all this immature sexual innuendo, but it's so hard. Okay, I really am done now. That was definitely the last one. The two of them are hovering on the fringes at the minute, but don't seem bitter about it. If anything, they expected it, so they're taking it in their stride. My instincts say these two aren't bad eggs, but they'll have to work to earn everyone's trust, with more visible effort than other new people might. I kind of like them. When Mace gave me the story of Dong's nickname, I blurted out, I've always wondered, how do you get Dick from Richard? Without missing a beat, Mace answered, Maybe ask him nicely. Damn it, but I needed a laugh at that moment. I like the guy. There's one major boon to liberating the 15 captives, other than actually saving them, obviously. Emma Newham is mid-forties and a fully qualified doctor. The amazing thing was a real small world moment. Doc Emma and our very own Maria Williams are friends. Emma often acted as the on-site consultant at Vale Infirmary where Maria worked, so the two know each other really well. Maria Wax is lyrical about her, saying she's a top-draw medical professional and has worked in emergency rooms and able to perform life-saving surgeries when required. I can't tell you how happy that's made everyone. With a senior nurse practitioner, a trained first response combat medic, and now Doc Emma as a qualified trauma surgeon, we are stacked with medical skills. Crenshaw is a busy place now, and food is swiftly going to become an issue. Nora is planting ready for next year after turning some of the fields, but in the interim, we need to do some serious clearance over the next month or so. We're going to need two or more teams beyond the gate, acquire some larger vehicles, and load up with as much as we can put our hands on. With the 17 people from the Nomad Liberation, 15 captives plus Mace and Dong, the 21 survivors from Willow Park and the 20 that already resided here at Crenshaw. Well, count them up. 
That's 58 people here now. Crazy to think that it all started out with just the three of us, Freya. You, me, Nate, and of course my little dude, Particles. He's been awesome this past week, as my emotional support pug again. I feel shitty, because I withdraw when grief hits like this, and other people carry the weight. I should be more visible, but when I'm this low, I'm just terrible to be around. It's also compounded by being that time of the month and I feel rotten. My insides are cramping like a vice is crushing them, and my emotions, which aren't stable in the best of times, are absolutely all over the fucking place. Sometimes, my alone time is generally for the safety of others. It's a new year tomorrow. Hopefully a better one. I'll probably be writing at more distant intervals for a while. For the next few weeks, we're going to have to start on major resource acquisition to ensure this many people are fed, kept clean and healthy. With so many of our main shooters healing injuries, a lot of the responsibility for security is going to fall to the likes of me, Nate, Dean and Eli. Alicia's torso looks like it's been run over by a truck with all the bruising from being shot. Mace and Dong are keen to help, and both can shoot. Also, Dong is probably as strong as three people and will make short work of any physical labour. He was a bouncer before all the bullshit started, and I can't imagine many people carried on causing shit with Big Dong thrusting towards them. I'm getting my laughs where I can, Freya, no matter how childish. Definitely the last one, I promise. A lot of people are still nervous about them, but even the doc says the two were always respectful, with Mace forever apologising for all the shit while she was there. I think they're good, and will let them play for my acquisition team. My instincts are usually on point about people, and these two guys don't set off any alarms in my head. Our first point of call, however, needs to be Vale Infirmary, where Maria and our new doctor worked. It'll be an unholy mess of undead without doubt. Medical centres must have been ground zero for so much horror. Vale Infirmary isn't a hospital, more like a minor injuries clinic. The nearest hospitals are a good 15 miles away minimum, and there's no way we're going near Chester or Warrington. Way too heavily populated areas. The hospital over at Leighton is just a hell no. The place is massive, and I bet it's a special mini-apocalypse all of its own. Nope. No way. Vale Infirmary, however, Maria assures, will have plenty of medicine, dressings, supplies, equipment, and remember the desperate need for IV bags in the case of serious injuries. Uh-huh. With so many people here, we're going to have to take the ammo hit and clear it out. It's not a huge building, but I bet it got crowded as fuck on that day as people turned up with minor bite injuries. Shit, I bet it went to hell in no time at all. Maybe taking out a load of the undead instead of shooting asshole humans will help me work through my grief. Shit, I really hope so. Helping people instead of bloody fighting them is good for the soul and what we should be focused on. But Isaac's loss tainted it because we had to kill so many of those dickheads to do it. It was a very bloody Christmas, lacking goodwill to all men. For once, I'd like to feel I'm gaining a little victory over Captain Evil's bullshit, no matter how small that win might be. So I'm going on an undead hunt at Vale Infirmary in a day or two. A new year approaches. I hate all the new year, new me bullshit people used to say in those heady days before the dead were trying to kill us. The truth is, if you've got any real commitment to personal growth, we renew ourselves in little increments every day as our experiences shape us. So, here's my new year speech. Will I use my head instead of listening to my heart? Will I rein in my potty mouth? Will I stop sniggering at innuendo like a 12-year-old boy? Tune in next year for the new season of... No, I probably fucking won't. January 2nd, 2011 
most heinous. Today was a long day, Freya. We went to the infirmary, and holy shit, I said I wanted some catharsis, and boy did we get some. It was just good sense to take virtually every able-bodied shooter we could. Me, Nate, Dean, Elijah, Mark, Mace, Dong, and Maria. We needed Elijah and Maria because they're both combat-effective medics, so we could leave Doc Emma back at the school in case of any medical problems, and Maria knows Vale Infirmary intimately. On top of those solid shooters, Clyde came along to get more firing time with the shotgun, as he's sufficiently healed from his superficial buckshot wounds. Dean also brought along young Zane, who's been working with the pistol for about a month since his birthday, so our newly minted adult came along for live firing experience. Young Alex came along as well, not for firearms, but because he's apparently some kind of youth county champion archer. This caught me by surprise, so I asked him for a demo yesterday after the team was finalised. Holy shit, that kid is fire. He turned 16 a month ago and is a level-headed kid. Dean thought it would be good for him to get experience using the bow against actual undead, but in a safe environment surrounded by solid people. The school was big on archery in the old world and has loads of equipment, so he's not short of arrows, and it'll likely be a target-rich environment, as Nate puts it. Alicia tried to say she was fine and she'd just use the pistol, but Doc Emma completely overruled her. She's lovely as our new doctor, but Jesus, if you risk your health against medical advice, she is not shy of ripping you a new one. Alicia decided the battle of wills wasn't worth it. With eleven of us and a mix of weaponry, we opted to keep just the four of us on rifles. Me, Nate, Dean and Eli. We're absolutely stacked with shotgun ammo and don't use it much. While we're okay on 5.56 and 9mm for now, if we can control the environment and use up a massive 12-gauge we have, that's way better for our stores. Two big crates of 5.56 were stashed in Castle Bancroftstein, which gave us an initial haul of about 3,000 rounds. But we've burned through a bit of it, and quite frankly, we don't know if we'll ever be able to locate any more. 12-gauge will be easier to locate over time, I think, though easier is a relative term in the UK when it comes to anything firearms-related, but 5.56 and 9mm will be rarer than rocking horse shit in our little northern paradise. We rolled out in a number of vehicles, Humvee, Pickup, which I still want Clyde to pimp with armour so I can call it the Warthog, a couple of diesel SUVs from the Willow Park people, and the loader crane truck in the event we wanted to load any medical devices that could be useful back home. The infirmary is on a standard road through a part of town, away from the centre, and surrounded by a six-foot-high brick wall. We pulled all the vehicles aside to let Mark drive the loader truck towards the car park entrance, while the four of us with rifles cleared the immediate area of wandering undead outside the entrance. Once clear, we parked the loader truck across the open space to create a barrier, allowing us to contain and control the undead mass within the car park. It was fucking heaving with undead, well over a hundred just outside. Using the truck bed as an elevated firing position, we set to work. The undead shambled towards us and we set ourselves in a couple of lines along the truck's bed, firing staggered. When one line of shotguns was out, they stepped back and reloaded, while the next line of shooters moved forward to take their turn. Me and Eli pulled security at ground level behind the truck, keeping eyes on both directions of the road and the line of houses opposite the infirmary, ensuring we weren't prowled by sneaky undead outside the containment. With that much fire going off to clear the car park, we made a serious amount of noise, and naturally drew other nearby undead. While me and Eli kept watch and took down any of those trying to sneak up, our two master mentors, Nate and Dean, did overwatch on the novice shooters to assess, help, and tweak the technique of those on the truck bed. It was good experience for everyone, and will help the group as a whole moving forward. 
Mace and Dong are solid shooters, as are Mark and Maria. Zane got solid time with the pistol and took it very seriously, as one should, and his confidence has notably increased. He did get a little too confident at one point until Nate spotted it and scared the shit out of his ass with that drill sergeant voice. You don't play at guns when Nate is nearby, because in verbal terms, he will rip you a new asshole, sew it up, and then rip it again until you start acting sensibly. Alex might get upgraded to a firearm, even though he's 16. Nate was seriously impressed with his level of composure, even going so far as to say, That kid has ice in his veins. Trust me on this. From Nate, that's praise of the highest magnitude. Even with the jarring thunder of all the guns going off around him, he was like Hawkeye with that bow of his. Smooth, unhurried, and accurate. When he's using that bow, he must zone out, seeing only the target. I don't think he can train that level of focus into someone, and probably explains why he was two-time youth champion in his age groups. He's one of those people who just has it, whatever it is. To use a firearm in the field, though, he'll have to learn awareness. You can't afford to zone out in a live situation, because you'll have a zombie biting at your arse cheeks before you can say, Oh, matron. With the car park clear, I volunteered for the shitty job of opening the infirmary front door. I'm the fastest and most agile, a fact not up for debate. All the noise pulled the undead inside the building to the front door, drawn to the shattering thunder outside. The wooden entry doors push inwards, and the undead pressed from the opposite side against it, pushing out. There was no way those double doors were getting opened from my side, with so much undead press against them. So Nate suggested taking one of the six shell shotguns inside the little entry porch before those doors, and blast the frame from close range, optimising the damage of the buckshots spread into tight areas. If I fired twice on where each hinge was, and twice where the door closer was screwed to the top above it, the heavy press of undead should just force through one side of the double doors, and then walk out into the car park in a nice steady stream. It worked like a charm. I'm not as green as I used to be, so when I took a shotgun into that little corridor from the main external doors, about 12 feet in length, I plugged my ears. Shotguns are fucking monstrously loud anyway, but in tight confines like that entrance corridor, it's like sticking your head in a thundercloud. The door frame was utterly ruined by the time I fired the sixth blast. I got my motor running when it started collapsing, and the first undead stumbled through and hit the deck as the immovable door gave way. The urgent press of bloody bodies briefly stalled as they tangled with those at the front and fell on their face. Zombies don't put their hands out to arrest falls. They just fall, and I'm sick to my stomach from hearing them bite hard floors as they smash down. Breaking teeth at speed on hard surfaces is a truly awful sound, and one you can't escape when you have regular contact with the undead. It keeps resurfacing to haunt your memories. Gah, I'm shivering just writing about it again. That initial tangle did give me the chance to clear out safely, though. Tossing the shotgun back to Mace for reloading, I climbed up on the truck bed in readiness for the swarm. They started streaming out in a little line. Very British zombies, you see, as they'd all waited patiently in a queue to get out of that one collapsed doorway. Nate held everyone from firing immediately, ever teaching as he answered a few queries. Because if you shoot them all as they come out the door, they'll stack up in a small area and eventually the rear of the pack will get trapped again. We want them all out that can come out, so we've only got stragglers in rooms to deal with. Let them come to us as the others did and spread the fallen out over the larger space. Doesn't miss a trick, our Nate. It was a good two hours from our initial arrival before we were satisfied that no more undead were going to shuffle out of the main lobby, which Maria confirmed is the single communal space. Anything else inside the building would be trapped in rooms or corridors sealed by doors. The car park was a horror show. 
When you have to headshot everything to kill it, and you've mostly been using buckshot from close range, the area is like someone's gone mental in a slaughterhouse. Out came the gloves and face masks, and we all had to put our backs to moving a lot of ruined bodies so we could get the vehicles in for loading. Honestly, that job is way worse than actually putting down about 250 undead, which was the rough estimate. Breaking stuff is always an easier job than picking up the scattered pieces, but when those pieces are bloody chunks of former people, Nasty doesn't even begin to cover it. PTSD incoming for some people, I bet. There were numerous vomits by many people, including myself. Let's not forget how odious the undead are, Freya. These are corpses that mostly pissed and shit themselves upon dying, as bladders and bowels relax, and half of them had spent the summer months baking inside a building with other cadavers that were fully dead. All those head trauma corpses inside the infirmary had been rotting all this time. The smell and vileness of moving so many bodies was fucking gross. I thought that was bad enough. But once we moved inside the infirmary to clear it, Jesus, Mary and fucking Joseph. It was... Well, I'm not even sure... I can articulate the horror of that lobby's stench. Putrid, festering, and worst of all, old. Some people who didn't become undead after their demise had been rotting for half a year, and the battalion of undead had infused their miasma of death, decay, and outright taint into every square inch of that waiting room. The odour was so rank, it didn't just make your eyes water from the smell. It was a cloud of horror hanging in the air, assaulting the eyes like millions of tiny needles. The smell was so acrid, acidic and absolutely fucking rotten, it felt like it touched you. Icky. I'm overly dwelling on this point to try and give you some sense of how terrible it was in that infirmary. I mean... If that's what this minor injury clinic in a small town is like, can you imagine what a holocaust a major hospital must be? The emergency rooms on that first day must have been carnage on an epic scale. Nobody really had a clue what was happening. It was accelerating at ridiculous speed, everyone turning up with bites for treatment, mass triage, people dying from toxic bites in corridors, only to sit back up and start killing... Recently deceased people in wards reanimating and causing mayhem, and only God knows what other horrors. I am profoundly thankful it was Maria's day off on the 23rd of June. Doc Emma proved fortunate because of a dental checkup first thing in the morning, so was also off the rota that day. Survivors escaping medical centres must have been few and far between if this minor infirmary is a yardstick to measure it by. Scaling it up to a major hospital, even to a smaller one, is a terrifying notion. After taking care of the masses and piling the human wreckage in a gory mound, clearing the rest of the small building was next on our to-do list. We had to pull masks and cloths round our faces just to move through the reception waiting area. That smell is embedded into the walls for all time, I think. We'd need a tsunami of bleach to clean that area, and stomachs of iron. The inner corridors beyond the main entrance were less traumatic. Pockets of undead still needed handling, but were easily managed with care and vigilance. The younger kids and green shooters didn't get involved in that bit, only those with some training or experience in building clearance. Moving in two teams of three through separate double doors behind the waiting area, me, Nate and Mace went one way, while Dean, Maria and Eli went the other. Mace isn't fully trained per se, so was just back up to the familiar machine of me and Nate, but he proved to be a steady shooter outside, and we needed to split our four most experienced shooters with one clearance novice each. Plus, I think Nate sees something in him and wanted to run a little test. The clearance was largely without serious incident as we moved solidly through the corridors, except for one eerie experience that I feel requires noting for historical purposes. 
Vale Infirmary is mostly one floor. There's no top level, but it does have a basement area. We cleared the whole corridor before the steps to the basement, then had Mace stand by the stairs down so Nate and I could go back to the end of the corridor and work through each closed door one at a time and clear the rooms. Zombies, after all, are secure if they're in a room with a closed door. Right? Mace was facing back down the corridor towards us, just as I emerged from clearing a room with Nate a step behind me. A door to Mace's right fucking opened, a rotted hand clasping the door's edge and pulling it open just inches away from the former nomad. I screamed out a warning just as Mace caught the Zed in his peripheral vision and almost lost my shit as the thing lunged out of the room like a savage predator. Mace couldn't raise his pistol in time to fire, but his boxing reactions saved his bacon, just managing to get a meaty hand on the creature's throat and prevent it biting a chunk out of him. The momentum of its predatory lunge slammed Mace into the wall, though, knocking his balance to shit. Then both man and monster disappeared from view as they tumbled in a heap down the basement steps. I think I hit a decibel level of scream rarely achieved by humans. After all the recent injuries and deaths and Isaac's sacrifice still a raw and open wound, I couldn't face another loss so soon, especially in a situation we thought under control. Both Nate and I swept up the corridor as the blast of Mace's pistol cracked in the stairwell. As we reached the top, Mace was sat up on the small space halfway down the stairs, pushing the zombie off him and wincing. Are you okay? I panted, eyes on the gore covering him. Mace nodded, groaning, and put one hand to his side. I'm okay, he wheezed. Luckily, I think my bones broke my fall. A relieved laugh exploded out of me. Partly in relief he was okay, but mostly because I thought that was a fucking funny thing to say, given the situation. No bites, I urged, offering a hand to help him stand. Mace shook his head as he stood with a grunt. Nope. Kept my grip on its neck and when we landed, I managed to get my gun hand free and pop its noggin. I feel like I've been kicked by a racehorse, though. We escorted him back out and continued the clearance with just the two of us. Here's the weird thing, though, obviously apart from the door being opened. When Nate had a look at it, it wasn't even a proper door handle that could be pushed down by accident. It was a round doorknob that needed twisting. There's still the chance the thing reflexively gripped the knob and turned it. Yet when the door clicked, it clearly slid its fingers into the space between door and frame to actively pull it open. Even if twisting the doorknob was by accident, its natural brainless push forward should have pushed the door closed again. Those are two distinct and separate actions required to open a door. Both happening in sequence, by chance, are pretty fucking long odds. Zombies that can open doors. Well, that's a whole lot of fucking nope, thank you very much. It only happened that once. Dean's team reported nothing of the kind, despite finding other undead stragglers in the building and Nate and I didn't experience anything like it after that. But even just happening once by a freak chance is too worrying for me. These days, I'm suspicious of anything being attributed to mere chance where these rotting, murderous monsters are concerned. Knowing Captain Evil played them as pawns before makes me all kinds of paranoid. Strange things are afoot at the Circle K, Freya. Most heinous. Other than Mace having the shit knocked out of him and needing a change of underpants, nobody else was injured and the building successfully cleared. We've used a serious amount of ammunition for this operation, but it was worth it. The place was full of good shit. I don't know what any of it is, but Maria and Elijah were like pigs in a poo trench once the place was cleared. Dressings, IV bags, consumables, medicines galore... Syringes, sterile equipment, defibrillators, blood pressure and heart monitoring equipment. Just loads of stuff to set up a real clinic on campus. It took the second half of the day just to get it all packed up and loaded across the vehicles. 
Whatever equipment we could uninstall that wasn't too ridiculous, we loaded up on the truck. It was just going dark as we got back, and I'm absolutely bone-weary. Shower, write, and sleep is the order of this evening. Two of them are done, so it's just dreamland left to go. Tomorrow it's back to standard resource gathering, now the medical situation is vastly improved. There's a fuel run to a petrol station going on, and one team is finally clearing out that convenience store and the hair salon we intended to empty, the day Isaac was abducted. I think Ellie transforming us from a bunch of shaggy wookies into human-looking folk again might do everyone some good. I know I'll feel better once my manky hair has been trimmed much shorter. It'll certainly be easier to clean. It's way too long now, reaching three quarters down my back once I untie it. I've never had it this long, and sooner or later I'm going to get it trapped in something, or a zombie's going to get a fistful of it. What's that, Freya? Talking about my hair is not a historical event worth noting in this apocalypse chronicle. We'll have to agree to disagree on that one, my lovely. I feel like shit, and if a tiny thing like tidying me up can give me a lift, then I'm taking it. Anyway, I'm too bloody tired to argue with a phantom. I'm going to bed. Still love you, though. January 7th, 2011 Lockie calling Earth. Please open up and swallow me. Busy few days. A fuel run, getting our new clinic and hair salon set up, building works and all that fun stuff. Too much to write in here, and I've said repeatedly I'm not a day-by-day -day detail person. I'm recording interesting events, not things I now class as business as usual. What I will say, however, is that surviving in a world without modern convenience is a metric fuckton of work on a daily basis. Everyone is doing their part, though, even the kids. I am bone-fucking-weary every night now. We aren't night owls here, Freya. There's too much to be done while the sun is up in these short winter days. So, once it's been dark a couple of hours, and we've had some wind-down time, it's lights out. I can't stay awake. However, the byproduct of work and a much leaner diet means those of us working are starting to get pretty ripped. I've always stayed physically fit with fight training and parkour, but holy shit, I'm the leanest, meanest, most ass-kicking machine I've ever been in my life. I've got two tickets to the gun show, baby. So, what fabulous event have I chosen to record in tonight's thrilling instalment, you ask? I'm glad you brought that up. Today, I got my hair cut. Okay, so you're probably thinking that's a bit of an anticlimax, but I can't tell you how much it's improved my mood. It's gone from three quarters down my back to rest lightly on my shoulders, and Ellie has thinned and lightened it to the point it feels like air. Good sense would say I should probably get it even shorter in a pixie cut or something, just because having long hair is a pain in the arse. But it's not me. Maybe in the future. We took everything out of that salon, including a shitload of hair dyes. So now I have shoulder-length hair again and... Drum roll, please! My hair is fucking red. Not auburn or slight hint of red. I'm talking fire engine red. The colour of Liverpool Football Club kind of red. It's not just red. It's fucking red. I love it. So now I have flaming red shoulder-length hair twisted into a single tight braid for good sense. And I feel like a million dollars. Amazing what something so simple can do for you. It'll take Ellie a few days of work to get through everyone, but those she managed today already makes us look more civilised. Nate has gone short and close-cropped, as you'd expect, but I'm happy he decided to keep his cool salt and pepper beard. Ellie just trimmed and tied it that for him, and he's been turning the heads of some of the older women on site, let me tell you. Nate Carter, elder apocalypse bachelor, wouldn't you know? Work that booty, Nate.
I just weirded myself out with that last bit. That's like telling your dad to get his freak on. I feel unclean. So we'll move swiftly onwards. Elijah looks knockout now. He's also kept his dark beard, but trimmed and tidy, with a similar close crop to Nate. Must be a military thing. With all those shaggy locks gone now, though, those sparkling emerald eyes contrasted against his dark skin, and coupled with damn good bone structure, I went all stupid and teenage again when I first saw his new look. What do you think? he asked, posing with overly dramatic flair as he showed off his new image. To which I proceeded to make strange noises that were one part giggle and two parts gurgle. I ended that shit show with a shameful flourish, quivering out a lopsided grin that was accompanied by a double thumbs up. Jesus, what an absolute fucking moron. I couldn't even manage a polite, yeah, looks good man. It would have probably been less weird if I'd just wandered up and licked his face like some weirdo stalker. Even that couldn't match my brainless, awkward reaction as I suffered a complete collapse of social competence. I came, I saw, I made it awkward. Okay, maybe the face-licking thing would have been weirder, but you get the picture. I felt like an absolute fucking tool. Swiftly making the decision to disappear by claiming errands to run, the chuckling behind me as I fled indicated Elijah caught every last bit of my awkwardness. I'm glad he found it funny, though. That's more reassuring than awkward silence, or hearing footsteps disappearing in the opposite direction, scarpering as fast as roadrunner away from the crazy lady. Meep, meep. One thing I didn't consider when choosing my fiery new look was Nate. I rocked up at the house we share. He took one glance and gave an approving nod. Really taking this flame thing serious, eh? Nobody will miss you with her the colour of fire. Ah, oh, damn it, Nate. I just wanted to look awesome to cheer myself up. Now he's made out it was some conscious choice for me to stand out as the flaming torch. Bah. So yeah, that was my big news. Hopefully, I'll wake in the morning and the memory of my awkward meltdown in front of Eli will have been erased for both of us. Judging by how funny he found it, I'm not holding my breath. I expect piss-taking. January 11th, 2011. Two is two. Theodore did it again this afternoon. This time without any eerie sketch. Fully recovered from my mental and verbal collapse, I was sat on Eli's couch, sharing a hot and comforting beverage with him, taking a day off after the strain of the infirmary. Nobody went out today, and we've got a meeting later about our next task. Elijah's just so easy to be around, and I find myself gravitating towards him more as time goes by. I don't know why, but I just feel calmer when around him, and that's no easy feat. I'm a hyperactive pain in the butt most days. Theodore was scribbling away again at the table, as he always does. Suddenly, he stopped, turned fully in his chair, and locked eyes with me directly for the second time. Remember me saying he doesn't do that with anyone. It took Eli by surprise the first time, the night Nate had his dream with you, and everything changed. Everything is three, said Theodore in his odd, dispassionate voice. The dreaming. One is one. Now two is two. One of three and two of three. Shield and faith. His eyes looked right into my damned soul then, his voice almost a whisper, his gaze penetrating. Just the flame remains. Then just like that, all the intensity switches off and he turns back to his drawings. Cryptic and creepy as all hell. Even Elijah is weirded out by it. The change in his younger brother is so stark and intense, it really seems to have rattled him. 
My own sea of calm was once more tossed by the winds of chaos, and I excused myself, heading straight back here to tap on this keyboard and record it. Nate is the shield. One of three. I'm the flame. Three of three. Which means whoever is designated as this faith, the middle of our weird little trio of chosen, is getting a dream tonight for a proverbial sword tapping on both shoulders as they get anointed into their newfound role. I'm creeped out by Theodore's eerie statement, but now a little bit excited about what tomorrow might bring. More accurately, I'm excited about who might be revealed tomorrow. With a title like The Faith, I half expect it to be Dean, but the other half of me thinks that's a little too obvious. After all, if it was Dean, why wait this long to reveal him when he's been here all this time? Sigh. More waiting ahead. January 12th, 2011. The Faith. And so, the faith is revealed. You and I really need to have words, Freya. Now you appear to a complete stranger, and still I'm sat here waiting. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's do this right and recount the tale in its proper order. With the massive increase in headcount, and therefore food consumption, our resident science teacher came up with a bonanza idea last night while discussing plans for today. What about that supermarket distribution centre, just off the dual carriageway on the big roundabout running past the edge of town? Graham seemed excited by the thought, pushing up his perfectly positioned glasses again. It's absolutely huge, and I imagine, even if looting has started there, there's no way it would be empty with everything going on. It's a national distribution centre and the size of a small village. We all slapped our heads for not thinking of it before. Well, everyone except Nate. That place was running 24-7, he cautioned. I'm willing to make a wager that when things started getting out of hand, they did so quickly. Employees with the exact same thought as us. Look at all these supplies just sitting here, I'll take what I can. Then, security tries to stop them, people start fighting over certain goods, things get out of hand on a large scale. I'll leave the rest to your imagination. Sobering. As usual, Nate's right. That place is massive. Other workers off Rota could have feasibly headed to their workplace with the intent to stack up on supplies, given their knowledge of its contents and access to the building. They'd also be aware of just how quickly the world around them was devolving. With no police responding to ever-increasing food riots as things spiralled into violent panic, just one accidental death in there would be like a match to gunpowder. Well, shit. We'll roll light, said Nate then, surprising me. Given his cautionary tone, I thought a veto of the mission was incoming, Instead, he bought into the idea and was just exercising his usual pragmatic approach to the problem so people didn't get carried away. Light? I queried. Aye. Me, you and Elijah. We'll take the Humvee in case things get bad and we need to exfil a hostile situation. We'll do a recon on the area and the warehouse itself to get a lay of the land. Graham's idea is a good one, as there'll not only be a serious amount of readily available supplies there of all kinds, but likely freight trucks too for mass transport of goods. We'll scout it out, see what's what with the place, identify any vehicles Clyde could potentially get running, and then make a proper plan based on our findings. So that's what we did, heading out early this morning around 8.30am. Alicia is almost ready to come back out beyond the gate again, and she's absolutely bursting to do something. That time I hurt my back after the builder's yard, I felt stir-crazy all cooped up in the lodge, and Alicia has been stuck inside longer because of her more serious injury, so I think she's going a little do-lally now after nearly three weeks. Not just yet, though. As the three of us edged towards the area of the warehouse, 
my sense of expectation increased in equal measure. I was waiting for something to happen, someone to reveal themselves, just as Nate stopped the Humvee in the road. Hear that? We rolled down the windows, and sure as shit, we heard the echoing blast of gunfire coming from the direction of the warehouse, with shouts of alarm interspersed into the gaps. Someone needs help, I blurted, already making my move to exit the vehicle. Hold up, said Nate, his hand gripping my arm. Look. A single figure, wrapped heavy against the cold winter morning, scrambled into view from the direction of the warehouse. Turning, they peered down the bank into the massive warehouse yard, which was hidden from our vantage, then spun on their heel and started running. Right towards us. As they neared, it was a woman frantically waving her arms. Elijah popped out of the top of the Humvee, training his rifle downrange at her, while Nate slid out and did the same. On the far side of the Humvee, I muttered obscenities and slid out my door to move around the vehicle, just as Nate barked out a command. Halt! Identify yourself! The woman stopped dead, terrified by the hostile weapons pointing her way. She failed to say anything, shocked to fearful silence. I sidled next to Nate, now able to see just how frazzled the poor woman was. With her fair complexion reddened by the cold air and strands of blonde hair peeking out the bottom of her beanie, one of the woman's raised hands clutched a small thirty-eight. Before I could say anything, Nate's command sliced the air like a knife. Drop the weapon, on your knees, hands where I can see them. When Nate unloads his don't fuck with me voice, one does not fuck with him. The small revolver clattered to the road, hands shot towards the clouds, and the woman dropped to her knees before finally finding her voice. Don't shoot, please, I'm no threat, I'm just trying to get away from that. She gestured backwards with her head, not daring to test Nate by moving her hands even an inch. Who are you? Still that commanding growl. My name is Tori Cates, please, I need help. There was a wildness to her eyes, and such desperation in that plea that I was compelled to intervene before Elijah's gentle voice stopped me. Um, guys, you might want to take a look at this. We both glanced up to him, then followed the direction of his gaze. Despite his darker skin, he somehow managed to look pale. One of the undead awkwardly clambered up to the same spot Tori appeared, but there was something off about it. As it climbed to its feet, it raised one arm as it ambled towards us with a ferocious lack of speed. Nate lowered his eye to his scope, moving his gaze from Tory for the first time. What the? As his words trailed off, I lifted the small pair of binoculars I'd brought for our recon mission and stared at the singular zombie plodding towards us. Its clenched, upraised fist popped out three fingers, one by one. One, two, three. Then its fist clenched again and it repeated the count. Wash, rinse, repeat. Holy fucking batshit, Robin, I muttered without thinking. I'll be a monkey's bare arsed uncle. You know when those moments when you can feel people looking at you? I sensed it in the quiet following my outburst and lowered the binoculars a little to find both Eli and Nate staring at me with almost identical expressions of singular raised eyebrows. Even Tori's panic was arrested for a moment, reddened face peering my way. What? I demanded. I'm surprised, okay? At least I didn't ask you to butter my butt and call me a biscuit. Elijah snorted a, huh, at that one, while Nate just shook his head. Too many drugs or just not enough, he sighed, the twitch of a smile at one corner of his mouth. You're her, aren't you? said Tori, eyes dancing between me and Nate. And you're him. That stopped all of us dead. Say again, I asked. You're her, the flame, and you're her shield. Freya said I'd know you, a flame that burned bright and an old warrior that shielded her. You even have red hair. 
I'm starting to regret this fucking hair dye. Actually, no, fuck that. I look awesome. When Tori mentioned your name, Freya, all three of us knew she was legit. So, you are... I wanted her to finish the name of our little minity. The Faith, though I don't know why. Nate and I shared one look before he nodded and put his eye back down the scope. Wait, is that... He looked up again at Tori. Is that Jacob Tyler? Surprised, Tori nodded. How do you know him? I've watched your odd little community for a while, answered Nate. Threat assessment. Tori shook her head vehemently. No, I'm no threat, and nor are most of the people there. That's why I came to find you, and why Freya sent me to you. Most of the people there just need help. You don't know how bad things are. Did you shoot him in the neck? Asked Nate, his eye on the undead as it inched ever closer. Tori nodded. He discovered me making my escape. He was going to take me back, but not before he tried to... assault me. I'll let you fill in the gap before changing her choice of words. Surprised? No. Saddened yet again? Definitely. He didn't know about the revolver I stole in an ankle holster, continued Tori. I shot him and when he died, all the undead went insane. There's close to a thousand down there and about 30 live people from Ascension. They're lost, said Nate bluntly. If they make it out, good luck to them. Tori blanched as Nate squeezed the trigger and put Jacob Tyler's undead husk to final rest. Come on, I said, helping her to her feet. Let's take you home. I think we've got a lot to discuss. And we did. I'm tired now after listening to it all, and none of it was great. We were going to put Tori in one of the dorm buildings, but she virtually begged to stay with me and Nate, at least for this first night. We put her on the couch in the front room and she's out like a light as I write this. You know what makes me trust her more than anything? When she and Particles met, the little dude's tongue lolled out happily as he sought her affection. He likes her, and Particles is yet to judge anyone wrong. I think she's the real deal, and I like the fact that she's just asking, why me? Just as I am. It reassures me she's on the level and not getting carried away with all this mystical mojo. Anyway, sleep now. Long day. Lots to think about. And I'll loop back to Tori's horrific revelations in the morning when I've rested and I'm sat with a brew. It sickened me hearing those folks at Ascension have milk from dairy cows. I would bite a zombie for a good cup of tea with milk right now. January 13th, 2011. Expectation. I don't feel much better after a night's rest. Tori's tale was too disturbing to get off my mind, and my night was pretty restless. It's 7 a.m. and I'm already on my third black coffee. Today I will be a creature animated entirely by caffeine. Conversely, Tori said she had the best night's sleep in a long time. For the first time in months, she slept feeling safe. After hearing a tale, I can see why. Victoria Cates, or Tori, as we know her, was an investigative journalist before the world's end, going undercover trying to expose those who preyed on the innocent or naive, and The Children of the Resurrection was her latest project. With a degree in psychology employed to good effect when inserting herself into these dark and gloomy worlds, this woman is as tough and as daring as they come. I can't imagine what went through her head the day the world ended, when the cult she sought to expose was now her permanent refuge. She survived by being a popular member of society, a confidant to many, and a friend to all who weren't completely loopy for the shit this first disciple spoon-fed them. 
Most of Ascension's people are those who slipped through the cracks of normal society or paranoid about the state of the world, wanting to be prepared if everything went to shit. Many just want to be part of something and have a sense of community denied to them in their everyday lives. Jacob Tyler was one of the triumvirate we heard about, as we already knew from Nate's recon. Now we have names for the other two as well. One of them we only knew as Oliver, who we now know is Oliver Hargrave, the sole inheritor of close to half a billion in property wealth. Hargrave funded the whole construction of Ascension about three years ago, stacked their supplies, offered paid jobs to ex-veterans at odds with a world that chewed them up and spat them out, and brought in all the skills needed to make a fully functioning, post-apocalypse, self-sustaining settlement. According to Tory, Hargrave is a socially awkward and deeply closeted gay man, likely forced to conceal his sexuality because of the outdated, old money principles of upper society, though she admits that's mostly speculation on her part. Hargrave wanted to be a part of something greater than himself, and Tory's convinced he's infatuated with their revered leader in both a reverent and romantic fashion though his secret crush isn't reciprocated by their first disciple. Or, as the world used to know him, John Maddock. Tory spent months digging into Maddock's life before finally going undercover in the cult. Finding only a thoroughly unremarkable life, despite possessing intelligence and charisma, Tory suspects he latched on to Hargrave in order to fulfil his personal wishes for wealth and comfort, she expected the cult leader to disappear with Hargrave's fortune once he got bored of the charade, as nothing about Maddox's life was remarkable. The only remarkable aspect of his life was rising from a dingy one-bedroom flat on the outskirts of London, with a history of failed careers, to a cult leader with hundreds of followers in a short space of time. Cults feed on uncertainty, insecurity and social isolation, Tory explained. A charismatic individual creates their own version of reality, maintaining the illusion by keeping members separate from the outside world. Ascension was just such a place, with its high walls, armed guards for protection from the evil beyond their border, and everyone kept constantly busy so they don't think too long and hard about their situation. That leader ensures he's the only one with the keys to their promised kingdom, with a tight inner circle of trust to enforce his will. Demands start small, as Maddox did, like taking donations to help sustain his religion. But eventually those demands result in the poor, disaffected souls standing in an orderly queue to hand over all their possessions and, ultimately, their freedoms. It's hard to imagine so many people duped by such obvious tactics, observed Nate. Just like fascism, cults feed by harvesting the bitter crops of discontent, answered Tory with a spread of her hands. The world can be an unforgiving place, and it was far too easy to be alone in the world we left behind, even though everywhere you looked there were people all around. Humans are social animals by nature, Nate. We need to be connected, need to be a part of something. Look at all of you. Tory gestured to the assembled room. We'd brought everyone we could to the school assembly hall to hear her tale. I didn't want anyone to miss this, and only a handful of people were missing taking care of the younger children. They didn't need their dreams tormented by Tory's dark tales of ascension. You've all come together, binding yourselves into a community, because that's what people do. We're communal creatures, and when it's lacking, that sense of isolation can be soul-crushing. If you felt alone while standing in the middle of a crowd, invisible in the mass, and just a single hand reached out for yours, wouldn't you reach for it in turn? That's how many of the Ascension people felt, and Maddox sold them a dream, offering his hand into the dark of their isolation. That's the real crux of a cult's ethos. The carrot, I said. Tory nodded. 
The big payoff is always just over the horizon, always just around that last corner, and they, the chosen, will be the ones to benefit for their belief and commitment to whatever cause they've been sold. The clouds will part, the sun will shine, and the rapture will begin, I muttered, contempt hanging from every word. What cause did he sell? Tory blew a bitter snort of disgust. That's just it. Maddock was never specific. He just said the world was crumbling under its own weight, the pillars of society corrupted beyond repair, and eventually the world would fall. Of course, his children, the chosen ones, would resurrect humanity. Dean sighed. I think it's safe to say that anyone could predict such an ambiguous fall. Maddock was seen as a revered figure at first because he predicted the end before last year was out. Personally, I just think he was nearing the final stage of his plan and was readying his exit strategy. From what I gathered while there, he gave them until the end of the year before his prophecy came to fruition. To my mind, his intention with such specifics was just to renew their excitement, keeping everyone distracted with their preparations, while he worked on Hargrave to sign over his wealth in its entirety. Well, I bet the world actually ending really pissed on his chips, I purred, feeling just a little satisfied he never got to betray everyone and get away with it. His supervillain plan suddenly became the illegitimate love child of a dumpster fire and a train wreck. He'd have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for those pesky zombies. The Scooby reference got a laugh from the room. Tori gave a faint smile, but it's quizzical at the moment, as though she's still trying to figure me out. I guess that's the psychology degree playing out. Good luck with that, though, love. I haven't got a fucking clue what I'm doing from one minute to the next, so if you figure me out, let me know, yeah? Um, quite, said Tori with a nervous half-laugh. Succinctly put, but yes... He was forced to be a real leader. With his prophecy coming true, coupled with the fortuitous name he'd chosen in referencing a resurrection, the people elevated him to near messianic status, like he really had predicted the end of all things. Then, the day after the dead awakened, that reverence was sealed as he performed his dark miracle in front of everyone. Hands snapped to mouths with shocked whispering, as Tory described a man named George, dying of cancer, offer himself as a sacrifice. With his own hand, Maddock cut the man's throat, and when he reanimated, everyone witnessed the newly risen undead man obey Maddock's every command. The inner circle revealed itself as head of security Jacob Tyler and Oliver Hargrave as Maddock's right hand, were both given the same gift. Here's the kicker. Their twisted little trio have to sacrifice a living person with their own hand. Not a gun, but an actual throat cut with a blade. To retain their command of the dead in order to protect their little society. And each of them had to do this. Every week. Three people sacrificed to Captain Evil every week for almost seven months. At an approximate of 30 weeks for that time, that's 90 murdered people, just so that little inner circle could retain their power. That's about 30 more than our entire community. Their security people raided outside their walls, dragging people back alive as prisoners to keep in a basement dungeon called the Pit until needed. The strange event that Nate couldn't see when he was observing them. That was the seventh day sacrifice, because these nutters do it publicly. Captain Evil has been getting humans to sacrifice humans under the pretense of protecting them from the dead, preying on Maddox's thirst for power and control. In turn, he preyed on the fears of his people. Scared beyond measure, the people allowed this to continue, more fearful of protecting their own from the ravages of the dead than putting a stop to this primitive and savage practice. That was, of course, until survivors became scarce. 
Around a month ago, their pit finally ran dry, and three residents of Ascension were found guilty of crimes offered as sacrifice to the Lord of the Dead to keep their community safe and as an example to others. Now, however, they're the architects of their own downfall. Their illusory discontent is now very real once this twisted little trio started killing their own. The community at large don't consist of fighters and were mostly timid people in life, so they're now trapped by fear. Against the loyal believers of Maddock, the real lunatics reveling in their perceived chosen status of this new world, they're powerless. Tori resorted to seducing Tyler, making him fall head over heels for her to protect herself from the blade and to try and exert some influence to protect the innocence of Ascension. Shit, Freya, that's some real sacrifice, requiring a tremendous level of fortitude and strength on a scale I can't even comprehend. The haunted look of her eyes when she talked about how violating and unclean his touch was to her made me shiver, yet she endured it anyway. Give that woman all the Oscars, because I wouldn't be able to pull that performance off. Nuh-uh. Tori finally made plans to escape after Tyler mentioned another group of three that Maddock was on a collision course with, when the time is right. He calls us the evil ones, which is fucking rich considering they're the bastards cutting innocent throats. The night before making her escape in the convoy heading to the supermarket warehouse, up pops you, Freya. When she described you perfectly, the core of us who lived with you before you were taken sat there utterly gobsmacked. Maria, Nora, Mark, Alicia, and even little Charlie all shared amazed looks between them and towards me and Nate. Everything changed here with Tori's tale. All the doubters seemed to be swayed, and I found myself extremely uncomfortable under the keen regard of the fifty or so people in the hall. Practical Nate dropping the dream bomb a while ago got people asking questions and talking because he's not a whimsical chap. But this complete stranger turning up based on a dream from our dead friend, uncomfortable herself with the title of the faith, describing our deceased friend in perfect detail and witnessing the raw reactions of those who knew you. Well, Captain Evil's existence is getting harder to deny as hard as the celestial boner he seems to have for me. I hate this, Freya. I'm not comfortable with it. I don't want to be revered like Maddock does, and I certainly don't want to be treated like some bullshit icon for everyone to hang their hopes on. Hold the front line, Lucky. It's your job and you've been chosen. You've got to keep things going so this trinity can get on with fixing shit, Lucky. Hey, Lucky, these innocent people are trapped by a dark, mad bunch of cultists that command the dead. So what should we do? How can you save them? I have no fucking idea. None. Don't get me wrong. I want to help and feel I have to. But that's not because of some bullshit destiny ordained for me. I want to do it because it's right and the number of living people is dwindling day by day. But how to do it? I just don't know. And now I'm starting to feel a weight of expectation as people's opinions swing towards me as the keystone of this little trio. God, I fucking hate this shit. I'm not cut out to be a leader and I'm sure as shit not cut out to be a spiritual figure for anyone. I swear a lot, quote movies for laughs, and titter like a child at farts. Does that sound like the spiritual icon of a community to you? Didn't think so. I know we have to do something, though. Maddock was a fraud that's now just a vessel for Captain Evil's bullshit, and it sounds like Maddock was a colossal turd gulper before the world collapsed. He's a bad egg, but most of his people aren't. They're just a flock in need of a shepherd, but one that puts them safely behind fences at night and protects them from the wolves, not a shepherd that calls them friend and then slaughters them for meat. For now, we'll have to carry on as we are. We still have to look after our people, 
And from what Tori says, Maddock has a hard-on for the number three. She thinks the auspicious time for this final clash he intends to have with us evildoers will be March 3rd, the third day of the third month. If that's right, then we have some time to figure out how to deal with a community ten times our size with ten times the armed combatants. Raining fire down on them will just get lots of people killed. I don't want innocents caught in the crossfire, and I sure as hell don't want any more of my friends to die. I don't do personal grief well at all, as yours and Isaac's deaths have shown. It fucks my shit right up and adds another little crack to my heart. Too many cracks, and I think it might break. Lots to do, lots to think about, but mainly lots to do. I just want some sense of routine for a while, doing something productive for the community while we figure all this bullshit out. January 15th. 2011. Unity. The last couple of days have been spent settling Tory in and trying to bind the disparate factions together. There are three distinct groups that make up our community now. We've got our original group, made up from the combined forces of the lodge and school, when ours and Dean's two groups merged. We've been a solid community, and that original group includes the latest arrivals of the Beckett brothers and the Ritchie family. There are twenty of us. The Willow Park refugees are all closely knit, even more so since their terrible losses when the nomads assaulted the convoy. There are twenty-one of them. Now we have the nomad refugees, the fifteen we liberated, plus the two nomads of Mace and Dong that abandoned that former life. So that's seventeen. Three groups, similar in size, all of whom are closing ranks, I feel. Some of them are integrating well, like Doc Emma, because of her personal attachment to Maria. Mace and Dong are eager to help, so that's great. However, these barriers need to be broken down, and what's the best British way to do that? Stuff your face and get drunk. It was time to go back to the deer park, so Nate and I did that today. Just me and him. And it was great, because I learned about real marksmanship. Oh yes, Nate let me fire the PSG-1 and take down a deer. I learned about range finding, using the wind meter, adjusting the scope for these factors and all that good stuff. He called all that information the dope of the shot. I like that. I'm never going to have all the training he's had, and we don't have bundles of spare 762 for hours of shooting, but learning the theory will stand me in good stead for distance shooting in general, I think. All fascinating stuff. Dope interests me. When we came back with the deer, we took it to Nora, who's organised one of the smaller sheds in the maintenance area as a little butchery and smokehouse. At the moment, it's just for when we head over to the deer park to bag one, but it's also an exercise in optimism. There have to be some farms still operating in this area, with people living still. We can't be the only survivors, and we're actually planning on sending some teams out to try and find them. Simple scouting missions to try and locate farms still operating, and hopefully someone will locate one that still has cows, chickens or pigs, so we can open trade. I am craving meat, dairy and bread so fucking much. I would trade anything for a bacon and egg butty right now. I'm like some weird version of Pavlov's dog. Write the words, bacon and egg butty, and I immediately start salivating in response. We decided on announcing a winter feast tomorrow, and honestly, just the concept seemed to cheer people up considerably. We'll hold the big buffet event in the school hall, lay out some tables to put the food on, and Nora asked for some volunteers to help her in the kitchens. There was no shortage of hands in the air from all three groups, so Nora ensured she took aid from our people, Willow Park and the nomad refugees. I want to get away from having to refer to our people as these three distinct factions and try and bring everyone together properly. The notion of freshly cooked venison certainly cheered many glum faces, including my own. 
we haven't had it for some time, mainly because we haven't been able to make the time to bag one. It feels like we've been moving from one crisis to the next, and I think we all just need to kick back and take a breath. Making our new community a single entity is important, now more than ever with the looming threat of Maddox cult gearing up for what they feel is some kind of predestined showdown in around six weeks. We'll have to start planning for that, but not right now. For the moment, we need to concentrate on getting our own house in order. The good news is that Alicia is ready to be put back in rotation and Sarah's arm has healed a treat. Doc Emma reckons she's only a week or two away from full flexibility again. Having a couple of solid shooters back on the rotor will make me feel a lot better, though it still doesn't change the fact that we can't go in a full head-to-head -head with the resurrectionists. We're outnumbered and outgunned, so we need to find a different way. I've got an idea that I'll get Nate's thoughts on, and I hate myself a little for even thinking it, but I can't see any other way. For now, it's time to try and unify our community. If we don't get our own house in order first, we don't stand a chance against Maddox Fruit Loops. Still waiting for that dream, Freya? You've done the other two. Where's mine? January 17th, 2011 Winter Feast Yesterday went down an absolute storm, and today the positive effect on everyone is plain to see. New friendships formed across faction boundaries, all through the simple fact of coming together to share food and a few drinks. Our booze stash has taken a hit, as has the fresh food, but without doubt, the payoff was worth it. The fresh-cooked venison went down a treat, with everyone spending so much time surviving on dry goods, canned food and vegetables from Nora's ever-growing garden, the introduction of piping hot, fresh, juicy venison had the same effect on everyone as it did on me the first time I had a bite. It's been a long time since any of these people have felt bloated after gorging on food, and its effect on everyone's mental state was evident. No fancy dress this time, just a good old cookout and social mingling. Also, I didn't make any drunken bad decisions and sleep with anyone, actually holding back on the booze so I could keep my wits about me, because I was expecting a number of people to finally drum up the alcohol-assisted courage to ask me direct questions about being chosen. The fact that I'm obviously uncomfortable with it reassured those who did, I think. Tori and Nate too, for that matter. Our little trio of torchbearers are all unnerved by the whole thing, even baffled by whatever force decided to tap its celestial sword on our shoulders, and this fact has probably helped people accept the situation a little easier. If we were all standing with hands on hips and crowing about how we're here to lead them all through the darkness, we'd likely slam headlong into a massive wall of suspicion. That me, Nate and Tori are all shrugging our shoulders and looking distinctly discomforted by the questions gives us a bit of validity in everyone's eyes, I think. I hope. The six women held by the nomads have all gravitated towards Alicia, and I have to give her a shitload of credit. She approached them, shared her story, and immediately forged a bond with the women. Alicia seems to have taken Nate's story about Katie to heart and reached out to them as support, showing them there's another way and that they don't have to live in fear with us. Having those women all see that Alicia is now a stone-cold badass, fully firearms trained and part of our top-tier security force, has really lit a fire under them. A woman named Lucy, who the others seem to defer to, has already expressed interest in following in Alicia's footsteps, as have two of the others. I have to give a special mention to our single father poster boy, Mark. Naturally, he and Charlie, along with the riches, did great work integrating himself with the other new faces with children. Those with kids all gravitated towards each other, mainly because younger children have fewer reservations about socialising, so, naturally, the parents end up greeting each other and talking about their various stories prior to the end of the world. 
children are a great common ground for opening dialogue. By chance, a group were sitting at a table near the entrance door to the hall. I'd just nipped to the toilet and on my way back in, but stopped just before passing through the wedged open double doors. Why did I stop? Well, I heard my name mentioned, and when you suddenly have the opportunity to listen what's said about you, when no one in the conversation knows you're there, you can't help but be curious and listen in for as long as you can. Human nature, eh? Why are Erin and Nate doing all this? One woman asked. I didn't recognize her voice. Doing all what? asked Mark. Why, start all this. What's their agenda? Agenda, Leanne? What makes you think that? People don't do something for nothing in my experience, she answered, especially since the world changed. What do they want? Power? Control? Mark's voice hardened a fraction, but enough to let Leanne know he wasn't thrilled by her assumptions. That's where you're wrong, Leanne. Erin and Nate, just the two of them, took on a local criminal with a large group of armed men over the course of a month and whittled them down before finally hitting Bancroft's home to free us. You know why? For no other reason than we were held against our will. That's it. Those of us that make up their original group, the time before we found Dean and this place, are here now because of those two, and all of us have had a say in our futures. Everything is for the common good. Look around you, Leanne. You see the smiles. See the safety and security people have. The relief that your children are protected by walls and people who care about their well-being. That is the agenda. That's not my experience. People are generally selfish and rarely do something for nothing. Then you've been hanging out with the wrong people. He sighed, his chair creaking as he leaned back. I'll tell you a story to make my point. When Charlie's mum died, he was only a baby. It was rough and I was struggling. I'd just lost my wife after a short battle with an aggressive cancer and had no clue how to be a dad. I was all on my own, as Nia's family were all in Kenya, and I'm an only child. My dad died when I was in my twenties, and my mum was over in Manchester and getting on in years, as they had me pretty late. I went out for lunch one afternoon with some friends eager to get me out, but naturally Charlie had to come with me, as I didn't have anyone else. I had to change him, and in the men's room, there are never baby changing tables. So as a middle-aged woman was leaving the ladies' room, I asked her to check if it was empty. She did so, and gave me the okay. While sorting the bag, she offered to change him. I said, it's okay, I've got it. But she insisted, and without warning, just put her arm round me. I don't know how, but that woman saw me teetering on the edge of a breakdown that even I didn't know was coming, seeing right to the heart of it in one brief interaction. While in that bathroom, I cried hard and ugly for a solid minute while this complete stranger changed Charlie's nappy. When I returned to my friends five minutes later, with my clean and changed son, the weight I'd been carrying on my chest and shoulders was that little bit lighter. I never got her name, had no clue who she was, and never saw her again. For those five minutes, though, while she took care of my son and I vented the pressure of my grief and sense of being overwhelmed, it let me hit a reset button of sorts. I took a few steps back from the edge of that incoming breakdown, getting my focus back and clearing the fog from my brain. I listened in hiding, wrapped by Mark's tail, the people at his table equally invested and silent. Simple acts of kindness can have a profound effect on someone's life, more than you might ever realize. There are people in this world who do things not for praise or credit or profit, Leanne. There are people who do these things because the only reward is the act itself.
in the hope it makes someone else's day a little brighter. That, my new friends, is exactly who Erin Locke is. I had to clamp my hand over my mouth to prevent a sob escaping and give away my listening post, a struggle that only intensified as Charlie enthusiastically chimed in about his birthday party, waxing lyrical as Mark got emotional again, explaining again my reasoning was simply to let Charlie be a normal kid for just one day. Mark got emotional at the time back in October, but I didn't realise how much that birthday party meant to him until now. It had a far more profound and lasting effect on Mark than I'd given credit for. No act of kindness, however small it might be, is ever wasted. It's a gift anyone can afford to give. I had to depart my secret spot then, returning to the bathroom to scrub my face and have a little cry before going back into the main hall. Hearing Mark's high opinion overwhelmed me, and it took a little while to get my shit back together. When I returned to the room and gave a nod and smile to their table, every one of them waved and smiled back. I think Mark did more for bringing people into the fold with that one deeply personal story than I ever could. I should make him my new director of marketing. Inevitably, I ended up in conversation with Elijah on a number of occasions throughout the day. We find ourselves orbiting each other more frequently, and there's definite chemistry between the two of us, though both of us are being cautious. We get on really well, shooting the shit and laughing about silly things, and the thing I enjoy the most is there's never any awkward silences. That's not to say there aren't moments of quiet as we're sitting together, just that when we are quiet... It doesn't feel awkward. It feels comfortable, like we're both okay just being there. As you can imagine, Freya, silence is not something I'm overly familiar with. I'm generally a mouthy little sod, always cracking a joke, taking the piss, or saying something dumb. I've always found silences uncomfortable, and when they happen, I'm gripped by a compulsion to bullshit my way through them. I don't feel like that with Eli. That aura of calm surrounding him is like a warm blanket. It's comfortable, and I like that. Being a bundle of nervous energy, rarely do I take the time to simply relax, and yet in his presence, I feel like I can. I'd like to see where this goes, I think, but I can't right now, not until we've dealt with the impending threat of the resurrectionists. I can't be distracted, and I'm afraid I'd get too comfortable if things developed between me and Elijah. I can't afford any blunted edges. I decided on chatting to Maria about it. Her opinion is important, and she's spent lots of time with Elijah, what with them being our only medical people, until Doc Emma's arrival. Maria and Eli have formed a pretty solid friendship, and I know he thinks the world of her, as does everyone. I've never taken the time to get her opinion of him, though. So while we were all eating, drinking and being merry, I decided this was the opportune moment and asked Dean and Maria for their thoughts when I sat with them for a while. Finally, laughed Maria, Dean shaking his head and rattling a chuckle of his own. What? I asked with a shrug. Oh, Erin, that boy's absolutely smitten, she snorted. And it's obvious you are too. Don't think we all haven't noticed the way you two are around each other. Plus, whenever we're working together in the infirmary, all he does is talk about two people. His brother Theodore. And you. Well, what does he ask? What doesn't he? What you were like when you were younger. Stories since the world changed and we've been reunited. Things you like, things you don't like. Maria laughed again. Honestly, Erin, it's sweet. He's so eager to make a good impression on you. It's like he's building a file for him to study at night so he can hit all the right notes. Taken aback, I'm not too proud to admit this revelation is a little bit exciting. No man has ever gone to these lengths before and it made me feel pretty darn good. 
He would have been a hell of a catch even in the world we've left behind, Erin, said Maria. In this new world? Well, that boy is solid gold. Smart, funny, sweet, a big heart, and he's not too shabby in the old looks department either. Careful now, warned Dean playfully. I'm sat right here. Don't you go planning on trading me in for a younger model. Maria laughed and her hand dropped to Dean's on the table, one thumb affectionately rubbing the back of his hand without thought. Dean grinned and absently returned the gesture with his own thumb. That is the kind of thing I want. That unthinking affection and intimacy and the simple joy each other's presence brings. That one moment between Maria and Dean made me thankful I'd found them both and been able to reunite them. After more than two decades together, they were still so in love with each other. That's a powerful bond. I don't think I can right now, though, I admitted, stopping both dead as they turned questioning looks my way. Why ever not? asked Dean. There's too much to do. The threat of Maddock and that tiny group of nomad thugs are still out there. Their arse-faced little captain strikes me as the vengeful type, and I don't think we've seen the last of him. Until those threats are neutralized and we can think about moving forward, I can't afford to be distracted. If you hadn't already noticed, I'm currently in a committed relationship with guilt and bad decisions. Maria's hand switched from Dean's to mine. Erin, stop breaking yourself trying to hold everyone else together. Let the rest of us carry some weight. I shrugged. You can't, Maria. Not in everything. Not in this. There's something coming that I'm supposed to do, and I've no bloody clue what it is. I've been chosen for some weird reason I can't figure out, but that burden is mine and mine alone. Until I figure it out, I can't be distracted. You deserve love too, Erin said Dean softly. You deserve to be happy, just like everyone else. Right now, Dino, I don't have time for me. My life is the equivalent of trying to stand up in a hammock. It's a confusing clusterfuck. I can't figure it out, and I feel like I'm about to slam my face into the ground any second. Starting anything now wouldn't be fair on Elijah, because I wouldn't be all in. My mind's always somewhere else. Dean smiled, tinged with a hint of sadness. Sometimes I have to pinch myself. It's hard to believe that this woman sitting before me is the same mouthy little tearaway that caused me all kinds of headaches back in the day. Yet here you are, a selfless leader, putting everyone else above yourself. I snorted a laugh. I'm no leader, Dean. You two and Nate are the real leaders around here. Dean shook his head. Not so, Erin. Maybe for all the daily administrative headaches, but whenever something of note rises, everyone looks to you, even Nate. Eh, Nate? Dean nodded. Nate might be the one who makes your crazy plans work, Erin, but they're your plans, and he finds a way to make what you want a reality. He takes his lead from you, and the pair of you make such a great team. You're the heart that drives you on, wanting to do the right thing. And he's the sensible head who finds a way to make it work. I think I've written something similar to that somewhere in this journal. It was nice to hear Dean say it as well. It validates my opinion. And a leader isn't just someone who makes decisions about crop rotation or food distribution or fuel consumption. Leaders stand as examples to others. You don't stand by while others suffer, and you don't ask anyone to do anything you wouldn't do yourself, often taking the lion's share of the risk on yourself so others don't have to. Whatever self-deprecating opinion you might have, that is leadership, my young Joan of Arc. Deal with it, he added with a wink. All in all, yesterday was a resounding success, I feel. A lot of the barriers have broken down, and there's a definite sense of pulling closer together as a whole. 
The next few days we'll spend replenishing our stores, but today everyone is recovering from their gluttony, and some are nursing hangovers. The winter feast was definitely a good idea, so I'm giving myself a big pat on the head for that one. Alicia has been shown a great deal of trust by Nate in that she's being allowed to act as training officer for the three women who want firearms training. Shotguns are the way to go. We've plenty of both weapons and ammo after acquiring more from the Nomad clearout. Nate will ultimately clear them for active duty, but Alicia has formed a bond with them and trusted by Nate to be sensible. Delegation isn't easy for Nate with all of us non-military folk, and Alicia knows it, so she's taking it very seriously. We're going in a small team to hit some little convenience stores. Two vehicles, a pair in each. Me, Nate, Elijah and Mace. He's a pretty solid guy, and a good addition, always eager to contribute. Another two teams are heading out just in pairs, but purely for scouting purposes, trying to locate any signs of life on local working farms. We really need to up our game on food production, and having access to dairy and other varieties of meat would be awesome. Two pairs of people, formerly of Willow Park, will do that, as we need to start trusting others. We'll take big hitters for clearance, but we can use non-shooters for recon. OK, I'm going to use the opportunity to relax with my boy Particles and sketch out some plans for the Resurrectionists. We can't win this one by force of arms, and after Tory's revelations, I think a hearts and minds approach might be the way to go. A long chat with Tory over coffee is the next brick in that road, I think. I bid you adieu. January 20th, 2011 12 cats. Doing store clearance yesterday, I nearly killed Elijah. Not in a bad way, I'll just clarify. I hit his funny bone, hard, and he got the giggles so maniacally he could hardly breathe. While Mason and Nate were loading up supplies left in a small corner shop, Eli and I decided to check out the flats above them, just in case there was anything of interest, and found the weirdest thing. Prepared for the worst after popping a door open and being greeted by the hell stench of the undead, a late middle-aged woman shambled towards us as we waited outside her door. Wrapped in winter clothing, she must have survived until quite recently in her little flat. There were no visible wounds on her, so whether she died from the cold or other natural causes we couldn't say. Either way, she had moved on from this mortal coil, and we let her shuffle outside before putting a halligan spike through her brain. The flat inside stunk to high heaven, but it wasn't just from the rank odour of the dead and undead. This time, it was mixed with the stench of dirty cats. You see, this little lonely cat lady possessed twelve, yes, count them, twelve cats. Litter boxes unattended since her death, repeatedly pissed and shat in, only added to the uniquely vile aroma clinging to every particle of air in the little apartment. Opened tins of cat food littered the kitchen counter, and we all know how lovely cat food smells, right? The place was repulsive. Here's the really weird bit, though. All twelve of her cats were black. All of them. Not a range of colours and breeds, but twelve identical-looking cats. And Elijah commented on the strange scene as we entered and found these dozen cats in various states around the living room. Cat Lady must have died only recently, as none of them looked particularly malnourished, but all were matted and filthy. Who the fuck has this many identical cats? said Elijah, one arm across his mouth and nose to shield against the thick stench. How many are there? Well, I mused aloud, there are either twelve different cats, or she's got one that moves really fast. Elijah lost it. It was a throwaway comment, but for some reason it really hit him in the funnies. I've never seen him full-on belly laugh like that, struggling for breath, and there's nothing purer than someone unable to control their laughter. 
He had to leave the flat because sucking on air polluted by zombie stench and cat anus wasn't good for his health. I didn't even find my own joke that funny, but you know how it is. When someone starts laughing that hard and uncontrollable, it becomes contagious. I started laughing as well, and we headed downstairs to the vehicles so Elijah could catch his breath. When Nate and Mace asked what was so funny, neither of us could tell them. Eli kept breaking out in new fits as he tried to explain, and his choking snorts and wheezes for breath set me off, so I couldn't tell the joke either. Both of us were pissing our sides, trying to gather ourselves, and failing in spectacular fashion, the pair of us laughing like teenagers with the weed giggles. With us two now in stupid fits, Nate and Mace just laughed at the pair of us trying to get our shit together. It's that gallows humour thing again. Here was a sad and tragic tale of a lonely woman with only her cats for company for the last half a year, finally dying miserable and alone, her brained corpse rapidly rotting upstairs. But one simple throwaway comment, and now four of us were laughing like we'd all taken a hit on a bong. I have to say, though, it improved all our moods for the rest of the day. Even last night, all I had to do was lock eyes with Elijah as I passed him, and boom, it set us both off again. You take your laughs where you can, no matter how ridiculous and no matter how dark things might appear. If you don't, all you'll fucking do is cry. Laughter is the windscreen wiper of life. It doesn't stop the rain from falling, but at least it lets you keep moving forward. No regrets. January 21st, 2011. Three of three. I'm nervous, Freya. Nervous and excited. Theodore finally did it. I was hanging with Elijah earlier. I know it's getting obvious now, hey? And Theodore turned ominously in his chair, drawings forgotten, looked me in the eye and said what I'd been both waiting and dreading to hear. Three of three, he said out of the blue. First shield, then faith, now flame. Tonight, the third dreaming. Tonight, three is three, and all revealed. Then, without further ceremony, turned back around and started scribbling again. That was it. Done. Message delivered. I'm excited to see you again, Freya. You've appeared to both Nate and Tori, and finally it's my chance to see you again. To tell you I'm sorry, to... I don't know. Close the book on that September day last year. But I'm also shitting myself. All is revealed. I mean, that's not ominous at all, is it? I'm buzzing with anticipation. Shit, I'm not even sure I can get to sleep, but I'll have to try. See you on the other side. Um, literally, I think. January 22nd, 2011. Epiphany. I finally had my mystical dream last night, and it breaks my heart a little that it wasn't you, Freya. Nate got to speak to you, as did Tori, a complete stranger. But me? Who writes this whole journal in your name? Nope. Nada. That stings a bit. It was a strange sensation, waking up within the dream, yet fully aware my body was sleeping. Back in the lodge, I sat at the kitchen island as I was in those early days with the sun shining and the big glass doors open to let the morning air in. Those moments were when I was most at peace, when you and Nate were still sleeping, and it was just me, writing in this journal with the world still and quiet, before we started our war with Bancroft. Sitting opposite me was Isaac. The sight of him knocked the wind out of me, my first instinct to babble tearful apologies, but he just raised one hand and shook his head. No, Lucky, he said. There was nothing you could do. 
I knew they were going to kill me anyway because I'd heard them discussing it. I was there just as bait to taunt you. The moment you retreated, they were going to put a bullet in me anyway. You wouldn't leave without me, and I love you for that. But it was either I died or we both did. It wasn't even a choice. There's too much at stake. His words took away some of the guilt's heavy weight, allowing me to breathe again. Why are you here? I asked. Why not Freya? Like with Nate and Tori? Isaac smiled like he knew something but couldn't tell me. You'll see her again when the time's right. For the moment, you need to be ready. Ready for what? When Tori killed Jacob, it changed things. Like a stone thrown into still waters. One of our trio killed one of theirs, and the power of such momentous acts are magnified on this other side. Ripples over here force the dark to react. Tori struck the first blow of real power. As a name, the dark gives me chills. I much prefer Captain Evil, as it sounds less ominous and menacing. Captain Evil I can deal with, but the dark sounds fucking dreadful. React how? Maddox lost one of his three, and whatever rules are in play in this celestial chess game means he can't be replaced. Now they only have two left commanding the dead. Well, this is good news. Knowing they can't just replace their third member with sacrifices and pass Jacob's dormant power on to someone else is the first fucking win we've had in an age. It means one less person gets sacrificed every week, but also means the grim plan I was hatching might have some real value, no matter how unclean it makes me feel. So, what does that mean for us? I asked. It means... Maddox willing to risk going against his auspicious date with no other available options. I felt cold to the core of my bones with that statement. Does he know where we are? I asked, a knot of fear tightening in my gut. Isaac nodded. Being the flame means you burn bright and hot on this side of the divide, he said. You're like a beacon for the souls that died around here, as we all wait for the Trinity to end this. Until they do, you're the only nearby light in the dim fog of our endless purgatory, Erin, and souls flock to you for warmth and light. Well, doesn't that sound lovely? It gives me a little fuzzy feeling inside. But that means the dark can see you too. You can't hide from it, so you have to face it. If our trinity should ever pass this way during their own crucible, the dark won't abide the thought of any potential sanctuary or safe zone where they might find shelter. So you have to be dealt with. Ah, oh, shit. There's always a bloody catch. It's used others, though, I said. The undead behavior changing after Freya's death and the dreams to the nomads. All just lesser options, Erin. Nudges and manipulations, rooks and knights and inferior pieces in the game. Maddock is its king this round. Other gambits have failed, so now it brings its most lethal weapon to bear. And you have to be ready. We can't face a firefight of that magnitude, I whispered in a shaking breath. Isaac just shook his head. It won't be a battery of guns you'll face, Erin. Of all the living warriors both sides have in play, none of them can match Nate in cunning or downright skill. That brought a smile to my face. But the dark has its own weapons, remember? I didn't register the implication immediately, but when I did, my chest felt like it was struck by a sledgehammer. The dead. The dead, he agreed gravely. How long do I have? Isaac shrugged and breathed a regretful sigh. That much, I don't know. Days, maybe? Not long. Tory's escape and Jacob's death accelerated things. Maddock now knows Tory is one of our torchbearers, and he's raging at having one so close for so long. Narcissists don't react well to realizing they've been duped all this time. So this is it. 
This is my role, just to defend our home. Isaac shook his head, his eyes never leaving mine. This is what Nate does, Erin, and what he does better than anyone. No, you and Tori have to find an end. The shield protects, but faith and flame must find a way to end it on the right side of humanity. You're not being very helpful, Isaac, I huffed. All this cryptic bullshit is really starting to make my teeth itch. He laughed then, and the sunshine outside suddenly appeared brighter, the birds song clear and melodious, the scent of summer flowers filled the kitchen. I'm sorry, but I'm only permitted to give you so much. There are rules. You're the ones being tested after all. It's hardly a test if I pass you the sheet with all the answers circled. Our team hasn't really done much for us, though, I grumbled, just leaving us to largely fend for ourselves. Isaac rubbed at his jaw and raised an eyebrow. Really? he said with a knowing grin. No help at all? Nate found you. The two of you found Freya. Then you found us with Maria in our number, in the hands of a man in possession of weapons able to help you fight the dead and liberate others. Then you find Dean, just when he needs you the most. Someone else important in your life. With him is a highly intelligent physics and chemistry teacher, qualified to the eyeballs. He chuckled and shook his head. In our first group, you find an engineer who can do most things, a medical professional and a wise old woman in Nora that has all the necessary skills to survive in a simpler world. You find the Becketts, one a combat medic, the other a conduit for the other side, as well as the Riches, who include an expert mechanic and welder. The Willow Park people have an experienced builder and his electrician's son. When you get to know some of the others, you'll find there are those with carpentry and engineering skills. When you go against the nomads, you find two allies within it that have firearms and combat experience, plus a fully qualified consultant and trauma surgeon. And now, here I am, warning you of impending attack, giving you the time to prepare. He gave me a pointed stare, inviting my response with one final question. Are you sure our team hasn't been batting for you all along? Freya, my head nearly exploded. All the evidence was right there. I've been pissing and whining about how our team isn't anywhere near as involved as Captain Evil, while at the same time saying how lucky we were to have found such good people with a diverse array of skills needed for us to thrive. Holy fucking shit. The test is ours. We're the ones tasked with holding the line so humanity might have a second chance. And to hold said line, our team has crossed paths with all kinds of people we need to do that. Yes, there's been conflict and tragedy, but ultimately, the people we need to succeed are the ones with us today. I feel like an idiot. We've been given the tools to do the job, but it's up to us to deploy those tools into building something better, to make something better. A second chance. Bloody hell. I woke up just as that realisation smacked me in my dream face. As the penny dropped, my eyes flicked open as I bolted upright in epiphany. Now I've recorded this, I need to gather everyone and we need to ready ourselves. If Isaac is right, we need to be prepared. Our worst nightmare is about to come true. The dead are coming. In force. January 24th, 2011. Fortification. Last couple of days we've been working round the clock. Funnily enough, it didn't take much persuading to get everyone on board. All I had to do was dangle the threat of an undead horde coming to the gate, and everyone moved like their arse was burning. A few questioned running around like panicked dickheads based on me having a dream of a dead friend, but those questions were like piss in the wind once Nate kicked everything into motion. He didn't even flinch at my revelation, he just went into protector mode, and everyone snapped to obey that drill sergeant voice of his. Nate, of course, already had a defense plan. 
God, I love that guy. He's so fucking prepared, it's ridiculous. He's been assessing weaknesses, tactical choke points and Lord knows what else since his first day here, and he got right to it. First priority is the non-combatants, the men, women and, most importantly, the children, who will only get involved if things go to shit. This isn't a time to be putting firearms in the hands of people without even rudimentary safety training. That's liable to get someone killed by accident, and in truth, if it comes down to needing those people in the mayhem, then we're probably already fucked. As soon as the horde is sighted, every non-combatant will transfer to the upper floor of either Hall Fire or Hall Earth, pushing themselves to the rear. We don't want everyone all in one place, unless things go wrong and we retreat to the gymnasium as a fallback position, and we need to spread the shooters out across the two dorm buildings that face the open space between the gate and the main yard. Anyone who can shoot will have to be spread at tactical points in those two buildings, allowing an L-shaped angle of fire. One thing we know is they'll have to come through the front gate, because the thick bramble hedgerows with the high, solid metal fence behind it is difficult for anyone to traverse. It'll be much easier for them to come down the lane, plough through the gates to breach it, and then just let the dead run amok. We never got a chance to do Mark's fancy plan for a gate defence, but we did get a couple of police stingers. After the nomads used them to cripple the vehicles in Isaac's abduction, we swept them up. If we put them outside the gate, they'll get seen and moved. However, if we put them a few feet back from the gate on the inside and the fuckers choose to plough through with a vehicle, it should disable all its tyres. I should probably mention here why we're expecting a vehicle. That was Tory's insight. To march a horde that far and keep them together, it's going to need Maddock or Hargrave to shepherd them here. The dead only follow simple vocal instructions, so one of them have to play Pied Piper to get a horde here, drawing scattered groups in as they go. Honestly, I think they're likely to pick up that horde outside the supermarket warehouse, rather than waste time picking up stragglers. There's a ready-made army just waiting there. Likely it will be Oliver, as Maddock is all about self-preservation. Oliver Hargrave worships him and would do anything for him, and Maddock will exploit that to keep himself safe. Nate's eyes lit up at that news. Then he'll come in one of their up-armoured Humvees with a protection detail. If I can take him out, then Maddock will be alone. I nodded my agreement. Remember me saying how I had a plan I wasn't comfortable with, but might be necessary? It was along those lines, charging Nate with returning to his sniper hide, this time with a weapon comfortable with the range, and sanction the assassination of Oliver Hargrave in cold blood, for no other reason than it made tactical sense. Honestly, Captain Evil sending the dead our way via Maddock is a relief in one sense. Using Hargrave as his proxy, it frees me of that burden. Now it's not premeditated murder, but defence of our realm. Can we take him out on the way? I asked. Nate shook his head. Too many variables. We don't know his timing or definitive routes, and he'll be encased in an armoured vehicle with potential decoys. There's a chance we could miss him, or the fire team outside the wire gets trapped out there as the assault starts. No, here we can prepare and have some element of control with the advantage of ground and cover. They could be on the way right now for all we know, and we've only got a limited number of experienced shooters to help guide the novices. He gave a rueful half-smile. Some of those novices are gonna get a serious baptism of fire. Nate locked eyes with me, his deep voice ending that discussion any further. Control the variables we can, Erin. It's easier to defend a fortified position with the gate as a primary choke point. If we were fighting the living, this place would be a nightmare to defend against experienced and mobile fire teams. But with the limits of the undead, we have some elements under our control. He's so smart. Dean was in complete agreement. 
If our two people trained in tactical thinking with their vast number of years of experience say it's the best option, then it's safe to say the rest of us should shut up and listen. This also means the stinger is a super good idea. Without question, they'll have to breach the gate to let the undead in. It's a weak point a charging Humvee or box truck could easily bust through, as it's just a fancy wrought iron gate more for aesthetics. This is a rural private school, after all, and not a bastion of defence. Every time I hear the word bastion, I get a little shiver. It just happened again. We've got some surprises if they come barreling through that gate in vehicular assault. Reinforcing it with bits of metal found around the place, Clyde has turned his welding skills to the gates and made them opaque and can't be seen through, as any planned surprises would be easily spotted through the bars. Now concealed, we'll place stingers about 10 or 15 feet back for if and when a vehicle does plough through. But even then, Nate has no intention of making it an easy ride. The admissions building looks straight down the long lane. The old original Victorian structure has a lovely little spot for a sniper to look right down that road from an upstairs window. So Nate's made himself a nice little perch to fire from. Anyone edging too close to the gate for any kind of inspection will be gargling with a 762 round. When I asked why we didn't just barricade the gate with the loader truck or other vehicles, Nate shrugged that they could move it eventually. Plus, we don't want to get boxed in as it's the only way in and out for vehicles. Better to let them in so we can kill the undead horde on ground favourable for us. We can't bring all the guns we have to bear on them in that approaching lane unless we send people outside the wall. The trees and hedgerows are a great defence, but they also narrow our own outward field of fire. Barricaded in the two dorm buildings with the exits reinforced, we can fire from our fortified positions down on their heads from multiple angles and clear the bastards as soon as we can. Maximum effect in a target-rich environment. If we don't let them into the open spaces of the school for us to fire on, trapped outside the dead might be, but the living will be sealed within. Sooner or later we'll have to deal with that horde, so better to let them come in when we're in fortified positions than having to risk letting them in at a later date when everybody's nerves are frayed to hell. Nobody likes a protracted siege. Plus, Nate's primary target is Hargrave. If he can locate Maddox number one fan and take him down, then Maddox is all alone back at Resurrection HQ. If he wants the dead moved away from his gate then, he'll have to do it himself. While Dean and Nate organised defences, it was time for that chat with Tori. The two of us had a sit-down to discuss, as Isaac put it, ending this on the right side of humanity. I asked Tori what she thought that meant. Honestly, she gave a little shrug. I'm not sure. I'll tell you what I do know, however. There's plenty of ill feeling towards Maddox since he started finding excuses to murder his own people. He's gone from revered messiah to a tyrant despot in their eyes because of it. They live in fear, and his blindly loyal base will have taken a beating after the losses at the warehouse. How so? The distribution centre was a key operation, explained Tory. Jacob took the bulk of his most loyal fighters bound to him, men and women he trusted implicitly that knew by staying loyal to him, they and those close to them would be exempt from the lottery of the sacrifice. I can't see many of them making it out of there. Oliver will be given an escort of more loyalists to gather the horde of that, I'm sure, which will leave Maddock painfully exposed. I toyed with my crimson braid as I mused aloud. So, you think we might be able to sway his people? Tori spread her hands. Honestly, who can say for sure? His power was built on the adoration and reverence those people had for him, and that adulation has taken a severe beating. They considered him untouchable, an icon. He protected their community from the walking dead, and fear is a powerful motivator. Jacob's death and the loss of so many of their security force in that failed operation 
coupled with the murder of his own people, has affected them, I'm certain. Can't we just have Nate gun him down when he next opens the gate? Tori shook her head. We could, Erin, but don't you think that will just make them fearful of us? They know me. I've spent months with these people, building relationships and earning their trust. But I don't even think me standing beside you will help all that much if our first act of trying to persuade them is to go all gung-ho and gun down Maddock from afar. We might make him a martyr, underpinning his spouted rhetoric that we are the evil ones. If the warehouse was anything to go by, the moment Maddox's life is snuffed out, all the undead at the gate will revert back to their original nature, so we'll be putting them at risk of the thing they fear the most. I doubt that will go well for us in trying to persuade them we're friends, as they're not party to the information from this other side that we are. Plus, if we start a firefight, innocents will inevitably get caught in the crossfire, even children. They might think they're just trading one despot for another. Do you want to win them over willingly, or win them by fear? Well, he's hardly going to agree to a public debate, is he? I huffed and slumped in my chair a little. How the hell am I supposed to reach these people, how am I supposed to be this damn flame everyone's expecting me to be? Without exception, everyone fails at who they think they're supposed to be, Erin, said Tori softly. Just be who you are, and that will give you the best chance of success. I've seen the faith Nate and Dean have in you, and so many of the others. A faint smile of remembrance touched her lips. Freya has faith in you, Erin, with a certainty I could feel in that dream. Not in who you think you're meant to be, but who you are. Trust your instincts. I chuckled and shook my head. You sound like Dean banging on about faith. I don't know what I'm doing, Tori. I tend to put my faith in others, competent and experienced people, like Dee, Nate and Maria. You seem to have your head screwed on right. Having faith in myself when I haven't got a fucking clue what I'm doing with this responsibility is pretty damn hard. Then she really did sound like Dean. Faith only makes things possible, Erin, she said with a shrug. I didn't say it makes them easy. I made us both a brew and sat back down at the small table, having spent a few minutes rolling things around the empty cavern of my head. These people don't know me, Tori, but they know you. Shouldn't you be the one to address them? My faith is in you, Erin, she grinned, almost mischievously. That's my role, apparently. I'll stand beside you so they can see me, but I persuade with logic and reason. I use facts and data. That's just my way. I might understand the psychology and use that to my advantage. But these are disaffected people, Erin. They slipped into society's cracks before the world ended and just wanted to be part of something. They've been isolated and found a common bond with each other and no reasoned argument will sway them. They need to feel something change. Tori's mischievous smile remained in place. After that one lucid dream conversation with Freya, she's clearly convinced that high emotion is something of a specialty of yours. I barked a laugh. The cheeky cow! In all seriousness, Erin, the relationships I've built with those people have been through hard work and patience, but they need rapport and connection, a spark of hope. A flame, you might say. And they need to see another way, feel it in their bones. And I can't reach that place in an instant. You've been chosen because whatever ordained this terrible curse on the world, judging us for all our sins, thinks that you can. I'll stand by your side throughout, and I'll support you all the way. 
but you're the one that has to connect and show them another way. You and Nate built all this, she said, gesturing vaguely towards the activity outside the house. Others helped, but it exists because the two of you started it all. Nate does what he does best, and I'm here, I think, to save all those innocents and previously forgotten people from being caught in the crossfire of a bitter war, because I have faith they can be turned to a better path if we show them some empathy and compassion. She took my hand then. But you, Erin, have the power to unite both our communities and show them there's an alternative to the death and terror and violence. I just have to figure it out, huh? Tori smiled and gave a little shrug. I guess you'll just need to have faith. I like Tori. She's a smart cookie and knows how people think. I can tell she's still a bit uncomfortable with the role she's been assigned. But then, aren't we all? Actually, that's not true. Nate is completely in his comfort zone. Despite her misgivings, though, you clearly had an effect on her, Freya. I think Tori sees what we've built here and continue to build, and that drives a desire for change for those she left behind in Ascension. Those relationships started with clever manipulation to improve her cover while she investigated Maddock, but when the world fell apart, she began seeing those people for who they really are. She has faith they can be shown a different path, and now has faith in me to lead them there. They just want to be part of something, always denied that sense of belonging by a society that shunned them, and Maddock exploited them as pawns in his own dark game. In turn, he's just a puppet too, that Captain Evil's using to royally butt-fuck humanity with a sandpaper-wrapped cactus. By the way, that doesn't excuse Maddock in any way, at all. He fucking chose to murder people for his own ends, and that choice damns him in my eyes. He could have opted for a different path and elected not to. Find another way? Hmm. I just want to kick him in the dick until he dies in tears for all he's done. But, apparently, I have to be better than that. Our team can be such a fun sponge at times. This isn't easy. At all. I think it was Mark Twain who said something like, it's easier to fool people than it is to convince them they've been fooled. Spot on there, Mr. Twain. Haven't a frigging Scooby-Doo how I'm supposed to pull this one off. I'll think on it, but for now, I better get my head in the game. The dead could literally arrive at any moment. January 25th. 2011. The ram has touched the gate. They're here. In less than a couple of hours, the enemy will be at our gate. We placed a watch on the roads, and they've just sent a message over the radio that they're heading home. Our sentry, Pete, says the road is filled shoulder to shoulder with the dead, all following behind a crawling Humvee. He saw another couple of vehicles further down the chain. About a thousand, Pete estimates. Maybe more. More than a thousand. What the fuck? We're going to burn through most of our remaining ammunition if that's the case. Fucking hell. I hope I get to write again, Freya. I hope I can sit here and say, all went well and nobody on our side died but I just don't think I'm that lucky. Freya, I'm scared for our friends. Not for me, never for me, but for these people I've come to care about. They're my people, my friends, my family. It's time to go. I'm needed. The ram has touched the gate. February 1st, 2011. Acts of Valor.
It's been a long time since I wrote. This is the first time I've had the time, energy and the will to write in a week of hell. I'm just empty, exhausted, hollowed out by grief. Again. People died, though I'm amazed we lost so few. Nate deserves pretty much all the credit, and I'll get to that. But holy shit, Freya, he still finds ways to leave me dumb with awe. No matter what plans we make, Nate forever chants the old military maxim that no plan survives first contact with the enemy. You can plan as much as you want for any contingency you can think of, but ultimately, the universe will find new and exciting ways to fuck with you. Adapt, evolve, overcome. I'm getting ahead of myself. Everything's a bit of a blur, so I'll try and recount the horror of the past week as best I can. I don't want to relive it all, but this is my purpose. My burden. A few of us clustered around one of the laptops wired to the security system Isaac relocated from the lodge, eyes fixed to the camera feed pointing down the road. The camera was at the end of the lane that leads to the gate, and the first thing we saw appear was a Humvee. It crawled around a gentle bend, and then the undead came into sight. Densely packed, they filled the entire width of the road. As the vehicle drew nearer to the camera and more of them shuffled into sight, there were muted curses from those of us watching the screen. It's one thing for someone to say they estimate a thousand, but it's an entirely different experience to see the horde appear. They just kept coming. And coming. And coming. Places, was all Nate said, sensing the fear in the room, his calm authority dragging everyone from the screen. Nothing has changed. We knew a horde was coming, and the plan remains the same. I'm getting to my perch. The rest of you, take up position. I sat with Nate in his sniping room on the upper floor of the admissions building, watching the Humvee crawl down the approach road, letting the lane fill with the packed undead. Shit, there were just so many. What's he doing? I asked Nate as the vehicle halted halfway down. Preparing a run at the gate, he murmured in response, his eye lowering to the scope of the rifle resting on a table. His prophecy came true as the Humvee suddenly accelerated into life, thundering towards the gate at speed. The flimsy metal barricade didn't stand a chance, torn from the hinges as the up-armoured Humvee smashed straight through them at about fifty, bursting into the school grounds to run right over the police stingers. They didn't even slow it. Military tyres, I guess. Some fancy pants ability to run flat or something. After all, what use is a military transport if it's easily fucked by a flat in a hot zone? Here's where we did get lucky, however. The vehicle should have had an armoured windscreen, but its original one must have been damaged while in service and, before being sold at a surplus auction, replaced with a regular one when getting ready for resale. The cheap and cheerful option was a horrifying surprise for the vehicle's driver when Nate's rifle boomed in the little room. His first round penetrated the windscreen and punctured the driver's chest. A second round followed swiftly and punched the passenger's ticket. The vehicle continued forward for some time before finally coming to rest about 20 metres from our perch. Anyone trying to get in the front would be a sitting duck. That'll ruin the day of anyone in the back when those guys reanimate, I shouted. Despite protecting my ears from the two shots, they still rang from the rifle's thundering echo in that tiny room. We'll see. As usual, Nate was proved correct when the two dead men reanimated, started to turn back to those in the vehicle, then simply turned and faced forward again, sitting silently. Nate smirked in satisfaction. Got you, he whispered triumphantly. 
Hargrave's in that vehicle. He was right. The undead had followed their Pied Piper all the way here. It stands to reason he would be in what they thought was their safest vehicle, but that standard windscreen ruined their party. Now they were trapped and unable to move, knowing a sniper had them in their sights if they attempted to bail. I had a brainwave and told Nate to be ready for my call, setting off at a sprint through the school's corridors and out into the open space beneath Dean's position in Hall Fire's upper window. I called out what I needed and he threw it down without hesitation after locating it. Complete faith, no questions asked. I love my people. One eye on the approaching horde down the lane, I gave Nate the call on the radio to suppress with his L85 through that shitty windscreen and keep everyone's head down. Again, without question, bursts of automatic fire rained down on the stationary Humvee, shattering the windscreen into pieces, and as I neared the vehicle, Nate ceased fire. Pulling the pin, I hurled one of Dean's few remaining flashbangs in through that open space, and right before I dived aside with fingers in ears, I heard the panicked cry of, Grenade! inside. I would hate to have been in that tiny space when that blast went off. The interior of the vehicle lit up like a crack of lightning had erupted inside, and seconds later, a couple of men fell out of the Humvee on each side from the rear doors, coughing and choking through the plumes of smoke billowing out from the vehicle. Even as the dense smoke dispersed in the winter breeze, Nate didn't hesitate, switching back to Semi and hitting both dazed men in the head with a round from his perch. Glock up, I moved to the back seat and found Oliver Hargrave with his hands clasped to bleeding ears, spluttering and disoriented, blinking rapidly as if the futile action would clear his sight. He was younger than I imagined, maybe about my age, and didn't hear my demands to get out of the vehicle. He was unarmed, so I just leaned in, grabbed him by the top of the military vest he'd been garbed in, and yanked him out into the open. Erin, you need to move. Nate said through the radio. The dead are starting to come through the gate. I glanced up as a man handled the dazed Hargrave away from the Humvee. The long column of the dead started separating out once there was available space, like liquid leaking from the neck of an upturned bottle into a basin. Glock pressed to Hargrave's skull. I roared at him. Call them off! Call them all off or I fucking swear I'll paint the floor with your brains! As Hargrave's sense slowly returned, he saw me for the first time through watering eyes, glancing at my red hair and furious expression. Turning, he regarded the dead spreading into the school grounds and filling the open space. And laughed. You think I'm scared of death? He coughed, a wild grin splitting his lips. Death itself is our patron. He is our dark light and lord of the dead. I will not betray my first disciple's decree given unto him by our dark lord in his dreams. Even if I die here, I will rise and my soul will be rewarded in the void beyond this life. I knew Hargrave was Maddox's most loyal dog, but fucking hell... He really did believe it all. He thought they were blessed, not pawns of a force hungering for humanity's extinction. As I gaped at him in open-mouthed disbelief, Hargrave raised his voice to a shout. Come to me, my guardians! Come to my voice! The strangest thing happened when he called out to the dead. My skin went deathly cold, a shiver of revulsion slithering along every nerve, swamping me with a cloying nausea. The foul odour of rotting decay invaded my senses, but the most telling effect of his dark siren's call was the thick, metallic taste filling my mouth. I had to check for injury, because I tasted blood on my tongue and palate as though a ragged wound leaked inside my mouth. I released Hargrave and took a step away from him, spitting to try and clear the phantom vileness from my tongue. He continued calling out, arms aloft, face turned upwards to the heavens. Lost in his dark rapture and completely unmindful of me and the pistol in my hand, 
the unnatural power of his commands beckoned the horde of undead to him. Towards me. Erin, said Nate, calm as ice in my earpiece. Fucking move. Now. Then Hargrave's head disintegrated in a spray of gore as Nate switched back to the ferocious power of the PSG-1 and executed him. From such close range, the trauma to the zealot's skull was spectacular, utterly destroying it and ending Hargrave's dark call to arms. I left his headless corpse on the schoolyard, and the bloodiest days of my young life began in earnest. It took two full days to put all the dead down. The estimate of a thousand undead was conservative, because when we carried out the horror of cleaning up the school grounds of all those corpses, Nate reckons it was closer to 1,200. That's a major win in terms of putting down the dead. But holy fucking shit, we paid for it in both resources and blood. We are criminally low on ammunition now because we burned through most of the huge stash of 9mm and 5.56 amassed from our raids on Bancroft and Dean's acquisition from the locker at his HQ. We rotated shifts firing down on the dead that first day as the rifles and pistols needed constantly cleaning and cooling, as did the stash of shotguns in use. As of now, we have zero shotgun shells left. Zero. We burned through all of them over the last two days, with all the shotguns firing. We've used up a lot of the random calibers found along the journey as well, such as the small stash of 357 for the couple of revolvers we took from Bancroft and the arsehole cult soldier Tucker. We've used up the 22 LR in the Ruger we acquired in that same rescue. All the little random bits of shit we've come across have all been used up as we tried to conserve as much of the 5.56 and 9mm as we could. But ultimately, we burned through a shitload of that as well. We've avoided going too heavily into the precious 7.62 for Nate's big PSG-1 toy and still have extras in the six magazines for the couple of AK-47s we got from Bancroft's stash that have never been used. We'll need those rounds, if only for hunting. I'm painfully aware as I write how much I'm hesitating in talking of our own dead. One is too many, but I wish it were only one we lost. I'll get to them, I will, because those we lost deserve to be remembered for their acts of valour. History demands we memorialise our heroes as inspiration for those who come after. One bleakly satisfying thing is what happened in the wake of Nate silencing Hargrave's zealous rant. Two other escort vehicles trundled in the mass of undead, and when Maddox groupie toppled off the mortal coil, the dead returned to their instinctive savagery towards any living human. As soon as Hargrave's dark light was extinguished, they reverted to their natural predatory instincts and closed on the vehicles in their midst. It saved us a few rounds by those two vehicles trying to accelerate through the horde, crushing a number of them as they fired from those vehicles, but spikes of bone puncturing tires or just the sheer number of dead piling up beneath them jammed those vehicles solid. Rendered immobile, those inside the vehicle panicked and tried to open windows a crack so they could fire on the dead, trying to clear the path in some insane notion that they could somehow escape. There was no escape. The two vehicles were tiny islands submerged by an ocean of the dead. Within twenty minutes of being unable to move, those men and women were dead torn apart to join the legions or silently snapping their jaws at the air while strapped into their seats. Pete, our observer on the monitor, thinks one or two of them may have even turned their weapons on themselves just to end the nightmare. Rather than being torn apart by a hundred grinding jaws, choosing to leave this life quick and painless is probably the option I'd take in their position if I'm honest. Shredded by the teeth of the dead, is a horrific end. You know, 
On reflection, saying I'm satisfied by this outcome is actually incorrect. More loyal soldiers of Maddock put to the sword is a tactical boon to us if I look at it coldly. But I still hate the thought of anyone dying unnecessarily if there was a chance of redemption. Tori is adamant that most of the truly loyal were with Jacob when she shot his throat out, sending the undead at the warehouse mental, and she knows the situation there better than any of us. I can't help but feel that some of those torn apart by the dead could have been turned to a better path if we'd just had a little more time. Sigh. This whole situation is just a steaming pile of shit. I hate it. I've delayed this long enough. It's time to honour the dead and their acts of valour. Looking down from the upper windows of our firing positions, at times it was hard not to feel hopeless. We had to allow the dead between the small staff houses where me, Nate and the Becketts resided, and the two dorm halls that formed the L-shape of our firing positions, filling that space so even novice shooters would find it hard to miss. With so many targets early on, it felt like a mechanical exercise. Fire until empty, reload, start firing again. Even as a brain-dead zombie was executed, its fall was simply swallowed into the thick mass of rippling monsters. There was no sense of victory and no sense of achievement or progression. At times, it felt like trying to keep the ocean at bay with a bucket. A thousand faces filled with hate leered up as we rained hell down on them, all blooded and ragged as the clack of their snapping jaws punctuated the quiet between volleys of fire. Glittering up at us like a field of sickly stars, that mass of milky white eyes chilled the blood. Without being able to see their irises, coated as they were in that demonic film, everyone felt every hateful glare as though it was solely for them. The stench of so many packed undead was invasive and violating, and I feel like I need to shower for a solid week just to scrub that corrupt odour out of every pore. Blast after blast filled the air, rattling the senses, jarring the teeth in my jaw each time, and pounding on eardrums like a sledgehammer. I've had a headache for a week that won't shift, and a whistling whine in my ears I'm terrified might never go away. My arms, shoulders, neck and back are battered beyond belief from the consistent thump of weapon recoil, pounding the same areas over and over, and the muscle-ravaging labour of moving so many corpses. My entire body feels like one giant, swollen bruise. I've forgotten what it feels like to be without some form of pain. I need to sleep and heal for a week, and it's not just my body that needs healing. My heart is fucking broken. We'd reinforced the lower doors and windows of each of our buildings, ensuring sufficient protection against weight of numbers crushing through the dorm entrances. We made a terrible miscalculation, though, and it cost us dearly. This was one of those moments that Nate referred to, and how no plan survives first contact with the enemy. About three quarters of the first day done, just as the sun was going down and the grey murk of twilight started to descend, we all made a terrible realisation. The sheer mass of undead we'd been firing down on was stacking up around the base of the buildings. Corpse after corpse piled on top of each other, and they were gradually forming a ramp of ravaged cadavers that the walking dead started climbing. Yes, climbing, like a conscious athletic action, rather than a gradual ascent formed by the fall of so many corpses. They were using their hands to balance as they clambered up the ramp of their fallen brethren. Suddenly, these creatures had more purpose, more coordination, and it fucking terrified me. All along the ground floor, the undead ascended to the height of the lower windows, pressing against the thin timbers placed across the bottom of the windows, intended to protect the glass at normal head height. Now, though, 
The undead pressed directly against the panes from their higher vantage, bodies pushing from behind in greater numbers, increasing the pressure against the thin glass. The plywood panels against the lower part of the windows splintered, and the glass cracked. Urgently, I bellowed this out over the radio, and the fire resumed with ferocity, targeting the undead pressing against the windows from their higher vantage. But there were just too many... The first shattering glass from the floor below me resulted in one of the monsters disappearing from sight as it fell into the building. The dam broke, and from Hall Earth across the yard, I saw the first undead topple through broken windows, lumps of bloody flesh left hanging like cloth from jagged shards of glass as the monsters climbed awkwardly to their feet inside the dorm. Breach! I screamed down the radio. Both buildings breached! With everyone split across the two dorms, we were so deep in shit it was running into our proverbial ears. The undead poured through the breached portals, ever increasing in number, and no amount of fire could stem the tide. We just didn't have the necessary firepower to hold back the surge. Each dorm had one main entrance, thoroughly barricaded against the press, but it didn't matter anymore. Like water following the path of least resistance, once that undead pressure vented through the broken windows, the monsters began toppling into both dorm buildings across the outward faces. As panic started erupting across the airwaves in a flurry of tangled voices, and the fear started to take hold, Nate's voice came across the radio, like a cooling breeze to soothe the stifling heat of panic. Fire exits to the rear of both buildings are clear. Strong, true, clear, and calm. Every other voice fell quiet as Nate started speaking. That, Freya, is how real authority is measured. No shouting, no raging, no threats. He just started speaking, and everyone else zipped it. Fire exit stairwells are at the rear, and breaches are at the front. Two to three shooters remain in each dorm on the main stairwell. Keep firing down on the undead now in the building and draw them with your fire. Stack them up and clog those stairwells with corpses. While distraction is in place, all other fire teams escort non-combatants down emergency stairwells to the fire exits and open those doors while defending teams make noise. Make sure everyone exiting the building remains quiet. I know everyone's scared, but you go slow, you stay together, and make no sound. Do the best with the kids as you can, and move the civilians to the gymnasium fallback position as planned. Jesus, when everyone is losing their shit, there's no sweeter sound or feeling than someone taking complete control. Nate adjusted on the fly without a hint of panic in his tone, and the effect it had on everyone was visible. In Hall Fire, I urged Dean to lead the civilians. He's the best shooter after Nate without a doubt, and he's equally calm in stressful situations. Me and my two new nomad buddies, Mace and Dong, would hold the line in Hall Fire. Elijah was tasked with leading the civilians out of Hall Earth's fire exit, while Nate, Alicia and Finn Archer held their stairwell to keep the dead occupied. Even with Finn's one eye affecting his ranged depth perception, he could still fire a shotgun into a mass from close quarters without issue. When they started pouring into the base of the stairwell, the three of us started unleashing hell down the stairs at the massing undead. Zombies are usually idiots when it comes to traversing stairs. Usually. Something has changed, though, considering the climbing action outside the dorms I'd witnessed. My mind inevitably flashes back now to the undead, opening that infirmary door to attack Mace. Now, here we were, with a distinct and obvious evolution from the early days of mindless shambling. We thought it would be easy pickings, but the ravenous legions clambered up the stairs with hardly a pause. What the fuck? The three of us muttered almost simultaneously when the first undead unerringly stepped onto the staircase. It got up three stairs without fault before we got our shit together, blasted it, then started firing down in earnest. They came so fast, it was hard to keep up solid batteries of fire against the mass. There was more purpose to them, 
more thrust. The staircase should have been a barrier to make life a bit easier, but instead their ease with the ascent only served to make our downward assault more frantic. Something was different about this horde. Whether it was some lingering command given to them by Hargrave, I don't know. But these Zeds had more of an agency to them. Maybe not intelligence, but definitely in coordination, like their instincts had received a tune-up. A series of catastrophic failures hit us then. In a million to one chance, all three of us found ourselves with jams or misfires. The weapons had been working overtime and in need of some TLC, but the people outside making the gymnasium run needed more time. I pulled out my Glock and started firing, as did the two nomads, but we'd soon run out of magazines and the undead corpses were already piling near the top of the short stairwell, with more still filling in below to clamber over their fallen brethren. We needed time to get new weapons and refill empty magazines with fresh rounds, the civilians had carried the stash of backup weapons, ammo and cleaning supplies with them to the gym, so they weren't lost to us when the undead eventually overpowered the building. We've got to go, I said, clicking in my last magazine. They'll follow us, said Mace with a shake of his head. We'll lead them to the exit and out into the space towards the gym. We need to keep them contained. We're about to run dry, Mace, I yelled. We can't hold them off with dick kicks, eye pokes and some stern finger wagging. Dong bellowed a laugh, his amusement changing pitch to a pained roar. The carpet of undead reaching to the top of the stairs weren't all dead. One monster had been shot in the face, but the brain hadn't been touched, instead just having its lower jaw smashed at one side. Slithering from the mass piled atop the steps, one emaciated arm reached out, clasped Dong's ankle, then catapulted itself forward in a single motion. Despite being unable to close a full bite, the monster rammed its upper teeth into Dong's shin like a mountaineer slamming a pick into rock, then scraped those teeth down the front of his leg, peeling cloth and flesh away like wet wallpaper scoured from a surface, exposing the white glisten of bone. Dong wrenched his leg back with a curse, slamming his heel down on the creature's skull, crushing it like rotten fruit. Without a word, he handed over his pistol and overheated shotgun, then drew the wicked machete sheathed at his hip. Against his massive frame, it looked like little more than a large kitchen knife. Go, was all he said. Mace started protesting, and though my heart broke, I pulled him away. The doomsday clock was ticking with the undead teeth peeling his leg, and we all knew it. I shared a final look with Dong, who just nodded grim acceptance before kicking away some of the corpses to advance down four of the stairs and fill the narrow passage like a human barricade. He rolled his head, loosening the muscles of his neck, and waited for the next undead advance. In the clean-up later the following day, we found his undead form and put him to rest. He was covered in bite wounds, so many it was hard to count. The dead stop biting when a victim falls, so Dong must have stayed on his feet for a hellish amount of time to sustain that many separate injuries. By all the hells of all the religions, that boy did not go down easy. There were at least twenty fallen undead in that stairwell, with skulls split by a machete, stamped on by his massive boot, or heads smashed against the walls of the stairwell, evidenced by the crimson smears on those whitewashed surfaces. Bitten and torn to all hell, bleeding from God knows how many wounds, Richard Dong Biggs went down like the valiant last stand of a hero from an epic fantasy novel. There was no ignoble death for our nomad refugee. He went out with the blaze of a dying star. As Elijah escorted his wards from Hall Earth, Nate's team defended their stairwell. One of the smaller kids from Willow Park's group panicked as they were running across the open space towards the back of our building. 
The kid was about six or seven, his tiny mind blinded by the chaos and noise, the dark only ramping his fear, and he ran off in the wrong direction. His dad slipped as he reached out, yelping as he twisted his ankle. Crying out his son's name in horror drew the attention of undead from the mass, a contingent peeling away from the edge of the horde. The kid was hurtling towards them, crying and sobbing, in full flight mode and blind to the danger he scampered towards. Elijah urged everyone else on, raising his rifle and firing as he chased after the child, trying to drop those closest in the boy's path, but knowing deep in his soul he wouldn't get there in time. Enter the smallest hero of the battle. Joseph Evans was just 14 years old. I learned a few days ago from his friend, Daniel, that Joseph was something of an athlete, a promising sprinter at the 100 and 200 meter distances. Without the burden of weighty weapons and ammo, he whipped past Elijah like the wind at full pace, reaching the small boy just as the nearest monster was about to fall upon the child and fucking shielded the kid with his own body. Yanking the child violently away and stopping the youngster dead, he virtually hurled the little boy back towards the advancing Elijah, even as Joseph's momentum carried him into the mass of undead. Not just carried him, though. Elijah said it was almost like he accelerated, throwing himself at the creatures, slamming into them and making just enough time for Eli to reach the small kid and sweep him up from the floor in one arm. Joseph disappeared under the ravenous mass of undead, and Elijah said his screaming was mercifully short, though I can see the memory haunts him. It's a strange paradox. On one hand, the incredible courage in the face of knowing he was going to die a horrific death, yet still throwing himself headlong into that demonic mass to save the life of a child he didn't know, is inspiring beyond anything you can imagine. That incredible bravery, that sacrifice, from a boy of just 14 years old, is phenomenal. And I'll forever be in awe of that kid's monumental courage. The other side of that bleak coin, however, is that Elijah watched a child swallowed up by the hateful mass, helpless as his dying wails of agony echoed in the night as he backed away with the small boy under one arm. Joseph Evans was small for 14. He was smaller than all the other boys his age here, and smaller even than some of the girls. But for what he did, for what he gave, Joseph will always be a giant to us. Once the civilians were all located in the gymnasium, then came the hardest graft of all. We shivered in the gym while the undead still rampaged out in the growing darkness, forced to remain as quiet and still as we could. It was a harrowing night of getting our weapons operational again, desperately trying to keep scared children from making noise and seeing the looks of hopeless terror carved into every shadowed face as we worked by flashlight. We couldn't go out into the night and fight the dead. There was too much peril stumbling about in the dark, We'd likely shoot each other or get ambushed by wandering undead. I mean, what kind of madman would go into the darkness to take on the legions of the damned? Nathaniel James Carter. That's who. Taking Dean's G36C with suppressor, loading up every magazine he had for it, filling every pocket with magazines of 9mm for his Glock, and even a shotgun slung over his back, Nate painted his face black, strapped on his NVGs, and went out into the cold winter night. Alone. For nigh on eight hours, in the biting darkness, Nate pulled the horde to and fro. His only goal was to give all of us rest, give us a chance to maintain the weapons and reload magazines, and keep the monsters from the gym doors so they didn't hear our desperate attempts to keep the children quiet. He switched between the three weapons, using the suppressed rifle to pick off targets edging around the dorm building that might head towards the gym. And when it started to look like a group might be drawn towards where all our people were hiding, he'd go ultra-loud, 
Switching to the shotgun and unleashing a storm of buckshot at the rogue group, he'd draw the attention of the whole horde towards the thunder of his weapon, ensuring he was their sole focus and drawing them away from investigating the gym any further. For eight fucking hours. I thought I'd mention that again. He moved like a vengeful wraith through the night, toying with the horde, not a soul watching his six, tactically moving the dark host this way and that, using every inch of the terrain to his advantage, for no other reason than to let the rest of us gather our wits and courage. He must have put down a couple of hundred undead, single-handed, during that first night, which is fucking staggering. He played Overwatch for that whole night, keeping the demons from our door and Captain Evil's personal scourge. When the sun finally started wiping the darkness from the sky, we formed up in fire teams of three, each led by an experienced shooter with two novices, and went out into the frost-coated dawn. It was a long fucking day. A long day. We moved around in our little trios, harrying the undead flanks, peeling them off in groups in different directions, funneling them into choke points, or dragging them out into open space where we could fire while moving backwards into safe space. We'd taken care of a good chunk of the mass the previous day, when just blasting down from first-floor windows into the Sea of Dead, so there was a bit more space to bob and weave, providing we watched our footing and didn't go arse over tit on all the corpses. It's all a blur, in truth. I fired, reloaded, and checked on my two novices constantly. Lucy and Kate were two of the women liberated from the nomads, and they are hard women. There's no giving them, Lucy especially. She reminds me a little of Alicia in some ways, but not heated and vengeful as Alicia was at the start. Lucy has adapted swiftly with an intensity of simmering heat. It's always bubbling away, always burning, but acutely under control. Like a trio of gun-toting Amazons, we battered the shit out of our bodies with recoil, unmindful of the blistering cold as we dragged a breakaway group from the horde into the open space in front of the admissions building, near Hargrave's corpse. With a constant, steady backwards walk, we staggered our fire, leaving a scatter of ruined undead in our wake, spreading the death out over a wide area. The two of them were solid, in control, and complete fucking heroes. Until Kate ran dry. I need a resupply, was all she said, and set off at a run back for the gym. She didn't heed the calls of me or Lucy, consumed by a need to get back in the fight. Rather than thinking clearly and letting us walk her back safely for a reload, she acted on impulse, thinking to replenish and get back to us in a couple of quick sprints. Just like Dong's demise, there was a corpse on the frosty earth that wasn't dead. Lucy and Kate don't hit the head every time, and some low shots with their shotguns took out legs or hips, leaving a crippled corpse. I can't keep my eye on everything. I don't have Nate's innate and ridiculously perceptive combat sense. And the two of them were novices. I'm still a novice if you really think about it, but I've had the benefit of Nate all this time and absorbed many of his good habits. Whoever took that zombie down initially probably put it out of their mind as it crumpled, focusing attention on those still upright and ambling towards us. There were corpses everywhere, so it was easy to miss a grounded one if you're not paying attention. When you're fighting hordes of the walking dead, though, you can never afford to be lax in your vigilance. In her eagerness for resupply and rejoining the effort, Kate ran too close to the crippled zombie, yelping as a rotten hand landed on her instep as she was running, throwing her gait completely off. She hit the frost-hardened grass, face first. The zombie's hand still on her foot, and now with a solid grip, the crippled undead dragged itself to her and smashed its gaping jaws into the fleshy meat of her calf. Kate screamed as the creature's head tore back, ripping a sickening chunk of tissue and muscle from the limb, visible steam rising from the hot exposed flesh and blood in the frigid winter air. 
Before either of us could put a round in the monster's skull, Kate wrenched her leg free of its grip, climbed to her feet with a grimace, then screamed obscenities at the thing and fucking pounded that zombie's skull to pulp with the butt of her shotgun. Why do I tell you this? Kate went and got her resupply, got Doc Emma to dress her wound, came back to the fight limping on her ruined leg and fought for another hour before the sickness poisoning her stole the last vestiges of her strength. With the darkness rising up to swallow her, eyes starting to sicken to that nauseating white, she simply turned to us and said just three words. I'm done, girls. Without further ceremony, she turned the shotgun on herself and pulled the trigger. Kate fought until she could fight no more, and before the sickness turned her into another enemy inside our gate, she took herself off the board. Fucking hero. There were two other deaths in a couple of other groups, one formerly of Willow Park, one from the nomad refugees. Both were just unlucky, Zeds getting too close or breaking formation and getting themselves cornered to be pounced on by the dead. Kevin Proctor and Nick Dillon did their part. They fought for their families, for our community. But weight of numbers and lack of experience took them down. They're still heroes to us, though. They did their part and will be forever grateful. There was one more death to come the hardest of all to take. Kevin, Nick, Dong, Joseph and Kate all went out like the heroes they are. The sixth and final death, however, was just pure tragedy. While Elijah was out with the fire teams taking down Zeds, Theodore's pen ran dry. He carried a small sketchbook and pen around with him at all times, as that was how Elijah kept him calm when always on the move and changing locations prior to us finding them. Routine was inherently important to him, and the only way Elijah could keep Theodore quiet and away from the attention of the undead when in an unfamiliar location was by him having the means to draw. When his pen ran dry... Theodore started losing it, becoming aggressive and constantly repeating, No more lines! No more lines! Over and over. Maria and Doc Emma didn't know what he meant, and he started smashing fists into his temples with ferocity, slipping further into a disturbing tantrum edging towards complete loss of control. Worried he might genuinely do himself harm, Others made the grave mistake of trying to physically restrain him, which pushed him over the precipice. With Theodore getting more unruly, Doc Emma feared the restraint was aggravating his panic and demanded everyone release their hold. The moment those restraining him backed off, Theodore bolted before anyone could react, through the gymnasium door and out into the afternoon in mere seconds. Once outside, he bellowed for Elijah, but his brother was on the far side of campus with his team and didn't hear his shouts. I was the nearest at the time, recognising his voice, dread rising from my guts like bile. If I could hear him between the blasts of gunfire, then so could the predatory dead. Seeking the art supplies from home, scattered dead still wandered the open space between the dorm buildings and staff housing. Theodore just didn't, see them. His mind was fixed on relieving his need for a pen. In helpless horror, I watched as he appeared a hundred yards away and ran in a perfect straight line towards his house, the threats all around him unseen. Already running towards him, I screamed as the first undead hand caught his shoulder. It ruined his balance, causing him to stumble and plunge forward, crashing to the blood-soaked asphalt on hands and knees. He started crying, staring at his skinned palms, not hearing me as I sprinted towards him, screaming his name over and over, firing as fast as I could to keep the closing stragglers from him. But there were too many. I wasn't fast enough. 
The first one reached him, dropping to its knees and driving its teeth into his shoulder, grinding through flesh and muscle as Theodore shrieked in response. Jesus, the sound of his terror and pain still haunts me. Despite being in his early twenties, it was a childlike shriek of agony, not the roar of an adult man. And he just sat there, screaming. There was no fight or attempt to get away. He just screamed without understanding what was happening to him, or why. Another one fell to its knees on his other side, its rotten jaw falling into the meat of his thigh, and the shrieking rose further in pitch, punctuated by sobs. At full sprint, the rifle slung round my back and the glock out, a third undead dropped beside him, its maw grinding against the side of his head, ripping his right ear away in a single bloody bite. All the while, Theodore sat there, shrieking and motionless. Now and again, I heard him cry, No more lines! through his terrified agony. When I finally reached him, I dragged the monsters off by the scruff of their neck, blasting their skulls from point blank with the pistol until it was just me standing over the blooded, sobbing Theodore, still on his knees, staring at the blood on his palms from his tumble to the asphalt, repeating that same phrase. No more lines! No more lines! Someone must have called Elijah on the radio as he appeared as I was stood over the sobbing Theodore with Lucy beside me, kicking and blasting any monster daring to come near. As his two fire team partners added their guns to mine and Lucy's, we formed a square around the crying man and Elijah kneeled next to his little brother, pulling a small ballpoint pen from a pocket and handing it to Theodore. Like magic, Theodore calmed as he grasped it. Despite the awful wounds to his leg and shoulder and the ear completely torn away, he sighed in near contentment as he hugged the small pen to him. We've got to move, Eli, I said, little more than a choked sob. Come on, Theodore, he urged softly, his voice gentle as he helped his brother to his feet. Let's get you some paper. We haven't got time for this, said one of Eli's comrades in frustration. We're going to get surrounded. I've since found out his name is Aubrey, and I don't like the twat one little bit. This was the beginning of a mutual dislike, and his words pushed my heartache aside for a moment, filling the hollow space with fury. That's his fucking brother, you shit-sucking twat, I snarled. He's dead anyway retorted Aubrey with a huff. Let's just get it done and get out of here. Remember how I've described my lack of impulse control? At that moment, all thought of consequence left me. That shitty, heartless comment while Elijah was right next to him sent me into a cyclone of blind rage. For a moment, I stopped firing, took two frenzied steps towards Aubrey and smacked a right hook to his sour mouth. Doc Emma had to take two of his teeth out under pain medication hours later because they were barely hanging in his bloody mouth by a thread. This girl knows how to punch, remember? I regret nothing. He hit the ground and I returned back to firing on the closing crowd of undead. Aubrey didn't respond, picking himself up and spitting blood, returning to the job at hand without further comment, but giving me a look of absolute hatred. I won't lose any sleep over it. We moved away and other fire teams joined us, Nate included. His strong hand alighted on my shoulder. Eli needs you right now, he said. I got this. Christ, Nate looked exhausted. Dark smudges were painted below his eyes and he looked like he might topple any moment. Despite fighting all day, then solo all night to keep the wolves from our door, the old warrior carried right on through the second day. Somehow, Nate finds new ways for me to be in awe of him. I didn't argue, and if Aubrey thought of making any further dumb comments, Nate's presence and commanding authority over the combined teams silenced any intended bullshit. 
I helped Eli move Theodore to the side of their house, knowing what the dying man needed. I quickly stepped inside, grabbed the nearest pad of paper from the kitchen table, and passed it into Theodore's hands when I returned to them. Elijah's eyes were wet with tears, and I don't know how he kept his voice so calm and soothing for Theodore. His brother smiled happily, despite the angry wounds sucking the life from him, blood running down his neck from his severed ear, his clothing drenched in blood from the other two monstrous bites. He just started to draw. Eli looked up, the pain in his eyes almost too much for me to bear. We couldn't let Theodore go down hard, poisoned by the dark force of evil. I knew Eli wanted Theodore's end to be painless and serene, but the thought of pulling the trigger on his own brother was too much in the stress of the moment, guns still thundering all around us. It was plain in his haunted, blasted stare. Full circle, Freya. I couldn't do it for you. I wasn't ready and needed an eight to carry the weight. Back then, it was too much. I could carry it now. I could do it for Theodore. And I could do it for Elijah. This was hard enough for him, and putting down his own little brother was a weight I couldn't bear to see him carry. I drew my glock, slid the chamber to check for a round, and locked eyes with Elijah. I've got this, Eli, I said, the sound of gunfire a storm in the air around us, Nate's commanding voice in absolute control. Our shield was giving us this moment, this calm eye of the storm as chaos raged everywhere else, so fuck the plan for this short time. Just this once. Eli said nothing, a combination of grief, gratitude and shame rolling out from him. Grief for Theodore's loss, gratitude for me taking the responsibility, and shame because he didn't have the strength to do it. I know that sickening mix all too well, eh, Freya? He kneeled next to his little brother, kissing the crown of his head, before ruffling his hair as only a big brother could. You draw me a picture, Theodore, he said, thick and heavy. Okay, chimed the dying man, eyes fixed to the page. Eli nodded and turned away, rifle shouldered and up, vigilant for any encroaching undead. Theodore didn't react to me sliding behind him, lost as he was in his art. Despite his awful injuries, he didn't appear to feel them. Once more in his happy place, he felt safe, calm. This time there was no hesitation. This wasn't for me. This was for Theodore, and above all, for Elijah. Elijah's entire body tightened with the gunshot, and I moved beside him, placing a hand on his forearm. We'll come back for him, I promised. He nodded, pushing his personal grief down for the moment, hiding it in the darkest, dustiest corners of his heart, and we went back to work. Thank you, he wheezed. Nothing else needed saying. As dusk fell on the second day, we were done. Once the grounds were cleared, we baited out those undead trapped in dorm buildings and took them out like a firing squad. Campus was a blood-drenched massacre. The past five days, we've scrubbed every inch of campus clean. Mark worked diligently on the asphalt with a pressure washer found in the maintenance area to blast it clean of blood and gore. Over the next week, we'll be putting everything back together, like acquiring new windows from a glass store in town. Moving so many bodies was horrific, transporting them all to one far corner of the playing field. A team went out and located a small, tracked excavator from a construction site, and Doug Archer used the equipment to scoop a mass grave for all the corpses of the undead. It was miserable, back-breaking work, 
that will haunt us all until the end of time, and only the small children were spared the disturbing horror of that grim labour. Yesterday we held a funeral and memorial for our six fallen in a designated cemetery. When we brought Isaac's body back from the college, this is where we decided to bury and honour our dead. Our heroes. I stayed with Elijah last night, returning the favour he once gave me. He couldn't be alone after burying his little brother, so I lay with him, holding him until he fell asleep when the grief finally burned him out. I don't know where we go from here. I do know that Maddock and his dark command of the dead has to go. All my efforts have to be directed towards ending his black reign, showing his people there's another way. Kevin Proctor, Nick Dillon, Richard Dong Biggs, Joseph Evans, Kate Alderman and Theodore Beckett were lost to us. Five heroic deaths and lives sacrificed so that others may live. And one heartbreaking tragedy, dealt by a world too cruel for such a gentle soul. We preserved many lives with this victory, and the acts of valour from five of our fallen will never be forgotten. But we didn't save everyone, and I doubt my heart will ever be whole again. Everyone fought heroically, did their part, but if I had a medal to pin on anyone's chest, it would be Nate. What he did that night, alone in the dark, keeping us all safe just to let us all breathe for a little while, was an act of singular selfless courage and raw fortitude I doubt I'll ever see the likes of again. He really is our shield, protecting us from the darkness, and I'm forever thankful he came into my life. Peace, Freya. All I want is peace. If we're ever to find it, then this final confrontation is unavoidable. It's time to end this. Part 3 The Flame February 10th, 2011 To plan B or not to plan B? That is the question. I've got the beginnings of a plan. Yes, I know it's been nine days since I last wrote anything, but it's been nothing but rebuilding here of late. We had to build new gates, which needed metal and timber, so clearing those bodies up by the gas shop and builder's yard was necessary to get timber from the building wholesaler and metal from the nearby scrapyard. I made sure we got enough extra metal and put in my order for an armoured pickup from Clyde. Damn it, if it's the last thing I do on this earth, I'll have my bloody warthog. We've had to replace all those lower windows, so a trip to the glass shop was needed. And wouldn't you know it, one of those Willow Park people was a glazier. So thank you, Team Light, for setting that up. We've had to acquire new bedding and furniture for the dorm buildings, because everything the dead touched is tainted. So we've burned everything and disinfected those buildings ten times over, therefore needing to acquire a metric ton of industrial cleaning supplies. You get the picture. We've been busy as all hell. In the meantime, Tori and I discussed how to take on Maddock and sway hearts and minds away from him. We've got a safe plan A, and I floated a mentally risky plan B past Tori. She sees the logic, but hates it. And if she hates it, because of the danger it poses to me and Tori personally, then Nate will lose his fucking mind if I tell him. I'm going to keep that one close to my chest for now and hope I don't need it. If I do, though, Nate's going to have to suck it up as he's an integral part of it. I'm keeping Plan B out of my journal for the moment. You never know if Captain Evil is peering over your shoulder. If you are reading this, you evil shit licker, just know I'm typing all these words with the middle finger of my right hand. Plan A is using the radio. We'll go to Nate's undiscovered sniper hide and have a conversation with this first disciple. There are few in this life that can annoy people better than me, and I'm a narcissist's worst nightmare. I will give you zero 
respect, and be so mockingly childish, there's no chance of having a reasonable adult conversation with me. It worked with Bancroft, and I'm hoping it'll work with this murderous twat as well. Hopefully, the radio traffic will be heard by everyone near a handset in Ascension. All the guards have one, and with the creeping dread pervading the whole settlement and eyes on everyone should they try to escape as Tory did, it's likely a large chunk of the population will get to hear their lord and master for who he really is. If that doesn't work, then it's on to plan B. I'll tell Nate plan B when it's the only viable option. He will just give me a flat, fuck off Erin, no chance, if I tell him now, and he'll try to dissuade me. Sorry, Nate. I love you to bits, but I can't take your nagging for the next week or two. These entries will be few and far between now, I think. At least until this is resolved, or there are no more entries because I'm dead. I don't want to lay out all my plans in this journal. I just want to get shit done and put an end to this threat. I'd really like to make some new friends instead of having to kill people. Killing that undead horde was hard, miserable work, especially as I lost friends to the monstrous bastards. But it was also a reminder of what we should be doing. Putting that many undead to rest felt like a colossal victory in many ways, despite the tragic cost. We, the living, should be uniting against the demons that have invaded our world, we should be exorcising those undead demons, not going to war with each other. I can feel it coming, Freya. I don't know how to describe it. It's a shit or bust moment, all in with the chips in the middle of the table and only the river card to turn. A convergence of forces. The flame and the disciple, playing for it all. Not long now. First, though. I'm going to annoy the living shit out of Maddock. February 17th, 2011. Three little things. More hard work for a week. I'll not list everything because you know how bored I am by mundane details. We're rebuilding, dealing with the grief of our losses and panicking like hell about our major dearth of ammunition. We've been so comfortable for so long with the massive stash we got from ours and Dean's halls that it's now a genuine concern. We have to be careful with every round, making my plan even more important. We can't afford a major gunfight in either people or ammunition, so now I have to go with the hearts and minds approach. Even if plan A doesn't work on its own, it will plant seeds for plan B. Tomorrow, we three torchbearers are heading to Nate's hidey hole near Ascension, and I'm going to have me a nice chat with evil Jesus. It's time to put plan A into motion, which I've decided to name Operation Cockwomble, because it makes me laugh, and Lord knows I need a fucking laugh. Plan B will be Operation Shit or Bust, because it really is an all-or-nothing gamble. I'll be victorious, or I'll be dead. Today's entry can be summed up by three positive things from the past week. Positives are difficult to find of late, so I'm taking the wins where I can. Firstly, we now have new gates. Mark and Clyde have put together a beast out of wood and metal. Hinged braces are fixed to the inner face, from which posts fold out and slot into small grooves we smashed into the asphalt of the road to really jam them in. Next time anyone attempts to drive at speed through our new fortress gates, they'll get a nasty surprise. Velocity meet the immovable object. Secondly, we've had no further incursions of living or dead. Maddock must be bricking it now, because his little worshipper Hargrave hasn't returned in two weeks, and neither have any of his people. There's no way that coward will come crawling outside his protective walls, and if he tries to push anyone else out to assault us, he could meet resistance. After all, their last two big operations have resulted in a big chunk of their security forces not returning home. 
The warehouse where Tori escaped was a huge blow, losing Tyler and the most loyal and experienced of their security force. Now they've lost Hargrave and another chunk of shooters. I doubt anyone will be rushing to volunteer. Last, and most certainly not least, is that I've achieved my dream. Well, Mark and Clyde achieved that dream for me. Oh yes, Freya. Lucky has her warthog. The pickup is a damn sight heavier and slower now, but it has an angled blade like a plow fixed to the front, which can be unhitched so maintenance can be carried out on the engine. This will let me crunch through the undead in a pinch and keep them from going under my tires. The doors have armoured plates welded to them, and in a pinch, there's now a metal shutter on the inside of the windscreen that can be pulled down with a narrow slit to see out of. The changes aren't much, and I can't have the Mad Max vehicle of spiky doom that I wanted because of stupid physics. Apparently it will be too heavy if they put any more on. But still, Lockie has her warthog, and such a stupid thing has made me way happier than it has any right to. Tomorrow is Operation Cockwomble, and I'll report back on our return. There's no danger in this one, as we'll be hidden a quarter mile away. So expect my bardic recounting of my first conversation with evil Jesus forthwith. February 18th, 2011. A different threat. I thought I was going to roll in and fuck shit up, just like I did with Bancroft when I got under his skin. Maddock, however, is an entirely different personality to our fallen king shit of Turd Mountain. We rolled up to the farmhouse Nate and Alicia used as a forward operating base when observing Ascension. After parking up, Nate went off with his big rifle to his sniper hide to watch Resurrection HQ while Tori and I moved the radio into the farmhouse. As soon as Nate signalled over our encrypted radio he was set and watching the place through his scope, I punched in the radio code and passed the handset to Tori. Me? I nodded. The people in there should hear your voice first, Tori. If they hear one of their own, they'll listen. Don't worry, I reassured with a mischievous grin. I'll take over soon enough. Tori nodded and blew out a calming breath as she took the handset. Hello, John, she said by way of opening. It was about a minute before we got any response. Who is this? The male voice was clear, his diction perfect and tone commanding, overly dramatic even. It's Tori Cates, John. Remember me? I remember a traitor by that name, was the hissed response. One who abandoned all she believed in and fled to the arms of our enemies. I never swallowed your fabricated mythology, John. I was never a believer. The truth is, I intended to expose you for the fraud you are before everything went to hell. You see, I am, was, a journalist. I know all about your unremarkable life, all your get-rich-quick schemes, and all your failed careers because of your arrogance. I know you planned to steal Oliver's fortune and abandon all those good people who put their faith in you, John. Nate's voice came softly over our radio. People are crowding to those with handsets. Even the guards have stopped to listen. Maddox's response was venomous. Jacob is dead because of you. A good man died because of your treachery, and with his death, so many more were taken by the dead. Only three made it back, exhausted, bedraggled, forced to walk all the way home. A good man, scoffed Tory. A good man, John? Between you, Jacob, and Oliver, how many innocent people did you murder? And where's it got you? War is never without cost, even for the righteous. Righteous? 
Tori openly laughed down the mic, hard and bitter. Righteous, John. You murdered people for your own ends, to hold on to your transient power, allying yourself with a dark force that wants to destroy us all. You're deluded, John. You've been duped and made a pawn, doing the work of the dark by killing what's left of the living. With no more survivors to feed your evil pact, you've turned on your own. How do you think all the people listening to this feel, John? How do they feel when you steal their loved ones away so you can execute them and wash your hands in their blood? Sacrifice is necessary if the greater good is to be achieved. My turn, I said, holding out my hand. Tori smiled, nodding as she handed it over. Clicking the mic, I put on my cheeriest, most irritating voice. Hello, is this customer service? I chimed happily. I'd like to place an order for my creepy hooded robe in time for the next ritual sacrifice. Tell me, do you have it in a small? Silence for a moment. I have that effect on people. To whom am I speaking? My name's Erin, Johnny Boy, Erin Locke. You might have dreamed about me when Captain Evil's been running its mouth off. I'm the flame you've got a hard on for. Silence again for a moment. The Lord of the Dead has spoken truth again, it would appear, purred Maddock. The auspicious day draws ever nearer, and you come to me seeking salvation. Fucking hell, Voldemort, I huffed. Your wheel might be turning, but your hamster's definitely dead. Why all the creepy villain talk? This isn't sword and sorcery, John. I haven't come to fulfil any dark prophecy or any of that bullshit. Stop all this dark god and destiny turd talk and be real for a minute, yeah? Your disrespect does not go unnoticed. Do not test the limits of my patience. Can I skip this tutorial if I press the X button? Do I need to turn you off and on again? Would a reboot help? Stop with all this fucking grandiose and dramatic speech, Johnny, and speak proper, like which I does. Tory stifled a snigger. Let's be real here, John. You're a fucking con man who got caught with his hand in the cookie jar when the world shat itself in June, and you've had to adapt to a new narrative. Since then, Captain Evil has had its hand shoved up your ass like the Muppet you are, and you've been singing his song ever since, dancing away to his murderous tune. Where's it got you, Johnny? Your two lackeys are dead. You've murdered countless innocents. You've killed some good friends of mine with the horde Oliver brought with him. And you've fallen so low that you've turned to cutting the throats of your own. Quite frankly, I'm amazed the people haven't risen up to depose you. You're not a chosen one or an icon to be revered and adored. You're a false prophet being played into flushing humanity down the cosmic toilet after you've taken your own personal dump on their heads. You're a fucking tyrant, Johnny. The dead stand watch at our gates as a reminder, hissed Maddock. A stark signal to all of what awaits should we stray from the path the dark spirit laid out for us. Without sacrifice, the dead would destroy us all. Some must die, so the rest may live in peace. His voice seemed to gather power as he spoke his next line. I am the only thing that stands between humanity and its ultimate destruction. What an absolute crock of curried elephant turd that is, I snorted. Have you heard yourself, Darth Maddock? Do you practice these lines in front of the mirror? It may have worked before, but your people are seeing you for what you are. My voice hardened. Your little lovebird brought a horde of more than a thousand undead to my home, to my people, and we killed them all, Joffrey. All of them, including your pathetic minion, I lost six people to that horde, and one of them was too many. Yet you've happily killed three people 
every fucking week since all this began. And for what? To prevent a handful of dead outside your gate from writing some disgruntled letters. With all the guns you've got in there, you could have taken them down easily. Even though he couldn't see me, I still shook my head in disgust. No, Sauron. You're not saving humanity. You're imprisoning it with fear and killing it piece by piece. This has to end. There's only one way this ends. Evil one, said Maddock, his voice low and cold through the airwaves. And that is with your blood. The dark spirit swears your blood will end the need for sacrifice. You can end all of this, Erin Locke. All you have to do is the noble act of sacrifice to save the humanity you profess to protect. I could almost hear his smug smile of satisfaction through the radio. If you truly wish to protect the last souls of humanity, then give yourself freely. One little cut, and all these people will be free, Erinlock. The dead will leave our gates, and we can rebuild, once more living in peace and prosperity. Your blood and the blood of the traitor beside you. Until your souls are set free, all will suffer for your selfishness. This is the Lord of the Dead's decree, and who am I to question a power so great that it can make the dead walk? What an absolute shithead, huh? It's not an act anymore, said Tori, shaking her head. He really believes it, Erin. He's lied to himself for so long that all he has left is the lie. It's now his only truth. I sighed and clicked the radio again. And that's what it'll take to prevent any more deaths. To halt the inevitable war between our people that will only see more bodies in the ground for your crazy belief. That... And only that, Erin Locke. I hated the way he kept using my full name. It is the only way to appease the dark spirit's wrath. Two souls for all of what is left of humanity. Remember, Erin Locke, that the horde Oliver brought to your door was only a drop in the ocean of undead out beyond our walls. How long can you survive, wave after wave, night after night, week after week? He laughed then, a bleak and soulless rumble of black humour. If you kill me, the dark spirit's chosen son, then his wrath will be endless and mighty, so do not think one bullet from a cowardly assassin could end this today. You are wrong. Nate, are you safe? Hissed Tori into our radio. All good, he answered immediately, leading us both to blow out a relieved breath. There are no other choices, Erin Locke, continued Maddock, now feeling completely in control. You say you want humanity to survive and have the opportunity to prove the truth of your words. I will part the dead at our gate, ready for the auspicious day. The third day of the third month and the third hour, you could free everyone. Think on it, and when ready to accept this immutable truth, I shall receive you. Until then, there are no more words to be said, Erin Locke. Words alone no longer suffice. Now, only a single action can redeem humanity for its second chance. And I will be waiting. That was the end of the communication. I turned to Tori and sighed. Well then. Operation shit or bust it is. Nate is going to fucking hate this. 
February 21st, 2011. I knew we'd hate it. You've got to be fucking kidding me, stormed Nate. Absolutely not. That's fucking suicide. I decided to open this entry with Nate's response to plan B. I knew he'd hate it. It's the only way, Nate. We can't take the chance that popping his melon with a sniper round won't trigger another horde in response. We need to take away his power, and this is the only way to do it. I sighed. Look, if you had one shot or one opportunity to seize everything you ever wanted in one moment, would you capture it or let it slip? Nate paused for a moment, staring at me. Erin, did you really just quote Eminem at me? I did my own thoughtful pause. Let's call it inspired by him, shall we? He shook his head and sighed. And you're on board with this, he asked Tori. Her response was more measured. It's the only way, she agreed. The only way to take Maddox's power from him is by taking away his menacing mystique. They fear his power more than they trust us right now. And if you do assassinate him from afar, and it does trigger a response from the undead, we'll have lost them forever. We might even doom them. Nate pinched the bridge of his nose, taking slow breaths to calm himself. How can I protect you both if you walk into the lion's den without me? Because, I said, the only way you can protect us is by not being with us. No sense, Erin. That makes no sense. I told Nate my whole plan then. I'm not writing it in here because, well, you never know. I'll tell it as history if I survive this thing. Me, Tori, and you, I said finally. It has to be us three. Dean can play Overwatch with your big gun if needed, and if necessary, we can have a QRF at the farmhouse ready to rock when all is done and dusted. But this, Nate, this has to be done by the three of us. This is what we've been building towards. Tori's faith in us and in the people of Ascension is what gets us here, that this is the right path. I've no fucking clue what I'll say if this comes off, but it's my role to convince them there is another way. And you, you big dolt, make sure we get that chance. Everything is three, I added, remembering poor Theodore's favourite phrase. I hate it, repeated Nate. I simply moved to him, threw my arms around his waist and crushed myself to him in a squeezing hug. I know. The plan is set in stone now. Pretty much everyone we brought in on it hates it as well. Maria near lost her fucking mind when she found out. Dean was clearly concerned, but his faith in me has never wavered, and I love him for it. Everyone is on edge and nervous as the whispers spread around, hardly believing what Tori and I plan to do. We're going to hand ourselves over to Maddock, just like he wants. Little does he realise, however, that Operation Shit or Bust depends on us being under his knife. I'm going to write Little now. My head has to be in the game. Maddock loves his auspicious day, so I'm going to hand myself over the day before. Until then, I'll be going dark. Hope to see you soon. March 1st, 2011. Promises. Damn it. One last entry before Operation Shit or Bust, as it needs recording. Largely because I feel as giddy as a schoolgirl. Elijah knocked on my door this afternoon. Nate was out and about on campus, drilling the novices in weapons training, so I made Eli a brew. I was just about to sit down and eat a bowl of canned chicken soup I'd heated up and seasoned. I offered to share it with him, though he politely declined. Who decided chicken soup was a thing, by the way? What culinary pioneer woke up one day and thought, you know what we should do? We should drink a chicken. Not disturbing you, am I? 
he asked. I shook my head as I tasted my meal and twisted my face. No, I was going to eat this soup, but I think I got a little carried away seasoning it. I added so much salt and pepper, I'm fairly certain I heard the soup singing, Ah, push it. Eli snorted a snotty chuckle. It was nice to see him laugh again. Theodore's loss has been hard on him. Hell, it's cut me to the heart of my heart, so only the powers know how heartbroken he is. This plan of yours is madness, Erin, he said finally. There was no accusation in his tone, just a statement of fact. I know, but it's shit or bust time, Eli. This needs to end. We win and hold the line that little longer and get some new friends. Or we lose everything. I'm aware what's at stake. Elijah shook his head. I don't mean all the big stuff, Erin. I mean you. Bemused, I kind of gave him a Scooby-Doo-esque. Huh? I want you to come home, he said softly, those pretty green eyes never leaving mine. You have to come home. I intend to, but we don't always get what we want in life. Well, I want this, he said. With his eyes still fixed to mine, he added, I want you to come home. To me. This should have been so cinematic and romantic, a story for the ages. Instead, Elijah delivered his passionate plea with all his smouldering intensity right when I was sipping at my coffee. It took me by such surprise, I snorted my hot brew out of my nose, dribbling a load of it down my top and onto the couch, then proceeded to have a choking fit as I tried to expel coffee from my lungs and nostrils. Not my finest hour, Freya. He chuckled again, grabbed a tea towel to clean myself with, and sat down opposite. I want you to make me a promise, Erin, he continued, reaching out a hand to take mine. No ifs, ands, or buts. I want your oath. If you go down on one knee, I swear I'll punch you in the nose. Another chortle before shaking his head. No, it's a lot less dramatic and nowhere near as weird. I mean, I hardly know you. Says the man who's been in bed with me twice all snugly like. Yeah, you should know something, Erin. He affected a mock expression of pained regret. You should be aware that you snore. It sounds like the bones of your face are breaking. I snorted a laugh. Yeah, well, if a guy really is into me, he'd be all, oh yeah, you rumble like that sexy diesel engine you are, baby. So maybe you should take a good look at yourself. Eli laughed openly, and it was the first time I'd seen him laugh like that since losing Theodore. A little bit of light pushed at the shadows trailing him in that brief moment. When he finally stopped, he shook his head and sighed. Erin. I want you to promise me that you won't go off half-cocked and do something reckless that gets you killed. I know you want to save everyone, but I believe you can do what you need to do without sacrificing yourself. So whatever you've got to do in this mad plan of yours, I know you have to do it. But promise me you'll stick to the plan, yeah? Do everything you can to walk out of there and come home. To me. He smiled then. That stupid, dazzling smile that made me so giddy the first time I met him. I'll be waiting. He leaned over, placed a soft kiss on my forehead, then left. I haven't stopped smiling all night. Particles is giving me some extra attention tonight. Again, it's like my little pooch knows something big is coming and is being hyper-affectionate this evening. He doesn't seem happy until he's back in my lap and snuggling into me. This really is it now, Freya. Tomorrow, it's time for Operation Shit or Bust. And now, 
It seems like I've got an extra reason to live. The Devil's Due Maddox smirked at the two women as the gates creaked open. Glancing down at his watch, the first disciple permitted himself a contented sigh. 3.33 p.m. A good omen. He held back a sneer at the traitor, Tory, conscious of retaining his poise before those witnessing the surrender. Tory looked nervously to either side at the silent undead guardians, parted a day earlier in readiness. Fearful they might fall upon her any moment, her eyes darted between the dead and their master. His gaze shifted to the smaller woman, unremarkable in appearance, save for hair dyed a deep crimson and tied back in a single braid. She seemed too weak to threaten his dark lord's design, but the woman stared defiantly back with deep brown eyes, gaze unflinching, despite the dead only feet away from her. Erin Locke's gaze was hard and challenging, no ounce of fear to be found. If anything, she regarded him with contempt. Finally, you accept the futility of resistance he declared in a loud voice, spreading his arms in dramatic fashion for the assembled witnesses. Many flocked to see the fabled sacrifice, promised to free them from the threat of the dead, and Maddock intended to give them a performance. I'm not scared of a gibbering bellend like you, Johnny B. Cunt, answered Erin with a scornful grin. I'm here for them. She gestured to the crowd. I do give a shit about them, as does Tory. So wind your neck in and cut the theatrical bullshit, eh, Voldemort? You'll get no civility from me, and you damn well won't get any reverence or respect. I've got a whole litany of creative insults to show how little I think of you and your savagery, but I've decided to go old school. She winked. You're a wanker and you'll get no validation from me, you prick. Maddock fought for poise as muted conversations whispered into life among the crowd, some even covering sniggers. Seeking to wrest her control away, he raised his voice in proclamation as he turned towards the people of Ascension. Tomorrow, on the third day of the third month, at the third hour, our troubles will be no more. My children, the gift of these women will be the last blood we will be asked to spill, and we can finally live in safety. Nobody asked us to spill blood, shouted a woman's voice from somewhere in the crowd. Who speaks treason, demanded Maddock, frustration visibly leaking out for the first time. The situation wasn't proceeding to his plan, and he turned to one of the armed men nearby. Find the traitor. The crowd pulled tighter, not one person offering indication as to who spoke against him, despite their obvious fear of reprisal. The guard looked to Maddock helplessly with a shrug. Looks like you're not as loved as you think, Darth Maddock, chuckled Erin. Funny that, eh? Who'd have thought that turning to the dark side and murdering your own people might turn them against you? Every word dripped with sarcasm, shaking her head in mock sadness at the turn of events. What a world we live in. So ungrateful. Are you always so childish, Erin Locke? He grated, increasingly irked by her easy mockery. She simply blew out her cheeks, lifting her chin and affecting a look of mock outrage. You know, with rude comments like that, you've just earned yourself a lifetime ban from my blanket fort. More muted sniggers evaporated the last of Maddox's tight control. Take these two to the pit, he snapped. The pit was little more than a large basement in the grand house, dominating the center of ascension. Sealed by a cell door of iron bars, 
a staircase led down to the cold stone space below. As Tori and the woman with red hair stepped through the portal, Jake closed the barred doorway and locked it with a sigh. I'm sorry, he said quietly, meaning every word as he withdrew the key. You could just open it again, said Erin, winking a mischievous grin. I won't tell a soul. Jake couldn't say why, but there was something about the woman he couldn't articulate. A presence or an energy that drew the eye. She certainly did not look special, save for the loud red of her hair, but there was an aura about her. Similar to the first disciple's presence in many ways at commanding attention, but unlike Maddox's aura of fear and intimidation, Erin's was an easy warmth. I wish I could, I really do. She mimed putting a key in the lock. Key go in, key turn, Erin come out. Easy peasy. Jake shook his head. I wish it was. You know this is all wrong, Jake, said Tori softly, moving to the bars. You're not a bad person. Most here aren't. I know the army let you go because of your injured knee, and you fell into the cracks, so I understand why you're here. I get why you feel the world we lost failed you. But did you join the army, proudly serving your country, just to watch innocent people butchered for one maniac's tyranny? Maddox, the type of person you fought against, Jake. Yet here we are. It hurt that she was right. Jake despised what they had become. This was meant to be a new start, a new purpose in life. With no skills other than those learned in the infantry, the IED shrapnel to his knee in Afghanistan resulted in a medical discharge at the age of just 23. Lacking any other employable skills, no permanent home and no job, anger at the injustice of it all pushed him towards the resurrection almost four years ago. Here he found meaning again, his skills of value once more, and never more so when the dead rose to conquer the old world. But while residing within Ascension's walls, he found a new meaning in his life, one he hadn't seen coming. I've got Cheryl and Will to think of now, he sighed. Will's just turned two. I can't risk them, Tori. Do you really think that bleeding us dry is the way to save everyone, Jakey? Asked Erin. That this is where the madness ends? She snorted in derision and shook her head. Maddox Puppet Master wants us all dead, Jake. There are three people out there, a trinity, with a chance to end all of this psychotic weirdness. But that chance is no good if there's no one left to save. Erin sighed resting her forehead against the bar. Don't you see, Jake? Maddock was a con man before the world shat its panties, planning to run off with Hargrave's fortune and leave you all teeth deep in shit. When the world actually died, his plans went down the shitter, and the thing pulling his strings is preying on that self-serving jizz fountain's need for power and control. Honestly, killing people... Is that really the way we save everyone? Seems like some grand cosmic dumb fuckery if you ask me. Erin's easy manner only increased the ex-soldier's unease. Maddock was dramatic and imposing, but Erin was relaxed and warm, her casual foul mouth only serving to humanise her all the more. Reconciling the small woman with dyed red hair and easy vulgarity with these evil ones Maddock crowed about in his sermons. Well, it just didn't fit. Everything was backward. He keeps the dead away, shrugged Jake, the argument sounding weaker by the moment. Yeah, for now, shrugged Erin, to keep you all shitting yourselves about how mighty and dreadful he is. But if me and Tori die tomorrow, then a week later Maddock announces Captain Evil needs a new sacrifice. What then, Jakey? Can you really trust the promise of something wiping out humanity and asking for sacrifices? Bit of a plot hole in his story then, eh? 
Half a year ago, Jake, and many others, would have died for Maddock. But when fabricated reasons to execute his own people reared their ugly head, opinions soon shifted. Most of them endured guilty discomfort when strangers went under the knife for the weekly tribute. But once their own started dying for the triumvirate's power, those feelings shifted starkly to a heady mix of fear, fury, and shame. Fear for their own loved ones, fury for the betrayal, and shame for the relief once felt as innocent strangers were sacrificed before them. Now, aware of the terror those unfortunates endured, that shame burned them. But fear of the dead was the most potent weapon of all. I can't take the chance. I'm sorry, he whispered. Erin regarded him keenly for a moment, arriving at some decision in her mind. A convergence of all this shit is coming, Jake, she warned. You seem like a half-decent guy, stuck in a shitty situation because you fear for your family. And I get that. Family is important to me too. But ask yourself this, Jake. If your little boy manages to reach an age in this world where he asks you about the before times, what will you say to him? Hey, son, you're here because we allowed a madman to murder countless people and Daddy stood by and did sweet fuck all about it. Oh, and by the way, the dead are still here, killing everything that breathes. Is that the legacy you want your boy to know? That when good and honest people needed protecting, you stood by and allowed them to die? Is that the shattered world you want him to inherit? How will you look your son in the eye and be the hero father every little boy wants? She sniffed and shrugged. Think on it, Jakey. You seem like a decent egg, so let me give you fair warning. When this convergence comes, let it play out. Let me show you there's another way. And how will you do that? I guess you'll find out, she said with a mysterious smile. Just don't get in his way before I get the chance. Whose way? he asked. But the two women were already heading down the stairs. Without understanding why, Jake shook out a foreboding shiver, gripped by a sudden and powerful urge to hold his wife and son. Two hours after midnight, Lucas and Bradley both stifled yawns. Nothing ever happened on perimeter duty. Forced to walk a long section of Ascension's wall for their shift, both were tired of discussing the two arrivals earlier that day, or what the future would be like once Maddock cut their throats. They would all be safe, promised the first disciple. Hopefully, these pointless duties would end. After losing so many in the failed warehouse operation, and further losses from those accompanying Hargrave to attack the red-haired woman's people, the shifts on perimeter patrol had been doubled, and arduous. Even though it was early March, the last teeth of winter still bit fiercely at night. Both men were bored, tired, miserable and cold. They just wanted it to end. Lucas was just about to say something when the rustle of a bush ahead caught their attention. You hear that? whispered Bradley. Lucas nodded. Drawing his handgun, he flicked on the small flashlight mounted on the underside, passing his larger torch to Bradley. Over there, he urged, and Bradley pointed the larger flashlight at the indicated bush. Heart beating wildly, Lucas advanced ahead with handgun up, directing his own beam at the foliage, the rustling intensifying as he advanced. Who's there? he demanded. It's not a good time to be dicking about, mate. Show yourself now and nobody needs to get hurt. A badger erupted from the undergrowth, eliciting a yelp from Lucas as it ran away into the night. He fumbled the pistol, startled by the animal's explosive appearance, and the beam caught his eyes as it dropped to the grass, blinding him for a moment. Laughing awkwardly as he bent to collect it, he waited for Bradley's inevitable mockery. Go on, lap it up, dickhead, he sighed as he retrieved the pistol. Silence. Darkness. 
Bradley's beam had been extinguished, and Lucas tried to make his friend out in the dark, his night vision ruined by the gun's flashlight. You're a funny fucker, aren't you? He muttered, pointing the gun's beam where he thought Bradley stood. Nothing. Brad? Huffed Lucas. Seriously? Dude, this isn't primary school. Jesus Christ, you dickhead, quit the bullshit. Stillness. Stop fucking about, Brad. Let's just get to the end of the shift, yeah? Then you can tell everyone how Badger made me shit bricks. Nothing. Lucas moved the gun's small light in the darkness, searching for any sign of Bradley, unaware of the black silhouette phasing through the gloom behind him. Face painted black and a dark set of night vision optics concealing a grim expression, the figure ghosted to Lucas's rear until his breath was almost on the man's neck. One iron hand clamped his mouth, a giant blade flashed past his eyes before thrusting upwards through his diaphragm, powering up towards the heart. In a single, terrified breath, Lucas died in silent darkness. Punching his knife through the eye to destroy the brain, Nate dragged the corpse to the bushes near the wall, concealing it next to Bradley's body, before wiping his blade on the fallen. With a quick scan to take his bearings, Nate moved on through the darkness like a wraith. The night's work was not yet done. Following the map committed to memory, Nate moved with careful precision through the night, lifting up the NVGs as he approached the one lights casting their sickly glow around the main compound. Thick tallow candles burned in glass boxes serving as streetlights, echoes of an age gone by their dim light enhanced by angled mirrors within the small glass box atop the pole. Despite their banks of solar panels and multitude of huge batteries in series, power was still conserved where possible for the community's primary needs, and the small streetlights were not deemed a priority. Larger spotlights were arrayed around the compound in the event of emergency, but with no need to be on alert after Erin and Tori's apparent surrender, the soft glow of the large candle lights was enough for those abroad in the night. Dropping to one knee in the darkness, far beyond the limited glow of the lights, Nate thumbed his throat mic. Situation, Dean. They've set up some kind of stage in front of the main house, replied Dean softly. Despite being over 400 meters from the settlement in Nate's sniper hide, the former police sergeant's words were gentle. Stage. Rows of wooden benches arranged, a higher platform everyone can see, and people are starting to arrive. The whole thing is lit by those eerie candle streetlights, like Maddox constructing some macabre ritual. There was tangible distaste in Dean's tone. They're going to make a dark spectacle of this, Nate. What's your progress? Outside rear of the main compound. Next, over the wall, through the interior alleys and into the main house. Tori's directions are spot on. Two hostiles down, bodies concealed with zero reanimation chance. Once in the house, concealed near the basement where Erin and Tori are held. It's a dark night for such business. It's the business that's dark, Dean, replied Nate with feeling. I'll leave the mic open once targets are secured so you can real-time update. Once the mic goes hot, QRF roll out on the quiet and edge closer to ascension. Lights off, halt away back. We don't want engine noise drawing the attention of the dead at the gates. Copy that, answered Dean. QRF copy, added Alicia from the farmhouse. Nate nodded to himself in the darkness. Good people. Going dark until target's secured. Stand by for hot mic. I'm going to get our girls. God bless and good luck, said Dean, just before the former Marine switched off his radio. If God had been watching that night, no blessings were to be found. 
With any observing deity's gaze turned from ascension, Nate moved through the compound like a murderous phantom. Erin desperately wanted to avoid death where possible, but for Nate to facilitate the final act of her plan, then discovery must be avoided at all costs. The lives of Erin and Tori depended on him. After scaling the inner compound wall with a makeshift grapple, Nate waited in the gloom as a pair of guards patrolled the interior. As they stopped to frown up at the metal prongs of his grapple, weapons unready and slung over shoulders, he ghosted from the shadows in ominous silence. One man died as the giant blade slammed into the base of his neck, a vertical drive that pierced the heart in imitation of a Roman execution. Releasing his grip, he placed one large hand against the second man's head as he turned, smashing his skull into the brick wall with sickening force, leaving a crimson stain smeared on the stone. Retrieving his blade from the first man, and ensuring no reanimation from either, Nate dragged both bodies into the shadows. Another pair of guards died in silence as Nate whispered like an angel of death from the darkness, edging ever closer to the main house. Activity bustled on the far side of the building as people arrived to fill seats, the buzz of their conversations echoing in the night air. Erin would have her audience. Sweeping across the compound in the shadows, Nate made his way to an old servant's entrance from days gone by, withdrawing his lockpicks as he glanced around to ensure privacy, before smoothly flicking open the barrel and drifting inside. The manor house was dark, the flickering lights from Maddox's theatrical scene unable to pierce the shadowed hallways, and he lowered the MVGs once more. With a deep breath and a knife in hand, Nate moved through the corridors, following Tory's directions, counting doors as he went. He glanced down at his watch. 2.47 a.m. Almost time. It's time, declared Maddock, hands clasped behind his back as the red-haired woman stared balefully through the bars. You're going to regret this, she sighed. Enjoy this moment while you can, you smarmy wanker, because it's about to go to the dogs. Still with the bravado, Miss Locke, chuckled Maddock, shaking his head in disdain. Moments away from feeling the bite of my knife, from the darkness rising to swallow the last fragments of your wicked soul, and you think to bait me. I have all the power here and you are bereft of options. There is no escape, Erin Locke. None. Tonight, your story ends. Yeah, well, I've got one more story for you, Johnny boy. Once upon a time, there was a twat. It was you. The end. She aimed a toothy grin at him. It's my finest work, don't you think? Maddock rolled his eyes at the insult, affecting a bored expression to conceal his frustration at the woman's blatant disregard. Used to the reverence and fear of Ascension's populace, Erin's dismissal of his menace was infuriating. He wanted her, needed her, to beg for mercy. But her casual scorn slashed at his ego like a blade. Enough of this tiresome bravado, he sighed theatrically, motioning to one of the four armed guards. Open the gate and let us escort the prisoners before our people. The auspicious event is at hand. It is time for our celebration. As chill as a cemetery wind, a question whispered at his ear. Am I invited? With all eyes facing the cell door and the guards positioning themselves in front of Maddock, ready to escort the prisoners, no one saw the black-clad figure melt from the shadows in the corner. The first disciple froze as the cold barrel of a Glock 17 pressed to the back of his skull, a strong hand crushing to his left shoulder and drawing him back a single pace as Nate whispered his question into Maddock's ear. 
Erin barked a triumphant laugh as the four guards spun, lifting weapons to the source of the voice. But Maddock was neatly positioned between them. Weapons down, boys, ordered Nate in a controlled voice. No hint of fear at the four handguns pointed in his direction. Did you not hear me? asked Maddock, attempting bravado, but the quiver of fear audible in the shake of his words. If you kill me, then the dead will rage. You'll be torn from this life. Everything will be over. Well, said Nate, a matter of fact, as I've got fuck all to lose right now, then you'd best tell your lackeys to put their guns down. Trust me, Mr. Maddock, I can kill you the moment a finger twitches on a trigger. And are you really willing to bet they're good enough shots to put me down with you in the way? Either way, the monsters outside the gate won't be a worry for you any longer. Nate gave Erin a playful wink before whispering to Maddock. So, you've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Erin barked a ha and punched the air before turning to one of the guards. Now's the time, Jakey, she said. Here's the convergence, and I told you not to get in his way. This is the fork in the road, and there's only two choices open to you. I'm trusting you to make the right one. Have faith, Jake, urged Tori beside her. Have faith there's a better path than this one, for all of us, for William. One of the guards, a man in his late twenties, paused only a moment, then lowered his weapon. Put them down, lads, he sighed, casting his towards Nate. Without waiting to see if the others responded, he turned and unlocked the barred door. As the pistols clattered at Nate's feet, he nodded, slipping a cable tie over Maddox's wrists behind him and pulling it tight. Erin stepped through the doorway, slapping the guard on the shoulder in a congratulatory manner. You made the right choice, Jakey, she said. I hope so. I hope you know what you're doing. Me, snorted Erin. No, Jakey, I'm winging it. It's shit or bust tonight, buddy. Win or lose, all or nothing. She grinned at his horrified expression as she turned to Nate. Nice to see you to see you nice, she winked. Shall we? Absolutely, nodded Nate, pushing Maddock forward, the Glock's barrel pressed menacingly against the back of his head. Erin turned back to the guard. We're all in, Jakey. Chips in the middle, river card to come. So let's go see how it falls, eh? Shocked exclamations greeted them as Maddock was bundled ahead of Nate, his grip firm on the man's bound wrists. 3.02 a.m., his watch said. Most of Ascension were assembled, sat upon rows of wooden benches before the makeshift stage, eyes watching in disbelief as their feared leader was manhandled unceremoniously to the side of the raised platform by an old warrior with a black painted face. Tori and Erin followed. Immediately, guns of nearby guards raised in their direction. Any of you even think about it, bellowed Nate, pressing the Glock hard against Maddox's skull. And your glorious leader is no more. Put the weapons down, cried Maddox, all zealous bravado now stripped away. Faced with the reality of his own demise, no matter how much he might believe the Dark's promise of power, Maddock was still the same self-absorbed narcissist at his core, and the threat of imminent execution pulled back the veil of his performance, revealing his true colours. It was easy to say he was willing to die and let the Dark Lord avenge him, but he craved his hold on life, just as they all did. Stripped of his menace, he was as frail as them all, screeching in near tears for guns to be lowered. One overly zealous man refused, even as all other weapons dropped. Standing in the open, rifle still raised in the flickering glare of the lights, the man's face twisted in fury. You'll bring the dead down on all of us, he roared, eyes wild and voice raw. 
Let him go, or I swear I'll fucking shoot him myself and let the world burn. Dean? The man looked confused for a moment, disarmed by Nate's address. My name isn't, he started. The zealot collapsed, rifle falling from lifeless hands as a high-velocity round smashed through his sternum, exiting from his back in a bloody eruption. The thunder of a rifle echoed somewhere in the night. Anyone else? asked Nate with a raised eyebrow. Hundreds of fearful eyes peered out into the blackness of the night, futilely seeking the distant sniper, wondering if they were next in the hidden assassin's scope. Weapons clattered to the earth, and Nate nodded in satisfaction, commanding someone prevent the dead man's reanimation with a knife thrust before turning to Tori and Erin. Your turn, I think, he said, pushing Maddock to his knees. Tori climbed the stage, standing before the fearful populace, letting them see her in the pooled light upon the stage. Her blonde hair illuminated like strands of sunlight as the flickering flames reflected from it, her upper body surrounded by a corona of radiant light, remaining still and silent until all eyes were on her and no voices stirred the night. You all know me, she said, raising her voice. I've lived with you all before the world fell and endured alongside you while this man and his two cronies terrorized us all. If you thought I abandoned you, then I'm truly sorry, but nothing was further from the truth. I left not for personal survival, but for help, in hope they could free us from the murdering grasp of Maddock, Hargrave, and Tyler. World's most evil law practice, muttered Erin beside Nate and he stifled a snort. Maddock has been speaking to a force in his dreams, but it's no force to redeem us. It's the very thing seeking to destroy us, to extinguish the last light of humanity from the world, and Maddock is its unwitting pawn. His selfish nature and desire for power made him the perfect mouthpiece for its dark design to speed our end. Friends, let me tell you the truth of John Maddock. For a good ten minutes, Nate and Erin surveyed the crowd's reactions as Tori revealed all she knew of Maddock's unremarkable life in the world before its collapse. As every failed scheme was laid out, every former disparaging manager's assessment of his character given voice, Maddock listened in grim silence his ego battered by the mocking talk of his arrogance and ineptitude. Tory eviscerated him with a damning litany of character indictments and failures. Those who once revered, then feared, him for his power over the dead, hearing every word. Disbelief and anger were thick in the air, overcast by the heavy cloud of fear still looming over the people of Ascension. No matter their fury at Maddox's alleged betrayal, still their fear of the dead beyond the gate was king. What are we supposed to do with this, Tory? called out Jake, the guard from earlier, as he threw his hands in the air. Many of us have families, children. Even if everything you say is true, and I'm not denying it is, Maddox still chosen by this thing ruling the dead. Kill him or cast him out, it'll still doom us all to the wrath of those monsters outside. What hope is there? What good is this information to us? Isn't it better the devil we know rather than fear of the unknown? Shit, good question, murmured Erin. Nate nodded, cuffing Maddock as the dark disciple chuckled. The terror of endless undead was his ace in the hole and the dread of Ascension's timid population, the one thing that might save him. Shut it, dickhead, ordered Nate, silencing the madman. Tory turned to indicate the two of them. This is Erin Locke and Nate Carter. They began this journey together, just the two of them. They've faced the dead and the violent living and are still here fighting for the likes of you and me. They first liberated others from a warlord of our old world. Two against more than forty. And they're still here. They merged with another group led by a former police officer, 
someone close to Erin, and bound their two communities as one. They've taken in yet another group discovered these past months and liberated more captives from a group manipulated by the same force speaking through Maddock. And they're still here. Once, they were two. Now their community is almost sixty. They've lost friends along the way too. But sacrificed their own to a dark force pulling the strings of the dead? Tori shook her head. No. I've seen the grief they carry with the loss of just a single life. How it cuts them to the core and how they fight every day in the hope of protecting any life within their power to save. What path would you rather walk? The path leading to fear of your loved ones under a madman's knife for his own power? Or the one leading to open arms, waiting to receive you? To warm you when the night is cold? She's going to do this on her own, whispered Erin. No idea why I'm bloody needed. How are girls killing it out there? Hush, urged Nate with a shake of his head. Then let's hear from them, cried a woman's voice from the crowd. Tori nodded and gestured. Nate shook his head. You don't need to hear anything from me, he said. I'm a sword and a shield, no speaker of fancy words to get your blood up. He gestured to Erin beside him. Nothing Tori's told you would have happened without this young woman. Oh, you fucking betrayer of worlds, she hissed, rolling her eyes and shaking her head. That's a little harsh for bigging you up, he murmured back, eliciting a snort from her. Then let us speak, cried another voice, raising a clamour of agreement from the crowd. Well, shit, she muttered. See what you did, Nate. Tori stepped to her, taking both her hands. This is it, Erin, she said. This is your chance. This is the moment. I've still got no fucking idea what to say, answered Erin. For the first time Nate could remember, she looked nervous as her eyes darted around the crowd. Tori smiled wryly. Don't think about it, Erin. You've never put your head above your heart before, so why start now? Erin snorted a laugh. Great pep talk, girlfriend. I mean it, Erin. Don't think about it. You were chosen for a reason. You weren't selected for the Trinity because the one to end this must be an everyman, someone plucked from the masses to be special because they aren't special. They represent all of us in some capacity. Tori's smile then was radiant, as though party to information kept secret until now. You, Erin, have never being regular. You've always been special, so that's why you're needed now. This, she said, tapping two fingers over Erin's heart, is what makes you special. So forget what you think you should say, and just speak whatever your heart tells you. Nate leaned next to Erin's ear. Now that was a good pep talk. Both women chuckled. Faith, Erin, urged Tori. Have faith in yourself, and faith these people will hear you, will see you, and all that you hope for. Don't think. Just act. Erin nodded and sucked in a deep breath, reaching out her hands to take Tori's in one and Nate's in the other. This feels like a moment where I should say something really profound before beginning. She paused in thought for a moment, then shrugged. Nope, nothing comes to mind. She grinned. Let's do this shit. Releasing their hands, Erin walked to the centre of the platform and faced the crowd, eyes closing as every voice fell silent in anticipation. I've never considered myself special, unlike your inglorious leader, Erin began, gesturing at the kneeling Maddock. I laugh, cry, 
eat, sleep, fart, piss and shit, just like all of you. Nervous laughter rippled through the crowd. Hours nobody of note in the world before the dead sat up. And I'm still struggling with the fact I seem to be chosen for the other team to be special. Unlike your dickhead mate here, she added, flicking a hand towards Maddock again. Erin scanned the crowd, meeting the eyes of everyone staring back as she searched for the right words. Nate worried she'd frozen, until the sound of her voice filled the night again. It sounded... different. Clearer. Stronger. For a moment, he was certain he could smell gardenias. We all lost our way. Technology gave us everything we ever wanted, yet it distanced us from the things we need as people. Real connection, real human interaction. Millions projecting the illusion of a false life. Smoke and mirrors making you question why your lives were so miserable. Making you dream and want for things you could never have because they simply weren't real. They weren't important. 90% of songs on the radio about sex. Corporations targeting marketing campaigns at young girls with brainwashing crusades to make them believe they had to look a certain way, be a certain shape, act in a certain manner, just to get them clamouring for the makeup, their beauty products, skin lotions, hair products, and their size zero clothing. Men told they can't feel, told to man up and swallow everything down and lock it in a box until the pressure got too great. I read somewhere that three quarters of all suicides in this country were male and still nothing changed. People hiding behind digital walls and keyboards, spouting hate and contempt because their own lives felt so meaningless, dragging others into their pool of spite and malice because it was all that was left to them. Just so little hope. You're reaching them, thought Nate, every face wrapped, hanging on her every word. In that one opening statement, the young woman touched their unified alienation from their fallen society at its core. Disaffection, disenfranchised, disillusionment, detachment. Intolerance and bigotry were met with counter-strikes of fierce accusation, and more counter-strikes back across the divide, until hatred and judgment became a yawning chasm between us. Nations, cities, towns, neighbourhoods, friends and even families, all divided by foolish grudges or driven by greed. Pride and selfishness at an all-time high. Humility and respect, the simple love of others, never lower. Our world was growing more brittle, weaker in heart and spirit with each passing year. Gone was the courage to unify, until only cowardice and division remained. Erin had not moved from her place on the stage. Despite her usual boundless energy, she stood motionless, fists bunched as her voice began to shake, intense emotion leaking through in every word. Yet there were, and still are, so many kind and good people in the world. I was fortunate two of them found me. Dean and Maria Williams, a police officer and a nurse, took a wild stray into their care and brought that stray to life. They showed me the power that caring for others can have on someone, how the simple act of give a shit can change a life. I'll forever love them for it and count my blessings they're both still with me, despite the world's collapse. I got luckier than most. But good people like Dean and Maria were too few. The acts of kindness and love and generosity were swallowed by a storm of hatred and intolerance, judgment, prejudice and greed. Why do you think all this is happening? she demanded, casting her arms out wide. We've ruined this chance. We've taken a world filled with magic and wonder 
and turned it into a charnel house of hatred, division and violence. Remember the joy you felt as a child when everything was new and magical and wondrous? We've poisoned the air, ravaged the natural world, and all we do is consume without thought for anyone but ourselves. Is it any wonder that whatever power exists beyond the pale decided to hit the delete button on their great cosmic keyboard? Then what do we do? cried a woman's voice from the crowd. If there's no hope, why even try? There is hope, though. Erin said, smashing one fist into the open palm of her other hand. There is a second chance. Somewhere out there, three people are tasked with bringing this horror to an end. A trinity to be tested, and our hope with it. One day, the dead could fall again and lie still. But what if they don't? cried a man. But what if they do? roared Erin fiercely, voice filled with wild passion. What if they do? Are you going to take your second chance by saying what if and searching for all that could go wrong? That's why we're here, in this shitty existence, because we've lost the ability to look for the light, because your first instinct is looking into the dark for the monsters lurking there and worry how to protect yourself. She fought for calm, sucking in a few deep breaths, then gave Nate a knowing look. We can't bind ourselves in the chains of things we cannot change. Erin had always loved that advice from Nora, and hearing it now brought a smile to Nate's lips. We can't change what the Trinity will or won't do, and we don't know if and when they might succeed so we must go on living, because we can control how we act, how we choose to survive. If the Trinity are ever to succeed in freeing us from the curse of the dead, then what use is that second chance if all we do is destroy each other or butcher innocents week by week? How long before this man has one of your children under his knife, all in the name of protecting what you had. Would it be worth it then? Eyes glittering under the light of the flames, Erin raised her voice higher still. Cruelty has to become kindness. Hatred must be compassion. Division must be unity. We have to change ourselves and make an example for all who come after. You can't force changes on another. But if you lead by example, if you change yourself, others will surely follow. I have to believe that. I have to. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'll say something I regret that makes me look like a complete tosser. I'm bound to piss somebody off when I'm tired and say something I don't mean. I'll make mistakes. I'll have regrets. I'll never do anything perfectly, and neither will any of you. But that's what it means to be human. We're all just one big, beautiful mess. But if we're going to survive the end of the old world and build something new, we need to do that together. And it'll be hard. It'll be messy. We'll lose people along the way. We'll fight and disagree. We'll sulk and say things that hurt. But we'll also work together. We'll build and create. We'll love those close to us and laugh with friends. When one of us struggles, another will stand beside them, raising them up and taking that weight for a little while. Because none of us can get through this without each other. We can't do this alone. And we can't do this giving in to the dead. If we don't unite and work together, then we'll all die divided and alone. Stop putting all your faith in people like Maddock and put that faith in yourselves and each other. Her voice hardened with fury, casting her gaze to the kneeling Maddock. No more sacrifices. No more needless death. No more dark manipulations. 
We bind as one, and the living unite to fight the dead, because they're the real enemy, unnatural things brought to dark life by a force bent on our destruction. Then Erin poured out her plea to the people of Ascension, repeating a line first spoken to the Willow Park refugees. One day, if we're lucky to leave behind anyone who will remember us, all any of us will be is a memory. Given the choice, wouldn't you want to be a good one? Burned out from her emotive speech, Erin finally brought the people of Ascension full circle. Against the dead, we either stand united or fall united. But I promise you this, that if we choose to stand together, then we will rise. Like a flame to gunpowder, those words sent fire racing through the crowd. We will rise, they roared in a singular voice. Oh, you clever girl murmured Tori, shaking her head with a smile. Completely subverted the meaning. Sometimes she's just too lazy to show us how clever she is, chuckled Nate, remembering one of the earliest things she said to him so long ago. As Tori and Nate shared a laugh, a stirring in the air carried the scent of flowers to their senses. Startled, Nate looked to the crowd, confused looks revealing they all noticed it too. The scent was intensely familiar to him, more so than anyone else. Gardenias. As the crowd chanted their mantra, the celebration turned to gasps of awe, and Nate felt Tori's hand snap to his forearm in shock as she sucked in a breath. Behind Erin, a phantom figure appeared, barefoot in a long white dress. Her dark hair swept back from angelic features, with a single gardenia perched behind one ear. Phasing from the shadows, solid and real, the figure of Freya shimmered into existence in a burst of radiance. Sensing the change, Erin turned slowly, locking eyes with Freya, unabashed tears of joy streaming as she locked eyes with her fallen friend. Behind her, as though straining at the edge of the shadows, Ghostly faces hovered at the edge of Freya's light, unable to pass into the living realm as the young woman had. Isaac, Theodore, Kate, young Joseph, Dong, Laura. All of them shimmered at the edge of existence, barely defined features straining to see from whatever dark place they inhabited. Who are they all? whispered Nate in awe at some unknown faces hovering at the edge of darkness. Some sacrificed by Maddock, breathed Tori in equal wonder. George, the first, and, and... Tori's voice trailed away, drinking in the sight, not daring to miss a single moment of the miracle. Freya's phantom plucked the gardenia from behind her ear and held it out to Erin. In a shaking hand, the flame reached out, gasping as her fingers clasped on the flower, as real and solid as the bones in her hand. As the crowd watched in awed silence, Freya's musical voice sang out into the night. Never has the flame burned brighter than this moment, she said voice rippling with warmth and power, the musical tone felt by everyone witnessing the event. It was a warm embrace, wrapping around them to shield them from the cold breath of the March night air. All of us were drawn this night to the fierce burn of your light, Erin. A bonfire, a great flame in the dark to us all, pulling us all to this one place, for this one moment, as you burn brighter than a star to warm our endless night. We're all so enormously proud of you. I miss you, sobbed Erin, not daring to take her eyes from her friend's wraith. Freya reached out, drifting the back of her hand across Erin's cheek in affection, 
before turning her gaze to Nate and Tori. With a heavenly smile, she graced them both with a nod of approval, as one by one the smiling phantom faces faded back to darkness, tears rolling freely in the crowd, until only Freya remained. With the end of one journey, so another begins, said Freya to Erin, every word absorbed by the hushed onlookers. Keep the flame of hope burning, Erin, for we're all still with you. Hold the line for the Trinity, because they will come this way as the front of the battle moves. I love you, and will see you again. The radiant light dimmed, the angelic smile of Freya's phantom fading with her to be swallowed by the night, until only the living remained. Nate glanced down at his watch. 3.33 a.m. Well, he murmured to himself, would you look at that? Maddock gaped in disbelief as the angel faded from sight, and Erin dropped to her knees in a flood of tears. Tori ran to her side, embracing her and lifting her to her feet. The crowd buzzed in breathless whispers, the awe in their faces choking the first disciple. They were lost to him, their reverence stolen by the small weeping woman with the red hair touched by the other side, and a knot of fury tightened in his belly. It was almost within his grasp, everlasting power, and a king, no, an emperor of the new world, and once again cruelly stolen away. The cruel, fickle twists of fate laughed once more. Up, said Nate, yanking on his bound wrists and all but dragging him to his feet. So, what now, mighty warrior? hissed Maddock, his earlier show of weakness still burning. In desperation, he gathered an air of bravado about him as he stood, head raised in defiance. I guess we'll find out answered Nate, nodding towards the approaching women. The crowd fell silent again as the chosen of light and dark faced each other. Despite being much taller than the small woman, she was undeterred. The people were hers now, not his. And he was powerless. So, what now, Erin Locke? He sneered in a loud voice. You show this great power of love you speak of by ending my life, a promise broken so soon. You're done, Johnny boy, she sighed, visibly exhausted by the experience. Best you just shut your cake hole. You've no concept of the force pitted against you, child, he scoffed. Whatever you think possible is doomed to fail. Ghosts and flowers will avail you nothing against the Lord of the Dead. I'm not so sure, you murderous smear of shit, she replied. After all, you set yourself the personal goal of being the wettest splash of shit you could possibly be, and yet here you are, having knocked that goal right out of the park. The crowd's open laughter, no hint of nervous fear, cut him to the bone as a final insult. No reverence or fear remained. Worse, they didn't even respect him. Now he was little more than a scorned afterthought, where once he had been a titan. Erin's voice hardened from her jovial manner. I know exactly what I'm up against, Dick Splash. I know exactly what Captain Evil wanted from me, and from you, and that was to cause another war between our peoples. To have all these innocents caught in a crossfire while you bled their throats to hold on to the illusion of your gift. And even now, I know what it wants from me as you stand defeated and at my mercy. And that is? It wants me to execute you before everyone, to make me the evil murderer you sold me as. It wants me to show all these people 
I'm no better than you. Make them fear they've swapped one tyrant for another, despite the miracle witnessed tonight. She smiled then, and the satisfaction in her expression gave Maddock pause. What did she know? Well, guess what, fuck nugget? I'm going to shit on his dinner with my secret weapon he won't see coming. What weapon? Erin folded her arms. Mercy. A brief flare of hope bloomed in Maddox's heart. Mercy? He was going to survive. Despite his inward rejoicing, he pushed back, desperate for some modicum of victory in their public battle of wills. Shakespeare said that nothing emboldens sin so much as mercy, he sneered. Shakespeare also said that sweet mercy is nobility's true badge. She grinned back, wiping the pretentious smile from his face. Titus Andronicus, act one, scene one. Everything's just a question of perspective, smart ass. Even the warrior Nate seemed impressed by her response. I'm going to show these people that we aren't wanton killers, Darth Fucknut, she continued. I'm going to walk you out of that gate to all your undead friends, and we'll see what happens, shall we? Security personnel, retrieve your weapons, commanded Nate, and Maddock almost choked at their instant response. Lost. All lost. Be ready for when the gate opens. If one of those stinking corpses takes a step towards the gate, you open up with everything you have. Every man and woman responded to the authority in Nate's command, and the entire crowd followed in nervous anticipation as they marched Maddock towards the gate. Dean? asked Nate down the mic, the earpiece unplugged so everyone could hear the response. They're still in formation, standing either side, answered the voice over the radio. Having watched the display through the scope and hearing every word spoken through Nate's open mic, his voice contained the same breathless awe as the crowd. The gates swung open, revealing the silent rows of the dead staring across at each other, and Erin gave Nate the nod. Cutting the cable tie binding Maddox's wrists, the old warrior pushed him through the exit. The first disciple stared at the motionless undead before turning to face the crowd, laughing as his confidence returned. <laughs> you should have killed me when you had the chance, Erin Locke, he gloated. See? He gestured to the waiting dead. I am still the chosen of the dark spirit, and the dead are mine to command. His wrath will be biblical, and I will return with a horde unlike anything you can imagine. Surprisingly, as the gates started closing, the woman just smiled. In all this excitement, I guess you forgot to check your calendar, Johnny boy. You see, Tori told me that your first sacrifice was the day after the world fell, so that would be Thursday, 24th of June, 2010. Every seven days, you've killed another to top up this power of yours. She sighed theatrically, a faint twitch of a shrug from her shoulders. I guess, with the hard-on you've had for the number three, and being so focused on the big sacrifice, you haven't realised that today isn't just March 3rd. She winked. It's also Thursday. Today is day seven, my dear Thundercunt, and we're not cutting throats in Ascension anymore. Her smile of savage delight stopped the breath in his lungs as her voice dropped to a foreboding tone. But I reckon the devil still wants his due. She gave him another cheerful wink as the gates of ascension closed. Maddox swallowed a dry lump as he turned to face the rows of undead either side of him, flinching as one of the monsters took a single step forward from the silent ranks. Opening its mouth, the monster awkwardly sucked at the air, filling long dead lungs to fuel its speech. 
your power over the humans has waned, John Maddock. The unnatural grating hiss from the cadaver shivered along his spine, the taste of blood filling his mouth, sickness roiling in his guts as the white-eyed corpse addressed him with that voice of unearthly power pervading every atom of his being. You have failed. The flame wins this battle, and so tactics must evolve. You are of no consequence anymore, John Maddock. No, my lord, quailed Maddock, raising his hands as the spark of demonic life rippled through the lines of undead sentries. No, I command you all to halt. I command you. His words went unheeded, and the corpse spoke one final time as the ranks closed on him. John Maddock, you are judged. His blood-curdling cries were mercifully short. March 5th. 2011. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Well, fuck a duck. We won. I'm here. I don't even know why I'm writing this to you, Freya, because you know everything. You came to me, finally, when I needed you the most. Love you, girl. It's all a bit of a blur, so I'll do the best I can from memory. It was an emotional night. Tori and I presented ourselves to Maddock, and let me tell you, walking between those silent rows of undead outside Ascension's gate as they faced inwards like some creepy guard of honour was pant-shitting. I did my best not to let Maddock see it, though. I wasn't giving that spunk trumpet one iota of satisfaction from me. I can't remember much of what I said to him, but I'm sure it was witty and hilarious, as some of his people tried to stifle giggles. I think I went for a classic and just called him a wanker and a prick. Hey, sometimes the oldies are the besties. The pit is the basement in Ascension's big fancy mansion that must have been the main house on the land before Hargrave bought it and converted the acres into an apocalypse settlement. Tori and I turned the charm on to a guy about my age named Jake, who seemed to hate the whole situation. I mean, he apologised to us as he was locking the cell door, so straight away I knew we had something to work with. Jake was someone who slipped through the cracks, injured in the service, returning to a world with no skills and no hope. Turns out, though, since being at Ascension, he's met someone and had a kid. That need to protect his family was something of a pattern for many in the settlement, I think. They were more fearful of going against Maddock out of sheer terror of the dead. Fair enough, I suppose. It didn't matter anyway, because the main component of our plan was kicking into gear in the middle of the night. Yep, you guessed it. Nate. Tori made Nate various maps in the days leading up to it, and he committed them all to memory. There are none better at stealth and recon behind enemy lines than the Special Air Service. It's their shtick. He figured out the best way to infiltrate, and as Tori was familiar with the patrol patterns, he entered unseen at one of the most distant points, about two miles northeast of the main compound, on the very edge of the farmsteads, near a place called Mottram Hall. The deadly old bastard killed six of the guards on his way in. All regrettable, but it was never going to be an entirely bloodless night, and we didn't know who was or wasn't a loyal zealot of Maddock. That's just a sad fact. If all in Ascension were to be freed of Maddock's influence, we couldn't afford an alarm being raised and Maddock locking himself down or just sending someone to finish us off. We needed his spectacle, and shit, he was planning a big one. Out front of the main compound, he directed a damn stage with rows of wooden seating for everyone to watch. 
hearkening back to medieval times when the family outing was popping down to the town square for a good public hanging or beheading. Grim as fuck. Nate got there first, though. One image that will live with me until my dying day is when Maddock had his four guards readying to drag me and Tori out. We'd been sat in the basement prior to that, and I had no idea Nate was already in the room above, skulking in the shadows. It is time for our celebration, Maddock declared, all puffed up and feeling chuffed with himself. Everyone was facing us, and I watched the dark glimmer of a glock melt out of the shadows, the barrel touching the back of Maddock's head as Nate's other hand grabbed his left shoulder. Then, like the cold breath of the dead hissing out the darkness, Nate just whispered, Am I invited? Into his ear. Chills, baby. Chills. It was epic. Maddock almost shat a brick right there on the carpet. Maddock tried to get all courageous, squeaking about how if he died, then the undead would descend upon us in the greatest horde we could ever imagine, and blah da fucking blah. Honestly, he speaks like the arch-villain in a cheesy sword and sorcery epic. The guy seriously believed his own hype. Nate then dropped his second pearl of our rescue, giving a little speech about not giving a shit, and whether his guys were a good enough shot to take Nate out before he put a bullet in Maddox's skull. Then he gave me a wink, and with his best Clint Eastwood impression, rolled out this beauty. You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? I fucking punched the air in joy at that. Nate unveils a Dirty Harry quote, entirely for my benefit. Love that guy. Jake was in those four guards, and he came through. He was the first to throw his pistol at Nate's feet, and the others soon followed. After marching Maddock and the guards out to the assembled crowd, Nate barked an order for everyone to put weapons down. Maddock showed his true colours for the first time. The slithering little narcissist desperate with self-preservation, cried out for everyone to throw down. Nate already proved at the basement door he meant every word he said, so Maddock was under no illusions he'd be the first to get a bullet if things went to shit. The guards wavered, but looked ready to obey his whiny validation of Nate's command. Well, except one. Tori told me since that this guy, Eddie, was one of the few true believers remaining. He had a rifle up, screaming that he'd put Maddock down himself if Nate didn't let him go, and was happy to let the world burn. With his hot mic open, Nate just said a single query. Dean? It threw the guy for a moment as he got all ting-tings and started saying, that's not my name. But Dean was on point. Peering down the scope of the PSG-1, he squeezed around off at the lunatic and punched his ticket. Nate's query of, anyone else, was met with a load of weapons being thrown to the floor. Perched up in Nate's sniper hide 400 metres away with a gargantuan rifle sighted in by Nate's craft on a windless night, Dean was playing Overwatch, and there's very few things people fear more than a hidden sniper when you're standing in open ground. After someone made sure Eddie McDeddy wouldn't stand back up again and try to bite anyone, Tori took to the stage. This was our plan all along, because they knew her and she knew them. Honestly, she did an amazing job, and I thought I wasn't going to be needed. After all, they weren't particularly fond of Maddock anymore since he ordered the sacrifice of his own people, and Tori knew exactly what buttons to press with them. She laid out all of her investigations into Maddock, absolutely destroying his personality and character with all the research she'd done on him. He came out of that looking a right twat, and honestly, I was starting to wonder why I was even there. Tori was nailing it. Inevitably, questions came about what they were meant to do with all this information, as they were still fearful of the dead. And that's when she turned to me 
and Nate. Both of us were a little uncomfortable, as Tori did quite a spectacular job of making us both sound awesome, until eventually one voice demanded to hear from us. Nate, the big planet head, threw me under the bus by declaring he was just following my lead and everything was my idea. Treachery. Tori took my hands and said this was it. The moment. I still had zero idea what to say, though. Don't think about it, Erin. You've never put your head above your heart before. So why start now? I laughed. But then she said, in all seriousness, not to think about it. I can't remember everything she said, but the last bit really resonated. You've always been special, so that's why you're needed now. This, she said, tapping two fingers over my heart, is what makes you special. So forget what you think you should say and just speak whatever your heart tells you. Seriously, Tori should be the one doing the talking. She is so articulate. Faith, Erin, urged Tori. Have faith in yourself, and faith these people will hear you, will see you, and all that you hope for. Don't think. Just act. And that's what I did. I wish I could remember it all for posterity here. But I can't. It was a fucking long speech that just poured out as it came to me. The world before, and how broken it was. And the world now, and how we should be rebuilding together. I talked about Dean and Maria, and how they redeemed a lost girl with love and care. I shot down some negativity by using Nora's timeless quote of not being bound in the chains of things we can't change. The longer I went on, the more emotional I got, and the tears started to fall as I remembered those we'd lost. You, Freya, Laura, Isaac, the Willow Park people, Dong, Kate, little Joseph, and Theodore. I held their images in my mind as I spoke, drawing strength from them all, while still feeling their loss all over again. It was all my pain, but this time, there was a healthy dose of hope mixed in. Hope that we could find a better way forward, together. We're all just a hot mess of humanity, and we'll make mistakes along the way, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to be better every single day. As my penultimate line, I do remember voicing the same phrase I'd said to the Willow Park people when we dropped the torchbearer bomb on them. One day, if we're lucky to leave behind anyone who will remember us, all any of us will be is a memory. Given the choice, wouldn't you want to be a good one? And then I'll forever remember the last thing I said. I don't know why, but it felt right. We'd heard the mantra of the Ascension people, and the context was far different then. But for what I was trying to achieve, it felt right flipping it on its head. Against the dead, we either stand united or we fall united. But I promise you this, that if we stand together then we will rise. And the crowd responded by roaring it back at me in a single, unified voice. I'd done it. They were with me. But there was one final twist in the tale that nobody could have foreseen. Something shifted. I don't know how to explain it. I felt a chill? No, that's not it. It was like a cooling sea breeze on a hot day, a soothing balm carrying with it the scent of flowers. Everyone else felt it, could smell that floral aroma, 
It was obvious in every face. Then the chants died as a collective gasp of awe sucked the air from around me. I turned, and there you were, Freya. Beautiful, angelic, a long flowing white dress in your feet bare. You were always beautiful, but bloody hell, as an ethereal phantom, you seemed otherworldly. Were otherworldly. A being of the divine, with a single white flower behind your ear. I started crying in joy at seeing you again, at seeing that smile radiate and fill up the darkness. Behind you, pushing at the dark and distant, unable to reach out like you did, there were a sea of faces clustering to the edge of your light, hazy and just distinct enough to make some out. Isaac's smiling approval. Heroic little Joseph. Big Dong. Couldn't resist a snigger there. The Willow Park people, and a multitude of others I didn't know. Even the Fruit Loops from the lodge way back in the beginning hovered somewhere in that mass. Faith and Sky, Hope and Jericho, Grace and her toothy bollock Theo, and even poor broken Ariel and her buffalo Barkley. Even Zion was in the back there with his fluffy potato head. Yeah, you're still a bellend though, Nigel. And Theodore. Sweet, smiling Theodore Beckett in front of them all. He looked so... Happy. Always so expressionless. But here, a misty face at the edge of your light, he smiled with such joy, I thought my heart might burst. When I told Elijah of it later, a weight seemed to lift from him, and he straight up wept in relief. I felt like Luke Skywalker seeing the ghosts of the Fallen on Endor at the end of Return of the Jedi, though not quite as stark and obvious. All those unknown to me were the sacrifices from Ascension, the earlier strangers that went under Maddox's knife, and their own people when the initial victims dried up. You plucked that white gardenia from your hair and held it towards me, and holy shit, it was solid, real. I still have that flower in my room. Never has the flame burned brighter than this moment, you said. Somehow your voice was felt like a soothing caress on my aching heart. All of us were drawn this night to the fierce burn of your light, Erin. A bonfire a great flame in the dark to us all, pulling us all to this one place, for this one moment, as you burn brighter than a star to warm our endless night. We're all so enormously proud of you. I miss you, was all I managed to sob. You reached out, though I was unable to feel any touch against the tear-streaked skin of my cheek. The crowd of faces hovering in the dark faded from sight, until only you, Freya, remained. With the end of one journey, so another begins, you said to me alone, though the awed crowd heard every word. Keep the flame of hope burning, Erin, for we are all still with you. Hold the line for the Trinity, because they will come this way as the front of the battle moves. I love you and will see you again. Then you faded from sight. All that was left were the living. I don't know why it happened, though Tori theorised from the subtext of your words that as the flame of hope burned and everyone started believing what I had to say, she thinks I lit up on the other side, drawing everyone in from where they were trapped. That brief 
flare, let you pass over for a little moment, everyone else straining at the edge of darkness to see beyond the veil between our world and theirs. You've obviously got a bit more mojo than the rest of them as our dream guide, eh? God, I don't know. Why it happened, how it happened, I honestly don't care. I'm just grateful it did. You don't get second chances to say goodbye to a dead friend. I did. And that makes me profoundly fortunate. All that was left to resolve was Maddock himself. I knew exactly what to do with him. We walked him to the gates, cut his bonds, and let him stand amongst the silent, motionless dead. You should have killed me when you had the chance, Erin Locke. I still command. Yeah, blah, blah, evil monologue, blah, whatever, knobhead. Maddox's idiotic need to gloat ended up biting him on the arse, and that's probably the first time that can be used literally and not just figuratively. With my mercy, he thought he'd gotten away with it. And jinkies, he might have, were it not for this one pesky kid who figured out a detail he'd likely forgotten about in all the fuss. You see, Tory told me that the first sacrifice Maddock made was the day after the dead began to walk. I know that to be the 24th of June. Using my laptop's calendar, I worked forwards to see when the 3rd of March would be, the date Maddock had a raging boner for. Imagine my cackle when discovering that was also a Thursday. Every seven days, Johnny boy, someone had to go under your knife. This particular Thursday was the seventh day, and that devil wanted its due. I dropped that nugget at his feet, gave him a wink, and closed the gates. It was only a short breath before the screaming started. Didn't last long, though. March 6, 2011 Dawn of a new day I'm almost done with this journal for now, I think. The compulsion to write isn't as strong. It's like I've done what I need to do, for now at least. There will be shitloads of work ahead, and I don't think I'll have the time to write. I'd like to spend some time seeing what I can make of this life, and follow my own advice, instead of being bound to this digital page. It's strange how I started this almost a year ago, just as a coping mechanism while I was on my own, trying to keep my spirits up by being a bit of a dick. I'd take any laughs I could get, even if they were my own scribbles for my own amusement. Now, though, I realise it was a compulsion, the first steps on this journey that led me to this moment. Now it's strange, because I don't feel the need to write anymore. Now it feels like I have a choice, and for the moment, I think I'm going to choose making something of this life we're trying to build. Before I put this journal aside, though, for now at least, because never say never, right? There's a couple of things I should catch you up on. As the sun came up on the third, the question remained as to what we should do with the dead outside the gate. Even though they had shredded Maddock, they were still there, and the people still feared the dead. Facing fears, gaining victory over them, was the first natural step for these people. There were enough guns in Ascension on our team now, and plenty of ammo to get the job done thanks to their stores. However, I needed to set the tone for our new friends going forward and introduce them to the real Erin Locke. Forget the flame business and all this mysticism and chosen by a higher power bullshit. I wanted them to see who I really was. Everyone was just too in awe of what had happened to venture near me, and the last thing I wanted was being a figure of weird reverence like Maddock, placed on some pedestal and treated differently. I was still one of them, so I needed to lower their expectations of me. Basically, I had to show them what a dickhead I was. After making a request, 
that got some weird looks. I was handed a battery-powered CD player and a selection of CDs for me to rifle through. This was a critical choice. What the fuck are you doing? queried Nate in a huff. We've got everyone ready with weapons for the gate to be opened. What's the delay? And is this really a time for music? I held up one finger. There's always time for music, Nate. If we're doing this, we're doing this right. Doing what? Aha! Perfecto! I slid the CD into the player, turned the volume up to max, selected the track number I wanted, and looked up at Nate. Flint and lock action heroes? I inquired, holding out a fist to be bumped. Naturally, Nate had no idea what I was talking about, but he shrugged, bumped my fist, and we both reeled back with the finger explosion, just as me and Charlie have done so many times. Laughing, I signalled for the gates to be opened as I pressed play on the CD. Some moments in life stay with you forever. Some are so perfect, they burrow deep into the marrow of your bones and forever become a part of who you are. As the gates of ascension opened to admit Team Evil into our killing ground, the people were liberated from Maddox's insanity by the joyful sound of Katrina and the waves filling the morning with walking on sunshine, while a whole bunch of us shredded the 300 undead in a screaming storm of lead, Maddox undead husk in their ranks, and it felt like the perfect closing credits soundtrack to this part of our journey. This is the kind of ridiculous nonsense I've been missing, laughed Nate between reloads, as I danced and threw out some shapes while clicking in a new magazine. March 7th, 2011 Inkepto ne desistam. This is my last entry, I think. For now, at least. I'm not a detail-oriented person, as well you know, Freya. I won't be laying out every little thing that happens now, as we've got a big job on our hands. So this is me, closing the loop from where I began in June last year. So much has happened, and in such a relatively short space of time but it feels like we can finally move forward. With two large communities to integrate and bridges to build between them, it was off to a good start as Ascension unanimously voted Tory as their new leader. I think many thought I intended to take up Maddox's mantle in some way, but I've never wanted to lead, and I'm still trying to get a handle on everyone looking at me like I'm some kind of second coming after the ghostly curtain call on stage. No. My place is at Crenshaw, and in the spirit of moving forward with new beginnings, we decided on a new name for the school. Something to reflect our identity and what we stand for. We all agreed on New Hope. I think it's perfect. Also, it's a Star Wars reference that Nate has no idea I sneaked in. Wins all round! Tory's first decree, wholly supported by a new council, was also a renaming ceremony. Ascension felt wrong, holding all the dark connotations of Maddox rule and the cult built on a foundation of lies and deceit. Instead, they've opted for the name Unity. And I have to say, I bloody love it. New hope and unity. Our path forward through the uncertain days ahead. Probably the most important news I should share before signing off is this. I had a bacon and egg sandwich and a cup of fucking tea with milk, bread, butter, bacon, egg and a brew with fucking milk. My northern English soul was lifted to new and magnificent heights and I was whole again. I must have sounded like I was having multiple orgasms as I hummed and oohed my way through every bite and lip-smacking slurp. Unit is agriculture. Rules. Best day ever. The dead are still here, but no monstrous horde descended on us as Maddock threatened. 
the fight goes on, and we'll continue to hold the line for when this mystical trinity gets their chance to pull our asses out the fire. Frey said something about how the front of the battle would move, which I take to mean that they're bollocks deep somewhere worse than here. Fogley is still out there with some of the nomad escapees as well. I'm sure we'll come across them again one day, or they'll get chewed up by the dead. Whichever way it goes, Fogley will get what's coming to him, no doubt. I discovered something eerie today from Graham. Do you know what Crenshaw's school motto is? Incepto ne desistam. Know what that means? May I not shrink from my purpose. Weird, huh? As you said, Freya, one journey ends and another begins. We don't know if and when this trinity will end the threat of the dead, so until that day comes, we'll carry on fighting the good fight, continuing to build and make something of this new world as best we can. Now at least, we have sanctuaries for any resourceful survivors still out there. This will be our first mission. Gathering what we can of humanity and build for a future we all hope for. Who knows, maybe this mystical trinity will swing by our way sometime in the future. You seem fairly certain that's likely. If that's the case, then we should be ready to help them however we can. If we can. We will not shrink from our purpose. Unity and hope. That's the key to it all. Without it, there's no point in living. If we can't dream of a better life, a better way to take our second chance on this earth, then we may as well give up now. The saying goes that those things that don't kill you only make you stronger. I don't think that's completely true. The things that don't kill you tend to give you a twisted sense of gallows humour and temper you in the heat of whatever crucible it is you endure. You have to let in whatever slivers of light remain, or all you'll do is weep in the shadows. Laughing through situations that make normal folk weep is the only way to make it through. Things that don't kill you don't necessarily make you stronger. I think that's the wrong word. They can make you... harder. Those things that fail to break you can add piecemeal layers of armour around your heart, so the real challenge in this new world is ensuring there are just enough chinks in that armour to let those slivers of light in. Let the cracks fill with light, not shadow. I'm going to try. I'll see where this thing with Elijah goes, even though I wonder if any man can genuinely love me for the spectacular walking disaster I am. But these days we need to take life one what the fuck at a time and see where it leads us. This might not be the party we hoped for, but while we're here, we've got to dance like no one is watching. As each story ends, a new one begins. So for now, I think I'm finished with my tale of bardic magnificence. I may write again. I may not. It's all about what life lays in our path. I might even let someone else read my insane ramblings, though that notion makes my stomach flip with anxiety. Letting someone take a peek inside this disastrous chaos of a mind is a big step. It's pulling back the curtains from the window of my soul and letting someone have a nosy inside the private room of my head. I'll think on that one. There's a lot of work ahead of us all, as we hope this trinity have the courage and will to endure their crucible. They might just drag humanity's burning butthole out of this rotten fire and give us a real second chance. May they not shrink from their purpose. Peace and love, Freya. I hope we do get to speak again one day, now that I know all things are possible. Keep walking on sunshine. Bitches. April 13th, 2011 You cheeky scamp. Planet Head Conversational desire of a brick. The Grim Reaper's unfriendly kind of threatening dat. Wrinkly old scrotum face.
I'm not as dumb as Nate looks. I think you and I need to have words, young lady. Nate. This has been The Devil's Due, an Adrian's Undead Diary novel. Loki vs. the Apocalypse, Book 3. Written by Carl Meadows. Narrated by Danielle Cohen. Copyright 2021 by Carl Meadows. Production copyright by Carl Meadows. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.